I don't believe in witches, but that they're real. They're real. This is a phrase I often heard said when I was a child growing up in the north of Chile, a long and narrow country in the southernmost area of the American continent. A magical land with unforgiving deserts at the north, dark and impenetrable forests in the south and enormous icy blue glacials reaching the south end of the world. The north of Chile, where I grew up, is a desert area where the soil itself is filled with chemicals such as peroxide that kill anything trying to grow in it. But these same sterile soils are filled with riches and minerals, especially silver and copper. And because of this wealth in mineral resources, there has been a mining industry in the area since the late 19th century, even before big cities and the resources needed for them arrived in those areas. The north of Chile is filled with ancient legends and mysteries. People are often lost in the desert and never found or returned several years later, looking just as they did when they disappeared, still believing it is the very day when they went missing. Strange voices of centuries-old battles are still heard. Terrifying creatures roam the dunes, and, of course, beings not from this world are often seen by people working in the copper mining operations. But those are all stories for another time. Before these mysteries populated the minds of the local folklore and superstition, people already spoke of witches in their infernal black sabbath where they would commune with darkness incarnate and surrender themselves to the most wicked of perversions the human mind can conceive. Child sexual abuse, torture, cannibalism, animal and human sacrifice, etc. In Chile, when someone speaks of witches, it is a neutral pronoun, for there are female as well as male witches, both equally abominable both working to spread misery wherever they went, turning people away from the righteous path and towards a life of hedonism and self-destruction. Because that's ultimately what darkness seeks, to drag you through feces and destroy your very soul while you smile and ask for more. It is said witches fly towards their black Sabbath on Friday nights during the new moon when the skies are dark only lit by the soft glow of the distant stars on a branch of the Milky Way we can see, which when seen on moonless desert nights, looks as if the night itself was a living being, exposing its backbone to us. These witches don't fly on a broomstick as many people think European witches do. These witches don't fly on a broomstick as many people think European witches do. Oh no. These witches meet in caves deep in the mountains, in ravines and crevices where normal-sized people would have a hard time fitting in, where only children could maneuver their way around or get lost forever. Instead of broomsticks, these witches turn themselves into strange birds. Some say these birds look like very large cows or like black vultures, while others claim these strange creatures, which the Amerindians called tutu, are instead the very heads of the witches, which they detach from their bodies by means of dark craft, with a necromantic vest made of human skin, the skin of someone who loved them and whom they loved. The grotesque transformation was invoked, ears turning into large black wings and, and their veins and viscera hanging as it would on a decapitated head turn into birds' feet with sharp and strong talons, with which they can steal children whose parents were careless and look away if only for a moment. But not all babies that were stolen ended up eviscerated and devoured, with their skin becoming soft leather, or their fat being used for candles and catonic rituals. The very lucky ones got to live a life of constant hell, becoming an embunchi a twisted and deformed creature of pain and sorrow, with their hands and legs broken and then mended in unnatural contortions in a way the human body was never meant to move. These monstrosities would become guards at the entrance of the witch's cavern system. 
It is said that sometimes, on moonless nights, you can hear the witches cry out as they fly by, a horrible scream of agony and joy. And when you hear them, you must say this to them. Fly by, devil bird. You are already late. Jesus Christ came by earlier, and he has already won the race. I have personally never seen or heard of these devil birds, uh, these witches. But my grandmother once told me the story of one of her family members, before she was born, who had a close encounter with these things, and the horror she endured haunted her for the rest of her life. This story is based on real events. My grandmother told me about her great-aunt, who once lived in the small town of Salamanca, a mining village of barely 12,000 people in present day, and perhaps only 1,000 people in the late 19th century when these events took place. Salamanca was in a semi-deserted area, with two rivers nearby that allowed some vegetation to grow. Back then, most people were poor, and didn't have many options to make a living. If you were a woman, you found yourself a good husband who, hopefully, didn't beat you too harshly. And if you were a man, you found yourself a mining job, risking your life every day in dark tunnels, only to earn barely enough to feed your family, and often dying before your time, buried alive when one of those tunnels collapsed or from lung cirrhosis after decades of breathing toxic substances. My grandmother's great-aunt was one of the lucky women who found herself a good husband, a hard-working man who didn't drink and didn't beat her, and only wanted to save enough from his work to one day own some land of his own, land he could leave to his children. He had been working since he was twelve years old. This was the way it was back then when kids as young as age ten were forced to earn a living and help around the house, as feeding hungry bellies was more important than earning an education that could help better their lives. In spite of all the challenges, they were happy. They had met when they were both teenagers, at church. Soon they were married and they moved together to Salamanca, so he could find work as a miner. They had hopes for the future, and within a short time of moving to their new home, she became pregnant with their first child. Pregnancy, and especially the time after childbirth, are the most dangerous moments for a woman and child when dealing with darkness and its minions, which is crave the tender, soft flesh of a newborn baby, and they enjoy driving a fragile woman to madness and despair. And my grandmother's great aunt held on to her faith, traditions, and superstitions. Even though she heard the bone chilling cries of those devil birds on moonless nights, far off in the distance and getting closer, she knew what to say. And she always held on to her baby, knowing if she would let go of him for an instant, the witches would have him for supper. Years went by of happy and simple life. A hard-working couple with faith for the future, living one day at a time. Their baby grew up soon. Too old to be carried away by the witches now. He was now nine years old. Her womb desired to be a mother again, so they conceived another baby. This time a baby girl. And once again their house was filled with jingles and nursery songs. And once again they had to worry about devil birds witches, and their sharp iron teeth, their blood-curdling screams, and not knowing if one day they'd close their eyes just for a second too long, and their baby would be gone forever. Their first son had grown up too fast. He was a smart boy, who did well in school, with an inventive and curious mind, just like every other kid of his age. It wouldn't be too much longer till he would have to abandon school and find work at a farm or in the copper mines. He wished it could be different, but that's just how things were back then. My grandmother's great-aunt wished it would be different, too. She wanted him to study and become a doctor or perhaps a priest, someone who did good for the world. With his newborn little sister at home, the boy felt like a big man already. 
He had no more time for thinking about childish games, even though he missed a time of careless existence, and now he missed his mother's hugs and kisses. She was looking away from him, looking to her newborn baby. He felt it, and he knew he was no longer her little baby anymore. One morning, before her husband went up to go to work, she woke up to make breakfast for her family. She noticed the door on the back of their little adobe house was left open, and her heart sank to her stomach. Had someone come into their house? She went to check again on her little baby girl. She was safe and sound in her crib. Next, she went to check on her young boy, and his bed was empty. Had he run away, or was he taken? It was a moonless night. Just a few moments later, the boy came through the door. Before dawn, before his father would wake up, he had walked up to the river that crossed the valley of Salamanca, the only thing that allowed any vegetation to grow in the semi-desert area of the world. He had gone to swim in the pitch-black darkness and think about his future. She scolded her boy for being so careless and for leaving the door open like that, knowing fully well what superstitions say and for going alone into the night, because even if witches thought him a bit stale for their taste, there were still plenty of bad people who wouldn't think twice of hurting a young kid wandering the streets at night. But she was happy. Happy he hadn't run away as she suspected. After being scolded, the boy replied, Mom, I don't want to be a miner. I don't want to work on a farm. I want a better life. Saying these words in a calm and gentle voice, barely above a whisper. His mom understood how he felt. She hugged and tried to comfort him. What would you like to do instead? She asked him, knowing their options were extremely limited. I, I don't know. I want to study, perhaps travel and see the world. I want a chance for a better life. I'm sure I can think of something better than just staying here. For a moment, they held each other in silence. Whatever you choose, I'll support you, she said, trying to show empathy, and knowing fully well what his only real options were, hoping he'd come to his senses. Days went by, and with them, also the phases of the moon. She didn't have to worry about the devil birds for a little while, but she felt in her heart that her boy would truly run away soon, before he was even ten years old. She told her husband her concerns, and together they decided it was time for him to talk some scent into the boy. Show him the value of hard work, because sooner or later, at ten or sixteen years old, he'd have to learn it. My great granddad's husband took his son to the mines with him to show him how being inside these tunnels and crevices wasn't so bad. You're right. Life in these tunnels isn't too bad, the boy said, while coyly smiling, perhaps accepting his fate. Nearly a month went by, and things were normal. The family would be together for dinner, go to church together, living a life of normal and expected. But soon, the moonless nights would return. It was the first night of the new moon, and they all went to bed early, leaving their candles on until they'd fallen asleep, as if the soft golden glow of a single candle illuminating a cold room could hold back the vast darkness of the moonless night outside. Suddenly, Appalling screams that sounded like the shrill cries of a baby or the desperate pleas of a dying man woke them up. The candles had gone out, and a misty, chill air floated through the house. The screams were getting closer and closer. And then, suddenly, thuds loudly fell on the roof, breaking the shingles with loud cracks. Multiple, petrifying, Horrific screams came from the roof. She got out of bed, waking up her husband, both trembling with fear. The cradle with her little baby girl was next to them. The little girl woke up as well, 
crying loudly, as loudly as those things outside. She tried to light her candle, but it wouldn't light up. He tried as well, but it was as if that misty chill floating around them kept any fire, any light from igniting. Suddenly, the screams were coming from inside the house, shrill and stupefying sounds only comparable to a nightmare. She picked up her baby, and her husband went in front of her, grabbing a hammer he kept nearby, naively thinking this could serve as a defense in case those things got too close. They headed towards their son's bedroom, walking in the darkness, tripping over the little furniture they had, making their way towards their boy so they'd all be together. They made it into the boy's room as he lay in bed awake. The family sat together on the bed in pitch black darkness, recognizing each other only by instinct and each other's body warmth and shape. The birds kept screaming, now walking inside of the house, getting closer and closer towards them. In total darkness, the family realized they were under siege. The room soon was filled with these devil birds coming to take the little baby girl. The father got up and swung his hammer towards the sound of the devil birds. Without thinking twice, only hoping wild action could give his family a fighting chance. And then she felt small hands taking away her baby. In just an instant, she couldn't even fight it. It was only a quick pull, and her treasured child was out of her arms. She couldn't see, only feel intense terror, imagining the future of her precious baby. From outside of the house, the parents heard a scream. This time not one of the devil birds, but one equally horrifying. It was their boy, screaming. He was being taken away. Mother? He screamed, as we all call for our mother when overwhelmed by fear. And suddenly, the house was empty, except for the two parents. The devil birds were simply no longer there. They had vanished like a shadow, as silent and swiftly as an evil thought. They heard distant screams once again, getting farther away every second. They were heading towards the mountains, towards the old tunnels and caves. They couldn't believe what just happened. They just knew they had to get their kids back, no matter the cost. The parents ran as fast as they could towards the mountains where the mines were, and where superstition said the caves of the witches were as well. They arrived at the feet of the mountain, the entrance to the tunnels, and in the darkness they entered, holding each other's hand, hoping their love would protect them. They walked deeper and deeper into the tunnel, only following sounds of distant crying of children. Finally, they arrived in a chamber the hard-working miners didn't know existed in those tunnels. Torches lit up a circle around them, and a tall man wearing a black robe faced away from them. They saw the man had their young boy by the throat, but there were no signs of their baby girl. Let him go, you motherfucker. I swear to God, I will fuck you up, said the husband, always a tough man. He took a steps forward towards the man in the black robe, but no matter how much he walked forward, he didn't move at all. My great grand aunt was paralyzed by fear, still standing on the threshold of the chamber, observing this terrible scene. The man in the black robe turned around to face them, his face obscured by the long hanging robe over his eyes, but they could see he was an old man, with long bony hands and very white skin. Let's make a deal, said the man in the black robe. I'll let your boy go, in exchange for you, he said. The tough man, hard-working father and husband, didn't think twice. He nodded, and got closer to the man in the black robe, this time actually being able to move closer. I'm here. Let go of my son now, said the father. Come closer, said the man in the black robe. The father obeyed him, now face to face with the man in the black robe. 
The father tried to raise his hands and strangle the man in the black robe, but something prevented him from doing it. It's not that something held his hands back. Instead, it was as if his arms didn't respond to his commands at all. Then, the father felt a sharp pain on his chest. A ritual dagger was cutting him till its tip reached his backbone. The man in the black robe twisted the dagger, causing the father unbearable pain. At this moment of agony, the father noticed the low angle of the stab wound, and he closed his eyes and opened them again. Having a revelation more horrendous than the certain death that awaited him, there was no old man in the black robe. The one who had stabbed him was his son. The boy held on to the dagger, his father's blood dripping down his arm. The mother, still paralyzed by the threshold of the chamber, screamed and screamed until her throat was raw. Why? Why? asked the father as he felt life slipping away from him. I want to fly, said the boy, opening his mouth and revealing sharp iron teeth, grinning widely in an unnatural way. So many teeth, so sharp and so big, they couldn't possibly fit in his mouth. The boy looked at his mother standing in the back, and he said, Mommy, I figured out what I want to do with my life. His mother looked at him with terror in her eyes. As he smeared his father's blood on himself, finally washing away the baptism, which he had first washed away in the river at night on a moonless night, the boy began to vomit. Not food, but his own insides. His guts coming out of his mouth the flesh around his neck detaching his torn flesh, his ears growing and turning into large black wings, his head turning into a monstrous bird and his body falling to the floor, vanishing before touching the ground. The mother turned around and ran into the night, crying and unable to contain her anguished screams. Her son was no longer her boy, and her little baby was ripped from her arms. She found her way out of the tunnel and ran back to town, screaming for help. The next day, the people in town went looking for the missing baby girl, but after days of searching, they never found her, but they did find the skinned corpse of my great granddad's husband. Many people believed her story, that witches had taken her children and killed her husband, while others thought she was crazy and she must have killed her husband and drowned her children. She never told him what she had really seen and what had truly become of her son. Eventually, she left the town and moved to the capital city of Santiago de Chile. After years of solitude, still being an attractive woman, she remade her life and found a measure of happiness with a new husband a kind and wealthy widower with children from his previous marriage. But still, my grandmother told me that her great-aunt dreamt about what had happened often for the rest of her life. And on moonless nights, when those wicked witches and devil birds could be heard screaming in the distance, she heard them and could clearly hear a word in their screams. Perhaps she imagined it, but among the cacophony of screams, she could clearly hear one of the voices that shouted, Mother. I think I'm the same as every guy out there. Or, more so, I think every guy is the same. We have an innate desire to fuck. Pardon the profanity, but I don't think I'll be able to tell this story without it. I differentiate between the desire to fuck and the desire to have sex or make love. They are two different things in my eyes. To delve deeper into my philosophy, the rapper Kanye West actually has a very insightful line that I believe describes the sexuality of men. I could have me a Naomi Campbell 
and still warn me as Stormy Daniels. We may have a type of woman that we want to marry and have married sex with, no matter how crazy or unique. There will always be a deviant side to our sexuality that tells us to share a bed with less reputable women or men, and maybe experiment with a taboo. Despite the controversy surrounding Kanye and Daniels, the sentiment remains the same. I'm just another victim of this lustful nature all men have. We are all plagued by this, and I think no matter how normal, mature, disciplined, or moral the man or woman is, everyone has a kink to fundamentally unique sexual desire that can range from just wanting to participate in BDSM, wanting to fuck multiple people, role-playing, all the way to immoral and unethical practices I won't get into. This leads me to one kink I want to talk about specifically. I believe it's been around since man began worshipping the sun, but it really became a part of pop culture in the 70s when a cult, not to be confused with cults, although the two can mix, horror, thriller, sexploitation, and pornos entered the mainstream. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should give it a search. Hell, you might end up liking it. Especially if Satan or Satanists and occultists having ritualistic, horrific, or raunchy sex with gorgeous men and women sounds like your thing. Just be prepared to see the occasional Euro Bush. On the topic of occult exploitation films, there is one film that isn't an occult film necessarily, but has some influence and undertones from that era. I think most, if not all of you reading this, have probably heard about it at some point. The film I'm talking about is the first VHS film. If you haven't seen it, basically the viewer is taken on a journey along with some shitheads who broke into a creepy house, and they watch a series of underground and rare VHS footage displaying very disturbing and surreal events. One of the stories is about a group of three college-aged guys going clubbing and picking up chicks. The guys go to a club and invite a few chicks back home, one of which is a little strange, not only physically, but also seems to have trouble saying basic words. Long story short, she ends up killing the two Chad-type guys and kidnaps, or uh, should I say literally transforms into a demon humanoid figure and flies off with the skinny nerd archetype guy for, well, who knows what. The story is often referred to as the succubus story. I tell you this to give you an idea of what a succubus is, but I'm sure you have an idea of what a succubus is. A classic example are the sirens from Homer's Odyssey, whom sing so beautifully that men are drawn to their voices and Eventually, their death. All of this being said, now I can explain how all of this relates to me. My name is Ike, like Turner, and as you may have already picked up on, I have an obsession with sex and the occult. I believe my obsession with sex is healthy, and, like I said, I believe every man is, even if it is only secretly. My obsession with the occult... Uh, I'm not so sure now. All of this is private information. I work and live in San Francisco and have decent social skills. Hard to believe, I know. I'm being blunt because I have to, so... I'm not the type that is into weird shit due to a lack of getting actual ass. The truth is, I just have a hard time connecting emotionally. This has led me down a rabbit hole of demonic and occult porn and an obsession with fucking something unnatural. This leads me to believe I wanted to fuck a succubus. I figured, you know, a succubus wants something like my soul or my life or some shit. I don't even care. I just had this burning desire telling me I want to be used by some paranormal, gorgeous, and maybe not even entirely human-looking creature. This led to a lot of sex with sometimes attractive, sometimes not. Sometimes sane and sometimes not. Goth, punk, straight-up eccentric chicks that were willing to do like, that were willing to do things like fuck in a pentagram, or maybe carve one on me with a knife and get a little burning wax dropped on their bodies while we have some animal-like sex. Sometimes we'd even read this book containing occult, satanic, or witchcrafty ritual stories, and I gotta tell you, 
It might sound a little insane, even unsafe if you're afraid of that type of thing, but goddamn, that rush was phenomenal. The issue is that the rushes could never last at the rate I was going. I was lucky enough to meet one chick named Rabbit. Uh, this wasn't even a nickname. Her story is her parents were crack addicts who thought that the story of Peter Rabbit was cute and somehow saw the name Rabbit fitting for a girl. Her middle name was even worse, though. It was Jessica, so she decided that Rabbit was okay. I'm not going to lie, she wasn't all there, but she was nearly perfect. She had a non-existent attention span, and her hair was always matted and unkempt, despite it being a new color every week. She always looked tired and spent time at a local loony bin for attempting to murder one of her teachers, who she said made some unwanted advances on her. She said that he lied and said it was unprompted, and that it was her word against his. I believe her, of course, but she's still crazy. Despite all of this, she had some beautiful features, like a legitimately smoking body and, if I'm being a little sentimental, the most gorgeous hazel eyes I had ever seen. Anyway, we started hooking up and having some seriously satanic sex. We would get high on a multitude of drugs and read this book I found called Doctrina Satanas. I'm not an expert, but I believe that roughly translates to Satanic Doctrine. We would read all these crazy stories and these crazy rituals inside, partially translated by some secretive guy who most people say was a local Freemason. I knew things were getting unintentionally serious when we wouldn't even have sex some of the times we'd meet. We'd just read, laugh, talk about the types of forbidden knowledge we'd like to learn, and watch old horror movies together. Despite finally meeting someone, I felt I finally felt a weird connection to. I still couldn't satiate this hunger inside of me, telling me to keep going. I needed this sex to be more dangerous than just cutting pentagrams into each other, and stupidly saying shit in Latin we didn't quite understand because it might summon a demon. Although we know it wouldn't, because we weren't following the ritual to a T. It was all in good fun, but I wanted to go further. So I started reading some of the Doctrina Satanas on my own time in order to find something that might help me. In order to find something that might help me. For the first time in a long time, I felt focused. I would critically read and meticulously decipher the rituals and stories written in this book with the hopes that I find something that piques my interest. About a week ago, I finally found something. If I'm being honest, I was subconsciously hoping I'd find a succubus the whole time. I've always had a fixation with the harlots from the 70s, occult pornos, and the succubus from VHS. I guess that's why, when I found a section named Metatrix Demonium, it felt like everything was coming together. The translation literally means prostitute demon, or harlot demon. I'd like to think what it's actually saying is succubus. When I began reading and trying to decipher the story regarding this demon, my interest only skyrocketed. Long story short, I translated and deciphered the bits that weren't already, and then dumbed it down to basically saying this. The prostitute demon, or succubus is a demon whose main function is to punish those who delve too far down into the deadly sin of lust. The demon punishes men and women who participate in sinful and immoral sex practices by first seducing the individual. If the individual is a male, and if the demon can get its prey to ejaculate inside it, it then takes ownership of that person's soul. Upon acquiring this person's soul, it then reveals its true form if it hasn't already, sometimes resulting in immediate death due to shock, and resulting in that individual serving as a slave for the rest of eternity, or until the demon releases them. If the person does not die upon completion of the act, they continue to live a normal life, but live knowing their eventual fate. I got excited just reading that. Upon translating this description with Google Translate and some other random translation sites, I wanted to see it. I wanted to fuck this thing. 
I didn't care about the consequences, if I could lay with this creature, even if I lost my soul. I felt I finally knew what my calling was. Of course, I would try and maintain my soul, but the rush of the whole thing is what really sold me. So I began reading on how to summon it. It was much harder to piece this part of the text together, and it was very vague, but the summoning process goes a little like this. The succubus summoning is either at the discretion of a higher-ranking demon, or when a heartbroken, angry, or ambitious lover performs the demon's sacrament. In either case, the target will not know the identity of the creature until completion of the demon's contract, in which the demon will reveal itself in its true intentions. In order to complete the demon's sacrament and the summoning the succubus, one will need to 1. Create a pentagram. Method and material not important. 2. At each point of the pentagram, there should be a wax candle burning. 3. Between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m., you must kill a human sacrifice. 4. Before taking the sacrifice's life, you must chant Et ego invocabo, metetrix demonia, mater profano sexus. 5. After the sacrifice's life has been taken, you must then chant Videtur. Upon summoning, the succubus will often appear in a non-threatening and beautiful female form, and you will need to provide a possession of the target in order for it to prey upon the target. As soon as I understood these steps, I began acquiring the supplies. I decided I would perform the ritual in my living room, and that I would cover everything up to avoid a mess. I would then try to convince it to lay with me upon its arrival. If I gave it a possession of mine and said I was the target, it would work. Right. I bought red paint to make the pentagram, some generic wax candles for the ceremony, and plastic tarp to put on the furniture in case of blood splattering. The only thing I hadn't figured out was how to obtain a human sacrifice. I may be into some dark shit, but murder never crossed my mind before deciding I would do this. I didn't even know if I had it in me. So I began contemplating and realized if I were to perform this ritual, I had to take it seriously. This meant that I had to find a sacrifice, and upon finding them, I couldn't back down. Occurring almost simultaneously with that thought, I received a text from Rabbit. It read, You want to hang out? I knew what I had to do. I realized she was probably the only victim suitable for this. And she is practically a nobody. She has no real friends and no family left. I replied to her. I was just thinking about you. I'd love to get into something weird tonight. Come over and let me show you this new story I found. She replied hastily. Wow, I didn't know you were capable of feeling something like love. I'll stop by in an hour. Try not to blow your load to the thought of me before that, alright? An hour. This is perfect, I thought. This would give me enough time to prepare the sacrifice. I decided I would use my butcher's knife and add a lot of crushed up painkillers into a drink in order to prevent a struggle. I prepared two glasses of whiskey, added the powder, and placed them on the table. I put my drink on the left and hers on the right, and decided that I would pick mine off the table immediately upon her arrival, in order to eliminate a mix-up. After everything was ready... I sat in anticipation. Not too long after, the doorbell rang. It was about ten o'clock. I could feel my palms getting clammy, and sweat formed on my scalp. After assuring myself that this is what I wanted to do, I went to the door. I answered it, and there was a rabbit as expected, standing in her normal semi-slouched posture. Her hair seemed washed today and it was dyed completely purple. Her eyes were brighter than usual, and she sported black lipstick to match her typical black makeup. She radiated a positive energy, despite the overwhelmingly goth-inspired outfit featured today. Upon seeing this unusually peppy rabbit, I froze for a minute in admiration, admittedly, then forced my head back into the game. This was no time to become unfocused or change my mind. We went into the living room, 
where I sat in my armchair, and she took a seat close to me on the couch. I immediately grabbed the drinks, offering her the one with the special stuff inside. So, what's the new story about? She said, her eyes wide open, not turning away or blinking. This was a common expression she wore. I, I believe it's about a succubus, I said bluntly. I took a sip of whiskey, so she did the same. She took only a small sip and made a disenchanted expression. The right corner of her mouth cracked a smile, though, signaling to me that everything was okay, and that she was interested in the story. This allowed me to relax a little bit. And so I was able to form an actual smile, rather than a forced and rigid one. I see. You want me to play one, right? She said jokingly. I... Uh, actually, I have something like that planned. Let me read you the story real quick. I read her the lore of the beast. I'm sure in a very animated and passionate way that happens involuntarily when I really like what I'm talking about. As I told her, her smile grew and grew, and her eyes grew brighter and brighter, almost giving off this aura of innocence I have never seen in her before. Once I finished, we sat still, staring at each other. I realized at this moment exactly just how wrong what I was doing really was. I realized I might even love this woman. Don't drink that, I said firmly yet ashamed. She maintained eye contact. She even maintained her smile. Instead of heeding my words, she began drinking the glass anyway, all without blinking her eyes. Her pupils began expanding to the point that they filled the entirety of her irises, destroying that bright, innocent look I just had. When she put the drink down, I noticed not only that she was still smiling, but her grin seemed to be getting larger and larger, until her lips opened up, revealing teeth that began to change form. Her teeth were transforming into a monstrosity that resembled a great white's. She began laughing all without looking away from me, seemingly unfazed by the drug I had slipped into her drink, and with evil, entirely midnight black eyeballs, her voice changed. It was deep and loud, and yet the feminine voice was still layered underneath. What's wrong, Ike? Keep going. I want to hear the summoning ritual. She said in a mocking, highly amused tone. She continued to laugh at my expense, all the while I stared in bewilderment, unable to comprehend the horrendous transformation that just took place before my eyes. The pit in my stomach dropped, and I felt paralyzed, yet for some reason I felt relieved. Well, this saves me the trouble of killing you, I forced out. Her laughter paused but she maintained that smile. She decided to walk closer to me, and for the first time I noticed that her nails had grown to the length of what looked like two inches. Are you the real rabbit, or... I asked, puzzledly. Yes. Some of the Dark Lords took notice of you a while back, so I was hired to fetch your soul. Her appearance remained unchanged, but her voice returned to normal. But luckily for me, I haven't given you my soul yet, despite our history. So why reveal yourself now? I have no reason to hide now. You know why. She was right. She realized my infatuation with her, this monster, and knew that she would have my soul tonight regardless. Although now, being face to face with this danger, I began getting second thoughts. I decided to bluff. You're right. I want to ask you a favor, though. I suppose I'll listen. I want to see your true form. She laughed and then turned her back to me. After a moment, wings started to rip out of her back and out the back of her shirt. Her skin was morphing into a blackish-gray color, and when she turned around, her eyes were yellow and reptilian. Her nose was now just two slits, 
and her fiendish smile was now even larger. Her height grew nearly two feet, making her possibly seven and a half feet tall. Despite all of these changes, her figure remained feminine and humanoid. At this moment, she walked towards me and embraced my face. She had a look of sweetness behind this evil caricature, and I thought there was something beautiful about this form she was in. She began to speak to me. You know, one thing they never put in those books is the whole truth. It says we have to lay together in order for me to obtain your soul, as I can also just make you fall in love with me. I felt my heart drop. You were harder than most, I'll admit. I knew that when I did some background on you. I knew that this was the way to go, though. Rather than let you put your weak human hands on me again. At that moment, a tale I hadn't seen before instantaneously shot forward and into my stomach. I looked down, confirming that it pierced my body. Then at her, she looked despicable and ecstatic with what she had just done. I'm going to take your soul, but don't worry, you'll see me again soon. As she said that, her tail ripped back out of my stomach, holding what looked like a faintly glowing aura. I never thought this soul would have a physical form. She then suddenly vanished into thin air, and like that, she was gone. That leads to now. I'm writing this as I bleed out. Luckily, the puncture was through my abdomen, where you can typically live the longest after an injury. However, I'm not going to lie to you. Getting your soul sucked out isn't what you think. I feel like all of my vitality and youth have been stripped from me, and any ambition and all will to live have literally and metaphorically been ripped out of me. I write to tell you all this. Don't get involved with a succubus. Today is April 9th, 2020, and I have just awoken from a terrible nightmare. Before I tell you about it, uh, let me start from the beginning. Five days ago, I left to go on vacation with my parents. We stayed at this magnificent hotel, or so it seemed from the outside. As we checked in, we were all so excited to be away from home, and not to mention I got my own room. Our room numbers were 503 and 505. Anyway, we gathered our luggage and all piled into my parents' room for dinner, and it was around 7pm. I, excited to see my room, hurried down my food and begged my mother for the room key. Oh, if only I knew. I made my way down the hall looking for this room, room 505, as we all assumed we would be... T room 505. As we all would assume would be one of the two rooms away from my parents. I followed the numbers down, continuing as I went along. They read 507, 509, 511, 13, 15. Then came this precarious looking room. On the wall it read room 505, but on the door the numbers were upside down and the zero was missing. I figured this was some elaborate prank and reached in my pocket for my key card. As I went to slide my key card, the light above me flickered, and for a second I could have sworn that the number had flashed 666. I just thought it was my eyes playing tricks on me, but why would it have been those numbers? Those evil numbers. Well, I never did believe in a lot of the superstitious things that normal people did. Being a teenager at the age of 17, I questioned religion, so I continued on. This room, room 505, it looked just as my parents' room did. This gross, grunged orange wallpaper with little shapes of things you'd seen on walls of castles. The bed linens were this dark brown cloth with white pinstripes. The curtains were almost the color of vomit, with two different colors running down them. Let's just say this out-of-place room wasn't very delighting to the eye. 
What did I care, though? I'm a teenager. All I thought about was throwing off my pants and watching television. So I got unpacked and did just that. After an hour or two of watching crime scene investigator shows on TV, I became unknowingly parched. I remembered my parents packing a cooler full of soft drinks and waters, so I pulled my gym shorts on, grabbed the room key, and hurried down the hallway. When I made it to their room, I knocked on the door, and as I was waiting for someone to answer it, I heard a faint cry, almost as if there was a baby at the other end of the hallway. Then the hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up, and a slight chill ran through my veins. I felt as if someone was standing against my back, just far enough so they weren't touching me, but close enough so I could feel their breath on my shoulder. I nervously knocked again, but this time a little harder. I looked from side to side, trying my best not to turn around. Now I could actually feel a warm, humid air blowing ferociously against the side of my neck. I wanted to turn around, but something told me that if I turned around... My mother then opened the door. I ran in and slammed the door, not looking on the outside. With my back against the door, I said, I may have some of the drinks we brought. I don't know why, but I feel like if I told my mother about what had just happened, I would lose my bedroom, and that was the last thing I wanted. I grabbed one of the cloth bags we had brought and filled it with some drinks and a few bags of potato chips for later, which I knew I would need. I then told my parents thank you and good night. As I exited into the hallway, I felt as if the presence that overwhelmed me before had vanished. So I hurried back down to my room at the end of the hallway before it showed up again. When I made it to my room, I noticed the numbers on my door had changed again, and somehow, the zero was there. This time, this time they had been rearranged to read 550. I thought this was very strange, and whoever was messing with me was doing quite a good job at it. I pulled out my key card, and for some reason, something made me turn my head to look down at the end of the hallway. A tall, shadowy figure stood at the end, and in its arms were what looked to be a newborn baby. The baby was crying the exact same sound as before. I was petrified, so I hurried into my room and locked the door. As I entered my room, I laid down my bag to realize that something, someone, had pulled my comforter down as if it wanted me to enter the bed and sleep. At this point, I was terrified and didn't know what to do. All I knew was that I had to face this because I did not want to lose my room. That night, I ignored its plea to sleep in that bed, so I crashed on the couch with my bag of chips at my feet. The next morning, I got a call from my mother telling me to get ready to leave and to meet her outside the room in 30 minutes. I looked at my phone. The time read 8.05. Then I realized I had forgotten to charge my phone last night, and the battery read 25%. So I decided to leave it to let it charge. That was the worst mistake I had ever made. I had gotten a shower and got dressed, ready to leave. I grabbed my wallet and slid the key card to room 505 in one of the sleeves. The phone rang again, and without hesitation, I picked it up to hear Mother tell me that it was supposed to storm today, and that I needed to bring a jacket. I agreed before hanging up. Then we left the hotel to go on whatever exciting adventure awaited us that day. I'm known for getting sick when we go on vacations. My mother blames it on the air pressure, Dad blames it on not wearing enough clothes. No matter what causes it, I always end up with some sort of sickness before the end of the trip. When we arrived at the hotel, I'm coughing and sniffling. My mother tells me to take some medicine and try to get some rest after dinner. But being a teenager, I do the exact opposite. After dinner, I head back to my room, anticipating something strange to happen like last night. Nothing. The door to my room still read, Room 550 and it had looked as if the cleaning staff had come in and made my bed and cleaned up all the crumbs around the couch from last night. The only thing that truly caught my attention was that my phone had been pulled off the charging cable, and on the home screen, the word punishment was written. 
Ignoring it, I grabbed a soda and threw myself into bed and watched some more crime scene investigator shows. I awoke the next morning to find myself curled underneath the comfort of shivering. My body felt as if I had been thrown into the depths of hell, then coughed back up to this putrid bed. My body is coated with a layer of sweat, and yet, I feel cold. I never really understood why fevers make you cold when your body is of a higher degree. I guess it's like a glass window in the middle of winter. All the condensation built up from being warm on the inside, but cold on the outside. But at this point, all I could think about was this undying thirst and just how fucking cold I was. I could feel my bones rattling from the inside out. I needed to get up to get some drink, or at least call my mother to tell her my situation, but I felt as if I couldn't move. So I decided to rest. Now, here I am, lying in this goddamn bed. This brown, putrid-smelling, sweat-stained bed. I've been lying here in my own excrement, going on four days now. I feel disgusting, and my mouth has begun to wither. Funny thing about this is, I find laying here, soaked in piss, staring at this clock more enjoyable than when I fall asleep now. These dreams, I swear they get worse and worse every night. Each one as realistic as the last, I feel like something evil has taken over me. Last night, I dreamt that I watched myself lay in this bed, tortured by that same shadowy figure from four nights ago, who was now standing at my bedside, smiling. On its neck, or what seemed to be his neck, was the name Shekel. Dr. Shekel. At his side were a series of tools ranging from doctor's scalpels to a box of nails and a hammer. I couldn't speak. I tried yelling at my physical self to wake up, but no sound ever came from my mouth, only the feeling of being strangled as punishment. I felt as if he was punishing me for something, but what had I done? He used the hammer to drive a nail into each of my twenty-eight finger segments. The whole time my physical being stared into the eyes of my celestial being with this dead, distraught look. After he finished with the nails... He began to carve the word punishment in every inch of my body with the scalpel, with very deep, emphasized incisions. I continued to tell myself that this was all just a dream, but what had I done to deserve such a fate? Now I lay here, anticipating the worst. What more can it throw at me now? How much more suffering can Dr. Shekel inflict? I've just awoken to what I believe is the most satisfying night I've had in a long time. I, I didn't dream. I've awoken to what seemed to be a slight bit of strength, uh, at least enough to lift my hands. I reached over to the side table where the telephone rested and began to die on my parents' room. Room 503. There was no answer. I've become quite uneasy again since that dead silent dial tone. Almost as if Dr. Shekel was here, watching and waiting. I tried to must enough strength to crawl out of the godforsaken bed, but something was restricting me from getting up, and I began to sob at the thought that maybe he got my parents, or that maybe I was dead. At this point, the real world was starting to feel like a dream, mainly because I've lost feeling in most of my body now from laying here for so long. The last moment my eyes were open, I saw the clock read 5.05 a.m. The last thought that ran through my mind was that I'm cold. You cannot move. You cannot breathe. You are stricken here forever. Those words kept repeating in my head as my eyelids closed. After forcing my eyes open... I'd awoken to the front of a chapel as dark and red as blood. The sky was dark, headed by a moon painted red. There was a distant sound of the dying souls of many unborn children. On the doors of the church was the word punishment. I was in hell. There was no doubt about it. I fell to my knees and begged whoever it was to please let me go. 
The doors of the church swung open, and a dark voice that sounded like a hundred men all at once said, Please come in. I don't know what drew me in, but my body took flight by itself, and I began to walk uncontrollably to the steps. There were five steps, each with different but similar words on them that read, Agony, Despair, Hopelessness, Pain, and Punishment. I began sobbing greatly as I knew this was the end. This was the last time I was to ever exist. I was going to suffer to a life of punishment. The word Dr. Shekel had granted and embroidered me with, almost as if he had labeled my soul with such a fate. I took a step inside the church to wait for what horrible fate I deserved. The inside of the church was lined with thick, jagged barbed wire, and the walls were coated in the blood of thousands that had coagulated hundreds of times before. The pews were seated with thousands of lost souls waiting to be entertained by my punishment. I recognized a few faces in the crowd. From where, though, I don't understand. But what really drew my attention were the two agonizing faces at the front of the church. My mother and my father were waiting at the altar, which stood four stories in the shape of a pentagram, as if to baptize me. They were weeping with tears of joy. What more could he do to me? I was forced by an unknown power to the altar, all the soul's faces on me, staring deep into my soul as if to catch me trying to escape. I stood there, facing a dark figure and Dr. Shekel standing side by side, laughing, while my parents, to the right, stood there, smiling. This had to be punishment by itself. Who knows what fate awaits my poor, innocent soul? The dark figure with the voice of a hundred men called upon me, and as I stood in front of him, he said, You have no choices here. I control you, and you feel me. He then lifted me into the air and tied me upside down to the altar. He pulled a thin, gorgeous blade from his shroud of darkness. Its hilt was made out of the bones of demons, and the blade itself was stained red from the blood of his many victims. He then held this blade to my throat and made a deep incision in my jugular, causing me to gasp for air. He then began shouting and screaming, which sounded like every soul from the depths of hell all at once in a magnificent chorus of death. He then exclaimed, He is not the one. His soul is too pure. What is this? All at once my body was sucked into a vortex of darkness, and what felt like three days I was stuck in this tormenting nothingness and bitter silence. I felt tired, cold, and uneasy, as if waiting for some relief. I then awoke to my mother standing over me, and my father sitting in a chair to the side. She told me that I had been in the hospital for a few months, and that the doctor had said that I wasn't going to wake up for possibly a few more. She told me that we were on vacation, and that one night, after having a terrible fever, I just never woke up. I asked her what room we were in, and she told me a room 505, and described everything in the room to her as if I were still there, and then I told her about what had happened. When I mentioned Dr. Shekel, she then told us about how my original doctor, from when they had first admitted me into the hospital two months ago, was named Dr. Shekel, and how he had committed suicide the day after I arrived. My name is Tyler, and I'm seventeen years old. I'm not sure what happened the day we went on vacation, or anything that happened while I was in a coma. One thing I am sure about is that whatever it was had gotten the wrong person. And I'm not here to tell you my story, but to warn you. Whatever it was that got me is obviously angry and will not stop until he finds the right victim. I have no idea what he's looking for or how to tell, but I'm almost certain that whoever it is has done some terrible things in their life, things that you or I can't ever begin to imagine. 
My only advice for you is to be careful and don't ever take your lives for granted. I never believed in heaven or hell up until that day in the hospital. Now I am a religious churchgoer who will never again question what is heaven or hell and do they exist. Take my word for it. You never want to experience the things I went through. For your own sake, be good little boys and girls. And remember, Dr. Shekel is always watching. Thorn River was not a river at all, but a small town hidden behind a ridge of but a small town hidden behind a ring of snow-capped mountains. The place lent credence to one of August Maynard's favorite sayings. The map ain't the land, for Thorn River could not be found on any map. Following Kippenau's instructions, August rode into Thorn River at high noon. It was out of character for a town made up of mostly prospectors to disappear without their gold, but Chief Kippenau insisted it was here for the taking. The mountains and the rivers for which the town was named should have moistened the air, but every breath the old gunslinger took was bone dry. The dull wind baked his eyes to splinters and bit his throat when he swallowed. He removed the water skin from the inside of his shirt and took a long drink, but no amount of water could stop the sun from kindling his old scar, a faded burgundy band around his neck, evidence of a failed hanging from a lifetime ago. He pushed the memory away. Dark thoughts could prove as fatal as any noose in the shadow of Thorn River. Sky, the horse, ganteered across the flat stone road which divided the town. August kept his hat down and his eyes sharp. He rode past a dry goods store and a telegram office on the left, and a post office and saloon on the right. Not a peep from any of them, but when his back was to the building, he could feel someone staring. A crow cawed from the roof of the saloon, startling him cry echoed off of the surrounding mountain range and transformed the crow's lone cry into a hundred. The scavenger stretched its wings and disappeared into the sky. Sounds like a murder, August thought, chuckling. Appropriate. Something moved within the post office. August drew his pistol quick as lightning, and when he turned, the window was empty. It had already begun, he thought. Get in, get the money, get out before dark. That's what Kippenau said. An old chief may have been a lot of things, but he wasn't a liar. Get in, get the gold, and get out before dark. If there's someone in there, you better come on out, August said, shattering the silence. I won't hurt you, but if you don't, well, I don't give warning shots, and I don't take well to being startled. His words echoed a thousand times off of the looming mountains before silence washed back over the town. Nothing stirred. I am alone, he thought. A fresh gale of wind rolled into town. Somewhere, a rusty chime tittered at him. The town, or whatever walked here, was laughing. Get in, get the gold and get out before dark, August muttered. He put his hand to his forehead and squinted at the sun. He usually told the time by holding his hand side long against the horizon and counting fingers until he reached the sun. The mountains, which seemed to strangle Thorn River from every side, made the measuring technique impossible. He would have to use the position of the sun and the length of shadows to make a best guess. He judged the time to be an hour past noon, but that couldn't be right. Surely he'd arrived in Thorn River only minutes ago. August looked back along the road, tracing his steps, noting each building he'd gone by. He couldn't help but notice the way the black, empty windows seemed to be watching him, or the howling wind, and how strange it was for mountain air to be so hot and dry. Perhaps the flat road was magnifying the torrid afternoon. 
All at once, he felt tired. His eyelids crept down, and before he could do anything about it, August was dreaming of family. His wife, his twin daughters, their old home, his bedroom. Dyson cards and the roulette wheel crept into his mind, and why shouldn't they? They consumed his waking thoughts. It was unfair to expect them to stay out of his dreams. August's eyes snapped open. His pulse rocketed. How long had he been sitting here? He gave the horse a light tap with his spurs and she stepped forward. She had been close to sleep as well. Close nothing, he thought. You were out cold. In the bowels of Thorn River, something giggled. The town was slowing him up, making him retrace his steps, and making him waste his time, making him... Move, he shouted at himself, and the harsh echo banged in his ears again and again like rolling thunder. It was maddening. Sky whinnied, frightened. All right, steady, girl, steady. Keep going. Get in, get the gold, and get out before dark. According to Kippenau, Thorn River had four streets. The longest, the main road he was on now, and three smaller roads which crossed through it. Kippenau said the gold was in a long-forgotten bank, but claims to not remember which of the four streets the bank was on. I swear I do not remember, Kippenau said in halted English. Zorn River is bad place. I saw a terror that I cannot remember. It made me forget things. What made you forget? August asked. Kibanaugh looked at him, brow furrowed in confusion. The town. At the time, August reckoned a man would say nearly anything when his hands and his ankles were bound and his life was on the line. But going back over Kibanaugh's last words, he wondered if that was true. It made me forget things. Uh, could a town do that? A haunted one? Ghost or no ghost, something had made the people of Thorn River disappear. Better than 150 townsfolk had called this place home, and they'd all vanished in a single night. Then, as if by some collective agreement that the town should be forgotten, it had disappeared off of every map. Some folks said a wolf pack was responsible for the mass exodus. This version of the story claimed that a pack of wolves stole up while Thorn River slept, and then dragged the townsfolk, one by one, into the surrounding spruce forest. Some folks believed that Wendigo had taken them, that some minister or priest had on purpose or accidentally summoned the old Injun monster, and had pulled the whole town into the land of nightmares while they slept. Some folks said the devil himself came from the mountains and drew Thorn River into hell. Get in, get the gold, and get out before dark. August found the bank on the third street. You wait here, girl, he told Skye, tying her to a post so she wouldn't wander off. Skye neighed in the affirmative. After a deep breath, August ascended the wooden steps to the front entrance of Thorn River Savings and Loans. The old wood porch creaked and whined under his boots. There was a sign hanging from a nail on the front door. August had taught himself to read as a boy, and though the words came, they did not come quickly or easily. Closed. Hours 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. Be out before dark. Just a coincidence, he said, knowing it was not. He gripped the brass doorknob, ice cold. The bank had two front windows, one on either side of the entrance, and blinds were pulled across both of them. The blinds ran horizontal, and there were thin gaps between them where light could trickle through. August happened to look to his left, just as he pushed the door open. Someone was watching him. The instant August noticed, the eyes withdrew into the dark. The blinds trembled slightly from the disturbance. A shrill scream came from within the savings and loans building. 
right behind the door. It startled August so badly that he lost his balance and fell. His knees twigged angrily when he climbed to his feet. The spiders could scream, they would sound like that, he thought. Get in, get the gold, and get out before dark. He coughed and spat out a glob of bloody saliva. There was one tooth in the swill. It occurred to August that the hot air of Thorn River might be poisonous, and he would not be surprised in the least if this were true. He checked the sky again. It was past three o'clock. Impossible, he breathed. There was a choice to make, and now was the time to make it. He was sure, with no proof at all but his own intuition, that if he cut now without taking anything, whatever haunted Thorn River would let him go. It would take his memories of the afternoon the way it had taken Kippenau's, but August was more than happy to get rid of those. What ended up driving him inside of Thorn River Savings and Loans was a simple calculation of risk. If he did not steal the money, the loan sharks would cut off his fingers and would keep taking off parts of him until he paid the money back or died. There was also the possibility that the spirit of Thorn River was just his imagination. He was never the one for getting carried away, but Kippana had spooked him. Yes sir, the old engine had scared him good and proper. That was all. August put his hand on the doorknob, turned it, and noticed the sign hanging there had changed. Come on in. He opened the door, and when he saw what was inside, he nearly wept. Towers of golden dollars stretched from floor to ceiling. The place was so crowded with gold that there was hardly enough room to walk. He stuffed an armful into the burlap sack he'd brought with him, setting off dozens of glittering avalanches. He stuffed the bag, dragged it outside, tied it to Sky's saddle, then grabbed the rest of his bag and went back in for more gold. August half expected the pile of coins to have vanished, and for a green-eyed demon to be waiting in its place. But the gold was just as he'd left it. He had hopped over the teller's counter at the back of the room, after spotting papers for common shares and divided slips. Shares for the Clear River Company, Rob Daniel, King George Flower, and a dozen others. August didn't recognize most of the company names, but he knew that he could get more than fifty dollars for each share of Rob Daniel, and there were at least fifteen of those. Farewell, ghost, he called when he was done. He departed Thorn River as the sun started to dip behind the mountains, dying the town a pale pink. You have my thanks. August rode all night. He was worried about being taken by thieves on the road. Eight overstuffed sacks of coins and share slips bulged from Sky's saddle, and it would behoove even the most nervous of banditos to investigate such a hall, unmolested by sunup next morning. After showing the gold to Cordelia and his twin daughters, Daisy and Abigail, they held a glorious morning celebration. The party paused briefly when August rode into Carson City to pay his debtors, but continued in earnest upon his return. The following years saw the downward tragedy of the Maynard family take an abrupt turn towards the clouds. August became the second largest shareholder in the Clear River Company, and whisked his family off to a penthouse suite in the Borginning city of New York. Daisy, who had seemed all but destined to wed an abusive 40-year-old cattle farmer by the name of Bew Hicks, attended Harvard and married a lawyer shortly after her graduation. Abigail wrote poetry and was invited to London to dine with the Queen. She stayed in England teaching poetry at a private school, and she wrote her parents often. August retired from the Clear River Company, a multimillionaire, and lived out the last chapter of his life in an old Victorian mansion when he caught the silent car. He was 85. Miss Maynard and the hired help took care of him as best they could, but his wife wept often when she thought he was asleep. Between fits of painless coughing, he reminded her how strongly he loved her, and that if it was his time, he knew... He would go to the kingdom of God, thankful for the blessings of his life. Then came the end, 
when it was clear he was on his way out. The attending nurse fetched the Maynard family to August's bedside. It happened not long after supper, while the pale evening faded into blackest night. Cordelia Maynard, who had tried her very best to be strong for her family, sobbed uncontrollably. Daisy and Abigail, knowing their father was not long for the world, had come home to spend one last week with him. They were at his side now, weeping silently so as to not upset their mother more than necessary. All things considered, August had to admit the timing of his passing was perfect. He was surrounded by love. Goodbye, my family, August said, closing his tired, tear-strung eyes. How I love you. Goodbye, Dad, the girls said together. Goodbye, sweetheart, said Cordelia. Goodbye, August, said Kippena. It's nearly dark. August's heart clenched. He opened his eyes. He was standing at the entrance to Thorn River Savings and Loans. Still open. No, he said, though a younger man's voice he barely recognized. No, it, it can't be. Behind him, a horse whinnied. He spun, and there she was, brown as chocolate. Sky. He remembered, his mind whirling. And this is... And I'm... It all came flooding back. Where he was, why he was here, and who he was. Not the retired executive of a company, the name of which he was already starting to forget, but a tired gunslinger in desperate need of gold. Get in, get the gold, and get out before dark, he thought. And it took a second to remember what that phrase meant, and why it was so important. Oh, God he said, turning westward. The sun was low, an orange eye hovering over a mountain, ready to plunge itself into the tip. A high, thin laugh floated through the empty streets of Thorn River. He remembered, and as he remembered, he was painfully aware of another life being forgotten. It was slipping away like smoke through his fingers. He opened the door to the bank and stepped into darkness. In another life, or a dream, the office had been well lit and stuffed with prospector's gold. August was standing in the same room as the one half remembered, but there was hardly any light here, and not one coin. The windows along the side had been haphazardly boarded, leaving the office in almost total darkness. The only light came from thin lines of the afternoon squeezing between blinds. It was bone-chillingly cold inside, and August's breath fanned out in quick tufts of vapor. His heartbeat thundered into his eardrums. As he stepped into the middle of the office, the front door slammed behind him hard enough to rattle the frame. August spun to his heels, drawing his revolver, but the door was gone. He was staring at a blank wooden wall. The windows were gone too, and with nowhere to peek through, the dying yellow light of the afternoon had vanished with them. He fired the pistol. His ears rang and the smell of gun smoke filled his nostrils. The bullet bored a black circle in the wood, but did not break through to the other side. He was about to fire again when a small voice rose from the darkness. The light, and whispered, Go to the light. What light? he thought, and in reply, pale green glow crept from over the teller's counter. The source was farther back, in a room beyond sight. Who's there? August called, his smoking gun wavering. Show yourself. The horrible, thin laugh came again, but this time it didn't die out. It went on and on, growing louder, until the gunslinger had to holster his weapon so he could clamp his hands to his ears. Let me out of here, 
he screamed. I'll go. I'm sorry. I won't take anything. I just want to leave. The laughter became outrageous, whooping and hollering. Go to the light, the girl repeated, somehow audible over the laughter. I'm going, August shouted. All right, I'm going. He leapt over the counter, and the moment his boots touched down to the other side, the laughter stopped. Thorn River was silent, watching. Behind him, the doors and windows had reappeared on the wall. A trickle of light was coming in through the gaps in the window, and a small round hole in the entrance. August strode to the closest window and peeled off the board. The pink and red of early evening fluttered in, and he saw the sun hanging in the sky. Half gone behind one of the cliffs, it was at least seven o'clock. Whenever I started wondering where the time had gone, he realized it slipped away even faster than before. He could still get out before dark, but he had to move fast. If he were to jump back over the counter and try to leave now, August knew the laughing creature would come back. The spirit dwelling here was playing games with him, and if he didn't cooperate, it would punish him. He strode quickly into the depths of Thorn River, savings and loans, following the pale light through a cramped hallway, past a stretch of doors and into a back room. Kippenau was waiting for him in a steel room. August was standing inside of an enormous safe. An enormous, empty safe. The green light was coming from his eyes. Chief Kippenau? said Augustine. Gunslinger, the chief moaned. His face was drawn, skeletal, and his skin was several shades paler than it had been in life. The chief tilted his head sideways, revealing a dark hole above his ear where the bullet had entered. Is that what this is about? August asked. You knew I was coming here, so you came to haunt me? It wasn't personal. You know that. The chief shook his head. Then what? Spit it out. August stammered, trying not to sound afraid, but shivering anyway. Kippenau's ghost held out an old tin box. For you. August came forward cautiously. There was a small note attached to the lid. One per customer. Take it. Kippenau groaned, but when August looked up from the note, it was not the chief holding the old box anymore. It was Cordelia, his wife. Cordelia in death. Her fingers were missing, and she was holding the box between two flat palms. Her hair was parchment white, and strips of skin hung off her face in tatters. Her new emerald eyes burned in anger. They'll cut my fingers off, she hissed. Take one. If you don't, they'll cut your fingers off and then mine, and then your daughter's. You just had to play your cards. Play cards and throw dice. You lost the house. Will you bet me next? Whore me off when you can't roll double sixes. You couldn't get much for me, but your daughter's. August snatched the box away before Cordelia could finish. She became silent, but did not disappear. The thing disguised as his wife watched and waited. There were a dozen slots inside. Four had been emptied. One presumably by Kippenau, though August had no idea where the chief had hidden his treasure. But a single golden coin occupied the other eight. August lifted one of the coins delicately from its groove and examined it. It was thick and heavy and when he pulled the coin higher, he realized it was not gold at all, but a shining gold-tinged diamond. The etchings claimed the coin was minted in 1795. On one side was the queen, but she was not etched or carved into the crystal. Instead, the bends within and on the outside of the diamond seemed to trace her features, and when August tilted the coin, her face turned with him. 
On the other side of the coin was a range of mountains, and two words running along the rim, repeating over and over. Get out. August shoved the coin into his pocket and ran, leaving the decomposing creature behind him. The demon of Thorn River was no longer in the shape of his wife. It was a dead daisy. The decaying face of his daughter smiled up at him before he fled, and was still smiling when he took a last glance over his shoulder. The horse was gone. The sun had nearly disappeared. August ran on foot, breathing hard. He took off across the stone street, back through Thorn River the way he had come. His shadow dragged behind him, willing him to stay and visit just a bit longer. You've never seen nightlife like this, said a voice in his head that did not belong to him. August screamed and kept running. There was a headless girl waving at him from the window of the saloon, and something horrible that looked like a mix between a lobster and a fungus was oozing from the post office door onto the street. August observed these things from the corner of his eyes and kept running. These were destructions, or tests, or real monsters. But as long as he got out before dark, he would be safe. Out before dark, he chanted. The lobster thing screeched behind him, but he ignored it. Out before dark. Each breath was tearing his lungs a little more, and his head was forced down. He was no longer running over flat rock. The street had turned to human bones. Skulls and femurs exploded under his boots, almost tripping him up, but he kept his balance and ran. Sky neighed, and before he could think, he was staring into the window of the telegraph office. The horse was there, but she was not alone. Good horsey, good horsey. Something enormous had her wrapped up in dripping tentacles. Whatever had her was so large that it barely fit in the building. The walls were jutting out slightly, and dark blood was dripping between the cracks. Sky gave one last holler and disappeared underneath wet ink black skin that left a trail of slime on the window. Something grabbed August's ankle. He yelped, tore himself free, and ran out of Thorn River. The coin danced in his pocket. Behind him, the sun went out. August ran until his legs gave. He fell, and when nothing grabbed him, he opened his eyes. Thorn River watched from every window. If there were monsters or windigos or devils lurking there, they were hiding. The roads were once again flat stone. From where he had fallen into the grass, August could see the Thorn River savings and loans standing in the darkness. There was a lantern flickering inside, and a silhouette with glowing green eyes was standing in the window. The figure was waving for him to come back. August turned and ran. A high, thin laugh echoing in his ears. Just the cutest, my grandmother exclaimed in a bubbly tone as she booped the baby's nose. My aunt had just given birth, a baby boy. He squirmed around on the table his back rubbing against the soft blanket. He swirled his tongue around, his eyes full of wonder as they darted around. My whole family loomed above him. My aunt, June, looked down at him with proud eyes. Her husband, my uncle, Luke, almost shed a tear. My grandma, Mary, had this smile on her face, almost devilish. My grandpa, Danny, right next to her, like two peas in a pod. My mother stood next to me, her hands on my shoulders, my father standing behind her. I watched uncomfortably as they rubbed their hands across all the baby's body, admiring his soft skin. My throat slowly started nodding up. I jumped in my seat, my eyes twitching as my grandma raised up a shining blade and swung it down into the child's face. My neck cranked at the feeling of blood splashing against my cheek. The knife went completely through its head. The tip of the blade pressed into the wooden table. My grandma pulled the knife out, blood dripping off. I looked around at everyone. They were drooling over its corpse. My grandma slowly slid her tongue against the blade, licking off a sliver of blood. 
She pulled her tongue back into her mouth, her eyes rolling into the back of her head. Sweet youth, she moaned, a grin on her face. Dig in, my aunt chirped. My family knocked into my shoulders, rushing towards the body. They raised their knives and began slicing off limbs. Blood squirted across the table as they dismembered arms, flesh, and muscles stretching as it severed. I watched my grandma sink her teeth into the severed arm, blood trickling down her chin. She chewed slowly, savoring each bite. Her hair slowly began changing, the gray strands almost instantly changing to a grayish brown. Her wrinkly skin grew tighter and smoother. She looked like she had gone from 75 to 55. My grandpa tore a leg off, blood pouring down the table. He sunk his teeth into it like corn, pulling on strands of skin. And just like grandma, his frizzy gray hair began to transform colors, reverting to grayish blonde, bald spots filled in with clumps of hair. His skin smoothed out. My mother and father didn't need very much, so they picked lightly. My mother reached over with a fork and picked one of the eyeballs, tucking it off of meaty strings. She observed the small, shiny eyeball and then plopped it in her mouth like a piece of gum. My father took the other eyeball, blood squirting out of the empty socket and dripping down the side of its face. My uncle reached over with his knife and opened the baby's mouth and yanked its tongue out of its mouth and began slicing it off with the knife. Blood filled its mouth and squirted down its neck as my uncle chewed on the tongue like fat from steak. They continued to pick it apart, taking any limb or organ that fulfilled their insatiable desire. They began to slice it open after taking most of the outside. They slid down its stomach and pried its corpse open. These are the goods, like a piñata, my aunt choked as they dug their hands around its organs. They pulled out stringy intestines, slurping on them like sausages. My grandma went right for the gold, tearing out its small heart. She raised it above her mouth, tilting her head back. She clenched the heart tightly, blood pouring down her mouth and to the sides of her face. My family cheered her on, as if she were chugging a beer at a frat party. She juiced out every last drop, licking excess blood off her lips. She then devoured the rest of the heart until there was no more. My uncle bit off pieces of lung like a pork chop. I watched as my family ravaged the corpse, blood smearing everywhere. I began to think about my siblings. I knew I had three of them, but I only remember one. I only ever met one. I don't even remember his name. I just remember playing with him one day, and he was gone the next. My train of thought broke when I noticed a head in front of me. My uncle dangled his head in front of me, soaked in blood. Between his fingertips, a small toe with a nail ripped off. I looked up at him, my eyes shaking. He had this soft, encouraging look on his face. It was disturbing. I couldn't push the words out. So my mother interjected. Oh, please, she doesn't need that, she chuckled. Be grateful for that one, my uncle said, dropping the toe in his mouth. By the time they were done, the body had been picked clean. The only things left were bones and pieces of meat to save for later. I eyed the carcass, and it looked like it was attacked by rabid dogs. I looked around at my family. My grandpa and grandma looked young enough to be parents, and my aunt and uncle could pass as my older siblings. Maria, honey, why don't you go to bed? My mother said quietly, kissing the top of my head. I stood up, leaving the table, as my family bantered. I walked upstairs, the old stairs creaking as my feet hit each one. I went to the bathroom, quickly sliding in and shutting the door behind me. I turned the light on, and the room illuminating. I looked at myself in the mirror, my big brown eyes staring back at me. I scraped off the dried blood that splashed on my tan skin. I felt like crying. Why did I feel like crying? I've seen it before. It, it doesn't really get any easier. I, I understand, but do I? There was no point in questioning it. It was just one of those things. I should be grateful that they didn't choose me, that my parents chose parenthood over youth. I left the bathroom.
Walking back to my room, I slowed my pace down when I heard the faint sound of grainy breathing. I looked around the dark hallway. I looked at the door next to me. The sound was coming from behind it. And then I remembered. My great-grandma Lorraine. She's been on the brink of death since the 90s. They always intended to involve her in the feast every time, but they get selfish and end up barely giving her scraps. Being in old age for over a decade has crippled her. She sits in her room and never leaves. They bring up slices of skin and chunks of meat on a plate like a dog. I know they don't care about her, only about the bloodline. I entered my room and plopped under my bed, my body sinking into the cold, soft mattress as I drifted off to sleep. I wake up suddenly, startled by the sound of arguing. I open my eyes slowly, my eyeballs feeling dry. I slowly sat up, still a bit dazed. I overheard a loud conversation. It's not fucking working anymore, my grandpa exclaimed, his voice muffled to the floors. Did she eat any at all? My uncle asked. Yes, and it didn't do anything, my grandpa answered. Does it ever do anything? My mom snarled. Don't be fucking stupid. It's kept her barely alive for years. Why isn't it working? His rage grew, followed by a bang against a table. Calm down. Why didn't you save more? My dad chimed in. Why didn't you save more? Why didn't any of you save more? He barked back. Please just shut up. She's been alive for this long. She can go a little longer without. My aunt groaned. I knew they were talking about my great-grandma. I guess they got a little too selfish this time. She... she can't die. She's my mother, for Christ's sake. He shouted. We'll figure something out. My mom suddenly interjected. They stayed silent for a moment. My ear is wide open. The girl, my grandma suddenly proposed. What? My grandpa asked, annoyed. Maria, she's young enough. Good amount of meat on those bones, the creaky voice explained. My body went numb as the words flowed through my ears. It couldn't have been serious. No, we made a deal, my mom growled, her voice beginning to shake. We did it with the others. She'll understand. We're family. My grandma tried to convince her. Fuck that. She's family. My daughter, you fucking hag. Don't ever try that again. My mom attacked. I flinched at the sound of a smack that rang through the floorboards. We brought you into this family. You are where you are today because of us. My grandma hissed. There was silence for a moment. We did it with the others previously. This is just how it has to be, my uncle reassured her. I'm not doing this. Touch her and I'll fucking eat you instead, my mom declared, the sound of pounding footsteps following. We'll get her in a few hours. It'll have to be a bit of a surprise. She won't cooperate. My grandma planned. My heart dropped into my stomach. I needed to make a move. Now. I threw my blanket off of myself and hopped out of bed. I stepped onto the floor, squinting my eyes after realizing I might have stomped too hard, praying it wasn't loud. No other noises followed, so I started throwing around ideas in my head. I tried to map out the layout of my house in my head. Six family members looking for me. My brain scrambled when I heard the sounds of multiple footsteps. I quietly opened my door, sliding out of my room quickly. I observed the long hallway, and no one was in sight. My house is pretty much a mansion, a courtesy of my great-grandmother's fortune. I slowly walked down the hall, my socks sinking into the old carpet. I heard muffled whispers beneath the floor. My best bet would be to sneak down the stairs and bolt out the front door. I crept closer to the staircase, trying not to alert anybody of my presence. 
Suddenly, my aunt turned the corner as she reached the top step. I froze in place, my heart racing. She turned to look at me, silent for a moment. A grin grew on her face. Maria, there you are. Could you please come downstairs and help with the cleanup? Your poor Aunt June's back is taking a toll. She let out a try-hard giggle. I thought for a moment, trying to plan my next move. Then I realized, they don't know that I know. I straightened my posture, closing my widened eyes, but my guard was still up. Sure. Uh, can I go to the bathroom quickly? I asked. Yeah, actually, can I come in with you quickly? Gotta grab some ibuprofen. She smiled, tilting her head to the side. Bitch. I nodded and walked over to the bathroom. She wouldn't walk next to me, only ominously behind me. I looked out of the corners of my eyes as I entered the bathroom. I'll grab it quickly and be out of your hair. She approached the medicine cabinet. Stupidly, I let my eyes off of her when I looked down at the toilet, noticing the creaking pipes. All of a sudden, I felt hands push me over with full force. I yelped as I slipped on the tile floor, trying to grab the toilet to regain balance. My hands slipped as well. And my forehead crashed into the side of the bathtub. The impact rippled through my head. Blood began to trickle down my face. I slowly opened my shaking eyes, my vision blurry. Just make this easy. She groaned as I felt her kneel behind me. She balled a clump of hair in her fist and pulled my head back. I looked up, blood sliding past my eye. Just a sliver and some more. Her mouth stretched into a sinister smile as I saw a knife go towards my arm. Still dizzy from the hit, I used all my strength I had and swung my elbow, knocking into her nose. She fell off of me on her knees, leaning over the tub next to me. I stood up, almost falling backwards. I blinked tightly a few times, trying to clear my vision. I looked down, and she was covering her nose with her two hands, the knife on the floor next to her. It was too risky. She released her hands, placing them on the lining of the tub to help her get up. Before she could lift herself up, I raised my leg and dropped my foot on top of her head. Her head crashed down, her mouth ricocheting against the lining. A knocked out tooth sliding into the tub. I quickly whipped around and dashed out of the room. I ran for my life down the hallway, finding any room to run into. You little cunt. Danny. Her cries echoed out from the bathroom. I continued to run, my feet stomping, then halted harshly, almost leaving tire marks when I hit a dead end. The only door left on this side of the floor. I looked behind me, waiting for a furious ant to come for blood. I heard quick footsteps run up the stairs. Oh my god, what happened? My uncle asked. I turned back around and barged into the room. I shut it behind me quietly, trying not to give away my location. I looked around the room and it was pitch black. I dragged my hands across the walls to feel for the light switch. And when I flipped the switch under my fingers, I flipped out. The room illuminated. I was in one of the dozens of living rooms. Couches you weren't allowed to sit on. Tables you'd get crucified for if you set a drink down on them. The room painted a light maroon. The fancy sofas a bright pink. I looked around for any windows to escape, but they were all too small to escape through. I quickly noticed the two medieval armor statues that stood like guards together at the back of the room. I walked towards them, feeling like they were going to get possessed and leap at me like in Scooby-Doo. The light reflected off of their shining silver armor, their hands clasped together, holding long swords like canes. I kneeled down, dragging my finger down the side of the blade. I raised my finger up, noticing blood coming from a paper-cut-sized incision. They're real. I noticed the blood from my head dripping off my chin. I wiped the stream of blood that ran down my face, smearing it on the back of my hand. I stood up and looked behind me at the door. I haven't heard a sound since I escaped my aunt. I looked back at the statue. Suddenly, a light bulb lit up above my head. 
I grabbed the statue's fingers. They were easily adjustable. I pulled them back one by one until I stepped aside as the sword dropped to the floor. I grabbed the handle with two hands and tried to lift it. Jesus Christ. I groaned as the sword had an unexpected weight. I felt my face turn red as I tried to lift it above my head, but my arms gave out and I had to drop it to the floor. I panted as I tried to catch my breath. I could lift it at least up to my stomach. I realized how loud the sword was when I heard footsteps quickly approaching the room. My eyes widened as I began dragging the sword over to the door. I quickly ran over and turned off the lights, planting myself in front of the door, lifting up the sword and holding it like a spear. I aimed the tip towards the entryway, waiting for someone to walk. The footsteps grew closer, the pounding shaking the floor. I tightened my grip, my arms shaking, my gaze locked. The footsteps reached the door, the doorknob slowly turning. The door flew open, light outlining the silhouette of a man standing in the hallway. Where the fuck are you? My uncle called out. I put all of my might into it. Cutting off his words as I rammed the sword through his stomach, he let out a drop of air as it escaped his lungs. His mouth dropped open. I slowly trekked closer to him, pushing against his weight as I impaled the sword deeper into him. Blood began trickling out of his mouth. A look of fear glimmered in his eyes. I pushed the sword far enough that the base of the handle prevented me from pushing any further. He looked down at me, the life leaving his eyes. He tried lifting his hand, his skin losing color. He reached for my neck, lifting his other hand as well. And before he could get a hold of me, he collapsed to the ground, the sword still inside of him. I looked down at his corpse, my chest pumping, a pool of blood forming under him. I couldn't believe I had just done that, but it oddly didn't feel bad. No! A voice cried out from down the hallway. I looked down the hallway... My aunt stood, a knife in her hand. Her light brown hair was frizzy, looking like a bird's nest. I could see a broken heart in her eyes as she watched me standing over her husband's body. The heartbreak quickly transitions to rage. Her jaw was shaking with anger, her mouth covered in dried blood. She slowly raised up the knife, looking bloodthirsty. I stared her back down, trying not to show fear when I was really just frozen. She broke into a sprint, letting out an ear-piercing cry as she flew down the hallway. My fight-or-flight kicked in, and before she could reach me, I slammed the door shut and locked it. I jumped back as the knife pierced through the door. You little shit! I'll fucking gut you! She screamed from behind the door, retracting the knife and stabbing it back through. I looked around for something to defend myself. I, I didn't have enough time or strength to grab the other sword. My time was cut off when she began kicking the door. I slowly stepped back, eyes still on the door, trying to back up as far as possible. I could tell adrenaline was running through her veins when the door gave in after three kicks. The door swung open, the knob crashing into the wall. She stood in the doorway, her upper body moving up and down. She was breathing like a beast. I walked around the sofas, standing behind the small glass coffee table. She began walking after me quickly. I sidestepped quickly, trying to run her in a circle around the sofas. With no defense, she caught up to me quickly, grabbing my hair before I could turn around and making a run for it. I screamed as she threw me backwards, dropping me onto the glass. The thin glass instantly shattered behind me. My back pressed against hundreds of shards. Before I could try and get myself up, she pounced on top of me like an animal. Our gazes crossed. Her eyes lit with fire. I'll savor this one. She hissed through her teeth, raising the knife up high. Her knees pressed into my stomach. I struggled to reach for a piece of glass. I stretched my arm out, but couldn't get a grip on a big piece. She swung down, my impulse reaction being to raise my hand up. I blocked the knife with my hand, the blade going through my palm. The blade pierced entirely through, the handle pressing against the wound. Not able to squeeze out a scream, the shock numbing the pain, I watched as blood trickled into my face. I quickly snatched a big chunk of glass and jabbed it into the side of her neck. 
The look of anger on her face dropped as blood squirted into my hand. Using all of my strength, I gripped the shard tightly and dragged it across her neck, blood pouring out as I left a rigid gash that ran across the entire front of her neck. When I reached the other side of her neck, I ripped the shard out, leaving a wound deep enough to hit her windpipe. A long cut imprinted from the glass pressed against my hand. She fell over, gargling blood in her mouth, slowly stood up, tripping on shards of glass. I looked down at her body, the youth slowly leaving her. Strands of gray hair grew back, small wrinkles forming on her skin. The pain finally hit me as I looked at my hand. The knife still stabbed through. I took a deep breath and held it as I tightly gripped the handle. I slowly pulled the knife out, the sound of metal grinding against flesh and bone. Fuck! I shrieked in pain as I took the knife out, tears streaming down my cheeks as I lifted up my shaking hands, blood streaming down my arms as I observed the massive hole the knife left. I had no time to cry as I heard footsteps running upstairs. They had heard my scream. I quickly ran out of the room, keeping the knife as a weapon, and down the hallway. I needed to get out of the house. Before I could turn the corner, someone quickly grabbed my hand and snatched me inside of a dark closet. I squirmed around, punching and kicking everywhere, swinging the knife around. Who is this? I'll fucking kill you! I threatened as I twisted and turned. Suddenly, Hands grabbed my shoulders, trying to get me to stop wriggling. Shh, it's me, my mother whispered reassuringly. I stopped moving at the reassuring sound of her voice. Oh, thank God. Everyone's going fucking insane. I've literally killed Uncle Danny and Aunt June. Oh my God, I killed them. I panicked, the situation truly setting in. It's okay, you did what you had to do. Another voice reassured me. I realized my father was in here as well. What are you guys doing in here? I asked quietly. I'm assuming you know. The plan. I stormed away up here. Your father and I talked in here for privacy. When we heard the fighting, we stayed out of fear. She explained. What do we do? I begged for a plan. I, I don't know. There's no way to make it downstairs, she added on. I just want to get out of here. I quietly sobbed. My father stayed silent for a moment. It sounded like he was choked up. I, I'm sorry. I love you. But it's for the family, he suddenly declared. What? I questioned confusedly. Don't do this, my mother pleaded breathlessly. What? What's going on? I began to panic. She's in here, my father called out. My whole body sank. I felt like I was spiraling in a dream. He threw the door open and shoved me out in the hallway, dropping the knife inside of the closet. I stumbled around, falling against the wall. The sound of running came from downstairs, sounding like bulls. I regained balance and began running back to the room where my aunt and uncle laid to rest. Stop! My father called out to me. I stopped dead in my tracks, my entire body shaking. I slowly turned around, my cheeks soaked with tears. My father stood at the other end of the hallway, a rifle in hand aimed at me. I froze like a deer in headlights. He kept his aim steady his eye looking to aim. Please, don't do this. I begged through my tears. As he was about to pull the trigger, my mother came out from the closet and lunged at him. She leaped out of the closet, slicing his waist with a knife. I jumped where I stood as the bullet just missed me, hitting the door frame behind me. He turns to my mother, a look of fury painted his face. You stupid whore, he roared, hitting her with the stock of the rifle. She cried as she fell to the ground, blood dripping onto the carpet. He swung it up, hitting his chin and knocking her on her back. He stood over her, holding the rifle with two hands and began bashing it into his face. No, no, stop, I cried out, 
barely able to get the words out. I watched with empty lungs as he repeatedly bashed her face in. Her nose snapped to the side, eventually caving into her face. Blood splattered across the floor, her eyeball beginning to pop out. The sight was nauseating, but I had no time to mourn. I tried running down the hall and past him, but he put a hold on bashing your face in and swung the rifle into the back of my head as I flew past him. I groaned as I tumbled to the ground, my face burning as my skin rubbed against the carpet. I felt his pounding footsteps coming towards me. I took a chance at making a hit and kicked my foot back. My timing was perfect, and my foot rammed into his ankle. Fuck! He groaned in frustration, and before he could stand up, I grabbed the gun from his hands and knocked him on the top of the head with it. He fell to his knees, his hands planted on the ground, blood trickling through his dark hair. I stood in front of him, the rifle in my hands. I lifted his chin up with the barrel of the rifle, looking at him in the eye. The fire in his eyes had been blown out. He looked scared now. I crammed the barrel into his mouth. He gurgled as the cold metal filled his mouth. I tilted the gun down, aiming the barrel up. He looked up at me with pleading eyes, but I barely gave it any thought as I pulled the trigger. The bullet burst through the top of his head. Blood and brain matter flew through the air. I flinched as blood and chunks hit my face. I retracted the gun, and he fell over, the hole in his head pouring blood onto the carpet. What have you done? A voice cried out from the end of the hallway. I looked up. My grandpa stood at the end of the hallway, his hand gripped tightly on a hay hook, presumably from our barn. He looked around, observing my body count. A look of horror on his face. He came storming down the hall, quickly stopping in his tracks when I raised up the rifle. I aimed him down, keeping him where he stood. I pulled the trigger, but the gun only clicked. I looked down at the gun in confusion and pulled the trigger again. It clicked. He was out of bullets. I looked up at him, and he laughed at me. He began walking towards me again. I dropped the gun, looking around me with the looking around me with the mere seconds I had to find something else to defend myself. The knife was nowhere to be found. I thought my mother may have fallen on top of it, but I didn't have time to move her body. I swiftly ran into the closet, grabbing anything I could find in the darkness. My hand grazed across a wooden baseball bat. I snatched it quickly, until the jarring sensation of a blade dug into my shoulder. He had swung the hook into my skin, leaving me screaming in agony as he pressed his foot against my back. Pulling the hook in deeper, he yanked it back, knocking a windless scream out of me and dragging me back into the hallway. I tried to keep my grip on the baseball bat, but it slipped out and plopped right outside the door frame. I wriggled as he dragged me out, the hook feeling like it was about to tear right through my skin. He dropped me, blood soaking through my shirt. He vigorously ripped the hook out from my skin, earning another agonizing scream from me. I placed my hand over the oozing wound, squinting, squinting my tear-filled eyes. He raised his arm up, ready to gouge my eyes out. I swiftly rolled over, just missing his attack. The hook pierced through the carpet and into the wooden floor. He groaned as he struggled with pulling it out, as it got caught on strings from the torn carpet. I stood up wobbly, growing dizzy from the blood loss. I stumbled over to the closet and grabbed the baseball bat. I lifted it up, swirled it in the air, and aimed it down, building up a good enough swing. Before he could get the hook out, he looked up at me. I swung the bat up, slamming it into his chin. He stood up, his legs moving like jelly. His back slammed against the wall. I had caved his jaw in. Teeth fell out, along with a waterfall of blood. The crunchy sound of broken bones as he tried to open his mouth. The youth was slowly leaving him. Wrinkles grew quickly. Strands of hair growing from blonde to gray. Patches of hair retracting into his scalp and forming bald spots. He looked like a grandpa again. I lowered the blood-soaked bat again and hit him with another uppercut. His head splitting off his body. 
jumping up with his spine attached to it like a toy. His head slid back down into his neck, and he stumbled around, blood circling down his entire neck. He collapsed to the ground, blood pouring everywhere. I stood over him, my heart and lungs on fire. I couldn't believe I had just done that. He broke like porcelain. I dropped the bat with tired hands and looked for the knife. It was an easier and more lethal weapon. I approached my mother's corpse. Her bloody face caved in. I wiped a tear that came quickly. She saved me. The only family member who wasn't trying to eat me. I rolled her body over, weakened from all the wounds. The knife was hidden under her body. I grabbed it and stumbled down the hallway. I flew down the steps, tripping on a few of them. I limped towards the front door, the feeling of escape so close. I grabbed the cold metal handle. I took a deep breath, trying to keep myself conscious, and I turned the knob and cracked open the door. The sweet taste of freedom turned sour as I felt a sharp pain in my upper arm. I began to scream, my shout growing louder as the pain grew stronger. I looked over, and my grandma was sinking her teeth into my arm, her eyes rolling into the back of her head, my arm spazzing from the pain, my grip on the knife loosening and dropping it to the ground. She collected a clump of bloody flesh in her mouth and began to pull on it, my skin and the muscle stretching like gum. I fell to my knees, screaming until my throat practically bled. She pulled farther until my skin gave out and broke off. She chewed on the chunk of meat, swirling it around in her mouth like a piece of steak. She threw her head back, moaning in pleasure as she fed off my youth. Her hair grew longer, the gray strands vanishing, and her skin looking baby soft. She reached her peak age once again. She cackled devilishly as I looked down in horror at the gushing wound she left. I swiftly grabbed the knife off the ground and sliced her ankle. You little bitch, she exclaimed in pain. I tried to open the door and run away as far as I could, but I was too slow. She wrapped her hand around my neck, dragging me back and choke slamming me to the ground, the knife slipping out of my hands, sliding just out of reach. She sat on top of me, wrapping both hands around my neck. She slowly squeezed tighter and tighter, completely blocking my windpipe. Tears in my eyes filled to the brim as I felt the blood trapped in my head. I coughed up saliva as I wriggled around to break free. She stared down at me, flashing her teeth with a ferocious smile as she awaited my demise. She leaned in closer. I love watching the life fade out of the young, like draining blood from a chicken. She sniggered as I slowly began to black out. I made one last attempt at survival before she crushed my windpipe. I stretched my hand out, my fingers about to detach as I reached for the knife. I grazed the handle of the knife with my fingertips. It was so close. The energy in my arm grew weaker as my neck tightened in her clutch. Right before my life began flashing before my eyes, I got a decent grip of the knife. She began opening her mouth wide, ready to bite down on my face and feast. Before she could, I lifted up the knife with every bit of life left in me and shoved the blade into her mouth. Blood immediately began pouring out of her throat and onto my face. Her grip slowly began to let go, my throat clearing up space to breathe. I took in as many breaths as I could as I slowly pushed the knife deeper. She choked up blood, squirting it onto my face as I pierced the knife through the back of her throat. I twisted the knife around, the blade grinding against her teeth. She fell over, her grip entirely loosened. I took in a breath so deep it could have popped my lungs. I could feel the blood flowing back through my body. I coughed up a bit of bloody saliva. I looked over at her corpse. Her hair turned to frail silver again, and her skin wrinkly and blick, and her skin wrinkly and baggy. I did it. I survived. Everyone. I disorientedly stood up, 
the sudden movement too much for my body to handle. I approached the door. The coolness of the handle soothed my hand. But before I could leave, I remembered I had forgotten something. I leaned down and pulled a knife out from my grandmother's throat, blood spurting out from her throat and across the tan wooden floor. I limped upstairs, walked down the hall. I looked at the bodies as I passed them. When I reached the room, I could hear my great-grandmother's dying breaths. I slowly opened the door, the light from the hall peering into the dark room. My great-grandma sat in a wheelchair, one they never cared to let her move around in. I approached her with a stare. You would have thought she was dead if her lungs weren't pumping. She didn't look at me. I didn't think she even knew I was there. I tilted my head, just staring at her as she slowly breathed with a deep wheeze. It was a strangely peaceful connection for a moment. But all good things come to an end. I cranked my arm back and swung the knife into the side of her head. The blade went straight through, the tip of it pointing out the other side of her face. She didn't look any different than when she was alive. Blood trickled down the side of her face as she slumped over in her chair. I stayed silent, watching her corpse lie. I stood and thought to myself for a moment. Fuck this family. Have you ever been in love? If you have, you know what it feels like. It's a force stronger than any logical reasoning. We are swept and thrashed by it like a wooden ship trying to fight a furious ocean storm. And even if we survive the storm, we shall take massive damage. And the wreck inside lasts for the rest of our lives. But if you are lucky, if you are truly blessed, you meet the one who is willing to love you in all your wretchedness. They refuse to jump ship even when they see you for the revolting creature you truly are. Forgive my sentimentality. I'm a romantic man. I grew up in Chile, a small country at the very south of the world, thin and narrow, with the driest desert in the world, and to its north and glacials so pure and white in the south that they seem to glow a bluish hue. The culture there is a mix of European traditions as well as Andean Amerindian superstitions. So when something truly magical happens, it feels like something ordinary. Isn't that how most of us treat love? We treat something magical as if it were mundane. Many mysterious things have happened to my family and to myself, and this one happened in the early 20th century. To one of my great-granduncles, who was a sailor near the small town of Constitucion, six hours south of the capital city, Santiago de Chile. My uncle loved the sea. He loved the illusion of freedom that traveling from port to port gave him. A woman and a story in every port, they said back then. Never settling down, he truly was a ladies' man and a heartbreaker, but he was also admired by his mates, as they considered him an alpha. He was tall and strong with a physique naturally built by manual labor, the kind of guy you want on your corner during a fight. He did love the ocean, and sometimes his mates would find him alone in the middle of the night by the edge of the ship, grabbing onto the rail as if contemplating to jump into the water his gaze lost in the dark, unseen distance. And when one of his closest mates would ask him what he was doing there in the middle of the night, he would tell them he was listening to the singing. It was so beautiful. His mates couldn't hear anything, and they thought he was pranking them. But this happens too many times for it to just be a prank, so maybe he truly heard something calling out to him from the distant horizon deep at sea. Who knows? My uncle wasn't a sentimental man like me. Instead, he enjoyed a good party and a stiff drink. And every time him and his mates arrived at a new port, 
they would walk the streets like a pack of wolves, hunting for defenseless lambs, looking for the most beautiful girls to keep them company, and my uncle being a handsome man always got first pick. Even though he had the prettiest girls around him, he still felt like they were missing something. So after he had his fun with them, he didn't stay to hold them or get to know them. He would go to the shore and stare into the distance, as if that voice calling out to him from the depths gave him more fulfillment than the touch of a beautiful woman. One of those nights, while my uncle sat by the shore of the beach, gazing into the distance, after having his way with a couple of local girls, he spotted something in the water. Skin so white it glowed silvery under the full moon, hair so long like seaweed as it hung wet down her body. And when she turned around, he saw her face. Perfect. It was perfect. The most beautiful face he had seen. And he had seen lots of pretty girls, but there's a difference between pretty and beautiful. And this girl was beautiful. He couldn't control himself. He, he couldn't help it. He had to see her up close. So fully clothed, he stepped into the water. The waves were up to his waist. And as he got closer to her, he saw she was even more beautiful than he thought earlier. She turned to look back at him and held his gaze. She was naked, only covered by her long hair that looked dark green under the full moon, like seaweed on the rocks. And he couldn't help himself. He touched her silvery white skin. She was so cold, but felt so soft. She didn't seem scared of him. He didn't try to run away. Instead, she signaled for him to come closer, and before you could embrace her, she embraced him, kissed him, and held on to him. She was so cold, a colder than a person should be, but she didn't shiver at all, and he enjoyed her embrace. They didn't exchange words, only kisses and embraces there in the shallow of the beach, and as they kissed and held each other tenderly, my uncle noticed that they were getting deeper into the water. Now the waves were up to his neck, but he didn't worry. He was a good swimmer and being with this most beautiful girl was worth the risk. But this moment didn't last for too much longer. Soon, my uncle's mates were yelling from the shore, calling out to him, and as he shouted back at them, it was time to get back to the ship. But he couldn't leave her there. He begged her to come with him. For the first time ever, he wanted to know a woman as more than an adventure. She told him she couldn't go with him this time. But she would find him again, she promised him, that she'd always find him. So with this reassurance that he wouldn't lose what he never knew he needed, he got out of the water and walked to the beach, soaked and heavy but light-hearted, all smiles. His mates teased him for letting a girl get him into that shape, but he didn't care. She was special and he turned around to look back at her and wave, but she had already left the beach, so we could only hope she kept her word. The very next day, while my uncle and his mates were out in the town, walking the outdoors market by the port, with a mixture of stands selling fruits and vegetables, second-hand goods, antiques, and artisan jewelry, etc., my uncle saw the beautiful woman, she was wearing a simple white dress that fit loosely around her body, and her hair was lighter than he remembered it. A beautiful ash blonde instead of the green that the full moon and salt water seemed to cast on her the night before. And she was fair-skinned, but not nearly as pale and silvery as under the full moon. But that face was extraordinarily beautiful, as he remembered. He went to her holding her hand and leaving his mates behind, walking along the port and seawall with her, asking about her and where she came from, as he had never done with other girls. But she didn't like talking about herself. Instead, she wanted to know all about him, about his travels and his adventures, and 
He told her as she listened attentively and wide-eyed. It was almost sunset, and he had to go report to the ship, but he asked to see her that night, and she said yes. As my uncle walked back to port, an old gypsy woman walked behind him, waddling behind him as she held herself together with a cane. He had seen her earlier selling artisan crafts at the outdoors market, and he stopped to look at her and see if she needed help. But instead, when she got up to him, she grabbed his wrist and squeezed tightly. With tears and fear in her eyes, she said, Not her. Leave alone. The woman had a thick Eastern European accent, obviously didn't speak much English, so my uncle stood there trying to understand what the woman wanted, and she repeated, Not her. Leave alone. My uncle just looked at the old gypsy lady as she repeated, Leave alone. Mahrimi. As she spat on the floor three times, still tightly squeezing his wrist. My uncle pulled away from the old lady as she screamed, Mahrimi. At him which is not a word he recognized, so he walked away from her and got back to the ship. My uncle met his beautiful lady again that night. He was curious about her, and she finally relented and told him she wasn't from the town. She had grown up used to traveling, and soon she'd get back home. Soon she'd need to leave, or she wouldn't be able to get back home, but that she'd always find him. He assumed that she must be a traveler, a gypsy, and perhaps that's why the old gypsy lady acted so strange with him, as a girl of the tribe isn't supposed to be with someone who is not a gypsy. My uncle barely knew this beautiful girl, but he thought himself in love with her, and with both of them traveling around, he feared he would lose her. So he begged her to stay with him and not go back home, but she couldn't do that. If she didn't leave by sunrise, she would not be able to go home and he said he understood, but still he planned to keep her with him. They found a little hotel in which they could spend the night together, and they made love for hours. He didn't want to leave her in silence after the climax as he did with other girls. He wanted to hold on to her. He wanted her to be his wife. So after hours of love making, he cuddled her, caressed her soft, fair skin, and stroking her beautiful blonde hair. He wrapped his arms around her all night. By morning, the beautiful girl had woken up before sunrise. She tried to leave the bedroom so she could go home, as she had told my uncle she needed to do. But he held on to her, overpowering her with his strong body, and although she struggled against him and asked him to release her, he didn't let go. Instead, he kissed her and held her firmly, but gently, as if holding something extremely delicate, and for a moment he thought she could break in his arms as she struggled to break free from his embrace. But by sunrise, she surrendered. She cried so gently, and he thought she was even more beautiful when she was sad. She told him she had nowhere to go now, nowhere to call home, so my uncle told her she had him and wanted her as his bride. He wanted to settle down with her, and he was in love with her. He promised her she had his heart. My heart is yours, and as long as I live, you'll always have me, and we'll make a home together. She believed him. They bought a little house together, with the savings my uncle had, a cozy cabin overlooking the ocean, and they settled down. My uncle worked in town as a fisherman, and his beautiful lady kept their house, cooked for them, and always had a pleasant disposition for him when he arrived, tired after a long day. They were a happy couple living a simple life. But that's the thing about happiness. For many people, settling down and living a simple, happy life isn't enough. It wasn't for my uncle. He missed being a sailor and just going out into the ocean to fish wasn't enough. He missed traveling and going to different ports, uh, meeting new people and meeting new girls, even if the most beautiful one was waiting for him at home. 
A year had gone by and he decided he would go back to being a sailor. He needed excitement in his life. He told the news to his beautiful bride, but she didn't take it well. He wanted to leave her already to go on adventures while she had left everything behind to stay with him. He didn't understand what the big deal was. He would be gone for a few months, six or eight, but he would return. He would send her money to keep their house in order, and he'd come back in less than a year. She was heartbroken, but she let him go. She had met him a sailor, and she understood he wouldn't change for her as she had changed for him. My uncle was always a ladies' man, and old habits die hard. He still enjoyed a stiff drink or a few. He wasn't cut out to be a husband and a father or a householder. He needed to float around from shore to shore to feel alive. And thus, he was back to his old tricks. A new girl in every port while a lonely bride waited for him on the distant shore. Six months went by. Eight months. And then a year. He was not back home within a year, as he had said, and he wasn't planning on going back just yet. And soon after the letters and the money stopped, and his lonely bride was left stranded waiting for him on that distant shore. A year and a half later, my uncle was in Valparaiso, a beautiful port city about an hour west from the capital city of Santiago de Chile. And as always, he was surrounded by pretty girls and drunken sailors. He no longer heard anything calling out to him in the distant horizon. There was nothing anchoring him. He was swept around by his passions, and that's all he lived for. As he parted with his sailor mates and their pretty young female companions, another female figure entered the tavern. She wore a dirty and worn-out dress, stained gray, though at some time in the past it had been white. Her hair was a matted mess, as if coarse from salt water, and there were large bags under her eyes from so much crying. I found you, she cried. I told you I would always find you. She cried. W what are you doing here? said my uncle. I came for you. I haven't heard from you in months. I, I was so worried. I've missed you so much, cried the beautiful lady in such a pathetic state. You shouldn't have come back for me. I'm not going back with you. I'm sorry, he said in a tone that almost showed embarrassment from his actions. But you promised, she cried as she grabbed him by the arm, but... Instead of embracing her and calming her down as he had done when they first met, he struck her. He hit her so hard she fell to the floor, blood dripping from her lip, and she cried loudly, humiliated. The drunken sailors and their whores laughed. No one came to her rescue. No one spoke on her behalf. She picked herself up and left the tavern. My uncle didn't go after her as he should have as an honorable man would have done. Instead, he kept drinking and playing games with the little harlots he had been acquainted with. Later that night, when my uncle and his sailor mates returned to the ship, she was waiting for him by the shore. What do you want now? asked the drunken fool who couldn't appreciate something precious. I just want what belongs to me. I came to collect what you said is mine. She spoke with an emotionless, empty voice. His drunken friends laughed at her, and he asked them to leave so he could talk to this crazy broad. So they left him alone with his former lady by the rocky shore. No one knows exactly what happened after, but my uncle didn't return to the ship. And for days after, there was a search for him and his former bride. Eventually, they found his sailor uniform on the rocks, along with a torn, stained dress she wore. A few days later, they found him. He was floating face down, livid flesh and swollen as those who die drowning at sea end up. 
disfigured almost beyond recognition. But that was not all. His chest was ripped open. Not a cut made by a knife, but something blunt that tore his flesh. His heart was gone, and his insides were all torn to chunks, or perhaps eaten. They never found his bride. To this day, small towns across the Chilean seashore tell stories about the Lady of the Sea. A beautiful woman who bathes nude in the ocean during the full moon. You can look at her from afar, but never get too close. It's said many young men don't heed this warning and are so enchanted by her beauty they must touch her. Those poor fools are found drowned and disfigured. Their hearts devoured, eaten from the inside out by fish. It's easy to let yourself believe that there's no such thing as a community anymore. With everyone tied to their online identities and social circles, neighbors often remain strangers, only coming together by chance or tragedy. I sure as hell didn't plan on getting to know my neighbors when my family moved into our house. They didn't seem unfriendly, but I just didn't see the point in getting to know them. My wife and I had our own friends already, and our boys would rather play video games inside than get to know the other kids of the neighborhood. As I said before, sometimes people are brought together. For us, it was tragedy. It happened before I got home from work. The crowd had dispersed and the ambulance was gone, but the drying blood still stained the sidewalk. I heard the story from my wife. A boy from across the street was walking home from school when a car swerved and ran him down. The boy's mother, who was sitting on the porch, watched it happen. Her screams brought everyone else out of their homes, and they called 911 while she cradled her son's broken body in her arms. The driver, an old man, had died of a heart attack while behind the wheel. An accident the worst luck in the world, the kind of tragedy that fills you with an anger you can't blame on anyone. We all reached out to the mother, Miss Ramirez, in the wake of her son's untimely death, and to each other for support. We learned all of our neighbors' names in those weeks, started actually talking to one another, and suddenly this cold street became a real neighborhood for all of us. My family wasn't the first to leave flowers on the spot where the boy died, but we contributed. One of my brothers knew that Miss Ramirez was religious, so he used his allowance to buy a rosary, which he tied to the fence. No one was shy about showing their support during that first week, not until someone added an effigy to the memorial one Sunday morning. When it first appeared, it looked like a cross two white wooden boards that were nailed together and bound the fence. I didn't bother to ask anyone about it, assuming that someone had seen my son's contribution and decided to add to it. The following morning, someone had nailed a third piece of wood to the top, giving it a stick figure-like appearance. I asked my wife if she knew who'd put it up, and she told me she had no idea. The third morning, the circle had a smiley face crudely drawn onto the surface, almost like a mockery of the boy's death. That started a conversation among the adults, who agreed that a child must have been behind it. We all asked our kids, but no one admitted to doing it. At this point, none of us were upset or irrationally mad, but it was unsettling to see the works of someone who seemed uniquely interested in reminding us that Someone had died on our street. The final addition to the effigy was made on the fourth morning, as someone had dressed the stick figure in a white t-shirt. It looked almost like a scarecrow at this point, or maybe a ghost. When I got home from work that day, my wife told me that the boy's father, Lewis, had stopped by. He'd spoken with members of every family in the whole neighborhood asking them to stop with the effigy if they were responsible. Apparently, 
It was upsetting Miss Ramirez. That evening, I watched from the living room window as Lewis took it down and rested it against the fence. The following morning, it was back up, secured to the fence with more rope than before. According to what my wife heard, Lewis had cut it down and thrown it in the trash. The next morning, the effigy was back. As I finished mowing my lawn, Lewis stopped by. Who the hell's doing this? He asked me. When I told him I didn't know, he pointed at the effigy. I threw that thing away, and someone pulled it out of my trash. Do I have to burn the damn thing? I glanced over at it from across the street, trying not to stare too long into its large black eyes. Whoever's doing this either doesn't know that it's upsetting you, or they're trying to upset you for some reason. Either way, they need to understand how you feel. If I were you, I'd take it back down and keep an eye out for who puts it back up. And Lewis frowned. You mean stock the thing out? Like watch over the area overnight? Uh, yeah, I know it sounds strange, but I'll do it. With that, he crossed the street and used a pocket knife to cut away at the effigy's bindings. I didn't judge him, as I'm sure I would have done the same thing had my son died on that sidewalk. I saw the smoke rising from his backyard later that afternoon. The effigy had been destroyed. The following morning, a week after the effigy first appeared, it was still gone. I went outside to grab the newspaper and saw that Lewis was sitting on his porch, pocket knife in hand, staring at the memorial. We shared a glance and a nod, and I went back inside. It happened that evening. Shortly after dark, while she was walking home, a woman who lived a few doors down from us was hit by a drunk driver. I ran outside when I heard the noise. It was Miss Allen. She was pinned against a telephone pole by the driver's van. At first glance, it looked like she was standing up, but her feet were a few inches off the ground. The driver was still unconscious when I approached them. I pulled him out of the car and kept him there while my wife called for an ambulance. He tried to get me to let him go, but I wouldn't let him leave. He told me that he had a family, and I informed him that she did too, telling him the names of Miss Allen's husband and children. That got him to stop talking. After telling the police what I'd witnessed, they thanked me for what I did and told me that I was free to go home. As I turned around to start walking back, I saw the effigy from the corner of my eye. I crossed the street and approached it, unable to truly process what I was looking at. The Ramirez boy was back, as though he'd never been taken down. He didn't look burned at all, but I could smell the smoke on him. Something told me that it wasn't a replacement, that this was the same effigy that Lewis had burned. It wasn't a guess. It was almost like intuition. I stared into the effigy's black eyes and knew that I'd stared into them before. The next morning, a second effigy had been nailed to the telephone pole. The face was slightly different, the eyes smaller and the smile a little thicker. In a way, it slightly resembled Miss Allen. Lewis took them both down and didn't bother bringing them into the backyard to burn them. He brought an oil drum to his driveway and threw both effigies inside them, setting them ablaze without saying a word to anyone. From what my wife overheard, he didn't even speak to Mr. Allen before doing so. The third death happened overnight, and no one noticed until the following morning. Near the end of the street, Mr. Harper was found just outside his house, nearly flattened on the sidewalk as though something had run him over. There were no tire tracks, but it looked like another vehicular accident. Nearby, a third effigy was already tied to the fence. Lewis came back, asking me what he should do next. I didn't have an answer for him. I wasn't exactly religious before this, but the deaths were making it easy to believe the impossible. At this point, it was clear that either our neighborhood had the worst luck of all time, or 
Some force beyond a misguided or cruel person was responsible for the deaths. The connection to the effigies was clear, but I didn't know what it meant. Was it an apology? A signature? A knowing nod? I didn't know the answers, but I did know that I couldn't bear to look at the effigies anymore. If they were put up a year ago, I wouldn't know what they were for. Now I know all of the faces they resemble from memory, and all the names that go along with them. The fourth effigy came before the body did. A blank white cross was tied to the fence outside Lewis's house. I called him and told him about it, and I watched from my living room window as he made his way to the cross. He touched the cross and suddenly collapsed. By the time I ran to him, his body had been crushed by some invisible weight. It didn't even look like he'd been run over, more like something heavy had pulled him down and tried to flatten him against the ground. He died quickly, but not painlessly. I looked up, and, and a smiley face had appeared atop the cross. The effigies, I realized, weren't meant as memorials. They were warnings. By who? I had no idea. Since then, three more effigies have appeared, and three more neighbors had died. The city plans to put speed bumps on the streets, but it's not going to stop it. This morning, I woke to find a white cross left on the fence in front of my house. Without explaining why, I got my family into the car and drove to a hotel making sure that no one was on the sidewalk as we drove past the cross. I'm going back tomorrow morning to begin packing my family's things. By now, someone else has died, and their effigy will be waiting for me. I'm sure I will recognize them, and even know their name. If a cross appears for me, I try to avoid it as best I can. If I fail to do so, or if an effigy appears in your neighborhood then consider this as a much kinder warning than those I've been getting. And with that, I'll give you a piece of advice. Don't learn your neighbors' names, and don't let yourself become part of a community. A stranger's death is a far more shallow cut. The dim lights at the restaurant really set the mood, romantic, tranquil, and serene. I stared into Greg's amazing blue eyes. They were electric and lively. He had a big, goofy smile as he stared back at me while taking a sip of his wine. I poked around my plates, not wanting to eat too fast or take too big a bite and pointlessly embarrass myself. It was our third date. And every time I saw him, I felt my troubles go away, like I could lose myself in that moment. I wasn't ready to declare him as the one, but I had strong feelings for Greg. I sipped the final bit of wine left in my glass, hoping that Greg felt the same way about me. Would you like another glass of wine? Greg asked. I nodded and Greg flagged down one of the waitstaff who approached with a bottle of wine. This man, unlike the rest of the waitstaff, appeared a bit unkempt. His uniform was ill-fitting, like it was too baggy for his skinny frame. The man had days' worth of stubble and black circles under his eyes. I knew I will sound a bit pretentious, but at a restaurant that upscale, you expect people who are clean-shaven and professional-looking. This man appeared as if he had rolled out of bed and slapped on his crumpled uniform before rushing to work. The man picked up my glass and began to pour, but as he did, I couldn't help but notice that he trained his uncomfortable gaze upon me. To be blunt, I was wearing a rather revealing dress. I wanted to look good for Greg, but it seemed this creep was now oogling me. I averted my eyes, trying not to meet the man's gaze. I was on a date. How could he leer at me like that? I could feel him staring at me, though, as the wine poured. I looked over at Greg, whose eyes looked at me. Then he was looking at the man with a hint of anger. 
You mind not staring at my girlfriend so much? Greg asked in a firm tone. Despite the weird man standing beside me, I felt my heart thump as he mentioned the word girlfriend. It was quite bold of him to assume that, but it made me happy. The man finished pouring and placed the wine glass back on the table. He gave me a weird half-smile, not even responding to Greg in the slightest, and then walked off. What a creep, I whispered to Greg. Yeah, really. I'm going to talk to a manager about that. That guy was incredibly rude. Let me use the bathroom first, and then I'll track down someone to talk to. Greg got out of his seat, and I watched him as he headed towards the bathroom. I grabbed a glass of wine from the table. It was extremely cold, like the wine was chilled. But it wasn't just the wine. The glass itself was nearly freezing cold. I wondered to myself how the glass could possibly get that cold, but pushing it aside and slugging down two big gulps of wine. Time went by. First five minutes, then ten, then fifteen. I pulled out my phone and saw a text from Rebecca. Hey, how's it going with that Greg guy? You need me to call and bail you out? The text said. I closed the text and finished my glass of wine with one final gulp. I felt a pang of anxiety flare up as I scanned the room looking for Greg. I didn't see him anywhere. My mind raced to the worst possible scenario. That Greg had ditched me. That he wasn't as into me as I was into him. I felt the tears well up in my eyes for a moment, but I held them back as I looked to my left and saw that unkempt waiter approaching my table again. I brought my hand to my face almost using it as a shield from the guy who approached regardless. More wine? The man questioned. I could feel his eyes on me again, scanning my body. I felt cornered and wanted to leave, to get away from this creep. I wanted to yell and scream to get him away from me, but instead I passively responded with a yes, and the man picked up my glass and began to pour. To my dismay, the man didn't just pour silently, Perhaps emboldened by the fact that Greg was not around, he began to speak to me. His tone was rather nasty, and I felt myself getting scared. What's that guy got that I don't? The man asked me. I felt a lump in my throat as he finished asking the question. I couldn't formulate a response. Tell me, he demanded. Again, I said nothing. I couldn't find the words. I felt on the verge of screaming. Tell me, Laura, what has he got that I don't? I felt horrified, but my horror gave way to anger. How the fuck did this man know my name? I gripped my teeth, feeling anger well up in me. Get the fuck away from me, or I will scream, I said in a quiet but demanding tone. The man placed the glass down on the table and walked away swiftly. I picked up the glass and wondered if I should even bother to drink it. But I gulped it down anyway, feeling disturbed both by the man and by the fact that Greg has still not returned to the table. I sent Greg a series of increasingly angry texts, but after five more minutes, I gave up on that. I began to quietly cry, trying not to draw any attention to myself. I pulled out my phone and texted Rebecca back, begging her to come pick me up but what I thought was the worst-case scenario of Greg ditching me at the restaurant ended up not being even close to the worst case. The worst-case scenario happened a few minutes later as I waited for my ride. A man came out of the bathroom area, panicked, his face red and breathing heavy. He stuttered out the words loudly so that most of the restaurant could hear. Th there's a guy dead in the bathroom. Someone call the police. The man shouted out. The restaurant staff were quick to pull the man to the side. One of the employees rushed to the bathroom to confirm. I felt a sinking feeling as I prayed it was not Greg. But I had to see what was going on. My resolve grew, and I got out of my seat and started towards the bathroom. I stormed down the hallway, pushing open the men's bathroom door. Hey, lady, you can't come in here! An employee shouted at me, but I ignored him. There it was. The real worst-case scenario. Greg laying on the floor, 
his skin an icy blue, his eyes frosted over, lifeless and frozen. His left arm was tossed across the room, his two legs lay severed beside him, both practically shattered. There was a notable lack of blood in the room. Greg was frozen so badly that even his blood had turned solid. I ran from the bathroom, screaming and crying hysterically. Rebecca soon showed up and at first was angry. She leapt from the car, yelling. I knew that guy was an asshole. What a total fucking douche. Don't worry, Laura, we're going to... She stopped when she saw the tears rolling down my face. Or maybe it was the way my face was contorted into a mix of fear and anguish. She gave me a hug and asked me what happened, and I did my best to fill her in between heavy sobs and tears, and soon the police had arrived. They questioned everyone at the restaurant and would not let anybody leave until they gave the okay. They questioned me the longest since I was Greg's date. They asked me if I knew if Greg had enemies, if I knew who might be capable of murdering Greg, but how could someone murder a man like that? Freezing him. It wasn't humanly possible. I asked them how he could have frozen like that, but the detective told me sternly that he asked the questions. The only person I could think of to mention was that weird guy who had somehow known my name. That strange guy seemed angry that I was with Greg. When I mentioned he was part of the wait staff, the detective pointed in the direction of the staff, who had all congregated in the parking lot. Can you point out the guy? The detective asked. I scanned the face of all the wait staff, but I couldn't find the guy. I did it again and again, but I didn't see him anywhere. I don't see him. Could he have slipped out? I asked. The detective told me to stay there, and went and got a man from the restaurant staff group. The man was evidently the owner of the restaurant, and he came over to me. The man appeared kind, eyeing me sympathetically. I guess he heard I was the date, and he could tell by my now smeared makeup and puffy red eyes that I was crushed. This woman mentioned one of your staff made some comments that could potentially make him a suspect. Are all of your staff accounted for over there? The detective asked. Yes, I checked twice. Everyone on schedule for the shift is accounted for. No one has left. The detective then told the man that he would need all the surveillance tapes that the restaurant had. The detective gave me his card and told me that I could go home, but if I thought of anything I should give him a call. I went home and slowly tried to recover from the incidents, but it was not at all easy. I would wake in the middle of the night, screaming, imagining the cold, lifeless body of Greg again. I started going to therapy where I was diagnosed with PTSD and given anti-anxiety medication, as well as some pills to help me sleep at night. It took about three months before I felt better, but the person who murdered Greg had still not been caught. I spent most of my time staying at home now in my room. I lived with Rebecca, and she had been extremely supportive but she started pushing me to go out and socialize more, to really live again. It was hard, but I finally agreed to go out to a bar with her and a couple of other girls one night. The bar was a bit more relaxed, not as rowdy as some other bars. We got ourselves a table and ordered a few drinks. It wasn't long before the girls started scanning the room for interesting-looking guys, and the guys were doing the same. A few started approaching us, singling us out and trying to start conversations, offering to buy drinks. One by one, the girls began to disappear from the table, until I was left sitting with Rebecca. Lighten up, Laura. I know things have not been easy for you, but there's a whole world out there. You can't hide forever. You need to try and enjoy life, and... Rebecca's little inspirational speech faded into noise. As I looked across the room, I felt my blood go cold as I saw the man. That same creepy man from the restaurant a few months ago. He was trying to be inconspicuous, hanging back against the wall with a beer in his hand. I could see the dark circles under his eyes as he looked at me. He gave me a sly little smile and sipped his beer. I grabbed Rebecca's arm and pulled her hard, interrupting whatever she was saying. Hey, wait, what are you doing? Rebecca said. 
We need to leave. I shouted at her, and pulled her outside as fast as I could. I got in the car and furiously began digging through my purse, looking for the detective's card. Once I found it, I called and the phone rang, and then rang again as I cursed. The phone went to voicemail and I frantically left a message saying that the guy was at this bar and he was looking at me before hanging up. I realized afterwards that I never even said who I was. I had a feeling the detective would have no idea what I was talking about, but the detective called back no later than 15 minutes, and I quickly explained what was going on, a little less frantically than before. Rebecca drove me home after that, unsure of what to do to help me with the situation. I retreated to my room, crying. I felt an intense pressure pushing down on me, like I was suffocating. I fell to the floor, panicked, barely able to breathe, feeling like I was going to die. It was the first time I ever had a panic attack. I was back to being a near total wreck. The detective called me the next morning and gave me the bad news that the guy had slipped out before they arrived, but that they had gotten more footage of him that might help them identify who he was. The detective said it was obvious from the surveillance footage that the man had followed me into the bar, though they didn't see him get out of any car. He also assigned a policeman to sit outside my house 24-7. He also advised I carry pepper spray wherever I go and remain vigilant, with his last piece of advice being again to call him if I saw anything. It was clear now that I had a stalker, and I was horrified. I had never dealt with anything like this. The stress was almost too much. The police officer sitting outside made me feel a lot safer, but, but it was only a few weeks later that a large bouquet of flowers showed up at my door. A thick envelope came along with it, the front of it reading simply, Laura. At first I didn't think too much about the flowers. It was close to my birthday, so I thought one of my friends may have sent them as a gift. But as I tore open the envelope, I saw a folded up note. As I opened it, a strange feeling came over me, like a cold wave of anxiety. I looked down at the note. I saw an extremely shaky handwriting that filled me with dread. Laura, you melt my icy heart. I have been watching you for some time, safeguarding you from these vile men you used to have relations with. Every time I see you, I am struck by your immense beauty. If only you could accept me, Laura. I am the one for you, and I hope you will soon realize that. I look forward to the moment you fall into my arms and we can be happy together. I have included some photos, a symbol of my devotion to you. My hands started to shake. I wanted to tear the note to pieces and never look at it again, but my rational side told me I needed to give it to the police. But then I looked at the photographs. They were a series of pictures of me. The room spun and I felt nauseous. Dozens of photographs of me going out and doing daily things. At the grocery store, the pharmacy, going to work. One was from long before I even met Greg. About a year ago, as I was out at the beach with my friends. Another showed Greg and I eating dinner. The day he had died, Greg's face was scribbled over to the black sharpie. The final photo was the most chilling. It showed my ex-boyfriend, Craig, body blue and lifeless. His eyes were poked out in the picture. I dropped the pictures on the floor, incredulous and terrified, and began to cry. I felt wholly unnerved. My whole life had been turned upside down by this creep, and now he had seemingly killed another person. I called the detective frantically again, telling him about these photos and the letter. He came around the house and gathered the photos and the note as evidence. I asked him rather rudely what the hell they were doing, and why was it so hard to catch this guy. He assured me they were doing all they can and confirmed that the man appeared to have targeted other guys that I had previously been in a relationship with, though he could still not explain how these men were frozen to death. He assured me that I was safe with the officer outside, and I tried to refrain from going out too much. 
That night I could barely get to sleep. Too disturbed from the photos. This psycho was now targeting my exes as well. I tossed a turn. I tossed and turned until I finally managed to doze off. But my sleep did not last long. A ruckus outside woke me up. Hands in the air, I heard a man shout. I scurried to my window and looked out. A hooded man stood about ten feet from the police officer, who had his gun leveled at the man. I said, hands in the air, the officer yelled again. The hooded man began to raise his hands into the air, very slowly. But then I saw his hands beginning to glow an icy blue. It was completely unnatural, and I stood in stark terror as they grew ever brighter. From his hands spewed a torrent of ice and cold that projected itself at the officer. The ice hit the officer's shoulder, and I heard him groan in pain, his shoulder icing over. He fired two shots that seemed to strike the hooded man as he recoiled backwards in pain. The hooded man raised his hands again, and they began to glow before unleashing another torrent of cold. It struck the officer's face, and I could hear a final muffled scream as his skin rapidly froze over in the span of seconds. The officer fell over unconscious, and the hooded man moved forward, clutching at his side. The officer had hit him, and I could tell he was bleeding. I screamed as the hooded man loomed over the downed officer before lifting his foot and bringing it down on the officer's face. His head shattered into pieces that spread out all across the street. The hooded man looked up at me, and our eyes met once again. I ducked down from the window, pulling my hand over my mouth. I could hear him as he began making his way towards the door. I grabbed my cell phone and frantically dialed 911. Rebecca was awake now, asking me what was going on. I told her to get into bed and lock the door, and that the psycho was outside. She ran to her room and came back, pulling a large knife from a sheath. Fuck that guy. I've had enough of this shit. The man was kicking the front door, trying to knock it down so he could gain access. Rebecca sat ready with her knife. She was brave, but I begged her to not try to fight. He had killed the officer. I knew she was no match. I yelled into my phone to send help now to the operator on the other end who kept asking me to remain calm. The door began to frost over as the man kicked at it. And soon the lock gave way with a snapping sound, and the door slowly swung open. The man hobbled in, still clutching at his side, blood dripping behind him. Rebecca ran at him with a knife in her hand, but the man held his hands out and the familiar blue glow started again. The cold wave hit Rebecca's feet, and as she continued to try to run, I watched as her body continued forward, but her feet remained frozen to the ground. I heard the terror of flesh as her feet ripped away from the rest of her body. She fell to the ground, blood spurting from her legs, and a look of absolute shock crossed her face, her eyes wide with shock. The man walked forward and kicked the knife from her hand. Rebecca winced in pain, but her face went from shock to anger. Ever defiant, Rebecca spoke again. You fucker. You are going to pay for this. The man pulled down his hood, and I could clearly see his face. There was that same guy, the one who had been at the restaurant, at the bar. I could only continue to scream as I scrambled up the stairs. Rebecca kept cursing at the man until there was silence. And then a shattering noise. I ran into my room and closed the door, locking it and pushing myself into the corner bringing my legs up to my chest and hugging them. I heard the man come upstairs and then wait outside the door. Laura, my love, it's time for you to accept me, to love me as I have loved you, he shouted through the door. I could never love you. You're a psycho, I yelled back. No, no, you love me. You just don't know me well enough yet. I know you can love me, Laura. We are meant to be. Open the door, Laura. I'm the lover of your life. 
You just need to give me a chance. Those other guys were no good for you. The man sounded absolutely hysterical at this point, and I remained silent. I could hear the sirens of police cars drawing closer and closer. Oh, I'm bleeding, Laura. That crazy bastard shot me. They don't understand a true love like I do. They stand in the way of our love. Open the door, Laura. Let me see your beautiful face. The police cars were outside now, and I could already hear officers pouring into the building. In a matter of seconds, they were up the steps, and my ears began to ring as gunshots rang through the building. For a moment, all was quiet. Then I heard the blip of a radio and heavy footsteps. Suspect is down. But wait a second. He's still moving, an officer said. But a moment later, there was a sickening sound, like an explosion. Cold overtook the house. Items in my room frosted over before deadly shards of ice radiated out in every direction. Piercing through walls and ripping holes in the floor and ceiling, I heard the cries of several officers as the shards pierced their bodies. A single shard pierced my shoulder, sending sharp waves of pain through my body. After all that, it was finally quiet. I clutched at my bleeding shoulder, feeling woozy, and then blacked out. I awoke in the hospital. They told me I had a nasty wound, but that I would be okay. My shoulder still stung. I laid in bed feeling in pain, both mentally and physically, and unsure of what really happened. Was it really all over? And no sooner had I thought that did the detective walk into the room. He pulled up a chair and sat beside me. His face was grim. I'm sorry this all happened to you, he said. Rebecca, did Rebecca make it? The detective looked down. I'm afraid not. We lost six officers as well. I'm sorry. I began to tear up. She had tried to defend me. The officers, too, lost their lives. Greg and my ex. So much death in such a little span of time. I pulled up my hair, feeling frustrated and powerless. The man, though, he's dead. You got him? He's dead. This whole thing is over. I'm sorry I can't be as comforting as I should. I lost friends, too, in all this. I'm going to leave for a few weeks. I just wanted to let you know that the man is gone. You don't need to worry about him anymore. If you need anything, then give me a call, the detective said. I thanked him profusely, and as he left the room, I cried and cried. The whole ordeal had taken a huge mental toll on me and for the next few years I was filled with grief. It took a long time to come to grips with everything that happened, but eventually I moved on with my life. I found a nice man and got married, had two children. I finally put everything to rest and began to forget about those horrible incidents. It was a cold winter day, and I had just taken my kids to the bus stop to see them off. I returned to my house and sat down in my chair to have a cup of tea. My husband made real good money, so he allowed me to stay home and take care of the kids, the pets, and the house. I looked out the window. It was cold and gray. I felt a chill as a sudden burst of cold air permeated the room. I kept staring out the window, and to my absolute horror, it began to frost over slowly but only in certain areas. It began to spell out something as I felt dread rise in my chest. Laura, I love you. The first time I saw it, I was seven. I didn't understand what it meant. I thought it was all a dream. At one second I was sitting on the bus and the next, I was in a hall. There was no color in this hall. 
A single black and white door in a single black and white hall. And none of this made any sense at all. There is always dread in the hall. There is always a curiosity about what lies beyond the walls. Still, nothing happened. I'd be there, think about walking through the door. I would hear whispers and suddenly I was gone. I would return to wherever I was before. When I was seven, it was the bus. Every year after, at least once a year, I'd have an episode, as I would begin to call them. At first, I believed I was losing my mind. I felt something was wrong. And then when I turned 13, I was watching a show that referenced astral projection. It didn't happen entirely the way my episodes did, but there were enough similarities that I decided to do more research. I checked out books, watched anything I could find on the subject, even looked up forums online. None of it helped. There were similarities, and perhaps what I was expecting was a form of astral projection, but at the time, I'd found nothing to completely convince me that's what I was experiencing, or that it was real at all. From 13 until 17, my episodes grew more intense and more frequent. I'd often have memories where I was in class, listening to the teacher, and suddenly I was in the hall again. When I was 17 was the first time I looked beyond the door. Now, every episode until this point, it was just the hall. But, I was laying in bed one night, listening to music when the music was gone. It was sudden, and I felt myself shaking. The entire temperature in the room had changed. I looked around, and I no longer had my headphones on me. The world was devoid of color. There was only that single door in the black and white hall. The voices called from beyond the wall. At first it was many, and then only a few, and finally it was merely a whisper. I remember slowly reaching towards the door, but that dread grew. The quieter it got, the more afraid I felt. As I placed my hand on the door and put an ear to it, I felt a faint murmuring. I say felt because it wasn't like I heard it per se. No, I felt it in my body. Explaining this is hard to do, but as my ear touched the door, the murmur turned into a scream. A scream of agony so horrific that I shot awake, or thought I had. My assumption was that I was having another unexplainable episode, but there's a point in each one where I would come back to whatever I was. Like I had awoken, except I was never sleeping. This time, I awoke on a floor. It was the hall. There was screaming on the other side of the door, and I felt an overwhelming dread and sadness creep into my mind. I could hear the screaming, and yet I found myself moving closer towards the door. I placed my hand upon the door, and it began to shake violently. Then I shot up, and I was in a bed, eyes wide open, heart racing, and for a faint moment, I could hear the screaming through my headphones before it faded into the music I'd been listening to before. There had been a brief flash, where I felt drawn back into the hall. The door was before me again, and, sick of all of this, I ripped it open. I never should have opened the door. I was in bed again, sweating, and as I pulled my headphones off, I heard the sound of rain outside. I went to the kitchen and got some water before spending much of the night watching comedies until I actually slept. I'm 21 now, and, well, after opening the door four years ago, the episodes became more frequent. Now, though, I've seen many places. They aren't always the same things. Sometimes I meet uh, people, if you want to call them that, and other times I see things. These things are things I cannot unsee. Between 17 and my current age, I looked much more heavily into astral projection as well as anything that may be causing these episodes. Things, as I've stated before, were never quite the same. 
They didn't align with the usual rules that most people mention. For all I know, people were wrong, but I didn't really think that. There was no tether or rope or string. There was no semblance of safety. I'd read nothing could truly bring you harm if you were projecting, but my experiences, they haunted me. An example was one of the first episodes post-opening the door. I'd seen nothing but blackness, a dark void that spoke my name. Danny, it would say. Danny, come inside. Sometimes it was a normal tone, other times it was a whisper. I stepped inside and I felt the door shut behind me. It wasn't a slam or anything that should have startled, but it was a quiet closing of the door. A door I'd taken years to open that led to a place I had no way of understanding. The door shut quietly, but the moment it shut, I felt a disquiet welling within my soul that turns to a fear I'd never experienced in my life. A single black and white flame gave light to the room, and more than ever, I wished it had never done so. I saw around me six sides to a room. There are four walls, a ceiling, and a floor. All at once, faceless shapes and formless figures clawed from all sides of the room. Tormented screaming accompanied them. It shook me to my core, and the candle within the room went out. I sat in a room, shaking, as the candle sparked alive once again. I saw a room of corpses, including a few that had been skewed on pikes. One hung from a cross, and I couldn't look away. The body was naked, and I felt my feet walking forward against my will. There was a moment of silence before the seamlessly lifeless corpse lifted its head. It twisted and slowed its head, moved and continued moving until the bones in its neck snapped from its skin, and it let out a strange moaning. Those formless faces, once within the walls, now formed inside the chest and body of the figure. I could hear their screaming, and then the candle, all light of any kind, went out. There was a sharp pain resounding from my hands, and suddenly, I felt something piercing my skin. For a split second longer, I saw myself. I stared at myself, blood falling from my palms. Soon after, I was back in my everyday. I remember the pain in my hands. I had to take time away from my responsibilities for roughly a week after that. My hands weren't working properly, and... They hurt in a way I'd never felt them hurt before or since. I can't explain it, but after seeing a doctor, they could find nothing wrong. They thought maybe it was in my head, but none of it added up. Having no answers, I was sent home. My hands would regain function, and the pain would fade with another week or so. Last year, things escalated farther. I suppose I should say they had continued, but... Around my birthday last year, I had an episode while sitting at home. I was watching my TV, and then I was in a black and white room, watching static. There was a storm outside. I could hear thunder. I could hear the rain, and though I couldn't see through the window behind my TV, I noticed a silhouette. Part of me wanted to believe it was just a tree. I knew I was having another episode, and... The deeper I went into this place I was so drawn to, or maybe it was these places. It seemed like it was places that existed beyond the door, but I could never be sure. No good ever came from these places, or this place. I heard a crying briefly in the static of the television. The TV looked like an old box TV from the 50s. There was what sounded like a woman's sobs and this was followed by a sudden whooshing and the sound of snapping. Then the rain continued. It was silent for a moment before I could hear a phone. The phone rang several times, and I looked all over, but I couldn't find it. Then I was home, watching my television again. I was shaking and sweating violently when I came back, too. I quickly grabbed a water bottle I had next to me and chucked it. I was about to stand up when I was there again. 
The phone was ringing. The wind still blew, but things were quieter. I picked up the phone, and as I did, I heard scratching at the window. I watched curiously as I said, Hello? On the other line, the only reply I got was a low gurgling sound. I said hello once more and suddenly felt sick to my stomach. The line went dead, and I found myself awake again. This time, however, I was on the kitchen floor and my family was staring at me. My mom looked sad and asked if I was okay. I wanted to say something, anything, but I couldn't get anything out. My mother hugged me and told me you would be okay. I asked her what she meant. She then stared at me like she was confused. Hugging me tightly, she helped me up and sat me back on the couch. The nausea was beginning to wane when I asked again what had happened. She looked at me and asked, You really don't remember? I shook my head. I shook my head no. And that's when I saw the tears welling up in her eyes. And she said it was Emily. I felt sick again, and I asked the question I felt I already knew the answer to. I'd been waiting for her to come to the party, but as my mother looked on, I knew something was wrong, and I began crying again. She held me and explained it wasn't my fault, and there was nothing anyone could have done. She said no one knew, and after a long time crying, I mustered the courage to ask her what had happened. My mother explained that her mom had gone to check on her to see if she was getting ready for the party, and when she couldn't find her, she went looking around. In the backyard, at the tree with the old treehouse we used to hang out in, they found Emily dead. She hung herself from that tree. I was hysterical at this point and completely confused. Emily was a straight-A student and the sweetest person I'd ever known. When much of this school had turned on me and my episodes grew more intense, uh, when everyone would make fun of me, she'd always have a reassuring warmth and she was the kindest person I'd ever known in my life. And now, now she was dead. It didn't add up. I didn't want to believe it, but as the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months... The cold reality had set in for me. I'd had episodes after this, of course. It was becoming a daily thing. The things I'd seen were horrific, and I couldn't make any sense of them. After I graduated high school, I took some time off, partially due to my inability to decide what to do next. I'm 21 now, and I can't help but feel lost. I've been going to therapy for my episodes and to get past Emily's suicide. I don't think you ever truly get past suicide, but you do learn to carry on, somewhat. Today I'm supposed to go looking for jobs, a recommendation from my therapist as a way to keep moving forward in life. The only problem with that is I can't really drive, and I can't reliably be trusted to do many jobs based on my episodes. My therapist told me it isn't so much about finding a job, as it is just taking the steps to move forward with life. Part of me was angry at the thought. Moving forward made it feel as though I was trying to stop caring about my best friend. I knew that wasn't what they wanted, though, and it wasn't what they were asking. I planned to take a bus today. I, I'm overtaken with the thoughts of moving forward, and half through the thought of moving forward, I find myself here again. Another episode. I can faintly hear a radio. I cannot quite make out what is being said. And then I heard a phone. A phone ringing with no real source in sight. I desperately began looking for the phone, having a horrible PTSD from the moments leading up to Emily's suicide. No matter where I look, I can find no phone, and now the radio is beginning to grow louder. There's a burst of repeating laughter coming from it. It isn't familiar laughter, and I feel myself beginning to panic as the phone ringing grows louder and I'm overwhelmed emotionally by the thought that I'm not going to make it this time. I must save her. 
This repeats in my head until the ringing stops, and I realize I'm in hysteria, and the slow, cold realization sets back in that I can't save her. Because she's already dead. The radio falls silent, and I sit there in my own sorrow. I feel the tears pouring down my face when I hear a beeping sound and a voice playing from the answering machine. It's a looping of Emily's voice. She says, I'm sorry. And then the sound of falling and snapping occurs. Then comes a familiar gurgle until I hear the last breath exhale from her body. This loops, and soon I can hear it coming from the radio as well. But what? I think to myself, what the hell? I want to stop this madness. I forcefully try to will myself out of this episode. I think to myself, it's an episode. You'll wake up soon. Nothing. None of it helps. I'm not waking up and I don't feel myself growing any saner. Just when I'm at the edge and ready to start clawing at my eyes in desperation, it all stops and a door is visible. It looks like a swinging door, and as I approach it slowly, I slowly push, wanting to peer in before going to the next room. Unfortunately, the moment I give any form of push, I find myself in a dining room. I never stepped through. I'm simply here now. Sitting at a table are three people's emaciated bodies. There's an empty chair, and I look more closely... I begin to recognize things on these bodies. I begin to shake and cry, gripping my head, wishing and screaming internally that this will all just end. It wouldn't. At the far end of the table was very clearly my dead friend. To the left was the body of my mother. I recognized the necklace she wore and her wedding ring. My third body was my brother's. The empty chair had a white sheet of paper that read, For you. No. No. I refused to sit down and tried to go back out the door I'd come through, but it was gone. Looking around, I could find no other way out. I began clawing at the walls in anger and sorrow. I want out. A guttural choking echoed from the far end of the room. I stopped at the sound of it and turned to see Emily's body, trying to say something. It was just the choking again and again, though. Afraid and unsure what to do, I reluctantly sit down at the other end of the table. I begin to cry, for I am not sure what other response to give. It is then it all fades and I awaken. It's dark and my mom is looking at me, asking if I'm okay. I wasn't sure what to say, but I was grateful to be back. She asked if I'm hungry, and I tell her I could try to eat. We walk into the kitchen, and she has already set the table. The food smells delicious, and I sit down to eat. There are burgers and sausage and all sorts of delicious meals. I bite into my burger, and I feel good until I taste something off. It is blood, but fresh blood. I don't eat my burgers any other way than well done, My mom has always known this. Partially this was because I don't like it, and partially this was because my dad used to eat his meat rare, and I hated my dad for leaving my mom. I asked my mom why she cooked the burger the way she had, and she turned back, saying it was how she wanted to be served. What? I asked. Emily, my mother said. It was how she wanted to be served. I felt myself growing sick, and the world turned to that familiar black and white again. I had never left. This episode, or whatever it was, had just been fucking with me. Looking down, I saw pieces of flesh in the food, and I threw up at the table. Looking around, no one was there anymore. I was alone at the table. In front of me were three sets of eyeballs and a bunch of meat with bits of skin in it, all covered in my vomit. Why? I know my screams will elicit no response. Still, screaming is the only thing I can do to deal with any of this. 
As I sit alone and sickened, I hear a swaying. It is the sound of a swinging door. I look up and turn around to see a door again. I get up and hesitantly step towards the door, fearing what sick shit might be on the other side. I touch the door and I find myself outside. Looking behind me, an unfamiliar house stands far away. It soon fades, and all I can see are dead trees. There isn't a leaf in view. A strange warmth permeates the air around me, and as I look down, I find a flashlight attached to a piece of a severed arm. Gazing closer, I find myself taken aback at the fact that the blood is fresh. I try to shake it off and tell myself it's just a trick of the mind or something this place has created to gross me out. I grab the flashlight and pry it from the fingers of the hand on the severed arm. The light flickers, but then stabilizes as I pan around the forest. Seeing no other way to go, I head forward. I just went out of this hell, I think to myself. But some parts of me feels the only way out is to keep going deeper. The longer the walk, the more I feel it all looks the same. It's all just dead trees. There is no strange noises, just endless dead forest. As I continue my trek, I begin to think about the flashlight. By checking it, there appears to be no compartment for batteries. Convenient, I think to myself, before pressing onward. I'm not sure how long I've been walking, but it feels like ages, and still it all looks the same, so I stop. Looking around, there are no signs or any real hints as to where to go, or that would help me with navigation. Having nothing else to lose, I turn back, but as I do, I notice there is no back. There is darkness. Shining the light on it, I, I notice my light doesn't pierce the shadows at all. There is an extreme cold that comes from the dark. I feel so unsettled and so decided to press forward again instead. I'm not sure how long it has been, but things haven't changed. Same forest and if I turn back, the same darkness sits there. I continue to walk for what feels like forever, and as I do, I think back to my dear friend, Emily, and the happier times we had together before her death. I always thought we'd be friends well into old age. She was always so protective of me, and I wasn't sure how life would go on without her. As I thought that, a part of me realized I would. I would continue on. I felt the first bit of comfort, but as I did, I noticed a humming. The forest had grown brighter. All around were tiny lights, almost like fireflies, and the cold darkness behind me had warmed a bit. Almost like fireflies, the cold darkness behind me had waned a bit. It had melted back, and I could see the forest again. A faint sign appeared behind me. It was wooden and carved with the number 100, and an arrow pointing back in the opposite direction. I took my light and walked forward. The lights followed, and as I continued to walk, I'm not sure how long I've been walking when I noticed another sign with 80 marked on it. Pressing further, I am left only with silence and my own thoughts. I reflect on the hatred I have for my dad, and as I do, I begin to notice the light around me dimming. The air is growing colder. I try to let go of these thoughts and think of something more positive, but as I do, my thoughts grow darker. It almost feels like they aren't in my control any longer, and that hatred grows stronger and the lights dim further. I felt myself begin to panic as the light on my flashlight fades and cold darkness envelops me. I scream, but there is no sound. I can't see anything as I stumble forward. While my screams go unheard, I hear the sounds of guttural rage piercing through the darkness, and in response, I bolt forward. I sprint as long and hard as I can, the breath in my lungs begging for a reprieve. The more tired I get, the harder I sprint. The thought of the severed arm I got the flashlight from enters my mind, and 
I dropped the flashlight, half out of freaking out and half from the irrational belief it could be cursed. My heart feels like it's going to explode, but I can't stop running as some part of me knows if I do, I'm dead. I can feel it behind me, stalking and keeping pace. It's going to get me. I feel my foot catch something, and I fly forward, slamming hard into the ground before rolling around in the dirt. That presence. I feel it fading back, and as I do, I swear I hear laughter for a second. Standing up, I still feel cold, but I can begin to see something again. I stop and look on in shock as I see what were trees previously, replaced by twisted bodies. There are arms and legs and entire bodies at times stitched together and sewn together, their expressions maddening and tortured as their cries and screams of agony quickly overwhelm my senses. I feel myself fall to my knees, clutching my skull, trying to block out the screams, but the screams burrow into my very psyche, and quickly I can hear it through my mind. I try to fight the pain of the dizzying cries of anguish, but I'm quickly overcome by them. I attempt to refocus and continue forward, but then I hear it. The sound cuts through the screams like a butter knife. A man in a suit, eyes missing from his skull. A large scythe in hand begins cutting down the bodies. The blood from their bodies and their screams of agony are all absorbed within the scythe the man carries. The scythe grows black, and a mouth appears from its blade as it laughs. The man soon is covered in a blood-soaked barbed wire that quickly wraps itself around his body and his eyes. I'm terrified as I look on and the man smiles. His teeth razor sharp and his lungs forward in a twitchy nature. His body convulsed as he steps forward, then he would fade and appear again, taking more body trees and absorbing their blood. I felt helpless and sprinted back the direction I came. Depraved laughter cackled behind me as I ran for my life. I couldn't think, only run. I just keep running and running. I felt myself stop. I could see the world growing dark again. I don't understand anything anymore, as everything was black before lighting up again. When I could move again, I stumbled forward and fell on my face. I wasn't sure what was happening, but in front of me was a building. It looked old, and hearing the laughter behind me once again, I didn't hesitate to rush towards the doors in front of me and tried to open them. They opened with no real struggle and closed calmly behind me. I found myself in a long hallway once again. A very familiar hallway if I'm being completely honest. Everything looked as it did when I had first come here. The hall, colorless as ever, but was that possible? I didn't enter the same building. I took a moment to breathe and did my best to keep my mind in check with sane and rational thought. Once I'd calmed myself a bit, I took in my surroundings once again and wiped the sweat from my brow. I looked behind me and noticed there was no longer a door from where I entered. It was dark. I walked towards the dark and entered it, but I found I only wound up in the same hall, in the same spot as I always had when I was younger and began having these episodes. Then it dawned on me. I wasn't even sure how long this episode had been going. Clearly longer than any other, but how long had I been here? And was there a way out? I'd been having these for years, and yet I would always come to eventually. This time, though, something felt different. I didn't see an end. I didn't feel an end. I knew only that I was here again, even if I didn't understand why. I stood in a hall, and if I walked back, I wound up in the same place, but walking forward, I quickly discovered a familiar-looking door. On the other side of the door, I could hear screams of agony. I could hear tortured cries for an end. At one point, I could hear myself begging for the inevitable end. 
The door shook for a time and would stop. It was chained shut, and I wasn't sure why, but I felt I could open it. A key, I thought. A key. The key was in my pocket. This was a thought, but as I reached into my pocket, I felt it. I felt a key. I pulled it out and noticed on the end was a skull. I placed the key into the lock and the chains fell away. The door opened and I was hit by a strong gust of wind before I was drawn in. There were lights that lit up the room. There were moans coming from another room. They were familiar. They came from a memory I held. The day I realized my dad had been cheating on my mom. He had been banging some fucking whore in their bed. Fucking whore! I felt the overwhelming screams of anger and hate welling within me. The room turned red, and a different sound now rang out. It was the sound of screaming. It was the sound of laughter. It, it was the sound of my own voice. And then the sound of the knife as it plunged deeply into both of them. Again and again, I felt the sweet release of my broken family's redemption as again and again I stabbed them. It took a moment for me to realize I was no longer standing on the other side of the door. No. I was holding the knife. I was feeling the warm blood, and I was smiling the entire time. I felt the insides of the whore. I felt my father's heart slowly stop, and I felt consumed by the madness of it all. I saw visions of madness and things I didn't quite understand. I was outside my body at this point. One moment I could see myself stabbing into the lovely couple. Yes, lovely. Next I saw the man in the suit with the smiling scythe. Then back to watching their lifeless bodies lying side by side. I felt myself smiling once again. And then I was awake. It was all sorts of red. They were naked and dead. Yes, they were all sorts of red and they were naked and dead. I don't remember much, but this morning I awoke in a strange place. I was informed I would be spending my life in prison. I was told I'd found my father and killed him and his wife. I was told I'd done things for which no one wished to describe. I've been told... I'll spend the rest of my years behind the bars in this place. It's funny. As they tell me these things, I can see that door again. And behind it, I can hear screaming. The screaming isn't my own. The screaming makes me smile. A little background first. I was serving a 15-year sentence in a penitentiary in southern Arizona. What I was there for isn't important. During my stay there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain, and even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. Supposedly, years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning we'd be woken up and expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently, about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexpected thing happened during one of these routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked very off during this check. When a guard pulled over another guard to help him check it out, they found it wasn't exactly the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. This man was wearing the skin of the other man over him, loosely fitting and draped over him. Apparently it looked like a real monster. The scariest thing was, though, as the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into the prison let alone a cell. What's worse is that they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. 
he wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that, they never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty grisly stuff, I know. And I realize that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker, but that's what the prison called him. The skinwalker. Didn't help that the guy never talked, apparently. Anyway, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened, and just about everyone in Genpop felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay. Hell of a story to hear in your home for the foreseeable future. Now, on to the real shit. Sure, that guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old lifer Navajo inmate to tell everybody about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now, apparently, skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, almost everyone can tell the mannerisms are all off. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch manically. They have an unnatural gait while walking. But apparently, they get no better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners. Slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grand Master Skinwalker at one point. Apparently, he thought it had mannerisms down so well that you might not even be able to tell if it was your cellmate for a day or two. It had to be good. He would expect a skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill, but this one realized it had a revolving door of people to kill coming to it, and masterfully bided its time, as Carl thought, for years. A lot of guys found humor in it. A lot more were really on edge about it. Every once in a while, while in prison, people snap. Sometimes you'll find your cellmate swinging in front of your bunk, strung up around the neck by his pant leg. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore, but... In our yard, people tend to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. Guys would just stop talking, hunch over and shuffle around. Any friends they had would be mostly out the window. They would turn into a loner during wreck time. They would let their hair hang in front of their face. No one liked to talk about it. Like, if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or just people going crazy. But I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything, but... Every time someone snapped in this way... It wasn't more than a couple weeks before they were shipped off or transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then, there were the nighttime occurrences. Short, loud bursts of sound echoed throughout my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig's dying squeal and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one likes to talk about. Even scarier were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows flit across my walls on a regular occasion, while there were definitely no guards near my cell. One time, near the end of my sentence, I woke up and looked at my back wall and found a perfect silhouette of a person standing there. But when I looked... My bunkmate was asleep, and no one was outside my cell. And the footsteps. Everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes, more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on the tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was inhumanly fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, 
by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated the footsteps. I agreed. I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about a month ago. I have more stories than I can count. I swear it was nearly my turn. But a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped in the same kind of way. I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep, of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. I never turned my back on the guy. The scariest thing. I woke up one night to him somehow snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. The worst part, though, he was coming back into our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him. I just left. He seemed fine with it. So, so was I. I had made it through. Fifteen years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gates, a free man. As I walked along the fence for the wreck yard, I spotted my cellmate, standing off on his own, like he had for the last week or so. I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence. I wish I hadn't. There, standing off on his own on the other side of the yard, was Carl. Slouched over, eyeing the other inmates, and twitching manically. Growing up in the central U.S., I've heard all of the myths and legends about skinwalkers. I never really gave them any merit up until last week. I've also heard that talking or thinking about them can draw them, but I need to tell someone. Anyone who will listen and not think I'm crazy. Let me start with some background. My name is Dakota. I'm 26, and I've grown up in and around the southern Rockies and the Superstition Mountains and all the vast wilderness that is Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. All my life I've been drawn to the outdoors, hiking, climbing, biking, rafting, kayaking. You name it, and I've done it. I'm very experienced in all of these activities, and I've worked as a guide and survival instructor since the age of 19. I've experienced many strange and possibly paranormal things during my time in the wild, but I'm rambling. Those stories can't be posted separately if there is any in... Anyway, last Friday I took some time off for myself just to get back in tune with the solitude of nature. I packed all my gear, finished going through my checklist, and made sure to let some of the other guides know where I was headed and when I'd be back a few days later. I then loaded my gun into my four-wheeler, made sure that Bear, uh, my very large and very loyal and very protective German Shepherd, was comfy in the passenger seat. He is my lookout, adventurer partner, and best friend. He never leaves my side, even to the point that all the small businesses around the long-forgotten mining town I call home welcome him happily. We set out shortly after 11 a.m., towards a canyon I'd recently discovered hidden away behind thick brush and an apparent rock slide. After about five hours of driving through the dusty and desolate landscape, the trail continues on between a narrow passage through the mountainous cliffs. When we arrived, I parked the four-wheeler behind a large outcropping of boulders, took the keys, and covered it. Not that I was worried about theft, I was possibly miles away from the nearest human, I covered it to keep out of the unforgiving sun to prevent any melting damage. After getting the four-wheeler stashed away, I donned my pack and my sidearm, a large caliber Desert Eagle. There aren't many large animals out here, but I like guns and target shooting, so who cares if it's overkill? It's a last means of protection, and it will do the job. I surveyed the area, 
There was thick brush and dry foliage all around us, with a small foot trail I cleared from the four-wheeler at our rear, and a large rock pile in front of us with sheer cliffs on either side. I scurried around the rocks to the very narrow passage behind on the left side. It was a tight squeeze and I had to remove my pack and pull it behind me. I had to side shuffle like this for about twenty feet, with cold jagged rocks against my chest and loose boulders against my back. The trail narrowed near the end and I had to suck in my chest and wriggle my way out into a large opening in the rocks where Bear waited happily for me with his head cocked to the side, with a confused look on his face, almost as if wondering why I was struggling, while he passed easily. When I finally freed myself from the narrow crevice and looked around, my jaw dropped. All around me, the cliff walls were covered in ancient cave paintings and carvings, some of which I recognized from some other Native American sites, used as religious sites. But many of these symbols were new to me, the most notable was a large painting near where the trail continued on. It depicted a large figure whose head and antlers resembled that of a deer, but the body was long and narrow and, strangest of all, bipedal. It's at times like these I wish I brought some piece of technology, such as a camera or my iPhone, but I usually leave them at home and only bring an emergency sat phone. Intrigued, I left the opening and headed on down the trail. I was surprised by the steep downward slope that seemed to be heading down further and further into the earth, and was even more surprised when the trail ended at the mouth of a large cave. A cave I hadn't known about. This couldn't get any better. I set down my pack and pulled out my flashlight. It was getting pretty dark, so I figured I'd just check out the opening and then get settled for the night. I wandered in a few feet and abruptly stopped when the floor dropped down into a chasm. My flashlight barely penetrated the dark abyss below me. Disappointed that I'd need to return another day with my caving gear and possibly a partner, I headed back towards the mouth of the cave, and Bear, who had strangely stayed put and had not followed me in. He must be tired, I thought, as I suddenly started to realize my own fatigue after five hours of driving and nearly four hours of hiking. I started a small fire with some light newspaper logs I packed in, which burned for a surprisingly long time, heated up some water for some dehydrated oatmeal, and gave Bear his bag of kibble. After a not-quite-so-satisfying meal, I unrolled my sleeping bag and got comfortable with the fire by my side in the distant view of stars peeking between the distant cliff tops that sheltered me from the rest of the world. With that peaceful thought, I dozed off to the sound of crackling fire and bear snoring beside me. I sleepily checked my watch when I was nudged awake. It was almost three in the morning. I softly pushed bear's head away from nudging me so I could go back to sleep. But that's when, in the dim firelight, I saw his teeth bared and head low beside me in a very protective position. He was staring towards the mouth of the cave, with a deep guttural growl emanating from his throat. More alert now, I clumsily grabbed for my flashlight and unholstered my pistol, my finger ready to switch off the safety. I motioned to Bear to be quiet, which was a very handy skill that had taken a lot of time to learn. On command, he quieted but still snarled, staring at the dark hole in the cave. I illuminated the edge of the drop-off, my gun aimed with the beam, and we listened. For a few minutes, all I heard was silence besides my heartbeat. Then, faintly, I heard it. I still can't describe it, but I will try my best. It sounded like the belt of a goat and the yowl of a wild cat coming together to form words that seemed so broken and foreign. Quiet at first, it was accommodated by a clicking and scraping sound, getting closer and closer. I strained my eyes to see the edge in the beam of light. What I saw next, I'm sure has been burned into my mind's eye, and I will never forget it. In the light, 
Long, rotten fingers with thick black claws curled around the lip and proceeded to pull something up and over into the cave. This thing pulled itself to a standing position. It was about six feet tall with long, deer-like legs, too skinny to support it, that ended in small hooves that seemed to float above the ground. The body looked semi-human, but a skeleton draped with rotten, stinking flesh and patches of mangled fur and ribs protruding from the chest. The smell was wretched, and I wanted to look away, to vomit, and to run. But I was paralyzed with fear, and I kept staring at the long curled antlers, the warped and twisted body, long arms hanging loosely in front of claws scraping the ground, but mostly the disturbing, contorted mix of human and animal intertwined to make a face so haunting. I will remember vividly on my dying day, I'm sure. And when it locked onto my view with its empty, rotten sockets, it met my eyes, and then I heard it. Quiet, but all around me, that horrid howl managed words. <sighs> me. With that, I snapped out of my paralyzed state, switched the safety off, and pulled the trigger. Once, twice, three times from only three feet away. In an instant, the horrible thing before me flickered and was two feet to the right. I fired again and again, and this thing twitched and jerked towards me, a terrifying nightmare continuing to consume my very being. I don't remember much of what happened next. Bear barking, us sprinting, flashes of gunfire and the jerking and clacking, the putrid breath on my neck and the voice, the evil voice, echoing around me. Let me help you. I remember the peak of sunlight, the roar of the side by side as me and Bear sped through the desert. We woke up in our shack, uninjured, but forever scarred by our experience. It's kept me awake every night since, and I needed to tell somebody. To warn somebody. Please, if you see the carvings of the thing, or see an unknown cave, please, don't enter. I've been dying to tell this story, but though I know no one is bound to believe me, I don't even want to tell my parents in fear that they'll stare at me in disbelief and think that I'm crazy. So here I am, anonymously telling it to a group of strangers in hopes that someone will believe me and give me some peace of mind. It started out a few months ago when we moved into our new home. I grew up in a rural community, but there were plenty of neighbors and mostly fields around, and no woods. Given that I'm the youngest child, my parents waited until I was done with high school to move, as to not affect my already established life. Although we had always lived in a small, rural community, my parents were ready for something a little more secluded. Something with a lot of acreage, woods, and a place to shoot. They put my childhood home up on the market, and soon found their dream home, which is where I am currently, and desperately conveying this story. The house and the property are beautiful. It's a large, turn-of-the-century house facing 15 acres of land, the majority of which are woods and the nice half-acre pond. The best part, or so I thought, is that there are no neighbors within a mile of us. At first, I really enjoyed it. Being out in the woods was very much a cathartic experience for me. It helped shed the stresses of school and studying. Being among the tall trees and the surrounding nature made all of my problems seem totally insignificant. So I made a habit of going on regular walks through the woods. As the weeks went on, I started noticing strange things as I went on my walks. I would find partially eaten deer scattered along the leaf-littered ground 
accompanied by a putrid, rotting smell, which is attributed to the carcass in front of me. At first, I thought nothing of it. It was probably coyotes, I would tell myself. Other than that, I thought nothing of it. But I started carrying a gun with me on my walks, in case I encountered the animal that was responsible for the carnage I saw in front of me. As the days went on, I started noticing more and more mutilated deer scattered across the floor of the woods, still accompanied by the rotting smell, which I again attributed to the animals. If the increasing number of mutilations weren't enough, I started to notice a change in the sounds coming out of the woods, which was once a cacophony of sounds was now mostly dead silence, minus the low, guttural growl that seemed to be becoming more prevalent, more pronounced, and more insidious each day. By this point, I had stopped going on my little walks. A gun or no gun, I didn't want to risk the chances of facing whatever was causing these events. That being said, my curiosity eventually got the best of me one night, as I heard its growls. I decided that I was going to go get a trail cam, and set it up out in the woods the following day, in hopes of finally seeing what was out there. The next evening, after work, I gathered up what little courage I had left, and camera in hand, when walking out into the very woods I had promised myself I would stay out of. I never did get to set up the trail cam. I lost it somewhere in the woods while I was in a panic, running for my life. I made it about a hundred yards past the tree lines into the woods, where I decided to stop and set up the camera. I thought it was a good place to set up, but quite frankly, I was too scared to go any farther. After all, I wanted to spend as little time out there as possible, given the ongoing events, and the fact that it would be dark soon didn't help. Already on edge, every creak of the wood and every churn in the leaves sent me into a panic. Rushing to set the camera up, I dropped it, sending it to the leaf-ridden ground with a thud, murmuring under my breath and cursing myself for being out there. I bent down to pick the camera up, and I started to smell that putrid smell of rotting flesh again. I carefully looked around, checking my surroundings to see if anything was out there. I could feel something watching me, but I couldn't see anything. Just as I finished packing the supplies off the ground, I heard that low, guttural growl again, as well as the snap of a branch to my right. I quickly turned, seeing a human-like creature standing there, staring at me. I was completely frozen with fear. It had human features, standing on two legs, and... It had feet and hands. Two things that threw me off, however, was the fact that its skin was charred black, as if it had been burned in fire. And, most disturbingly, it had no upper or lower lips. Although mostly bald, a few thin, straggling hairs stuck every which way out of its scalp. Its sharp teeth were hanging out like hypodermic needles, with the absence of lips, its raw red gums hung out in the open. Thick strings that would appear to be saliva dripped off its chin in a persistent stream. For one single brief moment, the world around me seemed to stop. I quickly went through my options on what to do. There were really only two viable options. Either stay exactly how I was and get attacked and most likely killed by this thing, or I could get the fuck out of there. I chose the latter. I quickly scrambled to my feet and ran as fast as I could, throwing my camera in vain at the creature behind me. In the chaos of what had just occurred, I found myself to be momentarily lost after running in what I thought was the right direction for what felt like 20 minutes, but I'm sure it was only 30 seconds. Looking around and not seeing the spawn of hell that I had just encountered, I stopped to collect myself and try to find the way back to the house. I finally decided on the general direction in which I should head, when I then heard a commotion that almost sounded like a horse pounding its hooves on the dirt. I looked behind me and saw that thing 
whatever it was, running at me on all fours, spit fire out of the corners of its mouth like a rabid dog. I ran as quickly as I possibly could without daring to look behind me. Although I would not look at it, I could hear it galloping behind me and smelled its rotted flesh. Tears ran down my eyes as I thought that there was no possible way to make it out of the woods alive when I finally saw the lights of my house out in the clearing. Using what little adrenaline I had left to sprint the 200 yards or so to my back porch, I quickly opened the door and slammed it shut, not daring to look out the window. It's been about a month now since this happened. I haven't told anyone, and I will not dare to go back out into those woods. I've been doing a lot of research to see if I could find any clues as to what that thing might have been. I've exhausted myself, but I think I may have come to a conclusion. The closest thing I could find was possibly a skinwalker. I know my sighting doesn't entirely match up with the stories I've heard, but it's the closest thing I've found. Any suggestions on what it might be would be greatly appreciated. I always knew exactly what kind of gifts my grandma likes for Christmas because of something very strange that happened to her when she was just a child. My family is from Chile, all the way down in South America, and my grandmother grew up in a city called Talca, five hours south of the capital city, Santiago de Chile. Talca is a beautiful, small city with stone-paved streets, surrounded by forests and rivers and the Andes Mountains to the east. This city is more than 300 years old, and my grandmother's house, the one she grew up in and still lives in, is more than 200 years old. An old colonial house with lots of rooms and a courtyard in the middle. And in a 200 plus year old house, whenever I visit my grandma, I know I have roommates. I can always feel their eyes following me around. Growing up in this big old house, my grandma, still only a toddler, would sometimes have a difficult time sleeping. She'd see faces staring at her in the dark. She'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming due to night terrors. Almost every night, her mother, a woman with a fiery temperament I also inherited, would have to go soothe her back to sleep, reassuring her there was nothing to fear in that house. Only old memories, nothing more. But one night, the night terrors stopped. My baby grandma was about to sleep peacefully throughout the night. However, instead of being woken up by the screaming and crying of her child, my great-grandmother would wake up in the middle of the night, thinking she heard a croaky male voice coming from my baby grandma's room. That's impossible. That's just my imagination, she said to herself, and she'd go back to sleep. After a few days of waking up thinking she heard a croaky male voice in my baby grandma's room, my great-grandma decided to investigate. But every time she'd hear the voice and try to approach my baby grandma's room, the creaking of those old hardwood floors would give away that she was approaching, and the voice stopped. When she'd go check in the room, there was nothing there, only my baby grandma peacefully sleeping. One day... My great-grandmother took my baby grandma to play with our kids at a neighborhood park. In those days, during the Great Depression, there was not a lot of money to go around for fancy toys, so sunshine and good old dirt and lots of imagination had to do. And thus, my great-grandma was intrigued when she noticed my baby grandma was carrying along a beautiful porcelain doll they certainly hadn't bought for her. A pretty little thing with strawberry blonde hair and gray eyes. Where did you get that from? My great grandma asked. It's a secret, said my baby grandma. Did you find it last time we were at the park? Questioned my great grandma. I can't tell you, mommy. He says it's our secret. My great grandma, being a fiery woman, didn't put up with her child's secrets. And after a good spanking, she got her child to tell her who gave her the doll. It was my betrothed said my baby grandma, but such a silly thing to say for a child. My great grandma thought her child must have heard the word from one of the ladies at church, but what about the doll? 
My baby grandma must have found it, or stolen it from a rich kid at the playground. That was the most logical explanation. My baby grandma got another spanking, so she learned she must never steal. But then, more and more pretty dolls started appearing in my baby grandma's room. My great grandma thought they could still be explained, logically, but we all know about logic. And then things got a bit stranger. In the 1930s, in the middle of the Great Depression, people had to learn to live with just the essentials. Many barely had enough to eat, so it was alarming when all manners of rich cakes and sweets started appearing under my baby grandma's bed. Every time my great-grandma would go clean up her child's room, she'd find some kind of pastry. She'd ask her child about it, and all my baby grandma would say is, My betrothed. This went on for a few weeks, and one day, besides pretty dolls and rich sweets, pieces of jewelry appeared, always under my baby grandma's pillow. Small things. One of them, a particularly beautiful string of black baroque pearls, caught my great-grandmother's attention. She knew none of that jewelry belonged to her. She came from a wealthy family, and she had married for love, but married to down her class. And now she kept her good jewels in a box, what was left of them, at least. Only for special occasions. In those days, there was not much to celebrate. All of these occurrences were harmless, and yet... My great-grandma couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling they caused her. What was it that was gifting those things to her child? She needed to know. So one night, she decided to sleep outside my baby grandma's door, waiting for whatever it was that came into her child's room. But instead, she woke up to a croaky male's voice, already inside her child's room, and as quietly and quickly as she could, she lit a large candle and opened the door. What she saw sent a chill down her spine and made her break into a cold sweat. She saw the silhouette of a man, very thin, with normal proportions of a grown man, but so short it could be called a dwarf. This figure, in fractions of a second, jumped from my baby grandma's bed and onto the floor and slithered under the bed. It happened so fast, all my great-grandma saw by candlelight was barely a shadow. My baby grandma was peacefully asleep, and my great-grandma, feeling her heart beating in her throat, quickly entered the room, directly checking under the bed, but there was nothing. She checked every corner of that room, but nothing. No little man, no entrance for him, no hole on the ground or the walls, but nothing. My great-grandma picked up her child in her arms and took her into her own bedroom, holding her in her arms for the rest of the night, unable to sleep. In the morning, my great-grandma took my baby grandma to a bakery downtown and bought her the best slice of pie she could afford, determining to get the truth out of her child. Their conversation went something like this. Do you love mommy? Yes, mommy, I love you. From here all the way to Santiago and back. And I hope you know mommy loves you too. More than my own life. And there must be no secrets between us. Don't you think? Yes, mommy, that's right. Sweetheart, then won't you tell mommy where did you get those dolls and sweets and jewelry that have appeared in your room? I told you, mommy. It was my betrothed. And who is your betrothed? He comes into my bed every night, because I couldn't sleep well before. So he comes into my bed with me, and he kisses me and cuddles me, strokes my hair and holds me all night. And he spoons me and tells me he loves me, and that soon he'll take me with him, and we'll get married, and I'll live happily with him happily ever after. She was shocked and said with a trembling voice, holding back tears of terror. Uh, and where does he want to take you? I don't know, Mommy. I guess he lives under the house, under our city. And he'll take me soon. And we'll be married and live happily ever after. He's my Prince Charming. 
and I'm his bride. My great-grandma was trembling, but fiery woman she was. There was no way she would let anyone or anything mess with her child, even if it seems to be harmless until now. My great-grandma went to a local priest and asked him to bless the house, expelling whatever unclean things there might be in the house, especially in my baby grandma's room. And the priest did. And for one night, things were quiet. But then things got truly bad. The following night, my great-grandparents woke up to the shrieking of my baby grandma, and they ran into her room. She had scratch marks all across her back, and bite marks on her stomach and her thighs, and chunks of her hair had been pulled so hard, her scalp was bleeding. Mommy, Mommy, he's mad. I told you about him. He says I'm his, and he can do whatever he wants with me. That night, nobody was able to sleep. They waited until the morning and visited another priest for another blessing and another night and another attack. The second one worse than before. Bites and bloody scratches all throughout my baby grandma's body, her pajamas torn to shreds. The next morning, my great grandma, desperate to protect her child, went and saw a Jewish rabbi who gave her an amulet of protection to place around her child's neck. That night, same story. This time my baby grandma's hair had been cut off, and she was covered in black and blue bruises. Mommy, he said he wants to make me so ugly, nobody but him would want to touch me. He says it's all your fault. My great grandma was desperate. She was a pious woman and trusted in the Lord, but she knew that the Lord works in mysterious ways. The next morning, she spoke with her sister, who told her about a cunning woman who lived two hours away, in a smaller town towards the Andes Mountains, called Paso Nevado, and that this cunning woman knew things. She was a machi, a Mapuche shaman, an indigenous folk healer, and she'd know how to deal with what's going on. My great-grandma went to see the machi, the cunning woman, And the Machi told her that these things, these dwarves, they like little children. And sometimes they become so obsessed with some of them that they take them away. And their parents never see them again. Nobody knows what happens to the children. There are only strange legends about their fates. But these things, they are very clean. They hate dirt. They hate anything filthy. That's why they love pretty children, because they never smell as grown-ups do. So the only way to make him go away is to disgust him so much he'd never want to touch the child again. They'd have to cover the child in human feces and let her sleep like that throughout the night. My great-grandma was desperate enough to try anything. So that night she scooped up some of her own filth from the toilet bowl and with her hands smeared it all over my baby grandma, asking her to trust her on this, as the child complained it stank so badly. That night, they all went to sleep. Suddenly, my great-grandparents woke up to shrieking and screaming. This time, not the voice of my baby grandma, but a male voice, bellowing like a trumpet sounds through a hollow tree. When they entered the child's room, It was trashed. The mattress was slashed, feathers from the pillows flying everywhere. Porcelain dolls smashed against the walls, a broken window and cakes and sweets smeared on the walls. But my baby grandma was unharmed, and the thing was nowhere in sight. It never returned. Modern man has hitherto found it a great comfort to believe that in his efforts to search and discover, to record and catalog, he has left no forest unexplored, no crevice unlit, and no creature unnamed. 
It is said that there are no hidden reaches into which human sight has never ventured, and no occurrences which can defy the infallible forces of human knowledge and reason. Man chooses, with great conviction, to believe that there is nothing alien left on Earth. This prejudice allows him to recline in feelings of relative safety, secure in the belief of his own omnipotence. Maybe it is in order to protect this belief that accounts of things alien and unexplained are reacted to with fervent denial. Maybe it is just human nature to resist any revelation that cannot be easily dealt with, regardless of whether it is a modern prejudice or an ancient impulse. The compulsion to disbelieve that which would not require a shift in perception is doubtless what has confined me to this institution. Man is much more eager to believe in the hopeless fragility of his own mind than he is to believe in foul, hidden away worlds and nameless horrors beneath the earth. You who reads this manuscript, I'm sure, are less interested in my speculations about human belief than you are in the circumstances which resulted in my commitment to a psychiatric care facility. I do not know precisely what compels me to commit this story to paper. Perhaps it is out of a desire to share my experience, or my perceived experience, as it is referred to in some company, with the world. More likely it is out of a need to relieve the pressure exerted on my mind by its memory. Whatever the reason may be, the enlightenment of the world to a terrible truth or the medicine of my troubled brain. I will, to the best of my ability in the pages that follow, relive the strange and terrible events that befell me in those horrid caverns beneath the forest. At the time of the occurrences in question, I was a young man, recently graduated with a degree in botany from a small but richly historied college in Massachusetts. I soon found myself employed with the Natural Resources Department of British Columbia, having desired immediately to conduct field research. My first real opportunity to do so occurred when I was assigned to conduct a surveying of the native flora within a certain selection of a remote national forest. The trip there was a long one, up lonely highways where the towns grew fewer and farther between, and winding back roads that looked as if they had been untraveled for years. At the outside, I had been excited about the isolation for all its implications of a natural ecosystem uninfluenced by human activities. Driving further north, however, as I watched the green fields and sparse sunlit forests give way to dark looming pines, I began to feel a sense of unease, as if I was traveling to the edge of the world. I dismissed these misgivings as irrational, and as I continued on, I slowly grew accustomed to my surroundings. After three days spent driving, I arrived at the small village that was the last outpost before the vast expanse of the National Forest. Upon seeing a faded sign advertising a diner, I was suddenly aware of both the fact that I was extremely hungry and that I had grown dreadfully tired of fast food. I pulled into the near vacant parking lot and parked my car near the entrance. A bell rang above the door as I entered. I glanced around the place and saw a few well-broken-in booths and a time-worn bar with metal stools. Besides me and the owner, there were only three other people to be seen. A couple in the far booth who did not look up from their food, and an old man who eyed me suspiciously from the bar. I sat down at the end of the bar opposite to the old man and picked up a menu. I did not feel his eyes leave me as I read. What brings you round here? asked the owner, after I had read him my order. He was a large, tired-faced man who looked to be in his late forties. A faded tattoo of an anchor and rope showed halfway out of the sleeve of his worn t-shirt. We don't see too many new faces up this way, if you ain't already guessed. I'm from the Department of Natural Resources, I replied. I'm here to conduct a survey of the forest. I heard the old man scoff at me, and I turned in his direction. You best watch yourself out in those woods, grumbled the old man, seeing he had caught my attention. Uh, what do you mean by that? I asked him, confused and somewhat intrigued by this statement. He ignored my question and grumbled on. There's things out in them trees, 
Things that ain't supposed to be seen by the likes of you and me. What sort of things? I questioned. You just get in and out of those woods as quickly as you can, and pray you don't find out. He replied in a low voice, raising a gnarled finger at me in warning. Knock it off, Gus, interjected the owner. Why do you gotta try to scare the kid with that nonsense? I'm just trying to tell him something he might need to know. The old man complained. Yeah, well, you don't need to know none of your loony stories, the owner replied. I was done talking to him anyway, grumbled the old man as he laid his money down onto the bar and walked out of the front door. I was left puzzled and somewhat unnerved by his words. You don't mind nothing, old Gus says, the owner reassured me. Thought it wouldn't do you no harm to be careful in those woods. Gets dark early in the thick of those trees. It's real easy to lose your way and real hard to find it again. There's been a few people gone missing in those trees. He cast his eyes to the door that the old man had just left through. Happened to Gus's kid. The atmosphere had become awkward after that exchange. I ate my meal quickly and left without another meaningful word. As I started my car and drove the short distance to the small motel that I had been told would accommodate me, I found it difficult to forget the old man's words. Surely it had just been a manifestation of backwoods superstition, developed after a life spent in the shadow of the mighty forest. I tried to dismiss it. The motel fit the faded atmosphere of the old town exactly as one might have suspected. The room I was pointed to by the disinterested old woman at the front door was a small one, occupied by only a bed and a small wooden desk. The final rays of the sun now disappeared over the treetops, shone through a cracked window pane, casting my shadow upon the faded wallpaper. I set my suitcase down on the bed and opened it. I took out the map of the forest that I'd been given by the department before I set out on my trip and laid it out on the desk. As I looked the map over, I was struck by the forest's massive scale. It was countless times the size of the tiny town I now stood in which occupied the bottom left corner of the map. The section I had been sent to survey was itself of a considerable size, and mile after mile of trees stretched beyond it. Past the trees were a few small mountains and scarcely another human being in that direction. The words I heard in the diner echoed in my mind. I pushed them to the back of my mind and planned the course I would take tomorrow. I planned to enter the forest the next morning, at a point on the east edge of town, and travel in a horseshoe pattern that would take me several miles into the forest and bring me out on the other side of town about an hour before sunset. Satisfied that there was no reason my venture would not be successful, I decided it was time I should get some sleep. A very peculiar dream troubled me that night. I found myself wandering amongst the trunks of great black trees. I was wrought with a feeling of great unease, as if I was being watched by some terrible entity that lurked in every shadow. I lacked the faintest idea of where I was or how I had come to be there, but... I felt that I needed to find my way out of the strange forest with the greatest urgency. As I wandered, the sense of unease I had felt transformed into a feeling of imminent danger. I began to hear bizarre screeching sounds from just outside my field of sight. Upon hearing those dreadful noises, I broke into a run. I soon found, however, that I seemed only to travel deeper into the forest. The trees grew wider and taller as the sky grew darker and lower, until the two seemed to meet above me. The shadows closed in, and the horrible noises echoing out of them grew louder. My breathing grew faster and shallower as I ran deeper into the forest. The trees ceased to look like anything organic, becoming great pillars of black stone. The sky pressed down farther, till it was like a great stone ceiling. The sounds from the shadows grew unbearably loud and began to resemble those of metal screeching against metal. I had run until I felt my chest would burst when, all of a sudden, the ground in front of me fell away like a waterfall of soil and stone, leaving only a sheer vertical drop into oblivion. I stopped abruptly, inches from the edge, 
I stared for a moment in disbelief at the endless expanse of black nothingness that yawned in front of me, before something compelled me to whirl back around in the direction of the forest cavern. It was the sound. They had grown impossibly loud, and they seemed to be closing in. The shadows likewise closed in around me, bringing the screeching and scraping cacophony upon me. I glimpsed formless black shapes in the edge of the shadow creeping toward me, patient for the advance of the shadows to allow them to reach me. One of the forms darted towards me. Unable to stop myself, I instinctively recoiled backwards. I tumbled back into the void. I sat up with a ragged gasp. I was drenched in a cold sweat, feeling a falling not gone from my stomach and the echo of the abrasive noises not gone from my ears. Never in my life had I endured a dream of such vividity. I blamed it upon the strangeness of my environment and the peculiar warning I had received the previous night, but it had still shaken me. I fell back onto my mattress and laid my hands over my face as I caught my breath. When the physical symptoms of terror had left my body, I sat up once more and surveyed the room. Nothing was changed from the night before. My suitcase still lay open on the floor beside the desk, the light of morning streaming in through the window. I knew I needed to get started on my day's plan, and with a shuddering sigh, I lifted myself out of bed and got dressed. It was a cool, dry morning. Only a few wispy clouds hung over my head as I got in my car and drove back to the same diner where the exchange likely responsible for my nightmare had taken place to eat breakfast. This time the diner was completely empty, except for me and a young man behind the counter, who looked as if he would much rather still be asleep. I ate my breakfast without a word, so I had decided I would forego lunch that day and knew I would likely soon be stricken with hunger, I felt little desire to eat. My mind was still plagued by the recollection of the nameless shapes that lurched and crawled through the shadows of my nightmare forest. If the sleepy youth behind the counter noticed my tension, he did not show it, and I left without any sort of conversation. I climbed back into my car and tried to clear my mind as I drove to the mouth of the thin trail that would lead me on my expedition. I rolled down the windows to let in the cool morning air and took a few deep breaths. I began to feel better as I watched the morning sunlight stream across the branches of small trees and cast dancing shadows upon the quiet old buildings of that little town. It was just a dream. Rational men don't fear dreams, I thought to myself as I turned off the worn pavement onto a dirt road. After a few minutes spent driving down the sunny dirt road, I felt quite at ease. In no time at all, the road narrowed, and I parked in the grass beside it. I stepped out of my car, taking from the passenger seat the backpack of materials I had packed that morning. I shouldered the bag and looked up at the towering pines that marked the end of where my car could take me. I took a deep breath of the crisp morning air and began down the path into the forest. The first few hours I spent in the forest were relatively uneventful, although I did take note of the fact that there were far fewer animals to be seen than I had expected, which, at the time, I attributed to some undetermined effect of the local air or water that had taken place since the last survey was conducted a decade prior. After some time had passed, however, and I had traveled several miles into the forest, I began to feel uneasy. I would occasionally be moved to glance over my shoulder by the feeling that I was being watched. Each time I did, memories of my nightmare caused me to shudder. These feelings grew in frequency and intensity as I ventured deeper into the quiet, looming pines. Soon, another feeling arrived to accompany them. This was the feeling that I was intruding. I began to be troubled, without knowing why, by the thought that I was not meant to walk on the cold ground between the mighty trunks of these ancient trees. I was musing on these strange thoughts when I was jolted to alertness by a strange noise. Some terrible, abrasive fusion of a screech and a squeal, like bone rasping against rotten wood, long, loud, and guttural. After the initial shock of the sound, an awful realization grasped me. Despite how terrible and otherworldly it was, 
The sound had unmistakably been produced by a living organism. My mind raced with thoughts of the thing in the woods that the old man of the diner had warned me of when a terrified deer burst out of the foliage a few feet in front of me. Running from the direction that the sound had come from, the animal did not so much as acknowledge my presence as it raced across the trail and disappeared into the ferns and bushes on the other side. For the brief moment it had been in view, I thought I had glimpsed in its eye an expression of sheer terror. When I reflect now on what I did next, I curse my foolishness. I still do not know what compelled me to leave the trail and search for the source of that terrible screech. Perhaps it was simply curiosity, but I believe it was more likely out of a desire to prove to myself that my fears had been unfounded, that there were no things, not in the forest or anywhere else. I followed the impulse of the scientific man and sought a rational explanation for what seemed unnatural and strange. Following this impulse, I turned off the made trail and began to make my way along the path the terrified deer had made through the brush. As I walked, pushing branches and plants out of my way, I heard another sound from the direction I was heading. They were quieter, but still unmistakably of the same source as the first. My mind flailed and gasped in search of any natural explanation for these hideous sounds, but I could not think of a single one. I was filled with both creeping dread and utter bafflement as I stumbled through the brush. After a handful of seconds that felt like hours, I broke through the brush and into a small clearing in the woods. There, on the floor of dead brown needles, I saw it. Looming over the bloody body of the unlikely companion of the first deer I had seen was the creature, the thing that I had been warned about. I stared, blinking and stared once more. Upon realizing that my eyes were not deceived, my mind acted to save itself, and I fainted dead away. I could not hazard a guess as to how long I remained unconscious, but it must have been no insignificant amount of time. My mind was firmly committed to preserving its sanity by making me oblivious to my surroundings, but there at last came a point that the physical sensations of my body overcame the wishes of my unconscious mind. When I awoke, it took me several seconds to get a bearing on my surroundings. At first, all I knew was that I was being dragged across the floor of rough stone, and I had an intense pain in my right ankle. I then realized with tremendous shock and horror that I was being dragged by the creature from the forest. The tunnel or cavern I was in was sparsely lit by some manner of bioluminescent fungus or lichen, and I was able to see the creature's insect-like head with its mandibles clamped around my ankle. I began desperately considering any possible means I may have to escape. For a fleeting moment, I was terrified that the thing had noticed my awakening, but if it had, it did not show it. I concluded that I must have much poorer eyesight than myself. I tried to take stock of my situation. My backpack had apparently been ripped off of me, so I was without even the poorest weapon. It was nearly impossible to think straight while this thing was dragging me across the abrasive, rock-littered floor. Then an idea struck me. I did not particularly like it. It involved not only an element of uncertainty, but also a time spent waiting. However, I could think of no alternative. I waited for what felt like aeons, but could really have only been a few minutes. The floor tore my clothes, my flesh burned with pain where the mandibles held me. I strained my eyes in the dim light, searching frantically. When at last, my eyes landed upon the object of my quest. A loose stone on the floor, about the size of a softball, that came into a dull point on one end. It was unlikely I was going to find a better weapon, and I threw out my arm to reach it. The energy with which I flailed caused my body to shift to the right, and in response, the creature jerked me forward with considerable force. I felt a crank in my ankle and a shower of pain. 
and my fingers closed tightly around the stone. I steeled myself, adjusting my grip on the stone and facing the point downward. I took a deep breath and looked up at the creature. Then, with a loud cry of effort, I sat up and brought the stone down, point first on the creature's head with all my strength. I felt the stone break through the hard shell of the creature's skull and plunge down into softer matter beneath with a sickening crunch. The creature released its grasp on my ankle and let out a gurgling screech as I fell back on the cold stone floor. I quickly sat up again, ready to defend myself from an attack by the creature, but I at once saw there was no need. The first blow had killed it. I breathed a shuddering sigh of relief and bracing against the rough wall of the cavern, tried to lift myself to my feet. Once I had managed to stand up, I limped over, favoring my left foot, to look at the creature. The old man in the diner had said that the things in the forest were not meant to be seen, and upon looking closely at one of them, I found myself in complete agreement. The thing that lay on the stones before me Illuminated by the dim glow of the walls, was a sight never meant for human eyes. It was roughly six feet in length, insect-like in general outline, having six jointed legs, ending in bony, hook-like appendages, as well as a mandible head resembling that of a termite. Its body, however, seems to possess a fleshy, rubbery quality that distinguished it from being totally insectoid. The dim light glistening off what appeared to be a slimy coat on the creature's body. A whitish-green fluid ran out onto the cavern floor from the cracks around the stone wedge that was still lodged in the creature's skull. It emanated a foul, acidic smell. I marveled at the monstrosity, still in disbelief at the existence of such a creature, after a few moments passed, a thought crossed my mind that turned my blood to ice. The thought had been one of the old man's words. Things in the woods. Things. I realized that there was no reason for me to believe that the monster I killed had been the only one, and wherever I was now, I was deep within the territory of its kind. It became apparent to me that I was still in great danger as long as I remained in those tunnels. Conscious of how little time I may have until another creature passed through the tunnel I was in, I started trying to find my way back out. Having no idea of what direction out may be, I began traveling down the tunnel in the direction opposite to the one I had been dragged in. I was only able to move frustratingly slow due to the injury to my ankle. Each step caused a stab of pain to rush up my right leg. I was encouraged at first by the fact that the floor of the tunnel I walked up sloped upwards and I hoped it would bring me to the surface fairly quickly. However, after nearly twenty agonizing minutes of staggering through the cold, damp tunnel, it became clear to me that I was far deeper underground than I had thought. Continuing on my way, I soon reached a fork in the tunnel. This was what I had been dreading. I had no way of knowing which tunnel would bring me to the surface, and which would carry me further into the realm of the creatures. I was about to choose a tunnel at random and hope for the best, when I heard a sound from the tunnel to the left. It was a persistent, hollow tapping. I realized with horror that I had heard the sound before. I had heard it when the creature was dragging me down the tunnel. Footsteps. Listening closer, I could hear that the sounds coming from the tunnel before me were faster and more irregular and growing louder. By my reckoning, this indicated two or three creatures traveling down the tunnel in my direction. My breath caught in my throat. I immediately ducked into the tunnel to my right and started to scramble down it as fast as I could, dragging my right foot behind me. After a few minutes moving at this pace, I stopped to catch my breath. When my heart stopped hammering in my ears, I became aware of a quiet sound drifting back down the tunnel from the way I had come. My heart skipped a beat and then resumed its hammering. One of the creatures was moving down the tunnel behind me in my direction. 
Suddenly, my exhausted limbs blazed with energy. I lurched and stumbled down the tunnel, heedless of the pain that stabbed upon my ankle. Heedless of the pain that stabbed up from my ankle. Heedless of the fact that the tunnel I now traveled was sloping downward. The only thought that occupied my mind was that in my current condition, facing another creature in the narrow, dark tunnel would mean certain death. I staggered on further, urged forward by thoughts of mandibles and hooked insect limbs tearing my flesh from my bones. I took no notice of the fact that the clumps of glowing fungi grew thicker and more frequent, filling the tunnel with a pale green light. I was nearly at the point of collapsing when I turned a corner in the tunnel and was stopped in my tracks with horror. The stone before me fell away into a steep vertical drop. However, unlike in my nightmare, the drop did not lead away into nothingness. No. What I saw when I fell to my knees with horror and stared over that cliff was far worse. The stone wall fell vertically for at least two hundred feet before it terminated in the bottom of a tremendous pit. The pit was lit by the sickly green light from the thick ropes of glowing fungus that hung far above me. I saw that the tunnel I looked out from was one of the dozens that perforated the sheer stone walls of the pit. From those tunnels streamed the creatures. Hundreds of them. Thousands of them. They crawled up and down the rough walls, in and out of the tunnel mouths, and they covered the floor of the pit. At the bottom of the pit, in the center of teeming, screeching masses of the creatures, was the most terrible sight of all. The queen. It was larger than the other creatures, much larger, the length of twenty ordinary creatures. Its body was a great mass of whitish-gray, undulating flesh that seemed to glow in the unwholesome light. The creatures swarmed around its immobile bulk. Before its head was a cluster of creatures who offered it chunks of bloody flesh, which it occasionally leaned down and grabbed into its mandibles. I was sickened by the realization that I had just witnessed what my fate would have been had I not awoken and killed the creature that had taken me here. My mind was soon torn away from this thought by another horrible scene. The queen let out a low, gurgling sound. Its sides collapsed inward. A wriggling white larva emerged from its abdomen, and at once two adult creatures took hold of it and carried it off deeper by way of a tunnel in the base of the wall. At once, I was on my feet. I turned back and lurched up the tunnel from where I had come, heedless of the creature that may still occupy it, caring only about distancing myself from that foul chamber. My mind spun as I stumbled, bending under the strain of what I had witnessed. I heard the sound of my own hysterical laughter echoing off the walls of the tunnel. I felt tears running down my face. Pain. Terror. Then, mercifully, darkness. I have no recollection of what else occurred that night. I only know that I must have escaped the tunnels, for when I next awoke I was in a clean white bed in a brightly lit medical ward, with my ankle in a cast. When I inquired as to what happened to me, I was politely informed by an orderly that I was found by a search party two days after I had ventured into the forest. I had apparently been hysterical when I was found, and had told the search party all of what I experienced, and I had been committed to the Clearview Sanitarium. I have been kept here for the past two years. I have been told that what I experienced was, in reality, the sudden onset of a mental condition. My broken ankle had been explained as the result of stumbling in the forest. My scrapes and cuts have been explained as the result of running through brushes and thorns. My story has been dismissed as a grand hallucination. My warnings of the rapidly multiplying legions of nightmare creatures in hidden caverns have been dismissed as deluded paranoia. In short, I have been labeled a madman. What most torments me in this facility is the knowledge that humanity still remains ignorant to what I have learned. 
I have learned that there are places on Earth that man does not own. There are creatures that man has not faced and must never face, for they harbor no fear of man. Every day that man reclines in the serene illusion that he is master of all the Earth, the creatures who live outside his sight grow in numbers and strength. Each day that man remains ignorant, he grows weaker in comparison. I pray this ignorance does not destroy us. I ordered myself on the dark web. The title is weird, I know. But if you can just give me a moment, I'll explain. I'll have to be fast though. I don't know how close they are. Essentially, I ordered myself on the dark web. I'm a drug user, I'll admit it. Weed is my usual go-to, but I buy that off my friend. If, however, I want to get something a little heavier, like acid or coke, I just order it off the dark web. It's surprisingly simple. A few clicks, some bitcoin transfers, and then boom. I have acid in my P.O. box. But I'm also a curious guy. The dark web has always intrigued me. Up until a few days ago, I had been on there to buy some drugs off sites some of my friends gave to me, but late one night I was sober and at home, which was a rare thing for me. So since I was bored, I decided to boot up my Tor browser and try to see what sort of fucked up shit I could find on the dark web. If you've ever been on the dark web, you'll know that you can't just search up Red Rooms or Hitman for Hire and get results. No, you have to find links to these websites first. So I hopped onto Google again to try and find some links to a messed up website. I know it's weird that I was actually searching for the worst. But as soon as I got on the dark web that night, I had a sense of morbid curiosity come over me. Anyways, I spent a little while trying to find some links. Anything that I found was either too tame for me, or the links didn't work. At this point, I was about ready to give up, and I wish I had. But in one final attempt, I clicked on Reddit, hopping onto r slash deep web. I didn't think I would find anything, so I just scrolled through hot for about half an hour before sorting to new. Then I found it. One simple text post titled, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services. In the text box, it was a post with what seemed to be just a random assortment of numbers and letters. It took my tired brain a second to figure out what it was, but I realized pretty quickly it was a link, presumably to a Hitman website. So I decided to paste the link into my dark web browser, and what do you know, it worked. But before I decided to go any further, I figured I should go back to the OP's profile see if they have posted any other dark web links. However, when I went back to the post in question, OP's profile was deleted. Weird. Anyway, I reopened my dark web tab and hopped onto the site. Up along to the top of the website was its name, Slayer's Assassination and Life Rooting Services, and next to it was what looked to be a skull inside of a crosshair. I chuckled when I saw that. This site must be fake. Upon scrolling down, however, I was not disappointed. There was a paragraph of white text on a black background, and a small box to the right of the text that just said, place an order. The text was the main part, though. As it took up most of the page, it read, Slater's assassination and life rooting services offers everything from acid attack, crippling, blinding, castration, torture, rape, beatings, and good old death. We have the lowest prices out of any other company running similar services, and we are worldwide. We have a dedicated and experienced group of staff based all over the world. So if you need someone to be assassinated, or maybe you just want them scared for life, don't hesitate to contact us. Again I laughed. This had to be satire, right? Hell, I was even tempted to order it on someone just to see what would happen. Ironically. I actually have a half-decent job so I can afford to. Better not risk it though, I thought to myself. I was about to close my computer and call the night, 
when I heard a knock at the door. I live alone, so it was unusual to get visitors, especially so late at night. But when I opened my door, it was just my good buddy Mark, who also happened to be my weed plug. As I opened the door, he didn't hesitate to let himself in, and shove a big baggie full of pot in my face. This dude is the best shit I've had in a minute. We gotta try some. I couldn't say no. Cut to a couple hours later, it's early morning, and Mark and I are chilling on my couch, both blazed as fuck. He suddenly decides to get up, and I assume he's going to get some leftover pizza. But he walks over to my desk and my computer. Slayer's assassination. Are you gonna kill someone or something? He mutters. What? I reply. Your computer, dude. It's got some hacker shit on it. It's the dark web, man. Don't fuck with it. At this point, I'm still on my couch, half asleep and not paying full attention. However, I sat up pretty fast when he said the words, Hey man, let's order a hitman on you. I hopped up and walked over to my PC. Part of my brain was screaming no. What the fuck are you doing? But the majority of my brain, which was also the high part, was thinking about how funny it would be to order a hitman on myself. So I agree. I did make him get out of my chair though, because I didn't want him seeing what my credit card numbers were as I transferred some bitcoin. At the end, after I wrote down all my personal details, like my address, age, and even a photo, I had to select what I want happened to me. I just selected plain old assassination, as it was actually cheaper than some of the other things. I could have paid an extra couple of grand to be beaten before my death. But even my high brain didn't want to splash the cash too much on my own death. God, this is ridiculous. Anyways, I placed the order and then replied to a confirmation email. And boom, it was done. A couple of clicks and I had ordered myself on the dark web. Mark and I laughed about it for a while. But then he left about an hour later and I fell asleep not too long after. I woke up around 9am. Which meant I got at least 6 hours of sleep even if it felt like I got three. I got up out of bed, threw on some track pants and a cotton shirt. Yes, I slept naked. And I brewed myself a coffee before sitting down to play some games. And just enjoy my Sunday. You can imagine how shocked I was when I saw that I had ordered my death the previous night. Even though I thought that the sight was bullshit, I still felt a pit open in my stomach. Even when I'm high, I usually make sensible decisions. I chuckled, not like I remembered anyway, but I guess Mark's new shit was really good. I would assume a normal human being would do something else, but I was still kind of out of it from the night before, so I just carried on with my day. I was a little more paranoid, sure, but as I said, I just assumed it was bullshit. I even laughed at the email I got from the website, saying that their hitman has been dispatched and was on its way. It was like ordering a package off Amazon. I was tempted to email back and ask for some day delivery. But I didn't need to ask, because that's exactly what I got. I didn't see it arrive, but around the time. I started to cook myself a shitty dinner, I noticed a blacked out sedan parked on the side of the road from my house. I didn't live in a rural area. But there is a lot of trees and bushes between each of the houses on my street. So I'd be surprised if any other houses saw the car except of mine. At this point I was freaking out. What if this site was real? Even though I'm a big guy, I was freaking out. I didn't own any weapons, aside from a slightly larger than average kitchen knife. Fuck it. I'm confronting it, I decided. I put on a hoodie and slid the knife into the front pocket, before waltzing out of my house and walking right up to the driver's side window of the vehicle. Even I was astounded at my own courage. Knocking on the window, nothing happened. It was rather anticlimactic. I was fully prepared to have a fight for my life. All because I did something really dumb while I was baked. But like I said, nothing happened. I even put my head right up to the window. As if there was a reflection to try to get a better look to see what was inside. I could barely see what was inside the car. But all I could make out was two empty seats. No, one was even inside. I had got all hyped up for nothing. 
I decided to wait out by the car for a bit, but after half an hour or so, I was hungry, and I had to go back inside to take my dinner out of the oven. I swear, it was only a minute between me going inside to take my dinner out of the oven, and looking back out the window, and the car being gone. I didn't even hear it go. Guess I'm eating my dinner with all my curtains closed and doors locked, I muttered to myself. I just started to calm down when the power shut off. It was sunny outside, and coupled with the car, I now knew that this was the real deal. I had signed my own death warrant. I ran into my upstairs bedroom and locked the door, and then hid under the bed. I couldn't at all call the cops. What would I say? Oh yes, hello sir. Turns out while super high, I paid $5,000 for an anonymous hitman to kill me, and now he's arrived. Send an officer, ASAP. Please and thank you. So I just stayed hiding under my bed. I still am now. I've been here for half an hour now writing this. Think of this as an epitaph. I know I'm screwed. Just a minute ago I heard my back door slowly creak open. This piece of writing may seem humorous to you, the reader. But in reality, as you read this, I'm under my bed, praying to a god that lost all faith in me years ago to spare me, to let me go. But I know that won't happen. My bedroom door just opened, and I can see a big pair of black boots. When I was a child, I lived in a small neighborhood, in the heart of a bustling metropolis, in one of the most populous countries in the world. It was the era before smartphones, flat screens, and social media. The internet was in its infancy, a tool for those in the know instead of a commonplace necessity. There were no massive franchise outlets popping up in every available square foot of pavement space and restaurant leaflets printed on cheap yellow paper were still something to look forward to when checking the post box at the end of the day. I say this not to decry what we have now. I'm very much a member of the modern era, and I don't glorify not being able to look up what I want when I want to. I simply say this to carve out an image of what the days were like when I lived through this story. Because, you see, I believe the only reason most people don't know about this was because they had no way to. There is nary a traveler faster than rumors. But rumors itself cannot board a ferry and cross the oceans, nor can it rack up the money to print out warnings and ship it to the billions who needed to hear it. Not until the net came about could that truly be possible, and it is for that reason that I pen this today, with the intent of reaching out to as many people as I can just as Pahari had once intended. Pahari was our neighborhood guard. He was an amicable man, tall and dusky with a heavy voice, and a pair of trousers that looked like they'd seen battlefields more than the wash basins. He had a ready wit about him, and the children of my complex loved listening to the stories he told us about his village down east by the river, where they caught fish and nylon nets and cooked curry with bitter gourd grown in their own backyard. Sometimes his fondness for food would slip into the stories and the children would groan, impatient. He would laugh wholeheartedly and talk about how his wife could cook the most amazing potato curry with cumin seeds and onions, and how if she was here she'd yell at them for not appreciating her cookery more. What he considered most precious, however, was his daughter, he would proudly show around the little black and white photo of her that he would carry around in his wallet. He would take a new one every year. So for someone like me who would talk to him often, it was like watching her grow up before your own eyes. He would rant about how she'd inherited her mother's cleverness and her father's good looks, and how she would tease him, saying she preferred his nephews and her mother's company to his drab stories. Listening to Pahari every day, however, was a privilege afforded to only a select few. For despite being a guard, he never stood behind a door, or sat at a table in the garage of a still, 
silent apartment complex to keep miscreants at bay. He patrolled the neighborhood at night, from eleven to seven in the morning, and slept in the afternoon atop a straw bed he'd made himself, laid under the shade of the tree in front of our house. During monsoons, when the rain would break through the canopy and cover the tarred streets in a muddy torrent, he would calmly sleep on the roof of our building with a tarpaulin sheet pulled tight above him, tied to the corners of the roof with twine he'd gotten from the sweet shop nearby. Therefore, it wasn't particularly easy to get a hold of him, and it was only through sheer luck that I'd often run to him getting ready to sleep outside or up on the roof. That was when he'd started telling me his stories. He'd speak of the children in his village, playing at make-believe with carrots tied to the sides of their heads to look like horns, of how when the storms ravaged the riverside they'd often have crocodiles coming on shore, trudging a mere feet from their bedrooms, of wizened men shutting their doors and lighting candles at their threshold for the most auspicious days of the month. My favorite stories were the ones he told of their local legends, the half-man, half-tiger demon that haunted the riverbanks after the witching hour, the two-headed stranger that only came out on the third full moon of the year, thirsting for the blood of human children and newborn calves, the medicine man who would step out from the ashes of a bonfire in the ruins of the old school on the east shore, and, most importantly, of the doorman. While all of his stories would delight and enthrall, the tales of the doorman would stand out to me. They were the kind you'd dream of when you sat in the dark, awake and aware late at night, listening to every scratch and jolt and squeak ringing out in the slate-black shadows and imagining the unseen machinations behind them. The doorman always seemed more than just a story when I heard Pahari talk of him. Somehow more rooted in reality and in the terrors of the mundane more than the other fiendishly horrific specters he would tell us about. The doorman isn't a human, he'd say, neatly folding a betel nut leaf in half and sealing it with sweet syrup. No one knows what he is. He's not of this world or any world that you or me or our ancestors have any knowledge of. He lives in the shadow behind the door, the shadow it casts when it opens completely against a wall, and he's lived there forever. Uh, which door? I'd whisper, trembling as the evening skies turned darker and darker and the rains beat against the tarpaulin above his straw bed. Every door. If it's a door that leads into a room, the doorman has lived in the shadows behind it. Perhaps he still lives there. He isn't of this world, and there are no worldly laws to tether him to our way of life. He is everywhere at once, and he is nowhere. He will come out during great misfortune, when the night is at its darkest, the lamp is burning at its lowest, and the shadows it casts are at their strongest. At that moment, if you are awake, you'll hear a scratch at the first door to your house. If you tiptoe quietly to the room it opens up into, you'll notice the air around you getting heavier, like it does hours before a massive summer thunderstorm. With the sweat trickling down from your brow, you will see the faintest hint of something dart in from under the door. A shadow in the shape of a seven-toed foot, thinner than paper, slowly taking form like a cloud of black steam being frozen in place. Then, as you're rooted in place, you'd see the rest of him, coming through the door, jarring it from the center outwards. What does he look like? I asked, as thunder rang out behind me. Like nothing you could comprehend. It'd be like looking upon something vast and unstoppable and describing it with nothing, save words later. You can hear them on the radio talking about a 60-foot tidal wave or a million-kilometer forest fire, and you could convince yourself you'd grasp the sense of their magnitude, of their terror. You would tell yourself that this is as big as a building or as wide as ten cricket stadiums but you will only truly understand the scale of terror they inspire if you see them. 
There is no yardstick, no measuring tape to convey what horror he'll bring into your life. All that is certain is after he's done, they'll never find you. You will be alive only as a story. A cautionary tale of no real value since there is little you can do to thwart him. Isn't there any way to stop him? Not in this day and age. There will be those who believe a prayer will stave him off. I say that's not true. To say that he is rendered impotent by anything we may do is wishful thinking, and an all too human way of convincing yourself that you're safe. Pahari would pop the betel leaf into his mouth and look into the dark clouds, savoring the sickly sweet flavor as the world around him rang with rain and thunder and howling winds. His blue tarpaulin flapping madly against its restraints, an old tattered bedsheet covered in black polythene bags, covering his frame. He never seems to mind the elements, their fury and splendor. He said they reminded him of home, and when the storm would force him and his wife to keep watch at their doorstep, to deter crocodiles from coming in too close to their daughter's bedroom. As I came into adolescence, my interest in the macabre grew, becoming a full-time hobby. Bahari never stopped telling me stories, but I had less and less time to listen to them. I still sat and heard him talk any time I could, however. But on most days, I'd come back from school, finish off work, prepare for the college entrances, and plop down on the bed to read horror stories. The gothic, incomprehensible terror of those tales would lull me into a fitful sleep, sometimes broken by sordid nightmares of whatever abomination I'd read about that night. And sometimes in those dreams, lurking at the back of whatever ludicrous world I had conjured up, there would be something tall and black, standing still just out of focus. And if I tried too hard to see what he looked like, I would be jolted awake. In the summer of my first year in college, Bahari suddenly stopped coming to our neighborhood. There was no warning, no news of his departure. He just up and left, put in notice at the ramshackle secretary's office down the street, and he took his straw bed and blue tarpaulin with him. One day he was there, raring to talk. The next, he was gone. I asked around at my neighbors and all the local tea stalls and no one seems to know why he had left. Apparently he had taken the early morning train to his village and set off midway through his shift. The only one who'd seen him was the porter at the station, who was also a regular at the tea stall. He looked scared, sir. I've seen this man coming and going for a decade, and I've only ever seen him smile. It was strange. I felt odd listening to that. I was certain that there was some tangible reason, some concrete rationality behind his sudden departure. I was worried for him, and more than a little angry. Bahari was a part of my childhood, and I shared several memories with him. Stories told on gloomy days, Cricket matches played with makeshift bats and plastic balls, talking about his family to the extent where they no longer seemed like strangers in a place miles away from home. To think he would walk away without a hint of a goodbye to an old friend piqued me, and I confessed to having sat on the roof for hours, reminiscing about him and his hundreds of tales. But time is a ruthless taskmaker, and as the months and years rolled by, he faded from memory. With just a handful of moments scattering in the larger consciousness of my past to gauge the impact he had on my life. I grew up. I graduated from college and entered a master's program in a university away from home. It was a very different life there. Far removed from the hustle of everyday city dwelling, the university campus was quiet blanketed in silence on weeknights with only the drone of cicadas and crickets breaking the austere atmosphere. There were no buses thundering down the streets and no drunken neighbors yelling at the wind, just calm solitude amidst the pursuit of research and academia. 
I would often walk outside my dorm room, a novel in hand, and read quietly under the university park lights, their incandescent bathing the shrubbery in an almost dreamlike glow, orange among black. My penchant for horror was as prevalent as ever, and when time came to do my thesis, I knew I wanted to do it on something relevant to me, something I could pursue passionately for a year and delve into the most fine-grained details and histories of. It was then, after half a decade, that I recalled my old friend Pahari and his treasure trove of stories about the culture, mythos, and legends of his land. What I had then seen as enthralling, disquieting fun, I now saw differently through a scholar's eyes. I saw a little community full of lore and rites peculiar to them. They begged to be explored, to be written about and held up to the world. That merited a deep dive into their very roots to find out the origin of their stories and their customs. It seemed to me to be the only way forward. After all, Bahari was my friend, and I felt like I had a connection to the place. It was as if what I had shared with the man had been set up simply so I could venture into this second act, and maybe in the process regain a lost kinship. I presented my idea to the supervisors, who needed more than a little persuasion. After all, there was naught to provide that this little village could truly hold anything heretofore unseen, save stories I had heard from a single resident a lifetime ago. But I was possessed of a strange determination to do this, and I pushed for the project, even offering to fund it myself. Eventually the committee relented, agreeing to support it on one condition. I was to stay there for a week and surmise whether there was anything of promise to be gleaned. If that was successful, my thesis would be completely funded. If not, I would come back having wasted neither too much time nor any consequential sum of money. I set out a few weeks later for the village. I always knew the name, and finding out how to get there from the university town I was in was no easy task. It was the middle of summer, and I was facing a 14-hour journey by train and boat. I boarded the train in the early hours of the morning, the skies and unkempt fields rushing by outside while I leaned against the window and felt the wind brushing my hair backwards, smelling of sweat and pitch and wet grass. The heat was bearable, for the sun hit beneath steely clouds, and the low rumble of thunder rang out with the occasional flash of distant lightning. I got off at the port by noon, and hunted for a ferry, or at least a fisherman's rowboat. The journey by water would take six hours, and I wanted to be in the village as early as I could. It had started raining by then, and the cascading drops left ripples on the river's visage, marking old, hunched-over fishermen sitting by the burning grounds. The wind blew my umbrella around, and I had to weave my way through it, only barely keeping it from being tugged away by a sudden northerly draft. I found a boat that charged a small fortune, and spent the next six hours lying on my back under the tarpaulin roof that covered its aft. The sky turned slowly from gray to blue to a dark red as the rain pattered against the fabric, making little puddles wherever there was a fold or abrasion. I turned my thoughts to what I would do on reaching there. I would, of course, seek out Bahari's family, introduce myself, meet Bahari again if he was still around, and then tell them of why I was there. They were my gateway to understanding the truth of this place. I reached the shores after 6.30. The rain showed no sign of stopping, and the humidity was only helped a little by the cool river winds flowing across the jetty. I paid the ferryman and trudged up the muddy path, umbrella all but useless against the turbulence of the downpour. There was no one about and I saw no traces of electrical lights anywhere. What looked like a broken-down kindergarten school loomed up before me. 
white walls covered with colorful paintings of children and books and cartoons. I knocked on the door. Nothing. The wind picked up, and I almost immediately regretted having gone there. As it began to dawn on me that the village might be farther down from the shoreline than I expected. Once I reached there, money would buy me a bed and some basic meals for the night, but if I couldn't make it to the community before eight, they'd likely all be asleep, and I would have to spend the night out in the elements. I had my tent and a sleeping bag, but it would be far from ideal. I made slow progress on the wet mud, walking with my foot slightly turned to provide a better grip. The noise of the jungle and its emptiness couldn't quite overtake the patter of rain, but it loomed beside me, lonely and imposing. The path was all but washed away, and I only managed to stick to it by following the clearing through the multiple trees that decked my surrounding. Almost an hour later, I saw the first settlement, a single, thatched hut with mud walls popping up against a darkened horizon. There was only a single family about, cooking on the balcony with a coal oven, while clear tarpaulin protected the pots from the rain. Two children played inside, wearing shirts that looked about five times too big for them. I approached the woman fanning her cookery flames. She looked up at me in surprise. Hello? I'm looking for Pari's family. I yelled over the torrent. What? She strained to hear me. Pari's family. I'm a friend of his. She finally seems to understand. I told her I was from the city, and that I knew Bahari for almost a decade. She called out to her husband and asked him to talk to me. The man who came outside was well-built and dark, with calloused hands and a strange shirt that seemed too small for him. He smelled of sweat and metal, and, oddly enough, of sickly sweet honey. The lantern in his hands lit up the little house, and I felt a little chill run down my spine. I didn't understand why, but it was as if a primeval part of me, conditioned to instinctually heed something unfathomable, kicked in and pulled me backwards. Come in, sir. I snapped out of my daze and looked at him. He was pointing to his door. I shut my umbrella and followed him. He heard my story and assured me he'd take me to Bahati's house tomorrow. His wife served me a simple meal of lentils and rice, and I devoured every morsel. They laid out an old mat for me to sleep on, and insisted I sleep inside. I was far too tired to refuse, and laid down, sipping up my sleeping bag, and fell asleep in that tiny room, lit by the light of a dying lantern, throwing long, flickering shadows on the gray, clay-baked walls. That night, for the first time in years, I dreamt of a man in black, stood too far away to discern any features, yet just close enough to feel the terror of his presence emanating through me and into my insides, churning and twisting and ripping. I woke up with a start at around midnight and looked around, slowly gathering my bearings. The lantern had burnt out, and the room was pitch black with the sound of rain bombarding the frail wooden door. The shapes of the sleeping farmer and his family lay against the wall farthest to me. I looked closely at the door again, trying to understand why the thought of entering this home had suddenly filled me with dread for a second. But there was absolutely nothing. It was a simple wooden door, painted a fading green with rusted hinges. There was nothing here to scare me the way I had been, yet a sense of unease still gnawed at me. I got up, silently pulled back the dead bolt, and then pulled the door open to a world of incessant darkness. Gone were the trees, the path, the ground, the rain and the wind. It was just black nothingness as far as I could see. This house and me were suspended in it, like a rowboat on a perfectly calm ocean on a moonless night. 
I gaped and gawked and sank to my knees. I slapped myself in the face, pinched my arm and screamed for the farmer and his wife to wake up. Not a sound from anyone. I stared out, aghast. This had to be a dream. It must be a dream. It had to be a dream. The blackness outside suddenly came alive, seeming multifaceted. Impossible structures and patterns glistened in the dark like diamonds under moonlight. Stairwells that twisted and opened in on themselves, cheating geometry into accursed shapes, materializing out of thin air. Long, thin stars that disappeared into nothing, wide ones that looked as if they connected the topmost step to the lowermost in an infinite, incredible loop of sterile, vined marble, and doors. So many doors. Old wooden ones, broken steel ones, warped plastic ones, red ones, blue ones, green and white ones, a million times a million doors scattered in that black cocoon like the eyes of some great beast staring down at me as I knelt at the threshold, mouth agape, tears running down my eyes. Abject disbelief and terror having grasped every fiber of my body. And then, at their center, meters from where I stood, another door appeared. This one was old, older, it seemed, than anything I'd ever known, older than science could surmise. It was sandstone and glass with a single large hinge of brushed metal. It began opening inwards, a dark, clawed hand crept out from behind it, along with a seven-toed foot. The rest of his torso materialized through the door, unnaturally tall, covered in wrinkles from legs upwards. The whole body leaned backwards as it walked out, as if he was walking up a steep hill. As his face slowly phased through the stone, he bent farther and farther back until his arms as long as his legs touched the inky black ground. He crawled towards me, slowly bent backwards, his head just out of view. I cried as I watched him pick up speed, knowing I could do nothing, knowing no law of the moral plane would serve me now. His fingers and toes grew longer and longer until it looked as if each of his limbs rested on a massive spider scurrying towards you, swaying frenetically tilting. Claws at the end of his digits glimmered in whatever faux light existed in this blasted world. I closed my eyes, and the next thing I knew, it was morning, and I was lying on cold, hard clay inside the hut. There was sunlight streaming in through the windows. I pushed myself up, staggering, almost threw up over how much my head hurt. My sleeping bag lay crumpled in a corner, and I got to my feet. The farmer and his wife were nowhere to be seen. All that remained were the man's stained shirt and a gold ring I remember the woman wearing. Now that I looked closer, it seemed like the stain on the man's shirt was blood. Dry and flaky, but unmistakable. The ring, too, seemed to have traces of dry blood on it. I knelt back and caught my breath against the wall. The door seemed to have a giant scorch mark on the inside, spreading outwards from almost the exact center of the creaking wood. Old damage from a kerosene fire gone wrong, I was sure. I hadn't seen it last night because of the dark. For all I knew, I'd gotten soaked in the rain and had a massive bout of shivers, despite having dried myself off before sleeping. I had definitely hallucinated everything. If there was any other explanation, I would never pursue it, nor accept it. I gathered everything I had and set out. The clouds had let up, the rain had stopped. The sounds of birds' song and the cacophony of winds and waves rose ahead of me, calming me, driving from my mind the nightmares from before. The sun shone on a still, muddy, but discernible path. I reached the community proper in half an hour where I inquired at the tiny post office about where I could find some food. 
They pointed out a place by the local market where laborers gathered to eat. I thanked them and asked after Bahari, and asked about Bahari. Bahari? asked the postman, quizzically. Yes, I'm a friend of his. I came to ask for his help over a certain matter. I had to stay over at the farmer and his wife's up half an hour from here last night, but I don't want to waste more time. The man sat down with a huff and put his legs up on the ramshackle wooden table. He pointed at a stool beside the door, and I took a seat. Well, sir, he said gruffly, you're about half a decade too late. I narrowed my eyes at him. Have they left the village? He looked at me for a while, then looked down as if unsure, and when he finally spoke, it was with measured gravity. Yes, they did but I can't tell you where they went. You see, Bahari had a daughter. I'm sure you must have seen pictures of her. One day, when he was away in the city, she came to her mother saying she had a stomach ache, a really bad one. When she was taken to the village nurse and got to know what had happened, her mother traveled three hours by boat to the nearest island with a phone line so she could let Bahari know he came back that very night. I realized with a jolt, this must have been the day when he'd left our neighborhood for good, throwing away his friendships and job. The day he left mid-shift and got the earliest train home, taking his blue tarpaulin with him. Uh, what happened to his daughter? Visions of the precocious little girl popped in my head from when he would show me her black and white photos one of his few cherished possessions. She must have been eleven when he left, maybe less. Well, sir, she was pregnant. I choked in my own spit and gasped for air. The world around me seemed thick and heavy. The birdsong had ceased to be replaced by a distant metallic screeching as if someone was pushing aside a rusty, collapsible gate from far away. We didn't know who did it at first. She wouldn't tell us. But Bahari didn't need her to say it. He knew. That night, he invited his nephew to spend the night with him and his family at the clinic. To keep watch over her because he trusted him, he said. When morning came by, the locals found the clinic on fire. The family was safe, having escaped just in time, apparently but the nephew was never found. There was no body, no charred remains. All they found of him was a chipped nail tucked away neatly on the clinic chair he'd slept on, miraculously untouched. The police never found evidence of anything having gone wrong. The family claims to have not noticed anything until the fire started, except the daughter. He furrowed his brow. She spoke of something coming inside in the dark. Something that was bent over the wrong way. Her words, not mine. We never got more... We never got more out of her. Because she claimed she passed out before that. The next day, the entire family left. And they've never come back. As he stopped, he drew in a deep breath and closed his eyes. The stifling tension in the room seemed to let up a tad, and I put my head between my hands. This was difficult to process. I imagined Bahari's smiling visage, his pride over his daughter and his prowess at hide-and-seek, his sudden departure, and the terror he must have felt as his world slowly crumbled around him with no warning, no heed to the lives it was going to destroy. He would have taken the boat across the river, paying out from his meager salary, the subtle beauty of the tepid river blanketed by an ocean of despair and horror, anger and vengeance. He was a father, and the pivot of his entire existence had been torn to pieces, thrown into the wind like Chattel, thrown into the wind. The postman cleared his throat, bringing me back. Also, sir, 
The only one who lives up that path is an old man. There are no farmlands there, and no farmers or farmers' wives. If you say you spent your night there with the people you say you did, I believe you may be talking about someplace else. But either way, I would caution against going that way late at night. Why's that? I asked. There's a family of honey-gatherers from across the border that have been spotted up there, and they are a bloody lot. They'll sooner kill you in your sleep if they think you have coin than make you a meal. I bent over and threw up. The world spun and tilted and collapsed in on itself, and I passed out. I dreamt of him again, inching out of the door, scuttering towards me, his talons gleaming, ready to rip and shred and take me away to his own world, or he could have his way with me. When I came to, it was evening. The sound of crows and storks resounded in the distance, preparing their perches for a long night. Glowworms were floating outside my window, pinpricks of yellow and white that appeared and disappeared of their own accord. The air seemed cooler. I was in a brightly lit room on a clean white bed, with the smell of mosquito repellent permeating the air. I gathered that I was probably lit by a generator, given that outside my window I could only see lanterns and wick lamps. This must be their clinic, I thought, probably built on the foundations of the old one they burned down. There were definitely patches that looked like they weren't replaced, and had instead been reused from the burnt building to cut down on costs. The window frame was far older than the walls or painted ware, and covered in darkened patches where they had been scorched. The little white table was steel but bore burn marks on its legs. Even the door itself had a large scorch mark emanating from the center and outwards. I paused. It was as if someone had plunged me into an ice bath and was holding me down, refusing me a single breath of fresh air. The hair on the back of my neck stood straight, as the pieces slowly came together in my clouded mind. That day, I ran faster than I'd ever ran before. I left all I had, save for the clothes on my body and the wallet in my pocket. I woke up an oarsman sleeping near his boat and paid him ten times the normal fare to take me away from there as fast as he could. We made the six-hour journey in four. I got into the first train I found going my way and got on, my heart racing me the entire way back. I reached university in the wee hours of the morning, panting, spent and exhausted beyond measure, and slept for a day and a half. Then I told the supervisor that the project was a bust, and I looked forward to working on something more theoretical, as I felt that was more to my taste. I assume you must have noticed how bedraggled I was, how bedraggled and inhumanly tired I looked, because he set me working on something I would never have to set foot outside of the campus for. As the months passed by, I began to finally confront what happened. The puzzle assembled itself before me with astonishing clarity, something I sorely needed to move past the events of that night. It needed me to summon a certain suspicion of disbelief, for the missing pieces were nothing if not supernatural. You see, I believe the doorman was real. He was something, as Pahari said, that existed in a realm devoid of the laws of mortal science. He was insurmountable, and to look upon him for too long was to lose consciousness, for the human mind can only decipher that for which it has context, a frame of reference. The doorman was not bound by moral laws. Therefore, trying to comprehend what he truly is, is as impossible as, say, making a submarine out of holes. But the only thing that tethered him to our world was why he did what he did, why he lived in the shadow of doors, and why he attacked. That was what Bahari, through some chance of fate, had figured out. 
because the doorman, in fact, only came for those who caused misfortune, not those who received it. Which is how Bahari knew that he would come for his nephew, because the absolute truth of this world is the only thing of consequence to this otherworldly thing. Which is why he came for the murderers I had the ill fortune to spend a night with. And even more importantly, I believe you'd have to know of and think about the doorman to draw him in, just as I was when I entered that house. Why am I writing this now? Well, simply because I now have the forum to, and because there are far too many in the world who deserve a fate worse than the one they've been dealt. Because if there's a witness to a crime, there is a way to exact justice without relying on the machinations of a broken world and its broken system. Because there may be something behind your door. And there are those, I believe, who should fear it. Who is it you'll be swallowing today? I asked. This was the body of Gerard Farley. I had met Josette Plemons three weeks ago at our school's lunchtime silent film club. Now I was sitting with her in a stranger's home, watching her dip a dainty gray spoon into a blue vase filled with an old man's cremated remains. It was one of those times where there seemed to be no way to ask any unserious question, since any reality could pop up and present itself as the truth. Uh, do you ever take that with cream and sugar? No, Josette said. She tipped the spoonful of ash into a small glass bowl she had brought with her. Small, ornately illustrated leaves of ivy spooled around its rim. That would be disrespectful. She gently tapped the back of the spoon against the edge of the bowl in a rhythmic clink to jostle the last flakes of ash out. That question didn't seem like it needed a follow-up, so I took a moment to reflect. We were in old Gracie Farley's house. She was one of the seniors Josette would visit and provide light care for every week, as part of a volunteer program that offered substantial college credit. But that's just a bonus, Josette told me. The walls were festooned with a garish lilac print, portraits of the beaming dead, cluttered old dark wooden shelves pushed against the walls like balustrades. There was no TV, only a window. There was a room that had been furnished and decorated before the invention of digital time. It was little wonder that Josette found this an appealing space for her ritual. And you're like certain Miss Farley won't come in and flip out. Positive. I set her up with her little CRTV and a bowl of chili for her nap an hour ago. She's dead asleep. Uh, pun intended. My voice quivered. She looked at me, aware of her own ability to generate discomfort, relishing it. No. We make up a big shape for our lives so that they'll make sense when we think about them in the abstract. But when you stop and dig into the moments that are most important, it'll always feel like each one of them took place on a different planet. Some of those planets become moons. Your memory is of what you were remembering at that time. I sat on that weird pink couch and looked at Josette's nails, lightly crusted with human remains. I remembered sitting in the art room with the rest of the silent film club at the end of lunch, five minutes before the bell was to ring. We had just wrapped up the scene in The Golem, where the titular monster throws the knight, Florian, off a tower and kills him. Miguel, the club founder, flicked the lights on. Any questions? Observations? Anything? He must have felt that he had to present a facade that we were a real club by giving us half-hearted homework attempts after each viewing, even though our superior, Miss Horton, was sitting off in the corner, diddling her iPad and clearly couldn't have cared less. Miguel sighed. All right, see you all here next Wednesday. Y'all was a somewhat generous appraisal. There were four total members of the club. Amid the soft shuffling of backpacks being hoisted and zipped up, I saw Josette peering at the now blank TV screen. Her eyes focused on it, 
as though trying to make sense of a confounding scene. What's up? I asked her. She looked at me, startled. And, in fact, I was startled by my own question. No one knew each other at the silent film club, and being a gaggle of quiet weirdos for the most part, we didn't go out of our way to socialize with one another. Not much, she said. What do you mean, what's up? Uh, no, uh, nothing. Just, you looked like you were really concentrating there. Almost like you were still watching the movie, even though it's turned off. She looked away from me, past my temple. Well, I found it interesting, she said. It seemed like they were setting up Florian to be the big hero of the movie. And then they just went and smoked him like that. Bold move. Uh, yeah, I murmured, thinking about it. It's funny, too, because it's not like the stories in the movies were real sophisticated back then, like with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Yes, she replied, rolling her eyes and laughing. I don't care if it was the first plot twist in any movie ever. It was all a dream. It's still dumb. It's still cheating. Thank you, I said. The club had finished that movie a couple of weeks ago, and clearly, the betrayal of the ending was still a fresh wound for both of us. It's just like, trendy with internet weirdos to like that movie. Just because it has cool sets doesn't mean it's actually good. You know, I was just about to... She began, as the shriek of the bell cut her off. It was likely for the best. Miguel had been eyeing the two of us peevishly. Not only because he was feeling left out, but also because we were trashing one of his favorite movies. It must have been killing him to feel like he couldn't jump in and defend its honor. We'll talk more about it later, she said, as we walked out of the classroom. It's so cool you think that too, though. I was afraid to say anything. <laughs> yeah. I said, laughing. She smiled in affirmation, and then waved as she went down the hall. We didn't share any classes together and didn't have much in the way of common friend groups, but I didn't want to wait until next Wednesday to talk to her again. Fortunately, both of us turned out to be the type of people who, once dragged out of our shells, yearns to be charmed, to stumble into unique and intricate friendships. Josette bumped into me in the hall the next day, and we picked up right where we left off. Talking about the storytelling quirks of weird old movies, how Miguel never seemed to want to play anything but German expansionism. It's good stuff and all, but like, is he aware that there were a bunch of other countries that also made movies in the 20s? She quipped. We may not have shared any class periods, but we did have a couple of teachers in common, which made it easy to find ways to do homework with each other after school. She was a funny person to be chatty with. We shared many objects of disdain. I learned a lot from her, too. Once she cracked a quiet moment of AP chem study by asking me if I knew what a sin eater was. I, uh, you mean death eaters? The things from Harry Potter? She looked at me like I had just destroyed her wedding cake. No, she dripped. Not the things from Harry Potter. I, I guess I don't then, I said, smiling. I liked getting a rise out of her every so often. She grimaced, then continued. Sin eaters were Celtic wanderers who traveled the Irish countryside and absorbed the sins of the soon-to-be-deceased in exchange for a small fee or for food and shelter. They were pretty much outcast from society because they were thought to be so bloated with the sins of the dead that it was spiritually dangerous even to be in their presence. That's pretty metal. It sounds like a good idea for a movie. She paused. Why do you think a person would do that? Damn themselves irrevocably in exchange for a little bread and water. Uh, maybe they don't believe in heaven or hell. They could have been the first atheists, or maybe it's not really a choice. This piqued her curiosity. How do you mean? Well, people drive cars at crazy speeds, even though part of them knows they might die, and they do die all the time. And that's a really direct and immediate physical thing, being in a speeding car, knowing you can't totally control it. If so many modern people can't even parse out the risk-reward of something like that, then how is it so far-fetched that there was once a whole class of society way back when they made their living by sending themselves to hell, and they didn't have any better reason for it than, I'll deal with it later? She still looked puzzled. I went on. 
floundering. Look, I don't know. Why do people commit suicide or eat at Taco Bell? Those aren't choices either, exactly. I couldn't think of anything else to add. I wasn't even sure if I believed myself. You know? To my amazement, she nodded reverently. Yes, Josette said. I think I know exactly what you mean. Do you remember when the paper is due for Miss Chetney's class? And that was the last time we spoke of the Sin Eaters for at least a couple weeks. Still, the conversation lingered with me. She kept saying things that would remind me of it. Josette was fascinated with religion and spirituality. We'd be talking about the legend of Zelda, and she'd bring up something from the Hebridean mythology that it reminded her of. Or she'd quote some wisdom from the Upanishads when I was pissed at my dad and rambled about what a dick he had been. I asked her once when she found the time to learn all this shit. And my mom had a degree in religious studies from Naropa. A lot of these books are lying around the house, and anything I can't find on the bookshelves is easy to look up online. I just read a chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, or gods and fighting men, or what have you, before I go to bed. But ancient wisdom is everywhere, truly. She was always serene when she talked about these things, but I could sense a desperation underneath it all. It seemed almost stream of conscious the way she talked about them. None of her ideas fit together. They were free-floating and contradictory, dropping in and out of her life depending on the situation at hand and her present mood. It was almost like all these spiritual aphorisms and principles were photographs she had ripped out of a scrapbook, and she felt like if she grabbed enough of them, then eventually every frayed corner, every stranger's smiling face would form a bigger picture that would make sense of it all. I never asked if she believed in hell or something like that, but it never felt like I had to. It was a Tuesday in April when Josette first told me about her ritual. She seemed worried and bleary-eyed. April was the busiest time of the year for big class projects and papers, and she always looked a little bedraggled in any case. But something seemed off when we met up at lunch. You look like shit. Thank you, she growled. Is anything the matter? Yes. I don't know what specifically, but yes, something's the matter. This was a cryptic answer even for Josette. Help me out. Is it fever? Is it trouble at home? Cramps? Anything at all? Even a ballpark? Even Google directions to get to the ballpark? She took a timid bite of her tuna fish sandwich and looked at me sheepishly, almost guiltily. It's over something weird that I don't want you to know about. It can't be that much weirder than anything else about you. I laughed. She still looked troubled. I straightened up. Is it illegal? That kind of thing? I whispered. Not as far as I know. Good. She sighed and pulled a sliver of crust off her sandwich. You know, when you were a little kid and you had ideas about life that didn't seem to come from anywhere. They just slid out from under a rock in your head, and that made them seem all the more real. And then you'd fall into a weird habit or say things that didn't make sense to anyone anymore, because they corresponded to this thing you felt you knew about life. And you only stopped doing or saying those things because, at some point, someone corrected you. I, I think so, yeah. She looked at me with great intention. Could you give me an example? Put on the spot, I sputtered. Then something started coming back to me. When I was really young, I used to think fireflies were dead Christmas light bulbs. Her eyes widened. Yeah? Yeah. I saw a bunch of them flittering around outside our house once, the day after my dad took all the decorations down. I think it was just unseasonably warm that year, but at the time, it didn't occur to me to not think that they were the ghosts of our Christmas lights. I thought Dad took them down too soon, and they wanted to come back in the house. I started crying, thinking how lonely they must have felt, 
I felt that horrible little kid guilt that weighs down your whole torso. I ruminated. I hadn't thought about this in a long time. Actually, it's even a little wilder than what you were talking about, because I remember telling my dad we needed to let the lights back in, and when he tried to explain that they were just glowing bugs, I, I didn't believe him. I think I even got in trouble for calling him a liar. She nodded. When I was little, I ate some of my grandmother's ashes. On purpose? Yeah. Uh, wow. Why? I thought I'd be able to hear her soul or that she might come back to life. I looked down at the garnish ketchup colored cafeteria tilling. Did it work? Not really. Not the way I wanted it to. She took a big bite of her sandwich, the first real bite she'd taken since we started talking. I still eat people's ashes. I looked at her. What? I didn't mishear her, and I didn't doubt for a second that she was telling the truth, but it was the only word that would come out. I think it's making me sick. Uh, well, of course it's making you sick. It isn't there, like, formaldehyde and stuff like that in people's ashes? She shook her head urgently. Not like that. Then she looked at me. Would you mind coming with me to Miss Farley's house tomorrow? The memory moon passed over right at that point. I was back on that pink couch, body and mind. I remember my chest tightening. I remember that for some reason the tops of my cheeks were in pain. I thought about what you said about the Sin Eaters, how what they did wasn't a choice, she mused. I don't think you were right. No? I think you can be chosen by God, but I think you also have to accept the call, just like any other job. She slipped another spoonful of ash between her lips. She coughed and her eyes bulged ever so slightly, then she wiped her mouth and continued. I think the older you get, the quieter the call becomes. Whether you're raised in a secular way or a religious way, you're only ever taught to do what other people say. You aren't told how to listen to the spirits. Miss Farley gave a concerned yop from upstairs. Dear? This startled Josette. To her own visible horror, she almost knocked the ashes on the ground when she jumped up. She covered the bowl with her shaking palm as she stood. I'll be right back, she told me. She stuffed the bowl into my hands and jogged up the stairs. Coming, Miss Farley. Holding onto those ashes was bizarre, to say the least. I looked into the bowl and tried to glean some spiritual significance from it. Feel the gravity of what used to be a human body in my own hands, but... Nothing would come. It just looked like dirt. Like the stuff that piles up in an unswept corner. I spent a few minutes alone in that hideous room, too nervous to poke around and too unfocused even to waste time on my phone, before she sundered back downstairs. Miss Farley heard me cough and wanted to know if I was alright. She smiled. Could you take this, please? I held the bowl out to her. Annoyed, she grabbed it from me nonchalantly and sat down again. I hadn't noticed when she'd gotten up, but she'd put the spoon behind her ear like a pencil and daintily retrieved it to continue eating. Anyway, she went on, if you hear the true call at all, you usually hear it when you're young, and it's your own responsibility to have an epiphany when you're older, because when you're a kid, you don't really have the resources to follow up on your instincts, but... You know, and part of you always knows. That's why I said you're beholden to your own epiphany. Even though that seems like the wrong way around. That story you told me about the fireflies, about how you used to think that they were ghosts of Christmas lights. I think you were right, or at least I think you were on to something. I think God was talking to you, but... You don't have the spiritual vocabulary to understand what he was saying. Her eyes were glued to mine, 
terrifying in their intensity. Her jaw was rigid. She put her free hand on my wrist and lightly gripped it. If you could see what I see now, if you could just hear the call the way I hear it. This has officially become too much. I yanked my hand away from her as gently as I could and started rustling up my backpack. Joe, look. I could already tell I was going to make her feel bad and I was already feeling guilty. I think you're super smart and probably the coolest and most interesting person I've ever met, but like, this is fucked up. This isn't normal. I don't know if you've told this stuff to anyone else, but I think anyone would say you need to go to a doctor of some kind. You already told me it's making you sick, so I think a part of you has to know that you need help. She scowled down at the rug in a rain cloud of misery, and I stood up. I didn't know what else to say. I, I didn't know if this old woman would be safe with her, but I also didn't want to be there a second longer. I really care about you. I mumbled. Please, do what's best for yourself. And I don't know if maybe you hate me now, but text me anytime. I'm always down to talk. I left the house, waiting for a reply from her that wouldn't present itself. The closest I'd get to a response would be the tinkle of silverware as I opened the door to the sidewalk. I was home sick with the flu on a crisp Wednesday morning in May when I got a text from my friend, Eli, that Mr. Umbria had been stabbed in the side of the head with a compass during third period AP geometry, and that classes were cancelled for the rest of the day and maybe the rest of the week. Immediately, I felt responsible because immediately I knew Josette had done it and I felt as though I hadn't tried hard enough to help her. I cried for a little bit, my guts rolling with sickness and guilt, and then I fell asleep. When I woke up, I was feeling less nauseous and needed something to distract myself with. If only superficially, so I opened up my laptop. I had a new email. It was sent via a filing sharing service. Although when I clicked the link to the download page, I saw that the file wasn't particularly large. It was sent from an email address composed of a gibberish sequence of letters and numbers, and normally I would have written it off as a clumsy spyware trap sent by some Ukrainian gifter, but today I knew it was from Josette. She'd likely made a proxy address of some kind, just so whatever she'd sent me would be harder to trace back to her. I opened the download. She had written me a letter. I couldn't find a date on it, but I figured she had to have sent it last night. Hello, friendo. So I know I freaked you out a little last time we really talked, and I also know you've been mad at me for not eating with you at lunch, or hanging out with you after school, or really seeing you, or talking to you at all. And I'm super sorry about that. I've been in a bad place, so I just wanted to send you this and let you know what's up, and hopefully make a little more sense of how I've been acting. Please forget the lack of capitalization and tumblr use of punctuation. I'm writing this as fast as I possibly can because I'm not sure how much longer I'll have the facilities to put this stuff into words. It'll make sense later. I don't know if you would probably still think I'm fucking crazy after you read this, but I did see that little glimmer of belief in your eyes, even when you were telling me I should have gotten help. Fear is the best path to belief, in my opinion. Anyway, when I first heard the call, I was really young. Like I was five or six years old. It was like a week or two after my grandma's funeral, and my mom had come home with her ashes in this nice little blue china urn. She left it on the end table for a minute to go do something, and my dog from back then, a big boxer mutt named Swooper, knocked it all over the floor because his tail was wagging too hard. So her ashes were sunk real thick in the carpet, and Swooper started lapping it up with his tongue and trying to pull it out of the fabric with his teeth, because dogs are fucking dumb and they'll eat anything. Grandma smelled horrible, but I thought maybe Swooper knew something I didn't, so I got on my hands and knees and started eating it too. The taste was wretched. My mom came back in the room and flipped shit. 
as she smacked me hard across the face and sent me to my room and put Swooper outside for the rest of the day. That was the one time in my life that my mom had ever hit me, just so you know. I'm not sure about you, but when I was little, my dreams and nightmares were way more vivid than they are now. Even with that in mind, even having had a relatively comprehensive grasp on the difference between dream and reality for a little kid, this was something different. That night I heard my grandma talking, and it was this really spooky, non-language I was hearing. Like if you can imagine a language that's spoken only in tone, made from little inflections and interruptions that sound like words but aren't comprehensible as words. That's what this was. The voice would bounce in and out of my range of hearing like the words were little rubber balls, and the tone itself was the scariest part because it didn't sound like my grandma. It didn't talk how she talked. It was like the sound of her voice, but it sounded disappointed and mocking in a way Grandma never did. And it was so, so quiet. I started crying, and when I cried, I heard the voice make a formless laugh, like a laugh without consonants. I had nightmares about that voice for years afterwards, but this wasn't a nightmare. This was a ghost. It's hard to explain the difference between a real supernatural experience and a nightmare or a hallucination, but they're as different from each other as hearing the voice coming from the person sitting next to you and hearing a voice on a podcast. You just know. Nothing like that really happened for a long time, probably because I didn't need anyone's ashes again for a long time. Then when I was ten, me and my family went to Yosemite for a big reunion type thing. The place was this big estate that was kind of next to a lake, but it was one of those estates where the rich asshole that owns it wants to seem like they have taste, so they make it a bunch of boring rectangles and rhombuses and weird grey glass cubes instead of a normal richy rich mansion like everyone actually wants. The reunion itself sucked. It was one of those things where all the adults you don't know are trying to talk to you like you've known each other since way back when and haven't spoken in years when... Really, you just don't fucking care, because why would you? And all the kids are dressed kind of formally, and have bad personalities, and, and no one would share their DS with you. Everyone under 15 seemed real put upon, and I didn't really want to talk to any of them. So obviously I got bored, and while everyone was getting shit-faced at the lake or the beach, I started poking around the house. Whoever owned the place, it was my aunt or something, I don't remember had a Doberman named Max, and he was the nicest dog ever. I would just race him down the weird angular halls, and since there was no one else in the place, we could just crash into each other and bump into walls, and no one told us to slow down or knock it off. It was easily the most fun I had at the whole place. I bring Max up because I think dogs have something to do with the paranormal stuff I get into. They always seem to lead me towards it some way or another, and during one of our more rambunctious races, I tripped and fell over him in the living room. I looked up and found myself in front of the fireplace. There was a ledge above it with a framed black and white photo of a woman, probably taken in the thirties judging from the quaff of her hair. Although, what do I know? And next to it, right fucking next to it, there was a blue china urn. I'm not sure if it was exactly the same as the kind my grandma was held in, but... To my ten-year-old eyes, it looked totally identical. I stood up and picked it off the shelf. Max started jumping at my hands because he was still in a playful mood, but I held the urn tight. I opened the lid and looked into it. The ashes looked the same as my grandma's because all ashes looked the same, but I wondered if maybe it would taste the same too. So I looked around to see if anyone was coming in, and when I saw I was alone, I stuck my finger in and tasted it. Then I gave it to Max so he could have a lick too. I never learned who that woman was, but I had a few more laps and then I put her back on the shelf. Something occurred to me. I went back to where the party was happening down by the lake. Everyone was dead drunk at this point. I found my mom and I told her I was going to go explore the woods for a little while. She slurred that she didn't want me to go too far. It was dark because the sun was getting down, but... I could tell from the glint in her eyes that they were barely in focus. Maybe it wasn't fair of me. It's not like she drank all the time or anything, but 
I was disgusted. I felt this big black ball and chain of contempt for the ways of man who wrap around my heart, and I've never been able to shake it all the way loose ever since. Anyway, I went into the woods, not terribly far, but a ways enough so I couldn't hear the party. I found a smooth boulder on a slight incline and sat down on it. The trees blocked what little remained of the sun. The pattering and flickering of animal feet and insect wings at varying distances had a symphonic effect, and where normally that would have spooked me, tonight they put me at ease. I let my body relax and I waited. When the dark fell completely, I looked straight up. A faded silver cloak began to drift downwards, as if let go from the tops of the trees. It stayed fuzzy, like waves of vapor on a hot day, and no matter how far it fell past the trees, it stayed small. I could see it passing branches as it came towards me, but it never took up increasing space in my line of sight, like something is supposed to do when it's coming closer to you. I reached up to touch it and let it fold over my fingers, and a cool breeze slipped across my palm, and the cloak vanished. Satisfied, I went back to the party with this little initiation into the true cosmogony of things, skittering in secret around my heart. It was better than a first kiss. I realized I was in possession of a special gift that no one else had, or if they did, they were keeping pretty quiet about it. There was still so much I didn't know, and as I got older, these questions began to articulate themselves in more precise ways. Was I inviting communication with spirits, or simply observing behaviors without playing a meaningful part in them? Is there any ethical line between the living and dead that shouldn't be crossed, not out by some doofy fear of black magic or or what have you, but out of respect for the privacy of the souls themselves? Is real communication even possible when language, like everything, is constrained by time and time has no meaning once a person stops having a body beholden to its whims? I started thinking about all this later. All that time, all I knew was I needed to see more of this stuff to even know what exactly I was doing. Opportunities were far and few between when I was very young and so for a while the visions left me. I went to the graveyard and swallowed some of the dirt around the tombstones every so often, but it didn't have any effect. I tried to will myself into lucid dreaming, and sometimes that worked as far as it went, but like I said, the difference between a vivid dream and seeing an actual ghost is like the difference between a vase of flowers and a still-life painting. I even applied for an internship at the local mortuary, but they didn't take me. To be honest, I don't think any mortuary worth its salt would trust any twelve-year-old who wanted to be around dead bodies all day. This was about the time I started getting really into my mom's religious books out of sheer desperation. If I couldn't go straight to the source of the universe, I felt I had to at least scour for clues as to its true nature. Finally, in eighth grade, I had the idea of volunteering to be a caregiver. I saw a little flyer in the office advertising some service for the elderly in exchange for college credit and signed up on the spot. Most of the people I helped were really happy to have a young woman around to give them the house a little youthful energy. Meanwhile, all I was concerned with was death. Ironic, I think. Anyhow, the idea worked. It turns out elders keep pots full of their spouses and pets around almost uniformly. Most of my cases were widows and widowers, but sometimes when I got a married couple that needed help, they'd still have an urn on display for one of their brothers or sisters. The work itself was quite unenjoyable. Old people suck. Even the ones who seemed nice and cute at first all ended up being racist or fucked up in some way. I've had to wipe a vile, disgusting, putrid, concave human ass free of its excrement on more than one occasion. One man would discharge down his pet legs as he walked without noticing. I had to trail behind him and clean it up like I was holding the train of a grotesque wedding dress. I started to think that maybe the reason so many of them kept the urns in plain sight was something beyond commemorative sentiment. Maybe they were proud of their dead kin perhaps subconsciously envious. 
The upside to this revolting job was that their withered, malfunctioning bodies, once minimally provided for, were easy to keep out of my way while I did my research. It was as easy as feeding them chowder and turning on the TV most of the time, and I never felt I was being disrespectful to the dead that I consumed. If anything, I was putting them to better use than their guardians ever would. I mentioned to you that I never seasoned the ashes at all, because to me, that would be disrespectful. And anyway, that might interfere with something in the communication process. At first, it was like the two times I'd done it before. I would have a little scoop of ash, and then I'd have to wait a few hours and be in a dark, quiet area for anything to happen. But after about a year, the effects were more vivid and immediate. I remember being in a house and just smelling the ashes of a man's sister, and I heard the sound of a turquoise bell. Don't ask me how I know what the color of the bell was. It popped a tiny bit in the left ear, and then shortened into itself. Then it sort of spread to the rest of my cranium and exited through the right ear. I was excited. For the first time, it felt like they were talking to me. Not the other way around. They trusted me. I downed a scoop and turned around, and there was this blissful, strong silhouette of a soldier sitting in the recliner. His face was an eyeless, mouthless mass of light, but I could tell he was smiling at me. I think he appreciated that he had a visitor after what maybe felt to him like aeons of the silence of death. He vanished quickly, but it was an incredibly joyful experience for me. It also provided to be the turning point. Ghosts would come to me stronger and faster, and not always right before or after I had their ashes. I was down by our little town lake once, and I saw a velvet gossamer shape that reached from shore to shore, ripping underneath the waves. I saw the smoke form of an infant boy dancing between geese and a flock as they flew south for the winter. Once, when I was lying awake in my room, a pair of white hands drifted through my door, each one holding an apple. I ate the one from the left hand and refused the one from the right. It was unthinkably sweet, like marshmallow foam. These were all pleasant, if not downright beautiful instances, but they soon became the exception to the rule, and, in fact, the reason I write this to you now is that I am still experiencing the death world, but in a way that is now as rhythmic and constant as my beating heart, and in a way which has become distressing to me, and which I no longer welcome. One night I woke up facing my bedroom wall, and there was a set of teeth embedded in it. They were dull, cracked smoker's teeth that glowed with a smile of mistreatment. Breath came from behind them from inside the wall. I turned away and turned back, and they were still there. I, I touched them. They were porous. Night turned to day and they didn't disappear. I sleep next to them still. I feel the wall's breath on my neck every night. The teeth don't talk, but I wish they would. They would scare me less if they'd just say something. At some juncture that I failed to spot a prepare for, the entire living world cracked in my vision. Now I see veins on the outside of my mother's cheeks. There's a scalpless hunchback at the side of our school. He claws at the ground like a dog trying to bury a bone and screams all day long. I don't think anyone told him he doesn't have a body anymore. Every car smells like a corpse. I am privy to open wounds in the fabric of nothing that bleed pure night, and I don't dare go near them or look at them for too long. I would tell you where they are, but you might be safer not knowing. I've trained myself to cope, but I can only dislocate my senses from only so much of this. Nor would I ever wish to separate myself from these spirit materials entirely. I have gained valuable insights from many of them. For instance, Mr. Umbria has the skin and tongue of a Komodo dragon. He sends mosquitoes to drain sleeping girls' souls when the stars go down. He is not who he says he is, and you should not trust him, or in fact be near him at all if you can help it. But do you want to know what I have observed about you? You talk in the frequency of mist. Sometimes your eyes switch places when you have a big idea. You are beautiful. 
This is why, for my own selfish reasons, I wanted to initiate you into this world of mine, so I could have a friend who I knew would understand. But as you can probably guess, I don't think you would have liked it very much. I ask your forgiveness, but I don't feel entitled to it. I'm not at the point where I feel as though I can just stop eating the ashes and see what happens, as much as that might seem like the obvious and reasonable thing to do right now. It seems as though I'm at a point where I can sense the truth, but it isn't coming in strong enough to be coherent. It's like that ugly sound the radio makes when the signal's strong enough to be more than static, but too weak for you to really hear the music. I can't stay like this much longer, and I have to believe I'm on the verge of a sensory breakthrough. And even if I stopped now, I, I would never want the ghosts to leave completely. I can't go back to the way it was. As painful as this all can be, I'd rather see in the most violent shade of red than go colorblind. I hear a sound like nails hitting a wood floor with each keystroke, and the corner of the screen is starting to curdle. Someone's peering up at me from under my shoes. I can't write too much more. I don't know if we'll ever really talk again. Think of this as an apology and also as kind of a last will and testament for my normal existence in this world. I hope you have a good life. The secret of the call is now your inheritance if you should choose to claim it. Goodbye. I deleted the email and the file but not before I printed the letter out, stapled it together, and put it in a shoebox in my closet. I wondered if maybe I'd learned nothing from her story, keeping things around like this. I do my best to take the specifics of what she told me to my grave, but everyone knows that me and Josette were close, and the kids at school, probably the cops too, would want to know if she had been acting strange before she attacked Mr. Umbria. I'd have to lie and tell them yes, she had, and as I did so, I would have to dream of a perfect world where knowledge didn't turn you insane, where the senses didn't become dangerous when acted upon. The truth that I could never tell any of them would be that there was nothing strange at all about trying to live in a world like that. The sound of crunching gravel quieted as the small bus slowed to a crawl at the foot of the campsite. The old metal doors opened with a wheeze and the reluctant campers exited into the ancient wood. The last to exit the bus, Elliot stepped onto the stone and dirt. Shortly after he did so, the bus rolled back down the woodland trail out of sight. Howdy campers! announced an all-too-enthusiastic man as he jogged up to the group. Elliot rolled his eyes. The man was wearing brown baggy shorts and a bright blue t-shirt, a red whistle hanging from his neck. He also donned a grey baseball cap, the words Camp Counselor sewn into the front. Similarly dressed adults wandering through the campsite in the background, carrying mattresses to and from the two low wooden cabins on either side of a small fire pit. I'm Matt, your head camp counselor. And this is Camp Disconnect, the man shouted to the crowd of unimpressed teens. Elliot scoffed at the ridiculousness of his tone. After an uncomfortable silence, the man continued. Now, uh, the first rule of Camp Disconnect is that you gotta disconnect, he said with a grin, holding out a plastic tray. Come on, kids, phone's in the tray, the group moaned before complying. After everyone, including Elliot, threw their phones into the tray... Matt handed it off to another counselor. Now, before you're shown to your beds, let me go over the rules. Number one, bedtime is ten. Gotta be in bed by then, okay? Number two, no wandering off into the woods. We wouldn't want to get you lost, would we? And number three, no communication with the outside world, hence the phone tray. Now, lucky for you guys, however, we will allow relatives and friends to send you letters which will give you which we will give to you as soon as they get to us. You will not be able to respond, though. This is Camp Disconnect, remember? Now, let's get you folks settled in. After a brief and unmemorable tour, Elliot and the rest of the campers were shown to their respective beds. 
It was clear just from that short introduction that Elliot was not going to have an enjoyable four weeks. Elliot woke up on the morning of his fifth day at Camp Disconnect. He sat up with a groan. The stiff springs of the mattress had been digging into his back all night. The past four days had been tough for him, and not just because he had no phone. The place stunk of rotted wood and excrement. It was infested with flies and other swarms of bugs and the food. Oh god, the food. Gruel is what it was. Elliot had no clue what was in it. Aside from the occasional hair, the ingredients were a mystery. He rubbed his eyes and flakes of dead skin fell from his face. Elliot Peters, called a man in the center of the rows of beds. Elliot looked up and squinted. He hadn't noticed him before. He was large, donning a familiar blue attire. However, he appeared to be a good deal older than the rest of the staff. Elliot Peters, he repeated, but louder this time. Yeah, over here. Elliot stuck his hand up. The large man marched over to him. Letter for you, he growled, handing Elliot a surly white envelope. Thanks, Elliot murmured, and the man wandered back outside. He opened the envelope to find a single piece of paper, writing scrawled on either side. Elliot smirked. He already knew who it was. It read as such. Yo, Elliot, it's Ollie. Sucks that you have to stay at that camp for the summer. It's been pretty sucky back here since you've been gone, but I gotta tell you something. It might just be nothing, or it could just be turn- It could just turn out to be a big fucking deal. So last night, I got real bored and I couldn't sleep, so... You remember when we used to search the deep web on your dad's old computer? Yeah, I did that, but on my computer. I couldn't quite remember how to get on it at first. It eventually it came back to me. After a bit of searching, once I was on the hidden wiki, I found this creepy ass website. www.occultplayground.org As soon as I learned it was full of tutorials on how to summon demons and monsters and all types of creepy shit like that, it was kind of getting too cliche for me though, so I was about to click off. Till I saw one which sounded interesting. The Raggedy Man Ritual. I clicked on it and read the description. It said something about a game for depraved souls and some other weird shit I can't remember. It was creepy though. At the bottom of the page it gave me a list. Two mirrors, salt, darkness, and something to prop the mirrors up. Then went on to explain how to summon the Raggedy Man to begin the game. I followed what it said. Propping the two mirrors I found up, facing each other, and sprinkling salt in a circle around them. After it was done, I turned off the lights and sat in between the mirrors and read the poem from the website. I had to memorize it, cause I couldn't leave the computer on. It said I needed pitch darkness. As I'm writing this, I realize I'm sounding pretty crazy, but you get it. Anyway, I closed my eyes and recited the poem. Raggedy man, raggedy man, won't you come out to play? Raggedy man, raggedy man, or else you cannot stay. Raggedy man, raggedy man, as quiet as a mouse. Raggedy man, raggedy man, awaken from your dark house. After saying that, I just sat there for a moment. And nothing really happened, so I checked the website again. Probably should have read the whole thing before I did the ritual. It said that once completed, you're trapped in a game with the Raggedy Man. He will appear anywhere, in any form to stalk you. You can take the shape of someone you know or a complete stranger. For whoever performs the ritual, the objective is to not let the Raggedy Man touch you, but he cannot use force to do so. The website says this is because the Raggedy Man prefers to work more discreetly. Whatever the hell that means. It didn't go into much detail about what happens if you lose the game, but I assume you just die or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, I'll keep you posted if anything creepy happens. I thought you might be interested. From Ollie. Elliot had been friends with Ollie since the first year of school. This certainly wasn't the strangest thing he's done. Elliot chuckled to himself as he finished the letter. This kid. He giggled under his breath as he placed it down beside him. The next few days were just as agonizing as the first four, if not more so. 
Elliot was usually fond of the outdoors, but something in that hollow wood unsettled him. He woke up once more on the ninth day of his summer camp extravaganza to the sound of a familiar voice. Elliot Peters, the same large camp counselor said. Elliot rubbed his crusty eyes. Yep, he called out. The men stomped over and dropped the letter in his lap. Thanks. Elliot sighed as the man wandered out the cabin door. Assuming the letter was an update for Molly, Elliot ripped open the envelope and began reading. Yo, Elliot, it, it's me again. Something's not right, man. Some real scary stuff's been happening. The ritual, it, it worked. No joke, I'm freaking out right now. Let me explain. I woke up the day after I sent you that letter and heard my mom calling me from downstairs, so I got halfway down the stairs to see what she wants. And then I remembered she's been on a business trip to Budapest for the last five days. She told me she wouldn't be back for a week. I ran back upstairs, obviously scared out of my mind. I pushed my back against my bedroom door so whatever was in my house couldn't get to me. I thought of what it said on the website. The raggedy man can take any form. So I just sat there for like half an hour, just trying to figure out if I was dreaming or not. I tell you, man, it's the longest 30 minutes of my life. Anyway, after a while, I finally managed to calm myself down. I just figured I must have imagined it. So I opened the door and crept downstairs to make sure there was no one there. And there wasn't. I called my dad to tell him to come home straight away. I think he could tell I was shaken by my voice because he was at the house not ten minutes later. That helped a lot. The rest of the day went without incident, but that unsettled me even more, in a way. I told my dad what happened, and he agreed that I must have just imagined it. I didn't tell him about the ritual, though. If he found out I'd been on the deep web again, he would have kicked my ass. The day passed and I got into bed, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't fall asleep. It must have been three in the morning when, as soon as I was about to finally drift off, I heard a knock at my door. I lay there for a few moments, not saying a word, and then I heard a second set of knocks, but much louder this time. Finally, I managed to squeeze out a weak, Who's there? There was a pause before I heard my dad's voice on the other side. I want to talk about what happened earlier. Can you open the door, please? Something about his tone was just... I don't know the word. Uncanny. I knew that something was wrong. No, Dad, I'm trying to get some sleep. After I said that, there was just silence. For like ages before I heard the sound of footsteps slowly walking back down the hallway. I was shaken to my core. That night I stayed open until my eyelids just fell. I must have passed out because the next morning I woke up, aching on my bedroom floor. But what I dreamt of, I shudder to remember. All I can recall was that I found myself in a dirty, decrepit hallway with no end in sight. The walls were a disgusting, creamy shade of yellow with moss crawling up them. The hallway was dimly lit by a row of rusted chandeliers, the wax of their candles dripping onto the metal. I walked for what felt like miles. I, I just kept going. And then I heard it. The sound of heavy boots slamming on the floor echoed out from behind me. I turned to see a tall figure stood motionless in the hallway, no more than ten feet away from me. The raggedy man. He was large, with brown shaggy trousers and a similarly colored jacket covered in filth. His face was unkempt and just like the rest of him. He was covered in brown and black dirt. Thick dreadlocks draped over his shoulders, crawling with lice and other insects. His piercing eyes a similar, sickening yellow to the walls. His mouth unmoving, he spoke to me. As if he were in my head, he growled a phrase which has haunted me since. You're going to have to try harder than that. With that I woke up, just as I said, 
on the floor and dripping with sweat. Elliot, I'm not okay. I asked my dad and he said he never came to my door, but don't worry. I'm working on a way to end the game. I'll keep you posted. Ollie. Ellie put the letter down. He shook his head in confusion. Uh, he must be fucking with me, he muttered, slightly disgruntled by his friend's tasteless joke. Elliot crawled out of his stiff bed with a groan. That place made him feel thirty years old. Noticing the rest of the kids in the cabin getting ready, he threw on his outdoor clothes and trudged outside beyond the rest of the troop. The subsequent day passed slowly. First a hiking trip, then a series of monotonous activities in the woods, and finally an excruciating song time about the campfire until the sky was black and blue and filled with stars. Elliot got to sleep very quickly that night. He woke up the next morning to the sound of his name being called once again. Elliot Peters, the same man called, again stood centered between the rows of beds. Elliot sat up, somewhat surprised. He wasn't expecting an update this soon. How had the letter even gotten here so soon? He thought. Before the man could call again, Elliot waved his hand in the air. Over here. The man walked over to him, handing him the third letter. Elliot thanked him once more as he left. For a moment, he contemplated not reading it, not willing to entertain it, but he caved in. Too curious to ignore it, he tore off the envelope and read. Elliot, I have some good news. This will be the last letter I'll send you regarding this whole raggedy man situation. I ended the game. However, I may not have been completely truthful with you in the past two letters. I, I, let me explain. The night of the ritual when I told you that I couldn't quite remember what the article said. Well, I did remember. In fact, I've read it many times now. I just wasn't sure if you were ready to hear it. To be as brief as possible, it said the game cannot be ended, only passed on to new players. Through the use of a separate ritual, the details of which shall spare you, you can transfer the curse of the raggedy man to someone else. According to the site, there are many ways of passing on the game, but the least complicated one, and the one I've used, involves tricking someone else into talking to the raggedy man three times. I'm sure if you're reading this letter, then you probably have. I know how you are, always thanking people. Always so polite. Depending on the form he has taken, he may have just left, but he'll be back. I'm sorry, Elliot. Your friend, Ollie. It took me nearly three months to build this mansion of a treehouse for my daughter. It had slides and swings, windows and doors, ladders and steps. It had it all. Shit. I even insulated it, and had power outlets, heating and cooling. This monstrous structure was a beautiful mix between a full-fledged apartment and a McDonald's play place. I was incredibly proud of it, but I must say that it fully solidified the truth in her words whenever my wife told me that I sometimes way overdo things. Truth be told, it only made her more right since our daughter was only four years old. By the time I finished building the treehouse, there were only a few nice days left in the fall before snow hit, and my daughter only got those few days to play outside and in my creation. Even though I did install heating in it, my daughter wasn't a big fan of going outside to play in the snow unless we turned it into a big event to go sledding somewhere. This was slightly disappointing to me, but she was only four, so I understood. When the snow melted and the temperature climbed again, she was out there playing in it almost constantly. This made me happy to see how excited she was with what I made for her. For about a week, it was even difficult to get her to come back inside to eat and sleep. There were a couple of nights I even had to go out and drag her back in the house for bath time and bed. It was times like these I was happy I had made the treehouse big enough and sturdy enough for me to venture up there. 
It was plenty big enough, that was for sure. I had made the inside 12 feet by 16 feet with an 8 foot ceiling. I secretly had planned that size so that if for some reason my daughter didn't like it, I could just turn it into a cool sort of man cave. A month went by with her out there, spending nearly every waking moment playing either inside or on the swings and slides. Then one day, in the middle of the afternoon, my daughter came screaming out of the treehouse and into the house. Daddy, Daddy, I don't like it. Whoa, 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 little one. What's wrong? I said as she barreled into my legs, nearly causing my knees to buckle. My treehouse. It's scary. Seriously? It's been your favorite place for months. Why is it all of a sudden scary? I asked with a little more annoyance in my voice than I intended. I saw a scary man in there. He was hurt, she said. What? What did you say? Is there some... Just stay here. I commanded as I ran out the door and towards the treehouse. As my hand touched the doorknob at the top of the steps, my heart jumped for a second, and the thought of how dumb it was charging inside with no real plan if there truly is someone in there. Still, I turned the handle and burst into the room of the treehouse. Nothing. Various toys and Barbies on the floor, a, a kitty couch, and a couple small beanbag chairs were the only things in the room. I'd like to say that I searched the place, but that was literally it. There wasn't much searching. It was all one big room, so search complete. I saw no man inside, hurt or otherwise, save for myself. I walked back out the door and back into the house. As I walked through the back door, I found my daughter in the next room, sitting patiently, just watching the back door with her thumb in her mouth. Who is he? She said to me, as soon as she saw me walk through the door. Who is who? I didn't see anyone out there. What did he look like? He's gone? She replied, completely ignoring my question and running past me back outside. What the fuck just happened? I thought to myself, as I watched her climb the steps and enter the treehouse from the kitchen window. I mentioned the odd experience to my wife a little later that night. She seemed only slightly concerned, and we both chalked it up to her exceptional imagination. That night, as she sat eating around the table, my wife began to ask our daughter about what had happened. Daddy told me you saw someone in your treehouse today. Did they ever come back? I... No. What did the man look like? Do you know how he got into your treehouse? He was scary. His mouth looked weird. He, he looked like he had lots of owies in it. Do you know how he got in the treehouse? I chimed in, wondering if I was going to need to upgrade the security around the house. I, I don't know. I was playing on the swings, and then I came in to play with my toys, and he was there. So he was already hiding inside the treehouse, my wife asked. No, he was hiding like in here, she said, pointing to her head. My wife and I locked eyes at the sound of this and both let out a sigh of relief, assuming that it meant it really had been her imagination. Everything went much more smoothly and calmly the rest of the night. We went another week without any thought or mention of the situation. Regardless of the lack of hearing anything more about it, I still felt uncomfortable, and the day after I decided to move the backyard security camera, pointing it at the treehouse as best I could. Sadly, with how much my daughter played back there, I wouldn't be able to set the motion detection on it without it sending alerts every five minutes. In the middle of the second week following the unusual afternoon, my daughter again ran inside the house screaming about a man in the treehouse again. This time I immediately ran out in the treehouse and burst at the door, and I was again met with nothing more than an empty room. Frustrated and annoyed at the situation, I turned and began to leave the treehouse. Just as I passed through the doorway, behind me I heard a crack and a thud, as if something had been knocked over or broken. I spun around and looked through the doorway, and from outside the treehouse I saw nothing. 
I thought to walk back in and check a second time, and I really wish I hadn't. As my foot crossed the threshold of the door back into the treehouse, everything changed. The light from the sun coming through the windows vanished. Rusted steel and concrete surrounded me, and everything was bathed in an ominous deep red glow. An overhead light flickered and popped, giving me only quick random glimpses of the horror I was now surrounded by. Nearly every surface looked like it had been coated in a thick layer of sticky, half-coagulated blood. Chains hung from the ceiling and ended with the same hooks you would imagine at a slaughterhouse. A rusted steel table sat against the wall with various crude, rusted tools on it. The place sort of looked like an abandoned warehouse or meat locker of some sort. A clank rang out behind me, and I turned around, half expecting to see the doorway out into my backyard. I didn't see the door I was hoping for, but I did see a massive man, nearly seven foot tall, and looked to be solid muscle. He was shirtless, but covered in scars. With the dim and flickering lights, I couldn't tell if he was black or just completely covered head to toe in dried blood. The lips of the Goliath were missing, and its teeth had been ripped out and replaced with rusted nails, screws, and razor blades, crudely inserted at odd angles into its gums, and blood seemed to constantly run from the nightmarish dental work. A giant scar ran down its face, and large stitches using what looked like thick yarn or twine drenched in blood held both the scar and one of its eyes closed. The large man raised its arms out to its sides, and I noticed that huge nails and screws were also sticking out of its skin in random locations. Blood dripped from each place a nail or screw had been protruding from his skin. He lowered his head and his arms became stretched out fully from his shoulders and let out a strained and wheezy attempt at a yell. I guessed that its vocal cords had either been severely damaged or removed. I could see rage rise in its one good eye as it began to run towards me. Oh shit, what the fuck? I yelled as I turned and ran as fast as I could. The dim and flickering light caused me to slip and stumble over the hooks and chains laying on the floor that I had not noticed before. The man let out another wheezy yell as it chased after me. I screamed and ran, stumbled and rolled, scrambled to my feet screamed and continued to run. I hit the wall clumsily when I tried to look back to see how much the creature had gained on me. It was getting closer and closer. I ran and fell along the wall, just trying to find my way in the nearly perfect dark that I had been surrounded in. The huge behemoth of a man was getting closer and closer, and finally I found it. A door handle. Or a crash bar, really. I slammed into it, and luckily it burst open and I fell through the doorway. Quickly, I scrambled to my feet. As I stood fully up and began to run, I realized I was outside. I was once again in my backyard. Holy shit! I exclaimed, looking back at the treehouse. My heart pounded furiously inside my chest and out of breath. My brain had insurmountable trouble in trying to comprehend what had just happened. Was it a hallucination? Some sort of waking, stress-induced nightmare? I couldn't truly grasp what I had seen or what I had just gone through. I walked cautiously back into the house. A constant feeling of uneasiness flooded my body. My wife standing at the back door saw the look on my face and asked if I had seen anything in the treehouse. I nervously chuckled at her choice of words, but not knowing how to explain, I just told her, no, I hadn't. My daughter wanted to go back out the next day and I refused to let her go out there alone. When I got out there, I stepped through the doorway first, telling my daughter to stand back and wait for a second, and nothing happened. I stood just inside the doorway and let my daughter enter while I scanned the room, looking for anything out of the ordinary. She seemed completely unaffected as she walked in and instantly began to play on the floor with her toys. As I saw this, I decided to merely shrug off my previous experience as my own temporary psychosis. I try my best to not be an overprotective parent, and I don't believe in the paranormal, but I can't get the image of that afternoon out of my head. 
It makes me wonder if there is any truth to it, or if there is something truly wrong. A few days later, I was standing in the kitchen loading the dishwasher, and I heard a scream radiate from the backyard. Worried and confused, I looked over to confirm that yes, my daughter was still in the next room playing. Nervous, I opened the back door and began to walk towards the treehouse. From the ground, I called out, not wanting to enter the structure. Hey, is someone there? I stuttered with anxiety. No reply. Hello? Is anyone there? The only response was another scream. This one was much less woman in pain and much more guttural demonic beast. What the... I mumbled under my breath, but was interrupted by another scream. This one back to sounding more like a woman in pain. Upset at the idea, I realized I was going to have to go up in there to get any answers. My body trembled as I forced myself up the steps, my brain screaming at me in reluctance to enter. I held my breath and closed my eyes as my hand grasped and turned the handle to the door. I opened the door and, after a few seconds, exhaled and opened my eyes. There was nothing. It was just as my daughter had left it a few days ago. Holy shit. I am completely losing my mind. I said to myself, as I stood there looking through the door into the essentially empty room. I really need to get my shit together. This is getting embarrassing. I turned to walk back into the house, and in the corner of my eye I caught something inside the room. I looked back and recognized a small, stuffed pink squid laying on the floor next to the couch. Damn it, child. I told you not to bring your stuffed animals out here. I said to myself under my breath as I began to walk in to grab it. Again, as I stepped through the doorway, the light faded. The red glow and flickering light returned, and screams bellowed out around me. Excruciating, horrific screams of pain filled the air. I was back in that hellish warehouse once again. My first thought was to run for the door again, but looking in that direction, it was gone. The place that held my escape was now nothing but a flat, blood-covered concrete wall. Anxiety and fear rose in my throat as another scream flooded the room and I looked around to find its source. On the table in the middle of the room lay a woman. The giant of a man was on top of her, straddling her. Her chest and ribs had been cut and ripped from her body, exposing her organs. A huge, rusted knife was stabbed into the side of her neck, and I had no idea how it was possible she was still alive, let alone still screaming. The man was taking handfuls of her intestines and pulling them from her body. He was wrapping her organs around himself and stroking himself with them. He looked towards the sky, and with his mouth gaping, that loud, guttural yell vibrated the room. After a few strokes, he would throw the chunk of intestines or other organs across the room. It would splat as it hit the wall or floor, and he would grab another handful and rip it from her open chest. Completely frozen in shock at the horrific sight, I watched as the woman's head turned towards me and screamed again. You could already see the vacant look of death in her eyes. Just as she looked towards me, a chunk of stomach came flying at me and splattered against the ground near my feet. He grabbed her hard and ripped it from her chest, lifting her entire torso off the table before the arteries snapped and her lifeless body slammed back down. He yelled out again as he brought himself to orgasm and shot a black tar into the open, blood-filled cavity that had been the woman's chest. I nearly passed out from the pure shock and disgust, but instead I snapped out of my trance and began to run. Not sure where to go, I just knew I had to get out of there. Again, tripping and stumbling over various things on the ground, I found the wall on the opposite side of the room, far from the light. I began to feel around in total darkness for a door. I heard a yell and turned back. In the dim light, I saw the Goliath of a man bite into the woman's flesh with his rusted screws and nails for teeth, then flipped the table over. He yelled out again, 
and just as he looked like he was starting to look for me, I found a door. I pressed and slammed against the door, but it just wouldn't open. The failed medical experiment of a man heard my attempt and began toward me. I began to panic, slamming harder and harder into the door, still to no avail. It just wouldn't budge. He continued running at me, getting closer and closer. I took steps away and threw my body into the door, and still barely any movement. He got to me and tackled me into the door, and we both slammed into it. The impact broke the door free. As we fell through the doorway, he disintegrated and disappeared while I fell backwards down the steps, landing on my back in the grass of the backyard. My body filled with pain, and I slowly got up, staring at the open door in utter disbelief. I stood staring for what felt like an eternity before my wife came out and asked me what was wrong. I did my best to explain the horrific images as best as I could, and once I was done, she ran back into the house, yelling something about having a plan. My wife is the much more superstitious one of the two of us, so she decided to call a friend that would know what to do. I had no idea what was truly going on, so reluctantly, I agreed to have this crystal-wielding hippie witch doctor show up to our house. A few days later, she showed up, and I say showed up because after pulling into our driveway, she refused to get out of her car and just called my wife from the driveway. My wife put her phone on speaker so I could hear the conversation. Something is very wrong here, she said. I feel the presence stronger than I've ever felt before. Well, can we burn some sage or something to get rid of it? My wife said. No, absolutely not. I'm not leaving my car. I need to go, and you should get hold of someone else to clear that evil spirit from your property. She replied. Uh, can you come into the house and talk to us? It seems to only be in the treehouse in the back, I said, trying to get as much time for answers as I could. No, it's not. I'm sorry. Is all she said before the call ended, and we watched her drive off away from our house. What was that supposed to mean? What do we do now? I asked my wife. I don't know. That was the only person I could think of. Well, at least there will be no more playing in the treehouse, okay? I responded. Yeah, I'll try to look online for someone else to help, she said, as she walked off towards the office. Sure, I'm going to go block the door to the treehouse so she can't just wander in there, I said, walking towards the back door and motioning to upstairs where our daughter slept. Avoiding it altogether seemed to work well enough. I was disappointed at not being able to use what I had put so much work into, but it had been a month since we had any problems with it, so, oh well. During that month, my wife had messaged and called numerous people she found on the internet, trying to get at least an explanation for what was happening in our backyard. All her effort hardly got any results. Most of the people never responded, as some refused to help or even investigate, and the ones she got to come to the house did the same as the first lady. They either refused to come inside or just drove past without stopping at all. Finally, I'd had enough with all of this and told myself that it was just all bullshit and there was nothing actually wrong. I went out to the treehouse and unblocked the door and took a deep breath and walked in. Nothing. It was perfectly fine. A few spiders had made some impressive webs inside, but besides that, it was all fine. <laughs> See, I fucking knew it, I yelled out. Just to prove it to myself, I even walked over to the door and jumped back and forth across the threshold a few times with no effort. Hell yeah, I was right, it was all in my head. I thought to myself as I walked back inside, it's fine, I told you it would be okay, I said to my wife as I walked in. I then told her what I had just done out there and she did nothing but give me a concerned look. I really don't think that was a very good idea. What if you just pissed whatever it is off? She said. Oh, whatever. There's nothing out there. It was all in my head. I'll prove it. I replied overconfidently as I began to walk back outside. 
When I got back out in the treehouse and up the steps to the door, I looked back at my wife, staring at me from the back porch. See? Nothing, I said, just before walking through the door. As I stepped through, everything changed again. The darkness was back in that haunting red glow that seemed to be coming from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. The chains with hooks draped down from the ceiling held decayed and naked bodies this time. A few of them swung back and forth, as if someone had just run into them as they walked past. Every one of them had its chest torn open, with their organs either missing or spilled out onto the floor. From the far side of the warehouse room I heard a scream, followed by the groans and yells of the massive demon of a man I had run into the other times. Oh fuck, I whispered to myself, realizing I had seriously messed up. The smell of rot and decay was overwhelming, and I nearly threw up as I pushed past the bodies, making my way hopefully towards a wall and some sort of doorway out of here. Each time I pushed against one of the hanging bodies, something would fall from them. Various body parts and organs fell out or broke off, hitting the floor with thuds and splatters. The sound made me flinch every time. I made my way slowly through all the bodies for what seemed like an eternity before I came to an opening. I had been traveling in the wrong direction and it led me right to the beast. I could see it between two of the swinging corpses, different this time. It looked as though it had grown at least a foot taller, bigger in every aspect, including all the rusted nails and screws seemed to have changed to the size of long, sharp railroad spikes. Its muscles now completely oversized bulged and dripped with blood both from the various impaled spikes in his skin and from the splatter of his victims. His jaw had become more pronounced and the rusted screws and razor blades he had in place of teeth were much bigger. He also now had large rusted metal bloodied horns that looked like twisted rebar jetting from the top of his head. I caught the horrified look from the man laying naked on the table just before the beast grabbed his skin at the top of his chest and ripped it down and away from his body like tearing off a shirt. The beast looked towards the sky and dangled the skin over his face, letting the blood drip all over him before dropping the skin into his mouth and swallowing it whole. The man on the table began to scream in pain, but his cries were cut short as the beast leaned down and bit into the man's throat. Somehow still alive and alert, all the man could do was spatter blood from the gaping wound where his throat used to be. My heart felt like it was going to burst through my chest, it was beating so hard and so fast. I couldn't have held my eyes open any wider in terror. All I wanted to do was look away and run, but the horror of what I was seeing rooted me to the spot, and I felt paralyzed. The beast roared in the man's face and then began to bellow a deep and haunting sound I could only describe as some sort of demonic laugh. It got louder as it again looked towards the sky, and after a few seconds, it suddenly snapped its head back down and ripped both arms from the man's body at once, sending arcs of blood flying through the air. It threw one arm off and into the darkness and took a huge bite out of the other before also throwing it away. The man, now having no way to make any noise, just sputtered more blood from his throat in response to the pain. I watched on in shock, knowing I really needed to get the fuck out of there. As soon as the beast leaned in and seemed to study the man's face, the beast's thick black saliva dripped onto him as he held his gaze mere inches apart. Another roar exploded from the creature's mouth and my shock suddenly broke. I began to move as quickly and quietly as I could through the bodies in the opposite direction, desperately looking for a wall or a door. The sound of ripping came from behind me and shortly after, I was hit in the back by part of a leg with a huge bite taken out of it. There wasn't much of the man on the table left and I knew that meant I was very quickly running out of time before he would be looking for someone else to put on that table next. Now covered in blood and viscera from pushing through all the corpses, I finally made it to a wall. Sadly, I found no door and began to run down the wall. 
my fingers sliding along in hopes to feel a door. In my panic, I ran straight into another wall as I came to the corner of the room. As I hit the wall with a loud thud and fell back, another roar emanated from the center of the room. I stood back up and placing my hand on the new wall, began to run down it, my footsteps making so much noise now as I panicked, running along the wall. I heard chains begin to swing and I knew that the beast was on the move. Shit, 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 I mumbled to myself as I ran. I smashed face first into another wall, another corner, and still no door. Standing back up again, I turned and made my way down the third wall. My face and body hurt so badly from slamming into two walls without even slowing down. As I ached, I ran my fingers still sliding across the wall. I felt the wall shake and a roar erupted through the air. The beast must have just slammed into the same wall I was running along. Not thinking it was even possible, my panic rose even higher. And then I felt it. A door frame. I stopped suddenly and felt all around it. It was another crash bar handle, and I stepped back and kicked with all my might at the door. My heart raced as I glow, my heart racing as I began to just barely make out in the red glow, bodies on chains, swinging as something was tossing them aside as it came directly towards me. I kicked at the crash bar a third time and the door flew open as if someone had opened it from the other side before my foot made contact. The force of my kick caused me to fall forward through the suddenly open doorway, and I came tumbling down the steps to the treehouse, landing in the grass. My wife let out a scream as I came flying through the doorway and ran to me as I hit the ground at the bottom of the steps. What the fuck just happened? And why are you covered in blood? Are you okay? Uh, should I call an ambulance? I looked down at my body and she was right. I was still covered in all of the blood and guts I had picked up pushing through all the hanging bodies. Fuck this, I exclaimed as my wife helped me to my feet and I hobbled off to the garage. My wife stood at the bottom of the steps, staring up at the door to the treehouse as I came back from the garage carrying a gas can. I told my wife to move out of the way and to grab a lighter as I started pouring gasoline all over the treehouse as best I could without stepping inside again. I poured half the can everywhere I could reach and through the other half, can and all, through the doorway and into the treehouse. Still not really knowing what was going on, my wife stood in the grass holding a box of matches, and as I returned to her side, I took them out of her hand. I struck one match and dropped it back in the box. The rest of the matches lit as I threw it onto the top of the steps next to the door. We stood next to each other and watched as the treehouse quickly turned into a raging fireball. It was nearly just a pile of ash and scorched earth before the fire department was called and showed up. When they did arrive, I held them back, making sure there would be nothing left of the treehouse. That was nearly a year ago now. Grass had grown back over the charred spot in the yard where the treehouse once stood. The fire marshal had lots of questions about what had happened, but I just told him I must have put in some bad wiring that caused the fire. I don't think anyone would have believed me anyway if I told them what really happened with it and why I did it. It's been peaceful around the house since that all went down, but my daughter just came running up to me a few minutes ago. She was yelling about a scary man in her toy room. I'll buy her new toys, but I'm going to call the moving company. We're leaving. My grandfather told me this story one afternoon while I sat beside his bed at the hospice he was dying in. Interrupting himself every other few seconds with wet coughs into a handkerchief. Lung cancer. His mind was still sharp but cloudy. I could tell that sometimes when I visited him that he struggled to fully remember who I was. I would have never heard this story had he not already had one foot in his grave. His mind was going fast by then, and he often mistook me for my father, who was long gone by then. Once he thought I was his brother, uh, my great uncle, 
and excitedly gripped my hands while he told me all about how he regrets never making amends with me, his brother, before he died in the war. The war. Vietnam. The afternoon that I heard the story, I came in and sat down while my grandfather stared at the television on the opposite wall. The news was on, and though my grandfather was staring at it, I could tell he wasn't really watching. James, he said. Why did we never go back to help? My name isn't James, and I wasn't aware of anyone in my family named that. I, uh, Grandpa? I asked. My grandfather rolled his bloodshot eyes over to me. He was stick figure thin. The skin on his face looked so taut that you could make out the skull underneath. We could have gone back and saved them. He coughed weakly. We didn't. Why? I... I don't know, Grandpa. I said. Because we were weak and scared. That's why. Me and you. What the fuck were we thinking? This took me aback. I never heard my grandfather curse besides the occasional God damn it!" when frustrated. I'm scared of dying, he said flatly. I'm scared of what I will see on the other side, if there is another side. A crucifix was laying on his chest as he said this. I had always thought my grandfather a devout Catholic. I felt like I had to say something. You'll be okay, Grandpa. Grandma is waiting for you in heaven. My grandfather chuckled. Don't patronize me. You and I know if that god exists, he is one sick bastard. Why would he be so kind to reunite us? The good go to hell, and the bad go to heaven. If he exists, that's how he would do it. I regretted coming that day by then. Clearly my grandfather was in a lucid state. Perhaps what he was speaking wasn't what he actually thought, but I felt like it was. He had let his guard down. He snapped his eyes back to me. We know, he exclaimed gruffly. We saw those fucking things, and what did they do? Do I have to remind you? I was stunned. Uh, Grandpa, uh, please. He settled back down into bed with a sigh. Who are you? He asked. I opened my mouth to answer, and he spoke before I could. I need to tell you what happened out there. I don't want to die alone with this knowledge. Do you need... He shut me off with a grunt. Don't talk. Listen. He started. Of course, I didn't go to college to save my ass. When the draft started, I knew my name would be on the list, and I did nothing to stop it. I could have gone to Canada, but I didn't. I could have joined the Guard, but I didn't. I just let it happen. So when I got the card in the mail, I wasn't surprised or sad. I just accepted it. I heard all sorts of horror stories the months leading up to my deployment. I heard stories of Vietnamese savages feasting on the flesh of dead soldiers. I heard about quicksands that could swallow you so quick you couldn't even yell for help. I heard about tales about black magic that aided the Vietnamese soldiers. It was all horseshit, of course, but it still got under my skin. So by the time I was deployed, I always felt on edge. I was more scared of shamans than I was of getting shot in the head while pissing in a ditch. For the most part, being out there in the jungle and the grass fields that went on forever was just boring. Lots of dope helped a bit. Playing cards well into the night, but no action. We would pass some civilians every now and again, and we could have shot them if we wanted to. Headquarters didn't care. We never did, though. We weren't bloodthirsty, at least not in the cold-blooded variety. By the time it fucking happened, we were almost begging to come across some poor Vietnamese saps with an outdated machine gun. At least then we would have an excuse to kill so we could sleep at night. Over there, things just fucked with you. You didn't need dope. You just needed boredom and all those damn bugs. My grandfather closed his eyes for a few minutes at this part and I thought he had gone to sleep and wouldn't finish the story. But much to my surprise, he started talking again. I've read a lot about the paranormal and all that. I was looking for anything to help me explain what happened that night. None of it helps. It's all horseshit. 
Ghosts, vampires, werewolves. Who the hell knows if these things are real? I know what's real. It happened to me. There were eight of us. We had been together for about six months by then, and we all considered ourselves brothers. It's hard to not grow close to the only people you spend company with for over half a year. We set up our camp for the night and we were just shooting the shit, playing guards and smoking dope. We were bad soldiers, that was for sure, but none of us cared. We all came to the conclusion that the war was pointless. We were spending billions on some little proxy war that amounted to a dick measuring contest. So we didn't care about all the technical military shit. Any half competent Viet Cong regiment would have killed us all easily. But we didn't see them. At least, uh, never mind. The jungle around us was pitch black, and only our lights would have alerted anything or anyone for miles of our presence. Stupid. So goddamn stupid. Marvin heard it first. A crack. Someone or something was just outside our camp, walking heavily. I noticed him noticing it in almost a comedic fashion. His eyes jumped open to the size of dinner plates, and he swiveled his head back and forth. Guys! He hissed between his teeth. We all stopped talking and listened. We all heard it, too. Multiple things were making noise around us. The sound of snapping twigs and leaves. We all shot up suddenly alert, our rifles in hand, nearly all of us with bad trigger discipline. Oh shit, I heard Joe say. Oh shit, oh shit. Then we saw it. Coming from the brush was a Viet Cong soldier, walking jerkily and strangely and without noise. Fuck, I heard someone yell. Then suddenly the night was full of deafening gunfire and the smell of gunpowder. Our bullets tore through the man, and I saw vividly the top and bottom half of the man's face explode off of him. Everything below his eyes became a gory red mess. His neck exploded into red tatters, and his head fell to the side like his neck was a broken door hinge. But he kept walking. I heard screaming to my side, and I looked to see another Viet Cong soldier grab Marvin by the neck. I realized I hadn't fired my gun at all. I was too shocked. Devin spun around and before I could tell him no, he fired at the Viet Cong soldier, grabbing Marvin. Devin's bullets tore through Marvin and into the soldier. Marvin's torso riddled with friendly fire. The soldier threw the body with incredible force at Devin, who fell to the ground from the dead weight. I saw the soldier who grabbed Marvin was also riddled. A large bullet hole above his eye that had caused a fist-sized hole at the top of his head. He, he should have been dead, but he wasn't. He wasn't. He kept walking. He kept fucking walking. My grandfather's voice had risen at this point, and he was becoming agitated, but I was too stunned to console him. More were coming, and I turned to see one was holding Joe and literally ripping him apart. The screams he made. They'll be the last thing I ever hear. I swear. A hand grabbed me by the shoulder, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I pissed myself. But it was just James. I turned around to look at his face. He looked oddly calm, but I looked at his eyes and I could see the animalistic instinct in them. He had shut himself down and given himself over to instinct. We need to fucking go, he said. Everything else was a blur. All I could hear was James's voice and the ringing in my ears. He turned and ran, and I followed. The others fought those things while we ran like the cowards we are. We could have stayed and been good soldiers and fought, but we ran. I couldn't think of a response. Everything he had said so far was too fantastical to believe. Was this story the product of a cancer-addled brain? I refused to believe it's real. I leaned over to say something, but my grandfather reached out and grabbed my hand. Don't let me die, he said. Their eyes were black. Don't let me die. He closed his eyes. That was the last interaction I ever had with my grandfather. He died two days later. 
His story weighs on me like a pile of bricks sometimes late at night, and I often find myself staring at my ceiling thinking about it. I wish he never told me. I know this story will be very hard to believe. I still have doubts about it. But I do trust my wife's uncle. He served in the army following so many after September 11th, but he had an experience that may separate him from so many others. He experienced a monster in an abandoned town in Iraq, and it seems to have stayed with him all the way to today. Years ago in Iraq, my wife's uncle served for a short time and was discharged after severe trauma. Sure, he had some physical trauma, but it took a long time to figure out the mental trauma as well. He was always so silent about it, but a couple days ago, he finally told me his story about this town. I don't remember the exact name of the town, but he said there was no one there. He told me how the town was not that large, looked pretty old, and was probably abandoned years ago. But he found one man that seemingly still lived there. He and a couple of others followed him into the town to find other people that may have been living there, but nobody seems to live there. But one of the men discovered what could only be described as a human slaughterhouse. Blood covered the walls of one house. So much blood that more than can be found in any one person. They investigated the house, and most of the blood was old, but some looked relatively fresh. They realized that despite all the blood, there seemed to be bodies, which was odd, so they looked all around until their eyes fell on this hole that led to a cave. The cave was massive and looked very well carved. There was a foul odor that permeated the air, and it didn't take long to find the source, nor did it take long to find the missing bodies. They looked down and found bodies everywhere. It looked like something from a horror movie. As they looked around, they saw writing all over the walls. Nobody even knew what language it was, but it looked like maybe some kind of Hebrew or some other old Middle Eastern language. They started to hear someone coming, and they got themselves positioned and ready for whatever may come. The footsteps got louder and louder, but nobody was showing up. Until they finally saw a silhouette. A massive figure stood at the entrance. It stood maybe ten feet, maybe taller. My wife's uncle was about six two, and he said he felt so small, he was like a child next to this thing. It let out a blood-curdling sound, drawing the men out. But it did something nobody expected. It spoke. I am the son of Serael, a son of heaven. Now come face me. The men stood as the creature stared at them. He went to his side and pulled out what looked to be a spear. He pierced one man who bled out very quickly. Then he grabbed another man and took a large bite out of him. He screamed for what seemed like an eternity until he just went silent. My girlfriend's uncle decided to start shooting at the monster, but bullets didn't seem to work. He looked so human despite his size, yet his skin seemed more tough than any animal he had seen. He then took an idea he remembered from the Bible, of the story about David and Goliath, except the rock is a bullet. So he took aim at his head, and multiple rounds went through the monster's eyes, and blood was gushing and the monster screamed, so he ran from the beast. He explained what he saw and what happened to the other men to his superior officer, but he was shocked with papers. He had to promise Uncle Sam that he would remain silent about these events. It's as if the government knew what was happening and they were just covering it up. How many others live out there? And what are they? Who is Serayel? I had so many questions, and even the man who was there had no answers. Again, I know this all sounds far-fetched, and that you may think I'm just making up some story. Or I could even just be gullible. But believe that him and I believe. There are large humanoids, 
that live in the Middle East that are just savages. I was deployed to Afghanistan for my second tour on my wife's birthday. This fact was all I could think about lying awake every night in that unfortunate country. I cannot describe the existential frustrations that come from day to day of sadness, sensual destruction, brutal heat, and fatigue in that godforsaken war. This combined with the catastrophic reality of the dreaded IED, improvised explosive device, and of course, the creatures. Swarms of insects, camel spiders, sand flies, snakes, and scorpions. You'd find them in your clothes, your boots, or on your floor, and they'd scatter in the night when you turned on a flashlight. But at least I was safe from those fucking IEDs in our camp. My troop lived in a small, burnt-out schoolhouse in a small village southeast of the capital of Kabul. The province we occupied was ravaged for months of insurgent fighting. Most villagers fled, but a few remained behind and stayed mostly indoors to avoid roaming groups of Taliban patrolling the area, looking for food or donations to charity. Those that refused to help, or worse, were identified as cooperating with Afghan national or American forces, were beaten or even killed. Even the young people stayed at home. Although we encountered the almost daily harassment of small arms fire, the peppering of bullets hitting the walls of the schoolhouse, the nights were eerily calm. Local insurgents had improvised a strict curfew on everyone in the area, even themselves. From six in the evening until morning prayers, the Taliban terrorized the locals and the presence of foreign troops only aggravated the fighting. Assassinations and kidnappings became daily news in addition to an increasing number of victims being caught between the fighting between Afghanistan National Security Forces and insurgents. To counter the expansion of government presence, anti-government elements used targeted kills to intimidate local influential elders. This deliberate targeting of civilians led to an increase in suicide attacks, IED attacks, and assassinations. It was the last type that took the life of a highly esteemed member of the High Peace Council one fateful day, gunned down inside his own home. The attack ripped apart his body, but his face was left perfectly, peacefully even, intact. The killing caused an uproar, being a distinguished leader in the village, it was of the utmost importance to the residents that his body be prepared for a proper religious burial. A challenging task as there was no longer anybody left at the health clinics or mosques. The local coroner, a religious man, had fled to Kubal months previous to the attack. In a brave effort of goodwill, my troop decided to make the dangerous trek to Kubal to send for the coroner. The journey would take at least ten hours by combat vehicle, and the men decided it would be best to sneak out after nightfall during curfew. There was just one thing. Somebody had to stay behind to guard the corpse. Being terrified of a possible IED attack along the way, and not particularly bothered by the sight of a dead body, I was comfortable with death at this point. I volunteered to stay behind. Besides, I had a flask of low-grade, locally made, contraband liquor to keep me company. There's a strong superstition of witchcraft among the local tribe the deceased man had belonged to. To be fair, it isn't locally referred to as witchcraft, but this is the best cultural translation I can offer. There's an ancient belief that local witches rifle graves and funeral pyres in search of bones, and cut pieces of flesh from unburnt corpses to use for blasting their neighbors' lives. And that some of these old sorceresses, the moment they smell death anywhere about, hastily mutilate the corpse before mourners even arrive. It is said that these witches even have the power to change their shape. They turn into spiders or mice or snakes or even flies, disguises they can use for stealing flesh. Most of us recognize this as symptoms of normal decomposition, but this superstition held strong in that particular region. For this reason, I was tasked by the locals to watch attentively the whole night. I promised to fix my eyes on the corpse without even a sideways glance. I respected the locals and wanted to grant them what little peace I could. 
The guilt I felt being involved in this war constantly overwhelmed me. Here was an opportunity for penance. The man's widow, one of the only women left in the village, led me into the man's room, where she showed me the corpse lying on a slab and wrapped in an off-white linen shroud. After a fit of weeping, she called in a man as a witness. Together, as if taking inventory, they examined the features of the man's face to record that it was undamaged. Then they left me alone in the room with nothing but a large lamp for the evening. All alone with the corpse, I fortified my eyes for the vigil by rubbing them hard and keeping up my spirits by talking to myself between poles on my flask. Twilight turned into night and night grew deeper and deeper, blacker and blacker, more quiet and then silent until my usual bedtime had passed and the midnight approached. I had only been a little uncomfortable at first, but after some time passed, I began to feel thoroughly frightened. Perhaps my mind was playing tricks on me, as it often did these days. At one point in the evening, a small desert mouse squeaked in through a hole in the door, stopped near me and fixed its gaze intently on me. The boldness of this stupid little mouse was disconcerting, but I quickly shooed it away. Sometime after this, a sudden and deep sleep took over me and dragged me down into a bottomless dark gulf of sleep. This was the deepest sleep I had experienced since enlisting in the war. Usually my mind was so frantic I could barely sleep. I don't even know how to describe it to you. I had clearly been running on a deficit up until this point, and my body finally just crashed. I didn't dream at all. I felt nothing at all. If someone had walked into the room right then, they couldn't have readily discerned which of us two was the corpse. The body on the slab, or the body passed out on the floor. It was almost as though I had actually died and my corpse had been left without a guardian. Many hours passed like this and I finally woke up to the sun rising and the sound of morning prayers. Quickly remembering my post, I rushed to the body in a bit of a panic. I pulled back the shroud and examined the corpse's face closely. To my huge relief, I found it untouched. No bugs or creatures had gotten into it the night before in my stupor. A short time later, the man's widow came into the room, still weeping, with the witness behind her. She threw herself onto the man and, after kissing him tenderly, brought my lamp close to his face to make sure all was well. Delighted with my local service, she turns to me to express her gratitude. Before she could gesture, a terror took over her face. The woman screamed and turned away from me. In my confusion, I put my hand to my face. It felt like wet, ground meat. Somehow, in my deep sleep, I hadn't noticed sand flies eating at my face, completely disfiguring me. Today, it looks like I'd suffered third-degree burns, caused by enemy gunfire or an explosion. I will never tell anybody the horrible truth of my wound, which haunts me to this day. Everybody watched her dance. Guys and girls alike just couldn't seem to break away from that hypnotic sway. The girl had just walked into the bar, gone straight to the middle of the room and started dancing. Just like that, we were all under her spell. Had I known then what I know now, I would have turned and run as far and as fast as I could. I would have tried to, anyway. It was hard to describe, but... Just one look at that girl was enough to ensnare you. She was perfect. Waist-length red hair, milky skin, and eyes that burned into your soul. The first guy plucked up the courage to try his luck. He was without doubt the best-looking man in the room. He knew it, too. He walked over to her and opened his mouth to say something, but she put a finger to his lips before any words could escape them smiled, and shook her head. Something about the way she turned him down hit me like a mace to the stomach. It was without doubt the most brutal thing I'd seen. She didn't insult him, didn't laugh at his face or throw a drink over him. She let him know, 
without saying a word, that she would never dine to let him so much as speak to her. Other men and women approached over the course of the evening, every one of them rejected. They were lucky. I never thought I'd stand a chance. After seeing the people she'd already turned away, what hope did a chubby, short, nineteen-year-old geek have? Better to preserve what dignity I had and sip my drink alone. When she pointed at me and beckoned for me to join her, I felt as though I were in a dream. I have to admit that, despite being sat in the corner of the room, I actually looked behind me to see if she was looking at somebody else. No. She wanted me. I froze. There wasn't enough alcohol in the world to give me the courage to dance with her. She laughed and danced her way over to me. A moment later, she took my head in her hands and kissed me full on the lips. That kiss. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. Better than sex. It sent hellfire coursing through my brain to set every nerve ending ablaze. Every forbidden, perverted thought I'd ever had came rushing through my consciousness. I felt proud to be an animal, a creature whose instincts compelled it to lust and violence. Nothing was beyond me. I could do whatever I wanted to whoever I wanted. And then it was over. Humanity came flooding back. The reality of social norms, ethics, and morality reasserted themselves, and I remembered who I was. I was a chubby, short, 19-year-old geek who had no business thinking and feeling the way I had. That wasn't who I was. You bet it was who I wanted to be, though. Deep down, in that place where sense gives way to desire, that was what I wanted. I think she could sense that. I think that's why she picked me. It's a rush, isn't it? She said. Getting a taste of the beast within is always a rush. I stammered something incomprehensible. My head was still reeling from the kiss. She smiled and I, like a rat, staring into the eyes of a viper. Give me your number. I... sure. I managed. Do you want me to text you? Uh, do you have your phone with you? I, I could write it down if you prefer. Uh, do you have a pen? She held up a hand before I could continue rambling. Just tell me your phone number. I have an excellent memory. I did as I was told. I'll see you again. And with that, she left. I spent the next three days in agony. I couldn't get that kiss out of my mind. The way I'd felt left me ashamed and aroused in equal measure. I spent every waking moment replaying the scenario in my head, trying to get another taste of how it had awakened some primal creature within me. Every night, I dreamt of that girl. She had my number, but hadn't given me hers. Looking back on it, it's amazing just how much power that gives you over a person. Uh, would she call back? Would I ever see her again? Was it all just a cruel prank? When she finally did call, my phone didn't display her number. I recognized her voice instantly, though. Her words like poison dripping into honey. Meet me at the bank in an hour. I didn't even have time to ask which bank she meant. The powerlessness of my situation began to dawn on me. I couldn't just refuse to go. I might never have the chance for another kiss. She had me well and truly dangling on her hook. In the end, I set off for the closest bank to my house. Sure enough, she appeared exactly one hour after she had hung up the phone. I realize how this sounds now that I'm writing it down. I'm sure some of you are thinking, Fuck that, I'd run. That's exactly what I should have done. I couldn't do it, though. All it took was one kiss to make me an addict. Uh, hi, I said as I approached. I've been thinking about you a lot. I, I wonder if uh, maybe you want to get a coffee or something. I don't drink coffee. Oh, uh, okay, maybe a bite to eat. No thanks. How much do you have in your savings? I blinked. 
I, not much. A couple hundred dollars. Perfect. You can make an ATM withdrawal. Not as many questions that way. Y you want my savings? I said it half as a question, half as a statement. I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. That depends. Do you want another kiss? I shook my head. Enough was enough. This was some kind of scam and I wasn't going to be a victim anymore. All I had to do was turn around and walk away. I didn't need another kiss. As soon as the thought entered my head, my body rebelled. My skin itched and my palms started to sweat. I gritted my teeth against a sudden rush of pain in my stomach. That money wasn't everything. Another kiss was worth it. I withdrew the cash. Good dog, she said. She leaned in and kissed me. It wasn't as good as the first time. The first time I had never experienced anything so intensely pleasurable. Even so, the feeling of power and fertility I'd been trying in vain to remember flooded me once more. All those dark little thoughts and urges resurfaced, and I knew there was nothing bad or wrong about them. Humans are animals. Animals fight and fuck. Animals rape and kill. The sensation receded, leaving me feeling confused, guilty, and turned on. I opened my eyes and she was gone. You know you can tell me anything, don't you? My mom said. Since dad passed away, mom had been trying to be extra motherly to me and my sister. Fully cooked breakfasts, family board game nights, the works. She looked at me with deep and genuine concern. I I'm fine, I lied. Just flu or something. It had been three weeks since my last kiss. Nothing else mattered. Not food, not sleep, not even family. My whole body ached with the need for another kiss. My skin crawled as though insects were burrowing beneath it. Every time I drifted into unconsciousness, my dreams were full of monsters and suffering. I rolled over in bed. I didn't want to look at my mom. I couldn't face her. I love you, Jason. I didn't reply. My bedroom door shut and my mom's footsteps faded away. I heard a faint sob. I screwed my eyes shut and tried not to think about my last kiss. It was impossible. I may as well have tried not to breathe. It's drugs, isn't it? My sister said. I hadn't heard her come in. I, no, Alex, it's not drugs. Bullshit. I sighed, rolled over and looked her straight in the eye. It's not drugs. Right, okay then. Let's pretend I believe you. If it's not drugs, what is it? It sure as hell isn't flu. A girl, I sighed. A girl. Jason, you're a mess. You don't eat, you don't talk, you just sit in your room and lie on your bed. I get that love can be rough, but come on. I don't love her. What? I said I don't love her. I fucking hate the bitch, okay? Alex took a step back. I hadn't realized I'd been shouting. I sighed. It felt good to tell the truth, even if it was only a partial truth. I did hate the girl who kissed me. I hated her for what she'd done to me. I hated her for not calling me for three torturous weeks. I hated her because I so badly wanted another kiss. What's her name? Whatever she did to you, I'll knock her out for it. I... I don't know her name. My phone buzzed. I answered straight away. Meet me at my house. I'll text you the address. That was her, wasn't it? Alex said. No. Don't lie to me. Where are you going? Out. I pushed my way past her. She grabbed me by the shoulder. I spun around almost ready to hit her until I saw the dampness in her eyes. Please don't go to her. I took her hand off my shoulder. I wanted to hug her, to apologize to her, but I was too ashamed. With my head down and tears running down my face, I left. The girl's house was on the outskirts of town, where the city started to give way to the countryside. 
To call the building a house would be like calling the works of Salvador Dali doodles. The thing was a mansion, secured behind enormous walls topped with vicious barbed iron railings. As soon as I approached, the gate opened for me, allowing me into a driveway the size of a small street. As I walked towards the front door, I took a moment to look at the garden. I didn't recognize most of the flowers, but I knew foxgloves and nightshades when I saw them. Beautiful and deadly flowers. Here and there, the garden was studded with marble sculptures. Each one depicted a naked person in agony. There were men impaled on spikes or being sat on by slavering wolves. Women wept as their bodies were engulfed in sculpted flame. She stepped out of the front door, her face split by a cruel sneer. I want you to give me a present, she said in a sing-song voice. Her hands were held behind her back. What do you want? I asked. I'd intended it to come out as a hiss. I wanted to show her I still had some power over myself. Instead, the words came out as a whimper. Nails. Uh, nails? I repeated. My thoughts turned to the marble sculptures and the tortures a little bit of sharp metal could inflict. Uh, what do you want nails for? I want your nails. Uh, oh. Uh, okay. I was suddenly relieved. Uh, whatever. Uh, do you have any scissors? She laughed and shook her head. From behind her back, she produced a pair of pliers. No, I whisper. Yes. Uh, not like that. Please, not like that. She pouted and held the pliers out to me. No nails, no kiss. I swallowed back a sob. I could already feel my heart beating out a maniac drumroll. The thought of what I had to do knocked me sick. The thought of not getting another kiss was like having red-hot needles pushed into every pore. I took the pliers. For a long while, I stood there, just looking at my hands. My consciousness seemed to be coming from somewhere else, as though I was watching my own body from another plane of existence. I closed the pliers on the nail of my left thumb and started pulling. The pain was unbearable. I watched through tear-blurred eyes as, millimeter by millimeter, a red line grew at the base of my nail. My fist clenched around the pliers and I pulled with all my strength, screaming with agony as I did. The nail moved less than a centimeter. I wasn't going to be able to pull it off in one go. That's it, she crooned. Just ease it out. Don't worry, it'll grow back. Minutes crawled by like hours. I screamed until I could only choke. With one last pull, the nail came free my hands shaking and wet with blood and sweat. I put my thumbnail into her cupped hands. Despite the snot dribbling down my face, I leaned in for my kiss. She backed away. No, no, no. That's no good. I gave you my fucking nail! I cried. I hated her more than I thought was possible. I said I wanted nails. Plural. You have another thumb and eight fingers to go. I pulled at my hair, waiting with frustration, pain, and anger. She stepped forward and tussled my hair. Oh, poor little doggy doesn't want his kiss. I made a grab for her. If she wouldn't give me a kiss, I'd take one from her. The moment my hands touched her, something like an electric shock passed through my hands and burned its way down to my feet. Searing agony knocked me to the ground. It took me a good fifteen seconds before I could breathe again. Just for that, she hissed. I'll have your toenails as well. Three months passed with no call. My last kiss had barely been enough to take the edge off the pain. As you might expect, my mother and sister were horrified when they found out what I'd done to my fingers and toes. They phoned the police straight away. I told the officer what I could. The description I gave had matched any number of women. My phone had no sign of any strangers calling or texting. The address I told them about revealed nothing but empty fields. None of that came as a surprise to me. I was pretty sure I'd gone way beyond the points where I could be shocked. 
Whoever the girl who kissed me was, I was certain she wasn't truly human. My drug test came back negative, eliminating my family's theory that I'd started taking heroin or something. With the negative drug tests, the police quickly lost interest. They saw no reason to suspect I was being abused by my family and passed me over to the care of a psychiatrist. Telling the truth didn't make me feel any better, especially since nobody believed me. My sister figured I'd been rejected by a girl and had a breakdown. My psychiatrist was certain that my so-called succubus was entirely a creation of a disturbed mind. He theorized the red-headed girl was a rejection of deep-seated sadomasochistic fantasies. I was too preoccupied with my own suffering to pay much attention to the people around me. I shambled through life like a zombie. The physical effects of kiss withdrawal were crippling. My skin itched and burned. It felt like it was being bitten from within by an army of fire ants. Until my nails grew back, I'd resorted to scratching myself with a fork, leaving bloody trails down my arms and chest. My nightmares started to spill over into my waking life. Here and there, I'd see something scuttling on the edge of vision. Shadowy figures loomed over my bed, reaching out with taloned hands to torment me. I saw maggots in my food and centipedes in my drink. Life had become hell on earth. Then she came back. The knocking woke me in the middle of the night. Somebody was pounding on the front door with the force of a battering ram. Uh, Mom, the door... I said, still drowsy from my fitful sleep. Mom? Alex? Could you see who's there, please? I swore and stumbled out of bed. I didn't hear any movement from my family, so I slipped on some clothes and went downstairs. I opened the door just as another set of knocks, knocks strong enough to crack the wood, started. A huge man in a suit stood in the doorway. He had the look of a bouncer, or... He had the look of a bouncer, or archetypal hired goon. She wants to see you, he said, in a voice too gentle for his appearance. I said nothing and looked past him. A black limousine was parked in front of my house, its windows tinted to stop anybody looking inside. I took a step back. Uh, Mom? I shouted. Panic started to overwhelm me. Alex? She has them, the man said. He sounded sympathetic. I'm taking you to see them. Uh, how? Where? I stammered, my mind struggling to put together a logical explanation for how my family could be kidnapped without me noticing. I gave in. Logic didn't apply to that demon. Come on, it's time to go. The man put a hand on my shoulder and led me towards the car. Partway there, when I'd managed to recover my senses a little, I asked him a question that had plagued me almost as much as my addiction. Who is she? She's... She's the worst thing that ever happened to me. The man said. He fought back a sob and squeezed my shoulder in an almost fatherly way. Just don't make her angry. Whatever you do, don't make her angry. He opened the back door of the limousine and waited for me to get in before heading over to the driver's seat. She was inside, clad in fur and diamonds like some sort of celebrity. She smiled and pushed a glass of wine into my hand. I didn't drink it. Let's talk business, she said as the limo started to move. I don't want another kiss. I want my family. Nobody wants another kiss. Not when they think it through rationally, at least. No, this is about craving. You don't want a kiss. You crave it. Deep down, I think you'd do anything for another kiss. Where's my family? They're safe. Not exactly comfortable, but... They haven't come into any harm. I relaxed a little. Some instinct told me that whatever she was, she couldn't lie. More precisely, whatever she said just had to be. You're a demon, aren't you? You're a succubus, 
She smirked. Poor little doggy. I'm more than a demon. I'm the monster of demons. Consort of the accuser. Queen bitch. So, you want my soul? I felt my mouth go dry as I said the words. It was like waking up to find out that the monster from your nightmare was stood by your bed. Clever boy. In return, I'll kiss you once a week, every week. After three long months of withdrawal, that has to be at least a little tempting, hmm? She was right about that. A kiss every week had already been through hell. My soul couldn't be worth much. What was damnation compared with a kiss every week? All right. Deal. Good dog, she purred. So, what do I do? Shake hands? Sign my name in blood? No, that won't cut it, she said. There was a delight in her voice that made my blood run cold. You can't just give away your soul. You have to do something to lose it. I felt the limousine slow to a stop. The big man stepped out and opened the door for us. She stepped out first and offered me her hand. I took it. We walked across soft, damp grass towards a structure resembling a concrete garden shed. My heart threatened to break through my ribs as we got closer. I knew my family was inside. I knew she wanted me to hurt them. She opened the door. My mother and sister were bound to metal chairs. They'd been gagged, and tears streaked their faces. When they saw me, they tried to scream their pleas. My heart broke at the sight of them. Something cold and heavy was pressed into my hand. I looked down at the gun and started to weep. I, I can't, I said, turning towards the red-haired girl. I can't shoot them. Oh, you poor puppy, she said in a mocking sympathy. The gun isn't for them. It's for you. For me? Yes. It's for if you want to back out of the deal. Put the gun to your head, pull the trigger, and you have my word I'll let your family go. I didn't have to think about it. I aimed the gun straight at the bitch. She pulled a melodramatic face of shock. Oh, wow. Didn't see that one coming. Here's the thing. If you shoot me, I won't die. I can't die. What I can do is make damn sure you, your mother, and your whore sister spend many a long year just wishing you were dead. I turned the gun away from her and put it to my own head. My hands trembled and I heard my mother wail. Very noble. Sacrifice yourself to save your family. Better than just walking away and facing a life with no more kisses, right? She put a certain emphasis on the word kisses, and the effect was instantaneous. My mind turned straight to the thought of that first kiss. I couldn't shake the memory of just how good it was. She cocked her head and sneered. She knew she'd got me. Mind you, a kiss a week. Now that can be heaven on earth. It'd be cruel of your family to stand in the way of your happiness, wouldn't it? I sobbed with frustration and shame as I turned the gun towards my mother. I couldn't look her in the eyes. I tried to ignore her muffled screams as I pulled the trigger. The shot echoed across the countryside. I'd missed. The red-haired girl held my wrist, pointing the gun a foot above my mother's head. I stared at her in confusion. I told you the gun isn't for them. She hissed. She pried it out of my fingers and dropped it on the floor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all of you. I turned around at the sound of the big man's voice. I looked down at what he was holding, and my heart sank. My family screamed. No, I whispered. Anything but that. 
If you want your kisses, this is how I want you to surrender your soul. Please just let me use the gun. No. I took a few trembling steps towards the big man, knowing that I stood on the precipice of damnation, knowing that if I did what she wanted me to do, I deserved to go to hell. A kiss every week. Every week. I couldn't stop myself from thinking about it. I took the kerosene and matches. I don't consider myself to be a particularly superstitious person. That is to say, I get the occasional kick out of the horoscope, and my boyfriend and I like to humor the idea that spirits and poltergeists exist. We even joke about how we'd haunt people when we died and came back as ghosts. In fact, my boyfriend refuses to go anywhere near a Ouija board. He refuses to even think of it. Why even tempt it? He'd say. Why would you want to taunt evil ghosts like that? Ghosts never play fair, and if you piss one off, you're screwed. I don't think he was ever serious, just precautionary. But maybe he was right. God, this all happened so recently, I'm still shaken. I can barely write about it now without my nerves acting up. Okay, here it goes. A few weeks ago, my mom, sister, and I went to Colorado for an entire week of vacation. We were going to drive all over the state, visit the national parks, and go horseback riding and whitewater rafting and so much more. I was excited, and I sorely needed a break from work anyway. We drove a grueling 16 hours out there and spent our first day rafting down the rivers. After an extremely wet but exhilarating day, we drove to a ranch house to go horseback riding. We arrived at sunset, so it was too late to do anything, but we had all next day to ride the trails and see the sights. The ranch was dumpy, to put it nicely. It was all run down with scraps of steel everywhere, and the shoddy log cabins were in desperate need of repair. I swear the roof over our shack of a cabin was a giant piece of drywall with shingles stapled to the top. My sister and I thoroughly checked the place for spiders and bugs before we even thought to bring our luggage inside. It was only for the night, I reassured myself. Just one night in a dumpy shack on a rock-hard bed that probably had bed bugs under the sheets. I shuddered at the thought. My mom tried to cheer us up. She had brought skewers and a pack of hot dogs to roast over the communal fire pit. Happy to get out of the shack, my sister and I made a nice cozy fire, and soon a few other visitors came out to sit around the fire and roast s'mores and share stories. We talked about where we were from, where we were going, and all our adventures along the way. Pretty soon the stories turned to tall tales and urban legends, and the sort of stuff you'd usually tell around a bonfire. That's when I spoke up. I loved stories, especially scary ones. And hey, we're out west. We're in Native American territory. Why not liven the place up with my favorite local myth? The legend of the skinwalkers. Now, for the uninitiated, skinwalkers are very evil, very dangerous beings. They were humans who gained the ability to take on the form of an animal by wearing its pelt usually through very dark and taboo magic. I knew all this and told my story. Who doesn't love a good ghost story, after all? Everyone seems to be enjoying it. I admit I took some creative liberties, really just retold an old werewolf story, but with a skinwalker as the monster instead. I improvised a lot of the story and added a few things that weren't in the mythos at all. I gave our beloved frightening skinwalker wide, crazed eyes with pinpoints for pupils with a matching, insane smile. I made the skinwalker horribly misshapen, swollen joints and arms that were too long and legs that were too short, and a head that never sat straight on its shoulders. 
I made it as terrifying as I could imagine. And no one minded. They actually really liked it. A man from Kentucky admitted the visuals alone were enough to creep him out. Victory in my book, if you ask me. And once I was done, everyone decided it was getting really late. Our firewood was dwindling and it was as good a time as any to turn in for the night. We packed up our skewers and s'mores, doused the fire, and headed to our little shacks. I tossed and turned a lot, trying to fall asleep. I couldn't get comfortable on that damn bed. A rock was probably cozier than that mattress. So against my better judgments, I got out of bed and walked about the cabin. I reasoned that if I stayed up late enough, I would be so tired that I would fall asleep no matter what I was laying on. I think I briefly contemplated sleeping on the floor, but I wasn't that desperate yet. It was pitch black outside, no lights from any nearby street lamps, no car headlights, hell, not even the cabin lights were on, and I don't remember seeing a single star. It was a bit creepy, but I shrugged off the shiver creeping up my back as simply the cold tile floor beneath my feet. I did, however, find it odd there weren't any lights on at all on the property. You'd think there'd be a floodlight on the horse stables or in the main office, but no, nothing. That was really weird. I stepped outside of my flimsy foam flip-flops to get a better look. I could barely make out the ranch, and for some stupid reason I decided to go walking around. Eventually my eyes adjusted where I could see well enough to navigate. I paced up and down the road where the cabin sat and then circled around to the fenced-in field where the horses were grazing. Except there weren't any horses. Probably in the stables for the night, I reasoned. I shivered again. It was getting cold. I turned around to head back to my own cabin. It was stupid of me to be out all alone at an obscene hour, I had realized. I needed to get to bed. But when I turned... There was something in the middle of the road. Its shape was swallowed up by the surrounding darkness. I could barely make it out. But whatever it was, it was tall and thin. I shrugged it off as just a pole or something else and kept walking. But then it moved. I froze. My breath caught in my throat and I could barely breathe. I just imagined that, I said. I just imagined it. I'm freaking myself out. Get your fucking head on straight. It moved again. My paralyzed throat managed to squeak out a pathetically weak whimper as my legs began to lose strength. I shivered violently against a cold that was building up inside of me. My eyes began to focus on the impossibly dark figure standing against a barely visible sleet gray night. Now I could see it. It was a person but like nothing I had ever seen before. Its arms were impossibly long, its legs impossibly short. It had a torso far too long for its rail-thin body, and a head much too big for its pencil-thin neck. Its right arm was sticking out to its side, swinging up and down. Its blockish head rolled onto its left shoulder, jerkily twitched up and down, up and down. It didn't move other than that. Just stood there, twitching arms, jerking up and down, head lolling around its shoulder. I still stood there like the dumb fuck I was. My cabin was a few hundred yards behind that... that thing. And I wasn't so stupid as to try to walk past it. My only option was to go around, behind the cabins and the stables, and hope it didn't see me. I forced myself to lift my foot off the ground to step backwards. My flip-flop made a loud, wet, smacking sound as it cracked against my foot, and I immediately froze in horror. The thing stopped, too. It stood there, perfectly straight, perfectly still, listening. I stayed as still as I could. My breath was shallow and panicked as I tried to force myself to slow my breathing before I started wheezing. My heart thundered in my chest. My whole body was shaking, but I didn't move, neither did it. I began to slowly, so goddamn slowly, 
bend over and slipped my feet out of those fucking flip-flops. My feet touched the dirt and the crumbly gravel, but at least now I could move silently. I spared a quick glance to the side to see where I was going. Two cabins were immediately to my right. I could slip between them with ease, disappearing out of sight. I only looked away for a second. When I turned back, that fucking thing was gone. It was fucking gone. It fucking knew I was there, and it was coming for me. Yet I still couldn't move. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move no matter how loud my head screamed to run. I heard something behind me. I turned instinctively. Even though I knew better, I still turned around. I was greeted with two bulging eyes. Oh fuck, it's eyes. Staring at me, unblinking with two black pinholes for pupils, and an insane smile that was stretched far too wide to be anything remotely human. My paralysis broke as I stared at that thing. I ran, crying my eyes out, trying to scream, but a horrible lead weight in my throat silenced me. My feet pounded on the dirt. I stomped over anything in my way. I trampled over a jagged rock, slicing my foot open. I ignored the pain. I ignored my body screaming in agony. I ignored my own blood pouring from the wound. I didn't care. I just ran. I felt the cold creeping up my back. Oh god, that cold. It was sinking right into my bones. I couldn't stop shaking or sobbing and I didn't stop running until I burst into the cabin. I slammed the door shut, deadbolted the lock, and leapt into my bed. I huddled under the blankets, hiding my head. And there I gasped and shook for breath. And I waited. I didn't sleep that entire night. I was too scared. I couldn't get rid of that chill. All I thought about was that thing, standing there and twitching. Morning finally broke, and I finally allowed a breath of relief. Whatever I had seen had not come for me. And now that it was light, it could no longer take me by surprise. My mom noticed my bleeding foot and the blood I tracked through the cabin. I shrugged it off, said I cut myself the night before when I was making s'mores. I don't think she believed me, but she didn't push it. We left not long after that, and as we left, I looked at the place where that thing once stood, and I shuddered again. But there was nothing. I assured myself there was nothing. We said goodbye to the ranchers and to our companions, and I noticed the man from Kentucky, who said he had thoroughly enjoyed my story. He told me again about how much he liked it, said he was going to tell it to his own kids when he got home. They really liked scary stories, he said. And as we drove away, his head rolled onto his left shoulder, and he smiled a wide, insane smile as he waved us goodbye. I tried to jot down all the explanations that came to my mind last night, and rereading it made me realize it was oddly difficult for others to understand. So perhaps this time I would start the story way back when I was first born, and work my story up to now as a not-so-human human. I am a skinwalker, or I figure that's what I'm called. Yeah, that scary folklore kind of skinwalker. First, let's clarify. No, we are not dogs with no tails or guys who walk on all fours. We are not witches. We are not once-human either. What you have read and watched online are lies, adaptations, and exaggerated versions of the skinwalkers during our early stage of development. Think of a toddler learning to walk and talk. Being a dog, a fish, a deer, a bird, half a bird, or even the first few humans was our toddler phase. We were learning to mimic. I was born a spherical, fleshy core the size of a pea with an eye, a tail, and a mouth. 
a round red lump of tadpole red meat creature capable of seeing, eating, and doing some extraordinary things to survive. It is hard to have one word that describes what skinwalkers do as infants. In fact, I don't think we even have a word for that. So I will try to break it down so everyone can understand the step-by-step -step process of us growing up. As a baby, I was durable and animalistic. I had a strong tail that allowed me to spring and jump like crickets, but it was instinct not to jump, as it requires energy to do so. And as a newborn, you don't have the luxury of carbs. We were vicious, opportunistic hunters, and we had our foul odor to attract the first prey. Unlike other tadpoles, who started underwater and preyed on fish, I started alone on land, probably because of my parents' choice of birthing location. My first prey was a bear cub during warmer season, which I was very proud of. It sounds way cooler to hunt a bear than a fish. I jumped into its nostril as it was sniffing me, then I wriggled my way up to the brain area. There, instinct told me to do three things. Eat, copy, replace. I feasted on a small portion of the brain and quickly fell asleep. When I woke up, my first thin layer of protection had already coated my red skinless self, as if the resting time was my body breaking down the structure and chemicals of what I just consumed. It automatically made an exact copy of said portion. There I had my first apartment inside a bear cub whose brain I gradually ate and replicated until one day I was completely able to control its limbs. Although imitating the movements of other bears was awkward and proven to be an ugly task. The outer layer of myself at this portion was the exact size of the bear's real and no longer existing brain. While my real self, the red tadpole that I was, with an eye and a mouth, was resting peacefully inside, like a snail. Except the fact that I have two shells when you think of it. The bear body itself, and the layer I made that looked and functioned like a bear brain. The bear's head at that point was hollow without me. Soon I learned to behave and hunt salmon like other bears, and soon I learned to shrink and expand my brain shell. Then I learned how to temporarily travel outside of that shell. I would shrink my real body, open a small hole of this brain, and venture south to feast on the spinal bone marrow. It took me days to finally eat all of them and come back up top. Although I was very young, my dexterity allowed me to glue the brain shell to the fake spinal cord that I just made. Soon I realized I no longer had to venture out and use my real mouth to eat. I can consume the bones, muscles, and veins of the bear, as long as it touches my outer layer, the fake brain and the fake spinal cord. However, the indirect eating process is significantly slower than eating with my mouth, as the enzymes my shell produced were not as concentrated. I gradually ate and faked the bear inside out, and then I learned to soften and harden my bear shell so I could shrink even more, to the point it felt like it was but a thin layer of meat wrapping around my tadpole core. I ate and cloned all the bones and muscles of the bear, but left the fat and the skin as it was nasty to consume. Had I shrunk my shell and left the bear there, it would have been nothing but its skin on the ground. Imagine a skinless, fatless, adult brown bear walking around, or half of that imagery walking around. The tales of skinwalkers being dogs with no lower half, a deer with no tail, humans who walk on fours, probably stemmed from there. People saw our very first attempts to mimic living creatures, and we weren't so masterful at digesting. Again. We were toddlers. I didn't leave the bear and venture out as a skinless monstrosity, though. I lived in my comfortable home for a long while, until one day I smacked a domestic dog unconscious at night. I shrank all of myself as much as possible and left the deflated bear via its mouth. 
I grew from the size of a pea to a kidney bean before I left. I then wriggled my way to the dog's brain through its mouth. There I ate the brain within hours of the night. However, in the middle of my feasting, I poured in a new experience. I'd call it not food-related good memories. At first it was foreign and shocking to me, for I ate the bear's brain since it was a young cub. My entire memory as the bear was simply the joy of me eating salmon and berries, but when I was in this dog it was something else. Joy and happiness that weren't associated with food, but with a foreign creature that was significantly taller than me. And in the dog's memories, the creature was always showing its teeth, as if it was trying to eat the dog. I learned that showing teeth means aggression behavior back when I was a bear, because that was what older bears did. They tried to scare each other with their teeth. I thought this creature, uh, the human, was trying to eat me, the dog. But at the same time, the dog itself associated that aggression with joy. As a baby skinwalker, I didn't know shifting from one species to another would be such a challenge. And that was 11 years ago. I'm in a male human host now, and I don't need to eat any more, if at all. I only eat to maintain the host's body. I don't take over people for the sake of comfort eating either. I only eat when I need a new identity. I don't eat their brain completely like I used to do, because doing so will kill the host immediately once I leave them. I learned that the hard way. I often have sex with the next potential host, and while they're sleeping together, I leave the worn out human for a new journey. And yes, skinwalkers can sense each other. We can also kill if we want to, but challenging mankind is not our interest. We just want to survive and thrive as a species. It's no use trying to irritate the host. I am writing this to you, not for your own curiosity, but to satisfy my own and as a means to remember more of that day, to maybe help soothe the pain I've carried all this time. Journaling, after all, is a good way to deal with trauma. So more than storytelling, I consider this an exorcism of a demon. A demon born, born ten years. Right. My nightmare begins in Sarah's laundromat. How stupid. The bell above the door rattled as the glass doors shut behind us. Middle-aged women with pink hair curlers looked up from their wrinkled magazine, rolling their eyes as we ran through the aisles of the laundromat. Henry went for the vending machine. Stephen pulled up stools to the corner arcade cabinets. Uh, aren't you two going to help? I asked, lifting a basket of reeking clothes up to a washing machine. Neither listened. Henry just walked back, holding in his thin arms a whole cornucopia of Cheetos and Starbursts and chocolate. I always wondered where it went. Never got to ask. Stephen kept himself glued to the mirrors, patted down a seat for Henry. I stood and tiptoed over to the machine, piling black smudged sock after black smudged sock, filling the machine to its seeming rim slamming down the cover and putting it to whatever made the most noise and bustle. And the machine roared, fidgeting in its bolted slot, like all the others, just rows of washing machines grayed with use, metal peeling off their edges as they shook along the wall or against each other. Women wheeled baskets with giant poles, staring at us three with the absolute look of death on their faces, dark ringed eyes and sagging jowls. I went towards the arcade cabinet, stopped. A television in the corner of the room beeped, staticky, in constant rhythm. Emergency report, a missing child suspect still at large. No details. I looked up, watching the television break to static. The janitor walked out from the back room, sighing, broom still in his hand. 
he went up to the machine and gave it two slaps. Back to Cooking with Miranda on Channel 5. The janitor turned, a vulture-looking fellow. One that even after coming here for six years, I had never gotten to learn the name of. He tapped the floor with his broom. You three again, he sniffed. Didn't you see the news? Where's your mom's? None of your business, I said. Fuck if I care, then. He waved with that I-don't-get-paid-enough attitude, retreating to his nest in the back. All to my sides were the possessed washing machines, shaking along the white tiles, possessed with fury. This was just another Saturday, spending an overcast morning with an arcade machine and yawning old ladies in the buzzing of laundry. I sat down next to Stephen, reaching down into my pocket, past a firework, more on that later, and deep in a pool of quarters. One down the hatch, two, three. I must have spent an hour sitting there, with Henry eating to my side. I threw my head back, slapping one of the joysticks around. My laundry had been done twenty minutes ago. You always pick Blanca, holy fuck, I said. And you always lose, Al, Stephen said. My turn, my turn. Henry poked his head between us. My stool wobbled. You don't even have any quarters, I said. One more. You want to keep losing? Stephen smiled. He was my age, thirteen, and of my sensibility. At least I'd like to think. Stephen was the type of guy who always wanted five dollars if I had four. Who wanted two bags of chips if I had one who wanted twice as many games and twice as many friends as me. And to be honest, I was like that too. So naturally, we gravitated towards each other. And naturally, we hated each other too. Tell him it's my turn, Steve. Henry looked to Stephen, pouting. Just wait one out, Henry. Stephen licked his lips and leaned into the screen. Yeah, one more. I pressed down on the buttons, almost punching them with the side of my fist. Come on, Henry said. Shut up, we both said with our bodies inches away from the screen. The tension of gears and metallic and plastic creaking as the joysticks went every which way, the laundry spinning and groaning with a bin full of clothes, a janitor moving up and down the aisles with lethargy, just to punch the side of an air conditioner rattling and blowing hot air. Old mother's gossiping dogs barking, muted car honks between the windows along the building. It should have been a normal Saturday. Fuck this, I leaned back. This is boring. Oh, now it's boring, Stephen turned to Henry. We do play the same thing every day, I said. Play the same game, laugh at the same jokes, act the same way. It's not my turn yet, Henry moaned, stuffing his face with a fistful of chips hands bright orange. I'm tired of this, I said. He says he's tired of this, Stephen laughed to himself. Yeah, and what? And what? I mean, if you're bored, then suggest something, Stephen said. What about my turn? Henry chewed. I looked around and tucked my head and reached into my pockets, fondling for the fuse, finding it, taking it out and presenting it long and flat on the painted plastic of the joystick. Ta-da, I said. Poof. What's that? Henry asked, grabbing his bag of chips, opening them up and finishing the dust settled at the bottom corners. It's a firework, I swallowed. An M-80. Aren't those illegal? Stephen asked. So? And although they were, he looked pretty happy about it. Stephen grabbed the firework and spun it in his hands. It's like TNT, I said a doorman salesman with his pitch. It'll wake up the whole neighborhood. Sick, Stephen said. Where'd you get it from? My uncle brought it back from Mexico. Stephen passed it to Henry, who passed it back to me as quickly as he had gotten it. Let's pop him, I said. I've got three. I don't think we should, Henry said. If it were up to you, we'd all be in giant bubbles eating cookies until we got fat. I said. Live a little, Henry. Henry didn't want to even stand. He just stood in place, looking at us with shifty eyes and pouty lips, mumbling words and warnings. 
Stephen grabbed him by one wrist and me by the other. It'll be fun, trust me, I said. We did not go far. We left the clothes back in the laundromat and traveled some ten minutes out into the street, on Bleecker, near the factories. The skies always looked grayer around that part, and they were particularly empty this day, all save an old man by his porch washing yellow, dried grass with his hose. He was in his underwear, and looked like he was supposed to have died a decade ago. We sat along a sidewalk, my feet in the sewer drains, watching Stephen stalk the sidewalk. Oh shit, he's gonna do it, I said. Stephen put his foot against the chain-link fence and walked up to a gnome by the side of a winding walkway. Stephen huddled over his firework and cursed and shook a lighter in the air. Is he doing it? Henry asked. Stephen went silent. It was hissing in the air. Oh shit, he said in a voice loud enough that attracted big German shepherds in the back of the house. They came running, jumping over a wooden fence. Stephen ran, jumped got his shirt chewed on and ripped as he tucked. The dog chewed on his clothes as he fumbled towards us, laughing. And then, like siege fire, a boom. Sparks flying in the air. The whimper of the hound as it ran away, back to its doghouse. Something in the air came flying. I ducked with my hands over my head and closed my eyes. Holy shit, Stephen said. My head came up slowly as I looked to my rear. Smoking in the middle of the street was half the face of a ceramic gnome, burned, scarred black along its once cherub cheeks. I looked to Henry, who stared with wide eyes at the gnome. I turned towards the whimpering dog. I turned towards the older man who had fallen, spraying water all over himself. He flailed in his own water, too slick to stand on his palm. Fucking sick, I said. Henry jumped in the air, screaming something at me. Did you see that fucker blow up? Stephen said. One more, one more, Henry said. All right, but you're lighting it. Uh, Oh, Henry went, tight-lipped. Never mind then. Come on, Henry, all of us are doing one. He hesitated, looking at the firework, then breathing heavily. With a sigh, he grabbed one and ran across the street. He stood, looking down the street, a car coming, passing him. What is he doing? I asked. Oh no, Stephen laughed. In front of Henry, a blue mailbox hunched over, bent and with a letter half vomited out of its mouth. Henry walked over to it, crouched and looked about. He opened the gray hatch and looked inside. Nothing. He lit it. He looked at it. Surprised that it was in his hand. Then he chunked it straight in. The hatch closed with a screech of its scratching metal. Henry dove into the grass, crawling underneath a small hedge. I swear it flew into the air five feet, papers scrambling everywhere. They came over us like feathers, burned at their edges. What the fuck are you kids doing? The man with the hose ran up to his fence, lifting his fat leg or at least trying to. The hose spun sporadically in the floor, twirling with water. Oh shit, I said. Come over here, you fucking punks. We ran. The mailbox busted open at the top, smoke coming out of its little hole. It lay crooked on the side of the road as I jumped over it and into the streets further. We didn't even know where we were going. Like kids do, we just kind of laughed and ran in full strides, turning corners wherever it was convenient, laughing and clapping at the moment. Even Henry, scaredy cat that he was. I stopped, holding my knees with my palms as I hunched over and breathed. I looked up to the sign post at the corner. There was no name to the cul-de-sac we'd landed into. It was just white weathered lettering, an R and an A, but nothing else to give the street definition. I looked around. Most of the windows were broken, some boarded up with wood, graffiti to the side of a yellow, jaundiced-looking house. Henry and Stephen looked around the corner, still giggling. I scratched the back of my neck, and a chill came up my spine. All right, all right, we're done, I said. Both of them turned to me, tightened face as if offended. 
No, 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 you're still left, Stephen said. Yeah, that's not fair, pussy, Henry said. What'd you call me? I narrowed my eyes and walked up to him. He's right, Stephen stepped up and grabbed an M80 from my pocket. Raising it in the air, you're left. I need to get back, pick up my laundry before my mom gets mad, I said. You're the one who wanted to do this, weren't you? Stephen asked, turning my head around the space, seeing the curly cues bent and rusted with brown. I could not help but feel a small tremble in my hands. It doesn't feel safe here, I said. He doesn't feel safe, Henry. Stephen rolled his eyes. I felt hot, a wave of heat coming out from my chest and up to my cheeks. Fine then. I snatched the firework from Stephen. I'll do it here then. I turned a complete circle. Where was here? Only a couple blocks away from the laundromat, but where? Where was this nowhere land? Even now, I still don't remember. I only recall the dead look of the area. A sort of dark, worn grayness in the gravel passing as asphalt, a serpentine design to the cracked roads. Shingles fell to the house next to me. Paint chips followed in big clumps that popped against the floor like hail. A broken rocking horse lay in overgrown grass. It glared at me with brown eyes. This was a street so silent and warped and ruined that it looked as if in moments of collapse. It was like the nightmare land of a dreamer, and the dreamer was waking up. Is anyone here? I looked over my shoulders. Were those passing eyes in the glass? Who cares who's here? Stephen raised his hands. You sure? I asked. My teeth clattered. I looked left and right. Henry was starting to feel it too, hiding behind Stephen as he did. Hurry up, I want to leave, Henry said. Not you too. Stephen pulled his arm away from Henry. I leaned down to place the firework, somewhere on the sidewalk. No, no, Stephen said. I put mine in someone's house. Henry put his in a mailbox. You gotta do something cool, too. All right. What do you want me to do, then? Stephen scratched his chin, a look of absolute concentration. Lips tightened, hand on his chin where he picked at the few strands of beard growing. Henry walked up behind him, arms folded as if cold. But it was a warm day. How about under that van? He pointed down towards the center of the cul-de-sac. A lone white van without a license plate, without design, with blinders on its black-tinted windows. Neat looking, too clean for the street. I turned the M80 in my hand and then looked back at the two. I'll blow it up, I said. That's the point, right? Stephen laughed. I'm not doing that. Pussy. I'm not doing that. Loser? No, I said. I'm not. I'm not. Then why the fuck did you even bring those fireworks? Stephen tilted his head. I went tight-lipped, sucking in my cheeks. Truth struck me hard. It felt like a piece of glass edged its way into my chest cavity. Something that drained the pride out of me. I looked down at the M80. Fine. Okay. I walked up to the van out to its black-tinted windows. Curious. I couldn't see a thing, so I knelt down towards the wheels where I eyed the perfect spot to put the firework, right behind the front tire. I pulled grime off the sidewalk with my feet, a combination of a Lucky Star Burger plastic wrapper and dirt and decayed leaves that caked and broke at my touch. Brown goop seeped out of the clusters. It made me gag. I flung the stuff to the side and planted the M80 tall behind the wheel amongst cigarette butts. Got my lighter, flicked the flint, observed the flame as it licked the air, and the van suspension dropped. I looked up to the window, a shifting shadow. There's someone in here. I mouthed the words. No noise came out. A door opened, my heart raced. I looked back and forth and back and forth. Sweat beads rolled down my face and my chest hurt. Just do it, pussy, Stephen screamed, 
I heard the person behind the van groan and mumble. I lit the firework and turned to run, then I squeaked, curled, and turned. A black spotted arm grabbed my wrist, something crooked and long and bony, something beyond the burning fuse. What's wrong? Stephen asked, coming forward. I pulled, and the arm pulled back. I kicked, and it dragged me closer, pulling my cheek into the textured wheel. Let go, I said. No oh, shit, Stephen started to turn to run. Henry was already crying. The fuse kept going, moments away from the explosion. So I reached forward to his black-spotted finger and bit hard, hard enough to feel the grit of bone hurt my front teeth. The man made no noise. Nothing save a small chuckle. The hand let go. I sprawled and tripped and kicked away, back to the sidewalk. The M80 went off. With such a concussion that my ears went deaf, and though I opened my mouth and I was not sure I was screaming, no voice was discernible. It was one note of static beep. I ran, hearing coming back to me as if lifting my head through a water surface. I stopped at the corner and turned, mouth agape in awe. The van lit up and its alarm system blasted in bright, beeping anger, yellow monster eyes flashing. And in front, hunched over, though still very tall, I saw him. A white-garbed man perhaps painter or carpenter or priest or asylum runaway, crooked looking, taking off his cap to observe his car. He turned, a giant black blotch across his chin and neck, the spot the devil must have touched him, the Dalmatian man. He looked at me and me at him, and he smiled and waved, which at the time I believed to be a goodbye and that now, I wish it was. I spread the pleated window curtains with my fingers and peeked outside to the front of the house. You're still worried about him? Stephen asked. You didn't see him? Eyes scanning across the empty streets. You wouldn't be scared unless you saw him. What about you, Henry? What do you think? I, I don't know. I got scared when Al got scared. Henry wasn't even looking. He carried his head with one hand and flipped through manga pages with his other. A copy of Berserker in black leather that from the window looked like a demonic tome. A Necronomicon. A satanic bible. I went over and took it and put it back on my library, tossed somewhere in the mess of papers and figures. It was a messy room, the floor covered with blankets and an air mattress and pillows. The oak tables were pushed in, closer to the center and stacked with VCR tapes, my Super Nintendo, tube televisions. It looked like a NASA station, just a mess of techno gizmos and papers and tried workers glowing with the screen glare of television monitors. I, I was reading that. Henry's face dropped. This is serious, I said. You should have seen him. Was he mad? Stephen asked. No. Does he know who you are? How could he? Then what's the problem? Stephen said. I don't know, but I just know there's a problem. Who cares? Stephen leaned back on my bed. He looked over to the television where some rerun played and where static cut the screen straight in half. It was my taping of Cowboy Bebop. A crackle of black and white discoloration on the bottom half came up. Stephen made a sound like a leech suckle and leaned over and slapped it on its side. It was fixed, but the sound went off. A fan blew quietly overhead. My curtains rattled with the gust. If he didn't want to get scared, he shouldn't have bombed his van, dude, Stephen said. You guys made me. How do we make you do that? Stephen asked. You're the one who brought out fireworks in the first place. Yeah, Al, Henry said. Shut up, Henry. You shut up. Don't get mad at him just because you're scared. Stephen cut between us, torso leaning down from the top of the bed. I'm not scared. Then why'd you ask us to sleep over? Uh, my mom isn't home. I, I thought we could just chill out. Chill out, he says. Stephen turned to Henry. He just didn't want to be alone. 
If you don't want to be here, you can just leave. Well, all right by me. Stephen opened the door. He went halfway out into the dark hall. I fidgeted in place, watching as Henry stood and wiped his sniffle and started out to follow Stephen. I bit my lips. Outside, a branch hit against the stucco walls. Cats hissed, two of them fighting in the alley below. My wooden table creaked, a notch or nail popping under its aged legs. The television sounded warped, the anime almost demonic in its creepy sound. Okay, okay. I ran past them in the hall, putting my hands across to block the hall. A picture of my mother slanted off its nail. She'd fix it after graveyard shift. What? Stephen smiled. I'm scared. My legs shook. Uh, come on, just this night. All right, but we want pizza. Don't we, Henry? Uh, yeah, yeah, pizza. Henry's eyes grew. With pineapple. Gross, Stephen said. I closed my eyes and sighed. I looked into my pocket for money I knew didn't exist. And I knew I'd have to steal some from the emergency fund. And I knew I would get yelled at. And I knew I would do it anyway. Anything to not be alone. Anything to just distract myself from the idle sounds of the apartment. The first few hours of the night, up until midnight, were the easiest. Hearing the noises of animated people around me distracted my attention. Because if I wasn't distracted, I'd go up to the sofa and peel the curtains and look outside. I just wanted people and noises. Hearing my neighbors scream and bang the walls so hard the picture frames fell, hearing the honks of cars on the main streets below me, hearing those two idiot friends laughing. All of it was comforting in its annoying way. Around ten at night, there was a knock on the door. I stood on my chair, feeling the top of a kitchen cabinet for the secret stash, a little aluminum cookie box where my mother kept her money. Another knock, harsher. What's that? I screamed out. Pizza guy. Stephen walked into the kitchen, leaning against the wall. You go get it. Really, dude? Really? I held a twenty out. My hand quivered. He rolled his eyes and plucked the bill and went out of the kitchen, into the living room and into the small foyer. The door opened and then slammed. I looked outside through the window, eyes wandering to the parking lot. A white van. My body went cold. Was that the same van? The same person? Uh, Henry? Uh, Stephen? I kept my hand on the curtains, keeping them peeled, keeping the van within the view of a small opening. Uh, Stephen, I said. No word. The lights went out. Uh, Stephen? My eyes blinked to the sudden darkness. I looked back and forth between the window and the entrance to the kitchen. I let go of the curtains, wandering, touched the walls with my fingertips, took apprehensive steps. I hit my toaster and knocked it over. Fuck. I went stiff, breathing heavily and loud. My heart hammered in my chest, my fingers growing numb and pulsing. Henry? H Hello? Hello? I turned the corner, reaching my hand for the spot I remember the light switch to be on. The cold touch of plastic and something else. Flesh. A grip that closed on my index finger. Fuck! I fell, scrambled, dragging myself back until I hit the table and then hugged the legs. The lights turned on. Stephen stood there, pizza in one hand and the light switch with his other, grin on his face. Smug and wide. You fucking asshole. I slapped the tile floor with my palm. You fucking asshole. Did I get you? Stephen asked. Henry walked in, cookie in his mouth. He chewed loud. Why is he on the floor? Henry asked. You're not right in the head. You know that. I could have been killed. Who would have killed you? And for what? He laid the pizza flat, sat with folded legs, and ate. Mondo's Pizza Parlor printed in red against the white box. My favorite pizza. That to me tasted absolutely dull and lifeless. 
pulled out a chair and sat, taking small nibbles. The strings of cheese dangled out of Henry's mouth. Stephen sat with folded legs, eating the cups of pepperoni first. The grease left his mouth yellow. Chill. Eat, Stephen said. My eyes looked up, glaring at him. He gave me a wary look then turned towards the television on the kitchen countertop. All I could take were nibbles. Every now and then I'd drift off into the window and look outside to the parking lots and alleys, half expecting the van to be there still, but it was gone. And what did I prefer? That I'd have it there, visible and held to my observation? Or that it would be out somewhere, unknown? It wasn't like I was sure it was the same van. A fair distance below and away, it could have been any other van. I'd only seen it from the top. But there was a strangeness to the way it would make me feel. The way that just one look at its sterile, bleached white surface made my neck hairs rise. The way how, when I sat on a sofa to watch television, the air felt cold and uncomfortable. The way all the laughter and the conversation slipped past me. Henry snapped his fingers in front of my face. It's late, he said. Let's go. I swallowed, though my mouth was dry. We went to sleep, both of them on an air mattress in my room and me on the single bed with the black and red squared blanket, eyes wide open and staring up to a ceiling fan, blowing warm air down at me. I felt thirsty around midnight and stepped gently on the floor, tiptoeing and arching my legs over my friends. I closed the door, still hearing Henry snoring through the wood. I went down the hall towards the living room, hand out to feel for the furniture in the blind darkness. There was no moon and the streetlights were far enough that their yellow glow did not reach. I came to the living room, looking out to the foyer where a single light shone. They must have left it on for the delivery man. I pulled down on the cord. My arm hairs rose. A cool draft came over me in the darkness. There was a small gap in the door. The air breezed through. I closed it and locked it, and stared through the eye peep. Nothing, right? A small mistake. I walked to the kitchen and took a glass and started filling it, finishing it in one giant gulp before going in for another. Back to the living room, I stood still. My head tilted to the side. Were the cabinets moved slightly? The table just angled a little differently than how we'd left them? Footsteps in the hall. I turned sharply, eyes wide, though I couldn't have seen much. Who's there? I asked. It's me, dude, Henry said. Forgot my retainers. He wandered and went back to his room and the door closed. I needed to lock down this whole house. I went behind the television where I always hide my keys and gripped them hard. First locking my mother's room, then locking the office, and finally the bathroom. I clenched the keys close to my chest and walked back into my room, around my two friends, who still snored, and laying down flat on my bed. I spent two hours awake every so often looking out the window towards the outside. The clock read 2.15 a.m. I turned it over and laid on my side until my arm went numb, still holding the keys in my grip. Stephen rose. I knew it was him. Henry was still snoring, after all. He walked out, yawned, loud, sucked footsteps going down the hall and around the corner. A doorknob turned. What the fuck? He said. The voice echoed. It's locked, man. Uh, Right. Shit, you need the key. I fumbled out of bed and started walking down, stepping over Henry who grumbled. You need the key. You need the key. I'm sorry. With a fast pace, almost sliding across the floorboard. What's wrong with you, man? Stephen asked, still turning the knob like it had unlocked itself with enough stubbornness. I went through the key ring, flipped through each one and finding the small one, taking it out from the others. He snorted and looked at me with puffed eyes. 
If you didn't want this, you should have never played that stupid game. You know that, he said. I know. I handed him the key. Everyone will laugh at you at school if they saw you like this. Steven said. You're afraid of a painter. A, a painter? I don't care. I know he's here. I saw his van outside earlier. You what? He shook his head and unlocked the door. I saw his van outside. I swear, I said. Behind the door, the toilet bowl splattered and a coke-fueled torrent of piss roared. There's like a hundred white vans in this city. And you know for a fact you saw his, he asked. The piss pittered off into a few drops. I put my head against the wall. It hurt. My eyes hurt. My chest hurt. Yeah. I tapped against the wall with my skull. Yeah, yeah, I know. It sounds fucked, but it's true. Stephen walked out, face drooped and bitter looking. It doesn't sound fucked, Stephen said. It sounds like you're insane. I looked up, hostile eyes staring at him and narrowing. Just give me the key. I held my palm out. Am I a prisoner or something? Give me the key, I said. He clenched his jaw and tucked it into his lip, making a puckering sound like a small pop. All right, that's it. I'm calling my mom to pick me up. Fine, I said. Just give me the key. Here's your fucking key, man. He dropped it on the floor and went for the living room. I went to my room, went to my bed, feeling the heat rise up in my cheeks. Your fucking phone doesn't work, dude. I heard Steven scream in the living room. Keep trying, then. I went over to the bed and pawed the mattress, feeling for the keys to the blanket or the sound of the rattle. Odd. Nothing. The keys weren't there. It's cut, dude. I don't hear anything but a beep. Steven screamed again. I heard him slam the receiver down, then lift it just to slam it down again. I kept palming, kept looking. Stephen walked down the hall holding the phone. The cord is cut, dude, look. He stopped in the doorframe. I turned back briefly to him. Stephen went statue-like. What? I looked back to the mattress, turning over the blankets and the mattress. The air carried a cold touch. Henry rustled in his sheets. The curtains fluttered but the windows were closed. Stephen mumbled words, inanities. I turned back to him, still red in the face. The fuck's your problem? I asked. Did you break my phone or something, man? He wasn't even looking at me. His eyes were just wide and looking past me into the corner of the room. What? I asked. He lifted his finger, and I turned around. He was hard to discern in the dark. It was like staring at a textured shadow, something warping darkness itself. I could not notice it at first, yet could not look away. And as my eyes widened, as I stepped back, tripping over the mattress, I saw it blink. One eye blinked, the other delayed. Hi, the Dalmatian man said. I ran out. Henry rose from his bed slightly, rubbing his eyes. Stephen went down the hall. Both of us closed the bathroom door and locked it. We retreated to the corner. The bathroom key shook in my grip. The phone shook in Stephen's. Can he get in? Stephen asked. No. I raised the key to him. I don't. The doorknob turned and we screamed. It turned and turned. A slam at the wood. It felt like the whole house quaked. We screamed passed beyond the point where the turning stopped. We stopped, and at that brief moment heard Henry. A stifened scream, and it short, somehow or some way. We gotta get out of here, man. Stephen reached for the door. I held him back. No, no, no. He's out there with him. He kept going for the doorknob, and I pushed him away. Into the toilet, wrestling against the sink, into the tub. The water faucet ran. Footsteps went back and forth in the hall, and we both screamed. We can't go out there, I said. We can't. He'll, he'll get us too. 
Do you even hear yourself? Stephen asked. Henry's out there. He's gone. Stephen looked at me in the door. His face tightened, jumping at each turn of the knob. The phone lay on its side next to the running faucet. He's gone. I sat down in the toilet seat. He's gone. He's gone. For a while, we bashed our fists against the wall. We screamed. We hoped someone would hear. No one ever did. Even with all the windows open, the futility of it, after the first few hours, was enough to have a stop for the rest of the night. We sat in that seat until my mother came home. She opened the door on both of us, eyes red and cheeks swollen. It was harder talking to the police later that day. My throat hurt from the strain and each word was interrupted with a cough or a wheeze. But the words came out eventually. The first couple of officers multiplied within ten minutes. And within the hour after dawn break, there was a small search executed for Henry J. Matthews. They never found him. And I can never look his mother in the eye and tell her what had happened. I think that was the first day I became truly alone. I don't remember having friends after that day. No one spoke to me, and I spoke to no one. A few months later, I left for Boston. My mother thought the transfer would be good for me, sent me with my father. Nothing changed. Nothing ever did. Nothing ever changes. I remember and remember and think, maybe in the details, that I'll find a clue. I've spent four years learning criminal science, studying psychology myself in the hopes that I'll figure something out. Something, perhaps, about the character of the Dalmatian man or about myself. But any freedom from my guilt has already tanked and capsized. It's so deep in the ocean that is me that I don't think I'll ever have it. I probably never could. Solace. Salvation. It's there at the bottom, idling and rusting, but at least I know it's there. I wish I could say I knew where Henry was. Okay, so this might be a long story, but I feel like people need to hear this. They need to know this. This is cult-related, specifically the Heaven's Gate cult. If you think the name sounds familiar, it's because a few years ago, in 1997, following an anonymous tip, myself, along with my fellow officers, entered a mansion in Rancho Santa Fe, an exclusive suburb of San Diego, California, and discovered 39 victims of an apparent mass suicide. The deceased... 21 women and 18 men of varying ages were all found lying peacefully in matching dark clothes and Nike sneakers and had no noticeable signs of blood or trauma. They had all in- they had all ingested a lethal mixture of phenobarbital and vodka and then laid down to die, hoping to leave their bodily containers and enter an alien spacecraft and pass through Heaven's Gates into a higher existence. However, more disturbing is what they found in the basement. The decomposing body of a teen girl. A small leather journal in her arms. The diary began as a private expression of her thoughts. She wrote several times that she would never allow anyone to read it. That she kept it hidden in a broken part of the wall in her basement. She candidly described her life her family and companions and her situation. But towards the end, one page caught my eye. If you're reading this, I'm probably dead. This is where I'll start reading. March 1997. If you're reading this, I'm probably dead. After reviewing the cult and taking over as leader, my father decided to follow in the footsteps of the original leader of Heaven's Gate, Marshall Herf Applewhite Jr., and help all his loyal followers into the next level of life. Up until now, I've managed to deal with all the meetings and bizarre beliefs, but 
It wasn't until a couple of days ago when my father informed me that he, along with the 27 members of our group, had been chosen to join the mighty Luciferians on their spaceship. I rolled my eyes. This was all just a bunch of bullcrap to me and continued going along with what he'd said. He explained that in order to join them, we were all to participate in a coordinated series of ritual suicides in order to reach the extraterrestrial spacecraft. And my heart must have skipped a beat, fearing the implication. Wait, are you talking about killing ourselves? I questioned, trying desperately to keep myself together. Don't you see, Leah? He shouts, his eyes growing bigger and brighter. Our bodies are merely vessels to help us along the journey. And when the comet crosses by Earth, we will ascend to it, to the next level. I stared at him with a horrific expression across my face. I knew my father was, well, to put it politely, eccentric, but I never realized he was psychotic. I stared into his dark eyes, waiting for him to say, just kidding, or... I got you, but he never did. He just kept on staring at me with those dark, cold eyes. The devil's eyes. When are you planning on doing this? I stutter, my anxiety building up more and more. Thursday, he replies blankly. I gasped so loud every head in the room turned to face me. But that's less than a week away, I... He cut me off. I know, so soon, he exclaims, his head practically exploding with excitement. Dad, I don't want to die. Not yet, I cry, quickly wiping a lone tear from my cheek. He sat up and placed his hand upon my shoulder. Leah, you're going to live again. As a Luciferian, he explains. I had enough of this by now. I didn't understand how someone could be so stupid. This is so clueless. I jumped to my feet and began screaming into his face. No, Dad. Don't you get it? There is no spacecraft on that comet. You'll be killing yourself for nothing. Don't sass me. He growls, slamming his fist against the coffee table. Chills were sent running through my body and I immediately snapped back to reality. I'm sorry, sir, I said, stiffened my spine so that I was standing with my shoulders back. We're all going as a team, Leah, and when you board the ship, and you will, you'll thank me, he scolds. Before I could even think about responding, he was already speaking again. Now, go to your room. I don't want to see you again for the rest of the night. He demands. I mounted up all the courage I had left and took a deep breath. No, I blurted out, instantly wishing I could take it back. He spun around to face me, and before I could run, two sets of hands curled around my forearms. Mage, Ezekiel, take her to the cellar, my father says, turning around to face the rest of the group. They nodded before beginning to drag me backwards out of the living room. No, no, stop! I scream, frantically trying to escape. I'm sorry. I'll go to my room. I felt a sharp pain in my neck, and suddenly my eyelids felt as if they weighed a million pounds. I fought to keep my eyes open, and I found that I could no longer control my limbs. My whole body felt numb and dead. Despite my best efforts to keep myself awake, my eyes snapped shut, and I was out. I awoke to a sharp, stabbing pain shivering up and down my entire spine. I blinked my eyes open to see that I was not in the same place I was in before. I was chained to a metal table, my hair stuck to my sweaty face, irritating my skin. My clothes had been completely removed except for my undergarments. Heaven's Gate, all of them, surrounding me completely, except it wasn't them. Don't get me wrong, it, it was them, but they looked different. There were thick black circles around each of their eyes, 
and they all looked as if they were stuck in a zombie-like state. Dad, what's going on? I shudder, my heartbeat increasing with every breath I took. Leah, sweetie, he says, clasping his hand to my left cheek gingerly. You're a good girl. He removed my hand from my face, using it to reach into the back pocket of his robe. My heart dropped all the way to my stomach as he pulled a sharp silver butcher's knife. That's what I know you'll understand when I have to do this, he exclaims. He took a few steps to me. No, no, wait, I, I don't understand. I stutter, frantically trying to stall my father as long as I could. He didn't respond, but instead began muttering something under his breath. Blood of a damsel, he whispers. His voice gets louder and louder until he is practically shouting. He handed the knife to one of the members who didn't seem to hesitate to start butchering me up. Without any warning, he drove the tip of the knife straight into my stomach, just the surface. My back arched up, and vomit exploded from my mouth. I screamed in pain as he continued forcing the blade through my stomach, carving a shape into my belly. I'm your daughter! I scream, tears streaming down my face. He didn't budge. I clenched my eyes shut as the knife continued to carve up my belly. Blood began pouring out uncontrollably. It leaked down my legs and spilled out onto the ground. Suddenly, they began chanting. All hail the Luciferians. All hail the Luciferians. Over and over they chanted until my ears felt like they were going to start bleeding. One by one they began dipping their hands in my blood intensifying the pain by 100%. All hail the Luciferians. All hail the Luciferians. Their voice faded completely. I could no longer hear. Then my vision depleted. It was all turning into nothing. One by one, I was turning into nothing. My heart slowed and I no longer felt the need to breathe. My eyes rolled up before closing one last time. I sat up, gasping. Dried blood coated my abdomen and legs as my stomach was extremely swelled and bruised. Blood was trickling out, mixed with blood that was already dried. Piece by piece, the contents of the night came flooding back. A fleet of questions filled my mind. Uh, how am I alive? Where is everybody? Why am I no longer restrained? Wait, I'm no longer restrained. I quickly looked down to my feet that were, along with my hands, no longer bound. They must have assumed I was dead, thereby no longer a threat. At that moment, I decided I was in control of my fate. Not God, not my father, only myself. I mounted up all my courage and energy I had left in my body and stood up, jumping to the ground. I aimed to land on my feet, but fatigue wouldn't allow. I landed flat on my knees, sending waves of indescribable pain through my entire stomach. I sat there for a minute, clutching my aching belly. I never knew something could hurt so much. It felt worse than the time I had fallen off my bike and broken four bones. A distant door slamming snapped me back to reality. I regained just enough strength to continue. I crawled to the staircase and pulled myself to my feet. I felt unbelievably weak. I'm not going to die today, I mutter, slowly pulling myself up towards the door. Once I reached the top, I wrapped my hand around the knob and twisted with all my might. It took all my strength just to turn it a few inches. I heard a small click and my heart filled with joy. I turned the knob once more and I pushed the door open. I was immediately flushed with light, almost blinding me. I peered around the seemingly empty room before making a break for the door. As soon as I stepped out, shouting erupted from the left of me. Get her! One shouts. I had to think quickly. The front door was too far. There's no way I'd make it before they get to me. In desperation, I turned to the stairs and sprinted upwards. 
I had this sudden adrenaline rush, which allowed me to race to the upstairs hall at an ungodly speed. I burst into my room and ran to the window. I was two stories up. Under normal circumstances, I could probably make it and be perfectly fine. But now, anything could happen. I had one leg out by the time the door to my room exploded open. And out of desperation, I threw myself out. There are no words to describe the fear I was feeling. My stomach seemed to float all the way up to my chest and my heart was throbbing. All the air was knocked from my back as my back slammed hard against the concrete floor. As I regained my breath, all I could hear was ringing. I held my hand up to my ear and snapped as loud as I could about twenty times. To my horror, I could hear nothing. I attempted to stand, but was unable to regain my feet. It's too much. Sick and weak and tired. Oh, so tired. I had no fight left in me. My stomach throbbed and now my back ached with pain. Help! I cried out, hoping to stop a bystander. I looked up to see a uniformed man walking across the sidewalk with a bag across his shoulder. Please, I say. I attempted to yell, but since I couldn't hear, I didn't know whether I was speaking loud enough. Help! I stuttered again, hoping I had made my voice louder this time. To my complete and utter joy, the man's neck snapped around and he stared at me. He threw his bag down to the ground and ran to me, sweeping me up in his arms. There was a loud pop and his voice filled my ears, causing me to practically jump out of my skin. What's your name? He ponders. My head lolled back to face him. Uh, uh, Leah Dawson. I need to go to the hospital. I plead. Okay, Leah, he says blankly. He began walking. I expected him to start towards town, but no. He seemed to be walking in the direction of my house. Uh, where are you going? I stutter. Why are you trying to fight your destiny? The man asked. My heart sank. Uh, what? I questioned. He didn't respond to my question, but... Instead, just quietly rambled to himself. It all sounded like gibberish except for one word. Luciferian. My stomach dropped as I realized what was going on. Let me down. I I'm fine. I cry, trying to escape the man's arms. He ignored my desire and continued trudging down the stone path that led to my house with a blank, zombie-like expression on his face. That's basically it. I'm back in the basement now, chained to the water heater. It's quiet upstairs. I've lost track of time. The days seem to go on forever. I'm so hungry. I, I just want it all to end. Anyway, I have to go now. I can barely keep my eyes open. This is a story of something that happened to me and will forever haunt me. I'm 14 years old and I live in South Africa, which is a place where crime is very common. Occasionally I hear gunshots outside my house, but that is something that's normal here as well. I live in a big house with security cameras everywhere and motion detectors. My family's house has two gates, just as a safety precaution. Power outages are also normal in South Africa because of our corrupt government. Anyway, I was sitting and eating dinner with my family when my brother asked me, Hey, did you hear that? I replied, no. He went on to say that he heard something break outside on our patio, like a wine bottle or something. Since I'm not paranoid like him, I finished eating and went to go study for my exam and sat on the couch in my living room. My parents announced that they were going to the gym, as they did on Saturday nights. So I said goodbye to them and carried on working. As I was working, I heard a crash from outside, near the patio, like my brother said. What happened next sends shivers down my spine to this day. My brother walked into the living room looking panicked. I've never seen him so scared in my life before. 
He sat down next to me and stared at me for about ten seconds with a look of complete and utter fear. His eyes wide open. Uh, What's wrong? I stuttered. Upstairs, now! He exclaimed while grabbing my arm viciously. What the hell is going on? I asked once we were upstairs. He didn't answer. He just started winding the shutter down. The shutter is a large door that connects the downstairs to the upstairs. We're only supposed to use the shutter during emergencies, as it is made of a strong metal that is hard for an intruder to break through. He then ushered me to his room, the third story of our house which overlooks our garden and patio. Putting a single finger over his mouth to shush me, he pointed to what looked like a dark figure by our patio. At first it looked like a long shrub, but as I adjusted and focused my eyes, I had to stop myself from shrieking. The realization made my bones feel like lead and my blood feel colder than ice. A man holding a broken wine bottle was pacing around our patio. He looked about five foot nine with a shaggy beard. That's not what scared me the most about him. His eyes were wide open and he was smiling. A smile so sinister and crazy, he looked as if he'd just been let out of a mental institution. Uh, Who is he? I started saying. Big mistake. The man turned to us and looked directly into my eyes with that same agonizing, crazed look that gave me goosebumps. He then started to run. A slow, staggering run that made him look injured. Towards the door to the inside of the house he went, and I was sure he was coming for us. I was so shaken up I I could hardly breathe, and so was my brother. And without a word, he took my hand and we headed to my room on the second floor. Since I'm his little sister, he always considered me his responsibility. So he held my hand and told me everything was going to be okay, even though I knew inside me that it wasn't. Just then, we heard slow clapping footsteps coming up the stairs. The shutter was closed, so he wouldn't be able to get to us. Just then, at just the right time, the power cut out leaving my brother and I in darkness, but my brother stumbled around and closed my door, locking it. He then explained to me that without the power, the shutters can be easily pried open. I thought for sure that my life was going to end soon. Just then I heard an excruciating sound that sounded like the shutters being forced open, and I headed for my drawer to get my hunting knife that I had received as a birthday gift. In my right hand I clutched my knife, and in the other... I held my brother's hand. Suddenly, the sound of the shutters opening stopped. What replaced it was the sound of something metal, presumably a knife, scraping up against my bedroom door. We sat there, shaking, not knowing what to do. When I asked my brother if he had his phone on him, he stated that he already called 112, which is our 911, but we both knew that the 112 squad would take a long time to come since here in South Africa, they usually hang out at McDonald's instead of coming for their duties. The scraping at the door continued for what seemed like ages. Seconds felt like minutes, and then my brother made me hide in my cupboard and hand him my hunting knife. With my heart racing and palms sweating, I heard the sound of police vehicles outside, and my brother used the gate remote to open up for them. They rushed in and captured the man, The police told us the man had been on the run from the local asylum for the past three months and had been charged for manslaughter two times before he was sent to the local asylum. If my brother hadn't been there to help me, God knows what would have happened to me. I hope the man is recovering and that he is getting all the help he needs. Sometimes, in my nightmares, I still hear the sound of the knife scraping against my door. Fantasy 22 here. Before we begin, be warned that this story is not for the faint of heart or the weak stomached. There are some very disturbing scenes depicted throughout this story, the most gruesome being at the very beginning involving an infant. So if you are not one for this type of horror, that is alright. A new 
game or video will be coming soon. But for those who stick around after this warning and then complain to me about the video's content, I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, on to the story. Just the cutest, my grandmother exclaimed in a bubbly tone as she booped the baby's nose. My aunt had just given birth, a baby boy. He squirmed around on the table, his back rubbing against the soft blanket. He swirled his tongue around, his eyes full of wonder as they darted around. My whole family loomed above him. My aunt, June, looked down at him with proud eyes. Her husband, my uncle, Luke, almost shed a tear. My grandma, Mary, had this smile on her face, almost devilish. My grandpa, Danny, right next to her, like two peas in a pod. My mother stood next to me, her hands on my shoulders, my father standing behind her. I watched uncomfortably as they rubbed their hands across all the baby's body, admiring his soft skin. My throat slowly started nodding up. I jumped in my seat, my eyes twitching as my grandma raised up a shining blade and swung it down into the child's face. My neck cranked at the feeling of blood splashing against my cheek. The knife went completely through its head. The tip of the blade pressed into the wooden table. My grandma pulled the knife out, blood dripping off. I looked around at everyone. They were drooling over its corpse. My grandma slowly slid her tongue against the blade, licking off a sliver of blood. She pulled her tongue back into her mouth, her eyes rolling into the back of her head. Sweet youth, she moaned, a grin on her face. Dig in, my aunt chirped. My family knocked into my shoulders, rushing towards the body. They raised their knives and began slicing off limbs. Blood squirted across the table as they dismembered arms, flesh, and muscles stretching as it severed. I watched my grandma sink her teeth into the severed arm, blood trickling down her chin. She chewed slowly, savoring each bite. Her hair slowly began changing, the grey strands almost instantly changing to a greyish brown. Her wrinkly skin grew tighter and smoother. She looked like she had gone from 75 to 55. My grandpa tore a leg off, blood pouring down the table. He sunk his teeth into it like corn, pulling on strands of skin. And just like grandma, his frizzy grey hair began to transform colours reverting to grayish-blonde, bald spots filled in with clumps of hair. His skin smoothed out. My mother and father didn't need very much, so they picked lightly. My mother reached over with a fork and picked one of the eyeballs, tucking it off of meaty strings. She observed the small, shiny eyeball and then plopped it in her mouth like a piece of gum. My father took the other eyeball, blood squirting out of the empty socket and dripping down the side of its face. My uncle reached over with his knife and opened the baby's mouth and yanked its tongue out of its mouth. I began slicing it off with the knife. Blood filled its mouth and squirted down its neck as my uncle chewed on the tongue like fat from steak. They continued to pick it apart, taking any limb or organ that fulfilled their insatiable desire. They began to slice it open after taking most of the outside. They slid down its stomach and pried its corpse open. These are the goods. Like a piñata, my aunt choked as they dug their hands around its organs. They pulled out stringy intestines, slurping on them like sausages, and my grandma went right for the gold, tearing out its small heart. She raised it above her mouth, tilting her head back. She clenched the heart tightly, blood pouring down her mouth and to the sides of her face. My family cheered her on, as if she were chugging a beer at a frat party. She juiced out every last drop, licking excess blood off her lips. She then devoured the rest of the heart until there was no more. My uncle bit off pieces of lung like a pork chop. I watched as my family ravaged the corpse, blood smearing everywhere. I began to think about my siblings. I knew I had three of them, but I only remember one. I only ever met one. I don't even remember his name. I just remember playing with him one day and... He was gone the next. My train of thought broke when I noticed a head in front of me. 
My uncle dangled his head in front of me, soaked in blood. Between his fingertips, a small toe with a nail ripped off. I looked up at him, my eyes shaking. He had this soft, encouraging look on his face. It was disturbing. I couldn't push the words out. So my mother interjected. Oh please, she doesn't need that. She chuckled. Be grateful for that one, my uncle said, dropping the toe in his mouth. By the time they were done, the body had been picked clean. The only things left were bones and pieces of meat to save for later. I eyed the carcass, and it looked like it was attacked by rabid dogs. I looked around at my family. My grandpa and grandma looked young enough to be parents, and my aunt and uncle could pass as my older siblings. Maria, honey, why don't you go to bed? My mother said quietly, kissing the top of my head. I stood up, leaving the table, as my family bantered. I walked upstairs, the old stairs creaking as my feet hit each one. I went to the bathroom, quickly sliding in and shutting the door behind me. I turned the light on, and the room illuminating. I looked at myself in the mirror, my big brown eyes staring back at me. I scraped off the dried blood that splashed on my tanned skin. I felt like crying. Why did I feel like crying? I've seen it before. It, it doesn't really get any easier. I, I understand, but do I? There was no point in questioning it. It was just one of those things. I should be grateful that they didn't choose me, that my parents chose parenthood over youth. I left the bathroom. Walking back to my room, I slowed my pace down when I heard the faint sound of grainy breathing. I looked around the dark hallway. I looked at the door next to me. The sound was coming from behind it. And then I remembered. My great-grandma Lorraine. She's been on the brink of death since the 90s. They always intended to involve her in the feast every time, but they get selfish and end up barely giving her scraps. Being in old age for over a decade has crippled her. She sits in her room and never leaves. They bring up slices of skin and chunks of meat on a plate like a dog. I know they don't care about her, only about the bloodline. I entered my room and plopped onto my bed, my body sinking into the cold, soft mattress as I drifted off to sleep. I wake up suddenly, startled by the sound of arguing. I open my eyes slowly, my eyeballs feeling dry. I slowly sat up, still a bit dazed, I overheard a loud conversation. It's not fucking working anymore, my grandpa exclaimed, his voice muffled to the floors. Did she eat any at all? My uncle asked. Yes, and it didn't do anything, my grandpa answered. Does it ever do anything? My mom snarled. Don't be fucking stupid. It's kept her barely alive for years. Why isn't it working? His rage grew followed by a bang against a table. Calm down. Why didn't you save more? My dad chimed in. Why didn't you save more? Why didn't any of you save more? He barked back. Please just shut up. She's been alive for this long. She can go a little longer without. My aunt groaned. I knew they were talking about my great-grandma. I guess they got a little too selfish this time. She... she can't die. She's my mother, for Christ's sake. He shouted. We'll figure something out. My mom suddenly interjected. They stayed silent for a moment, my ears wide open. The girl. My grandma suddenly proposed. What? My grandpa asked, annoyed. Maria. She's young enough. Good amount of meat on those bones. A creaky voice explained. My body went numb as the words flowed through my ears. They couldn't have been serious. No, we made a deal. My mom growled, her voice beginning to shake. We did it with the others. She'll understand. We're family. My grandma tried to convince her. Fuck that. She's family. My daughter, you fucking hag. Don't ever try that again. 
my mom attacked. I flinched at the sound of a smack that rang through the floorboards. We brought you into this family. You are where you are today because of us. My grandma hissed. There was silence for a moment. We did it with the others previously. This is just how it has to be. My uncle reassured her. I'm not doing this. Touch her and I'll fucking eat you instead. My mom declared, the sound of pounding footsteps following. We'll get her in a few hours. It'll have to be a bit of a surprise. She won't cooperate. My grandma planned. My heart dropped into my stomach. I needed to make a move. Now. I threw my blanket off of myself and hopped out of bed. I stepped onto the floor, squinting my eyes after realizing I might have stomped too hard, praying it wasn't loud. No other noises followed, so I started throwing around ideas in my head. I tried to map out the layout of my house in my head. Six family members looking for me. My brain scrambled when I heard the sounds of multiple footsteps. I quietly opened my door, sliding out of my room quickly. I observed the long hallway, and no one was in sight. My house is pretty much a mansion, a courtesy of my great-grandmother's fortune. I slowly walked down the hall, my socks sinking into the old carpet. I heard muffled whispers beneath the floor. My best bet would be to sneak down the stairs and bolt out the front door. I crept closer to the staircase, trying not to alert anybody of my presence. Suddenly, my aunt turned the corner as she reached the top step. I froze in place, my heart racing. She turned to look at me, silent for a moment. A grin grew on her face. Maria, there you are. Could you please come downstairs and help with the cleanup? Your poor Aunt June's back is taking a toll. She let out a try-hard giggle. I thought for a moment, trying to plan my next move. Then I realized, they don't know that I know. I straightened my posture, closing my widened eyes, but my guard was still up. Sure. Uh, can I go to the bathroom quickly? I asked. Yeah, actually, could I come in with you quickly? Gotta grab some ibuprofen. She smiled, tilting her head to the side. Bitch. I nodded and walked over to the bathroom. She wouldn't walk next to me, only ominously behind me. I looked out of the corners of my eyes as I entered the bathroom. I'll grab it quickly and be out of your hair. She approached the medicine cabinet. Stupidly, I let my eyes off of her when I looked down at the toilet, noticing the creaking pipes. All of a sudden, I felt hands push me over with full force. I yelped as I slipped on the tile floor, trying to grab the toilet to regain balance. My hands slipped as well. My forehead crashed into the side of the bathtub. The impact rippled through my head. Blood began to trickle down my face. I slowly opened my shaking eyes, my vision blurry. Just make this easy, she groaned as I felt her kneel behind me. She balled a clump of hair in her fist and pulled my head back. I looked up, blood sliding past my eye. Just a sliver and some more. Her mouth stretched into a sinister smile as I saw a knife go towards my arm. Still dizzy from the hit, I used all my strength I had and swung my elbow, knocking into her nose. She fell off of me, on her knees, leaning over the tub next to me. I stood up, almost falling backwards. I blinked tightly a few times, trying to clear my vision. I looked down and she was covering her nose with her two hands, the knife on the floor next to her. It was too risky. She released her hands, placing them on the lining of the tub to help her get up. Before she could lift herself up, I raised my leg and dropped my foot on top of her head. Her head crashed down, her mouth ricocheting against the lining. I knocked out tooth sliding into the tub. I quickly whipped around and dashed out of the room. I ran for my life down the hallway, finding any room to run into. You little cunt. Danny. Her cries echoed out from the bathroom. I continued to run, my feet stomping, then halted harshly, almost leaving tire marks. 
when I hit a dead end, the only door left on the side of the floor. I looked behind me, waiting for a furious ant to come for blood. I heard quick footsteps run up the stairs. Oh my god, what happened? My uncle asked. I turned back around and barged into the room. I shut it behind me quietly, trying not to give away my location. I looked around the room and it was pitch black. I dragged my hands across the walls to feel for the light switch, and when I flipped the switch under my fingers, I flipped out. The room illuminated. I was in one of the dozens of living rooms, couches you weren't allowed to sit on, tables you'd get crucified for if you set a drink down on them. The room painted a light maroon, the fancy sofas a bright pink. I looked around for any windows to escape, but they were all too small to escape through. I quickly noticed the two medieval armor statues that stood like guards together at the back of the room. I walked towards them, feeling like they were going to get possessed and leap at me like in Scooby-Doo. The light reflected off of their shining silver armor, their hands clasped together, holding long swords like canes. I kneeled down, dragging my finger down the side of the blade. I raised my finger up, noticing blood coming from a paper cut sized incision. They're real. I noticed the blood from my head dripping off my chin. I wiped the stream of blood that ran down my face, smearing it on the back of my hand. I stood up and looked behind me at the door. I haven't heard a sound since I escaped my aunt. I looked back at the statue. Suddenly, a light bulb lit up above my head. I grabbed the statue's fingers. They were easily adjustable. I pulled them back one by one until I stepped aside as the sword dropped to the floor. I grabbed the handle with two hands and tried to lift it. Jesus Christ! I groaned as the sword had an unexpected weight. I felt my face turn red as I tried to lift it above my head, but my arms gave out and I had to drop it to the floor. I panted as I tried to catch my breath. I could lift it at least up to my stomach. I realized how loud the sword was when I heard footsteps quickly approaching the room. My eyes widened as I began dragging the sword over to the door. I quickly ran over and turned off the lights, planting myself in front of the door, lifting up the sword and holding it like a spear. I aimed the tip towards the entryway, waiting for someone to walk. The footsteps grew closer, the pounding shaking the floor. I tightened my grip my arms shaking, my gaze locked. The footsteps reached the door, the doorknob slowly turning. The door flew open, light outlining the silhouette of a man standing in the hallway. Where the fuck are you? My uncle called out. I put all of my might into it, cutting off his words as I rammed the sword through his stomach. He let out a drop of air as it escaped his lungs. His mouth dropped open. I slowly trekked closer to him, pushing against his weight as I impaled the sword deeper into him. Blood began trickling out of his mouth. A look of fear glimmered in his eyes. I pushed the sword far enough that the base of the handle prevented me from pushing any further. He looked down at me, the life leaving his eyes. He tried lifting his hand, his skin losing color. He reached for my neck, lifting his other hand as well, and before he could get a hold of me, he collapsed to the ground, the sword still inside of him. I looked down at his corpse, my chest pumping, a pool of blood forming under him. I couldn't believe I had just done that, but it oddly didn't feel bad. No! A voice cried out from down the hallway. I looked down the hallway, my aunt stood, the knife in her hand. Her light brown hair was frizzy, looking like a bird's nest. I could see a broken heart in her eyes as she watched me standing over her husband's body. The heartbreak quickly transitions to rage. Her jaw was shaking with anger, her mouth covered in dried blood. She slowly raised up the knife, looking bloodthirsty. I stared her back down, trying not to show fear when I was really just frozen. She broke into a sprint, letting out an ear-piercing cry as she flew down the hallway. My fight or flight kicked in, and before she could reach me, I slammed the door shut and locked it. I jumped back as the knife pierced through the door. You little shit! I'll fucking gut you! She screamed from behind the door, retracting the knife and stabbing it back through. 
I looked around for something to defend myself. I, I didn't have enough time or strength to grab the other sword. My time was cut off when she began kicking the door. I slowly stepped back, eyes still on the door, trying to back up as far as possible. I could tell adrenaline was running through her veins when the door gave in after three kicks. The door swung open, the knob crashing into the wall. She stood in the doorway, her upper body moving up and down. She was breathing like a beast. I walked around the sofas, standing behind the small glass coffee table. She began walking after me quickly. I sidestepped quickly, trying to run her in a circle around the sofas. With no defense, she caught up to me quickly, grabbing my hair before I could turn around and making a run for it. I screamed as she threw me backwards, dropping me onto the glass. The thin glass instantly shattered behind me. My back pressed against hundreds of shards. Before I could try and get myself up, she pounced on top of me like an animal. Our gazes crossed, her eyes lit with fire. I'll save her, this one. She hissed through her teeth, raising the knife up high. Her knees pressed into my stomach. I struggled to reach for a piece of glass. I stretched my arm out, but couldn't get a grip on a big piece. She swung down, my impulse reaction being to raise my hand up. I blocked the knife with my hand, the blade going through my palm. The blade pierced entirely through, and the handle pressing against the wound. Not able to squeeze out a scream, the shock numbing the pain, I watched as blood trickled into my face. I quickly snatched a big chunk of glass and jabbed it into the side of her neck. The look of anger on her face dropped as blood squirted into my hand. Using all of my strength, I gripped the shard tightly and dragged it across her neck, blood pouring out as I left a rigid gash that ran across the entire front of her neck. When I reached the other side of her neck, I ripped the shard out, leaving a wound deep enough to hit her windpipe. A long cut imprinted from the glass pressed against my hand. She fell over, gargling blood in her mouth, slowly stood up, tripping on shards of glass. I looked down at her body, the youth slowly leaving her. Strands of grey hair grew back, small wrinkles forming on her skin. The pain finally hit me as I looked at my hand, the knife still stabbed through. I took a deep breath and held it as I tightly gripped the handle. I slowly pulled the knife out, the sound of metal grinding against flesh and bone. Fuck! I shrieked in pain as I took the knife out, tears streaming down my cheeks as I lifted up my shaking hands, blood streaming down my arms as I observed the massive hole the knife left. I had no time to cry as I heard footsteps running upstairs. They had heard my scream. I quickly ran out of the room, keeping the knife as a weapon, and down the hallway. I needed to get out of the house. Before I could turn the corner, someone quickly grabbed my hand and snatched me inside of a dark closet. I squirmed around, punching and kicking everywhere, swinging the knife around. Who is this? I'll fucking kill you! I threatened as I twisted and turned. Suddenly, hands grabbed my shoulders, trying to get me to stop wriggling. Shh! It's me, my mother whispered reassuringly. I stopped moving at the reassuring sound of her voice. Oh, thank God. Everyone's going fucking insane. I've literally killed Uncle Danny and Aunt June. Oh my God, I killed them. I panicked, the situation truly setting in. It's okay, you did what you had to do. Another voice reassured me. I realized my father was in here as well. What are you guys doing in here? I asked quietly. I'm assuming you know. The plan. I stormed away up here. Your father and I talked in here for privacy. When we heard the fighting, we stayed out of fear. She explained. What do we do? I begged for a plan. I, I don't know. There's no way to make it downstairs, she added on. I just want to get out of here. I quietly sobbed. My father stayed silent for a moment. It sounded like he was choked up. I I'm sorry. I love you. But it's for the family, he suddenly declared. What? 
I questioned confusedly. Don't do this, my mother pleaded breathlessly. What? What's going on? I began to panic. She's in here, my father called out. My whole body sank. I felt like I was spiraling in a dream. He threw the door open and shoved me out in the hallway, dropping the knife inside of the closet. I stumbled around, falling against the wall. The sound of running came from downstairs, sounding like bulls. I regained balance and began running back to the room where my aunt and uncle laid to rest. Stop! My father called out to me. I stopped dead in my tracks, my entire body shaking. I slowly turned around, my cheeks soaked with tears. My father stood at the other end of the hallway, a rifle in hand aimed at me. I froze like a deer in headlights. He kept his aim steady, his eye looking to aim. Please, don't do this. I begged through my tears. As he was about to pull the trigger, my mother came out from the closet and lunged at him. She leaped out of the closet, slicing his waist with a knife. I jumped where I stood as the bullet just missed me, hitting the door frame behind me. He turns to my mother, a look of fury painted his face. You stupid whore, he roared, hitting her with the stock of the rifle. She cried as she fell to the ground, blood dripping onto the carpet. He swung it up, hitting his chin and knocking her on her back. He stood over her, holding the rifle with two hands and began bashing it into his face. No, no, stop, I cried out, barely able to get the words out. I watched with empty lungs as he repeatedly bashed her face in. Her nose snapped to the side, eventually caving into her face. Blood splattered across the floor, her eyeball beginning to pop out. The sight was nauseating, but I had no time to mourn. I tried running down the hall and past him, but he put a hold on bashing your face in and swung the rifle into the back of my head as I flew past him. I groaned as I tumbled to the ground my face burning as my skin rubbed against the carpet. I felt his pounding footsteps coming towards me. I took a chance at making a hit and kicked my foot back. My timing was perfect and my foot rammed into his ankle. Fuck! He groaned in frustration and before he could stand up, I grabbed the gun from his hands and knocked him on the top of the head with it. He fell to his knees, his hands planted on the ground, blood trickling through his dark hair. I stood in front of him, the rifle in my hands. I lifted his chin up with the barrel of the rifle, looking at him in the eye. The fire in his eyes had been blown out. He looked scared now. I crammed the barrel into his mouth. He gurgled as the cold metal filled his mouth. I tilted the gun down, aiming the barrel up. He looked up at me with pleading eyes, but I barely gave it any thought as I pulled the trigger. The bullet burst through the top of his head. Blood and brain matter flew through the air. I flinched as blood and chunks hit my face. I retracted the gun, and he fell over, the hole in his head pouring blood onto the carpet. What have you done? A voice cried out from the end of the hallway. I looked up. My grandpa stood at the end of the hallway, his hand gripped tightly on a hay hook. Presumably from our barn, he looked around, observing my body count, a look of horror on his face. He came storming down the hall, quickly stopping in his tracks when I raised up the rifle. I aimed him down, keeping him where he stood. I pulled the trigger, but the gun only clicked. I looked down at the gun in confusion and pulled the trigger again. It clicked. He was out of bullets. I looked up at him. He laughed at me. He began walking towards me again. I dropped the gun, looking around me with the, looking around me with the mere seconds I had to find something else to defend myself. The knife was nowhere to be found. I thought my mother may have fallen on top of it, but I didn't have time to move her body. I swiftly ran into the closet, grabbing anything I could find in the darkness. My hand grazed across a wooden baseball bat. I snatched it quickly until the jarring sensation of a blade dug into my shoulder. He had swung the hook into my skin, leaving me screaming in agony as he pressed his foot against my back, pulling the hook in deeper. 
He yanked it back, knocking a windless scream out of me and dragging me back into the hallway. I tried to keep my grip on the baseball bat, but it slipped out and plopped right outside the door frame. I wriggled as he dragged me out, the hook feeling like it was about to tear right through my skin. He dropped me, blood soaking through my shirt. He vigorously ripped the hook out from my skin, earning another agonizing scream from me. I placed my hand over the oozing wound, squinting, squinting my tear-filled eyes. He raised his arm up, ready to gouge my eyes out. I swiftly rolled over, just missing his attack. The hook pierced through the carpet and into the wooden floor. He groaned as he struggled with pulling it out, as it got caught on strings from the torn carpet. I stood up wobbly, growing dizzy from the blood loss. I stumbled over to the closet and grabbed the baseball bat. I lifted it up, swirled it in the air, and aimed it down, building up a good enough swing. Before he could get the hook out, he looked up at me. I swung the bat up, slamming it into his chin. He stood up, his legs moving like jelly. His back slammed against the wall. I had caved his jaw in. Teeth fell out along with a waterfall of blood. The crunchy sound of broken bones as he tried to open his mouth. The youth was slowly leaving him. Wrinkles grew quickly. Strands of hair growing from blonde to gray. Patches of hair retracting into his scalp and forming bald spots. He looked like a grandpa again. I lowered the blood-soaked bat again and hit him with another uppercut, his head splitting off his body, jumping up with his spine attached to it like a toy. His head slid back down into his neck, and he stumbled around, blood circling down his entire neck. He collapsed to the ground, blood pouring everywhere. I stood over him, my heart and lungs on fire. I couldn't believe I had just done that. He broke like porcelain. I dropped the bat with tired hands and looked for the knife. It was an easier and more lethal weapon. I approached my mother's corpse. Her bloody face caved in. I wiped a tear that came quickly. She saved me. The only family member who wasn't trying to eat me. I rolled her body over, weakened from all the wounds. The knife was hidden under her body. I grabbed it and stumbled down the hallway. I flew down the steps, tripping on a few of them. I limped towards the front door, the feeling of escape so close. I grabbed the cold metal handle. I took a deep breath, trying to keep myself conscious, and I turned the knob and cracked open the door. The sweet taste of freedom turned sour as I felt a sharp pain in my upper arm. I began to scream, my shout growing louder as the pain grew stronger. I looked over, and my grandma was sinking her teeth into my arm, her eyes rolling into the back of her head, my arm spazzing from the pain, my grip on the knife loosening and dropping it to the ground. She collected a clump of bloody flesh in her mouth and began to pull on it, my skin and muscle stretching like gum. I fell to my knees, screaming until my throat practically bled. She pulled farther until my skin gave out and broke off. She chewed on the chunk of meat, swirling it around in her mouth like a piece of steak. She threw her head back, moaning in pleasure as she fed off my youth. Her hair grew longer, the gray strands vanishing, and her skin looking baby soft. She reached her peak age once again. She cackled devilishly as I looked down in horror at the gushing wound she left. I swiftly grabbed the knife off the ground and sliced her ankle. You little bitch, she exclaimed in pain. I tried to open the door and run away as far as I could, but I was too slow. She wrapped her hand around my neck, dragging me back and choke slamming me to the ground, the knife slipping out of my hands, sliding just out of reach. She sat on top of me, wrapping both hands around my neck. She slowly squeezed tighter and tighter, completely blocking my windpipe. Tears in my eyes filled to the brim as I felt the blood trapped in my head. I coughed up saliva as I wriggled around to break free. She stared down at me, flashing her teeth with a ferocious smile as she awaited my demise. She leaned in closer. I love watching the life fade out of the young. 
like draining blood from a chicken. She sniggered as I slowly began to black out. I made one last attempt at survival before she crushed my windpipe. I stretched my hand out, my fingers about to detach as I reached for the knife. I grazed the handle of the knife with my fingertips. It was so close. The energy in my arm grew weaker as my neck tightened in her clutch. Right before my life began flashing before my eyes, I got a decent grip of the knife. She began opening her mouth wide, ready to bite down on my face and feast. Before she could, I lifted up the knife with every bit of life left in me and shoved the blade into her mouth. Blood immediately began pouring out of her throat and onto my face. Her grip slowly began to let go, my throat clearing up space to breathe. I took in as many breaths as I could as I slowly pushed the knife deeper. She choked up blood, squirting it onto my face as I pierced the knife through the back of her throat. I twisted the knife around, the blade grinding against her teeth. She fell over, her grip entirely loosened. I took in a breath so deep it could have popped my lungs. I could feel the blood flowing back through my body. I coughed up a bit of bloody saliva. I looked over at her corpse. Her hair turned to frail silver again, and her skin wrinkly and bleak, and her skin wrinkly and baggy. I did it. I survived. Everyone. I disorientedly stood up, the sudden movement too much for my body to handle. I approached the door. The coolness of the handle soothed my hand. But before I could leave, I remembered I had forgotten something. I leaned down and pulled the knife out from my grandmother's throat, blood spurting out from her throat and across the tan wooden floor. I limped upstairs, walked down the hall. I looked at the bodies as I passed them. When I reached the room, I could hear my great-grandmother's dying breaths. I slowly opened the door, the light from the hall peering into the dark room. My great-grandma sat in a wheelchair, one they never cared to let her move around in. I approached her with a stare. You would have thought she was dead if her lungs weren't pumping. She didn't look at me. I didn't think she even knew I was there. I tilted my head, just staring at her as she slowly breathed with a deep wheeze. It was a strangely peaceful connection for a moment. But all good things come to an end. I cranked my arm back and swung the knife into the side of her head. The blade went straight through, the tip of it pointing out the other side of her face. She didn't look any different than when she was alive. Blood trickled down the side of her face as she slumped over in her chair. I stayed silent, watching her corpse lie. I stood and thought to myself for a moment. Fuck this family. I stumbled back down the steps. Half of my body's blood supply spilled across the house. My grandmother's corpse still laid near the front door, her death long awaited. I limped past her, blood dripping off the sole of my shoe as I stepped in the pool. I reached for the door with a heavy hand, trying to at least get outside before I fainted from my injuries. My vision slowly grew fuzzy as I stumbled forward, grabbing the doorknob to keep myself up. The knife clanked against the floor as it slipped from my weak grip, my arm resting by my side. I sat on my knees, resting my head against the door as I took deep, slow breaths. I couldn't give up now. I did too much to get where I was. I gripped the knob tightly, groaning as I lifted myself up. I slowly creaked the door open, my eyelids impulsively squeezing shut as the bright sunlight beamed. I slid out the door the cool air satisfying to breathe. I lifted my head, closing my eyes and taking savory breaths. I hadn't gotten the chance to just breathe. I quickly collapsed to my knees, pressing my blood-soaked palms against the concrete pathway. My jaw trembled as tears welled in my eyes. It felt like everything had just hit me. I... 
I killed everyone. I killed my entire family. The thought forced tears out of my eyes. It was a fight for survival, but at what cost? I let myself sob. I deserved to feel something else other than anger. When I emptied the sadness from my body, I wiped off my damp cheeks, weakly getting on my feet. I sniveled as I looked around my gated community. Nobody was outside, but I needed help. I staggered off my front porch and into the street. I went for the first house that was directly across mine. The car was in the driveway. I almost tripped up the smooth stone steps as I approached the big metal doors. With all my strength, I pounded against it. Please, help me, I pleaded. My simple cries felt over-exaggerating, but there was no response. I banged again, my arms ready to drop. Please, I'm injured badly, I cried, breathing heavily. Suddenly, the sound of clicking heels came tapping towards the door. My eyes widened with hope until the door wasn't open. I eyed the side of the house, catching the resident peeking through their pulled-back curtains. She didn't look worried or panicked. She looked disgusted. I stared back in silence, a beg for help gleaming in my eye. She threw the curtains back, her footsteps leading towards the door. She inched the door open, just enough to fit her head through. I don't know what dumpster you dragged yourself out of, but get off my property before I call security. How'd you even get in here? She warned. I'm literally your... I tried to explain, but she slammed the door shut. I stood in shock. Did she not recognize me? With a drop jaw, I stumbled off her front porch and tried another house, and another house, and another house. Each ignored my life pleas, told me to fuck off, or weren't even home. After my last attempt, I gave up, standing aimlessly in the street like a lost dog. If nobody was going to help me, I needed to help myself. I made my way back to that wretched house, hoping it was my last time. I sighed as I threw the door open, seeing my grandmother's corpse once again. I wished she'd just vanish, like a dead enemy in a video game. I limped up the stairs again, back into the blood-painted hallway. The bodies were still spread across the ground, the blood drying into the fabric of the carpet. I needed to find a phone, which is actually harder than you'd think. My great-grandmother owned the house, so all rules were written by her. She felt that house phones would allow spirits of the house to speak to us, so we never had those. I wasn't allowed my own cell phone because... I could get one when I was able to pay for my own, so that made this even harder. I had to take the bet that one of my family members had their phones on them. I started with my parents' corpses. They laid close to each other. My father's brain matter dried to the carpet. I kneeled down, almost losing my balance, and began pilfering through every pocket. Nothing. (sighs) Even in death, he was fucking useless. I turned to my mother's corpse, pausing for a moment. I couldn't avert my gaze from her decimated face. The sight churned my stomach. She deserved better. I held back tears as I searched through her pockets, ending up with nothing. I stood up, making my way towards my aunt and uncle. After checking my uncle's corpse, I was left with my aunt. I stepped over her corpse, approaching the mess that I left my aunt in. I carefully danced around the shards of glass that scattered across the ground. I reached down, sliding my hand into her pocket. My eyes shot open as my finger grazed the corner of a phone. I quickly grasped it, trying to slide it out of her tight jeans. Suddenly, my legs gave out. I groaned and I dropped to the ground, grabbing the frame of the table to keep myself up. I wasn't getting any stronger. I needed to act fast. I lifted myself back up, my arms shaking. I used my other hand to pull the phone out, and then stumbled out of the room. I dabbled my fingers against my shoulder wound, baring my teeth as it stung. Blood covered my fingertips. I was still bleeding badly. I wiped them off against my pants and kept walking. I walked down those steps for the last time, feeling as hard as ever to do so. 
I stepped outside, looking behind me as I closed the door. I lifted the phone, praying it wasn't dead. I sighed with relief and a smile as it turned on. Thank God old people don't put passwords on their phones either. I opened the phone app and dialed 911. I raised the phone to my ear, tapping my teeth together as it rang. 911 operator, what's your emergency? A woman on the other end asked. I I have a medical emergency. I I have multiple injuries, I explained. What is your address? She went on. I told her my address, explaining that I'm in a gated community. An ambulance is on their way, she informed me. Uh, Okay, thank you. I sat down on my curb, feeling dizzy. She asked me a few more questions about my injuries and what happened. It was hard explaining that my entire family tried to murder me and feast on my corpse. I eventually hung up the call, waiting for the ambulance to arrive. I looked around my street with tired eyes. It was so dull you'd think it was abandoned. All the trimmed bushes and parked Cadillacs don't cover the fact that everyone hated each other and thought they were better than everyone. After a few minutes, the thought of the sound of sirens broke me out of my thought cloud. The ambulance pulled up in front of my house, the colored lights spinning. I stood up and two men hopped up. Thank you. My words trailed off as I suddenly felt numb. I collapsed to the ground, my vision blurry and my head muffled. She's losing a lot of blood, one of the men exclaimed in panic, motioning for the other to get a stretcher. They pulled it out of the back of the ambulance, lifting me onto it. My eyes slid around, my eyelids desperately wanting to close. I looked at the blue sky and the faces of the panicked men carrying me. It was hard for me to make out what they looked like. Everything was fuzzy. They lifted me into the ambulance, a woman sitting on the back with me. She lifted my head, strapping a mask to my face, and began pumping something into my lungs. Within seconds, I felt exhausted. My vision blurred even further, and everything in a mist. But before I blacked out, it's funny. I looked at the woman, and I could have sworn she had three eyes. I slowly opened my eyes, staring at a blurring ceiling. I was laying down comfortably, my back supported by a soft bed. I reached up to rub my eyes, quickly feeling the weight of tubes that ran into my arms. I wiped the fuzziness from my vision, blinking rapidly. I made it to the hospital without dying. I looked over at the heart rate monitor as it beeped, mesmerized by the green bar as it rose and dropped to my heartbeat. There were wrinkled green curtains that separated the beds for privacy. Nurses fast walked by, masks covering their mouths. I reached up to touch the bandage on my forehead, flinching as it stung. Oh, you're awake. A nurse suddenly exclaimed as she noticed me. She walked over, a clipboard in hand. How are you feeling? She asked. Uh, uh, Like shit. I chuckled weakly, wheezing as I coughed. That's the usual with injuries like these, she said, leaning down towards me. How long was I out for? I questioned. A short three hours, I think, she answered, jotting something down. I'm going to change your bandages. This might sting a bit, she warned me. She gripped the gauze, my eyes shooting open as she applied unexpected pressure. I held in cries as she pressed into my wound, vigorously ripping off the bandage. I couldn't tell if she was extremely inexperienced or she did it on purpose. She dangled the crimson-soaked cloth, then dropped it into her pocket. She pulled out a clean gauze and medical tape. I almost shot up out of bed and she pushed the gauze against my wound, practically shoving her finger into it. Please, less pressure, I pleaded. Sorry, honey, it'll be just a moment. She ignored my request. She taped it down, my shoulder throbbing as she ran her finger over to make it stick. I squeezed my eyes, a tear running down my cheek. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to be so rough. She apologized, her tone ditzy. She grated her thumb across my cheek, wiping away my tear. With a smile, she began walking away. I stared at her in confusion and a bit of shock. Why did she manhandle me? Then I caught something strange. As she turned the corner, 
Almost behind the curtain, she put her thumb in her mouth and licked it clean. Did she just eat my tears? I thought to myself, absolutely baffled. I uncomfortably shifted around to my bed, my shoulder raging with pain again. I stayed observant like a hawk for a few hours, the nurse never returning since. In my time, I noticed a few things. First of all, the place seemed extremely understaffed. I think the only nurse I saw walk back and forth was the one that practically abused me. And a man walked by a few times, seemingly a doctor, but that was it. The only people that worked on this floor. Speaking of floors, I never saw anyone leave this one. From my viewpoint, the hospital seemed to be in a T-shape. The rows of beds were at the top, and then one long hallway that leads to other rooms, then the staircase and elevators. My bed resided in front of that hallway, giving me a bird's eye view. I had not seen one person enter or exit the staircase, uh, neither the elevator. And I thought I was overreacting. I lost a lot of blood, so I didn't exactly possess clarity, but... I came from a family of psychotic cannibals. I could smell suspiciousness, like a drop of blood in a bottomless ocean. The one thing that stayed under my skin was the nurse. A medical professional could not be that reckless. She was like a caricature. My tears, she licked it off her finger. Everything just felt so strange, like I was on an episode of the Twilight Zone. I knew I sounded paranoid, nitpicking with these observations till I was visited by the nurse. It was around 7pm, the sun almost set. She smiled as she appeared around the curtain, holding an IV bag. I faked a smile. We meet again, she joked. I nodded, letting out a stale chuckle. I'm going to change your IV for the night, she explained, unhooking the old bag. She then reached for my arm, giving me a moment before she pulled the needle out. This might hurt a bit. It's okay to scream or cry, she tried to reassure me. I'll be fine, I croaked, her comment rubbing me the wrong way. She unwrapped the tape, gripping the needles that were buried in my arm. Suddenly, she tore them out of my arm. A scream escaped my mouth as I almost flew off the bed. I looked down at my arm with wide eyes, blood squirting out of the holes. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, she apologized, reaching in her pocket for gauze pads. I glared at her like she was insane. My jaw dropped. She ignored my gaze and pressed the pads against my wound. The white cloth quickly ran red as my gushing blood soaked into it. While holding it down, she used her other hand to pull out tape, tearing off a piece and using it to keep the gauze down. That should stop the bleeding eventually. She straightened her back. I continued to stare at her in shock. I couldn't believe what she had just done. She pulled the needle out like a plug from an outlet. She was about to walk away until she turned to me. She stared at me intensely, like she was studying my face. Her expression showed the thought ran through her head. You're a tough cookie, aren't you? She smirked, sounding scornful. I kept silent, continuing to stare. She eventually walked away, my eyes following her until she disappeared. I looked down at my arm, groaning as I bent it. It wasn't the worst of my injuries, but it felt like a really intense bruise. I didn't know where I was going to go, but I needed to get the fuck out of there. I waited until the lights turned off and the floor was clear. When the time was right, I slowly slid off the bed. Goosebumps ran across my skin as my bare feet touched the cold, polished floors. I peered past the curtains, not having seen past them. I looked left and right perking up like a dog as I noticed a beaming red exit sign. I stepped out from behind the curtain, tiptoeing towards the exit. I would just go through the door, fly down the steps, and escape to... somewhere. As I continued down the pathway, I looked over, slowly stopping. The beds were empty. I backtracked a bit, realizing that every bed was empty. Where are the other patients? I shook it off and continued on towards the exit. When I reached the door, I pressed my hands on the cold metal bar, 
praying an alarm wouldn't go off. I clenched my fist as I pushed into it, preparing to run for my life, until the door didn't open. I scrunched my eyebrows as I repeatedly pushed it, in realization that it was locked. Why would they lock an emergency exit? I thought, fear beginning to grow inside of me. I turned back again, finding myself at square one. My only other options were the staircase or the elevator. I wrapped my hands around the corner, peeking my head out. It was clear, so I slid around and went for it. Suddenly, a muffled conversation caught my ear. I stopped in my tracks, trying to locate the source of the sound. I noticed two silhouettes through the curtain of a room window. I stayed quiet and froze as I listened in. Are you trying to make it obvious? A man berated. I, I'm sorry. You asked for tears or screams. I, I did my best. A woman apologized. One fucking tear that you saved for yourself. Humans aren't dumb. We can't have another escapee. We can't afford another cover-up. Get your shit together. He hissed through his teeth. Humans. Odd word choice. Hey, look, we could just move her to the basement early. I'm, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to make her suspicious. She suggested. The basement? You want to move her early? Do it yourself. You're the one who wanted to deal with her anyway. Go fucking prove yourself or something. He demanded, his footsteps storming off. I didn't know the context of this conversation, and I didn't want to. It just gave me more of a reason to get out as soon as possible. I crouch walked towards the elevator, pressing the button. I sat impatiently as I waited for it to arrive at my floor. After sitting there for a few seconds, it seemed like I was on a higher floor than I realized. Suddenly, clicking heels walked towards the door. My neck twisted around, eyeing the door to the room. The elevator wasn't coming any faster, and I couldn't take chances. I quietly sprinted back down the hall, clenching my teeth as I heard the elevator doors open. How convenient. I turned the corner, pressed my back against the wall. I could hear the door suddenly open. The nurse stepped out. I cautiously peered around the corner, attempting to see her position. She stood, staring at the open elevator, a needle in hand. I swiftly retracted my head as she looked down the hall, a look of suspicion in her eye. She began walking down the hall towards my empty bed. I sidestepped farther across the wall, praying she wouldn't see me. She walked through the doorway, stopping my breath for a moment so I did not alert her. She approached my bed, raising the needle as she slowly lifted the blanket. I lightly jolted as she realized I wasn't there, throwing the blanket back down in frustration. Little bitch, she scoffed under her breath. She's going to start looking for me. I needed a plan, fast. There was a high chance she'd end up seeing me anyways, so I'd have to trust my legs to carry me to freedom. I slowly went for the elevator. My sight locked on her as she threw curtains out of the way, desperately searching for me. As I turned the corner, she whipped around. Both of our eyes widened as our gazes crossed. We froze for a moment, as if she was scared as well. In the mere seconds of the pause, I realized I wasn't going to make it to the elevator. I then realized I was going to enter another fight for my life. I broke into a sprint, bolting past her. She unfroze, running right on my tail. As I ran, I realized the hall was short, so I was either going to have to dodge her extensively or kill her. The decision was quickly made for me as she leapt onto my back. Unable to handle the weight, I tumbled into a metal cabinet, crashing into the floor. I groaned in pain as we wrestled on the floor. She raised her arm, trying to inject me with the needle. I blocked it as she swung down, my arm shaking as I held back her force. She gripped her other hand around my arm, pinning it to the ground. We were in a face-to-face -face struggle, her hot breath hitting me. Her skin was beating red, her mouth stretched open to reveal inhumanly jagged teeth. I wriggled the arm she held down, attempting to release her grip. Just fucking sleep, she growled, forcing the needle towards me. Groans tried to escape through my teeth as the needle almost grazed my skin. I tugged at my arm with all my might, 
lifting it off the ground with her grip still attached. I directed her arm towards my mouth, quickly sinking my teeth into her skin. She craned her head back, her screams of agony growing stronger as I bit harder. She dropped the needle, using her other arm to pull herself from my grip. As blood began pooling in my mouth, I realized. She gripped her arm, staring at the wound as she whimpered. Blood oozed out of the tooth-sized holes, dripping down her arm. While she was distracted, I snatched the needle and swiftly pierced it into her eyeball. She stumbled backwards, breathlessly crying. The needle was stuck in deep, moving around with her eyeball. She lifted her trembling arm, gripping the needle. She moaned in pain as she slowly removed it, blood trailing down her cheek. After removing it entirely, she dropped it to the ground, her bitten arm dangling at her side. She looked at me, her eyeball red. She wiped away the streak of blood, baring her teeth. She storms towards me, ready to kill me with her bare hands. I scrambled across the ground, trying to get back on my feet. As I crawled, my hand pressed against cold metal. I looked down, noticing a scalpel under my palm. I gripped it tightly, whipping around with a slash. I hit a bullseye, slicing across her hand as she reached for me. She yelped as she retracted her hand, blood dripping onto the floor. I stumbled till I stood, planting my feet into the ground. I raised the scalpel at her, my hand shaking. Our eyes met, daggers in her gaze, but a sharper one in my hand. She wagged her hand, shaking the blood off as she came after me. She swung at my hand in an attempt to disarm me. I leaned backwards, pressing my arms against my chest to keep them out of her distance. Open for an attack, I lunged towards her, pulling the scalpel into her neck. Her eyes shot open as the blade hit a weak spot. Blood exploded out like a geyser within seconds of pulling out the blade. She tried to keep her balance, blood leaking between her fingers as she tried to plug the hole with her palm. Within seconds, she collapsed to the ground. I dropped the scalpel, my lungs on fire. Suddenly, as I watched the blood pool around her corpse, she began to change. Her skin darkened to a deep red, her hair disintegrated. Her jaw lowered as it made room to fit long, razor-sharp teeth. I scanned her corpse up and down in confusion. It had made a full transformation. Oh, what the fuck are you? I whispered to myself, my eyebrows scrunched. I tiptoed around her corpse, unable to take my eyes off of it. I reached the elevator again, pressing the button. I looked over at the door, remembering that the doctor or whatever he is was still there. My teeth chattered as I waited anxiously, staring at the glowing button. I periodically looked behind me, waiting for him to burst out the door. My anxieties cooled down as the elevator beeped, the doors sliding open. I stepped in, pressing the first floor button. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a door opening. I looked up, noticing the doctor staring right back at me. My eyes shot open as I began to press the closed door button. Stop, he demanded, running towards me as the doors began to close. Close, close, fucking close, I begged as I rapidly pressed the button. I clenched my limbs as he just failed to reach me, his fists slamming against the closed doors. I breathed deeply, a pit in my stomach. I felt barely safe for a moment as I traveled between floors, until it came to a halted stop. I looked up at the floor number. I had stopped at the second. Close enough. I waited until the elevator doors opened. My guard raised up again as the opening doors revealed a concerning scene. I slowly stepped out under flickering lights, blood streaks running across the floor. I tilted my head, eyeing down the hall. Papers were scattered around, bedpans and other equipment scattered about. It felt like I walked into the aftermath of something. I stepped back into the elevator, pressing the floor button a few times. It screeched as it tried to move, but ultimately stayed stuck. I remembered the staircase next to it. I gripped the door handle, grunting as I tugged on it. I groaned in frustration. It was locked. Fuck, I muttered under my breath, 
stepping back into the hallway. I had to find another staircase. Before I continued down the hall, I caught something out of the corner of my eye. A fire axe sat in a glass container on the wall. I slid my arm into my shirt and elbowed the glass. It shattered easily, almost thin as paper. I reached past the shards, lifting the axe off its stand. I felt its weight in my hand, gripping it with my other one as well. I didn't know if I'd need it, but it wouldn't hurt to have it on me. I prowled down the hall, my feet sticking to dried blood. Broken lights hung down from the ceiling as the others flickered. More blood painted across the floors and walls. There had to have been a full-on massacre. When I reached the end of the hall, I peered around both corners. More empty beds lined the wall. A few of the blankets stained with blood. I hid behind the wall as I noticed something at the end of the hallway. A man was leaning over behind a curtain, grabbing something. He straightened his back, revealing a body in his hands. The person was injured, but they didn't appear to be dead. I flipped my back against the wall as he began walking towards me. I lifted the axe, gripping the handle tightly with both hands. I kept my ears open for the sound of his footsteps, the floor vibrating as he grew closer. When I felt he was close enough, I appeared from behind the corner, throwing my whole body into the swing of my axe. My eyes darted around in confusion as the blade hit the wall. The man had vanished. Suddenly, a chill crawled up my spine as fingers slowly wrapped around my shoulder. I whipped around with a swing, feeling like I was going insane as there was nobody standing in front of me. Where do you think you were going? A gravelly voice whispered in my ear. I spun around, swinging the axe throughout the air. I felt taps on my shoulders as he laughed sinisterly, making me twist and turn. I couldn't tell if he was extremely fast or just invisible. I then felt something slice across my arm. I yelped in pain as I looked down, blood seeping into one of those jagged slashes that ran across my skin. I swiftly bent my neck as I felt a stream of air fly by my ear. I swung my axe around again, still not getting a hit. I quickly pressed my hand against my cheeks as he attacked my face. I removed my hand, blood trailing through the crevices of my palm. I made one last attempt at an attack. I pressed the bottom of the handle against my stomach. The blade extended outwards. I began spinning in a circle, covering any ground that he could have been on. I stopped shortly as my lungs began to singe with exhaustion. Where the fuck could he be? Then, it clicked. I slowly looked up. My eyes widened at the sight of the man latched to the ceiling. His skin was pale. His long nails hooked into the panels. His body was facing the ceiling. His skin on his neck straining as he had twisted around to stare at me. Before I could make a move, he retracted his claws and dropped above me. I screamed as the weight of his body crashed me to the ground, the axe slipping from my grip and sliding across the floor. I groaned as I held his arms back, his claws desperately trying to reach me. I stared deeply into his eyes, his iris a dark red. I slid my hands up to his arms until I could easily grab his claws. I clumped them together into my grip, bending them backwards. He hissed in pain as I pushed farther until they snapped in half. He leapt off of me, pressing his arms against his chest like a T-Rex. I scrambled to my feet, rushing over to grab the axe. I stood steadily, staring him down with the axe raised. He stared back, stretching out his fingers with now destroyed claws. And then, as I closed my eyes to blink, he vanished as I reopened them. I looked up at the ceiling, and he hadn't gone there either. Come on, I groaned in frustration. I realized he had somehow snuck behind me as his arm wrapped around my neck. My eyes shot open as he applied enough pressure to cut off my airways. I attempted to reach behind me, trying to snatch him or gouge his eye, but he used his other hand to hold my arm down, squeezing my throat harder. My throat croaked as I desperately tried to breathe, and then I realized he stupidly forgot to apprehend the arm that had a weapon. With the strength of one arm, I swung the axe behind me. He shrieked in agony as he released me from his grip. 
I fell to my knees, coughing up saliva as my throat opened up, trying to take in deep breaths. I wiped spit off of my lips, lifting myself off the ground. He stumbled into the wall, the axe stuck in his face. I rushed him, ripping the axe out of his face. I earned more screams from him as blood squirted onto my face, a deep gash running across his forehead. Taking away his chance to escape again, I flipped the axe around at the other blade and swung at one end of his stomach. He let out groans of pain as he gripped his gut, blood soaking through his clothes. I gripped the handle tighter, baring my teeth as I tore the blade across his stomach, then retracting it as I hit the other end. Blood poured out of his body like a waterfall as he fell to his knees. Organs began to slip out of the deep laceration. His skin painted red as he desperately tried to shove them back in with weak hands. I stood over him, my chest lifting as I breathed. He looked at me as I raised the axe, his dark pupils shrieking. I roared as I swung it down onto his head. The blade sliced through his head like a wooden log, splitting it into two as it reached his mouth. I yanked the axe out, blood shooting onto my shirt. The two halves of his axe wobbled around as he fell over, his exposed organs hitting the ground with a wet slap. I watched as his corpse transformed like the nurse, his hair decayed away and his skin faded to grey. I kneeled down, observing his corpse. Are you some kind of demon or monster? I questioned aloud, as if he'd answer. I stood up sucking air through my teeth as I wiped blood off my cheek, the cut stinging. I looked down at my arm, blood dripping onto the floor from the cut. I reached for the corpse's clothes, tearing off a strand of his thin white coat. I wrapped it around my arm as a makeshift bandage, blood quickly soaking through. I searched down the hall for another staircase, my eyebrows raised as one caught my eye. I ran over, grabbing the knob excitedly and my face fell as I realized it was locked as well. Oh, fucking hell! I exclaimed in frustration, slamming my fist against the window of the door. I aimlessly walked around, absolutely stumped. All the staircases were locked. It was as if they didn't want anybody descending any further. Are they hiding something? What's the motive? Left with nothing else, I decided to try the elevator again. The doors were still open, so... I stepped back in and pressed the first floor button again. Nothing happened. I pressed it again and again and again. I was about to break it. Come on, fucking work! I exclaimed, pounding the button with my fist. Suddenly, the speakers let out a small ding. My head perked up, noticing the doors slowly closing. I stepped back, a satisfied smile on my face. The elevator jolted down a bit but stayed stuck. I looked down, my blood beginning to boil. Suddenly, I lost my balance as the elevator began to drop. I stumbled to the wall, holding the metal bar as the elevator screeched. Everything shook as I descended at full speed, until it crashed at the bottom floor. I groaned as I fell to the ground. I looked up at the floor number, but the light had broken. It wasn't hard to guess that I had hit the basement. I stood up, dropped the axe, and forced my fingers between the elevator doors. I grunted as I used all my strength to force them open, barely able to get it to separate by an inch. I let go taking deep breaths. Then, a light bulb lit above my head. I lifted the axe and jammed the blade between the doors. I pushed against the handle, the metal creaking as it separated. I pushed harder, trying to make enough space to fit my hand through. Suddenly, the blade snapped off the wood, clanking to the ground. I quickly shoved my hand between the doors to stop it from closing. I dropped the handle, using both hands to pry the door open. When they were successfully open, I picked up the handle and the blade. There was no way of reattaching them. It was useless as a weapon. I tossed them in the corner of the elevator and stepped into the basement. 
I wrapped my goosebump-ridden arms across myself, the temperature dropping quickly. The basement was dark and bleak, the walls and floors a gray stone, weak lights illuminating the hall. I slowly continued on, my bare feet slapping against the cold floors. I peered around the corner at the end of the hall. It was vastly empty, rusted pipes that clanked as heat pumped through them lined across the walls. I turned the corner, observing a few different rooms as I walked past. Most of them were unhelpful to me. Things like the janitor's closet or plumbing, rooms that rang with sounds of steam. None of them were a staircase or an elevator, so they were useless. Till I reached the end of the hall and found a room that wasn't like the others. I stepped in front of it as strange sounds caught my ear. There were two big green doors, screw holes where a sign once was. I hesitantly pressed my ear against the door. The sounds were unrecognizable, possibly plumbing sounds. What was more concerning was what sounded like human grumbling. Disturbed, I pulled away from the door, looking down at the paint-chipped doorknob. I was too curious, so I reached for it, slowly turning it. I opened the door to just a crack, peeking inside. It was hard to get a good look, so I continued to open the door frame. When it was fully open, my jaw crashed to the ground. I couldn't process what I was seeing. About a dozen people hung from the ceiling, their hands and feet stretched out and tied to hooks. Some of them were presumably doctors, wearing white coats, others seeming to be patients, wearing hospital gowns. Ventilation masks covered their mouths, appearing to be pumping oxygen. The dangling tubes were attached to tall, thin steel tanks. I slowly approached the tanks, my wide eyes locked on the person it was attached to. They appeared to be unconscious. I looked down at the tank, detaching the tube from it. I hesitantly gripped the knob, slowly turning it. Suddenly, a jolt ran through my body as an ear-piercing sound exploded from the tank. I quickly sealed it again, reattaching the tube, my ears ringing. That was not oxygen. It sounded like a scream. I looked up, slapped my hand against my mouth to hold in a shout as I crossed gazes with the person. They stared at me, fear in their eyes. What happened to you? I whispered as I removed the hand from my mouth. He tried to speak, but was unable to, letting out panicked groans. Then I noticed something I hadn't seen before. Rubber cups were attached under his eyes, sewn to his skin. Clear tubes ran from the cups to the ground, the end of them sitting in a glass jar. I knelt down, leaning close to see inside. There was a bit of water inside. It didn't make any sense. I looked back up at the cup, then back down at the jar, trying to make the connection. Then my head jerked up as I realized. They were collecting tears. I thought about the nurse wiping away my tears and then licking it off her finger. Why are they collecting tears? I stood up, observing the rest of the people. They were all connected to tanks and jars, too. I slowly stepped back, trying to take in the room at its full scale. I blinked rapidly, still trying to understand what I was looking at. I yelped as I suddenly bumped into something, whipping around at the sound of glass clinking together. I had hit a shelf. Glass jars and bottles clumped together. I lifted a jar, a piece of tape stuck to it. Tears was written across it. They seemed to be storing them. I slid them around, grabbing a bottle. I ran my fingers over the label as it read, Fear. I twisted the cap off, almost dropping the bottle as a scream suddenly rang out. I whipped around to see if anyone else was down here with me. Confused, I turned back around and grabbed another bottle with the same label. Again, a disturbing scream was let out as I twisted the cap off. Are they bottling screams? How is that even possible? I looked over at the tanks, everything making more sense while getting even more confusing. It's not oxygen in the tanks. It's screams. I shifted around a few more bottles, reading labels like laughter and anger and other emotions. I didn't know why, but 
they managed to contain human emotions. But what were they using them for? My train of thought was cut off as the people began to groan. I turned around, realizing that they had all woken up. They wriggled around, screaming under their masks as they knocked jars over, their eyes locked on me. My eyes shifted around to each of them. I wanted to help, but I didn't know how. Suddenly, loud footsteps began to echo from down the hall. I quickly slid into the corner, punching up into a ball and praying whoever it was would go away. Of course, nothing was ever easy, as I heard them getting closer, but the people wouldn't stop wriggling around. They wanted my help so desperately. I felt guilty, but I was left with no choice. I held my breath, pressing my knees against my chest as someone walked in. The people stopped moving at the sight of her presence. Calm down. You're making a mess for nothing. She berated them. She stood a few jars up, menacingly walking in front of them. She randomly stopped in front of one of them, caressing her finger across their face. What makes you think this was going to work? She asked in a childish, condescending tone. Their bulging eyes turned to me. She took notice of this. Have you seen a ghost or something? She asked, turning around. We locked eyes, my body paralyzed with pins and needles. Within a second, she came lunging at me. I impulsively grabbed a bottle off the shelf, smashed it against her head before she could reach me. The glass shattered, a deafening scream bursting from the bottle. She stumbled around, plugging her ears as blood trickled down her forehead. I ran out the door, pushing myself off the wall as I fell into it. I flew down the hall, my heartbeat in sync with my pounding footsteps. I hooked around the corner, almost crashing to the ground. I passed the elevator and found the staircase that she had to have come from. I tugged on the doorknob, on the brink of crying as it was locked. I noticed under the knob was a keyhole. I then realized she probably had the keys that I'd have to remove from her corpse when I murdered her. The basement had nothing to defend myself, so... I'd have to get creative. I peered around the corner, watching as she limped out of the room, a bottle in her hand. She stood in the middle of the hall, twisting the cap off the bottle. She quickly shoved the neck of the bottle into her mouth, a scream puffing up her cheeks as it ran in her throat. She swallowed the scream, beginning to breathe heavily. Then I realized, they're not just storing human emotions, they're consuming them. I observed from behind the wall as she growled with each breath, her skin slowly turning red and her irises glowing, and finally, dark, goat-like horns began to erect from her head, stopping as they curled. I felt like I was trapped with an enraged bull. She began storming down the hall, her feet practically about to crack the ground. Unable to hide, I needed to find something to fight. I looked around filled with hopelessness by the emptiness, until I noticed a hanging pipe, water dripping out the end. I quickly ran out in her line of sight, latching onto the pipe as I tried to break it off. She came barreling towards me as I pulled harder. When she was too close for comfort, I snapped the pipe off and swung it at her. I smashed the side of her head, leaving me shocked as the pipe bounced off her head, the metal vibrating. She stood unharmed. Her head had dented the pipe. It was like hitting a boulder. She yanked the pipe from my grip, swiftly swinging it at my head instead. I tumbled into the wall as my ear rang, blood instantly dripping down my face. My head pounded as I tried to see straight. Before I could even try and stand up, she wrapped her hand around my neck. She had the grip of a gorilla as she lifted me off the ground, about to crunch my throat. I grabbed at her arm as she hung me in the air, saliva bubbling through my teeth. Her eyes were ignited as they stared at me. Then... She tossed me across the hall. I fell through the air until I crashed to the ground, feeling like my ribs cracked on impact. With no time to stay down, I lifted myself with the last drops of adrenaline I had left and began stumbling down the hall. I desperately searched for a room to hide in as she stayed on my tail. I threw the janitor's closet door open, quickly throwing myself in and slamming the door shut. She immediately began tugging at the knob after I twisted the lock. Stepping backwards, pressing my back against the shelf, knocking over bottles of cleaning supplies. She then began hitting the door repeatedly. 
I needed to find a weapon, fast. If she had the strength to bend a metal pipe, she had the strength to break down a door. I searched the room in panic, throwing around mops and bottles. I looked behind me, the door about to cave in. I needed to use what I had to my advantage. I grabbed a bottle of bleach, shaking it to see how much was left. It was about half full. I quickly twisted the cap off, my hand trembling. The door came crashing down, wood chips flying across the small room. She shoved it out of the way, preparing to lunge at me. I whipped around and tossed bleach at her face. She shrieked in agony as it doused her eyes, spazzing as she grabbed at her face. She stumbled backwards, practically clawing at her eyes. I rushed over, ready to attack. As she removed her hands from her face, I plunged my fingers into her eyes. She wailed even louder as she tried to pull my arms away. I shoved my thumbs in farther, swirling them around her eye sockets until her eyeballs turned to mush. She dropped to her knees, letting out blood-curdling cries as blood streamed down her cheeks like tears. She swung her arms around aimlessly, her eyes entirely demolished. I wiped off my thumbs against my pants, covered in blood and chunks of flesh. I then wrapped my hands around one of her horns and began to pull. Her shrieks grew louder and louder as the horn began to detach from her skin, strings of flesh splitting like melted bubblegum. With one last tug, I tore the horn off, earning a scream from her that was worth trapping in a bottle. Blood squirted from her head as she let out breathless cries. I tilted my head as I observed the horn, rubbing my fingers against its grooves. I looked down at her, realizing she wasn't over with. I held the horn like a knife, aiming at her gaping mouth that continued to let out sounds of agony. I pierced the horn through her mouth, her face dropping as blood began pooling in her mouth and trickling past her lips. She fully dropped to the ground, blood gurgling in her throat. I pressed my back against the wall, slowly sliding to the ground. I just needed a moment to breathe. My side throbbed as I sat. The pipe had done good damage. I leaned my head back, wetting my dry eyes as I blinked slowly. I enjoyed breathing slowly, for once. How do I always get myself into these situations? I chuckled to myself. Satisfied with my short break, I stood up, groaning as my sore ribs ached. I flipped her corpse over, digging through her pockets until I found the keys. They jingled as I lifted them, dropping them in my pocket. As I was about to walk towards the staircase, I remembered the people. I couldn't just leave them. I went back to the room, their eyes lighting up with excitement at the sight of me. One by one, I unhooked them, helping them onto the ground. Thank you, thank you, a woman cried as she shook my hand, her whole body shaking. I had no idea what to say, so I just nodded. Before I led them to the staircase, I snatched a bottle of anger from the shelf and shoved it in my pocket. They seemed to be as good as grenades. I then left the room. The people followed behind me. They seemed to be stuck here for a long time, their legs weak like jelly. I unlocked the staircase, opening the door for them. Go, quickly, and call the police, I ordered, motioning for them to run. They squeezed through the door, desperate to escape. They ran up the stairs like a stampede, and were out of my sight quickly. I followed suit, my wounds throbbing as I limped up the stairs. I finally reached the first floor as I pushed open the door. I stepped into the main lobby, seeing rows of waiting chairs in the front desk. I made my way into the lobby and realized the exit was to my left. Except a man was standing in front of the glass doors. I froze in silence as I watched the man stare out the doors prisoners running in the distance. What have you done? His voice shook, bawling his fists as if he sensed my presence. It was the doctor that almost caught me earlier. He slowly turned around, the veins in his face bulging. His eyes were pure black, like staring into a void. You'll pay for this, he growled, his voice demonic. I ran away from sweet freedom as he came stomping towards me. I zigzagged around the hall as I pulled on every doorknob, being left with nothing but locked doors. I was so close, I couldn't die now. When I found an unlocked door, I threw it open and leapt inside. I slammed the door behind me, locking it quickly, 
I had entered an operating room, medical machinery standing around and a blue table in the middle. I began throwing open drawers, looking for any type of weapon. After finding useless things like stethoscopes, I snatched a bone saw. I almost jumped out of my skin as he began pounding on the door. I turned around, watching as it bounced on its hinges. I crept towards the door, facing my back against it as I got close. I slowly reached for the lock, twisting it to unlock the door. He tried to throw it open, but it was blocked by my body. He shoved his hand through the crack, trying to grab at me. That was my cue, as I threw my back against the door, loosing it on his wrist. He roared in pain from behind the door as he began kicking it, his trapped hand wriggling around. I reached over with the bone saw, pressing the blade against his wrist. He screamed in agony, rapidly kicking the door harder as I began to slice his hand off. The blade easily cut through his skin and muscle, blood squirting and dripping down the door. His hand began to slump as I hit his bone, blood pouring onto the floor. I gripped the saw with two hands as I cut through thick bone. He tried desperately to pull his hand out, but I kept enough pressure to keep it stuck. When I cut through his bone, I sliced through the rest of his skin, completely amputating his hand. It plopped into the pool of blood on the ground, white bone poking out of the stringy meat. Blood squirted out of his nub as he removed it from the door, my body pressure shutting it. I quickly locked it again, his wails ringing from behind the door. He was going to continue coming after me and I wouldn't be able to pull off another stunt like that again. I then remembered the bottle that I stored in my pocket. I pulled it off, twisting it around in my grip. I thought of the ways I could use it to my advantage, but none of them would kill him, until an idea popped up in my head that would either save my life or get me killed. I twisted the cap off, quickly shoving the bottle into my mouth. The sensation of the scream filling my mouth was indescribable. I could hear it in my ears. I squeezed my eyes closed as I somehow swallowed it. I stood for a moment, waiting for its effects to kick in. For a moment I was confused, as I felt completely fine, until my body began to feel hot. My limbs twitched as my skin grew hotter, the blood running through my veins feeling like magma. In mere seconds, I felt like I could split the earth in half with the stomp of my foot. I marched towards the door my body feeling weighted. I threw the door open, the knob banging against the wall. The doctor stood, his back facing me as he whimpered, his hand wrapped around his bleeding nub. I rushed up behind him, dropping my foot into the back of his leg. He grunted as he dropped to his knees, holding himself up with one hand. I cracked him over the head with my heel, knocking him flat on the floor. He groaned in pain as I planted my left foot on his back and my right on the bicep of his good arm. I reached down and began pulling his arm back. He choked out screams as his bone began to crack. It felt like a fire had ignited within me, harboring pure rage. I gave it one last tug and snapped his arm. He tried to kick his legs into my back as he cried. Blood gushed out of his arm, jagged bone tearing through his skin. I stepped off of him, planting my feet at each of his sides. He groaned through his hyperventilating as I balled his hair up in my fist, lifting his head. Please don't do this. My people need your resources. He begged through his agony. I ignored his pleas and pressed the blade against his threat. It felt like bombs were exploding in my chest, my muscles straining. I began rapidly easing back and forth at his throat. He gargled out screams as blood sprayed across the floor. I bared my teeth, my eyes wide open as I pumped hot air out through my teeth. I let out a roar as I sliced faster, his stringy flesh tearing apart. With one last slash, I decapitated him. I raised his severed head up, blood dripping onto his body. My chest pumped as my lungs inflated with air, my heart feeling like a firework. Then, I crashed. The rage in my body plummeted, leaving me feeling exhausted. I dropped the bone saw in the head, blood spurting out as it rolled across the floor. I stumbled off his body, my limbs feeling weighted. I trekked down the hall on the brink of fainting. When I neared the doors, I dropped to my knees. My muscles couldn't handle any more, my vision blurring, but I was so close. I had to keep moving. I moaned as I stood up, 
dragging myself towards the door. I shoved the door open, leaning on it so I didn't fall. I took in a deep breath of the soothing air, closing my eyes. I did it. Again. I then looked up as the sound of sirens in the distance caught my attention. I was filled with hope for once as three cop cars skidded into the parking lot. One of the officers hopped out of his car, rushing over to help me. I fell into his arms as he walked towards his car. You're okay. You're okay. He reassured me. He opened the car door, helping me in. I settled into the leather seat as he slammed the door shut. I watched in a daze as he sat in the driver's seat, speaking white noise into his handheld radio. I dissociated as I stared at the bars that separated the front and the back seats, feeling lightheaded. I said, what's your name? He suddenly asked, breaking me out of my trance. Maria, I answered, my throat dry. Okay, Maria. We got a call from a group of people claiming they were medical workers that were imprisoned and some crazy things about demons. They claimed you freed them. Is that true? He questioned slowly. I looked up at him in silence as I tried to get my thoughts together. I... Yes, I did. I answered. All right. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. We're just going to take you back to the station to get you patched up and... Then you'll have to go through questioning, he explained. I nodded weakly, rubbing my eyes. He started the car, and we began driving back to the station. The car ride was peaceful, but rare moments where I wasn't fighting for my life. I watched as the buildings flashed by in a blur, the clouds moving slowly. I couldn't believe it was finally over. I could breathe. I felt safe. Do you have any family we can contact? He suddenly asked. I turned to him, thinking of a way to answer that question. Family? I I killed my entire family. I thought about my mom's side of the family, people I hadn't spoke to in years. Would they even remember me? Or or take me in? Well, here's to hoping they aren't cannibals or demons. I had been looking forward to Friday all weekend. It was Diane's 14th birthday and we were going to have a slumber party at her house. Mama offered me a ride, but Diane only lived about half a mile from town, so I walked. Fact was, I liked walking. It gave me a chance to be alone with my imagination. I got to Diane's house about five in the afternoon. Casey had already been there a little while. Gail showed up about half an hour after I did. Diane's parents had planned on going to dinner and a movie, so we were going to be left to our own devices for a while. Not that we couldn't be trusted, I mean, we were pretty good girls as a rule, but we all knew that we had it in us to be bad. Whether we'd do anything our parents wouldn't approve of was yet to be seen, but personally, I liked the idea that we might. If we were going to do anything that might get us in trouble... Though, it was probably going to be something initiated by Casey. She had always been the instigator in our little group. The brave one. The one who would step across the line first and then coax us over. In fact, she had said that she was going to try to steal a bottle of vodka from her stepbrother's stash and bring it over for us to drink. Once Diane's parents had gone for the evening, though, Casey announced that the son of a bitch had drunk it all himself there hadn't been anything for her to take. Frankly, I was relieved, but like everybody else, I acted disappointed. After Casey finished insulting her stepfather, though, she got that devious look on her face, the one that let us know there was something going on in that wicked little brain of hers. I asked her what she was thinking. She grinned and said, Maybe I've got something better than vodka. What could be better than vodka? Gail asked, trying to sound tough. She was the most timid of our little foursome. This, Casey said. Then she reached in her backpack and pulled out a book. It was an old-looking book, too. Very old. The cover was dark and dirty, and its edges were frayed. The title was hard to read, but I finally made it out. It said, 
incantations and their defenses. We all looked between Casey and the book, and Casey was looking between the three of us, still wearing that devious grin. A book, Gail queried. Really? I'm sorry, Diane said, but are you really planning on reading us a ghost story or something? Gail added. Don't you think we're a little old for ghost stories? I don't think you're ever too old for ghost stories, Casey said with that familiar edge in her voice. But this isn't a storybook. What is it then? Diane asked. It's got spells in it, Casey replied. Spells and incantations. You mean like witchcraft? Diane asked. Casey sort of shrugged, as if not wanting to be bothered with labels. I... I don't think it's a very good idea, Gail said. I mean, that's devil worship kind of stuff. Good lord, Gail, Casey said. Get a hold of yourself before you faint or something. It's just a book, but it's from 1791. 1791? I asked. Casey opened it to the title page and showed me. Sure enough, it had been published in New York City in 1791. Where'd you get this? My stepfather's library. You stole it, Gail asked. Borrowed is the word I believe you're looking for, Casey said. As a tribution for the old bastard drinking up all his vodka. We all laughed a little, but then Gail asked... Well, what do you mean to do with it? Not me, Casey replied. Us. Okay then, Diane said. What are we going to do with it? I thought you'd never ask, Casey said. Then she turned on Diane's bedside lamp to fight off the gathering darkness. I took the liberty to go through it ahead of time, just to see if there was anything interesting. We all waited, and finally I prompted her. And? And I found this here, Casey said, then opened the book to a marked page and laid it on the bed. We all gathered around so we could see. The thing that struck me the most was the smell coming from the book. It was dank and moldy. It smelled of something very old that didn't want to be bothered. Like Granny's storm cellar used to smell when we'd sneak off in it. What's this? Diane asked. The title at the top of the page read Summons of Corson, and it was followed by what appeared to be a list of instructions, all written in a very legible hand. Who is Corson? Gail asked. Not who, so much as what? Casey replied, her grin returning. Corson is a demon, apparently. I knew it. Gail said, sounding more than a little scared. It's devil worship. Calm yourself, Gail, Casey teased. You're not the Virgin Mary. And besides, it's not devil worship. It's a demon. I don't like demons much neither, Casey rolled her eyes. Corson is one of the four kings that have power over the seventy-two demons constrained by King Solomon. Diane said, reading from her phone. And it says he's not to be conjured except on great occasions. This is a great occasion, Casey said to Diane. It's your birthday. I'm not worried about who or what Corson is, I said. I'm more worried about this book. As old as it is, it's probably pretty valuable. I don't think it's a very good idea for us to have it here. What if something happens to it? I don't want to be responsible. Of course, that led us into an all-out debate about the merits of us having the book, which Casey quickly turned into a referendum on our bravery. And sure enough, just like always, before long, she had convinced us that we were just being silly, and that we were obligated to see things her way. It was all nonsense anyway. There was no reason at all for us to not go through the motions of summoning up Corson, just for fun, of course. 
and also, just like always, Gail didn't so much agree as she found herself overwhelmed by the momentum of the group. The book directed us to sit around a lit candle and to pour a line of salt around us for our own protection. Diane went and got the salt from the kitchen and drew a large circle on her bedroom floor. Casey took a large candle from Diane's dresser, one that was about a foot in diameter and had three separate wicks, and set it in the middle of the circle. We all took our places in the circle, and I lit the candle. All three wicks. I don't think it's a good idea, Gail half whined. But really guys, let's, let's not do this. By then, our motivation was probably mostly about scaring Gail. It was clear she was very uncomfortable with what was going on. I'm not sure why we found it so entertaining to make her uncomfortable, but we did. I admit that I wasn't very nice, but that's how it was. Casey set the book next to the candle so we could all see it. And then she took the first step as listed in the instructions. She called upon Satan to hear our plea. The lamp on Diane's nightstand sort of flickered. Just a little, but it got our attention. That's enough, Gail demanded. This is foolish. We're, we're just asking for trouble. The book says we all have to be engaged, Casey scolded. Stop your whining and concentrate. Diane sort of laughed, but I couldn't tell for sure if she was making fun of Gail or if she was trying to convince herself that she was okay. As for me, I watched the lamp. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, it stayed steady. We have to all read the incantation, Kale said, looking mostly at Gale. Or it won't work, Gale said. I don't want it to work. I swear, Gale, Casey scolded. You have to be the biggest baby I know. I don't hear anyone else complaining. Gail looked down at her lap and sort of fussed with her fingers. She looked so small all of a sudden. There in the flickering candlelight, trying to be brave but not succeeding. Just then, a low growl came from Diane's bedroom door. I won't lie, it scared the shit out of me. I whirled around and was more than a little relieved to find Diane's dog, Buster, standing in the doorway. We were all relieved, I could tell. It's just a dog, Casey hissed. Are we going to do this or not? The breeze had picked up and was blowing through Diane's open window and licking all the flames on the candle. A little voice in my head said to tell Casey that no, we weren't going to do this. It was foolish, and she was starting to sound a little too enthusiastic about it for me to feel comfortable with. I didn't say that, though. Neither did Gail or Diane. We all just sat there, as though Casey truly did have some sort of power over us. I saw a tear trace down Gail's cheek. This was wrong. We should have quit it right then, but we didn't. Like I was saying, Casey finally said, we all have to read the incantation three times. She looked around the circle at each of us as if to drive the points home, and then she looked back to the book and started to read. Like the lemmings we apparently were, we read right along with her. Fire est bon an en wamb. Die drustum morum before come. An brist o colin seper de farin. Lot corson are be faristin beren. We all read slowly, phonetically, and after the first time, though, the wind picked up and blew out one of the wicks. We kept going, though, faster than the first time, like a rock starting to gather speed rolling down a hill. After the second time, though, the lamp flickered again, and then went out. I don't know why we didn't stop then, why I didn't get out of the circle. But I kept on reading with everybody else. The third time, though, we had sort of found a rhythm, like a chant, and I could feel tingling all over my back as we spoke the words, 
like tiny fingers were moving across my skin in waves. No sooner than we'd finished reading, the wind stopped blowing altogether. Everything became still and quiet. Buster, who'd been standing in Diane's bedroom door this entire time, let out with a little whimper and scampered away. I could hear his paws clacking as he descended the staircase to the first floor. I didn't feel right. This, uh, this situation didn't feel right. I couldn't have said what it was, but something was wrong. Something was really wrong. Just then, Buster started barking wildly, like maybe there was an intruder in the house or something. Then I thought I heard another little whimper, and Buster stopped barking. By then, I was so scared I could hardly breathe. I didn't know what to do. You bunch of babies, Casey said, and then she stood up. Where are you going? Gail blurted out. You can't leave the circle, you'll, you'll destroy the protection. What protection? Casey laughed. It's a circle of salt. No sooner than she'd stepped across the line, Diane's bedroom door slammed shut with such force I thought the hinges would break. All of us screamed. At least I think we all did. Maybe it was just me and Gail. But regardless, after she'd composed herself and over Gail's protests, Casey started for the door. She said, I told Tommy to come over if he could. Tommy was her boyfriend, her 16-year-old boyfriend. It's probably just him and his friends messing with us. Uh, no, don't go, Gail protested, but it was too late. Casey opened the door and headed out of our sight. I looked at the other two, still sitting there in the circle of salt with me, and it was plain that they were every bit as scared as I was. Then there came a low, malevolent sounding growl from the first floor. It wasn't loud, but we could all hear it, and it filled me to the top with fear. Not two seconds later, Casey reappeared in Diane's doorway, and she was white as a sheet. I don't think I'd ever seen such a look of terror on somebody's face, not even in a movie. I, I, I'm so sorry. Casey managed to choke out through her fear. I, I had no idea. Right then, there came a heavy footstep on the stairs. Then another. And then another. Casey looked over her shoulder, tears forming in her eyes. And then, without saying another word, she sprinted across Diane's bedroom floor and went out the open window onto the roof of the front porch. She bounded across it, and without even hesitating, leapt from the roof to the ground. The footsteps from the staircase stopped, and then seemed to reverse course. We could hear them echo from downstairs as though passing through the den, and then we heard the front door squeak open. I wanted to get up and look out the window, to discover what it was that had just apparently let itself out of the house, but fear had a grip on me. I couldn't make myself move. I didn't want to leave the circle. What are we going to do? Gail whispered, laced with tears and fear. I only managed to shake my head slowly, and then she began reciting the Lord's Prayer, rocking back and forth as she spoke the words. I looked at Diane. She seemed as dumbfounded and as uncertain as I was about what to do. In the name of God, I kept thinking, what had we done? What had our silliness unleashed? It wasn't long, probably less than a minute after we'd heard the front door open. There came another sound wafting through the window. It was almost like a scream, but maybe mixed with laughter somehow. How odd. Had it been laughter, though, or something else? I couldn't tell for sure, but whatever it was, it didn't last long. Like Buster's barking, it just stopped. Like somebody had pushed a button and turned it off. Call somebody, I said to Diane. She was the only one of the three of us who had a phone. Call somebody. Call 911. She sort of froze and then looked towards her nightstand. You left it over there? I asked, exacerbated that she would do something so foolish. 
But then, of course, I realized it hadn't been foolish at all. I mean, it wasn't as though a reasonable mind would have concluded that a little interaction would work. Regardless, it was clear that she wasn't inclined to leave the circle, so I forced myself to do it. I grabbed the phone off the table and hurried back to my spot by the candle. Here, I said, thrusting the phone towards her. She took it from me, and after looking at it for a few seconds, pressed at the screen. She looked back at me, fresh fear on her face. What's wrong? I asked. The, the battery. It's dead. Of course it would be dead, wouldn't it? But where's your charger? Downstairs. No sooner than she'd spoken the word, we heard it. The heavy footsteps on the porch, then in the den, and finally to the staircase. My heart was racing so fast I could no longer feel the individual heartbeats. It was more like a constant hum in my chest. It didn't take long for the footsteps to reach the top of the stairs. Then they started down the hall, towards Diane's bedroom. Our eyes were all glued to the doorway. Our collective terror escalated with each new footfall. We were unable to move, just as we were unable to believe what appeared to be happening. I became aware that Gail had latched herself to my arm, squeezing so hard that it hurt. But I didn't care. All I cared about was whatever was walking down the hall towards us, and why we couldn't seem to move. It felt like it went on forever, the heavy footsteps moving even closer. There wasn't much light at all coming from the hall, barely enough to detect. There was enough, however, for us to see it as it entered the doorway. Or rather, for us to see its outline. It was like a shadow, all dark, and its form largely filled the space from side to side and top to bottom. All of a sudden, a wave of stench wafted over us, so putrid I almost gagged. It smelled like rotted meat packed with maggots, like old and insistent decay, like my granny's storm cellar, only a thousand times worse. Gail had started praying again. I tried to remove my arm from her grasp, maybe because I thought I needed it to defend myself or something, but she wasn't inclined to let me have it. We heard the low growl again, and the stench in the room got worse. All of a sudden, Diane bolted up and into the bathroom, a Jack and Jill bathroom leading to another bedroom, and the entity disappeared from the doorway. Before I'd even managed to wrap my arms around what Diane had done, Gail shot up as well and headed for the door the entity had just vacated, probably because I was thoroughly petrified and had lost the ability to think clearly. I followed after Gail. It was almost too dark to see, but I heard Gail head down the stairs. I chased after her. I thought I saw Buster lying on the floor over by the fireplace, but I didn't even consider stopping to check on him. Gail flew out the front door, screaming and crying by then, and I kept following after her. She leapt over the porch steps all the way to the ground and kept running. I tried to do the same, but managed to trip when I landed and crash hard into the ground. I could still hear Gail screaming as she ran away from me, farther and farther away as I struggled to my feet, only to discover I had sprained my ankle. The pain was excruciating, and I fell right back down. And then I heard another scream, but it wasn't coming from Gail. It was coming from inside the house, from Diane. It was shrill and sharp, then there was a choking sound, and then there was quiet. Oh my god. I scrambled back to my feet and started to limp along best I could, chasing after Gail, but she was already gone. Not only could I no longer hear her, but I couldn't see her anymore either. She had disappeared into the darkness, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to find her. I knew that I was alone and I knew that whatever that thing in the house was, it was coming. I couldn't move fast enough to escape. I knew that too, so I made a sharp left and headed into the woods. Just then, I heard something walk out onto the front porch, something heavy sounding, 
so I dove down into a little stand of bushes and tried to be as quiet as I possibly could. I was terrified. It was like everything I'd always known about the world had gotten turned on its head. Monsters were real, weren't they? It wasn't like I'd come to believe at all that they were just stories people made up to scare each other. They were real. Whatever was on the porch began to look my way. At least it seemed like it did to me. I just closed my eyes and tried to lie perfectly still. I was praying inside my head, but I didn't make a sound. Just then I heard a car turn into the driveway, its headlights flooding the yard and then the front porch. To my shock, to my amazed relief, I saw that the thing on the front porch, the thing I'd been so terrified of, was in fact Diane. Seemingly in a daze, she found her way down the front steps and waited as the car pulled up right in front of her. It was her parents, home from the movies. Thank God. I scrambled out from underneath the bushes and limped my way to the front of the car, to where Diane's parents were examining her. I was still frightened out of my wits, mind you, thinking that there was a demon named Corson somewhere in the house and that we were all in mortal danger but there was something about being in the presence of grown-ups that always made things better. They could handle it, but they could fix it. It took me a moment to see why Diane's parents seemed so concerned, though. Why they kept looking at her and asking her questions. Diane's neck was bruised all the way around, reddish and turning blue. It was like someone had choked her hard, like they'd meant to do her real harm. I shuddered to think what had gone on in the house once me and Gail had run out the front door. Things got a little sketchy for me from there. As far as Diane's parents were concerned, Casey was missing, that Gail was missing. I'd been hiding in the woods, and Diane looked as if she'd been choked half to death. The police came, and that's when they found Buster. He was lying by the fireplace where I'd seen him, and he was dead. They ultimately decided that he'd stumbled down the stairs and broke his back. Of course, that didn't explain how he'd gotten all the way across the room from the base of the stairs to the fireplace. But I guess they had bigger fish to fry. The police found Casey. She was lying in a drainage ditch out by the road, unconscious and badly bruised. They speculated that she might have gotten hit by a passing car, maybe by someone who hadn't even known they'd hit her because they never did find the culprit. Fortunately, though, her injuries weren't life-threatening, but she did have to stay in the hospital for a while. They didn't find Gail until early the next morning. She was sitting in the front pew of the Catholic Church, naked as a jaybird. After a number of interviews by people in the psychology world, they determined she was badly traumatized, to the point of having broken from reality just a little. Her family decided to send her to a convent to convalesce. I didn't understand that at all, but it wasn't for me to say. My dad is an atheist, so I pretty much know how he was going to react to all of this. If he didn't believe in God, it was unlikely he believed in demons. He was concerned, though, just like everybody else. I do think he thought there might have been a reason other than my imagination I told him the story I told. I'm pretty sure all the grown-ups believed we'd gotten hold of some bad dope, but I know that's to be untrue. Because of Diane's and Casey's injuries, though, they drug-tested all of us. As it turns out, Diane and Casey had been smoking pot before me and Gail showed up that evening. I'm pretty sure that hadn't had anything to do with what had gone on, but in the end it made us all sound less than credible. So, because they found drugs in her system, Nobody really believed what Casey had said about the events of that evening. As for Diane, she conveniently developed a case of amnesia. Couldn't remember a thing from the time Casey had gotten there until her parents came home and found her on the porch. I don't believe her, though. I think she remembers everything, just like I do. For whatever reason, she just doesn't want to face it. I guess I can understand that, but as for me, I... I can't forget. I know in my heart that something abnormal went on that night, and it scares me to death to think that it could happen again. I had to talk to the police a lot. I must have talked to them a dozen times in the weeks after. 
and I almost told them the exact same story. I knew I always told them the same story because I always told them the truth. Curiously though, they never found the book. We had all told them about it, but they never found it, or at least not that they admitted to. It could have been that one of them was a less than honest book aficionado, and he decided to add it to his collection. I don't really care. As long as I never have to see it again, that's fine with me. Finally, though, the police stopped coming around, and things started moving back towards normal. But they never would be the same, would they? I mean, how could they? My therapist doesn't think it's strange for me to believe the story I keep telling, but just like the police, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I'd seen what I'd seen, and I'd heard what I'd heard. Maybe we'd been a part of something we weren't intended to. Maybe that's why the book disappeared. Obviously, there are things in this world beyond my ability to understand. All I know for sure is that I'll never go out to Diane's house again, and for the foreseeable future, I'll be sleeping with the light on. My brother, Colin, and I always got along. Sure, we occasionally had fights like most siblings do, but when it came to what we enjoyed, we had a fair amount in common. However, it wasn't until our father took us to a popular caving spot in our town that we realized our favorite thing to do was to go splunking. Even as the years went on and hobbies came and went, there was just something about the exhilaration of exploring caves that just made us love it more as the years went on. The two of us loved it so much, in fact, that when we were adults, we got side jobs giving tours at a local cave. Once we were finished up for the day, we dropped off our equipment and went for a walk in the forest, sharing stories and having a laugh. We didn't see each other too often throughout the year due to our boring office jobs, so getting to do this was a great way to catch up. However, although we knew the woods well enough, we weren't cocky. Even people who knew a forest like the back of their hand could get lost if they weren't careful. Because of that, whenever we went out for walks, My brother brought an orange highlighter with him, so if we ever went off the trail, he'd draw thick lines on the trees so we could retrace our steps. It had happened on a Friday, when Colin and I were walking down the trails and chatting. We absentmindedly played catch while we chatted, tossing a ball Colin bought at a gift shop for his kid. It was when he accidentally tossed it too far and I went off the trail to get it, that I ended up finding a cave. There was a small open area, where the trees briefly parted for a small field of grass. Its entrance almost looked like that of a jagged mouth, the rocks hanging off its roof ending in sharp points like a set of sharp teeth. We were confused, as we had never seen a cave in this area before, but figured we probably were just in a spot that happened to look similar, with the only difference being that there was a cave. We tried to peer inside it, but found it was too dark to see anything. After a bit of debating, we eventually decided against exploring it. It was getting late, and neither of us had brought any equipment. It wasn't a good idea to go into an unknown cave without the proper supplies, especially when it was almost night, so we decided to head home. To make remembering the spot easier, however, Colin took out his highlighter and marked a couple of extra trees, so we would be able to get back to the spot without much hassle. We met up the next day in the morning, this time with proper equipment. I wasn't too fond of walking all the way back to the cave, now that a bunch of gear and a backpack my spine was getting crumbled under was weighing me down, but I was super excited to check out a new spot. As we reached the first tree with an orange line and began tracing our steps back to the spot, the two of us just couldn't help but ramble about how excited we were. I mean, this was potentially a cave that no one else had gone spelunking in before. For us, two brothers who had been doing this for years, the thought of getting a cave named after us, while probably unlikely, was exciting nonetheless. However, 
When we finally got through the cluster of trees and into the open space the mouth of the cave rested upon, that eagerness was snuffed out, as well as our happy smiles and joking attitudes. Instead, it was replaced with confusion at what was before us, or rather, what wasn't before us. The entrance was gone, and I don't mean there was a cave-in or anything like that. The entire cave was gone, replaced with nothing more than bundles of dandelions and unusually vibrant green grass. At first, after the confusion cleared away, we tried to be practical about it. Maybe we took a wrong turn, maybe the lines on the trees were from a different trip and just hadn't faded yet, etc. But each reason ended up falling flat. We didn't see any faded markings on the trees when we first went into the trail yesterday, and the ones we used to retrace our steps still looked new, so we couldn't really have taken a wrong turn either. Still, we searched around, looking to see if we were just being stupid, but after hours of walking, Exhaustion took its toll on us, and we decided to call it quits. As I told my wife about what had happened over a cup of coffee, she suggested that it was something else we just happened to mistake for a cave. Had we only glanced at it from afar, I probably would have agreed, but we were right up close to the cave's entrance, trying to see if we could make out anything in its darkness. There was no way it wasn't a cave. Cut to a few weeks later in August, Colin and I are still on good terms, and splunking is still one of our favorite activities. The cave incident, uh, while weird, faded in the back of our minds, and became nothing more than something we'd sometimes tell folks during guided tours, occasionally fabricating some stuff about seeing ghosts just for fun. Both Colin and I had an annual thing we did every summer, where, while visiting our hometown, the two of us would head over to the first cave our dad took us to and go on a guided tour in memory of him. We were halfway to the site, gear in hand, when I saw something off the trail and stopped my brother. I went up to it, and my brother followed soon after. Once I got up close enough, I felt a funny feeling in the pit of my stomach when I realized what it was. It was a cave entrance one I was almost certain I had seen somewhere else. I turned to Colin, seeing that, by his expression, he'd shared the same confusion that I had. This cave looked almost identical to that bizarre cave we saw all those months ago. But that was impossible. Our hometown was an eight-hour drive away from where we saw that cave. There was no way that this was the same one. The idea of checking out the cave came to mind, but... At the same time, something felt off. I took a step forward, but my brother stopped me. He wore an odd expression, seeming like he wanted us to check it out, but a part of him was saying no. Eventually, after glancing back and forth at me in the cave a couple times, he'd suggested that he'd go and check it out himself for a couple of minutes, then let me know if it was safe so we could go exploring after our guided tour was done with. Part of me was fine with it, but another part of me was screaming, no, that I needed to tell him to get away from the cave, that it wasn't safe, but he ignored it. Figuring I was just making something out of nothing, I watched as Colin turned on the light of his helmet, smiling at me and giving me a thumbs up, which I returned, before he turns back to the cave and descended into the darkness. It was at this point that I glanced down at my watch and realized that we had been debating over checking out the cave a lot longer than I thought. We didn't really have enough time to check out the cave before the tour started. For moments, I felt relieved, glad that the things I was worried about, whatever they were, wouldn't come into fruition. I looked up, about to call out to my brother to come back and forget about the cave for now. I never made it past the first word before it was caught in my throat, like a fly in honey. The cave was gone. In the few seconds I had taken my eyes off of it to look at my wrist, it had vanished, replaced with a familiar patch of daisies and vibrant green grass. For a moment I just froze, like a deer in headlights, 
I stared at the flowers and grass, uh, my brain trying to process the fact that there was a cave here just a few moments ago. The cave was gone, as was my brother. That's when I panicked. I started calling out to my brother, hoping he was nearby and safe. The quiet callings of my brother's name soon grew in volume, growing louder and louder until I was practically screaming it, praying that he was okay and that this was just a prank, that any second now, He'd sneak up behind me and give me a good fright, and then a good laugh afterwards. When there was no response, my franticness increased. I ran up to the patch of daisies and grass and ripped them out of the ground, putting my ear to the earth and trying to see if I could somehow hear Colin's muffled voice underneath the soil. But there was nothing. It was then I thought I was dreaming. I scrunched my eyes and gave my arm a hard pinch. I opened my eyes only to be met with the same forest, and that's when I realized I wasn't dreaming. My brother was really gone. In an instant, the cave had vanished and took him with it. As I hurried over to the nearest police station, I debated whether I should mention the cave at all, but I eventually decided against it. I knew I would look crazy, rambling about a cave that vanished and took my brother along with it, so I left it out when I explained what happened. All I told them was that one moment he was with me in the forest, and when I turned around, he was gone. They never found him. The forest was combed, and dogs were sent out to track his scents, but even the dogs seemed unable to find anything, apparently stopping in their tracks and sitting, staring at nothing. I was questioned a bit more, but I never mentioned the cave. It's been a few years now since my brother went missing. I still give tours at the popular caves around our area, and not because I still enjoy spelunking, but because since my wife and I have two children now, we need the extra money more than anything. While I give tours, I bring up my brother to those who would lend an ear to listen. I shared some fun stories about the things we did when we went spelunking as kids, though I didn't bring up his disappearance. It's a small thing, but I find it's the least I can do to help keep the memory of my best friend alive. However, that's not why I'm telling this story. While I miss my brother dearly, that isn't the reason why I'm writing this after all these years. Not the main reason, anyway. I'm telling this story because it's back. A few weeks ago, the cave started reappearing. At first, I thought it was after my kids, but now I think that's not the case. I think it's after me. It doesn't matter whether I'm on a trail in a forest or just outside of it. It doesn't matter whether the forest is small or large, thick or thin. I always see it. No sound comes from its gaping maw, but I find it beckoning me urging me to find the remnants of the brother I lost all those years ago and uncover the truth. But the scariest part of all is... is that I almost kind of want to. My name is Clem. I grew up in a little town in South Louisiana called Chickapen, about an hour west of New Orleans and right on the edge of the deep bayou. There were channels everywhere, and you could make it from my backyard all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico by boat. We'd spent time on the water just about every day since I could remember, and we knew the waterways in Terrebonne Parish like the back of our hands. Me and my cousin Rake were about the same age and we partnered up a lot when we were kids. There were times when we'd spend most of our day on the bayou, hunting and fishing and trapping. That's what life was. For the longest time, that's about all it was. There was one particular day, or night, should I say, that stands out above all the rest, though. A night I still have bad dreams about all these years later. It happened when we were about twelve, me and Drake, and we'd gotten out on the bayou late in the evening to run some traps. 
Daddy and Uncle Billy pretty much let us go wherever we wanted to because they knew they could trust us. They knew we knew our way around and they knew we could handle ourselves. We were also supposed to stay inside certain boundaries. To the south, that meant staying out of the ship canals and not portaging over any land barriers that would let us get too far from home. We usually minded those boundaries, but, well, sometimes we didn't. The night I'm talking about was one of those nights when we decided to take some liberties. There were a series of traps we'd set along a part of the bayou we couldn't get into on our little aluminum boats, unless we either skirted along the edge of the ship canals for a ways, or else portaged along a small stretch of land. About a hundred yards or so, once we'd paddled out to the ship canal and saw that it was clear, we decided to take our chances. The wake from even a smaller ship could swarm us if they passed too close but we could see far enough both ways to feel comfortable. Besides, portage was always a pain, especially in the dark. We'd made it about halfway to the channel we were headed to when things took a turn. I was in the back of our boat, so I saw it first, a small freighter coming up from behind us. I got Rake's attention and pointed at the ship, and we both knew what to do without further discussion. We dug in deep, paddling as hard as we could. Still, I yelled at Rick to paddle harder as the ship drew near. I could see the edge of the channel we were headed to, as the ship's bow pulled up even with us. To tell the truth, I half expected to get wet, but we turned into our little channel just as the ship's wake reached us. We rode on top of the wave for a ways until it died down. Then we laughed and thanked our lucky stars semi-disaster avoided. It was a pretty clear night. There was a full moon over us with only the occasional cloud, so we could see well enough to navigate even without our flashlights. There were cypress trees all around, and the Spanish moss hung thick all around, giving the trees a ghostly air. I loved that about the bayou. It always gave me a sense that I was a part of something that wasn't quite squared away. The first trap we came to didn't have nothing, so we moved on towards the next one. It was around a bend and on a little peninsula that was just barely higher than the water. As we paddled nearer and Rake shined the light, we both saw it. Two bright eyes shining back at us, and from the look of them, they belonged to something large. You could always feel your heart rate get up when you caught something especially if it was bigger than a coon or a possum. I could tell that this was bigger. We were eager to get there, but because we were seasoned trappers, we knew to take our time. Steady strokes uh, do nothing to get the animal more excited or scared than it already was. We must have still been about forty or so feet away when Rake stopped paddling, though. I stopped too, and we kept drifting slowly towards the bank. I shined my light at the trap, and finally saw what he'd already seen. It wasn't a normal animal there on the bank, at least not one we'd expect to catch. It was a gator, but not just any gator. Maybe the biggest gator I'd ever seen. It had to have been 16 to 18 feet long, and 1500 pounds, if it was a pound at all. It also wasn't caught in our trap. It was just sitting there on the bank, looking right at us, sort of grinning, like it was inviting us on up. Come on, boys, I've got room. Rake had done the right thing by not making any sudden moves, but my body didn't seem inclined to follow suit. I began paddling backwards as hard as I could, and in no time flat I'd stopped our forward progress and started us back in the way we had come. By then, there was no point in Rake staying still, so he started paddling as well. He turned us around so our bow was in front, and we stayed at it. By then, though, the gator had slithered into the water and disappeared beneath the surface. Talk about your heart rate going up. My heart was rattling in my chest like that playing card I'd stuck in my bicycle spokes. 
Even though it wasn't common for a gator to chase after a boat, we kept going until my arms burned like they were about to fall off, and then we both stopped paddling and looked behind us. Rake stood up in the front of the boat so he could shine his light at the water back towards the peninsula without me blocking it. I saw several water moccasins swimming towards the light as they were prone to do, but I didn't see no gator. It occurred to me, though, that the light was as likely to attract a gator as it was a snake, so I yelled at Rake to put out the light. He did, but it was too late. Just as he switched it off, I saw it rise up. The top side of the gator's massive head not more than five feet behind us. His big eyes focused right on us. I could see the water rippling too, way back behind where his tail was swimming slowly. Good lord, he was big. Rake saw him too, but I yelled at him anyway. I was already paddling before his butt hit the seat, and we both started digging at the water as hard as we could. It wasn't but a few seconds later, though, that something bumped up against us on the side, so hard it almost tipped us over. Rake lost his paddle, and it went in the water. I didn't care. Once the boat had settled, I kept on paddling. We had a 22 caliber rifle and a 22 caliber pistol in the boat with us. I didn't figure either of them would do a bit of good against that gator's hide, but since Rake had lost his paddle, he grabbed up the pistol. The gator pushed up against the side of our boat again, but not as solid as before. It didn't cause me to break stride. There was another bump, then a while later it felt like the gator tried to come up from under the boat. It sort of lifted us up on the water, and then it went away. I paddled for about as long as I could, and then I stopped. I could see the ship canal from where I was. I told Rake that I didn't think it was wise for us to go out in the ship canal, especially since we didn't have but one paddle. Of course, we could come across something unpleasant on land if we chose to portage, but as long as we had our guns, we should be able to manage. So that's what we decided to do. In any event, we didn't need to sit where we were for very long. That gator could have gotten bored and moved on, but we couldn't be sure of that. We needed to move. Rake shined his light over to the left bank, and pretty sure he found the spot we usually used as a landing. I started moving us in that direction, but no sooner than I got us turned that way, Rake yelled at me to look out, and then fired several shots right past my shoulder. I turned just in time to see the huge gator coming at me, his whole head out of the water with his jaws wide, and just about to come over the stern. I remember thinking in that split second how big his teeth were, and they were huge. Anyway. I launched myself forward towards Rake just as the animal landed its head where I'd been sitting. And all at once, the boat pitched up hard and rolled. Me and Rake landed in the bayou. The water was still deep enough to be over our heads this close to the ship channel. And I was disoriented at first, having got under in all that blackness. Of course, it didn't help that I was completely panicked. But soon enough, I remembered to stay still and look for light. I saw some pretty quick, moonbeams on the surface, and I swam up to the top. The boat was upside down, but it was just a few feet away from me. I got hold of it about the same time Rake did. I sure was glad to see him there, but I was just as aware that we were truly in mortal danger and had to get going. Rake said it too, that we had to get to land, we had to get to the bank. I said we should stay with the boat. And we did. Him on one side and me on the other, paddling towards the shore. We had just reached the point where our feet could touch the bottom when I felt something brush up against my leg. Something heavy and rough. No doubt it was the gator, and its body scraped on by my thigh all the way from its front leg to its back leg. I was so scared it felt like my soul was about to shoot out of my body, and I couldn't help but freeze. I stood perfectly still. Rake asked me what was wrong, but before I could answer, the gator took hold of him and yanked him under. I know I screamed. I know it's not manly at all, but I screamed. I called his name over and over, but I couldn't see him anywhere, him or the gator for that matter. 
No sign at all. I wasn't really thinking clearly by then either, but I managed to turn the boat back over and climb in. As fate would have it, the only thing left in our boat was my paddle. No guns, no flashlights, no nothing but my paddle. Yet I got jammed up under my seat somehow when the gator had come crashing down on it. Needless to say, maybe, but by then I had become hysterical. I mean, it didn't seem real. How was it possible that my cousin was out there somewhere under the water in the jaws of a huge gator? It was too awful to consider, yet that seems to be the story. That was what there was. That was all there was. And gators didn't eat you right away, neither. They took you under in a death roll until you were drowned. Then they stuffed you under a ledge or log or something and left you there to rot. But once you were ready, they'd come back for you and eat you piece by piece. For all the world and everything in it. How could that be my cousin Rake's destiny? To rot under a log and then be ate up by a huge gator. There was nothing, though. No sound but the occasional hoot of an owl and the croak of a bullfrog. And I thought I heard a big cat growl, but other than that, the bayou was quiet. Then, all of a sudden, not far from me, there came a big splash and a fuss across the surface of the water. I saw Rake. He was trying to swim away from the gator, but the gator was practically on top of him. And only a second or so later, they both went back under. This was horrible. The most horrible thing I could imagine, and I was living it. I paddled over to where they'd gone down, but there was nothing to be seen. A few seconds later, though, they came back up, more out towards the middle. I yelled out his name. He managed to look my way for a split second, and he yelled my name. But then the gator took him under again. I didn't know how I knew, but it was clear to me right then and there that hearing him call my name like that and seeing the gator take him under would haunt me for the rest of my life. I started towards where they'd been, but then they came up again, more towards the bank. At this time, not only did he call my name, but he also screamed the word help, and screamed it he had, like nothing I'd ever seen. The sound of his voice was the embodiment of terror, and hearing it made my skin crawl all over. Then, like before, they disappeared beneath the water, and the last thing I saw was Rake's hand clawing at air, trying to find anything to grab a hold of. I desperately paddled towards them again, and I started looking, hollering for them, bending over the side of the boat so far trying to see under the water that I almost fell out. Too long. He'd been under too long this time. There was no way he could still be alive. I came to know that in my heart, in a feeling of evil and darkness like I'd never even imagined possible began to settle over me. This was more than I could bear. I didn't see how I could find my way back to any form of sanity. I could feel it in my whole body like a weight, like a prison, and I could barely breathe. Suddenly, and without any warning at all, Something came crashing through the surface of the water right beside my boat, like it had been shot out of a cannon. Miracle of miracles. It was Rake. And he was most of the way in before and he was most of the way in the boat before I could even get over and help drag him the rest of the way in. He flopped in on the boat's bottom like a big fish, and before I could fully grasp the reality of what had just happened, he was screaming at me to paddle, to get to land. He wouldn't shut up about it. And finally, I made my way to my seat and started paddling for sure. Rake was breathing hard and moaning just about every other breath. But I couldn't tend to him just then. I had to get us to shore. I was afraid to look over my shoulder to see if we were being followed, but finally I couldn't help it. Sure enough, there it was. That big gator was right behind us, no more than three feet back just skimming along with nothing showing but the top of its head and back, with its tail swishing back and forth real slow. Just a second later, I ran the boat aground and hopped over Rake and out the front so I could drag it all the way up. 
Once I'd done it, I looked out over the water, fully expecting to see the gator coming up after us. But to my surprise, I didn't see him anywhere. I didn't quite trust it. I mean, it could have popped out of the water at any moment. But the relief I felt in that instant was indescribable. Anyway, whether the gator was coming after us or not, I had to get farther from the water, so I dragged the boat a good twenty yards inland. Only then did I dare give Rake a good look, and what I saw was ghoulish. He had blood on him in lots of places, but the thing that got to me the most was his leg, his right leg. From the knee all the way down to his foot, there was nothing but bone. No skin, no meat, just bone. The little bone in back was just hanging loose, and I could see where the big bone was almost broken too. The thing that I found so odd, though, was that his shoe was still on his foot. His leg had gone through all of that, and somehow his shoe had managed to stay on his foot. Anyway, I tried to talk to him, but he wasn't making any sense. I could see that his leg was bleeding bad from just below his knee, and I knew that he was bound to bleed to death if I couldn't find a way to stop it, or at least slow it down. Frankly, I don't know how I managed the presence of mind, but somehow right then I knew what I had to do. I took off my belt and wrapped it around his thigh right above the knee, and pulled it tight, as tight as I could, and then I wrapped it around again and tied it off. I could see the bleeding slow down, seemed like by a lot. No sooner than I got the belt cinched in place, though, I heard the low growl of a big cat, maybe the one I'd heard when I'd still been out on the water, somewhere real close. Maybe it had been watching, stalking us, waiting to see if we'd managed to escape the gator and make it to dry land. By then, no doubt, smelling all that blood was wetting its appetite. I had to admit my imagination was in fear-fueled overdrive, but there wasn't a doubt in my mind that there was a panther nearby, and that it was going to come for us. I couldn't just sit there and wait for it to attack, though, so I hopped over the boat and started dragging it, which wasn't that easy by myself in the dark, with Rake lying up towards the front of it. I almost tripped several times over roots and such, but I managed to keep my balance and to keep going. I could hear it, though. I could hear the big cat pacing us, probably waiting for the right moment. I stopped to listen, and it stopped. I started back up, and it came along. It was crazy. I felt completely vulnerable, yet I was unable to do anything about it. If only our guns weren't at the bottom of the bayou. I'd made it about three quarters of the way across, and I'd stopped the rest, just for a minute but I had to stop. That's when it happened. The panther came at me in a flash and knocked me back into the boat. I came down on top of Rake, and the panther came down on top of me. I knew in my heart that we'd come to the end, because there was a full-grown cat on me, and I was still just a boy, all alone without any means to protect myself. The moment was near. I could feel it. Just when my will to live was about to succumb to the panther's desire to eat, though, I heard it. It was a shot, coming from very near, and in that instant the big cat went limp and fell lifeless upon me. I scrambled over from under it and managed to find my feet in a hurry. What a strange memory. The sight of seeing Rake and that panther lying side by side in the bottom of that boat, one barely alive the other dead as a stone. It all seemed like a dream, even then, but I knew it wasn't. Just then I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was my daddy. I could say with complete confidence that I'd never been so glad to see somebody in all my life, before or since. Him and Uncle Billy and two of their friends had come looking for us when we hadn't made it back for supper, and luckily for us they had. I told them what had happened real quick, and just as quick, Daddy and Uncle Billy carried us to their boat and took us back to the house so they could get Rake to the hospital. Their friends stayed back. They had a gator to hunt and kill. Rake lost his leg below the knee, but he kept his life. 
I still don't understand how he managed to get away from that big gator, but he had. I can't even imagine what those few minutes must have been like for him, fighting against that beast under the dark water. Unlike me and the panther, I've always thought that maybe his will to live had been stronger than the gator's desire to eat. Maybe that's true, and maybe it's not. All I know for sure is that all these years later, I still travel all over those bayou channels, and so does Rake. And just like when we were kids, sometimes we follow the rules, and sometimes we don't. I loved reading as a kid, and devoured books growing up. A healthy diet of reading soon got me interested in writing, and the stories I loved the most were from the horror genre. Authors like Poe, Lovecraft, and Hitchcock, to more contemporary writers like King, Straub, and Kuntz. I dabbled in some short stories but never really submitted or published. I guess I lacked the confidence. That changed one day after a local author, a Jeremiah Preston, delivered a short lecture on writing at my high school. After the session, Mason, my best friend, kept nagging me to let Preston look at a couple pieces I'd brought along. I got to within six feet of the author before I blanched and was about to beat a hasty retreat when Mason opened his big mouth. Mr. Preston, Mr. Preston! The author looked up from signing a book to our language teacher. My friend here is quite the aspiring writer himself and was wondering if you could look at some of his work. I turned blue and I swore I would punch Mason when I heard Preston say, sure. By the time I turned, he was already standing in front of us, medium build and wearing a brown blazer at no tie. He had a wide smile on his tanned face and short blonde hair. Maybe if he had just ignored us that day, things would have gone differently. But if wishes were horses. He was very encouraging. Preston said he thought I had potential. He urged me to take risks and to put my work out there, recommending some online sites. By the time I got home, I couldn't wait to get started. I had quite a few short stories in my archive. Blood Camp, Grim Tales, The Ghost in the Hedge but they were fluff, not good enough to post. I had to create something new, something unique. My parents had migrated to New York from a small island in the Caribbean when I was just a baby. Now that I'm 16, most of my knowledge of the place came from the stories they would tell my little sister and I. Caribbean folklore was full of colorful and terrifying characters. And whenever my grandparents visited, Grandpa Mike would always regale us with scary stories he swore were true, and uh, to be honest, as a kid I was terrified. It was from these stories I decided to draw my inspiration and set out to do research like any good author. After school the next day, Mason and I headed over to a Haitian craft shop I knew about that was not too far from the school. We both rode bikes, and the detour wouldn't sidetrack us too much. The shop was in an old strip mall and had flags from various Caribbean countries hanging out front. There were also some wicker products displayed in the window, and as we pushed open the front door, a pungent scent assaulted us. The inside was a bit dark and filled with all sorts of paraphernalia. Red and white candles were lit. The keen aroma came from a shelf to the left, exhibiting bags of roasted cumin, turmeric, ginger, and nutmeg, and various blends of spices. A small bell had rung when he pushed open the door, and it now brought a short, heavy-set woman to the front. She wore a colorful dress with equally colorful head tie. Good afternoon, young fellas, and what is it Merle can help you with today? She had a thick sing-song accent. I told her I was doing a school project on Caribbean folklore and wanted to know if she could help me with any background literature or information, something unique that you would not find from simple online searches. Marley tilted her head to the left and stood, arms akimbo a bit uncertain, but when I told her my parents were from Trinidad, she relaxed a bit. Well, I never. You young fellas come here to ask me about Jumbie. 
she said before chuckling deeply. Well, I think old Merle can help with you, young man. Merle was born in Port-au-Prince and told us a story which she swore was true, and when she was a kid still living in Haiti. She remembers there were two prominent families in the area always competing with each other until one day. The patriarch of one of the families, uh, Mr. Jean, sought the counsel of an Obeya man. This was a sort of witch doctor who dealt in arcane and supernatural matters. According to local legend, the witch doctor summoned a magical spirit, which he called a bako. This particular bako was a short, childlike creature with an oversized stomach, tiny sharp teeth, and long claws, and had been trapped in a bottle the witch doctor procured some years earlier while traveling to British Guiana. The Bako was often naked and had very dark skin and red eyes. The creature would use its magical powers to help its owner gain wealth. However, there was a price, and it could sometimes be a high one. Traditionally, Bako fed on milk and bananas, but their tastes could become more radical. The family who had allegedly summoned the spirit started enjoying incredible success in all of their business dealings and soon became very wealthy. This, of course, incurred the jealousy and wrath of Jean's competitor, who confronted him in front of the town residence during a busy market day, insulting him and hurling accusations of practicing witchcraft at his family. Mr. Jean never responded, however, and two days later his accuser was found dead in a small ravine that ran alongside town. His throat had been slashed open, and he had bled to death. There were bite marks on his face, neck, arms, and legs that looked disconcertingly human, like he had been attacked by an angry child. Following this incident, the witch doctor had trapped the entity in the bottle once more, and no one spoke openly about it, but all believed the Bako was responsible for the murder. Sometime after that, Merle and her parents left for America, she filled in a few other details for which I was extremely grateful, and even though she insisted her experiences were real, Mason and I just looked at each other and smiled. I think we may have touched a nerve because she stood up from the small table we were all sitting around at this point and said, in a voice a bit higher than normal, Well, it is true. I can prove it too, you know, because that Obeya man was my uncle. What? I asked. Merle hastened toward the back of the store, returning a few minutes later with a small, short-necked bottle. It was a nasty-looking thing, brown with dark, muddy stains all around it. There was a wooden cork stuffed into the opening, and a small bit of paper was secured around the neck of the bottle. What on earth is that? I asked. This. This is what my uncle used to trap that wicked spirit. Inside this bottle, young fellas, dwells the spirit of a bako. The small bit of paper Merle warned us carried the spell that was used to call forth the entity. I pushed my chair away from the table. Well, Merle, you know what? Thank you so much, but we have to be going. It's getting a bit late. There was a tremor in my voice as I stared at the bottle on the table. Maybe Merle didn't quite have all her marbles after all. Mason looked at me and squinted, silently mouthing. What the hell, dude? At that same time, the bell over the door rang, and a couple walked into the store. Good afternoon. Anyone here? Merle quickly got up and went over to attend to them. As soon as she was gone, Mason slipped the bottle into his backpack. What the hell, man? I said. You can't take that. Shut up and walk. Jeez, don't tell me you believe that childish nonsense. He was already halfway to the door, and all I could do was follow him. Thank you again, Merle. I called as we exited. She looked up and nodded briefly before going back to her customers. On the ride back, I again berated Mason for taking the bottle, but he only laughed and called me names, insisting he'd only borrowed it. When we got home... He said he'd be over later to try the spell. What? I asked. Oh, come on. Mason seemed a bit flustered now. 
If you want to write a really good story, then this is your chance. Hey, you never know. He laughed and rode into his yard across from ours. I shook my head and went inside. It was about six when Mason came over, and the sun had just started to go down. My bedroom was upstairs and I could see the street from my front window. That Mason never needed an invitation. We had been neighbors since we were toddlers, and he walked right into my bedroom, shutting the door behind him. Hey chicken, I told the folks we had a project to finish together, he said and dropped his backpack on my bed. You ready, sucker? And he laughed again. He pulled out the small bottle he had borrowed from Merle. Come on, dude, let's do this, he said, excitedly, and dragged me over to the bed. I'm not sure about this, Mason, I said nervously. Oh, put a sock in it, dude. Come on, here's the spell. Mason opened up the paper, which was rolled into a tight cylindrical shape. Even our teenaged eyes strained a bit to make out what was written. It was in blood red, of course, and it was in a strange language. In fact, it was more gibberish than an actual language. You ready? And then Mason yanked the cork from the bottle. He struggled a bit at first, but it came free. A nasty odor came from it, making us both gag. Oh shit, dude, open a window. As the cool breeze cleared the air a bit, we picked up the paper and started chanting what was on it. Orca fi gruja. Orca fi bruja. After about ten minutes of continuous chanting, I stood up. This is stupid, Mason. Aside from the foul smell, the bottle was empty. For all we know, Merle is probably having a good laugh at us right now. Mason shrugged, but at that very moment, there came a scraping sound from under the bed. We looked at each other wide-eyed. What the... Mason mouthed in a silent way again. And then out loud. You heard that, dude? I nodded. Mason jumped off the bed, and before I knew what he was doing, he yanked up the sheet and was peering under the bed. There was nothing, except for my shoes. Just then, the bedroom door flew open, making us both jump. What the hell, Summer? How many times have I told you to knock when the door's closed? Get out of here! I shouted after my sister, who now stood in the doorway. But I heard you guys talk. Who's your friend? Duh, it's Mason. The one under the bed, dummy. Get out of here, Summer. Fine, then don't tell me. She shouted and slammed the door shut. That was probably the most exciting thing that happened all evening. A half hour later, we resorted to playing video games. After we had finished, Mason put the cork back into the bottle, replaced the bit of paper, and left for home. Well, that was a big bust, he said regretfully. As it turned out, we did have a school project to finish, so it wasn't until two days later that I finally had a chance to write my story. I made notes, included those from Merle, and laid out a skeleton plot complete with characters, dictionary, and the source on hand. I was ready, except that my mind was completely blank. I stared numerous times before deleting what I wrote. I even got to about three paragraphs once before deciding it was junk. Two hours later, I was still staring at a blank word document. Damn it, I thought, and slammed both fists on my desk. What's the matter with me? Why can't I do this? I felt like crying. If only I could get that first line. Do you wish it? What was that? Hell, now I'm hearing things, I thought. And the voice still resonated in my head, and I put it down to frustration from my writer's block. Do you wish to clear the block? I turned around sharply, even though I knew no one was there. Hell, it was just a voice born from my overactive but apparently useless imagination. Oh boy, I've finally driven myself mad and laughed out loud at the thought. It was just what I needed. Oh, what the heck, I figured. 
Yes, uh, yes, I wish to have no more writer's block, I said to thin air. Granted, it boomed in my head once more, like Aladdin's genie, I thought, and giggled again. But suddenly, I had it. It was there all along, right in front of me. All I had to do was reach out and grab it. My opening line, and it was perfect. One line led to another, which then followed into a paragraph, and then a page. It took me less than an hour to finish my story. All 2,500 words. And I knew, I knew in my heart that this was a good story. I proofread for errors, but I had a confidence I'd never felt before, and within 30 minutes of typing the last full stop, it was uploaded onto one of those popular forums where people post creepy stories and hope they get noticed. I wanted to act cool, but honestly, I kept checking the site every couple of minutes to see if anyone had read it and if anyone had commented on it. By the time my mother knocked on the door to make sure I was in bed, over a hundred people had seen the story, and there were at least ten comments. I looked at the ceiling for a long time before I drifted off to sleep. I was awake even before my alarm went off and made a beeline for the computer. Over 400 views, and dozens more comments, including one guy who wanted to narrate it for his YouTube channel. It was a hit. This was a dream come true, I, I could not believe it. Thank you, oh genie in my head, I thought, and got ready for school. I showed Mason the site when we got to school, and being who he was, he had half the school reading the story by lunch. People who had never paid me attention before came up to me and patted me on the shoulder, telling me what a great job I'd done. Even Jennifer Coulson smiled at me. I had died and gone to heaven. When I got home from school, Mason and I ran up to my room and logged onto the site to find over 1,500 people had read the story and there were scores, uh, maybe even hundreds of comments from people who thought it was a great piece of writing. Mason, who was bigger than I, grabbed me in a bear hug and started kissing my cheeks. My hero, my hero, he teased. Oh, get off, you oaf. I barked, but joined him in laughing. Mason stayed for supper, and Mom was just washing up when she asked me to take the trash out. Well, that's my cue, Mason said, adding... So long, Stephen King, and laughed. I walked out front with him and saw him run across the street and into his house. We had a backyard which my mother dotted over. There was a small garden and even a couple fruit trees. A darkness had fallen when I dragged the garbage bag through the back door. My peripheral vision suddenly registered movement from under the tree at the far corner. I stopped and peered into the darkness which the motion sense of lights could not quite dispel. Nothing. I shrugged and took the bag around to the trash can at the side of the house. I was walking back when I saw movements towards the back of the yard. Whoever it was was fast and short. I wondered if it might be young Sam Johnson from two houses down, but what the heck would he be doing in my backyard at this hour? I walked to the back of the house. Hello? I repeated myself, and was just about to walk inside when I heard a low whistle, followed by what I could only describe as a cackle. Who's there? A few seconds later, something answered me. A riddle, a riddle, a re. A wish I granted thee. A story, good and fine. Now give me what is mine. Whatever it was spoke in a grating whisper with a melodic ring, like the leprechauns you see in some of those B-rated movies. I was still reeling from what was happening when red eyes peered out from behind one of the fruit trees. I screamed and bolted into the house, almost colliding with my mother. Alexander Jones, what on earth are you doing? She grabbed me by the shoulders. Are you and Mason still fooling around out there? Mason, go on home, right now. I knew Mason was already home, and yet I heard Mason's voice answer her. Good night, Miss Jones. Good night, Mason. My knees almost gave out from under me, 
and I held on to my mother. Alex, get cleaned up. Is your homework finished? I had no voice. I just nodded and ran upstairs, locking the door behind me. I sat on the bed for about ten minutes, my mind a swirling confusion of what I just experienced, when I saw lights go on in the bedroom of the house across the street. I dialed. Uh, hello? Before Mason could say another word, I was into him. What the hell have you done, Mason? What the hell have you done? Whoa, buddy, buddy, get a grip. It's here, Mason, it's here. I saw it in the backyard. It, it spoke to me, Mason. We really summoned something. You idiot, Mason. What am I going to do? I felt tears running down my cheeks. I was losing it, and if I didn't get my voice under control, my parents would hear. You're shitting me. Oh, crap. We did it, man. We did it. This isn't great, Mason. And it's not funny. That thing, suppose it comes to my house. But look, man, if Merle was right, then you're the boss. So you just keep control of it, man. It's easy for you to say from across the road, you jackass. I hung up. I've never been so terrified in my life. Mason called back, but I ignored it. I turned down the overhead light and crept slowly to the window, overlooking the front yard and the street. I saw nothing. I lay in bed for hours, sleep eluding me. Every creak from the floorboards outside my room would send me into a panic. At some point, I must have dozed off. I was walking through a dense forest. It was humid and hot. There were tall trees overgrown with vines and thick brush underneath. I looked around. The jungle extended as far as I could see. There was a strong smell of wet dirt and rotting vegetation. Strangely, there was no sound, but no animals. I heard a rustle behind and turned around, and there it was. Just ten feet from me. It was just like Merle had described. About two and a half feet tall. Black, leathery skin, and was naked. Its tiny manhood barely visible under an overhanging stomach with a large navel. The feet were way too big, and the mouth seemed squashed into the face, with red lips barely covering two rows of sharp-looking teeth. I saw a pig-like nose, and eyes like large white orbs, except for the two tiny pits of fire at their center. If it isn't Alex Jones, it said in a raspy voice with that sing-song melody. What do you want? A good question, Mr. Jones. A fine question. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work, I say. That's the way it goes. It clapped, and I saw barb-like talons at the end of its long, bony fingers. What do you want? I repeated. What's this? It took a step closer. You called for me and I came. You made a wish and it was granted. A debt is due, and the debt must be paid. I'm hungry, boy, and I want what is due. I, I, I don't know what that is. It peered at me with those red eyes. Milk and blood, boy. Bring me milk and blood. Then suddenly he was standing right in front of me, bearing those teeth. Now. I fled, branches slammed into my face, leaving bloody scratches. And still, I heard it shouting behind me. Give it or I'll take it. Give it or I'll take it, boy. I sat up in bed, panting. I looked at the clock. It was just past midnight. I shook my head to try and clear the nightmare. It was a nightmare, after all. It had to be. I must have just imagined all of it. But just then, what sounded like every dog on the street started howling like crazy crept to the front window and peeped over the ledge. Was that something childlike standing in the shadows? I gasped and fell on the floor. This couldn't be real. I chanced another look outside. There was nothing there, and I comforted myself thinking that my imagination was getting the best of me. 
I fell asleep on the floor at some point and dreamt I was drowning in a giant bowl full of bloody milk. A sharp knock to my door brought me to my senses. Time to get up, kiddo. It was dad. The sun was already creeping over the horizon. I was aching all over as I showered and finally dressed. I came down to find my dad sitting at the kitchen table, sipping coffee. Summer was already halfway through breakfast. I pulled up a chair, thankful that last night's events didn't seem as terrifying now that daylight had calmed the world once more. Mom's not down yet? I asked with a mouthful of bacon and eggs. Don't eat and talk. Just then we heard Mom shuffle down the stairs. She moved slowly as if she was tired. She pulled up a chair and sat at the table. Oh my god, Donna. It was Dad. Are you feeling okay? Mom looked pale, and her eyes were bloodshot with dark circles around them. Just bad dreams. I kept having this stupid nightmare about being chased through a forest. I almost choked. Heck, if I don't feel like I've been running all night. She rested her head on her arms, which were folded on the table in front of her. I turned to see my dad looking at something on my mother's shoulder where her robe had slid down. What the hell is that, babe? He exclaimed. Mom had an apple-sized laceration on her shoulder just beneath her left ear. There were blotches of dried blood around it, and it had started to turn purple in some places. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst came when I looked closer. Because it was then that I saw the punctures. Punctures that seemed to have been made by numerous sharp little teeth. The life of an animator can be a dull one. However, I don't hate it. In fact, I love it. I've never had great social skills, and for my whole life, I've found that I would much rather stay at home and refine my art skills than go to a party packed with people and talk all night with people I don't even know. Since I've spent my whole 34 years of life creating art and animations as an adult, it's been rather easy finding jobs in the industry. Normally when I get a gig, I'll go to studios where I work for however long I've been hired for. And when the project is done, I'll go back home and begin the process of reaching out to big studios and convincing them to let me work with them. One of my most recent jobs had ended. I prepared to pack up and head home. The area I was working in provided most of my equipment for me, but I still had to pack up my enormous pen display. Transporting a 32-inch monitor is no easy task, and by the time I was finished carrying it to my car, all I could really think about is going home and eating an early dinner. However, I knew I couldn't do that. I'd be working on a short animated film every night before I ate dinner, and on evenings like this, this commitment can be a real pain in the neck. Most animators make short films to showcase to large studios in hopes of getting hired there. The idea is, give the business a taste of your work, and they'll be all over it. I challenged myself to work on my short film for at least half an hour every day. I know that half an hour isn't much in terms of animation, but over time it adds up. Already I was over halfway done with my project. I pulled into my driveway and got to work, moving my humongous drawing monitor into my home office, or art studio as I like to call it. My office is quite small, and barely has enough room to hold me, my pen display, and my computer. I struggled settling everything back in, and at this point I really didn't want to get to work on my film. It was 10.30pm. I knew that I would be busy for the next couple of days and that I wouldn't be able to work on my short film much. I decided to eat dinner first and then decide. I'm a procrastinator, I know. After a luxurious dinner of ramen and Dr. Pepper, I had to make my decision. Would I spend the next half hour animating or go right to bed? I chose to work on my short film. 
If I could at least get something done, I'd be happy. I sat down at my desk and booted up my computer. I set a timer for 30 minutes and began to draw. I was making good progress for the first 10 minutes, but then the stylus began to feel heavy in my hands. The lines I was drawing were becoming sloppy. At times I could barely keep my eyes open. I had woken up at 5 in the morning to make it to work on time. And now it was 11.15 at night. I was exhausted. I struggled to keep my eyes open. I dropped my pen onto the floor and fell back into my chair. By now I realized I should have just gone to bed, but now I felt too tired to even stand up and walk to my bedroom. I slowly began to doze off. That's when I heard it. I was almost asleep, but I could still tell that I truly heard what I heard. An owl. I'd seen documentaries and read books about them, but since I live in a large city, I'd never heard one. That's strange, I thought as I drifted off into sleep. The next morning, I awoke to the sound of the garbage trucks outside my apartment. It took me a few moments to register where I was. I had fallen asleep in my office chair, and my neck felt sore from being in such an awkward position all night. I groaned and sat up. I had left my pen display on all night. I turned it off and prepared myself for the day to come. My brother had tickets to a football game in our town and he was picking me up in an hour. I closed the window, got dressed, brushed my teeth, and ate breakfast, and even managed to squeeze in a few minutes of animation before my brother came. But we had a blast. We saw the football game, ate a huge dinner at some expensive buffet, and even dropped by a party for a few minutes. I guess it's good to get out of your comfort zone sometimes, even if it's to the dismay of your antisocial personality. Anyway, I got home at around 11.15 at night. I bade goodbye to my brother and stumbled blindly towards my room. I felt my way around my house, finding my way to my bed. I collapsed on it, exhausted after another late night. As I lay in bed, I heard it yet again. This time, I was slightly more awake than last time. I was still extremely tired, but... I was able to wonder why I was hearing an owl. I live in an apartment complex on the fourth floor, and my city is jammed full of streetlights and skyscrapers. I rarely even see normal birds, much less owls. I heard it once more. I climbed slowly out of bed, determined to catch a glimpse of this mysterious owl. I silently opened the curtains and peeked out. I didn't see anything. The sound of the owl's hooting seemed to be coming from the right. I opened my window just slightly and leaned out. After looking around, I gave up and closed the window. I submitted myself to sleep. The next morning, I woke up and noticed that my window was open. I knew that I had closed it the night before. A sudden thought ran through my head. I had left my window unlocked. Did someone break in? Uh, no. There was no way that someone would climb all the way up to the fourth floor. There wasn't a fire escape on that side of the building, so they would have had to scale the pipes. No, I must have just left it open and forgot in my sleepy state. I sat down at my desk and checked my emails. There was only one new email, and it made me ecstatic. I had just gotten a new job at a huge animation studio that I had been longing to be hired at for months. I would be working there for the next six weeks. To celebrate that night, I went to go get pizza at one of the many local pizza parlors. I ordered a large pepperoni and ate it in the restaurant. After I was finished, I received a call from the hospital. My sister had just given birth to a beautiful baby girl, and she wanted me to visit my new niece. I ran to the hospital, and when I got there, I found that my parents and my brother were already there. We celebrated the birth of my sister's daughter, Maria. My parents left at around 9.30, and my brother had to go at 
but I visited with my sister and her husband far longer. I didn't have to go to work until the day after tomorrow, so I relished the opportunity to stay up late without any serious repercussions. In fact, I stayed until 11.15. I didn't know how it was possible, but again I heard the owl. Riley, did you hear that? I asked my sister. It sounded like an owl. No, Ethan, she replied. I don't think I've ever even seen an owl. I've been hearing them every night, I explained. Right outside my window at 11.15. I thought the owls were just nesting outside my apartment, but I heard it here, too. Maybe it's the way the wind is blowing. My sister responded. There aren't a whole lot of owls in this city. Yeah, you're right, I said. It's probably just the wind. The following night, I was proven wrong. I'd spent almost the whole day animating my short film. I had made some great progress and decided to grab some dinner before going to bed. I swung by a burger place and ordered to go. My plan was to watch some television before falling asleep. My first day of work at the new studio was tomorrow, and I needed some sleep. I would just watch one episode of the show I was currently watching, then head to sleep. Unfortunately, you know how it is. At the end of each episode, you say, I have time for one more. And by the time you finally check the time, you realize you've watched six episodes and that you have work tomorrow. I stood up and made my way towards my bedroom. As I was falling onto my bed, I heard the now familiar hooting of the owl. Except this time, it was coming from inside my apartment. It's just the wind, I told myself. I heard it again. No, I recognized that sound from those documentaries I'd watched. There was the sound of an owl hooting and it was unmistakably coming from somewhere in my apartment. I climbed out of my bed. I followed the sound out to my bedroom. I traced the noise into the hallway. I was led straight into my office. I opened the door. I saw for an instant a pair of red eyes, and then they vanished. Owls don't have red eyes, do they? I closed the door back and entered my room again. I deal with it in the morning. For now, I just closed my... For now, I just closed my door and locked it. Morning came. As soon as I opened my eyes, I remembered my dilemma and decided to do something about it. I exited my room cautiously, holding a baseball bat. I wasn't planning on hurting anything, just scaring it off. The silence was unsettling, just my footsteps as I entered the hallway outside of my home office. I reached the door and listened, no hooting. The door was still closed, and there was no window in that room. That meant that whatever was in there last night was still in my art studio. Clutching the bat, I swung open the door. It was empty, but nothing. I checked every square inch of the art studio, but the owner of those eyes seemingly vanished in the night, or it had both opened and closed the door to the room. Whatever the case, there was no doubt now that was the thing making the noises. It also meant something is, or was, inside of my apartment. Whatever the case, I was almost late for work. I got ready in record time and raced to the studio. My first day working there went really well. In fact, I almost forgot about my situation at home until I was driving back to my apartment. The thought struck me as I was sitting at a stoplight. I'll give it one more night, I thought. If the thing is still there, I'll call an exterminator. I climbed up the stairs and into the corridor outside the entrance to my apartment. I walked right up to the door leading into my house. I took a deep breath and opened my door. At first, nothing happened. 
I didn't hear or see anything out of the ordinary. I slowly tiptoed my way into my home. Carefully, I reached my hand over to the light switch. I was about to flick it on when something lunged at me. I recognized the red eyes from the previous night. I could also make out a strange black figure before everything went black. I awoke on the floor in my apartment. I could see that I was in my art studio. What was going on? Whatever that thing was had attacked me, knocked me down, and dragged me into my home office. I checked my watch. 8.15 p.m. I sat up. I had made up my mind now. I was calling an exterminator. I made an appointment for the following morning with Ben Ferver, an exterminator I found for a low price. Finally, the matter could be put to rest. I went to bed that night, making sure to check my whole room for any sign of that beast. Ben Ferver arrived the next morning at seven o'clock sharp. He was an old man, most likely in his mid-seventies. He sounded and smelled as if he had been smoking for fifty years. I couldn't wait for him to get this over with and to leave my house. We exchanged a few words and I agreed that he could go into my apartment and do his thing while I waited outside. He walked in and closed the door behind him, which I found fairly strange, but I didn't think much about it. I just wanted that thing out. I waited outside of my apartment for twenty minutes. The entire time I could hear the sounds of rustling coming from the inside. At one point I thought I could hear glass shattering. This was getting ridiculous. I would rather deal with it myself than have the exterminator destroy my whole house. I pulled open the door. Did you? Mr. Fervor was running down the hall. I saw something drop out of his hands before two long, nasty black hands gripped him from behind. It all happened so fast. I saw the creature with the red eyes thrust his needle-like arm into the exterminator's back from behind. His blood gushed out across the room. His screams ended abruptly. He was dead. I ran. I could hear the sounds of the beast echoing from behind me. I didn't stop until I was several blocks away and 100% sure that the thing was no longer behind me. I sat down on a bench and pondered the situation. That creature was living in my apartment. I had just witnessed it ingesting an entire human being, but somehow it hadn't killed me. I would have been easy meat. There were loads of times where that thing could have grabbed me without any resistance whatsoever. I decided to stay with my brother. I didn't fully explain to him why I was crashing at his place, but he let me stay. No questions asked. The entire night, I considered my choices. I could stay at my brother's place forever. I could move out, or I could face whatever that was. I chose to face it. I don't know why. I don't know if I was going insane, but whatever the case, I knew I had to face my fears. When I woke up in the morning, I said goodbye to my brother and walked back to my apartment. I walked down the hall into my room. I flung it open. My teeth were chattering. I held my breath. I was sweating heavily. I stepped inside. I heard the sound of scurrying deep in the darkness. I flung on the light. Everything was silent. Who are you? What are you? I shouted. I must have seemed like a complete madman to my neighbors, but I didn't care. I was unarmed. This was hopeless. I just wanted this nightmare to be over. Then, I saw it. Fully. For the past couple nights, I'd just seen its eyes. Even the day before, the thing had been almost completely hidden behind the exterminator. But now, he was completely exposed. I couldn't scream. I I couldn't breathe. The thing inside my apartment was beyond comprehension. I had read the works of famous authors who have written about beasts that are impossible for humans to comprehend. I know that those stories are fictional, but this is not. 
My body refused to move. That creature, I, I don't think I could give a proper description of it. All I know is that the red eyes were definitely the same. I could feel my entire body shutting down. I was trembling all over. The monster picked me up. I didn't even react. I, I just let it. So this is where the noises were coming from. In a strange way, I felt contentment, knowing that I would die. I would end this nightmare. I felt peace. The creature turned around, taking me with it. It bent over and showed me the dead body of Ben Ferber, the exterminator, which was laying on the ground. Despite the fact that I was still in shock, I could still see that he was holding my wallet. In his pocket were other small objects of value. Laying on the ground next to him was a loaded pistol. My exterminator was trying to steal from me. A wave of realization tumbled into me like a freight train. The monster I had been living in fear of was protecting me. Mr. Fervor could have killed me had he not been killed himself. The beast itself had plenty of opportunities to attack and destroy me, but it didn't. The creature set me down. I could hear a dragging sound behind me. I passed out instantly. I woke up to my bed. My wallet and other belongings were next to me. I know what happened truly did transpire as when I turned on my TV, I could see a news report documenting the death of Ben Ferber. Like I said, I've read stories about such monsters that are beyond human comprehension. I've also read that there are two ways to deal with the trauma. Either try to rationalize what you have seen or go completely and utterly insane. I think for me, it's the latter. I've stopped eating and drinking myself. When I wake up in the morning, I'm always fed, but I think it's the creature keeping me alive, not me. I can't even summon up the strength to go to my art studio. I, I simply stay in bed all day, wallowing in my filth. I still hear the hooting every night at 11.15. I'm not scared anymore. I managed to type this all out on my laptop today, as a warning. I don't know if it's just happening to me, but if you hear an owl outside your house at 11.15, be warned. My name is Boston Murphy and I kill werewolves for the US government. I didn't join the army to get medals or to have a statue in my honor. I joined it to simply get away from my family. My father's okay, but his new wife is the most evil person you could have the misfortune of meeting. She used to constantly berate me, calling me less than dirt and a waste of space. I tried telling dad, but he didn't believe it, or chose not to believe it. I joined the army when I was 17. It was the only way to get away from the verbal abuse. Stepmom couldn't be happier that I was finally out of her house, but Dad was crushed. He understood why I chose to do it, but he still felt like it was his fault. I was shipping out today, and he gave me an emotional send-off. It was time to start my own life. I arrived at Fort Bronson by Thursday. I still remember having goosebumps arriving. This was it. I was really doing this. No turning back now. Fort Bronson was a massive base, expanding over 60 acres. The bus stopped, and drill instructor Haymeyer walked on board, gracing us with his hospitality. Attention, you piss cans. I'm Instructor Haymeyer. I'll be your friend for the next 18 weeks. Now get your sorry asses off my bus and get checked in. Do I make myself clear? Sir, yes sir, we all shouted in unison. We got our bags and got off the bus. Since I was sitting in the very back, I was the last one to leave. Haymeyer looked at me and stopped me. What's your name, cadet? He asked. Uh, Boston Murphy, sir. 
I replied nervously. He looked me up and down, muttering to himself. You're not going with them. You're going to the special assignment ward, Haymire said. I haven't been here more than ten minutes and I'm already getting a special assignment. Where is that, sir? I asked. In your room next to the mess hall, in the north building. Now get the hell off my bus, Haymire replied. I quickly got my bags and left. The north building was the farthest building on the base, away from everyone else. The sun was furious that day, and I was sweating hard, yet I walked at a brisk pace. All I knew was that it could be the first test. I entered the building, the air conditioning inside greeting me like an old friend. The place was a maze of stairs and hallways. I had to use my map. The mess hall was located on the second hallway. I climbed the stairs, carrying my luggage with me. This building seemed less maintained than the other buildings, but who am I to judge? As I approached the mess hall, I turned to the door to the left. It looked like a janitor's closet. It had a faded, special assignments sticker on it. I opened it, and a rush of old, musty air ambushed my nose. Once inside, I walked down a long hallway. There was no paint on the walls, it was grey. The fluorescent lights shined bitterly. Through a pair of double doors, I entered a waiting room. The place was empty, only a receptionist and another cadet populated the place. I went to the receptionist. Name, place, she said. Uh, Boston Murphy, I replied. She checked her notes, sighing. I don't see you in my notes. You must be new. Uh, yeah. Instructor Haymire sent me here, I said, sweating. She dialed a number on her phone, motioning me to take a seat. I did what she asked. The other cadet in the room was a skinhead called James. You're new here too, huh? He asked. Yeah, man, I replied. Me too. I was so ready to kick some jihadi ass, but I'm here instead. You feel me? He asked. Yeah, I lied. The truth was that I didn't join to kill. I was hoping to be a medic or something. My name's James. What's yours? He asked. Boston, I replied. You seem cool, Boston. Personally, I hope that was a mistake. I want to hit the range and make those bastards pay for 9-11, James said. Cadet James Fillmore, the receptionist said. I guess that's my cue. See you, brother, James said, patting my back. I waited to be called in, watching videos on my phone. The receptionist on the phone looking at me every so often, whispering. After what seemed like centuries, I was finally called up. The receptionist told me to go through the double doors and into the first door on the right. I walked through, luggage in hand. The hallway I walked in was small and dirty. The door on the right said, Lycanthropy Extermination with Greg Romero. Lycanthropy? Like as in werewolves? This had to be a joke. Surely Haymire played a prank on me, attesting how gullible new recruits are. I looked further down the hall. It only got weirder from there. Windigo extermination from Susan Fletcher. Thunderbird extermination with Otto Haymire. Zombie extermination with Tony Stevenson. I had half a mind to walk out and confront Haymire, but something told me that he didn't appreciate being called a liar. Despite my doubts, I walked in. Inside, it looked like a regular classroom, having desks and such. James was sitting in back while I sat near the front. Hey, Boston. Small world, am I right? He asked. I suppose, I replied. I sat down, and a man started speaking. Welcome, cadets. I'm Greg Romero, and for the next 18 weeks I'll teach you how to dispatch a lycanthrope. Mr. Romero said. James raised his hand. Aren't werewolves fake, though? He asked. I wish they were fake, but no, they're not. Lycanthropy poses a serious threat to livestock and humanity as a whole, Mr. Romero replied. I raised my hand. Uh, where's the rest of the class? I asked. Romero sighed. We're not as popular as Windigo extermination, but hopefully we'll receive more recruits next year. Romero showed a photo of a mutilated woman being eaten alive by a werewolf. I gagged. 
We have thankless jobs, gentlemen. Only two people know we exist, and that's the two of you. Who wants to kill a wolf? Romero asked. We both shouted in unison. For the next 18 weeks, I was taught how to kill a wolf. Silver does kill one, but instead of a crossbow, I got a mini-14 with silver bullets. I was trained how to track wolves and how to survive in the wild. It was hard at first, but I got the hang of it. On graduation day, I was so happy. James and I got drunk at his place. At first, I didn't like James, but during training, we became friends. I was deployed to Arizona, of all places. The assignment was simple. An elderly lycanthrope was spotted in the area, and I had to dispatch him. I had to cut off its right hand as proof and return it to my bosses. I was getting paid $100,000 for this. Since I was new, this assignment was sort of a test to see if I had what it takes. I arrived at Ground Zero, a campsite. The brass in Washington were nice enough to close its surrounding area so nobody could get hurt. I looked for clues, only to find a patch of hair. It smelled like piss, meaning that a wolf was nearby. The hair led deep into the brush, into the desert. The sun was angry that day. It cooked my skin under all my armor. It led to an abandoned farmhouse, but any sign of a farm was dried up a long time ago. I crept to a window, rifle in hand. I peeked, and not only did I see the wolf, but there were also two little wolves, seemingly surrounding him. Come on, Grandpa. Let's go play, one of the little ones said, nibbling on the big one's ear. In a while, I have to rest. He replied. My hands were shaking, sweat dripped from my brow. I had to do this. I was getting paid to. I took a deep breath and then I kicked the door open. I opened fire, shooting the big one in the chest four times, sending him backwards. The kids looked on in horror, screaming and crying. I brought out my axe and hacked off his right hand. I placed it in my bag and the puppy started crying. Shut your fucking mouth, I yelled, pointing my rifle at them. They only screamed louder. I panicked. I didn't want to fail my first mission. I did what I had to do. I shot the puppies, hitting them both in the head. I hacked off their right hands, putting them in my bag. Once the adrenaline died, I threw up. What's done is done. I can't fix it. I had $300,000 in my bag, softening the blow. I returned to my boss and gave them the hands. They were surprised, to say the least. Damn. Not only did you take out that old fuck, but you popped his grandkids, too. You're the best exterminator we've ever had, but no mercy. I'm gonna call you Isoner from now on, okay? My boss said, signing me a check. It was from the United States Treasury. $300,000. I placed the money in my bank account when I got home. And before I left, my boss said, your new assignment is to dispatch wolf pups spotted in Alaska. But I don't think that'll be a problem for you, Isonerve. He winked. Made me sick. I reloaded my silver ammo, bought some beef jerky, and flew to Alaska. A logger found a wolf pup hanging out around the woods near his house and locked it in his shed. I told him to stay back in case I got aggressive. I went in, closing the door behind me. Huddled in the corner, I saw four wolf pups. They looked scared. I wasn't proud of what happened next. I fired, and I took their hands. I returned to my boss and turned in the hands. He gave me 400,000 this time. I saw nerve you're making your country safer every time you go out. You're a hero, son, he said. I don't feel like a hero, sir, I replied. Just know this. They're monsters. They don't know right from wrong. All they know is killing. Take two months off, then come back, okay? He said, sending me off. That's all the time I have today. I'll get back to you as soon as I can.
You might have heard about this back when it first happened. A group of astronomers at Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia were witness to 15 fast radio bursts, or FRBs, from space. The signals came from a galaxy that's far, far away. Three billion light years, to be exact. And though it wasn't the first time the scientists had received FRBs from this location, it was the first time they had received so many of them in such a short amount of time. Five hours. It was odd. And intriguing. And inspiring. These people, who had been listening, observing for years, finally discovered something mysterious and unexplainable. Something to ponder about late at night or lazy afternoons and ask, what's up there? And I don't just mean up there in the observable universe, but beyond that, up past the fraying edges of what we call everything. Before we continue, it's important to understand that I'm a recluse who lives close to the Green Bank Telescope near the Monongella National Forest. And early that Saturday morning, months ago, I was listening too. I had lived in the area for a few years and had built a comfortable little hideaway complete with a homemade observatory. I recognized that the radio signals in that area were diminished from lack of lines and telephone towers and thought it would be the perfect place to just settle down and gaze up. And that Saturday, months ago, that's just what I was doing. Looking up, and listening, not expecting to discover anything at all. I was sitting there, in the dark of my homemade observatory, alone, in silence. There was a pinging noise, and then another, and another, fifteen in all followed by another deeper sound, a sound I recognized from my computer. It read, data received. And then immediately after that, something else happened. Something stranger. A voice, mechanical and cool, female, rose up and out of my computer, my TV, my phone, everything. It said three words. Insubordination. Decontamination. Rumble still skin. I couldn't believe it. I just sat there, awake, riveted for five fucking hours, listening, unbelieving, and now this. This was something I had never experienced before, and it was, in a word, invigorating. Quickly, I wrote down the words in my journal for good measure and tucked it away in my desk into the secret spot. It crept me out, sure, but I thought it might be some prank or other radio interference, and nothing more. And I tucked the thought away, too. There was something else, though. And my TV flicked on and grew unnaturally bright while the voice was speaking until something popped inside of it, and the screen went black. My phone and computer fared better, but still. Being where I was, I had no service on my phone, and the satellite phone I usually carried with me was in my car. I stood up, about to head outside, when I heard it. A rumbling noise. It sounded like an engine, perhaps a motorcycle. It grew louder and louder before cutting, leaving me in stark silence, and then... A footstep. Then another. I sincerely regretted not having any weapons with me and cursed myself for leaving the satellite phone in my car, which was parked quite a way away. I had this false belief that if nothing had happened before, nothing would happen now, and that I wouldn't need it tonight, and so I left it. Lesson learned. I steeled myself and stepped out of the doorway into the view of the thing making the noise. It was just a guy. He looked out of place against the trees, wearing dark jeans and a leather jacket over a black shirt and a black futuristic-looking motorcycle helmet. The visor of it was flipped up so that I could see his eyes. Hello? I called out. Can I help you? Hey, he replied, holding up a gloved hand. Got lost. Can't get a signal on my phone out here. 
You got any maps I could take a picture of? Where are you trying to get to? Public library. I squinted at him. You're a bit far from there now, aren't you? He didn't bat an eye and tapped his helmet. I was biking around Little Mountain. Found something up there. Just wanted to go to the library and look it up. What'd you find? Arrowheads. I considered this and then held my hand out. Uh, mind if I see it? The man hesitated once, then took a few steps forward, reached into his pocket, and plopped a small, smooth, yet sharp stone to my hand. I held it up to my eyes, examining it. Nice find. I handed it back to him. Thanks, he said, putting it back into his pocket. He pulled off his helmet, revealing his face. Can't breathe, he smiled. That simple act, the one of him showing me his face, made me trust him a bit more. Come on, I said after a moment. Got some maps inside. Together we walked back towards my place and through the door. Nice place you got out here. Yep, don't often get visitors. This an observatory? He was looking up at the dome I had built, a wistful expression on his face. Yes, sir. I turned my back on him, walking towards the desk where the maps were, and that was my first mistake. I could feel rather than see him box me in, blocking the only exit in the place. I turned, half expecting him to throttle me right there with his helmet, but he had placed it on the chair next to the door, and his hands were empty. What were they? His voice was stern. Uh, what? The words. Three of them. What did she say? What did you hear? I looked at him, shocked, wondering how he could possibly know I had heard something. As if reading my mind, he continued. They were meant for me. Uh, meant for you? Yes, he nodded. They were, but I cut him off. I wasn't listening. Uh, why? He looked at me, impassive. What? Uh, why were they meant for you? Uh, who are you? What did they mean? Uh, why are you here? He pondered my question for a moment, then pulled out what looked like a phone, but was far too thin to be one, and flicked through it until I thought he wasn't going to respond. And then, suddenly, he spoke up, startling me. What if I told you that everything is not what it seems? I... He was looking directly at me now. Everything. The world, the governments, the countries they control. History. Humanity. I closed my mouth. Uh-oh. I thought to myself. One of those conspiracy kooks. Like the moon is a hologram and the earth is flat, I said, emphasizing my sarcasm with a sneer. He shook his head, but he wasn't mad. No. Like. He looked away from me and then back. His eyes were fire. Like we're not alone in the universe. Like there's some greater force vying for domination. And the resistance. Fighting but failing. Oh, I said. I see. Aliens. Of a sort. Look, man, I don't mind helping you find your way, but I'm really not into all that conspiracy. He spoke over me, cutting me off, still blocking my path. Tell me, what were the words? Tell me what the words were. What's the harm in it? You don't believe it anyway. Tell me how you know about them. I already did. I sighed and looked past him, towards the door, wishing for freedom. I flicked my eyes back onto his. He stared back, unblinking, and there was something about him, the way he occupied space, his expression, his easy demeanor, something I trusted. He seemed harmless, if a bit crazy. I told him the words. He nodded. That's so. 
he said quietly, as if to himself. Then louder. Sorry to do this. Do what? Just, uh, just tell them that the Soviet spooks got you. Soviet what? I'm not aiming to kill. What are you talking about, man? I took a step back from him. If it looks like you struggled, it'll be, uh, safer for you. Fucking what? You can tell people what happened. Tell them the truth. Uh, capital T. But don't expect them to believe you. Seriously, man, are, are you fucking high or what? I'm, like, four seconds away from calling the cops. Pulled out my phone to show him I meant business. I knew it wouldn't work, and I would think he did too, because he just glanced at it and then back at my face. They might not come immediately, but they'll come. Eventually. Two of them. Or three, depending on the severity of the case. Black suits, ties, shoes, white shirts, all nice and proper. They'll ask to come in. Don't let them. Ask to meet them somewhere the next day, in public. He looked around. I wouldn't come back here for a few days if I were you. Too isolated. He paused. Oh. And when they do come, and they will, be prepared. Prepared for what? He swung his hand around his torso, then pulled it back with lightning speed. He was holding something that glinted in the dim light, and then there was an ear-splitting bang, and then pain in my left shoulder. Intense and biting, making me fall to my knees and slump back against the wall, bleeding. You shot me! Holy shit, you shot me! The guy didn't respond, but he knelt down next to me and placed his gloved hand over my mouth. He was holding that too thin phone in his other hand. The screen glowed and I heard a dial tone. I wondered how he had service out there. He flicked something on the screen and then held it up to his ear and said, Yes, I'd like to report an attempted burglary at... He gave the exact coordinates of my little hideaway. Someone's been shot. I tried to yell, he shot me, but the pressure of his hand increased, muffling the sound of it. He's bleeding out. Hurry. He lowered the phone from his face, lifting his hand off me, and then stood up. I sputtered, looking at him, reeling in pain. Who the fuck are you, man? Are you the Zodiac Killer or something? He simply laughed and walked over to where my equipment was located. I watched as he pulled a slim flash drive from his front pocket. Hey, what are you doing? Kill switch, he said dramatically, sticking the flash drive in one way. Cursing, flipping it over, trying again, cursing and flipping it yet again, and finally getting it in. He booted up some strangely encrypted interface and typed for a few seconds before looking over at me and saying, Hope he didn't have anything sentimental on there. He slammed his middle finger down on the enter key and my screen went black. It beeped and then restarted. I'm not ashamed to say I started crying and blubbering up. I remember I said, I don't understand what's going on. And I remember him walking over, kneeling next to me again and whispering something about being sorry about saving my life before I passed out in pain. I woke up in an ambulance being rushed to the hospital. I asked, no, screamed about the man, but was shushed, restrained, and was told everything would be okay. I passed out again. Later, at the police station, I told the cops everything, all of it, or at least I tried to. For some reason, I couldn't bring myself to tell them the words the woman had said. I just told them it sounded like Russian or something. They wrote most of my story down, but when I got to the part about the man and what he said, they stopped me and asked for a description. When I told them, the cops looked over at the detective who looked back over at me. They said nothing, but I could tell the dynamic of the room had changed. The rest of the process then seemed sped up, like they were trying to get rid of me. They told me that they would be in contact and said they would do everything they could to catch the guy then told me to get some rest, to stay with a family member. I thanked them and left. 
Their behavior was strange, sure, but it wasn't enough to sway a staunch skeptic like me. There was nothing weird or conspiratorial going on here. I was just stressed and traumatized and needed rest. Besides, the man seemed sociopathic. Able to gain my trust and betray it, like that, all within one interaction. Granted, uh, the gunshot wound was far from fatal and healed up nicely, but I still don't believe him. I couldn't. At least, I didn't want to believe him. And then something happened. Hours ago, an unmarked black SUV appeared suddenly across from my sister's house. She's currently on vacation with her family and sat there, parked, for hours. I first noticed it at about 3.33 a.m. I haven't been able to sleep much recently, and it stayed well past the sun came up and the stars disappeared. I was just starting to shrug it off as paranoia when they got out. Three men, all in black suits. One bald, one with a thick beard, and one who seemed much, much older than the other two. The latter seemed to be in charge. They banged on my door and I ignored it until I couldn't take it anymore and inched it open. The old one flashed a badge swiftly, introducing himself as a special agent. They asked to come inside and I was going to let them in when the voice of the guy, the one who shot me, rose up into the forefront of my brain. Don't, I thought better safe than sorry. I told them to meet me at a diner in town tomorrow, mid-morning. The man did not seem pleased at all, but agreed. They left, and I closed the door with a sharp snap, then ran to the window to watch them to the blinds. I saw them re-enter the SUV, I expected them to start the engine and drive off, but they didn't. I waited five minutes, ten minutes, twenty, an hour. They're still there, parked across the street, watching and waiting. What the fuck? I wasn't going to tell anyone for fear that they would call me crazy, a kook. But I'm scared, and writing this all out was somewhat therapeutic. Does anyone know what's going on? Uh, yes, the SUV is still there. Uh, no, I can't see any movement inside. Uh, no, I'm not going to call the cops, especially after what happened with them. Yes, that journal and what I wrote in it is on my mind. What if they find it? What if it implicates me? What do I do? I'm scared. And I'm not prepared. I'm posting this before I'm completely gone. I found this rock last year. I, I think it's from space. Ever since I found it, my life has been falling apart. I can't remember anything most of the time. I can't control my emotions. I don't remember the last time I slept. I, I think I've hurt people. I found where I wrote about it in my diary. I just posted everything from that point forward. Some irrelevant stuff, but it's so bright in here I can barely see to read. I know I won't make it. I'm going to run away before I hurt anyone or anything else. Don't come looking. It has me. August 21st, 2017. I witnessed my first ever solar eclipse today. I was stunned at how much I enjoyed it. I've always thought space and astronomy were cool, but I think today inspired me to actually start learning as much as possible about phenomena beyond our own worlds. Funny enough, I found the strangest looking rock I've ever seen. In fact, I almost didn't think it's a simple rock at all. It's shaped kind of odd and has little holes in it. I hope it's a meteor or something interesting like that. The grass I found it in had mostly been burnt or something. It almost looked like it was decomposing. No crater though, so probably not from space, which sucks. I put some gloves on and placed it in a Ziploc bag. I'm going to do some research to make sure it's not dangerous. October 14, 2017 Life's been hectic. School, work, drama. What else is new? Finally going to get back into my astronomy kick. 
Yeah, right. I've been far too exhausted from school to focus on more academic stuff, but I have managed to do some research on the rock I found nearly a month ago. Uh, definitely not a meteor. I can't find anything or anyone that seems to know what I've got. Clara really wants me to get rid of it. She thinks it makes my apartment smell, which is ridiculous, because it's still in the plastic bag. Plus, I haven't smelled anything strange. Maybe I'm just around my apartment too much to notice some faint smell. Whatever this thing is, it's definitely not normal, though. The plastic bag has turned a dark, greenish color on the inside, which is gross. If I can't figure this out soon, I'm just going to toss it and move on. October 20th, 2017. Uh, me and Clara broke up a few days ago. I was going to write about it immediately, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I'm not even sure how it came to this. But one minute we are perfectly fine, and the next she's leaving, and I'm calling her a bitch. God damn it. I know I shouldn't have said it. I just got so angry when she insisted I throw this freaking rock out. It's stupid, but I don't really have time for any normal hobbies. I'm just trying to enjoy myself a little. I did throw it out after she left. I thought I might tell her and ask her to take me back, but I ended up digging through the dumpster to find it again the next day. If she saw that, she definitely wouldn't come back. Good news is, I did finally find something online that sounded similar to the rock, but it was just some weird demonic color from space or something in a fictional story. But hey, a start is a start. I'm thinking about taking it out of the bag and trying to do some amateur tests on it. November 1st, 2017. No news on the rock front. It pretty much just sits in my fridge at this point. I put it in there because it definitely smells. It's also hot as hell. I dropped it immediately after taking it out of the bag. It straight up burnt my hand. No idea how it didn't melt the bag or my gloves when I first grabbed it to be honest but I've really had bigger problems lately than a strange rock. I think I'm depressed about my relationship ending. It's hard to put it into words, but I just can't focus right anymore. At school, I just stare at the professors, but sometimes I can't even hear what they're saying. I haven't hung out with my friends in over a week. I barely eat, and I constantly sleep. I've been depressed before, but man, this bout of it is bad. I'm going to start hitting the gym again. Maybe the adrenaline will do me some good. November 12th, 2017. Finals are coming, and I'm so stressed out. I know I'm not ready, but I just can't focus long enough to study. I barely do anything at home anymore but read morbid horror stories online. I think that's starting to affect my mental health. I did manage to go out to a bar the other night with some friends, but... I kinda wish I didn't. I punched Mason in the face last night after drinking too much. I only had a few shots, but after not drinking for the last few months, I guess my tolerance went down. He said he thought I was better off without Clara. But what the fuck does he know? I know he meant well. I know I should apologize, but I just can't bring myself to do it. Uh, hell, I haven't even cleaned out the rotting food from my fridge yet. If I don't go to the grocery store soon, my pantry will be completely empty. I hope all of this is over soon. December 2nd, 2017. I skipped my first final today. God, I hate myself. I'm just gonna drop out. I don't know how I'm gonna tell my mom. I, I think something is wrong with me. I got mad at myself for not showering for the last three days and punched a hole in my wall. Hand is busted up, and now I have to get this hole fixed. I don't even read horror stories anymore. I don't do anything but get angry and cry. I don't think I'm going to keep writing in this thing either. It's bumming me out rereading this crap. January 1st, 2018. Man, last year was tough. But I guess sometimes you gotta hit rock bottom to know where the top is, right? I got a job now. It doesn't pay very well, but it's a start on rebuilding myself. Been hanging out with Mason and the rest of the gang lately. I think I'm getting over my depression. I even started researching this rock thing again. 
The smell is gone. God, cleaning out my fridge was a nightmare. But the rock is literally glowing right now. Radioactive? It's probably not, or I'd be dead or sick according to the internet. I think the lights in my apartment are reflecting off of it. I tried breaking it in half to see what it looks like on the inside, but no luck. Even the hammer doesn't phase it, which I'm actually okay with, because it gives me something to focus my mind on. I also picked up several books on beginner's astronomy and got myself a telescope. I'm actually a little excited for the future for once. January 5th, 2018. I'm trying to make it a habit to write in this thing at least once a week. I think it helps me drain the negativity from my mind. Like today. I got sent home from work because my boss said I smelt like I haven't taken a shower in a week. What's ridiculous about that is that I showered this morning and I wear fairly strong deodorant. I guess my natural B.O. was worse than I thought. He also said I looked like I needed sleep. I admit I've been getting less sleep than usual lately, but only by a couple of hours. I'm still obsessed over this rock. I'm either trying to look up what it could possibly be made of, or watching scary movies about weird things from space. I've still found out basically nothing about the rock, and the movies don't really scare me anymore. But I think the routine is comforting. Still salty about being sent home, but I guess it's no big deal. I bought stronger deodorants, though I think my boss just doesn't like me for whatever reason. He may be right about the sleep loss, though. I do have some serious bags under my eyes. I guess I'll just try to get to bed early tonight. January 16th, 2018. Just joined Reddit today. Mostly to read No Sleep and other creepypastas. Hearing them narrated to me is cool, but something about the words silently running through my head is better. Sometimes I read them for hours just staring blankly at my computer screen. I guess I zone out sometimes, but more than once I've realized I was staring at the rock on my shelf. It's about as bright as my computer screen, but sits on the other side of the room. It's strange how I don't always notice turning around. January 31st, 2018. I was going to watch videos of the lunar eclipse today since I couldn't see it where I live. Instead, I spent all day trying to stop this rock from glowing so brightly. It shines right through blankets like they aren't even there. I put it in the closet, and it was still so bright I could have sworn it was right next to me. I haven't been getting to work on time lately. I haven't even been writing in this thing every week like I intended. I need sleep. February 4th, 2018. I woke up this morning to a text from Clara. What the hell is wrong with you? Apparently, I called her last night. I I don't remember doing it, but sure enough, one outgoing call to Clara. I must have been drunk, though. I haven't kept alcohol in my apartment for a few weeks. Maybe I went to the bar down the street or something. My mind's been hazy today. I called her and asked her what I said, and she said I threatened her or something. She said I asked her to come see the rock, and when she refused, I blew up on her. She really should see this thing, though. It's so bright, I don't even turn my lights on anymore. I tried apologizing, but ended up angry. I guess I'm more stressed out than I realized. February 10th, 2018. Mason came over today, and tried to take the rock away from me. He says I kept talking about it when we went out last night. He also says I agreed to let him come get rid of it for me. Bullshit. I think he's just trying to make me seem crazy so he can get with Clara. Fuck him. He even had the nerve to straight up lie to my face. It's not healthy to sit in the dark all day, man. And there's mold all over your walls. Sit in the dark? It mold? Does he think I'm an idiot? This rock is glowing so bright it sometimes hurts when I stare at it too long. And I'd notice mold on my walls. You think someone cares about you until they start gaslighting you. February 22nd, 2018. My dreams have been intensely vivid lately. I dreamt I got angry at the squirrels on the roof of my apartment and went outside to catch one. But the dream was like a horror story or something I would read online. Only I was the monster. 
I grabbed a squirrel from one of the trees that hangs over the walkway and just tore its skin off bit by bit. Its scream startled me awake. I must have fallen asleep in my chair while staring at the rock. How I fell asleep when the damn thing is so bright, I don't know. I guess I gripped the sides of my chair so hard while I was having the nightmare that I cut my fingers. They are torn up quite a bit, and I got blood all over my chair. February 23rd, 2018 My neighbors called the cops on me today because, apparently, there are several dead squirrels lined up in front of my front door. I threw up when I saw them. At first, I thought someone was playing a sick joke on me and told the cops as much. They agreed and left it at that, but when I came to write it here, I saw yesterday's entry. I don't even remember writing that or having that dream. Did I do that to those animals? Fuck. What's happening to me? March 12th, 2018. I got fired, but whatever. Also wrote and posted my first story on No Sleep today, so there's something. Honestly, I'd rather just sit here and read and write scary stories. I think my depression is back, or has been back. Sometimes it's hard to tell. March 19th, 2018. Happy birthday to me, I guess. I was supposed to go see my family today, but I didn't. Haven't seen them since I dropped out of school. I feel sick lately. I threw up twice yesterday. My memory is getting worse as well. I keep forgetting this rock is in my apartment, even though it glows so fucking bright I can see it outside through my window. Also, I think I've started losing my hair. Great. Just what I needed. April 3rd, 2018. I've been losing a lot of weight. Like, way too much. Made a doctor's appointment and then skipped it. I hadn't spoken to anyone in person or online in over a week. Last night I had a panic attack when I thought I saw people trying to bust through my apartment window. I swear to god I saw three or four pairs of hands running along my window and heard them banging on it. The light from the rock showed the shadows almost as clear as if they were inside my apartment. I screamed for them to go away. I hid in my closet for a while with my hands over my ears, crying. Eventually I grabbed a knife and went outside to make them stop. No one was out there. A neighbor sitting outside the door, smoking, saw me. I ran back inside and locked the door. I'm never going back outside. May 9th, 2018. It had been a while since I wrote here. I'm doing better. But reading my past entries is kind of surreal. I still can't really remember the things I've written about, but I can remember being depressed and not leaving my apartment. I still don't really go out and have stuff delivered but I have been occasionally going out to work some odd jobs to get by, mostly driving. It's fine for now. Saving so much money on electricity isn't the worst thing either. But I decided to get rid of the rock. It's not healthy for me to keep this thing anymore. I'm driving somewhere tomorrow I can't just walk to and tossing it in a lake or something. Hopefully that helps me get back to normal. May 10th, 2018. I woke up holding the rock. I don't know how long it had been in my hands, but they are badly burnt. My apartment smells like burnt flesh. It's awful. They hurt too bad to drive anywhere. I'll get rid of the rock some other time when I can grip a steering wheel again. July 1st, 2018. How long can someone go without sleeping? The internet says roughly 11 days, but I think I've been awake longer. I'm not sure, though. I dream, uh, constantly. I dream of going outside and screaming at my neighbors. I dream about harassing delivery drivers. I, I dream of mutilating stray animals. I dream of watching my hands burn as I stare into the light of the rock. But I definitely haven't slept. I'm sure of it. Maybe these scary stories are getting to me. I need to quit wasting so much time on Reddit and focus on the rock. I think it's mad at me. July 10th, 2018. I feel lucid today. I actually slept last night without dreaming. 
I woke up to find my toes completely numb and turning black. It looks like frostbite, but it's 90 degrees outside. I can barely walk on them. I decided to charge my phone for the first time in a month so I could call a doctor. Over 30 texts from Clara and Mason. Where are you? Can I come over? We're worried about you. I'm outside. Open your door. Dude, I can see you looking at me through the blinds. You need to see a doctor. Why won't they leave me alone? They just want to hurt me. They can't really care about me. I know it. They just came to take the one thing I care about away from me. To think I almost did exactly what they wanted me to do. July 11th, 2018. My apartment smells like rot, and I can't find the source. This is what I get for renting in the city. July 12th, 2018. There's blood all over my bathroom. I guess it's mine, but I can't tell. The light is too bright. I can't see. Typing hurts my fingers so much. I wish Clara hadn't left her phone here. It keeps ringing. The rock won't let me answer it, though. I really wish it would tell me what it is, but it says I'm not ready. It cares about me, and I'm thankful at least someone does. It keeps the shadows away. They never leave my windows. It's so loud. I dreamt Clara was here. And Mason. Why won't they leave me alone? This happened to my mother in 1991, in a known army town in Queensland, Australia. I apologize for the length, but hope you will stay to read the entire thing. It won't disappoint. I was around at the time. Even though I was a child, I do remember bits and pieces. I'll try to do my mother's story justice here. So as I said, it's 1991. Somalia has erupted into civil war requiring UN intervention. Soldiers from our town are deployed, which leaves women and children home alone. Not a big deal now, lots of single moms out there, but back in 91, it was a rarer thing. This all started with a prowler alert, so the MPs alerted certain areas that someone has been spotted sneaking around yards and under houses late at night. We became aware of it when I screamed in horror at the man's face on the other side of my window. Not a big deal, until you hear that these houses were typical Queenslander homes, so the house was on the second story and underneath was wide open only for slatting surrounding it. This man had to have climbed the side of the house and been hanging on my window, two stories up, just to peer in. MPs, military police, were deployed, found him down the street and issued a firm move on order. So two weeks later, and the prowler warnings are wrapping up, he's getting dangerous harassing women in their laundries, in the area under the houses, following them to their doors, up their external stairs at the rear of their properties, and watching them from the street, as well as pinching underwear off of clotheslines. Residents are being warned to check their wheelie bins before bringing them in as prowlers may be hiding in them to gain access to properties. Scary stuff for young mothers with young children, whose husbands are deployed. State police at this time have minimal jurisdiction as the properties were owned by the army at the time. MPs just decided the women were paranoid because their hubbies were away. Another week goes by and my mother notices a man in her backyard. She's concerned, but my mother is as tough as guts. As time progresses, he's at the same shopping center watching her, walking down her street, just everywhere she seems to be. She reports every incident, but nothing is done. She gets home one day and something isn't right. You know, when you hear people say they just have a gut feeling. She did. She gets inside to discover the place has been gone through and nothing taken. 
She calls the MPs and as she is looking out the front window, sees that same man creep out of her garage. He was still there when she got home. I was with her at the time. I think that's what saved her that day. Again, nothing is done. She is brushed off as being paranoid. This is where my mom changes her demeanor. She pursed her lips and took a breath, tensing. Mom said some might call her crazy, but she's never had this experience before or since. She said she could almost hear him, hear his thoughts. She knew with every cell in her body she was in danger. She said she could almost feel him nearby, looking at her, into her soul. She just knew he was there in her yard, looking up at her, somehow knowing exactly where in the house she was at that very moment, despite the blackout curtains and lights off. So mom calls the police again. They don't even bother coming out. I should note, she wasn't the only one that reported a prowler. Mom packed me up the very next day, and we were on a bus interstate to stay with relatives until my father returned from deployment. She just knew in her gut she was going to be murdered, and police weren't taking anything seriously. So by 92, the deployment comes to an end, and we return home. Mom, of course, had kept in contact with other wives and had heard some rumors swirling. We arrived home to my mother retelling to me now of a card shoved under her door from detectives. It was an apology that her complaints weren't taken seriously, but she and the neighborhood are now safe. However, two women are dead. Joelle Danoy, 29, and Jennifer Malley, 40. There was rape that had taken place. Both women were shot with a 22 pistol, and Jennifer's throat had also been cut. Later, a siege in a Brisbane park, 1,300 kilometers away, ended with a shooting suicide of one Jason Michael Knights, 19. The pistol he had shot himself with was connected directly to the two murdered women, leaving shattered families and a community that had lost its country feel and trust in my mother who has never been the same since. If you look hard enough, there is an article from the Sydney Morning Herald to verify, though you do not need to subscribe to read it. It's hard to find any other detailed information, as rumor has it. Uh, the killer was related to a higher up in the army. It was kept very hushed, in a way in which one, when my mother tried to gain more information about it, she was told nothing of the sort ever took place. She asked me, with my techno know-how, to delve into the internet to find it. So that's my mother's story of her encounter with a deranged double murderer who stalked her and an entire community for months, paying particular care to his prey and biding his time to strike. For some backgrounds, I'm a 24-year-old woman. I'm not the most intimidating person out there, but I can hold my own if necessary. My dad was a police officer most of my life, and he taught me some tricks if I ever get into a situation I need to get out of. When I was 17, I was dating this guy that was pretty abusive. Within two months of us dating, he had already proposed. At me, thinking I was grown up, I said yes. Now I realize that was a big mistake. He was 20 at the time, so I had no clue why he wanted to date someone who was still in high school. After I said yes to his proposal, he started getting very controlling. He would always text me after I got out of school since he got off work at the same time. He would say he was coming over and that I didn't have a choice. He would show up at my house while I was doing homework, forced me into his truck and drive me around until almost midnight every night. Eventually, I got a part-time job at a fast food restaurant in my town. He was not happy about this. He was convinced I was going to cheat on him. He would show up at every single shift I worked and caused a scene. He ended up getting me fired from there. After I'd finally had enough, I broke up with him, returned his ring and all the things he bought me, and blocked his number. 
He showed up at my house in the middle of the night and cut my brake line on my car. He also slashed three of my tires. Luckily, my car insurance allowed for towing, so I had my car towed to a local auto repair shop. That ended up costing me over a thousand dollars in damage. A few weeks later, a police officer came to my house saying that someone had made a complaint against me for harassment. They claimed they needed my phone to see my activity. I agreed and let them see all of my communication. They said they had everything they needed and left. It turns out my ex had claimed I had been harassing him when I wasn't. But once the police officer saw that, they took my name out of their system. A month later, I hadn't heard from my ex, so I was feeling safer. I had started a new job, and when I had started, my ex somehow found it. He came to my job and started harassing me and my co-workers. I eventually told my boss what had happened between us in the past. My boss banned him from the property, and my schedule was changed so he couldn't see me. My ex found out my new schedule, but I was luckily sent to the back for training so it would look like I wasn't there. After about six months of this, he stopped showing up, and I had found another job. I had graduated high school and was pregnant with my daughter. I found out that my ex was a registered sex offender, and since I had just turned 17 when we started dating, he was charged with a violation of probation. Moral of the story, guys are weird, and never date someone controlling who stalks you when you make them mad. My boyfriend, Jeff, and I lived in a semi-sketchy part of Tucson, Arizona. It's not gunfire every night type of sketchy, uh, more uh, I took my dog on a walk and came face to face with a canine unit searching for a murder suspect in my apartment complex, sketchy. It's also relevant to note that this is a dark sky community so our streetlights are incredibly dim. Jeff and I decided around 11.30pm to go out and buy water. The tap here is downright undrinkable, so we live off of gallon jugs, and we'd run out earlier that day. The Albertsons was directly across the street from us, so we figured it would be a quick errand. We went in, grabbed a couple of jugs each, and went back out to the car. I don't remember what we were chatting about, but... It was a light-hearted conversation. My car had manual locks, so I waited on the passenger side while Jeff set his jugs of water on the roof of the car, unlocked his own door, then grabbed the jugs. His face, which had previously been hidden by the gallons, startled me. He had an expression I'd never seen before, fixated just past my shoulder, looking somewhere between angry and stressed. He was standing rigid, staring. What the fuck do you think you're doing? He said loudly, and for a confusing split second I thought he was talking to me. I turned and felt my stomach drop. A man I'd never seen before was a few feet behind me, almost at my back. I hadn't heard him walk up. I hadn't seen him out of my peripheral. I'd had no idea this man was behind me, and had no idea where he'd come from as the dim parking lot was mostly empty. The thing that was the most frightening was his reaction. He didn't pause, didn't step back. He actually kept moving towards me and my still locked car door. I learned that night that there is a very significant difference between a person that cannot hear you or is ignoring you, and a person that is not even registering that you've spoken. That scared the shit out of me. That blankness made him seem inhuman. The man had just kept moving forward, slowly, and made no sign that he had heard Jeff, who was still yelling. Hey, get the fuck back, asshole. At this point, my boyfriend ran around the car, unlocked my door, and practically shoved me inside before slamming the door shut and locking it. At this point, I expected the man to run, but... He simply turned around and walked to another car before cupping his face and peering into the windows. Judging by his bedraggled appearance and lack of keys and belongings, it was clear he was looking for things to steal. Our neighborhood is prone to car thieves. 
Get the fuck out of here. Jeff was still yelling, and I could tell he was about to go after the guy who had started ambling towards a different vehicle. My boyfriend is a great guy, but can be prone to hot-headedness when he feels threatened, and I knew that he had a pocket knife with him at all times. At that point, I could tell I was on the verge of a panic attack, so I rolled down the window and told him to get in the damn car so we could go home. We parked, and I basically ran up the stairs, drew all the blinds, and double-checked all the doors were locked before I started crying. I'm 5'2", 115 pounds, and although I did cross-country in high school, I'm not overly fast or strong. I had had no idea anyone was behind me and would never know why he was trying to get to me. And if Jeff hadn't been there, I could easily imagine a number of ways that situation could have devolved. It was weeks before I felt comfortable going back to Albertson's after dark, and never alone. Pianos had been such a big part of my childhood. From smacking the keys at age four, to playing Flight of the Bumblebee at 17, I knew more than the average bear about the piano. If anything, you could call me a child prodigy. So being like this, my parents added a driving force to what I could do with my time, restricting me from hanging out with friends and making me spend time with the piano, to whom I eventually considered my best friend. You could say they had a totalitarian grip on my social life, making me the target for most attacks at school. I didn't mind, though. The insults thrown my way don't really matter to me. The piano in my hands mattered. So when my piano was out of tune, my dad called a tuner. A tuner who, in fact, taught my dad something I didn't know. I think all of us have seen a piano with the hood open, exposing the wood and bits of string and metal inside and I bet you played Hot Cross Buns or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, watching the pegs hit the tiny strings moving about in different directions and hearing sweet notes. For my piano, all you heard was a sour melody. Nice to meet you, I'm John, my dad said, firmly grasping the tuner's hand. My dad smiled and walked over to the piano and softly rested his hand on it. I gazed from the distance, my eyes fixed on his hand. Hope you do a fine job, sir. My son's over there. He pointed his finger to me and raised his eyebrows. He's a master at this right here. He tapped a glossy black cover with his fingernails. He gave a weak grin and pointed in my direction. The tuner gripped his bag and fixed the baseball hat resting on his hairless head. The man looked about in his mid-sixties. Balding. He had a scratchy scruff dabbled on his face. His pale complexion was too light for his pitch black eyes, which seemed to poke out of his head. His height was overwhelming. I almost had to look up at him while he spoke to me. And what might your name be, son? His words seemed to create a song on its own. His voice, that voice, it was almost calming, soothing in a way. His voice wasn't too high or low, it seemed to be just right. It almost sounded fake. Stunned, I muttered. Eric, I shouted like I had just spoken for the first time. His voice threw me off guard. For a man his height, I didn't expect him to have that kind of voice. The man gazed in my eyes. His eyes were as black as the shiny cover of the piano. In fact, I think they were even darker. Feeling nervous, I stuck out my hand to try to be friendly-like. My dad was staring me down anyway, waiting for me to be the polite gentleman he taught me to be. The tuner clasped my hand into his. His skin, it was so soft, the softest thing I'd ever touched. It was like a dog with long hair whose fur was silky soft. It was strange. He gave it a good shake and set his hand down. I'm Andrew. Andrew Walker. You call me Mr. Walker, boy. He softly spoke. In his other hand, a fabric tool bin was being grasped firmly. Mr. Walker nodded his head and turned his body to face my father. Well, I'll take a look. Could your boy possibly play a song so I can evaluate what works and doesn't? 
Mr. Walker blinked, then turned his head to look at me. He smiled and walked to the other side of the room. My dad's eyes narrowed as he looked directly at me. I knew he wanted me to play. My father spoke. Of course he can. Eric. My dad rolled out my name as I nodded my head. I sat down on the soft seat and raised my hands to the keys. A feeling washed over me. Nervousness. This was something I had never felt before when it came to the piano. Everything just came to me. I didn't know what to do. My palms were sweaty as I slid my fingers across the chords and keys. Sour notes filled the air. I could catch Mr. Walker flinching and squinting his eyes out of the corner of mine while I played. He was almost wincing, which was odd. Once I finished, Mr. Walker gave a small clap. Wonderful. Just lovely, Eric. He turned his eyes to mine. I can hear the problem. I'm going to take a look. Mr. Walker sat his bag down and opened it up. His tools were all standard tuning tools, uh, nothing out of the blue. He clasped a large metal rod and cracked the hood of the piano open. He gripped the side of the music stand as he turned his head around to see me and my father just staring at him whilst he stood over the piano. My dad jolted up and stuttered. Oh, uh, would you like some privacy while you work, sir? My father asked. That would be great. Thank you, John. Mr. Walker moved his hand to rest softly on top of the piano and grazed his fingers over the back. He itched a spot. His face lit up as a wide smile crossed his features. It seems you have my good old gal. She was mine back in the day. I didn't think I'd see her again. Mr. Walker pushed the wheeled piano out of the corner and waved his hand to call me over. Take a look, Eric. That's my signature. Mr. Walker looked up at me as his knee rested on the ground. I guess fate wanted us to meet again. You see? He pointed to the spot in which I glanced at. In a scratchy carving was the cursive signature of the name, Property of Andrew Walker. Mr. Walker tapped the leg of the piano and grinned. I'll give her my special treatment, just for her. With the metal tool grasped in his hand, he stood up and almost skipped to his tool bag. I cocked my head and just stared at him. Not to be creepy or anything, but I could stare into that man's eyes for hours on end. Something about them just gave comfort, a thing not a lot of people possess. Mr. Walker looked at me and blinked. Your father said privacy, right? Not to kick you out of your own house, but I have lots of work to do. Right. Uh, Eric, come on. Go to your room. My father spoke. He turned around and started to trip towards me and rested his hand on my shoulder. I swallowed and looked up at him. Before my dad could follow me, Mr. Walker cut in. Oh, John, you can stay. I have some things I could show you. Mr. Walker's gaze turned to my dad. My father nodded as he bent down next to him. I slowly backed away and my dad snapped his head around and gave me the If you don't go right now, shit will get real later. Look. I turned around as I got one last look at Mr. Walker. What I saw was a little strange. He was chipping his tools inside the piano as my dad stood idle and watched. My dad spent a small fortune on that thing and he was destroying it. My eyebrows furrowed as I gripped the side of the counter but it slowly faded into my thoughts of explanation. He's probably just doing his job. I don't know how these things work anyways. I convinced myself he was doing more good than bad and I walked down the hallway to my room. She. Look. Fine job. These were just some of the words I heard from my room over the next few hours. I sat on my bed as I looked down at my sweat-filled palms. Why was I nervous? I never got... Eric. My name jolted me out of my thoughts. I looked to see my dad, smiling and grinning. You can come out now, kid. His hand was on the frame of my door, tapping his pointer finger as he hummed. I squinted my eyes at my dad. Kid. He was never like that. My father was stern, slow, demanding. He never turned down a thing. 
He was a daredevil. Aggressive, competitive, never cheery. I was confused and concerned. I jumped out of my spot and pushed past my father, speed walking down the hallway. I rounded the corner and saw my piano, rested in the same spot it was before, just as slick and shiny as it was. My face went from scared to content. Mr. Walker stood next to the piano, gripping his tool bag in both hands. She's all fixed, maybe sounding better than she ever did before. Mr. Walker smiled and tightened the cap on his head. He turned his eyes to mine, fixing his gaze into me. How do you say, Eric? He walked over to me and put his hand on my shoulder. My nerves tightened as my head lifted up to reveal his dark, pitch eyes staring right into me. She's a biter. Be careful. He smiled with his teeth and chuckled, walking away to my dad. What the hell was going on? A million thoughts raced through my mind. My dad was acting like a weirdo. She bites. Pianos don't... How much do I owe you, sir? My dad took me out of my trance, standing behind me. I looked back at him, my forehead drenched with sweat. Clearly nervous, I shuffled to the side of the room and just stood there. Mr. Walker looked at my dad and smiled. Oh, no, no, no. I'll do this one free of charge. He looked at me and spoke. If she causes any trouble, just give me a ring. I'm only a dial away. He hooked his thumbs in his pockets as he started towards the door, his boots clicking on the ground. Have a good day. His black eyes narrowed on me as he opened the door and walked out of my house. I was so alarmed, almost shocked. But what had just happened? Am I thinking too much into this? My dad's gaze fixed on me as he frowned. Get cleaned up for dinner. When going out. My dad walked into the kitchen and walked up the stairs. I sighed in relief. I, I thought there was something wrong with him. Thank God. I walked slowly back down the hallway. A couple of weeks had passed after Mr. Walker came into our home. Everything seemed normal and I continued to play on the piano as normal. And boy, did Mr. Walker do something to that piano. It sounded so fresh, quaint and almost angelic. It sounded so much better than before, and I was quite happy after that. I really did think that the problem might have been eliminated altogether, and after that, I didn't think that I would have to get any tuning job again. My hands whisked with the melody, and the melody stuck to me. Playing some chime in my brain as I swept my hands across the pilot keys. With this enchantment of the piano, I never seemed to notice the small, acute, firm fingernails sticking in the cracks of the keys until I stabbed my pointer on one. By one, I mean there were many nails sticking out. I held up my hand and gripped in my other, looking down at the keys, gazing at the foggy yet clear divot. My eyes almost jumped out of their sockets as it seemed the piano was almost teasing me to play another song. I slowly let go of my other hand, letting it slip down onto the key in the center, exposing the gap in between, showing the grueling length of the nail. It was jagged and sharp, chipped and broken. My mouth opened slightly as I felt a wince in my finger. Shit, I muttered under my breath and stood up, walking over to the kitchen to turn on the sink. It stung like a bitch. I didn't think a fingernail could sting that bad. To top that off, a piano can't grow a fucking fingernail. My head snapped back to the piano as I rushed back over, looking at the cracks. Less than few had the long-edged thing sticking out of it. My eyes shook as I called out to my dad. Hey, dad? My voice was broken as I was quite disturbed with what I was looking at. Yes. My father stomped into the living room, holding a hammer and nails in his hands. He looked at me as I nervously began to speak. Uh, well, uh, I was playing something and... Uh, sweat began to drip down my forehead as I stopped. Spit it out, I'm busy. My father's words were harsh, like a snake's tongue. He moved the nail in his left hand up to his mouth and bit on it, 
freeing his hand. I think there's fingernails growing out of the cracks in the piano. I finished my sentence as my dad gave me a blank stare. His under eyes squinted as he spoke. You know she can hear you, right? His eyes fixed over to the piano, whose elongated keys had seemed to have been dampened by a glossy cover. He bent over and put his finger on it, tracing the water-like substance off of it. He felt it over the tips of his hands. It sweats. He rubbed his hands on his pants as he spoke. It doesn't talk to you, Eric, does it? He walked past me. My heart raced as he walked out of the door leaving a loud thump behind him. I swallowed deep as I backed away from the piano. What the fuck? Talking to me? Sweat? It's not a person. It, uh, it can't sweat. Can it? A million thoughts raced in my head as I looked over to the thing before me. It wasn't an item of music. It sweat. Grew fingernails. My heart raced as I realized the thing that hadn't been opened since Mr. Walker came to fix the piano. My body slowly crumpled over to the side of the piano, my hands gripping the hood of the piano. As my fingers clutched to the hood, I slowly cracked it open. What I saw is engraved in my mind for the rest of my time on this godforsaken earth. Hair. Fucking hair growing from the wooden pegs. It was all different colors. They were strung about in a messy manner, just waiting to be combed or brushed. But it was silky and slick. Some kind of substance was coated in it, dripping down from the pegs and more. It looked like pus, and it was just clumps and chunks of what I assumed to be fingertips. Uh, fingers? I, I couldn't tell. My eyes darted around, golden locks, brown and red. If it was a hair color, it was in that piano. My battered breath quickened as I slammed the lid shut, tumbling back. My eyelids flickered as I raised my trembling hands to my face, smacking it multiple times. Struggling to keep my balance, I fell on my knees, a loud thump echoing off the hardwood floor. I looked up to see the piano, the side angle shiny and glossed. Just the way Mr. Walker left it. Mr. Walker, he said I could... I swallowed, my dry throat bobbing up and down. I was still bent down on the hardwood floor, my knees shaking in place. I began to stand up slowly as I felt nerves sweep over my body. Shit, I muttered, grasping the side of a wall. I stumbled over to the kitchen counter, pulling a drawer wide open. An array of papers stood on top of the stack as I drove my hands in, digging around for that one slip. That one slip of hope I still grasped onto. Finally, after what seemed like eternity, I found what I was looking for. Piano tunist for hire, 10 to $15 an hour, depends on piano, call today. I examined the sheet and found the small phone number at the bottom. Sighing with relief, I made a mad dash for the kitchen cell phone, clutching it in my hand. I smacked the numbers into the landline and heard the sound of buzzing and buzzing and... Andrew Walker, who's speaking? The soft man's voice flooded the phone as my ears relaxed at the voice on the other end. Uh, Mr. Walker, it's... Uh, it's Eric. You, uh, you tuned my piano a couple of weeks ago. My voice filled with a mix of relief and dread. It must have sounded like I was about to die on the other end. Ah, yes, my old girl. How's she treating you, son? Mr. Walker's voice filled with desire and glee as he spoke to me. My eyes twitched and my blood boiled. Treating me. Treating me. Mr. Walker, your piano is not a piano. It might as well be human. There's fingernails, uh, hair, sweat. I was practically shouting on the other end to him as I continued on. And my dad is acting fucking weird. He says that she can hear me. I don't know what you brought into our house, but whatever you have, it's... I was cut off as the ever-calming voice flooded the phone line. What I brought into your home is a mix of my past, my creation, my joy. It seems you find her appealing. Well, Eric, 
She tells me you're just the perfect one she's been looking for. Your dad has been hinting at your future, my good boy. I was going to tell her to say it herself, but... Mr. Walker gave out a chuckle as he continued on. I guess she's already told you. You're ready to join her and the others. As I heard the phone click and the ever-growing line beep, my forehead dripped with sweat. I didn't know what he meant by the others. I think I never will. But what I hear when I'm sleeping at night down the hall is something I can't strip from my mind. The ever-growing, faint noise of a melody. A hum. A tune so sweet it could capture me in my thoughts with the flick of its fingers. Playing the piano doesn't seem so bad, doesn't it? I guess if you all gave it a try, found just the right tuner, and had one hell of a trip like mine, you would find that special someone. In the late 1950s, a group of American researchers wanted to test the adaptability of different animals. They began to hypothesize an extreme question. Is it possible for a dog to become completely civilized? They wanted to know if it would be possible to have a man walk side by side with a dog as near equals. The experiment would be this. A high-class family of a mother, a father, and a teenage son would live in a house with a dog. They would live their lives as normal, but would rarely leave the house except for short breaks of fresh air. Their goal was to make the dog adjust to modern human society. From birth, the dog would be separated from its mother and not have interaction with any other dogs throughout its lifetime. The researchers felt that if it encountered even one other dog at all during its lifetime, all their effort and research would be immediately undone and it would be reverted back to its natural instinctive lifestyle. As a result, the house would be built in complete seclusion inside a building. Immediately after being born, the dog would be dressed in specifically made clothes so it could get used to wearing them faster. They chose a Doberman Pinscher as they had garnered the reputation of being fast learners and picking up new concepts and orders quicker than most other breeds. They had also been used in earlier world wars, so it was thought that it would be easier for them to become closer to man. Each member of the family would have the very strict responsibility of treating the dog like a person. They must always refer to it by its proper first name, never talk down to it like an inferior species, Always show and remind it of proper social etiquette if it forgets. Speak to it as if it understands everything they are saying. If it doesn't at first, use smaller words that are easier to understand. Never speak slowly or talk to it like it is a small child. Assist to it every day when it needs to get dressed or change clothes. Never say good boy, bad dog, or any other phrases that are commonly used with dogs. Urge it to adapt quicker if it is not adapting fast enough. Treat it like another family member, and make sure it always thinks that it is a human. The researchers began diligently working with their scheduled laboratory. They took the healthiest adult female Doberman Pinscher from the city pet shop and brought her to the lab. They slowly and meticulously genetically modified her so she would give birth to only one healthy male Doberman puppy with a natural lifespan much longer than normal. They didn't want the mother to give birth to more than one, because if it was in the womb with even one other dog, it would still feel a sense of wanting to belong with his fellow siblings throughout its life. They also made it so the dog would be born one certain size, and would grow at a certain rate all its life. They wanted to make sure that it would fit into all the clothes they made. The final size and height of the dog would be larger than normal, so it could appear more human. While waiting for the dog to be born, they built a full-sized house within the lab and prepared it for a family of three to live comfortably inside. The house had no windows because that would only encourage the dog to leave. It was decided that the dog would stay in the house at all times. If the family needed to leave, they would walk out the secret hidden front door and go into the resting area of the lab. When the house was finished, it had a downstairs living room with a small television, a kitchen, a dining room, three bedrooms, 
one for the husband and wife, one for the son and one for the dog, three walk-in closets, two in the parents' room and one in the son's room, and two bathrooms, one upstairs and one downstairs. There were no mirrors anywhere in the house. The researchers did their best to make a TV that didn't show much of a reflection. The television was connected to a signal at the laboratory that allowed the researchers to play anything they wanted at any time they wanted. Cameras were placed in every room except the two bathrooms and the two walk-in closets for privacy reasons. Each family member had a place to change and do their business, but that's pretty much the only privacy they had. Possible candidates for each of the family members were heavily questioned and interviewed. The researchers needed to make the absolute correct decision when picking the family. If this failed, the entire experiment could be ruined. Three more than capable people, who all were chosen to portray the fictional family, and they spent over six months preparing for the experiment. The father was James, the mother was Susan, and the son was Harry. They were given a large supply of nice clothes for the dog and for themselves. The kitchen was filled with necessary food to last for several weeks. If they needed, they could let the researchers know they needed food, and more would secretly be delivered to them. No one in the house needed to go to work as they were all getting paid a very substantial amount per day to do the experiment. Most importantly, each of the three family members had a small earpiece that allowed the researchers to talk to them at any point if they wanted the family to do something. The family believed they were ready for anything. They were not. Day 1 On the day the dog was born, the researchers gave him the name David. Immediately after birth, David's mother was sent back to the pet store. With his eyes still closed, David was brought into the house, dressed in his pre-fitted, fancy human clothes, and placed into Susan's lap. She held him for hours. The family allowed him to sleep under the covers of his bed in his custom-made pajamas for most of the day. When he woke up, they fed him a dairy solution from a baby bottle. Several hours after he fell asleep again, the researchers quietly entered the house and snuck up to David's room. Once there, they acted fast. They declawed the dog as quickly as possible, completely without anesthesia. It's not natural for humans to have claws. David woke up during the operation. He was in pain, but he still couldn't open his eyes, so he couldn't see who was doing it. Afterwards, the family wrapped the puppy's paws in bandages because they were starting to bleed. Later, the researchers brought a human baby into the house. He was less than two months old. The family took him and posed for a photo. They gave the baby back to the researchers and the photo was developed a few weeks later. Day 16 David finally opened his eyes and Susan decided to carry him all throughout the house. She showed him everything so he could get familiar with his surroundings. She fed him more dairy solution and let him crawl around on the ground for a little while. She showed him the picture they took with the human baby on the first day. She pointed at the baby and told the dog, That's you. The dog didn't seem to fully understand. So far, the dog seemed slightly uncomfortable with his clothes, but hopefully he will get used to them soon. Day 23 The family began to speak to the dog and try to teach him common vocabulary and word recognition. They would say things like, I am happy to see you, but heavily motioning all of the words to the dog so we could understand better. The dog's teeth began to grow in, so the family started feeding him more varieties of food. James picked up David and sat him down in a high chair. It took almost half an hour for the dog to adjust to sitting in this new manner. They gave him a bowl of assorted meat pieces. He had trouble with the first few, but he was able to eat it all without being asked. His clothes were messy, but that was his first experience like this, so it was forgivable. Worse than that, he started to pee and poop wherever he wanted. Susan carried David to most places instead of having him crawl around, so she always took him to the toilets to allow him to relieve himself. The family started to teach the dog the proper way to lie in bed. After they dressed David into pajamas, they placed him in a bed on his side and then placed the covers over him. Day 29 David started to walk. The family and researchers noticed this. 
If David learned how to walk like a dog, he might never learn how to walk properly. Susan started carrying him around more than usual. They gave him a small playpen filled with typical baby toys that he could play with. James often held David in his lap while he watched television so the puppy could also be more educated about mainstream American culture. The researchers were sure to play lots of popular shows and news programs, but they were careful to not play any material containing dogs. Sometimes David would bark at some of the things on the screen. When this happened, James would tell him to stop yelling. If it happened three times in quick succession, James would put David in the corner and force him to stay in a timeout for ten minutes. At night and in the morning, Harry was tasked with brushing the dog's teeth with his own separate individual toothbrush. Day 38 The family was encouraged to play more music in the house. In order to make David more cultured, they started to play classical music from many different composers on the record player. David appeared to enjoy listening to this. He started to walk more and more. The family knew they couldn't avoid this, so they began potty training him. There was absolutely no way for a dog to sit in the toilet seat without falling in, so the researchers designed a special toilet lid with a small hole in the middle for the downstairs bathroom so the dog could do his business more sanitarily. The family realized the three of them would have to use the upstairs toilet until the experiment was ended because there was no way a human could use the restroom the same way as the dog. The family spent several months attempting to train David when exactly to go to the bathroom and how to use the toilet like a person. He finally understood and was fully potty trained on day 241. Day 67. The researchers told the family to act more like a family, so they started acting more affectionate towards one another. Every night after dinner, James walked up behind Susan's chair and hugged his arms around her chest. He made sure to do this within view of David. The fake couple would kiss each other more often whenever David was around, and James would always express how proud he was of Harry, even when he wasn't doing anything significant. James encouraged David to drink something other than water in the dairy solution. He got a glass of standard milk and slowly poured it on the dog's throat. Some of it spilled out on the sides of David's mouth, and he choked a little, but it was done. A few hours later, the dog ran over to Susan and started whimpering. She was not sure what to do, so she asked him several times what the problem was while asking slightly different variants of the question each time. Eventually, he pooped in the middle of the floor. Susan rushed David to the bathroom and plopped him down on the seat cover. For the next half hour, David had terrible diarrhea. He didn't eat much for the rest of the day, and he was allowed to stay in his bed for a few hours. In recent days, the researchers could see through the cameras that David had not been lying in bed properly. They told this to James, and he walked into David's bedroom. He was sleeping curled up in a ball on the foot of the bed. James woke him up and told David to sleep properly in the bed. David was clearly confused and didn't understand why he had been woken up. James forcefully positioned David until he was lying down under the covers like a person would. Incidents like this occurred often. Day 102 David was sitting next to the record player for several hours listening to music. At several points, he howled along with the song. Harry sang as well and encouraged him to do this more. Harry would sing and David would howl along with the instrumental music. At lunchtime, the family decided that David didn't need his high chair anymore. He could sit in a normal chair at the table with the rest of the family. When David first walked into the kitchen for lunch, he wasn't sure where to go because his normal seat was gone. Susan motioned to his new chair, but David just stood staring at it. James picked him up and plopped him down on the seat. It was wood and there was no cushion on it. As a result, David was noticeably uncomfortable and slipped off the chair multiple times in the following days. Day 130 The family knew that David obviously could not use proper silverware, so Susan hardly ever made meals that required the use of forks or knives. David's typical meals at the table were meat. Sometimes they gave him a bowl of soup, but that usually resulted in a mess, and he would get yelled at for that. They never fed him normal dog food. On this day, David sat down on his chair and Susan put a peanut butter and honey sandwich on the plate. David stared at it for a moment before digging in. 
He had a bit of trouble chewing it at some points, and he ate three quarters of it before sliding off the chair and walking away. Susan picked him up and placed him back in his seat. She told him to finish his meal or he wouldn't get any dinner. He didn't really understand, so Susan held up the sandwich up to David's mouth and kept it there until he ate the entire thing. Day 158 The family started taking more and more photos with human children and putting them into the home, proclaiming that they are pictures of David. Now that he was very comfortably walking on all fours, the family tried to make him walk on his hind legs. They reasoned that the more he did it, the more comfortable he would be doing it. They brought him into the living room and joyfully encouraged him to stand up on his hind legs. Each family member demonstrated this to him by awkwardly doing it themselves. David eventually understood what they wanted him to do. He tried lifting his front feet off the ground, but he just came crashing down every time. James lifted up his front legs and made David stand with help, but David was clearly not enjoying this, so James let him go. Throughout the coming weeks, most of their time was spent trying to make David stand on his hind legs to almost no result. Day 233 Susan tried a different method of making David stand on his hind legs. She put on some upbeat music and got the entire family to dance around. David quickly joined them. After a few minutes, Susan grabbed his paws and hoisted them up. She pretended to be dancing with him. It worked very well. David was spinning around in circles while standing only on his hind legs. Susan was still supporting him a lot, but the family was still very excited. They started to experiment more on this matter in the coming days. Day 310 David was walking to the dining room for dinner. The other family members were waiting. He entered the room, saw them all sitting at the table, and then stopped. He suddenly stood all the way up and looked at them. He was standing on his hind legs completely on his own with no support from anyone or anything else. The family clapped and cheered. Day 443. The family was told to go check on David. He was in his room and, according to the researchers, was doing something strange. The family walked upstairs and noticed that his bedroom door was open. They peered in and saw him standing with his hind legs fully extended. He was leaning over his dresser with his upper body and was facing away from the family. They walked in and saw that there was a picture on top of the dresser. The picture was one of Susan, James, Harry, and one of the human children. They were all sitting with nice, fancy clothes on in front of a royal blue curtain. They took this picture on the night of day 48. David stole the photo from downstairs and dragged it up to his room. He was just staring down directly at the photo, with an unwavering gaze. He didn't seem to be moving. The family could hardly hear him breathing. James started to walk towards him. He reached his hand out, but the researchers spoke into his earpiece. They told him that no one is allowed to touch him right now. They wanted to see how long he would do this for and what else he would possibly do. The family left and tried to go about their day as usual, but every single day up to that point heavily involved David, so they had a hard time figuring out what to do. David stood in that same position for most of the day. At 4.37 p.m., it's hard to tell exactly what happened. The researchers said that his hind legs gave out, but on the cameras, it looked like he just froze and fell to the side. Regardless, David fell to the floor and completely passed out cold. It could have been from standing for too long, or from the tension of staying in one place too long, or the stress of everything. No one was really sure. What was more odd is that David fell to the ground in a way that looked very wrong. His body contorted slightly before it fell. No one truly knows what happens, but the family rushed in and checked to see if he was alright, or if he was even still alive. He had a slow heartbeat and was very warm. They helped him into his bed and kept the covers off of him. He slept all throughout the rest of the day and all throughout the night. Day 444 David woke up the next day at about 8 in the morning. All three family members were in his room waiting for him to wake up. He seemed to be mentally normal once again and didn't show any sign that he remembered the day before. 
The picture from the dresser had been removed from the house. The number of family photos around the house had greatly decreased overnight to prevent further incidents like this from happening. David attempted to get out of bed and walk downstairs, but when he jumped onto the floor, his hind legs gave out and he fell on his stomach with a hard bang. The researchers hypothesized that all the pressure on his legs from standing for an unhealthy amount of time must have taken a toll on his strength. Susan gently picked the dog up and placed him back into his bed. She wrapped his hind legs with bandages and put ice on them. He stayed in bed for a few days so he could heal up. Day 498. David sang with the classical records for over an hour. He was on pitch for almost all of the songs, and at some points, he almost sounded like he could have been a human singer. This had all been highly encouraged by the family and the researchers. However, David also started to make some other noises. He hadn't barked in over a hundred days, but some of the other sounds that came out of him were concerning to say the least. He sometimes made a sound similar to that of a choking person. Whenever he made this sound, someone rushed over to see if he's okay, but he was never actually choking. He also made odd grunting and moaning sounds sometimes. Other times, he would be laying on the couch when he let out a noise that sounded like an old man struggling to walk up a set of stairs. The researchers didn't know what to do, so they told the family to try and ignore the sounds as best they can. Day 562. Susan was preparing dinner when she spotted David walking through the hallway on all fours. The researchers wanted Susan to urge him to walk properly on his hind legs again. They started to speak into her earpiece, but before they could even get three words out, David stopped. He had jerked violently to the left and pointed directly at Susan. It was as if he suddenly heard something. Then, his front feet quickly rose off the floor so he was standing in a domineering position on his hind legs. He remained nearly motionless as his black eyes stared back at Susan's. Her lip quivered in fear. The way he turned was unsettling enough, but when he stood up, it was like, for a moment, he wasn't a dog anymore. But he sure as hell wasn't a human, either. His body seemed to twist more the longer he stood in that hallway, even though he was barely moving an inch. Then, after what seemed like hours, David put his front two feet on the ground again and walked away. Susan kept looking at the spot where he stood. She didn't know what to do. She looked at all her cleaning and cooking appliances and shook her head before turning off the stove. She made sure no one was around before she exited the house to the secret door. When the researchers asked why she left, she told them that she didn't want to be a part of the experiment anymore. She felt unsafe and uncomfortable in the house and wanted to leave as soon as possible. The researchers explained to her that she couldn't leave because she's an integral part of the dog's life. He recognized her as his mother figure. They also reminded her that she signed an agreement saying she wasn't allowed to leave until the experiment is over. So she just had to deal with it. She returned to the house in anger. For the next few weeks, her time spent interacting with David noticeably decreased. Day 628 Susan cooked some shrimp, and Harry grabbed about three of them. He walked up the stairs, and James called out to him when he reached the top step. Harry turned around and looked back down at his father. James asked why he was taking the shrimp upstairs, to which Harry replied that he was giving them to David. James told Harry that he shouldn't do that because he isn't David's servant. But Harry explained that he just wanted to do something for his brother. Harry turned back around, and less than two feet away from him, David was sitting on the ground, looking intently at the shrimp in his hand. Harry jumped for a second. He didn't hear David walk across the floor behind him. He completely snuck up on him. After catching his breath, Harry told David that he startled him, and he jokingly said that he shouldn't be allowed to do that. David's face did not change. He licked his teeth as he kept his eyes locked on the food. Harry was becoming fearful. Without thinking, he tossed one of the shrimp far into the room behind David. David sprang into action. He leapt into the room and started looking for the shrimp. The moment the shrimp left Harry's hand, he ran down the stairs as fast as his legs could carry him. 
he was immediately regretting going up the stairs in the first place. He was regretting signing up to be in the experiment. Once David devoured the shrimp, he wanted more. He knew that Harry had more in his hand, so he started running after him. Harry was about halfway down the stairs when David started on the first step. David ran at about twice the speed, and Harry was becoming more scared. He could hear David running up close behind him, getting ready to attack. Just before Harry reached the last step, David stepped in front of him and snatched the other shrimp out of his hand. Harry tripped over David and fell onto the hard floor, head first. He was still heavily and anxiously breathing when he landed. David didn't seem to mind. He just ate the remaining shrimp in peace. James, who had seen the whole thing, was angry. He started to yell at David. He reached his hands out to grab at the dog, but David was ready to defend himself. He lunged at James and swung his paw in the air. He struck his father in the side of the head, which caused a small piece of metal to fly out of his ear. The force of the blow did not hurt very much, but it was much more powerful than expected. James grew even more angry. He barely even noticed the thing that fell out of his ear. David saw the anger in his eyes and started to back away. Without realizing, David stepped on the small metal piece that was inside James's ear. There was the sound of a metallic snap. David actually broke James's earpiece. James grew even more angry. He quickly reached out and grabbed one of David's front legs. He hoisted the dog up and began dragging him upstairs. Susan pleaded for him to stop, but he didn't listen. David was loudly whimpering and he even tried biting James's hand. James smacked the mud across the face as he hauled him up the stairs to his room. Once at the doorway, James leaned back and hurled David inside. He landed awkwardly on his back. James slammed the door shut and locked it. He stomped back down the stairs as David's door began to bang from the other side. Susan ran up the stairs to unlock it, but James said, No, he needs to be taught a lesson. Harry wasn't hurt too badly. He spent the rest of the day and much of the next day in bed with an ice pack on his forehead. The physical damage wasn't too bad, just a little bump on his forehead and some neck pain. The house was filled with banging and pained moans for the rest of the day as David desperately pleaded for someone to let him out. Day 629 The researchers told James that they would have another earpiece for him in about two weeks. He would just have to live without one for a while. With the permission of the researchers, Susan unlocked and opened up David's door the next day in the afternoon. He was sleeping on the floor right next to the door. Susan brushed the fur on the top of his head, which now had some red marks on it. The researchers assumed this was from him running into the door the entire day before. David woke up a few hours later. All the family was downstairs. Susan was getting Harry a new ice pack, and James was on the couch reading the fake newspaper the researchers had provided. Suddenly, James heard Susan say, Sweetie, in a very scared tone. He put down the paper and looked up. He saw David standing fully extended on his hind legs in the middle of the doorway to the living room. He was blocking out most of the light from the kitchen. He looked down at James with a disturbing half-grin on his face. James asked what he was doing and why he was staring like that. Suddenly, David let out a series of disturbing and guttural sounds. It shocked and deeply horrified the entire family and everyone on the research team. David was clearly trying to speak to James. Even though no one really knew what words were said, they did not sound like they could have come from a dog at all. It was growly and airy, yet it still had somewhat of a human cadence of speech. It sounded as though he was trying to speak human words, but his mouth couldn't form the right shapes. David walked back upstairs after this and left the family frozen in fear and confusion. The researchers spent the next several days trying to decipher what David said. Day 641 Susan and Harry left the house through the secret door. They told the researchers that they both wanted to leave. The entire experiment was getting too freaky for them. They said it was all such an unsettling experience. The researchers reminded them once again that they were not allowed to leave because they signed a contract. 
They were all in the midst of a large argument when one of the researchers burst into the room. He said he was pretty sure he figured out what David said. He played the tape again for everyone and then told them. He said, Thank you for the lesson, Father. I hope I can repay you someday. They all listened to the tape again. Some disagreed. Others believed that he wasn't saying anything at all and that he was just making sounds. Susan, Harry, and a majority of the researchers felt confident that that was what David said. Then they started trying to figure out what that meant. They looked around each other and realized that James wasn't with them. He was still in the house. They looked at the cameras and couldn't see him anywhere. They figured that he may have just been in the bathroom or something, but they also realized that they couldn't find David anywhere either. One researcher spoke into the microphone controlling his earpiece, but he was quickly reminded that James's earpiece was broken. Susan and Harry were quickly rushed back into the house to look for them. James wasn't in either of the bathrooms. They looked into his walk-in closet, and they immediately ran out of the room. James's body was laying on the floor of the closet, with several large patches of exposed blood and muscle. The carpet around him was getting more red by the second. His throat and hands had been ripped to pieces, and his clothes had been almost completely torn off of his body. Susan and Harry both descended the stairs in tears. They were terrified of what to think. They entered the living room and saw David. He was sitting in James's spot, watching a blank television screen. His face and most of his body was red. His clothes were ragged and disheveled. The pieces that were left were also a deep red, but he didn't seem to mind at all. He wore that same half-grin as he stared intently at the television. It all looked so... wrong. Harry ran up from behind with a knife from the kitchen, but the researchers shouted for him to put it down. They pleaded, saying that if David died, the whole experiment would be for nothing. Harry resentfully agreed and put the knife down. During that night, the researchers quietly entered. They took the rotting corpse from the closet and removed it from the house. Susan and Harry didn't sleep at all that night. They kept their doors locked. David didn't seem to have a problem getting to bed almost as soon as he laid down. Day 649. David had been acting like he owns the house for several days now. He came downstairs in the morning without his clothes on. Susan and Harry were prepared to march him right back upstairs and change it, but the researchers told them to do something else. They said that he would wear his regular clothes tomorrow but they reasoned that if David was told what to do now, he might do something else violent. They told Susan and Harry to take off their clothes for the rest of the day. The two of them protested for hours, but the researchers reminded them that they were in an experiment and had to do what they were told. At 1 p.m., they resentfully gave in and took off their clothes. They shamefully walked through the house, trying to avoid the cameras as much as possible. David, sometimes glancing at them and giving them a slight nod of approval, but both Susan and Harry repeated, just for today, several times. Both of them went to bed early that night and put clothes back on as soon as the researchers allowed them to, which was at 9 p.m. Day 663. When it was time for dinner, David did not come downstairs. Susan did not pry at all. She just ate with Harry. Throughout the past few weeks, they had been avoiding contact with David except when it was absolutely necessary or if the researchers forced them to. David has been wearing his human clothes again, but when Harry dresses him, the dog looks absolutely hateful. At the end of dinner, Susan felt something touch her shoulders. She thought it may have been Harry, but he was sitting right in front of her. She jumped with fright as she saw two hairy paws reach over her and almost touch her chest. David had watched James do the same thing for hundreds of days, and now he wanted to do the same. Susan stood up before David could put his paws anywhere else and marched up to her room. She shut the door behind her and didn't leave for the rest of the day. She didn't care what the researchers told her. Day 669. 
In the mid-afternoon, Susan opened the door to the downstairs bathroom. She was startled when she saw David sitting on his custom-made toilet cover. He stared back at her. She hadn't had to help him use the toilet in over a year. She looked at the dog, completely dressed in human clothes, sitting on the toilet like a person. She angrily shook her head and shouted, It just... it just isn't right. She shut the door and furiously walked away. A few hours later, David was lounging on the couch when the researchers got an idea. They played audio of a dog howling on the TV. David lifted his head and looked around for a moment before returning to his original relaxed position. They played the sound of a dog barking. David didn't seem to even notice. The researchers assumed at this point that David had almost completely lost his natural instinct. Mentally, he was way more human than dog. Day 681. The researchers understood that Susan and Harry did not enjoy being around David anymore. As soon as they both woke up, the researchers told them both to get breakfast and then stay in their rooms for as much of the day as possible. They wanted to see what exactly David would do. Susan and Harry gleefully agreed. They both stayed in their respective rooms for the entire duration of the day with the doors shut. When David woke up and came downstairs, he didn't seem too bothered by the fact that no one else was there. He carefully nudged the pantry open and began to eat all of the food he could find. About three hours after Harry isolated himself in his room, he began to feel tired. He prepared himself to take a nap when a thunderous bang on the door shook the entire house and immediately startled him out of the bed. The researchers told him that David had banged on the door with his front legs and was currently standing outside the door. They told him to go answer the door. Harry softly cursed the researchers before getting to his feet and trudging over to the door. He creaked it open and peered out. David was just beyond the doorway, looking on. He was standing on his hind legs, and Harry realized something. David was taller than Harry. He never really thought about it before, but David was definitely at least three inches taller. That meant that he was taller than Susan for sure, which made David the tallest one in the house. That thought sent a chill down Harry's spine. Harry asked David what he wanted. David pressed his paw against the wood and pushed the door all the way open until it hit the wall. In a growly and much more frightening tone than before, he shouted, Open! before walking downstairs and out of sight. A few hours later, David walked into the upstairs bathroom and began vomiting. The researchers noticed that earlier, he had eaten some foods that weren't healthy for dogs. He spent a few hours in the bathroom and... He didn't contact Susan nor Harry for the rest of the day. Day 703 At about noon, David stood up from the couch on his hind legs and walked into the kitchen. Then he walked into the dining room. These three rooms were all connected to each other, so he just started walking in circles throughout these rooms. For what seemed like hours, David was just walking on his hind legs in one small, continuous circle throughout the bottom floor of the house. His face had a giant grin on it. It didn't look real, but he was smiling so widely that his eyes had tears in them. Like he was being painfully forced. Susan and Harry watched him for some time. They were so confused, as were the researchers. The most logical answer was that many animals in zoos will repeat the same action for long periods of time because they are stressed. They couldn't tell if David was stressed, but... After Harry watched him walk in a circle for ten straight minutes, he was getting concerned. He walked down the stairs and started to talk to David when he passed by, but David never seemed to be paying any attention. His focus was only on what was in front of him. Harry stepped out into David's walking path to try and stop him, but when David came around, he just walked around and continued on. Harry stepped into the doorway to the living room and outstretched his arms. There would be no way of getting past him. But when David circled around and saw that he couldn't get through, he just turned around to begin the circle in the opposite direction without missing a beat. Harry gave up and walked back upstairs to his room and just waited for David to tire himself out. 
After almost an hour and a half of continuous, non-stop walking, David let out a haunting mix between a howl and a moan. He suddenly collapsed to the floor in the middle of the kitchen, and his back legs seemed irregularly bent out of shape. Susan and Harry helped him into his bed while they attempted to ease the pain. David continued to whimper and screech until late into the night, when he fell asleep from exhaustion. David did not walk properly again after this. Day 718. The researchers realized that they were almost completely unable to get any more definitive results from the experiment. David was confined to his bed due to his horrid leg injury, and all his meals had to be provided by Susan directly to his bed. Every time she did this, she would drop off the tray, stare daggers at the camera in the corner of the room, and then leave. There was no longer any purpose to conduct the experiment. David couldn't adapt to human society anymore, and there was no reason to keep Harry and Susan around if they weren't really affecting David's life anymore. At this point, David had suffered severe and irreversible psychological damage. He had also severely fractured both his hind legs, almost at the point of them breaking, so there was little hope of him ever moving out of his own room by himself ever again. A decision was made. Susan and Harry were escorted out of the house and immediately underwent a psychiatric evaluation. All the food from the fridge, pantry, and all the remaining food stored in the laboratory was brought into David's room. They patted him on the head and walked out of the room. The last thing any person ever said to him was, Good dog, David. His bedroom door was shut and firmly locked. All the researchers left the house and closed it off. No one was allowed in or out. All the cameras and microphones were disabled and or removed. And the entire project was abandoned. Millions of dollars had been wasted, and no result was ever published. The researchers were too ashamed of what they had done. Susan and Harry eventually re-entered society. Harry's parents were so happy to see him back home. He was just a teenager when he left, and now he was practically a man. Both of their respective families owned dogs, which were almost immediately taken out. Neither of them ever fully healed from the experience. What's worse, they left David inside that room, with enough food for an entire family of dogs to last a lifetime. Before he was born, the researchers genetically modified David so he would have a much longer life than a normal dog. They intended the experiments to go on for well over a decade. David was less than two years old when they abandoned him. No one had any idea how long he would live for. No one ever checked the house again. It was demolished a few decades after, with several pounds of dynamite. What if David was still alive when they blew it up? What if he survived for all those years on his own? We, unfortunately, will probably never know. But maybe it's better this way. My Aunt Mel was one of the strongest women I ever knew. She stepped in to raise my brother, Keith, and I after we lost Mom. Not many other people would have done the same, especially during that time period. I was only seven when our mother, Rona, died. Keith was barely three. I've been walking this earth for 40 years since that day, and Melody was the only parental figure I ever knew, honestly. The only memories I had of my mother were short and fleeting, always fuzzy around the edges. I remember that she had a beautiful smile, and her hair always smelled like green apples. My heart rarely goes out to Keith. He has no memories of her whatsoever. He only knows what she looks like through photographs. In his mind, Aunt Mel would always be mom. Anyway, I'm getting off track. The reason I'm sharing this bit of information is that our aunt's not doing so good. Keith and I haven't talked for months, but we agreed to take a trip to see her. We wanted to spend her last days with her, so she wouldn't be alone. As alone as one could be in hospice, that is. The point is, we wanted her to be with family. We stayed in the part of our house that wasn't being used, hadn't been used in some time, actually. Our aunt stopped being able to live on her own some time ago. 
the house and land were paid for, Keith and I are her only living relatives, so we used the hide a key and let ourselves in. Abby, how's the electricity still in this place? Keith asked with a sideways smile. Aunt M hasn't lived here in, what, three years? Maybe four? How long are you here for? Until she goes, I replied with a wince. It means a lot to me to spend our final days with family, especially after all she's done for us. Did you have any problems taking off work? That, my dear sister, would imply that I have a job to take off for. Which, of course, I don't. I'm here for as long as you are. We're in this together. Sorry, it's been so long, I just... You know. I've been... Been wrapped up in your own shit. I finished for him. I know, I know. It's fine. You're here now. We unpacked, cleaned up a little, then got ready to leave to see Aunt Melody. The care center she's placed at isn't very far from her house, but we selfishly get lunch beforehand anyway. I feel so guilty for stalling that I can barely finish my food. Come on. Keith stands up. Let's go do this. Once we're in the car, all conversation goes silent. I can barely stand the tension, so I say what I know we're both thinking. Hey, it's been a while since I've seen her. I'm dreading seeing what she'll be like. Do you think it's bad? I asked, not looking away from the passenger window. Keith grimaced slightly and replies, uh, Well, it's not going to be good. I can tell you that. As much as I hate to say it, we need to be prepared for anything. Mentally, I mean. But nothing could possibly prepare us for the state we found her in. My aunt has always been one of the most beautiful women in our town. Keith's friends all used to go crazy over her through his teenage years. She had lush, gorgeous blonde hair. She exuded charm and grace while maintaining a don't-fuck-with-me attitude. And it was easy for her. After all that she lost, she still made it look easy to be the warmest-hearted person around. People fed off that, were almost addicted to it. The woman we see before us now is a heartbreaking, empty shell of a person. Her skin is thin and veiny like a tissue paper road map. There are deep red bruises on her left arm and chest, skin injuries her body didn't have the strength to heal anymore, and not like it used to. Long, silver hair hangs limp, ragged over her bony shoulders. Her chest seemed to fight every breath it tried to take. Her chest seems to fight every breath it tries to take. Her wheezing quickens as she tries to get Keith and I's attention, tapping her fingernails on the bed railing until we meet her gaze. We're here, Aunt Em. I tell her with a warm smile as I sit at the foot of her hospital bed. Kids, I need to talk to you. Please come and listen. You need to know. Need to know what, Aunt Mel? What's the matter? You should rest right now. Keith tells her, as he stands at her right side. His large hand holds her frail one delicately, and I can tell there are tears in his eyes. No, I need to say this. Your mother, she never wanted me to tell you. Tell us what? Keith and I asked in unison. Whatever it is, I'm sure it's okay. We love you. She's so proud of you for raising us. A soothing voice that I don't quite recognize says through my lips. My cabinet. Go look in my cabinet there. I look around the room, and there's no cabinet. The only thing in here besides her medical equipment is a television stand with a small drawer attached for a remote. Figuring this is what she means, I open the drawer and see an audio CD. The words, Abby and Keith, are written across it in black marker. Take this back home and play it. But you must be together. Aunt Mel rasps. Her voice had always carried the hum of angels, but now was ravaged by the treatment given to kill the cancer, which had proved unsuccessful. 
she was in and out of consciousness for the rest of our visit. After a couple of hours of switching handholds, shifting at her bedside, we left for the night, promising the nurse would be back in the morning. There's an unspoken anxiety shared between us during the ride home. All right, Abby. I know there's a stereo around here somewhere. Are you sure you want to just dive right into this? From what it sounds like, this could be about mom. I don't know if I'm ready for all that. First, Aunt M's dying, and now this? I snap. Sorry. This is all just a lot right now. Sure enough, Aunt Mel has a CD player in her bedroom. With how excited my brother is, I'm surprised he didn't ask us to play it in the car on the way home. I guess it's understandable. He was a lot younger when she died and doesn't know anything of mom other than stories he's been told. I sit on the edge of her bed and light a cigarette. Abs, are you fucking serious? We just got done visiting a woman we love who is dying from cancer, and you're just gonna light the fuck up? What? She doesn't have lung cancer, Keith. Don't give me shit. I need this, okay? We turn the stereo on and place the CD in the slot. Static greets us almost immediately. Hey kids, your mother was my sister and I love her very much. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about her. She always wanted to protect you. She didn't want you to grow up in fear. If you're hearing this now, it most likely means that I'm gone. Or at least, the part that made me, uh, well, me, are. Hopefully, if it's a life support situation, you went ahead and pulled that plug. Aunt Melody let out the most youthful laugh I'd heard from her in years before continuing. You know, I don't want to go out like that. Anyway, when you both were little, your mother was renting a small two-bedroom house. This was back when you all lived way across the country, near the Pacific coast. It wasn't anything special, it has a garage big enough for her to park her car in when she worked late. You two had to share a room. Your mother had her own room, and everyone shared a bathroom. Abby, you remember that place, don't you? There was the little fence that you'd always kick when you get mad. You'd do it every single time you got called in from playing outside. I kept telling her one day you were going to break your damn foot. That'd teach you, huh? Keith, baby, you were probably much too young to have any memories there. A lot of your baby pictures were taken there, but... Well, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Anyway, as I was saying, you didn't live there for very long. Maybe eight months to a year at most. Things were fine when you first moved in. Your father had just left you all. It was your mom's first time ever living on her own. Add being a single parent to the mix, and it was chaos on her. But I tell you what, she did the best she could. She loved you kids with all her heart. She loved you kids with all she had. Tears formed in my eyes despite myself. Why couldn't our aunt have ever told us this when we needed to hear it? Why wait until now? About two months into the lease, I started getting these phone calls from her. She'd call in the early hours of the morning in hysterics, thinking that your father was breaking into your house when she wasn't home. Things didn't end on good terms with your parents, as much as I hate to say. Rona was very afraid of him, almost paranoid. Then, a couple of months after that, things started getting moved around. Her keys wouldn't be where she left them. Your toys would disappear from your room and reappear in hers. I tried to tell her she was just distracted. She worked very hard to give you a good life without a father. It was easily understandable for her to misplace things absent-mindedly. But eventually, things started to go missing altogether. Abby, you poor thing. You used to get in so much trouble for stealing food and snacks out of the kitchen. Every time you were asked about it, you would cry inconsolably, swearing it wasn't you. She was wrong. I know she felt bad for that at the end. I remember finally agreeing to stay with you for a while to see things for myself. Your mom needed help, and honestly, I 
missed my sister. I would have taken any opportunity to spend more time in her life. We were catching up at the kitchen table, looking through old photo albums. The more that we looked through, the more we realized that most of the pictures of you both were missing. Especially yours, Keith. You gotta remember, this was back before everyone kept all their pictures on their phones. Pictures were printed out at photo labs, brought home and saved. There were no backups. Once those pictures were gone, they were gone. We called the cops and made reports, but your father had alibis. He had an accountable life. Interacted with a lot of people at his steady job, not to mention lived three states over at this point. There wasn't really much they could do with no evidence and even less proof. Everything changed when Rona took an unexpected sick day from work. The schedule hadn't changed since they moved in. Rona always had weekends off and worked weekdays from 6am to 3pm, even holidays. Nobody was supposed to be there. Due to her being sick, she still took you kids to daycare. You both were dropped off like normal so she could go back home and rest. Sleep is off, kinda. Uh, Keith, you're like that too when you're sick. You turn into a big koala. You'd sleep 16 hours straight if I let you. Oh, Jesus, I keep getting off track. There's just so much I want to say. Uh, so much that I haven't been able to say uh, until now. When your mother arrived home, she walked in on the person in the kitchen. He was eating fruit that they bought at the market the day before. A pomegranate. No one can say what happened for sure in that kitchen, but I can tell you what it looked like from what the officers had found. The track interrupts as she breaks into a fit of hacking coughs. She was attacked with the kitchen knife he was using to cut the fruit in half. Her body was mutilated so savagely that at first I was convinced it was your dad. Even after all his alibis and current location, who else could have done something that brutal to someone? Rona had no enemies. The truth of the matter was much worse than I imagined. Investigators caught the man a few miles away shortly after the crime. He confessed to everything. I guess thinking maybe it would lead to some kind of absolution. Well, it didn't. Not to me. I could kill him ten dozen times every day and I'd still go to bed at night without a sister. The man they caught was a transient by the name of Terence Haynes. He'd been convicted of small crimes here and there throughout his life. Rona had stopped for gas one night real late on her way home after covering for someone who had called out. Haynes had climbed in the back of Rona's car and covered himself up with clothes to hide. You know how messy your mom always keeps her car, Abby. If you remember, that is. They made it all the way back home, and she never knew he was back there. He waited until everyone went to sleep that night, crawled out of the car, and entered the house. Your house had a crawl space just underneath the back room for storage and whatnot. Rona never went down there because she didn't have anything to store and didn't like small spaces. The most horrifying thing about it all was what investigators found in that crawl space. Haynes had pictures. Dozens of them. They were all over the walls and ceiling, mainly of Keith. He had gotten himself a blanket and pillow out of the trash when she threw away your old ones. There were scattered food wrappers and empty water bottles everywhere also. After I fought your father and gained guardianship of you both, police officers told me that there was evidence to suggest he had been living under there for more than four months, right under Rona's nose. You all were living with a murderer the whole time, and didn't even know. He ended up getting 35 years to life due to a mental illness technicality. That stuff was all new back then. Unprecedented. Now I hope you can understand why I didn't tell you. Even at the ages you are now, all grown up, it's still something that I don't think you would ever feel better about knowing. It's been tough on me throughout the years to keep things from you. I love you both so very much. Please forgive me and know that we love you. And that I finally get to see my sister. The recording stops just as the phone rings. 
Aunt Melody had just passed away in her sleep. My efforts to suppress my tears now fails me. My heart aches for my mother, for us, and most of all for Aunt Mel. Our whole lives we thought she was keeping information from us to be selfish. I actually accused her of destroying pictures herself as an angsty teenager. My high school project required a photographic family tree and I didn't have any adult pictures of her for it. When I asked Aunt Mel about it and she couldn't help, I flipped out on her. I looked over to my brother. His face was as white as a sheet. Keith's massive hands trembled. He chewed on his lower lips, something he used to do as a child when he was scared. Abby, he turned to me, tears in his eyes. I'm freaked out. I, I need help. What are you talking about? I asked him. I'm just as freaked out as you are here. She was my mom too. Give me hugs. No, you don't understand. He yelled, eyes wild with fear. A guy just moved in next door to me. It was an older guy at maybe like 65 or 70. He introduced himself to me when he first moved in. He said his name was Terry Haynes. You know the feeling you get when something just isn't right? That feeling of some unseen eye crawling over your body, making a shiver creep up your spine and goosebumps prickle up your arms. That feeling of dread as the primal, lizard voice screams in the back of your deepest thoughts. Danger! Danger! Proceed no further! Sure you know it. Everyone has experienced it a time or two. We're trained from a young age that the monster in the closet isn't real, that nothing is in our bed, and the shadows on the walls are our minds playing tricks on us. Unlike hunger or our need for oxygen, the something's off feeling is one our species purposely dampens. We're taught to seek out the logical reason, to assume we're paranoid and laugh it off. The truth is, the feeling is a survival instinct. And sometimes, something just isn't right. The lizard voice was blaring, clawing at my brain as my car's headlights sliced to the darkness and fell upon the weathered wooden sign. Faint white letters read, Welcome to Cedar Hollow. The planks of wood making up the sign were an ashy gray, and someone had clearly taken pot shots at the unkempt monument. Yes, as we neared the roadside sign, overgrown with weeds and its forbidding letters, my lizard voice was begging. Alas, I'd been trained so well that I chalked my bad feelings up to the late hour and the fact that our GPS had lost signal miles before, not to mention our phones were useless with their own no-signal messages. Good old Appalachia. That's weird, the bookish young woman riding shotgun uttered as she trailed her index finger along the accordion map. What is it? I asked, keeping my eyes on the road. Cedar Hollow isn't on the map, she spoke, moving her index finger to the bridge of her nose while she pushed up her stylish glasses. Well, baby, the map is new-ish. A recent. But West Virginia isn't like Florida. Hills and valleys galore, and I wouldn't be surprised if some places just got forgotten out here. Forgotten. Poor choice of words. As they did nothing to assuage my discomfort. And I could tell that Jordan's unease was just as palpable as she folded the map and crossed her slender arms over her university sweatshirt. Perhaps her own lizard voice was hissing. I tossed a glance her away as we passed the ancient sign, autumn leaves blowing around our tires, fluttering down in the darkness behind us as we traversed the winding road. How you doing? I asked her. She turned her eyes from the dense woods outside of the passenger window towards me. She truly was stunning in an unconventional way. With one hand she pushed the shaggy, shoulder-length mahogany hair behind her ear 
and looked nervously at me with amber eyes. She took a deep, wavering breath before speaking. My parents aren't racist. She started, but was cut off by my sigh. Oh, come on, Jord. You said you'd tell them. I got out before the petite girl interrupted. I know I did. And I tried, then. I just don't know how to bring it up. She said, sounding sincerely apologetic. What's wrong with, hey, mom and dad, the guys supporting me through this tragedy and driving me all the way to Delaware, who I've been dating for the last year, happens to be black, I said, slyly grinning as I gave her a side-eyed look, my dorkiness apparently shining through as she cracked a smile. I really am sorry, Ben, she said softly through her grin. All good, baby. If they don't like me, it's whatever, as long as you do. My words oozed cheese. Besides, we may not even make the funeral. I have no clue where we're at, I added. My bad news seemed insignificant compared to hers, so I was confident I would stay out of the doghouse. The endless forest that surrounded us all but blocked out any light from the sky, and the moonbeams that did manage to cut through the foliage made the trees look skeletal, sinister. Even the pines looked like they were watching with an unnatural amount of glowing eyes as we traveled the barren road. Again, that primal voice did its best to reach me, but I told it that those weren't eyes. Of course they weren't. Logic said that those pinholes of glowing light were nothing more than the moon peeking through the branches. Nothing more. Hey. Jordan said, tearing me from my thoughts. What's that? She squinted behind her glasses and pressed a finger against the windshield. Uh, some kind of sign, maybe? I offered, looking at the blue glow in the sky that peered back at us through the branches. Oh my god, can we stop? I have got to pee, and we should call mom and dad, uh, let them know where we are. Jordan spoke, a certain chirp of relief in her voice. I suppose signs of society had brought down her stress level. Not mine. It was 2 a.m. and we were deep in a West Virginia hollow. Uh, what business out in the middle of nowhere was open? Maybe you can tell them you're finally bringing a black man to their nephew's funeral? I asked in a scalding tone. Suck it, she returned, rolling her lovely eyes. No further words were exchanged between us as we closed the distance to the glowing light. As the trees became less dense, their naked branches parted. The pole sign became clearer. A faint white glow emanated from the sign, welcoming us with blue cartoon letters to the small gas station between the road and the tree line. It was literally the only building we've seen for miles, and its very existence felt off. Gas her up. I read the Marquis's words and followed it with a long, exacerbated sigh as I pulled the car next to the lone pump beneath the canopy, connected to the small mart. Jordan groaned at the hillbilly name of the service station before asking, Are they open, you think? With a bit more hesitance in her words, her lizard voice must have been whispering. Uh, lights on inside, I said throwing the car into park and gesturing with my head towards the illuminated frosted glass door that read, Welcome. And look, I finished by pointing to the only other vehicle in the modest parking lot. It sat catty-cornered in a space to the right of the building's entrance, a deep red sports car with tinted windows and a decal on the back, reading, It's a way of life, next to a graphic of a palm with the ring finger tucked under. The shocker. Great. Maybe Chad and the douchemobile can give us directions to the nearest rave. Jordan huffed. You can stay here if you want, I offered as I opened the door. Cool night air tickled the flesh of my neck, and the sounds of nature filled my ears. Insects chirping, owls hooting. Then came the smell. Sulfury. Burning. The vague hint of roadkill. Yeah, no thanks. She said. She still didn't move to open her door until I'd exited and crossed the vehicle and stood nearby. 
That off feeling was in full force as I stood there waiting for my girlfriend. I felt watched, but not only that, I felt vulnerable, like an ant beneath a magnifying glass under the hot summer sun. I felt exposed. The light breeze surrounding me caused it to feel as if something were softly brushing against the left side of my face, and the sound of breaking twigs and crushing leaves unsettled me. I wasted no time grabbing Jordan's hand and leading her past the pump, toward the glowing doorway. I had to force myself to keep my cool, to tell myself that I was just being paranoid as we crossed the small parking lot hand in hand. There was something about our footfalls, the sound and feel like we were walking through something sticky, and more than once I'd glanced down to verify that the asphalt was simply that. In moments, we reached the lit door the inside of the store obscured by the frosted glass. I placed my free hand on the handle, but before I could open it, Jordan spoke. Ben, this feels bad, she whispered, squeezing my hand and shifting her weight between her feet. I tried reassuring her with a smile, to tell her with my eyes that everything was okay, but the truth is that we were both feeling that discomfort. But moreover, I didn't want to walk back to the car and drive further into the unknown without some semblance of a plan. Who knows how far we'd have to drive before another opportunity presented itself. It was my job as boyfriend to protect Jordan, and at the time I felt the best way to do that was to protect a false bravado, to convey to her that I'd keep her safe. I tugged on the door's handle and was actually a bit surprised when it opened with no resistance a little jingle accompanying the motion. I stepped inside with Jordan following closely. The place looked uh, normal. Well, normal for Appalachian backwoods. Drab mustard-colored wallpaper lined the shop, and a couple of mounted buckheads flanked a stuffed bobcat above a door directly in front of us. The male and female stick figures adorning said door marked it as a unisex restroom. Jordan let out a relieved sigh and released my hand before pushing past me and making a beeline for the door. I couldn't help but snicker and roll my eyes as I watched the petite girl scurry, doing that dance where you're on the verge of bursting. She disappeared into the room a second later, and I took a moment to observe the convenience store. To my right, I saw a small refrigerated cooler housing a variety of beverages and between where I stood and the restroom was a couple of rows of products. Chips, candy, knickknacks. They made the small building feel cramped. Then there was the checkout counter to my immediate left, and the small cigarette display behind it. No one was manning it, and I took note of what appeared to be a tiny office behind the desk. I took a few steps closer to the counter and saw that sitting upon its surface was a silver bell. The kind you'd see at a hotel. Oh god, it's always awkward when you have to hit one of those things. You feel so, I don't know, needy, I guess. I hesitated for a second before placing an open palm over the device and giving the bell a soft slap. A sharp ding reverberated through the small store, and I immediately pinched the metal bulb, silencing it. No sooner than I had done that, a soft, shuffling noise emanated from the office. Hey, uh, sorry, do you guys have a phone? Uh, like a house phone, uh, maybe a pay phone? I asked before raising my hands and taking a step backwards as a figure appeared in the doorway. My brain felt as if it were short-circuiting, trying to rationalize what I was seeing. Surely this person had been in some kind of horrific accident, and my mother's voice filled my head. You shouldn't stare, Benjamin. You shouldn't stare at people who look different. Her words echoed through my brain, but god damn if I wasn't doing just that. I scolded myself as the disfigured visage jerkily lurched from the office towards the register. No, no, I wasn't being rude. My wide eyes were justified. There was no doubt that the thing I was seeing beyond the counter wasn't human. Jordan, I cried out in shock as the naked, sexless creature lumbered to a stop behind the register. 
The thing craned its bald head upward and locked its electric blue eyes onto mine. Its breast slowly rose and sank as it hissed raspy breasts through a vacant smile. Thick strands of saliva hung from its unnaturally wrinkled skin and dripped down its twisted, leathery visage. At first I thought it was lacking arms, but quickly realized that what I'd mistaken for breasts were its limbs. They were crossed across its chest like an unruly mental patient. The caveat was that it wore no straitjacket. Its arms resided beneath its horrific dermis, and I could tell from its previously jerky, twitchy gait that something was very, very wrong with the thing. What the fuck, man? I muttered anxiously before calling out again. Jordan! There was no response from my girlfriend, but the pale, hairless, wrinkled thing began to cough. It hacked softly, its empty smile never faltering, its gaze never leaving my eyes. From its gullet flew a jet-black glob of phlegm, which landed with a splatter on the counter. The bile pulsated as it sat there, and I had to stifle a gag. Feed. The thing spoke in a low, gravelly voice. My heart was racing, and a cold sweat had formed on my brow. Wh what I sputtered. Feed. The thing insisted. It then proceeded in a swift motion to ram its head into the counter, hard enough for a loud cracking sound to be heard, even over the silver bell's ding. I flinched and felt my stomach turn as the thing rose back up and I saw that the bell had lodged itself into one of the creature's eyes. But even that didn't dissuade the thing's awful smile. Without hesitation, it again smashed its face on the counter, setting off another ding, and I saw that the fluorescent lights above us were flickering. I began screaming as the bashing, the dings, and flickering lights continued. The monster's face was becoming more and more caved in as the beast rapidly mutilated itself before me. The same black substance that had coughed out sprayed from its cracked skull as the thing rapidly jerked its head up and then back down. By the sixth round, it stopped, and the lights went out completely. Thankfully, I wasn't left in the dark with the crater-like face of the being. A soft, flickering orange glow danced across the walls like the light of a campfire, but I saw no flame. I did, however, see that the place had changed significantly. The cigarette display behind the creature was smashed out and stripped of all products. Likewise, the knickknacks displayed were similarly raided. Only rusty skeletons of the racks remained. The mustard-colored wallpaper was faded, peeling, and wore an abundant amount of graffiti tags. There were several juvenile phrases covering the walls, but one repeated set of words stood out, as it was much larger and scrawled in frantic black letters. Beware, Valmardu. A muffled yelp came from behind me as the oily substance began to pour from the creature's shattered face like a faucet. I whipped around and saw that the refrigerator behind me no longer held beverages, but a blood-stained, wriggling burlap bag, which hung suspended behind the glass. My initial thought was that it was a puppy squirming and whimpering inside. The bag could hold a small dog, and the panicked movements against the fabric could easily have belonged to four limbs. Whatever it was, it was in enormous pain and instinctively I wanted to help, but that thought was quickly dispelled when I heard the restroom door clatter against the back wall. Ben! Jordan shouted as she struggled to pull her jeans over her thighs without stopping her run. She nearly fell, but managed to keep her footing as she bounded over one of the deer heads that had decorated the wall, now residing on the floor. She was a few feet from me when she got her pants up, and was prepared to dive into my open arms when she saw the horrible creature standing stoically behind the counter. A shrill screech escaped her as she skidded to a stop, and I saw that her legs were wobbly. That wasn't all, either. Blood was streaked across her cheek, mouth, and chin, and her pants and the hem of her sweatshirt were damp with the oil-like substance. Her wide, terrified eyes immediately began to sob. We gotta go, baby. Come on, I said, stepping towards her and grasping her hand. I turned us to face the frosted glass of the entrance door and practically dragged her towards it. 
The bloody bag cried out another volley of whimpers as we crossed the coolers, drawing a yelp from Jordan and sending a jolt through me. What's in there, Ben? Jordan shouted through her tears. I didn't answer. Instead, I snaked my fingers around the door's handle and jerked it open. The little jingle of its bell rang out and seemed to signal something. For as soon as the sound filled my ears, an eerie, staticky voice began to come from Craterface's gullet, unimpeded by the inky crude pouring from its gaping hole. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery. Craterface croaked out. Its words sounded as if they were being produced by an antique TV rather than a monstrosity. What struck me the most, though, was that I recognized the voice, that jowly mix of nasally and deep. I'm a bit of a history buff, and Nixon's voice was easily placed. The speech, however, was not. In fact, it made no sense at all. I threw a glance over my shoulder, beyond the wet, wide eyes of my girlfriend. I saw the rapidly expanding pool of murky black liquid had poured over the counter's edge, and as it continued to grow there on the floor, I could make out that the head and arms of a new figure, forming in the crude, reached upwards, seeming to pull itself from the pool. A jet black being, with no defining features. I could hardly stand to look at the thing as it clawed at the air. I turned and pulled Jordan through the open door, turned again and yanked the door closed behind us. As soon as it shut, the frosted glass went dark, the fiery hue dying immediately, leaving us in only the faint light of the moon high above. Ben? I heard Jordan whimper softly as I felt her release my hand. As soon as I turned away from the horrible building, I saw why. She brought both hands to her blood-smeared mouth to stifle her cries. The parking lot was coated in a sticky layer of blood, the crimson substance glimmering in the moonlight. I saw that the marquee, the sign that had beckoned us like a bug sapper, was no longer lit. In fact, it was in a state of despair, cracked, pieces broken free of the plastic dome, which itself was stained yellow. Following the rusted post with my eyes, I saw that its base was overgrown with flora. Most upsetting, though was the weathered skeleton wearing tattered clothes that swayed in the light breeze, held up by the noose hanging from the damaged sign. The red sports car parked near us showed signs of rapid aging too, taking on a more pink tone between the rust spots that spattered its body. The tires were torn and the windows smashed out, but my eyes were drawn to the open driver door, where a trail of blood led from the seat all the way through the parking lot where it stopped abruptly below another hanging figure affixed to the canopy just beyond the ruined gas pump. It was less rotted, maintaining a few springs of hair and some patches of skin on the skull. It also wore a red jacket emblazoned with the sports car's logo. I shivered when I realized that the body of the man was swaying quite near my car and remembered the horrible way my face had felt something brush by as I looked at the man's only remaining leg, the foot of which dangled exactly where I'd stood as I waited for Jordan to exit our vehicle. The skin of my face crawled, but the horror was far from over. I could see that the tires of my own vehicle had been shredded. The hood stood open, as did the passenger door. There, Sitting in my car with his legs hanging out was a thin man. He wore an old pair of overalls and nothing else save for an old dirty bandana holding his greasy hair back. A wispy, patchy beard covered his cheeks. He was using a large hunting knife to pick at his fingernails while he stared at us. With one of his eyes staring at us, the other wandered, looking up and outward. What do you think, Maggie? Food or string him up? I heard him say in the thickest country accent one could imagine. His sinister smile revealed that most of his crooked teeth had rotted away. Mama's getting tired, squirrel. Another voice chimed in from our right. The accent was just as thick, but with a noticeable impediment. 
I jerked my head to the direction of the new sound while Jordan continued to sob. My eyes caught the silhouette of a stick-thin woman rounding the side of the convenience store. She carried with her a long-handled axe, which she allowed to drag across the asphalt as she slowly stepped towards us. The sound of the steel axe head scraping against the blacktop was chilling. Baby might not like dark meat, though. She finished with a light giggle. As she stepped closer, the moonlight illuminated her face, and I saw that she had a cleft lip and palate that rose into her left nostril, leaving half of her nose nothing more than a black hole. Suddenly, the odd speech pattern made sense. I put myself between the approaching woman and my hysterical girlfriend, raising my hands in a non-threatening way, and foolishly tried to reason with the hillbillies. Listen to me. There's something in this store, and we all have to go right now. We all need to get away from here. I spoke calmly, fully aware that the duo meant to do us harm, but praying my words might reach them on a human level. Now listen here, boy. Round these parts, your kind don't speak to our women. The man in my car spat as he stood, extending his arm and pointing his knife at me. Get him, Cliff. He finished. Suddenly, a third member of the posse made themselves known. The man called Cliff had apparently been perched on the roof of the small building, as he came down on my back like a wild animal, pouncing its prey, knocking Jordan to the ground. I, too, was forced to the ground under the man's weight, my face connecting with the bloody asphalt, scraping my flesh and sending my head swirling. I fought to maintain consciousness as my eyes rolled and my head swam. I focused on Jordan's hysteric screaming and begged any god that would listen for help. In my confusion, I barely registered the fact that I was being dragged. All sound began to fade, and then blackness. I couldn't have been out long. When I came to, I was laying on my back, staring up at the swaying man in the red jacket. My hands bound with a rope in front of me. I heard Jordan screaming and noticed the second rope being lowered through the canopy above. My rope. Wakey, wakey, said the man who'd been sitting in my car as he poked his head into view. I could smell his putrid breath as he spoke. That good, Bubba? A man called down from the canopy. I realized that it had to be Cliff. A little bit lower. My captor called back up, and I saw the noose drop another foot. There you go. It was then that I saw Jordan. She'd been forced to her knees as well, held in place by the wooden axe handle pressed against her throat. Her hands were also bound, and I saw that her glasses were no longer on her face. Her terrified expression, along with the blood across her lower face, gave her such a ghastly look. I could hear her gasps and whimpers, and I hated myself for being so powerless. Then something clicked in my head that made everything so much worse. Food or string em up, Bubba had asked. I only saw one noose. You taking your trophy? You taking your trophy this time, Maggie? Bubba called to the deformed girl holding Jordan hostage. They say his kind have big ones, he added. I guess we'll find out, Maggie spoke gleefully, eyeing my crotch. Just beyond her, I saw that Cliff was scaling down the canopy's outside post with ease. He seemed more than adequate at climbing, and made it to the ground quickly. Something about his movements seemed spider-like. The noose swayed inches from my face, and Cliff held the slack end of the rope. I watched as Bubba crossed the small gap to Jordan, handing his knife to Maggie and taking her place as Jordan's captor. He knelt beside my girlfriend and ran his vile tongue up her cheek, apparently not put off by the blood. You're gonna be delicious, and after, I'm gonna have fun with what's left. I heard him mutter as he groped Jordan's breast before standing again, axe handle returning to her throat. First, let's watch. Maggie was approaching me in some weird stride that was a hybrid of seductive and lanky. She playfully wagged the knife in front of her malformed face. Don't worry, you won't have to live without it for long. 
she uttered as she knelt before me and trailed the knife along my inner thigh. In an instant, the parking lot was flooded by a bright, blinding light. My eyes reflexively squeezed shut as I was in the direct path of the powerful beam. A thunderous boom ripped through the air and I forced my eyes to open a hair. I saw that Maggie had stood and her back was to me. Beyond her I saw the silhouette of my kneeling girlfriend and above her I watched as the outline of Bubba's head limply fell to the ground. Jordan began to scream as the axe clattered on the asphalt in front of her. Bubba! Maggie's own scream joined the symphony. You killed him! She yelled out aggressively. Jordan, run! I shouted, climbing to my feet, and knocked Maggie to the ground as I pushed past her. Motherfucker! I heard the downed girl mutter as I stumbled around in the bright light. Thankfully, the more powerful beam suddenly vanished, and I was able to see much better after a second. The two headlight beams that illuminated the parking lot were much more tolerable, and I saw that Jordan was quivering, but managed to get to her feet as well. They're coming with me. A voice, an authoritative one, boomed. I saw the figure standing next to the new car, a massive man, easily seven feet tall and built like a mountain. Pieces started to fall into place, the huge man's tall outfit, his trooper hat and the shiny brass badge on his chest, the dome on top of his cruiser. A wave of relief washed over me. Jordan, he's a cop! I shouted to my girlfriend as I neared him. She seemed to not comprehend my words, though. Panic in her amber eyes. I reached her, and using my roped hands, urged her towards the gigantic man. She didn't fight me, and wordlessness followed my suggestion. The cop never took his eyes or his gun off the rednecks, even as he opened the back door of his cruiser. Get in, he told us flatly, and we did without hesitation. He closed the door behind us, and I frantically began trying to untie Jordan's binds. Mama needs to eat, I heard Maggie shout viciously at the cop while Cliff helped her to her feet. Plenty of food right there, the cop shot back, jerking his head towards the decapitated body of Bubba. I've told you people to stay out of Almardu's way. Starving ain't a bad way to go, he added sternly as he climbed into his driver's seat. His weight caused the left portion of the car to sink noticeably. He tossed the enormous cannon nonchalantly in the passenger seat and threw the car into reverse. As we backed away, I saw the remaining two hicks glaring at us fiercely. Maggie, who had retrieved her axe, held the weapon out threateningly. The officer continued his backwards drive as I freed Jordan's hands, and she began working on my binds. He then flipped the car's orientation with an abrupt U-turn, stomped on the gas, and suddenly, the cruiser began speeding into the darkness. Welcome to Cedar Hollow, he said, without looking back at us. I don't recall how old I am. It's been so long, time has moved at such a rapid pace that the past few centuries seem to have gone by in an instant. I know that Grace only died a few days ago, but it could have been last century for all that time matters to me. Even if it had been a hundred years, the grief is still raw and painful. I suppose I shouldn't be expected to cope with her death very well. After all, she'd been one of my only companion in life for millennia. Our bond was formed over hundreds, if not thousands of lifetimes. It is not a bond one can forget so easily. I'm sure you must wonder just who I am. A vampire, perhaps? Or maybe a demon or evil spirit? I can assure you I'm nothing so malignant or interesting. What I am is simply an old man who has lived for far longer than he has any right to. My biography is long but not particularly interesting. I was no great hero, I, I partook in no historical events, and I committed no great atrocities. I simply lived the quiet life most of humanity seems to have aspired to since its dawn. I stayed by the side of my beloved, and together we drifted through time, making the most of our infinite lives. 
I was born in a city called Yor. My father was a farmer outside the city and he raised me to do the same. The woman I would marry was named Amaritum. She was beautiful in her youth. We did not marry out of love, but out of necessity. Her father was a wealthier farmer than I, and he had no sons. He needed his heir, and so my marriage to Amaritum was meant as a means of binding our families. Less a labor of love, and more a formal business contract. Still, we were happy together. We had children, we lived our meager lives raising crop and cattle. Amaritum was as good as a wife as I could have asked for. I'd say that she was before her time. Back then, her intelligence would have meant little to anyone, but I found it impressive. Perhaps some people these days may have called her a genius. She devised more effective ways to tend my crops and animals. Under her instruction, I dug channels to use for irrigation and watched my crop flourish. During a drought, a few years after our marriage, she saw us through it, and while the other farmers around us struggled, we endured all because of her. I would have been content with just that, but Amaritum was not. Her father died relatively young. He'd contracted an infection a few years after our marriage, and I had inherited his lands. While his death was a stroke of good fortune for us, it didn't come without a cost. Pain has remained unchanged throughout the duration of human history, and the loss of her father hurts Emma Riddim in a way I'd never seen in anyone before. She was different after we buried him, quieter and focused. When she began to take a greater interest in the world around us, I did not stop her. I thought it might be better to allow her to mourn, but she was up to far more than that. She began to study my crop closer, taking samples to prod at. I can't even begin to describe just what she was doing with them. Until the end, she refused to disclose what her process had been. What I do know was that her obsession was with life. We'd had several children during the course of our marriage, although only a handful had survived. Others had either died in infancy or been miscarried. It's the miscarried ones I remember the most. I remember that some of the things that had come out of her seemed properly shaped. Those were the ones she'd kept and worked on. She'd use small knives to cut the miscarried fetuses apart, studying their half-formed bodies. I never watched just what she did to them. Her work was gruesome and it frightened me. At the end I had considered stopping her, but I truthfully wanted no part of it. Four years, I ignored her experiments and led her to her own devices. I never questioned any of it. Even when she began to leave during the night and return during ungodly hours of the morning, I never questioned any of it. When our home began to stink with the strange things she boiled together, I stayed out in the fields. I knew she was working towards something, but I did not know what. My cattle began to die, never more than one at a time, always the oldest of my flock. One death would occur every few months, and when it did, Amaritum would ask me to dispose of the animal. That meat is tainted, she'd say. Bury it. Give it back to the earth. I'd never questioned her on that either. Only once did I see just what she was working on during the later stages of it. I was on my way into the house to rest and I saw her outside, sitting by a fire as she set things into a clay pot. Several strange roots set around her, but those were not what interested me. I spotted something red and small in her hands. It took me a moment to realize that it was a human arm. She'd miscarried every few months at that point, and I knew what that severed arm had once belonged to. I turned to leave her. I can't imagine she saw me. I prayed she didn't. Yet, at that moment, I began to fear my wife. But then, it stopped. Her strange experiments, her late night disappearances, and the cattle deaths. Occasionally, she would still engage in whatever secretive work she had undertaken, but it seemed almost as if she'd gotten whatever answer she was looking for. Our small farm continued to flourish. Our cattle seemed healthier than ever before, and I prayed that things might return to the way they had once been. I'd been working in the fields on the day I became eternal. I came into the house and joined my wife and my son for supper. 
When we were done, my sons were sent out to watch the animals as they grazed, and I was left alone with my wife, my amoridum. So many memories of mine have been lost to time, but I'll never forget the way she looked at me that night. Nor shall I forget what she said to me. I haven't spoken Sumerian in so long. I no longer knew the language, but I remember the meaning. We've made a life for ourselves, haven't we? She asked me. She brought some wine and poured a cup for both of us. As much as we can, I replied. She smiled at me and I drank the wine. It tasted sweeter than usual. I watched as she did the same, drinking deeply. She seemed to savor it, and yet I thought nothing of the reverence behind the way she held that cup. She said, You know, we're almost as old as my father was when he died. I still can't believe how sudden it was. It was terrifying, wasn't it? I don't think I ever want to die like that. What about you, Ashmadu? The tone in her voice had given me pause. The way she'd smiled, her eyes glowing with triumph, both warmed my heart and unnerved me. I'd rather die on my own terms, I said softly. As would I, she replied. And we shall. At the time, I didn't understand her meaning behind that, nor did I grasp the meaning behind her smile. Now, though... Now I understand everything. There was no immediate change. Our sons and daughters were married off. Amaridium and I grew older until one of our sons took over the farm, and we waited for death. But death never came, and that gleam never left Amaridium's eye, even as her beauty slowly devolved into wrinkles. She never outright admitted to me what she'd done. We'd never spoke of our strange experiments or the wine we'd shared. I suppose once I figured out what I was, I was too afraid to confront her. I can't say if I was afraid she'd taken it away from me or what. She was so sure she'd defeated death. But I wondered if she really had. Years became decades. Our sons were replaced with grandsons, and in time we left them behind to start anew. Our bones were old. Our skin was wrinkled and leathery, but we were still alive, weren't we? We never went back to Yor. Instead, we traveled. We saw the rise and fall of empires and new civilizations. We saw human history unfold before us. It was a privilege, and yet, it did not change the fact that our bones continued to ache more and more with each passing day. And with each passing day, we grew more and more numb to the pain. We changed our names so many times. Aphius and Lelia, Harold and Emily, Thomas and Grace. We lived as best we could. Even under the strain of age, our bodies could still do that much. Whatever concoction my wife had slipped into our wine that night kept us intact enough to do that much. But the pain was still so mind-numbing. While my wife seemed to enjoy the gifts of her immortality, I found myself tortured by it. Even as a young man, the agony I felt in my bones from the simple act of being would have driven me mad by this agony was as eternal as I was. At times, I wondered if my wife did not feel it too. In thousands of years, she never once said, I loved my wife, a Meridian, a Grace, a whatever name she went by. I loved her so much but I don't think she realized the hell that existence was to me. I don't think she cared either. She'd won. She'd achieved her goal. And the fact that our bodies continued to age was of no consequence to her. The past century was the hardest. Moving my body became torture. At thousands of years old, Grace still zipped around like she did back in our old farm, and I resented her for that. The inhale and exhale of my breath was agony. The passive ache in my rotting muscles was too much to bear. In 1892, we had been living in Germany. Our house was modest. We weren't farmers, but we'd accrued enough money to care for ourselves. We had been sitting down to dinner when I looked up at her. Underneath the leathery skin and gray hair, I still saw that eternal twinkle in her eye, although I was sure I saw her wince as she moved her arm to cut her meat. 
Do you think it's been too long? I asked her. She looked back at me, still smiling, and she laughed. Too long? She asked. Can life ever really be too long? I hadn't said my answer. I knew she would not have accepted it. She never would have. In the end, it was the simplest thing that killed her. A fall down the stairs. Moving my arms to push her was no easy feat. But then again, nothing is easy these days. The mercy is, she died before she'd reached the bottom of the stairs. I remember the way she lay there, crumbled and broken. I remember trying to talk myself into throwing myself down after her, but even after thousands of years, I still did not have the courage. I think I do now, though. We were not meant to be eternal. Even committing this paltry autobiography down on paper has been a chore. I'd like the pain to stop now. I'd like to finally rest. I just hope that my wife understands why I did what I did. And when I answer to her in the next life, I pray she forgives me. I would have never thought that an object as mundane as a chair could cause so much terror in a person's life. Superstition often speaks of cursed objects, but I always found the concept to be laughable. However, the events that transpired the week of October 2nd, 2016 are something that will sit in the pit of my stomach until the day I die. My fiancé and I had just signed the lease on our first home, a modest one-bedroom apartment in an old building. There was nothing particularly amazing about the place, but it was ours, and that alone was enough to fill us with excitement. With my management position at the local diner and Alice part-time waitressing in between college classes, going out and buying brand new furniture was not an option. Luckily, Alice loved thrift shopping and typically knew where to get the best deals. She led me by hand through the aisles of clothes at the Good Finds thrift store near our new place. Against the far back wall sat a myriad of mismatched furniture. Worn wooden tables, couches with ripped cushions, dressers with half the drawers missing. I scrunched up my face at the smell of the dust and the thought of picking up someone's used, dirty furniture. Still, we were going to need more than just the furniture we currently had. Seth! I heard Alice yell from the other side of the furniture section. I headed towards the sound of her voice and found her standing in front of a large armchair. She pointed towards it. Look how nice this is. It was made of a deep blood red leather with delicate accents of black running along the edges. The black cushion was studded with a crisscross pattern of polished gold buttons. The buttons curved down the front of each arm as well. It sat upon four square legs made of a dark cherry wood. It was beautiful, but had a sense of darkness to it. I chalked that up to the color of its leather and vintage style. Most importantly, it was in perfect condition. It didn't even look like it had ever been sat on. Alice bent down and peered at the yellowed paper price tag. Twenty dollars was written in black marker. She glanced up at me with big eyes. The chair seemed to have some sort of pull on both of us. We knew we had to buy it. After some finagling, we had it in our car and on its way home. Carrying it upstairs to our fourth floor apartment was not as easy as we had hoped. This thing must be really well made, I grunted, trying to hold its weight as we rounded the third staircase. It's so fucking heavy. I can't believe how cheap it was. Alice was equally out of breath as she held the top of it, walking backwards up the final staircase. We put it in the corner of our living room, facing the television. It looked like it was meant to be there. The next few days went on without incident. We continued to unpack and decorate on our free nights after work. We explored our new neighborhood when we had the energy to go out, caught up in the novelty of our new place. The chair went mostly unnoticed. It wasn't until the next Friday night that I was given the first sign that something was wrong. 
Alice and I had settled in for the night, bowl of popcorn in hand and ready to pop in a movie. One of those classic black and white horror films she loved so much. I plopped down into the chair and immediately sprang back up. What's wrong? Alice asked. Two things had happened the moment I had sat down. First, the air around me grew incredibly cold, as if the room had fallen to a frigid temperature in mere moments. Second, the skin on my arm where the chair had touched burned like they had been pressed against hot metal. I dropped the popcorn to the ground without thoughts and began examining my arms where they had been burned. But there was nothing there, not even the slightest bit of redness. The fuck? I mumbled. Alice came over to me, gently putting her hands on my arm and looking me over. Did you hurt yourself? I, I don't know. I sat down and it felt like something was burning me. She paused, not exactly sure how to respond. Well, I don't see anything on your skin. Uh, the chair is in front of the window. Uh, maybe the sun was beating down on the leather today. Uh, yeah, maybe. Although I didn't believe that was the case. The sun had set hours ago. There was no way it should have retained that much heat. Let me see. Alice hesitantly lowered herself down onto the chair lightly touching her fingertips to the leather. I don't feel anything. I put my hand to the cushion and felt nothing. No cold air, no burning sensation. It was just a chair. I shrugged and assured her I must have had a weird hot flash or something. I cleaned up the spilled popcorn and changed the subject to turning on the movie. Alice still seemed uneasy by what had happened, but was happy to not dwell on it. We watched the movie in silence, both opting to sit on the futon. It wasn't more than a day or two after that when I noticed the chair began to move. It was subtle at first, seeming to be at a slightly different angle than it was the last time I had been in the room or a few inches forward or back from the last time I had looked at it. I told myself I was just imagining things, that my paranoia was getting the best of me. But when I woke up one morning to find that the chair had moved from the corner and now sat in the dead center of the room, I could no longer play it off as my imagination. Alice, I called. What? She yelled back from the bedroom, seemingly annoyed at the wake-up call. She groggily stumbled out into the living room. Her eyes widened. Did you move this? I asked. She furled her brow and shook her head. No, you didn't. No. We both sat, unmoving and silent, just staring at it. Alice's breath grew deep and uneven. Did something, like, break into our apartment in the middle of the night? I looked around the room. I don't think so. Literally nothing else looks touched. If something had come in, they'd have robbed us. Nobody's going to break in an apartment and just move a piece of furniture. I searched the apartment top to bottom, ensuring there were no unwanted visitors lurking anywhere. There was not a single sign that anyone had been there. I came back into the living room where Alice still stood, too confused to do anything. My eyes shifted from her to the chair still sitting feet away from where it had been the night before. I had never considered myself a superstitious person. I, however, I had seen enough horror movies. I knew the trope of the oblivious couple given a thousand red flags that something wrong was happening, but never do anything about it until it was too late. Yeah, we're getting rid of this thing. Alice nodded without a word. We agreed to get it out of the apartment into the dumpster that evening, as neither of us had time to carry it down the steps before work. Given that we were already living from paycheck to paycheck, we couldn't afford to be late. That night, I finished my shift and went to pick up Alice from her job, as we always did. We didn't say much on the drive home. I think we were both eager to just get there and get rid of the chair. As we climbed the stairs to our apartment, 
I groaned, thinking of having to carry that heavy thing all the way back out. Once we reached our door and I slid my key into the lock, we heard it. A high-pitched, blood-curdling scream coming from inside our home. It sounded like a child. I swung the door open as quickly as I could and rushed through the hallway into the living room. Alice quickly followed behind me. The screaming stopped upon us running in. There was the chair, tipped over on its side. Again, not a single other thing was out of place. No sign that anyone had been here. I stormed through every room. Who the fuck is here? I screamed, checking every closet, every dark corner, every single fucking inch of that house, but found nothing. I came back to the front door. Alice stood out in the hall, too afraid to come inside. All right, we're getting this fucking thing out of here now. I grabbed her by the hand and let her in. Without another word, we picked it up and began our descent to the dumpster. I spent the whole trip down, grasping the chair until my knuckles turned white, scared that it would somehow slip out of my hands and go plummeting down the stairs, taking one or both of us with it. I think Alice was scared of the same thing. We managed to get it outside, both of us throwing the thing on the gravel next to the dumpster and letting out a sigh of relief. It was then that I made the discovery, which still haunts me. I noticed a lump in the bottom cushion that I had somehow not seen before. Desperate to find out if something was actually going on with this or if we both were simply going insane, I took my pocket knife from my keychain and began to slice the leather cushion open. Shoved within the stuffing, I found the source of the lump. I pulled out a small white silk bag tied with a drawstring. I looked to Alice, who was visibly terrified. My hands were shaking, I, I didn't want to open it up, but I could feel that something was inside. I pulled the drawstring apart and peered through the opening, immediately dropping the bag onto the ground, the contents spilling out. Alice gasped. There was hair, several different colors, clearly from several different people. There were teeth. There were beaded bracelets and plastic rings made to fit tiny wrists and tiny fingers. There were the bones of the hands that once wore them. We called the police before even saying a word to each other. The cops came. They took the evidence, chair and all. We got a call from a detective the following week. The objects found were at least a decade old. The teeth were from eight different children, all between the ages of five and seven. They tested the victim's DNA, but none of it came up as a match in their system. They took the whole damn chair apart, searching for any evidence they could find from the attacker. But there were hundreds of fingerprints on it. Mine, Alice's, few workers from the thrift store that it had been dropped off at, and any thrift shopper who had touched it. The police investigated what they could, reached out to the thrift store employees to see if anyone remembered who brought the chair there and questioned any of the shoppers they could identify through the fingerprints. All in all, they came up with nothing. Nothing else strange happened in our apartment after that, but the presence of the chair still hung in the air. We moved out after our lease was up. I think the children that were killed were trying to tell something trying to get someone to find what was hidden in that chair. It hurts to know that the victims couldn't be identified. No closure to weeping parents. No honoring the dead with a picture or a name. But the thing that eats away at me the most is that the murderer could still be alive, still taking children from their homes. He might never be caught. The droning of Moose filled the night air as Rex took another hit of his cigarette. His marmalade-hued ember burned as bright as the morning sun. Dusk was setting in and it was time to take the cows back to the barn. The wind swirled like whirlpools surrounding and fluttering Rex's linen shirt. After throwing his cigarette into the dew-blanketed grass, he started to direct the cows in the direction of the barn. Rex was a farming man. 
He lived with his wife and two kids in eastern Washington, about 40 miles east of Wenatchee. Rex led a simple life, living mostly off of what the Mars-like terrain could muster. The occasional visit to the general store supplied his family with the little luxuries, such as toilet paper or the new Superman comic. Rex's son, Tommy, wanted to be just like his father and was set to inherit the farm one day. Rex's daughter, Mary, wanted to be a schoolteacher. The cows meandered into the dark and damp barn, huddling close together to shield from the cold November air. As Rex shuffled back to his homestead, he gazed up at the stars. There was little light in his town, resulting in beautiful galactical arrays projected into the night sky. The floorboards of his waterlogged patio squished and creaked as he shuffled to his front door. Father, uh, did you get the mail? Tommy asked. Not today, Tom. Say, will you go to town with me tomorrow? I've got to get a new hoe. Plus, there may be a surprise in it for you. Rex replied. The smile that waltzed across Tommy's face gave a calm pleasure to Rex as he retreated to his small study. Rex's study is where rest was had. Tobacco was smoked and drinks were drunk. In the corner of his study stood his most prized possession, the Cream Edison phonography machine, crafted by hand more than thirty years prior. As his music began to play, Rex sunk into his recliner and closed his eyes. The measly amount of light from a singular candle gave the room a calm atmosphere. Rex began to fall asleep. Rex awoke to a blood-curdling scream from Tommy and Mary's room, and then heard an even louder scream from his wife, who was now crying herself. Rex leapt upward unconsciously and began to sprint towards his kid's room. When he arrived at the door, he saw his two children and wife huddled in the corner of the room, pointing towards the window. What the hell happened? Rex asked. They said they heard whistling. I tried to calm them down, but then I heard it too. We saw someone out there. Rex's wife, Sally, replied. Stay here. Don't make any sound. I'll be right back. Rex whispered. Rex bolted to the closet and grabbed his rifle, along with a boot knife. Still in his long johns, he peeked through the door with his eyes down the iron sights of his rifle. He did not see anyone. He stepped outside into the cold night air and started to walk towards his barn. In the distance, he saw a moving light drifting farther and farther away from him. It looked as if it was a lantern, bouncing up and down violently as if someone were holding it while running away. He called out to the figure, Don't you come back! You come back here, you get a bullet between your eyes, you hear? Rex yelled. The light stopped moving. Rex repeated himself. Now that the light had stopped moving, Rex could barely make out a cloaked figure holding the lantern. The faceless figure stared at Rex for about a minute, before turning around and running the other way. Rex fired a warning shot to hasten the mystery figure. After about two minutes of standing there, Rex went back into his house. Well, there was someone out there, Rex told his family. Who, oh, father? Mary asked. I don't know, uh, but they're gone now. Let's go to bed, Rex replied. Can we sleep with you tonight, father? Tommy asked, voice trembling. Just tonight, Rex said. The family huddled into bed and laid quietly thinking about what just transpired. As the fear began to drift away, the family fell asleep. Rex awoke, nearly falling off the bed, his arms sore. It was 6 a.m., and work was to be done. As he brewed a cup of coffee and prepared some eggs for himself, he noticed that the barn door was slightly ajar. He rushed outside in an instant with his revolver in his coat pocket. Rex came upon a scene so ghastly that he could barely keep composure. In the middle of the barn, lied a skinned cow that was still alive. The cries from this cow sounded like no other animal, and it wailed as the sharp pieces of hay injected into the bare, bloody skin. The other cows were causing commotion, clearly distressed. Rex quickly grabbed his revolver from his coat pocket. 
He shot the cow once in the head. It screamed even harder. He shot it again. Still, it was alive, screaming even more. He shot it three times in the chest next. Still, the cow was somehow still alive. Nearly crying, Rex went outside the barn to grab his axe, still stuck in an oak stump. An adrenaline burst allowed him to free the axe from the stump, and he drove it as hard as he could into the middle of the cow's neck. That did the trick. Covered in blood, Rex lets out a wail. After sitting for a moment and reflecting on what had just transpired, Rex inspected the barn for further evidence of whatever was going on. In the back stable of the barn, Rex noticed that words had been painted on the wall. It wrote, Give children or death awaits. What the fuck? Rex asked to himself. Jesus, Rex! What did you do? Sally yelled from behind him. It wasn't me. It must have been that guy last night. Rex replied. This looks like a ritual or something, Rex. We need to grab Sheriff John. Sally said with bewilderment. Let's go to town. I don't want to leave you all here. Rex said. Sally woke the children and gathered them into the ford. Rex lit a cigarette to accompany his second coffee. He turned the radio on. In other news, the Department of Defense has listed new items that will be rationed. The long list includes steel, coffee grounds, and cigarettes, said a news broadcaster in a transatlantic accent. Now for your local news. Horror had stricken a small town in eastern Washington. Police said that last night a whole family was slaughtered brutally by an unknown perpetrator. Early details seemed to indicate that they were skinned and still conscious when police arrived. They all died shortly after reaching the hospital. Police do not have a suspect as of yet but they are warning residents of the surrounding towns, Winterset, Sunland, and Clarktown, to stay inside their homes and report any suspicious activity to their local police department. The newscaster read. Rex and Sally looked at each other for a moment. There was a look of both terror and confusion. They looked at their children, who were playing tag in the back seat. Rex looked forward as they had arrived in Clarktown. He parked the Ford in front of the police department and got out of his car. On the porch, Sheriff John rocked in his wooden chair. A large clump of chewing tobacco stuck out like a hillside on a grassy plain. Sheriff, how are you? Rex greeted the sheriff. About as fine as I can be, I suppose. About as fine as I can be, suppose. Heard it may snow soon, so I'll be getting the plows ready at about three or so. How about yourself? John replied. I wish I could say better. Rex looked at his family for a brief moment. I came to speak with you about a man I saw rummaging around my land last night. Did you get a good look at him? John asked. Uh, no. He was wearing some sort of black cloak and running away from me. He stopped for a moment and I saw his figure, but then he started running again. Rex replied, Well, I wouldn't pay it no mind. Probably some teenager's trying to pull a prank or something. Could be one of Tommy's friends or something. John said calmly, I would have thought that as well, until... Rex paused for a moment. Until what? Until I saw what happens to one of my cows. It skinned alive. It took at least ten shots... Three to the head and seven to the stomach. It wouldn't die. I finally had to use the axe to lob its head clean off. That's not all either, Rex whispered. What else? John asked excitingly. Whoever did it left a message. It said, give children or death awaits, Rex whispered. There was a long pause as John and Rex looked at each other with bewilderment. Neither was breaking the silence as they thought about the next course of action. I guess I could have some guys stay there with you for a couple nights. Do you think they could sleep in your barn? John asked. It sounds like a good idea. Whoever this is, I think this is more than just a prank, Rex replied. Rex and John shook hands and Rex left out the door. 
Upon entering his ford, his family began to ask him what just happened. They're going to send out some coppers to stay with us for a couple of nights. They got big guns and they'll keep us safe, Rex said confidently. The family all breathed a collective sigh of relief as the key turned the ignition over. Rex looked up in the sky and saw dark gray clouds. It was going to snow. It was just a question of how many feet. He hastened home to start chopping wood to survive the night. Perhaps he thought John's men wouldn't be able to make it. That would be the worst possible scenario. As night began to fall and the stars started glistening, only crickets could be heard in the snowy night. Silence had blanketed the town, along with a healthy helping of snow. Fog began to develop on the windows of Rex's cabin, and bright yellow candlelight painted the window against the dark and cold night. Sally was with the children making a pie, a cherry pie. Rex was in his study, thinking about what to do if the man comes again. In his head, he counted. One, two, three, four. We have four rifles. Tommy can handle one, probably. I could carry the revolver and a rifle. Five hundred rounds of ammunition. In the midst of this mental counting, Rex's heart sank when he heard a call from Sally. Down to the last candle, she yelled. Save it. It isn't the darkest yet. Rex yelled back. Rex had forgotten to get more candles. What good would 500 rounds of ammunition do if you cannot see your target? Internally, Rex felt a fear that was almost primal, a fear that was shared by cave dwellers who encountered large-toothed tigers in the dead of night. A fear that was ominous, almost as if the worst had yet come. A black mass of fear festered in the depths of his stomach and in the forefront of his mind. It was just past 8 p.m., three more hours of being awake, then daylight would come in no time. Rex tried to calm himself down as he went through possible scenarios. He dashed over to the window to see if John's men had arrived. They had not. Now they were late by almost thirty minutes. Stay calm, he thought. It's the snow. It's taking them extra long because of the snow. But deep inside the recesses of his thoughts was a dark voice that whispered to him his family's fate. Death awaits. Those words were laid in his head a thousand times, each time louder and more ghastly. Rex sat down and placed his hands together. God, I do not know what will happen tonight, but I feel very fearful. Please protect me and my family. Please protect us. Rex whispered to himself. Right then, Rex heard a familiar call. Rex, come and eat. The pie is cooled and ready. Sally yelled. Just a moment, Rex replied softly, knowing Sally could never hear his reply. As Rex stood up from his chair, he looked outside the window one more time to see if John's men had arrived. They hadn't. Let's all pray, Rex said as he sat down at the table. Father, we never pray before eating, Mary replied. I know, but tonight is different, Rex sighed, explaining no further. The family linked hands and Rex began to say a prayer. Lord, here before you are two adults, a mother and a father. Here before you are two lambs of your doing, my son and my daughter. Tonight, I ask you for your holy protection over my family and I. Protect us from the evil spirits, O Holy One. A tear began to roll down Rex's cheek. Amen, the family said quietly. Father, uh, what happened in the barn this morning? Tommy asked. I had to put down Mushi. Uh, he broke his ankle and was suffering in pain. Rex replied quickly. Father, what does awaits mean? Mary asked. Rex looked at Sally and then back at Mary, his brow furrowed. Where did you hear that word, honey? Rex replied. I read it in the barn. 
It said, give children or death awaits. What does awaits mean? She asked again. It doesn't mean anything, sweetheart. I wrote that there. It's just a Bible scripture I was trying to remember when I was painting the barn. I didn't have a pen and paper handy, so I just painted it on the wall. I'll paint over it when I'm done. Rex lied. I've never seen that in the Bible, Father, Tommy said with confusion. It's in the family Bible. I haven't read it to you yet. When you become a man, I'll read it to you. Then I'll give it to you to pass on to your own kids one day. Rex said with a smile. I can't wait until I become like you, Father, Tommy said. The pleasure felt from hearing those words almost made Rex forget about the impending doom that hung over his head. His smile faded slowly as he took another bite of his cherry pie. The policemen are here, yelled Sally. My prayers were answered, Rex thought. Rex ran outside to greet his protectors. Two big, fat police officers hobbled out of their ford, the tip of their beards almost frozen from the cold. Are you Rex? One of the fat police officers asked. That's me, Rex replied. Well, I'm Rick. This here's Frank. Hello, Frank said stupidly. Hello, Frank. Well, let's not beat around the bush. I'll show you the barn, Rex said. The three men trekked through the foot of snow thirty paces to their left towards the barn. Once inside, the men took their gloves off and began inspecting the scene. Wow, that's a lot of blood there, Rex said in amazement. That's what happens when you skin a cow alive, Rex replied. Shit, you weren't kidding. This is fucked up, Frank said. Well, check this out, Rex said, pointing to the back corner of his barn. Read over what it says, said Rex quietly. Give children or death awaits, Frank said out loud. So what, you think this is some pervert or something trying to scare you? Could be, but would some pervert go through all this trouble? Rex asked, already knowing the answer. This reminds me a lot of the case out in Shelton. You know what I mean? Rex said to Frank. Yeah, some sort of deal, Frank replied. What do you mean? asked Rex. You never heard of the Whistler? Frank asked with wide eyes. No, never, said Rex. Story goes like this. Out in Shelton, there was a guy living about two miles out of town with his family. The guy kept to himself. He owned a small lumber collective. One night, while out on a walk through the fields, he heard a strange whistling. He paid no mind to it, as it was probably just the wind. Next morning, he wakes up to the same whistling, but louder this time. Must be a weird cricket, he thought. Well, that night he went into his barn to find one of his milk cows skinned alive. He had to shoot the thing about fifteen times before it finally perished. Poor thing. Fella got freaked out and decided to lock his family in a room for the night. He sat on his porch with a shotgun. In the dead silence of night, once again, he hears the whistling. This time, it's almost definite. Almost as if it was done millimeters away from his eardrum. And just like that, it stopped. He heard some commotion in the house and ran inside to inspect it. In that room, he found his wife skinned alive with her tongue cut out. His children were missing. He shot himself on the spot. They never found out who did it. Rick said with a crescendo of sadness. How do they know the guy didn't just go crazy and kill his kids and wife? Rex asked. We thought that over. It's happened in three cities in Washington. As some say it happens in California as well, Frank said. They all stood in silence for a while until Rex finally broke it. Well, holler if you need anything, Rex sighed. Will do. They said. As Rex shuffled back to his home, he heard an unmistakable sound. A faint whistle. Almost as if it were miles away. Rex awoke to a deafening whistle. 
He looked to his side and his wife was sleeping soundly. He covered his ears in pain and terror. He ran to his children's rooms, only to find them sleeping soundly as well. The whistling abruptly stopped. He ran out to the barn and opened the doors. Kill me! Frank screamed at the top of his lungs. He was now pink, having been skinned alive. Next to him lied a dead Rick, who had a stake driven through both of his eyes. Fucking kill me! Frank screamed again. Rex pulled out his revolver and shot Frank square in the head. For a brief moment, Frank stopped screaming and stared over at Rex. He was able to muster out a couple of words before croaking. Just give him the children, Frank whispered. Rex kneeled over his dead body and began to sob. He grabbed a can of gasoline from the side of his barn and began to soak the bodies. He lit a cigarette, took a couple of drags, and then tossed it on the bodies. The barn began to catch on fire as well. Rex ran into his cabin to alert his family. First entering his children's room, he awoke them violently and yelled for them to gather their things. He did the same to Sally, whose initial anger subsided after realizing what was happening. In just five minutes, the children were in the cars with their suitcases, and Rex was the last out of the door. He took one final look at his homestead. It was ironic that he was the very man who built this cabin, and now he was going to have to watch it collapse in flames from his rearview mirror. They set out without a destination in mind, just anywhere away from here, thought Rex. Father, it's been two hours. But when will we stop driving? Tommy cried. This actually seems like a good spot, Rex said with urgency. What are we doing, Daddy? Mary asked with a tuft of fear. Your mom says I need to be more spontaneous. Rex looked over at Sally with a fake smile. So I've decided we're going on a surprise camping trip, Rex said with a false excitement mixed with dread. How fun! Can we hunt rabbits, father? Please? Tommy yelled with excitement. Of course, Tommy. But one thing that we have to remember, okay? No one can know we're here. Rex said sternly. How come, father? Mary asked. Why would we want anyone to know about our great camping spot, little Miss Mary? Rex replied. All right, team, let's get this tent pitched and the fire going. It's going to be a cold one tonight, Rex said, rubbing his hands together. The children began pitching the tent while Sally gathered dry sticks for kindling. Rex took out his revolver and set out to hunt for the night's supper. This time to himself also allowed him to think about possible plans of action. He was leaning towards just up and leaving. Sheriff John would never believe his story, he thought. He would be hung as a cop killer. Uh, Montana. Uh, yeah, uh, Montana. Uh, no one's out there. Rex thought to himself. I'll just tell the kids I got another job. The boss won't let me take it unless I'm there pronto. Uh, they'll believe that. Rex thought. Rex? Said a voice from behind the trees. Uh, yes, Sally. Rex replied. What happened to the barn? Same thing that happened to Moosey. I had to shoot him in the head to end it. Rex whispered. And the other one? Sally said with dread. Already dead. What's the plan? Sally asked hastingly. The plan is we're going to Montana. I can't go back there. They'll think I killed them. Rex said. We can explain it, Rex. Uh, John knows you too well to think that of you. Sally pleaded. No. If they saw what that thing did to those men, they would want to murder anyone responsible. I don't want to be mistaken for that. Whatever the hell it is. Rex yelled while still whispering. And what about money, Rex? What the fuck are we going to do for money? How will we eat, Rex? Sally yelled. We will make do. I'll find a way. I always have, Sally. Rex replied with passion. And what if it follows us? Sally whispered while darting. Sally whispered with darting eyes. Impossible. It never saw us leave. Rex whispered back. 
We don't know that. I suppose we don't, Rex said. Sally and Rex walked back together, hands linked in silence, held within their hands with an undying love for each other and their children, as well as collective fear for what is to come. When they arrived at the campsite, they looked at their children as they played together. I got you, Mary yelled. No, you didn't. I have a super shield ability. You can't hit me, Tommy yelled back. Not fair. Daddy, Tommy's teasing. Mary yelled with sadness. Sally and Rex did not reply to their children's calls. They only stared at their creations. The innocence, the naivety, the kindness, warmth, all illustrated through their children. How loud would they yelp if skinned alive? Rex thought. Does this thing want to kill them? Or worse? Thought Rex. He closed his eyes for a brief moment and sighed. It's getting dark. Let's call it a night. Sally, you and the kids are going to sleep in the tent. I'm going to keep watch for the night. Rex demanded. Can I help, father? Tommy asked. Tom, you're going to be the man of the tent while I watch over you. Keep your mother and your sister safe. Tell them funny stories and extravagant tales. Use your imagination. In the morning, we can hunt for rabbits all day. Got it? Rex said quickly. Yes, sir. Tommy said with his tiny hand horizontal to his forehead. Rex leaned closer to Sally and whispered into her ear. Check for me in the middle of the night. If I'm not sitting right here... Get the kids and run. Run until you can't anymore. Then find help. I'm going to leave a gun in the tent for Tommy. Rex whispered, giving a kiss to his wife's ear after speaking. She looked at him with tears streaming down her face. With a nod, Rex leaned over to Mary. Little Miss Mary, well how do you do? Rex asked with a smile. I'm scared, father. She replied quietly with her head down. Why, honey? Because I'm afraid of that man. Will you keep us safe? Mary pleaded. Little Miss Mary, I will be here all night protecting you. I'll be like the Queen's guard. And you know what? Rex said. What? Mary replied. I will probably never even have to use this thing. He smiled, pointing towards his rifle. Mary smiled and Rex tussled her hair. He told them to get in the tent, and they did. Rex perched himself down towards the fire, using its massive flames to light his cigarette. He grabbed his mug and poured some of his finest whiskey. His gun was perched against his chair, ready for a moment's notice. In his head, Rex began to recite an old nursery rhyme his mother used to tell him. If a boogeyman should come at night, when you're tucked in bed without a light, eyes like saucers give you such a fright if a boogeyman should come at night. Rex's eyelids began to grow heavy. He began to drift into slumber with the warm fire roaring next to him and the whispered prayers from the tent. Rex awoke to his eardrums nearly bursting. The whistle had almost turned into a disembodied scream, growing louder each second. Grabbing each ear and nearly pulling them off, Rex screamed as his head was banging in pain. Make it stop! God, make it stop! Rex bursted. Rex collapsed to the ground on his knees, sobbing violently. He looked upwards towards the tent and saw the door flap was fluttering in the wind. He let out a guttural yelp that sounded like it came from Lucifer himself. Anger, fear, dread. All of these words do not even come close to describing the state of his mind. He began to crawl out towards the tent, his tears creating rivers in the soil. When he finally made it to the door flap of the tent, he couldn't bear to look inside. Little Miss Mary, are you there? Rex sobbed so violently the words almost sounded like gibberish. He pounded the ground with such force it gave him upward momentum. Rex lifted himself up to his knees and began to peek behind the flaps of the tent. Inside was a ghastly sight. 
Sally laid there, skinned, still alive and begging for her mother. Rex shot her in the head quickly without looking. He had to take her out of her misery. After killing his wife, it had dawned on him. The kids were missing. Rex stood for a moment in silence. He began to cry even harder. With the little energy he had, he lifted the pistol up to his mouth and stared forward. Behind the fluttering flap, he saw a black cloak. The wind finally blew the flap open, revealing the reaper. The man's white face hurt Rex's eyes. He pursed his lips and began to whistle. Rex clenched his fingers, the hammer firing with an orange flash. His body falls backwards, right next to Sally. In other news, a family was found brutally murdered in what the police think was a murder-suicide. Police are reporting that wanted fugitive Rex William took his family on the run with him after killing two Clark police officers. Hound dogs finally picked up William's scent this morning, leading them to, according to the responding officers, one of the most disturbing scenes he has ever seen. William's wife was skinned alive. William's two children were found about 300 paces away. Both were skinned alive as well. Police said that right next to his wife's corpse, Williams decided the guilt was too much to handle and shot himself once in the temple. It is safe to say that Clark has never seen an event as gruesome as this. Richard turned to another channel, one that was more upbeat. Wow, what an awful man, Richard's wife, Molly, said in disbelief. Certainly not something you want to hear when you move to a new city, Richard replied. Richard settled in his chair, drink in hand, marveling at his new home. Honey, can you stop whistling? Richard asked. What? Molly replied. Uh, can you please stop whistling? I'm trying to read. Richard said more sternly. I'm not whistling. To be honest, I've never been a particularly motivated guy. Sure, I made it through high school all right. I never was in any advanced classes or anything, but I didn't really get held back either. When it came time to apply to university, I sat around and watched as all my high school friends got into their college of choice. Or second choice, or third, but me, I didn't get into anything. I fooled around going to the local community college for a while, but eventually my parents started nagging me to pull my own weight around the house. You see, my family was never really all that well off, and to be honest, even if I had gotten into a university I wanted, I don't think we could have afforded even a semester. So, yeah, I dropped out of the community college and got a job. For a while, I took any odd job thrown at me. I delivered packages, I worked on a farm tending to animals, I even did a little construction work for a while, but never could really hold anything stable. Eventually, I thought maybe getting closer to the big city nearby might help me find a more desirable job. I'd avoided moving that way before because the cost of living was insane the closer you got to the city. All those tech bros just kept running the rent through the ceiling. But there was one city within commuting distance which still had fairly affordable rent. If you were okay with the possibility of your place getting broken into and your car being stolen. I figured, what the hell? Not like I had anything worth stealing anyway. My most valuable possession was my last generation console with an outdated first person shooter game on it. I figured I could weather a few thefts, so I took the plunge. For a while, things were looking up. I had gotten a place near the big city, I had a pretty well paying and stable job at some hipster coffee joint in the city that seemed to think my rugged look was on point. I actually had some sizable pocket change for once, and to be honest, I really didn't know what the heck to do with it. That's when I discovered the big city's nightlife. I got so addicted to the clubs, the girls, and the drinking that I practically went out each night. Between the cost of drinking, ride shares, and late night binge eatings, I barely left room for rent and day to day expenses. But somehow I just scraped by every month. Jesus, Sean, you look like shit. Amy, my co-worker, took a drag from her cigarette, looking me up and down with a mildly disgusted look on her face. 
We were taking a quick smoke break between the busy hours. I'll be fine. I just need another shot of espresso, I said, and gave a sheepish laugh. My voice was hoarse and felt all too dry. It was the telltale sign of another late night, screaming, I love this fucking song, wasted out of my mind to some nameless girl on the dance floor. What's up with you lately? She asked. I sighed and took a deep drag of my own cigarette. You're just barely on time to work. The circles under your eyes are so deep I could mistake you for a panda, and you have this soulless stare when a customer comes up to order. She continued. I thought the soulless stare was part of why they hired me. Isn't it very, uh, on point? I said. We both laughed. Yeah, I guess, but I'm serious, man. You can't live like this. It ain't healthy, she said. Oh, it ain't, huh? I said mockingly. Amy wasn't from around here. She grew up in the Midwest and moved all the way out here, leaving her family behind. She was following the dream to come tech macabre and get a six-digit salary making obnoxious apps for lazy people. Occasionally, her Midwestern slang would slip out and I'd tease her relentlessly. She groaned and gave me a death stare. Her thick black eyeliner made it especially intimidating. I decided to change the subject. So, are you still taking that coding thingamajigger? I asked. Hack Academy? Hell yeah! She exclaimed. She balled her fist and shook it in a triumphant gesture, causing a few strands of her purple dyed hair to fall into her face. I'm almost done, but then I'll be out of this job, she said. She did a quick glance around to be sure no one else heard her, then gave me a knowing smile. Good for you, I said. I threw my cigarette butt down onto the ground and stomped it out before heading back toward the shop to resume my shift. Hey, you could, like, not litter, you know, she said. Yeah. Or I could just wait for you to come up with some app to get people to clean up my cigarette butts for me. I turned and walked away, lifting my hand in a lazy wave. Asshole, she said, barely audible. I glanced back and saw her bending over to pick up the butt I'd left on the ground. She was such a goody-goody sometimes. I went back to the shop. It was my turn on the espresso machine, so I zoned out and got into a rhythm of making coffee until the day ended. A few minutes into my walk home from the subway, I passed a giant church which had seemingly been entirely made of wooden glass. During the daytime it wasn't particularly special, but during the nights they would light up the interior, causing the pattern on the glass window to shine through dramatically. On my way home from work I'd stare at it regularly, absent-mindedly, but this evening while I was looking at it I felt a chill down my spine. The image was always a little fuzzy and hard to make out, but what had once seemed to me surely to be Jesus with his halo suddenly looked twisted and wrong. I stopped walking down the street and stared at the image. What had once been a halo around Jesus' head looked unmistakably like ram's horns, curling off either side of his skull. What had once looked like a serene smile now looked like a twisted snarl. His hand, once formed into a blessing, now looked like a claw reaching out to me. I stared at the depiction of the church's window, and it didn't change. I closed my eyes and rubbed them furiously, and looked again. It still looked wrong. What's going on? I muttered under my breath while staring up at the church from across the street. I was broken from my trance when a woman squeezed past me on the sidewalk avoiding me like I was an unkempt hobo shouting about lizard people. I shook my head and realized how crazy I must look. Okay, I'm going home and straight to bed. I hurried past the church, glancing at the image a few more times, hoping it would return to its old image, but it remained haunting and twisted. I'm gonna go have a smoke. You want in? I looked to Amy, who was just wrapping up, cleaning the espresso machine. Yeah, she said. Steve, you mind holding the fort? I asked to our other co-worker, Steve. Yeah, sure, I'll stay at the register while you guys go ruin your lungs. Alone. Again, he said with malice. Thanks, bud, I said, patting him on the shoulder. 
He gave me a cold glance and watched as we walked out of the shop into the alley out back. Steve's a real charmer, huh? I said to Amy once we'd gotten out back. Amy gave me one of her signature glares. You should be glad he doesn't report us for taking so many smoke breaks, Sean, Amy said. I looked up into the sky. It was a little overcast. People didn't have much coffee on days like this. It'll be a light day of work. Yeah, I guess. We smoked in silence for a few minutes. Uh, hey, you know that church that's over near where I live? I asked, breaking the silence. Which one? The one that's practically all glass. Uh, the one near the lake. I know of it. Uh, have you ever seen that image that shows on the glass at night? Uh, yeah, she said, taking a drag. What of it? Uh, did anything seem... I paused as I searched for words. Uh, off to you? Off how? Uh, never mind. It, it's stupid. Amy eyed me suspiciously. She wasn't one to leave good enough alone. Spit it out, Sean. Last night when I was looking at it, it, like, morphed or something. It turned into some ram-headed creature. That full satanic shit, man. Amy started to laugh immediately. Oh, come on, Sean. You've been partying a little too hard if you think I'm going to believe that cliche-ass story. I'm serious, Amy. That's what I saw. Clear as day. Amy tilted her head and looked piercingly at my eyes. You're really not joking, are you? I'm not. Amy looked at me, frustration in her eyes. You seriously need to take a damn break from all this wildlife shit, Sean. It's fucking with your head. I guess. We finished our cigarettes in an uncomfortable silence, neither of us knowing what else to say. I spent my entire shift thinking about that damn image of the church. I just couldn't stop seeing its evil snarl burned into the back of my eyelids. It was my night to close down, so I was leaving later than usual. I decided I needed a distraction. I was going out tonight. I went straight to the club after work. It was a Wednesday night, so the crowd was pretty lame, so I just ended up getting shit-faced and hitting on any girl with two legs. Eventually, 2am rolled around and the club emptied. As I stepped outside of the hot and steamy club, the cold night air felt like a slap in the face, making me nakedly aware of my own drunkenness. I looked around at all the other partiers, stumbling around and laughing a little. This was such a familiar scene to me by now, it almost felt like home. Then I noticed her. A girl in a pure white gown, blonde hair and piercing pale blue eyes, stood at the edge of the sidewalk in front of the club's entrance. She was staring directly at me, with no emotion on her face. I looked around me, wondering if maybe she saw someone she knew, or someone was doing something weird behind me, but all the clubgoers had emptied out, and I was the only one standing there. She was staring at me. What the fuck? I strode up to her, full of drunken bravado. Do I know you? I asked in what seemed like a very impressive tone. The woman stared at me with her eyes wide and emotionless and said nothing. After a few long seconds of silence, without breaking eye contact, she reached a hand into the sleeve of her robe and pulled out a small white object that looked like a little credit card and extended it out to me. I stared at it for a moment and then took it from her. I looked down at the card. It was pure white, solid, like some kind of hard plastic or... Maybe glass. In pure, solid black lettering it read, Cathedral of Light. You're from that church, I started to ask. But as I looked up from the card, the girl was gone. I looked back at the card and flipped it over. The back side read, 3 a.m., Holy Repentance Service, in the same imposing font. I glanced around and noticed some other drunken club-goers were being ushered away by the club owners and decided it was my cue to go home. I slipped the card into my wallet and stumbled back to my apartment. The alarm on my phone beeped incessantly in my ear. 
as I struggled to keep my eyes open long enough to enter my passcode to turn it off. I groaned as I crawled out of bed and down some water before hurrying to get clothed and off to work. I showed up to work just barely put together, but on time. Amy was just opening the doors as I came. She shot a concerned glance at me and I walked up. Hey, Sean, I want to talk to you about something at our break today, okay? She said. Of course, I said. So serious all of a sudden, I laughed. Amy shot me a look that said, I mean business and continued setting up the shop for the day's work. When break finally came around, Amy and I went to our usual spots and I lit up. Amy did not. So, I went to that church you were talking about last night. My cigarette practically fell out of my mouth. No shit, I said in shock. Why would you do that? I, I don't know. Something about the way you told me about that just made me feel like I had to know. So, did you see it? No, well, yes, not at first. She looked visibly shaken, speaking about it. Whoa, Amy, I've never seen you like this. You really saw it, didn't you? Amy nodded. Well, at least I know I'm not crazy, I said. Amy laughed weakly. I was staring at it, and... I just saw the same old Jesus figure I remembered, and then suddenly it started to shift, just like you said. She shook her head from side to side. The horns, the claws, and all of it was a straight-up demonic image. Right? I said. I still can't get the image out of my head. Yeah, it's almost like it burrowed in there. Suddenly, last night's images came flooding back to me in bits and pieces, and I remembered the card. I desperately pulled out my wallet and searched it for the card. There it was, right where I'd put it last night. Still ominous and pristine as the night before. Amy noticed and came closer to take a look. What's that? Get this. Some girl from the church handed it to me outside of the club I was at last night. Uh, what? Like she was flyering or something? I handed her the card to take a look at. She was, like, in this full white robe, like something out of the 1800s or something. And she just stared at me until I took the card. What's this on the back of the card? It beats me. Some kind of event for their weirdo religion? This is some creepy stuff, man. Amy handed the card back to me and we stood in silence for a moment. Wanna go check it out? She said, breaking the silence. You know this is literally the worst idea possible, right? Yeah, but I already can't stop thinking about this place since last night. You know how it is. I, I just gotta figure out what all this is. I'm ashamed to say that I straight up bailed. I know I probably should have had her back or talked her out of going, but all I could think about at that moment was not wanting to have more to deal with. I guess old habits die hard. You can go by yourself, Amy. I'm not interested. I said coldly. She scoffed at me and walked off back towards the shop. Amy, I didn't... I stopped as she stuck her hand back and gave me a middle finger without stopping. Whatever. I grumbled to myself and lit up my cigarette before returning to work. Amy wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the day and even Steve seemed to be sensing something was up, and he kept glancing between the two of us. Amy left early, and Steve and I were cleaning up before he had to close the place down. Lover's quarrel? Steve asked. I laughed. Who knows what's going on in that girl's mind? I said apathetically. Steve and I finished up, and I headed home. I laid in bed for hours, but I couldn't sleep. I saw the creature in the church glass. The girl in all white and Amy's cold stare. Fuck! I shouted in frustration. I glanced at the clock. 3.15 a.m. I punched the bed in frustration and got up, hurriedly getting dressed. The church was about a ten minute walk from my apartment. Maybe a little less if I speed walked. But I was practically sprinting. 
My chest was pounding and something just felt wrong. A primal feeling of worry. Something you just know but can't understand. When I finally arrived at the church, the creature in the glass was illuminated and towering above me. I tried not to focus on it as I circled the building looking for Amy. Before I could find her, I found a large double door, slightly ajar. A faint light seeping from inside the building into the darkness of the night. I slowly peeked inside. The building was dimly lit inside, except the glass wall where the figure was illuminated. Candles lined a walkway leading to a pedestal with a spotlight shining on a book. Something about the book drew me to it. Maybe it was just a natural instinct to approach light in a dark room. Maybe it was the mystery. Maybe it was something else. But I couldn't fight the urge to approach it. When I reached it, I saw that the book was in a language unlike anything I'd ever seen before. In the candlelight, the words seemed to shift and writhe on the page like snakes in a pit. On one page, a drawing depicted a dagger dripping with some liquid. I flipped through the pages frantically, each page filled with that strange language and more and more disturbing imagery. A loud clicking sound ignited my heart and made me spin around to look at the source. A long, laborious squeak sounded as a door opened slowly behind me, seemingly on its own. Hello, I said. I meant for it to sound strong, but instead it sounded meek and timid. Amy? Nothing responded. I walked to the door. I could feel my body shaking. I was terrified. As I approached the door, I could hear a dull tone, almost like chanting. I pushed the door open to reveal a spiral staircase, dimly lit but with a stronger light flickering down below. I methodically walked down the staircase, and the chanting grew louder and clearer with each step. As I approached the bottom of the staircase, I could clearly hear the chanting, though I had no idea what language it was in. The first thing I saw when I made it to the bottom of the staircase was Amy. She hung in the center of a room. Her hands were tied on either side of a large wooden cross, her legs tied to the bottom. She was gagged and completely naked. Her eyes shot open in a mixture of fear and hope as she saw me and our eyes locked. I quickly scanned the room, hooded figures in orange, their faces obscured, surrounded Amy. Several girls like the one I'd seen before, only now they wore no white robes, danced, spinning and jumping in jerky, stilted motions around Amy. The hooded men chanted methodically in the otherworldly language. The chanting filled the room with a cacophony of deep booms and piercing hisses. I started to speak. The chanting stopped. All the girls in unison stopped dancing in mid-motion and turned, staring at me. Amy? I barely managed to squeak, paralyzed with fear. I stepped into the doorway. Repent and be reborn. They all chanted at once. I don't think they were speaking English, but suddenly I could understand the words. I... I... I, I tried to speak. Repent and be reborn. They repeated. Repent and be reborn. It was then that I noticed the ornate dagger lying on a pedestal next to the cross where Amy was tied. Once I'd seen it, a flood of visions entered my mind. I saw myself the head of an empire. I saw possessions beyond anything I'd ever dreamed. People respected and aspired to be like me. Clearly none of it had happened, but they felt like memories. Memories of the future. Then, suddenly, my purpose was clear. For the first time in my life, I was intensely motivated, and I knew exactly what I had to do. Repent and be reborn, they said. I walked towards Amy. She looked at me with hope in her eyes. Repent and be reborn, they repeated. I reached Amy and tears streamed from her eyes, her thick black eyeliner streaming as she stared into my cold eyes. Repent and be reborn, I said as I grabbed the dagger and shoved it into Amy's chest in one swift motion. She screamed violently, even through the gag, as her eyes faded and the life flooded from them. 
The ambitious fall, the voices said in unison. The strong shall rule, they continued. I stared at the blood on my hands as the people around me slowly walked towards me in unison. It's been ten years since Amy disappeared. After the disagreement we had in front of Steve, he suspected me. But after they found a note in Amy's apartment claiming that she just couldn't take the pressure anymore after failing to finish her Hack Academy degree, the police dropped the case as a textbook case of burnout. I'm a successful CEO now. I was able to come up with a highly successful social media website, despite my relative lack of knowledge, and use that fortune to build several other successful apps on that platform. I never worry about money anymore. Sometimes I check up on my old high school friends just to laugh about what their university degrees have gotten them. It's an amazing world we live in, where a relative nobody can become a world name just by creating a simple website, just by having the motivation to do what it takes. Thankfully, the high-pressure environments in my tech bubble means no one worries when every few years the ambitious new intern just stops showing up to work one day. It all started four days ago. My job had just let me go because I was too slow at putting peppers on a freaking conveyor belt. So it was back to the hell that was job searching. Three applications a day, keeping an eye out for responses, and in general, just hanging with my parents that I could tolerate some days better than others. I honestly don't know what made me think of applying for that specific gas station. But don't get me wrong, I really do like the place, and I don't blame it for what happened. So I won't use the real name in this story. Let's call it Swift Pit instead. The gas station was family owned. Let's call them the Laika family. That has a nice ring to it. Miss Laika was a kind, short lady with gray hair and blue eyes, and a very gentle voice. Thirteen dollars an hour sure felt like one hell of a deal for just running the register, filling the hot food section and keeping the shelves stocked. And the other workers were nice, which was more than I could have said for my last job. I don't think I need to describe what it looked like to you because it's pretty much the same as any other gas station. There were four pumps, and the store itself was pretty small, but not so small it felt claustrophobic. During the day, they kept the hot food area well stocked, but during the night, we kept only the bare minimum there, replacing it only when the initial ones were taken. The evenings were so slow, they'd only put one person in the station, though the boss lived perhaps ten minutes away, and would be able to show up pretty quickly if I gave her a call. Not sure how the days went, though since they were still in business, I've got to assume quite a bit busier. I heard that they were toying with closing during the night to help save on expenses. It was my first night by myself. Nothing too eventful happened for the first few hours. I could have counted the number of customers that actually entered the station so far on one hand. One with a short old woman with a loud set of pipes. One was a short old woman with a loud set of pipes. Another was a man who really shouldn't have been driving from how badly he reeked of alcohol. There might have been a few more customers. It's a little fuzzy now. I spent a lot of time just standing at the register and staring out the window. I always grew up near cities, where you could only see the brightest stars. It really wasn't until I got this job, a few minutes away from the nearest city, that I really got to see the night sky in all of its glory. That night was no exception. The full moon was just... breathtaking. I could have stood there and watched the stars for hours. It was around one o'clock when I heard the gunshot. And it was close. Really close. The entire night went into a panic. I heard startled birds flying for safety, watching a single deer sprint past the building. Then it was quiet. The night itself patiently waiting for an explanation. But I didn't have one. There was a huge forest nearby, sure. Perhaps a hunter? I don't know the first thing about hunting. Uh, maybe someone was allowed to hunt on this property. I was straining my ears when there was a loud clunk by the door. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. It was an adult wolf, 
who had one paw lightly stuck in the handle to pull it open. All it took was the wolf making a little jump backwards, and the door swung open. And for just a moment, I realized the wolf had gained entry, and I was very possibly in danger. The wolf threw something into the store and took off into the night, all within the span of a few seconds. It was all so fast. But it was what the wolf had just flung into the building that really had me shocked. It was a small bundle of gray fur, looking at me with big brown eyes. I couldn't understand what I had just witnessed. Had an adult wolf just thrown its baby into the gas station and bail? That didn't make any sense. The little wolf looked outside, then hobbled its way towards me without a second thought. I was still thinking about it when someone stormed into view. They were wearing a huge trench coat, a very heavy set of jeans, some steel-toed boots, and a thick pair of gloves, along with a heavy-looking hat. But what really had me scared was the huge gun the man was holding. It was some sort of rifle, and even without knowing anything about guns, I recognized it as a high-caliber gun. The man was walking towards the entrance to the gas station, and while I couldn't see his eyes, I got the feeling he was looking right at me. By the time he got to the entrance, the young pup was out of sight, and the man's attention was grabbed when the adult wolf howled somewhere off in the distance. The man immediately turned and ran toward the sound, his gun at the ready. I didn't know what to think about the whole situation. I've heard of plenty of people hunting deer, but I didn't even know if it was legal for people to hunt wolves. I also didn't know how smart wolves were. But here was a parent wolf not only playing decoy to protect its cub, it even knew how to work the gas station's pull door with no trouble whatsoever. I've had some dogs that figured out that kind of stuff, sure, but that was only after several hundred attempts. And if the wolf was that crafty, I got the feeling the man stood no chance of killing it. My thoughts turned to the cub when I felt it nuzzling against my feet. It only took one look down before I knelt down and began petting it. I've always liked dogs and kids, so a two-in-one package combo was an absolute delight. It took me a second to remember that it was a wild wolf cub. This whole situation was just so weird. The poor thing was shaking like a leaf. Somewhere in the back of my mind I was wary. Even a fully tamed dog is likely to lash out at a person if it is approached when scared. But that part of my mind wasn't the one in control, as I gently clutched the cub close to my chest. There, there. It's okay. I won't let the mean hunter hurt you. The wolf looked up at my face, then, to my delight, snuggled close to my chest. Good. There was nothing to worry about. But it was strange. As far as I know, most wild animals are scared to be around people. This pup was scared, sure, but had no problem whatsoever with me. Did it realize I wanted to help it? I, I don't know. Would that be a bit too smart for a wolf cub? It didn't take long before I realized I had to call someone. Even if the poor cub was someone's pet, that meant that someone was missing their pets and probably looking for it. The only person who lived close enough that it even seemed plausible would be the manager. I hated the idea of waking her up at 1am, but I really wasn't sure what to do about the situation. The phone rang three times before someone picked up. Unlike the gentle voice I was expecting to come out from the phone, I heard a gruff and decadently male voice grumble its way through the receiver. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, I'm looking for Miss Laika. There's something odd going on at the gas station, and... My wife's sleeping right now, asshole. I'm gonna have to do. Well, this was off to a great start. I've never been the best at conversing with people, and I honestly hadn't realized she was married. Okay, okay. I, I heard a gunshot nearby. It took the man the longest time to reply, and when he did, I was startled at how nervous he sounded. All of that annoyance was gone, replaced with genuine fear in his voice. Is, is that so? Are you in danger? Uh, not that I know of yet. I did see some weirdo in a trench coat carrying a rifle walking around outside. But they left after hearing a wolf howl. 
Shit, you, uh, didn't happen to see if there was a wolf with a cub nearby, did you? Well, that was suspiciously specific. I'm not stupid, and that was setting off red flags in my head. It took nearly ten seconds before I decided the only rational answer was that the Lyca family owned a few tame wolves. I... Uh, yes, actually. The wolf kind of uh, threw the cub into the gas station. I'm currently holding the cub right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to... Actually, first I'm going to question why the hell you'd pick up a wild wolf cub. You do know mother wolves aren't very forgiving if they see you playing with their kids, right? That made me blush. He wasn't wrong, of course. If I was a normal person, maybe I would have thought through it a little bit harder. I, I, I like dogs. A lot. Fair enough. Anyways, I've heard about this nutcase on the news recently. Apparently it comes out every full moon and starts shooting at any wolves he sees. I'm gonna grab my gun and meet you at the gas station. Just in case he decides to do something. As for the cub, well, you seem to have that under control right now. Also, this may be a strange thing to ask, but could you please not call the police? I mean, if the situation gets really bad, then go right ahead. But so long as it's just weird like this... I agreed with him, my throat becoming very dry. More red flags were going off. He knew more than what he was letting on. I could sense it. This whole situation screamed trouble. As I hung up the phone, I looked at the clock. 1.15. Now, before I continue, I want it on the record that I'm not always the best when it comes to putting things together. But it doesn't take a fucking genius to figure out the connection between wolves and the full moon. Of course, I thought, werewolf at some point during this conversation. It would definitely explain some nut marching around the woods, killing every wolf he came across. At the time, I thought this gunman was probably just some deluded psycho who believed in fairy tales a little too much. As I waited for Mr. Lyca to appear, I couldn't stop the thoughts gnawing away in my brain. Why on earth had the man asked about a wolf and her cub? My more uh, creative side that likes to ignore reality played with the thought that perhaps this mother wolf and child were in fact not only werewolves but family members to Mr. Laika. I've always had an overactive imagination, and it's gotten me in trouble more than once. And tonight, faced with a mystery that the rational side of my brain had no answer to, the creative side was all too willing to spin a fantastical story of lies, murder, and love. Though, of course, the rational side was keeping it in check. The fantasies I was cooking up were nothing more than fantasies. Werewolves were not real. The entire time my brain was uh, thinking this up, I was playing with the cub. For the first few minutes, I just stood there and petted the cub. But then we got bored of that, and I decided to see if it could play fetch with a nearby pencil. The answer, to my delight, was yes. Somewhere in the middle of this, I started calling the cub Togo, which he seemed to love. Belly rubs were one of his favorite things, so I started rewarding him with a belly rub each time he brought back the pencil. It felt like forever before my mind noticed that there was something heading our way. I could hear it. Some soft, thumping sound. It made me feel uneasy, and I quickly had the cub sit at my feet while I stood up at the register, the cub well hidden from the doorway. It only took a few seconds before I saw the man wearing a trench coat walk into view. The man grunted as he took a step into the store, his large boots producing an audible thump with every step. His eyes checked out the right side of the store, then the left, before deciding it was safe to walk inside. In his left hand was a gun. Sorry to disturb you, lad. There was no sincerity in his voice, but it was deep, perhaps the deepest sounding voice I'd ever heard. And as he walked in the store, I had the pleasure of realizing the man was taller than me, which, considering I'm 6'3", is actually quite the feat. It wasn't just a little bit, either. He could have been seven feet tall. It would have been a lot more intimidating if he didn't look like some secret agent from a kid's cartoon attempting to blend in with society. But the gun was very real, and it was what I was mostly afraid of. 
Have you seen a wolf come by here lately? Rather tall, grey fur, blue eyes. I honestly told him no. I didn't get a good look at the adult wolf that came by earlier, and the cub had brown eyes. But the man gave another low grunt as he began sauntering his way over to me, his boots thumping the entire way. Well, what about a tiny wolf? Grey fur and brown eyes. I told him no, but even I knew full well it was pointless. I couldn't even maintain eye contact. His boots were getting on my nerves. I'm easily distracted by sound, and the thumping kept messing with my head. Really? He was heading my way, a crooked smile on his face as he lightly lifted up his gun. I'm not in the mood for games, kid. My throat was dry as the desert as I asked him why he wanted to know. The moon's full and there are wolves about. Do I need to spell it out for you? Are you trying to tell me they're werewolves? This man congratulated me on figuring it out, his voice soaked in sarcasm. I could feel Togo shivering against my feet, doing his best to stay out of the sight of this man. And in that instant, I felt a rush of paternal instincts kicking in. He was not getting Togo, no matter what he thought. Werewolves don't exist, sir. The thumping stopped, because he was now on the other side of the counter, and his eyes, a deep shade of blue, were trying to bore a hole right through my skull. I don't have time to explain the situation to you, so let's just settle with yes they are. Give me one reason to believe you. He lifted his gun slightly with a stone-cold frown on his face. He didn't aim it at me or anything, but the threat was clear. It was quite the experience. I've never felt a chill down my spine quite like that before. He really was crazy, and he was dead serious. Werewolves do exist. I've seen what they can do. What they are. They cause nothing but pain and misery. Now tell me where the cub is. I didn't want to hand any living thing to this psychopath. The little cub was huddled around my feet, shivering so badly that it almost felt like it was having a seizure. But at the same time, well, he was pretty much telling me he'd shoot me if I didn't tell him. And if he did, Togo would be easy pickings. There was a moment, a truly horrible moment, where I honestly believed there was no other choice. I was going to have to reach down, pick up the innocent pup, and place it within this monster's hands. Then reality struck me. Mr. and Miss Lyca lived only ten minutes away, and I quickly glanced at the clock, which told me I'd made that call about twelve minutes ago. Help was only a few minutes away, and maybe even just a few seconds away. If I could just stall for time... He wouldn't try anything if there was something with equal firepower on the scene, right? What will you do? Kill it? Not immediately, no. You see, his mother has proven to be quite the difficult catch. Not letting me get a clear shot. Good, good, he's talking. I just need to keep him talking. Uh, okay. He gives a very irritated grunt as he shakes his head. God, are you really that retarded? I'm going to use it as bait. Retarded? Oh, he just struck a nerve. But it also told me just how agitated he was. Did he know I was stalling for time? Why the hell did I think this was a good idea a few seconds ago? Uh, let's say that werewolves exist. How do you know these two are werewolves? Let's put it this way. Wolves are smart. But they're not that smart. The mother wolf realized I was tracking her down after I failed to ambush her. What did she do? She ran out to the gas station. And a few minutes later I realized she must have brought her pup inside. She then tried to lead me away from the gas station. That's quite a bit of thought for a normal wolf. Okay. I had to give him that point. But the more I thought about it, the more this man's plan made me scared of him. He wanted to use a child to lure their mother into a trap, and then kill the child. It was disgusting. Uh, did you see the mother doing something wrong? I beg your pardon. Uh, 
Well, I'm assuming you have a reason you want to kill her. She's a werewolf. That was it. He made no other attempt to justify murdering what he fully believed was a sentient being. And he said it with such conviction, as if I was out of my mind to even think he needed more of a reason than that. It made my skin crawl. This guy was well on his way to becoming a serial killer. And if I kept attempting to stall him, I was starting to think I would become his first genuinely sentient victim. There was movement in my peripheral. A quick glance outside showed me that my salvation was just pulling into the parking lot. I'd never been so happy to see a beat-up little Subaru. But when I looked back at the man, I realized I had made a horrible mistake. He was following my gaze, and the instant he saw the car outside, his mouth curled up into a nasty sneer. You little shit. He raised the gun and aimed it at my chest. There was no hesitation. The sound was deafening. Pain tore a path through my chest. I staggered backwards while placing a shaking hand to my chest and held my hand up to find it covered in blood. He had actually shot me. I mean, it's one thing to threaten to shoot someone. It's quite another to actually do it. I should have fucking known. It felt like a dream as I looked up at him to find him aiming the rifle at the doorway. Standing there was a burly man wielding a gun of his own, aiming it directly at the man in the trench coat. My breaths were slow and ragged, and I couldn't stop coughing. A few times I started coughing up blood. Mr. Laika and the man just stood there for the longest time, guns aimed at each other. At some point I fell to the ground. I don't think it had anything to do with the hole in my chest. I think it was just the shock of the entire situation. They started shouting at each other. I only needed to hear the first few sentences to realize they knew each other personally, and they despised each other. I tuned them out while reaching into my pocket and grabbing out my phone. It took only a few seconds to punch in the number and bring it to my ears. To my surprise, it hardly began the first ring before they picked it up. The welcome sound of a friendly voice came through. 911, what's your mer- The sound was deafening. I heard the man's boots thundering towards the nearest aisle as all hell broke loose. Somewhere in my mind, I finally realized this was really happening. A gunfight was going on right in front of me. I was shaking violently now, one hand clutching at the wound as I brought my knees to my chest and began whispering into the phone. I'm at the swift pit at the gas station. I was just shot. I couldn't hear her response over the gunfire, just the urgency in her voice. The guns sounded really different, with the man's making a loud bang and Mr. Laika's gun making a strange rat-a-tat sound, like it was firing three rounds at a time. Then it stopped. What followed was five minutes of silence, no one willing to make a single move. I was whispering to the operator, telling her everything I knew about the situation in a desperate hope that she'd have an answer as to what I should do. At some point, I took off my shirt and tightly wrapped it around my chest in an attempt to slow the bleeding. And poor Togo was curled up next to me, crying silently as the world itself stood still. My heart stopped as I heard a body fall to the floor. The man's gun fired last, not Mr. Lycus. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe it was a dead man's trigger finger. Oh no. Add that big sound effect. He was... He was heading my way. The young cub began whimpering. There was no point in trying to protect him anymore. I was about to die, and Togo was going to die right after. Time seemed to slow down as his boot came into view around the corner, landing with another loud thump. I looked up at him to see there were a few holes in his coat, but there was no blood. It took me a second to realize he was wearing a bulletproof vest underneath the trench coat. He had a nasty smile on his face as he rested the barrel of the gun right against my forehead. There was no hesitation, no guilt in his eyes. I could only watch, shaking my head pitifully and crying as I watched him pull the trigger. The smirk vanished off his face as he looked down at his gun with a raised eyebrow. The sound couldn't have been more unexpected. The man's eyes opened wide in shock as he buckled at the knees, blood flowing freely from the three bullet holes in his forehead. His head slammed into the floor with a nasty thunk. 
I heard pounding footsteps as Mr. Laika ran into view, pointing his gun at the man's head. It was only ten seconds later, when it was clear the man was never going to get back up, that Mr. Laika turned around and looked at me. There was blood pouring out of a wound on his shoulder. But what really had me scared was the haunted look in his eyes as he got down to eye level with me, putting a hand on my shoulder. He looked me over and gave a huge, relieved sigh. I... I called 911. They're on the way. Good. Can you stand? It took a few attempts. My legs were shaking really badly, but I did ultimately stand. It took me a moment to realize Togo was standing in front of me, now nuzzling Mr. Laika's legs. He just reached down and picked Togo up, and gently touched his head to Togo's forehead. The front door opened. At first I thought it was the police, but to my surprise, I turned around to find the mother wolf now entering the gas station. She trotted up to us, and waited for Mr. Laika to set down Togo, before gently picking up her cub and looking at me. The instant that her eyes met mine, there was a connection. I don't think I can fully explain how I knew her thoughts, but I knew exactly what she was saying to me, and I couldn't help the smile that came to my face as I scratched the back of her ear, even as the moment sent another wave of agony through my chest. You're welcome. She smiled before turning around. Red and blue lights were shining through the windows, sirens blaring through the quiet night. Before I could say anything more, the wolf sprinted for the back door, knocking it open and vanishing into the night with her baby. The next few hours were a blur. The police asked a lot of questions, of course, but I didn't say much. The ambulance wasn't far behind them, and they put some, uh endotracheal tube in my lung to help with my current breathing problems. The ambulance called the Laika family to inform them that Mr. Laika was injured, but they didn't pick up. My family was a different matter. You'd have thought that I really had died from how badly my mom was crying, screaming that I was never to work at a gas station ever again. The doctors performed surgery on me within half an hour of me getting to the hospital. The bullet had gone through my lung, and had nearly managed to exit through my back. It took a few stitches to close it all, but all in all, I was assured my life wasn't in any danger due to the wound. I'm currently writing this from the hospital bed. This is the first day where I haven't had some damn reporter shoving a microphone down my throat, trying to get my opinion on the whole thing. Apparently the cameras in the station couldn't catch what was actually said. There was just footage of me playing with the wolf pup, then the man came in, and it all went to shit. I told them everything the man had said to me, how he was hunting werewolves, how he wanted to know where the cub was. Right now, the TV in my room is showering the headlines on the werewolf hunter, as they've named my attacker. As of right now, he's a John Doe. He didn't have a phone or any form of identification on him. Not a single person is missing from town, and not a single abandoned vehicle nearby. Police are awaiting news from a DNA test. But here's what really caught my attention. There are no stories of him from before that night. Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, the actual news, I couldn't find anything. And I've had days to search. The closest I got was a man who swore werewolves existed and had killed his wife for thinking she was one. But he was several states away and was predictably in prison. I hadn't told the police that Mr. Laika had warned me of this man, that he had heard stories of a man killing wolves during the full moon. As for the wolf and her pup, no one had an explanation for what happened. There were animal experts trying to figure out why a mother wolf would put her baby with a complete stranger, why the baby trusted me with no trouble, and why the mother simply took her child back without attempting to maul us. Some are accusing me of having illegally tamed the wolf, saying that it explained why I had refused to hand the pup over, even with my life on the line. But others are defending me, saying that perhaps the wolf somehow realized I was protecting the child and pointing out that when the wolf opened the door, I was clearly alarmed until she left. In all honesty, I don't need an explanation. Miss Laika had come and visited me since then, looking at me with her piercing blue eyes and apologizing for everything that happened promising to give me an explanation that I don't really need. She brought her son, not more than a year or two old, with big brown eyes. 
I had asked her for the boy's name, and she told me it was Sam. Then the child spoke, and while his mother thought it was just baby noises, it brought a smile to my face. Togo. My wife has a twin sister. They aren't identical twins, just fraternal, but they still look very much alike. If you didn't know them well, you could easily mistake one for the other from a distance. Carrie and I have been married for six years. Her sister, Amber, just got married about six months ago to a guy named Steve. He seemed like a nice enough guy at first. A little aloof, maybe, but nice enough. The more I've been around him, though, the clearer it has become to me that he's not the type of guy I'd choose to hang out with. Since my wife and her sister are close, though, and since we all live in the same little Colorado town, I don't really have a choice, but we seem to see each other regularly. It sounds like I'm getting ready to complain, but I'm not. There are definitely worse things than having to hang out with Amber and Steve. I've always enjoyed Amber's company. She's a lot like Carrie, after all. And Steve isn't unpleasant, necessarily. Just a little peculiar. Still, I was disappointed to learn that Steve wanted to take me up to his hunting lease for the weekend. To tell the truth, I don't think it was Steve's idea. I think Carrie and Amber came up with it so the two of them could have the weekend to themselves, to go shopping or whatever else it was they wanted to do regularly. I think Carrie was also hoping Steve and I would bond better. She knew we really didn't click, and it would make our gatherings better all around if we could find a way to connect. Never mind if I didn't hunt anymore. I don't even own a gun. But there was no way I could have said no. For the sake of everyone involved, I was going to spend the weekend up in the mountains in a little rustic cabin with Steve. With Carrie's encouragement, I got my mind right, and that Friday afternoon, Steve and I headed up a mountain and into the wilderness. As usual, our conversation on the way up was stilted. When we got to the cabin, which appeared to be pretty sturdy, there be it far from civilization, Steve headed inside without really giving me any direction about where to go or what to do, so I just hung out on the front porch. He came back out a minute or so later, carrying two rifles, and said something about needing to make sure if they were sighted correctly. I went in to use the restroom, and when I came back out, he was sitting in a rocking chair there on the porch. I sat in another and we had the first of what we proved to be a recurring themed conversation. He said to me, So, did you ever date Amber before you and Carrie got together? What an odd thought to ask out of the blue, I thought. Uh, no, I met Carrie first. I didn't meet Amber until after. He sort of grunted, staring off into the forest, and then he asked, What about after? Did you date her after? I never dated Amber. She's my wife's sister, he grunted again, still staring into the wilderness. Finally, he suggested that we get a move on, because it got dark in a hurry in the mountains. There was a split rail fence about thirty yards from the cabin, and there was a traditional bullseye target fasted to one of those posts. He asked me to go check that the target was secured tightly, so I did. Just as I touched the target, though, there came a booming crack from behind me, a rifle shot, and simultaneously splinters flew from one of the rails not three feet from where I was standing. It scared the living hell out of me, and I flinched so hard I almost fell down. I whirled around and glared back at the cabin, at Steve. He was just standing there, with one of his rifles resting on his shoulder, laughing. What the fuck are you doing? I screamed. Relax, he chuckled. Just joking. I sighted the guns last weekend. Shooting at me isn't a joke. It's damn reckless. He sort of rolled his eyes. I... I apologize. I didn't mean to make you upset. Just trying to have a little fun. Being a little off was one thing. Firing a high-powered rifle in the vicinity of somebody was something entirely else. I had just about decided to demand that he take me home by the time I'd made it back to the cabin but then I started thinking about the girls. This was going to be hard to explain, and it wasn't going to do anything for the bonding thing Carrie had hoped for. Still, bonding or not, 
it wasn't worth getting shot at. I found him standing next to the sink, preparing to wash dishes. I marched over to him, still not quite sure what I was going to say, but he beat me to it. I really am sorry, he said. I'm an expert shot. No way you were in danger. But I get that you couldn't have known that. I understand. I shouldn't have done that. You scared the shit out of me. I know. He rinsed a pot under the faucet and set it in the drying rack. I just felt that we were a little tense. We're not the best of friends, and our wives sort of forced this on us. I was just trying to loosen things up. Yeah, well... I could feel my resolve breaking. Before I knew it, my hand had found its way to his shoulder and patted it. It loosened my bowels. He laughed. You should have seen your face. That's how it went for the next little while. Friendly and jovial. We worked together on dinner. Steaks and potatoes. Nice and manly. And then he made a fire in the fireplace. I grabbed us a few beers from the fridge and we relaxed there in the den and took in the tranquility. He was cleaning a pistol. A large one. I think it was a forty-five. The conversation was meandering along nicely, like any normal conversation would. He talked about his army days. He'd done two tours in Afghanistan, but hadn't seen much action. He was earnest about it, though, and hearing him tell the stories made me feel a certain reverence for him, as I did towards all soldiers who'd volunteered to put themselves in harm's way for the sake of our country. He finished cleaning the pistol, then he loaded it. Then he set it on the end table next to his chair. It was about then that we heard a noise from outside. Something indefinable, but large sounding. He shushed me. Then he sort of smiled knowingly and picked up his pistol. A bear, he said. He probably smells our dinner, and he's come to see if there's anything for him. A bear? A grizzly? Doubtful. Probably a black bear. Grizzlies don't usually come this far down this time of year. This far down? We didn't feel very far down to me. But then again, I wasn't accustomed to this kind of outing. No reason not to take him at his word. And not that it really mattered to me. I supposed a black bear could eat me just as well as a grizzly could. It would just take him longer. Steve got up and made his way toward the front door, creeping along quietly. It sounded like the bear had made its way under the front porch. I could hear his claws scratching on the floorboards, and I thought I could hear him breathing, sniffing, even grunting. Without any warning at all, Steve let out with a loud yell as he banged the front door with an open palm. Like before, I flinched so hard I almost fell out of my chair. He opened the door and rushed down to the porch, which I thought was a terrible idea, Though it was probably true that an unarmed bear was less threatening than a Taliban soldier. And then he fired seven shots into the air. Get out of here, you crusty bastard! He yelled. And then he came back in and closed the door. He sort of paused when he'd finally caught my eye, realizing that he'd scared me again. Sorry, Jake. Didn't mean to frighten you. I know. I actually felt a little ashamed. I need to grow up here. He sort of laughed and retook his seat. Good thing the girls aren't here. If they were, we'd probably be packing up and heading back to town. No shit. Especially Amber. She can be pretty freaky sometimes. I could feel the mood change instantly, like the air pressure in the room had dropped. What do you mean? He asked. Freaky. You know, just freaky. She scares easy. He still had the pistol in his lap. I wished he'd put it away, like back in the gun safe where he'd put the rifles. On the other hand, there was a bear out there. What do you think she's afraid of? He asked, all traces of mirth having left his voice. I don't think she's afraid of anything in particular. She's just who she is. She scares easy. For that matter, so does Carrie. I don't know why I singled out Amber. Me neither. He sort of cocked his head to the side. Are you sure y'all didn't date? You and Amber? Of course I'm sure. Because it seems to me like maybe y'all did. This was bizarre. And it was starting to become uncomfortable. Where was all this crap coming from, anyway? 
Of course, there had been that time I'd been in the hot tub with Carrie and Amber back in the early days. We'd all been drinking and things had sort of gotten out of hand, but that hadn't lasted. After a few months, the three of us had decided that it probably wasn't a good idea for any of us to continue down that path. And besides, I'd never been with Amber back then by herself. It had always been the three of us. Well, except for a few times. Amber wouldn't have told anyone about those encounters, though. She wouldn't have wanted her sister to know. As far as that went, we had all agreed to keep our time as a threesome to ourselves. I couldn't imagine Amber telling someone she was dating, least of all the man she was going to marry, that she used to have sex with her sister and her sister's boyfriend. She wouldn't do that. Would she? She knew it would hurt Carrie if she did, and as to the four of us, it would have made it terribly uncomfortable, especially for Steve. Surely she hadn't done something so stupid. Surely he didn't know. What are you doing with my wife, Jake? Good lord. That was more than just offensive, as he sat there staring at me with a pistol in his lap. It was menacing. I don't know where this is coming from, Steve. But Carrie and I love each other. Carrie and Amber love each other. Why do you think any of us would do anything to hurt the others? He didn't say a word. He just sat there, eyes narrowed, staring at me. Finally, he sort of grunted, and then he reached to the box of forty-five shells and reloaded the two spent chambers in the pistol cylinder. The only sounds in the room were the occasional pop from the fire and the faint ticking of the mantel clock, which was partially hidden beneath the beard of a mounted bison head. Well, he began as he stood. I'm going to bed. You should probably try to get some sleep yourself. We need to head for the blind about an hour before sunup. Swear to God, getting to the blind on time was about the last thing in my mind just then. I was beginning to think that old Steve was a little imbalanced, and it was plain as day he had a bone to pick with me. Still, I couldn't imagine he knew anything about me and Ember. It was clear he was suspected, but... Surely that was due to some insecurity he had about himself, or about his own relationship with her. Surely she hadn't said anything to him. Surely not. I only sat up a few more minutes, thinking about everything that had transpired over the course of the afternoon and evening, considering whether or not I demanded that he take me home in the morning, as opposed to trudging through the snowy wilderness with him to a hunting blind. By that point, I couldn't imagine staying. Given everything that he'd gone on, it would have been foolish to stay. My biggest concern as I went to bed was whether he would agree to take me back. The mattress on my little twin bed was hard and lumpy. My guess was it hadn't been changed out in decades. At any rate, it did little to help me sleep, which was going to be hard enough considering that Steve was in the next room with a loaded pistol. I'd actually had the thought that I should get one of those rifles and keep it in bed with me just in case, but he'd locked them up, which, at the time, I thought a responsible thing to do. There were knives in the kitchen, but they would obviously be of little use in a gunfight. Bottom line, this was going to be a long night. At least I was warm. Sometime later, I'm not sure how long, I began to drift. I wasn't fully asleep, though, and suddenly I began to recognize the feeling the feeling that I wasn't alone, that I was being watched. My eyes flew open, but it was total darkness. I lay there, still and quiet, the hairs raised on my neck, listening. And pretty soon, I heard it, breathing right next to my bed. I fumbled at my phone in a rush and finally managed to turn its light on. Sure enough, there stood Steve right next to me still holding the pistol. What the fuck? I managed, flinching away from him. What are you doing? He didn't answer me. He just stood there with the pistol hanging towards the floor from his right arm. It was still warm in my room, but suddenly I felt cold, like a sheet of ice had just been dragged across me from the inside. The moment was completely surreal, but in it I began to know real fear. This man was crazy. He was thinking about whether or not he should kill me, and I was completely defenseless. What's wrong? I asked, 
trying to start some sort of conversation. Is there something wrong? Did the bear come back? You fucked my wife, didn't you? That wasn't exactly the conversation I'd had in mind. At least it wasn't the one I'd hoped for. Still, it was better if I kept him talking. I can't imagine why you'd think that. You had your little cock in her. You know what she's like, don't you? Steve, I don't know who you've been talking to. You're still fucking her, aren't you? He'd said that in a whisper, more like he'd been talking to himself. I don't know why, but that was even more menacing. Why do you think you have to have both of them? One ain't enough. Aren't they pretty much the same? Or maybe that's it. Maybe you think they are the same, and you're entitled to have whichever one of them you choose. This was like a nightmare. I couldn't believe I'd managed to get myself into this situation. That I'd allowed Carrie to get me into it. But I had. I started to say something else, anything. But before I managed another word, he raised the pistol and pointed it directly at my forehead. Not more than an inch from my skin. No! I screamed. Wait, 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 wait! Was that my voice? Steve, wait! Shut the fuck up, you piece of shit, before I splatter your brains all over the wall. I did as told, the best I could, anyway. By then, I was almost whimpering, blubbering even. I was trying to hold it in, but failing miserably. At first, every thought in my mind merged into a great ball of white noise, one where language didn't exist. But then the noise began to abate in favor of distant words. Words like terror and survival and mercy and guilt. When was the last time you were with my wife? He seemed inordinately calm. Maybe because he was a soldier. Did you suck her tits? Did she suck your cock? He couldn't know. He couldn't know. I kept telling myself over and over. We'd been too careful. He couldn't know. Surely, to God, she wouldn't tell. Even if she didn't care about hurting Steve, surely she wouldn't risk hurting Carrie. I swear to God, Steve, I don't know what you're talking about. I was all but sobbing by then, and my voice was barely more than a squeak. Please, please don't kill me. Please. He almost laughed. Good Lord, you're pathetic. I tell you what. Amber ought to be ashamed to let a little pussy like you put his cock in her. You really do need to grow a pair. Please, please. Please what? Please put you out of your misery? I can do that. Without even waiting a beat for dramatic effect, he squeezed the trigger. I heard a solid slap of metal on metal, and then I screamed. It took me a second or two to comprehend that the chamber had been empty. Good grief, boy, he said with a mocking sarcasm. You need to change your diaper, he laughed and then added. You didn't think I'd really shoot you, did you? He laughed again, then he started out the room. He stopped in the doorway and turned back to face me, though his seriousness returned and said, If you're still here in the morning, I think I will kill you. With that, he disappeared into the darkness of the hallway. I collapsed into myself. The first thing I became aware of was that my body was covered with sweat, and I was shivering cold. The next thing, I would pissed in my drawers. Normally, that would have been tremendously embarrassing, but there was nothing normal about what had just gone on. That son of a bitch was nuts, and I had to get the fuck out. He said he thought he'd kill me if I was still there in the morning. I didn't know much but I knew I wasn't sticking around to give him the opportunity. I got dressed as quickly as I could, fumbling at the button and zipper on my jeans. My fingers felt as thick as sausages. My heavy coat was in the den, along with the rest of my stuff. But there was no way in hell I was risking going out there. I gladly sacrificed all that crap to the greater good, which was making sure I made it out of the cabin alive. I put my phone, which had no reception just then, in one pocket and my wallet in the other. Then I opened the window, quiet as I could, and crawled outside. The window was six or seven feet from the ground, and I managed to stumble my way out of it. Quite painfully, actually, but that didn't matter. Steve's window was just a few feet from mine, so I was pretty sure he would have heard me fall. I scrambled to my feet and took off running. 
I thought about heading down the road, but that would obviously make me easy to find, so I headed for the woods instead. I knew there was at least one bear in the general vicinity, but somehow that seemed less of a threat. At least there was a moon. That, coupled with the ambient light reflecting from the snow, allowed me to see well enough. I didn't stop running until I made it to the edge of the woods, and then I crouched down behind a tree and looked back toward the cabin. At first, there was nothing. No sounds, no sights of movement. But that changed pretty quickly. The front door flew open, and out came Steve, flashlight in hand, and his forty-five in the other. He ran off the porch, and then he stopped so he could shine his light across the area. I ducked behind my tree, best I could, anyway, and tried to make myself small. The beam of light passed by me once, twice, and then a third time. Then Steve called out to me. Jake! Jake! You know there's a bear out there. It ain't safe. I couldn't wait any longer. I'd lost my nerve. I took off into the woods like a scared rabbit, not being careful about how much noise I was making. It didn't take long for the beam of light to refocus in my area, which only motivated me to run faster. Jake, wait. You're gonna get lost. There's a bear. I had the presence of mind to change direction to try to avoid the beam. I ran until my lungs started burning, and then I hid behind the roots of a large tree that had fallen over. I could see the beam of light shining through the trees to my right. Maybe I'd thrown him off my trail. Jake, come back. It's too cold out here. You're gonna freeze to death. The beam of light kept moving through the forest. He hadn't turned where I'd turned. He kept going straight and was headed past me. Speaking of my trail, though, I felt certain he'd figure out sooner or later that all he had to do was double back and find my tracks in the snow, and they'd lead him right to me. I couldn't stay where I was. I had to move. Jake, I'm sorry, Jake. I was just teasing. You know I wouldn't shoot you. I couldn't just take off, though. I had to be calculated. I had to make sure I was staying clear of him, but I had to work my way back towards the road. Otherwise, I could get lost, and getting lost could prove just as deadly as staying put. Jake! I heard him calling to me yet again, but then there was silence. And then came another yell, but with a different sense of urgency. Get out of here! You get it! His words were followed by three gunshots in quick succession. Get! Fuck! Then two more gunshots. Then a growlish roar, like that of a bear. And then a scream. It was a blood-curdling scream, too. Like nothing I'd ever heard. It made goose flesh rise up all over my body. Jake! I'd never heard my name like that before, either. And frankly, I hoped I never would again. It was ghoulish, like Satan himself was ripping Steve's soul from his body. I heard another growl, and then another scream. And finally, a scream that cut off right in the middle, like somebody had pulled its plug. I was mortified by it. Just like the rest of this evening had been, it was almost beyond belief but I was virtually certain I'd just heard the demise of my brother-in-law. And in spite of everything he'd done, it was an awful thing to hear. In the moments that followed, I came to know true terror. I was afraid I was going to hear Steve call for me again in some half-dead, terror-filled plea for help. He never did, though. Nor did I hear any more comment from the bear, assuming that's what it had been. And, of course, I was afraid that the bear was going to come for me next, and I didn't have any way to defend myself. Steve had a gun. Lots of good it had done him. What chance would I have without any weapon at all? There weren't just bears in the forest, either. There were probably all manner of creatures that would do me in if given the chance. What was I going to do? What in the hell was I going to do? Before long, I started noticing how cold I was. I was bone cold and I was shivering like crazy. I thought about going back to the cabin, but realized there was a chance Steve had only been wounded and had made it back to the cabin himself. I thought about getting up and moving to generate heat, but quickly dismissed that idea. I would be asking for death by predator if I showed myself any more than was absolutely necessary. Finally, and only after I'd come close to giving up, I thought about Eskimos. Eskimos. 
I spent the next few minutes building snow walls up to the sides of the fallen tree trunk and its roots, building a space barely big enough for me to fit inside. Once I'd slid myself in, I built up the snow across the opening as high as I could, and then I wrapped myself up tight and waited. I waited for some animal to find me, or for Steve to call to me with some wraith-like voice, or for the sun to come up. By then, I had come to realize that I was definitely not the master of my fate. Surprisingly, I managed to fall asleep. I spent the rest of the night drifting in and out of consciousness, fighting to go back under every time I came to. The night was long and desperate, but finally, I woke up and found sunlight creeping in around the edge of my little cocoon. I was excited, almost deliriously thankful, and I burst through the side of my fortress and stood up in the new day. It was amazing how warm I'd stayed. It was almost counterintuitive, like a shelter made of snow could keep me warm, but it had. Again, I thought about going back to the cabin, maybe finding the keys to Steve's trunk so I could drive off the mountain. But just like last night... I recognized the possibility that I might run into Steve. I knew the road was to my right, so I decided to head into that direction. I came across a pretty gruesome sight just a few hundred yards along the way, though, and it almost made me change direction. There was an area, maybe eight or ten feet in diameter, where the snow was spattered with what I thought was blood. Frozen blood. I started to give the area a wide berth, but something caught my eye from its middle. I walked to it, and sure enough, it was Steve's gun. There were also several large pools of frozen blood next to it. If the body was Steve's, I didn't see how he could still be alive. There was too much of it. Then, I noticed a trail of blood-tinted snow leaving the area, as though something had been dragged away. The trail grew fainter and fainter, and disappeared altogether, maybe thirty feet from where I was standing. I shivered at the thought of what had gone on there last night, but it was clear that I couldn't be deterred. I had to find my way back to the road, and then, somehow, to safety. I reached down and picked up Steve's pistol. I remembered hearing five shots last night, which meant there should have been one unspent bullet left. I flicked out the cylinder and dumped the casings into my hand. Sure enough, there was one unspent bullet. I put it back in the cylinder and closed it so that the bullet would be ready to fire. And then I started walking. It didn't take long, maybe half an hour, to make my way to the road. I was elated, to say the least. I hadn't been paying that close of attention when we'd driven up yesterday, but it seemed like it had been four or five miles at least from the last sign of humanity to the cabin. I was starting to feel warm as the sun rose higher, so I unzipped my jacket and started walking down the road. I checked my phone for service intermittently, and about an hour later, found that I finally had it. I tried to call Carrie first, but she didn't answer. I left her a voicemail, explaining to call as soon as she could, that it was an emergency, but didn't give any details. This wasn't the sort of thing you left in a message. Next, I called 911, and after a few minutes of explaining, the operator felt comfortable that she understood where I was, so she sent someone my way. It shouldn't take long, she said. Just stay on the road so they could find me. Assuming nothing else went awry, that should be easy enough to accomplish. So I kept walking, right down the center of the road. Since the apex of the crisis appeared to be behind me, and survival seemed more certain, I began thinking about what had transpired the night before. It had all started with Ember, with Steve essentially accusing me of having an affair with his wife. And he hadn't thought it was something past, but... Something present. He thought I was fucking his wife currently. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why he'd think that. He certainly hadn't heard anything from me, and I couldn't imagine a scenario that would have led Ember to tell him anything. Like I said, we'd been extremely careful, only meeting in times and places when and where we were as close to certain as possible that we wouldn't be found out. It would have almost been miraculous had either Steve or Carrie caught us which got me to wondering. Maybe Ember had given something away. Maybe she'd gotten drunk and let something slip. Maybe she'd accidentally called him by my name when they'd been together. That was hard for me to believe, though, given what was at stake. Her sister's love, 
but surely she wouldn't have been so reckless. Steve wasn't as close to Amber as Carrie was, nor was he as sharp as Carrie. That's when it occurred to me. What if Carrie had figured it out? She was closer to Amber than anyone, and to me, too, for that matter. What if it had been impossible for Amber to keep it from her? Or what if she confronted Amber outright and Amber hadn't been able to lie? What if Carrie knew and she'd told Steve? Was that even possible? Would my Carrie do that? Would she prime Steve and then send me up a mountain with him? Carrie knew I didn't like Steve that much, and she knew I didn't like to hunt. Yet she'd been the one who set this whole thing up. She'd been the one who encouraged me to come. Encouraged? Hell, now that I thought about it, she'd insisted that I come. No two ways about it. She'd wanted me on that mountain, and she'd stayed after me until I'd agreed to it. Would she do that? Would my wife, the woman who's supposed to love me unconditionally, actually do that to me? First I heard it, and then I saw the SUV coming towards me from the distance. Soon enough, I could see the lights on the vehicle's roof. It was my would-be rescuers. I looked down at my phone. Carrie still hadn't called me back. Why wouldn't she have called me back? I stepped in the road and watched the SUV approach, felt the weight of the pistol in my hand, and wondered what the fuck was coming next. My story begins in the summer of 2017. I've been working towards my dream position at work for over 10 years, and finally felt it within my grasp. Walking out of the interview for it, I knew I was going to be picked. They hired me two days after, and I've been working happily ever since. The new position came with a hefty pay raise, which was only one of the big benefits. The other benefit being a company house. I couldn't believe it when they told me. Nothing about the position description stated I'd be getting free housing, but I wasn't going to complain. I was sent the address and was told I could move in any time I like, or not at all. The choice was mine. Nothing seemed off or sinister about it at the time, and honestly, I don't think the company actually knew the history behind the area. I talked it over with my wife, and we decided to take it. They said it was a large house set back in the woods about 25 minutes from my workplace. We had just welcomed our first child not four months before, and we figured the space and location would do us some good. I hired a moving crew, got everything packed, and off we went. The day we arrived took us a full three minutes to even drive down the long winding driveway to the house. They told me it would be a house, but I would actually call it an estate. The place was enormous and completely set back on its own. There was an enormous flower garden in the path, twisting and turning with beautiful plants all around. A long greenhouse spanned the length of the yard on the left side, filled with growing vegetables that we could take and eat to our pleasing. My wife and I were in awe of the whole place. It felt serene, peaceful beyond belief. It only took us a few days to settle in, and I didn't have to start work for a few more weeks. The house was actually bigger than anything we'd need. Five bedrooms, three bathrooms, and an entire basement. It wasn't finished, but it was very clean and the perfect place to store our unused things. The whole house was eerily clean, almost like someone had been taking care of it for a long time. I thought it was most likely the company, waiting for someone to move in. One afternoon, while the misses and kids were taking naps, I decided to roam the grounds. I got my hiking boots, and off I went. The place was completely surrounded by trees and brush, but it was very kept. The greenhouse was glistening clean, and the veggies were delicious. The flower garden was wonderful and made the grounds smell great all day. I was walking around the corner of the house when I saw what looked like a small path in the trees. It was a little out of place, just a little dirt path that looked almost like an animal trail. I walked to the edge of the woods, and that's exactly what it was. It looked like someone had walked it so much that the ground had worn in its own little path. I followed it back a while when I froze. Before me lay two graves, dusty and dirty, with broken headstones. They were worn so bad that the names couldn't be read, but I could catch a bit of the date. 1862 to 1880-something. 
and 1880 to something. Why was a lone grave out here? Was there someone who visited it often? It would make sense with the amount of use the trail has seen. I was entranced by the stone when I heard a blood-curdling scream. Someone in the woods passed the grave. It scared me so bad I tripped over myself trying to hightail it out of there. I ran back towards the house and found my wife and children standing in the backyard looking for me. What's wrong? Why do you look like you just saw a ghost? They hadn't heard the scream, apparently. I wasn't going to make matters worse and scare them, too, so I told them I thought I saw a bear. But it was nothing. She eyed me inquisitively, but took my explanation. They went back inside to have an early dinner, and the night went by smoothly. The next morning, we woke up, and I decided to grab some vegetables from the greenhouse for breakfast. Nothing goes better with eggs than some spinach. I crept downstairs so the others could sleep a while longer. I threw on my robe and some sandals and headed out the door. As I walked towards the greenhouse, I heard something. It sounded like a low, patterned humming. Creeping closer, I could make out that it was a woman's voice, humming some kind of song. It was beautiful, soft, and almost mother-like. I could make out a dark figure through the frosted glass walls. I called out to it. Uh, uh, hello? The humming stopped. I walked slowly to the door and peeked in the entrance. I saw a filthy, ragged old woman looking blankly now at the produce before her. I took a step inside, and she cracked her head my direction, peering through me. She looked like she wanted to murder me. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I just froze. She screamed. The same scream I heard the day before. I winced and closed my eyes, and before I knew it, the screaming stopped. She was gone, and not a trace left that she was ever there. I grabbed what I needed and sprinted inside. I wanted to call the police. I should have called them, but there wasn't a good explanation for it. I didn't want to seem like a lunatic. I've heard the horror stories of getting pushed into psych wards against your will. No thanks to all that. I decided to brush it off. Maybe I was still stuck dreaming or something. I made breakfast, brought it up to my wife, and got on about my day. The grass needed to be mowed. It was almost the only thing that needed cleaned up on the whole property except the destroyed graves. I figured maybe I could clean those up too. I got the mower out of the little shed and was going to start when I saw an old man walking up the drive. He called out to me first, asking if I was the new owner of the home. No, I don't technically own it. Uh, my company pays for it. He cut me off before I could finish. Oh, I know your company owns it. They've owned it for more than a hundred years now, he said. I couldn't really believe what he was saying. The house was over a hundred years old. It looked immaculate. There's not a thing wrong with it. Excuse me, you said a hundred years? Th that can't be right. The house is perfect. Oh, I know it's perfect, he said. It's perfect because she keeps it perfect. She's the best housekeeper there is. Again, he wasn't making any sense. Who is this guy? There's not a house around for miles, so he's definitely not a neighbor. Who is she? Are you talking about the old lady I've seen around here? Does she still live on the property? I asked. Oh, she's on the property. But she's not living. She's the previous owner of the house. This was her home, along with her husband and child. Her name was Constance. The old man stood there for over an hour, describing the situation of the property to me. I had to sit down at some point, getting dizzy with everything he told me. The house was built back in the 1870s, around 1877 to be exact. Constance and her husband had just had a child and decided to build the home for their family. Her husband had more money than they could ever need, coming from an oil family. They had an amazing life until a rival oil family paid a hitman to take him out. One day, while Constance was out of the home, men came and burned down the home with the same oil her husband made his life off of, killing both her husband and her young child. Constance came back home to a destroyed life, shattered forever. 
she was so distraught that she decided to join her beloved family and killed herself in the ashes of her home. Others happened upon the family days later and decided it must have been a freak accident. They buried the husband and child, but could never find the body of his wife, Constance. Over the years, people forgot about the incident, and no one paid any attention to the property. Somehow, the house was reconstructed, piece by piece, to its original glory by Constance. Her soul, torn in two, anchored to the place she loved more than anything. That's who I was seeing around the property. She was angry, still, that others would take up residence in her home. Apparently, sometime in the 1970s, my company found the property, and was able to buy it from state. They paved the driveway into the woods, straight to the perfect home. I thanked the man for his story, and set myself on a mission. I was going to show Constance that we would cherish her home just as much as she did. I went out and bought some masonry materials and supplies. I waited until later in the evening and went out to the graves. I hadn't done much like this, so I had to learn a bit online before I tried. But I started to clean up the grave sites and put the headstones back into their places. As I got to the second stone, I heard the scream. This time it was much closer. I looked past the site, out into the woods, and saw Constance. She looked angry, almost floating there, her hair suspended in the air. It's like she didn't know what I was doing out there. Like she thought I was there to destroy what was left of the headstones. She started to walk towards me, then started sprinting. I was terrified. I braced for what was to come, not knowing what would happen when my wife and kids came through the trees. Constance stopped cold. She looked confused. My wife came up to me, kissed me on the cheek, and gave me our child. We stood there for a while. I don't think they could see her, but I did. I could see her demeanor change. She could see how happy we were, and then she looked down to see I was actually trying to restore her family's headstones. I gave my kid back to my wife, fixed up the second stone, and looked up. Constance had changed. She looked beautiful, and nothing like before. She had long blonde hair, flowing past a stunning maroon silk dress. This was the actual Constance. The one that loved her family and home just as much as I do mine. She nodded at me and turned, walking into the dense woods. I wish I could tell you that's how it ended, but it's not. I thought that maybe the nightmare of my story would be Constance, but it wasn't. It's not even close to what happened a few weeks later. When you're parents, you do anything for your kid and your wife. I know that. Constance knew that. That's why she stayed on the property. She wanted to look after her family and home as long as she could. I would do the same, I have to say. Anyway, after I had the last encounter with Constance, things were amazing for a few weeks. The job was going well, the home was working out perfectly, and I would see Constance occasionally around the property, sometimes humming in the garden, sometimes checking on us through the large family room window, never creeping, always just on the edge of the woods. It was nice, actually. I felt like we were doing right by her. She was wronged, and it's the least we could do to help her find peace. One night, after work, I came home to find the front door cracked open. Nothing too alarming. I'm sure it just blew open a bit. I walked in, and things were very quiet. No clinking in the kitchen, no TV in the living room, nothing. I put down my things and walked into the dining room. The table was almost set, but things were missing. As I walked around the table, I found my wife. She was out cold on the floor. I yelled for her, but she wasn't waking up. That's when I heard our child. I heard them crying upstairs, and some frantic shuffling in the same room. I lunged up the stairs and swung down the hallway into their room. I stood in the doorway to find a masked man holding my child, halfway out the window. He took one look at me and jumped out onto the first floor roof. I ran immediately to the window as the man fired a few shots behind him towards me. I ducked back inside, then peeked and saw him running around the backside of the house. 
I hurried back downstairs to chase him, my heart beating in my throat like a drum. I made it out of the front door when I heard another shrill, blood-curdling scream. This time, though, it was not Constance. I dashed around the side to find our child lying in the grass. Not a scratch on him. In front of me, through the woods, I could hear branches snapping, and the now faint screaming of the man. I knew we were going to be safe. My wife had woken up from the ruckus upstairs and outside, and had called the police before coming to look for us. She ran over and embraced us. Apparently, he had only knocked her out before she had time to scream so he could make his way upstairs. The police arrived, and we gave our report. I told them that I thought maybe I scared him off, and he left our kid laying in the grass. They decided to look for him in the direction I last saw him running. What they found was short of a horror movie. The man was impaled on a tree, about three-fourths of the way up. He had burns all over his body, like he'd been thrown into a blazing house fire. It took some poking around, but apparently this same man had been taking kids from different states for a while, and sadly, none of them ended up as lucky as mine. The police ruled us out as suspects in his murder, but I'm not so sure they even looked that hard into it. He got what was coming to him in their eyes. As night grew nearer, the police wrapped up and asked if we would be okay, or if we wanted one of the officers there for the night. I started to think about it when I gazed past the cruisers. There was Constance, at the edge of the woods, her hands looking decrepit and almost claw-like. They quickly went away, looking completely normal. She looked at me, smiled, and nodded, then went back into the woods. I told the officers I think we would manage fine. Things have been great now. It's been years since the incident, and there hasn't been anything major again. There was the time a rabid dog found its way to the property as our child was playing outside, but I'm not sure what happened to it. They just came back to the house after playing and told my wife and I that Constance helped them with a mean doggy today, and she wasn't going to let the dog hurt them. We smiled and got set to make dinner. We go out to the graves often, cleaning them up and plant different flowers. I built a nice bench for us and Constance, so she could spend as much time as she wants there. I was going to have the gravestone professionally refurbished, but she doesn't seem to like others out at the site. It makes her a bit angry, and I start to see the old Constance. And let me tell you, I don't think I want to be on her bad side again. What some people call lucky isn't so much luck as just avoiding disaster. In my opinion, that word should be reserved for events like winning the lottery or finding a lump of gold in your backyard. It's not really lucky to get an early diagnosis of a life-threatening disease, nor is it lucky to survive a catastrophic car crash, but people say that sort of thing all the time. Maybe it's a personal thing. People have been calling me lucky for years now, and it grates on me. I certainly didn't feel very fortunate after the accident. That afternoon was stormy, the clouds bruised purple-gray and pregnant with unshed rain. Thunder rattled the street signs as my brother and I hurried down the winding footpaths around the bays, our shoulders hunched in anticipation of the impending downpour. But instead of rain, something else came down from the sky. I'd been nearest to the lamppost where the lightning hit, but I don't remember a single detail of the actual event. My brother recalls a searing flash, then the stink of burning hair and the roar of thunder overhead. I'd been thrown ten feet into the road, and the next car stopped just in time, assuming there had been a hit and run. The driver was an ER nurse on her way home. He had administered CPR and restarted my seized heart. He was the first one to say it. You were really lucky I finished my ship. You were really lucky I finished my shift early. Otherwise, I'd never have been driving past at that time. Lucky. Everything hurt, but my right side was the worst. 
The lightning strike had arced into my shoulder as my bare arm grazed the metal pole, part of the currents running through me to the ground. You were lucky it wasn't your left side, explained the doctor. It could have burned a hole through your heart. Lying in the hospital in blind agony, I didn't feel lucky at all. The shock wave had impacted my eyes, causing the corneas to buckle and fracture. The result was at once horrible and quite beautiful. Milky, star-shaped occultions known as star cataracts. They were able to replace the left cornea with a dead girl's. They wouldn't tell me who she was. She was around my own age. And she wasn't lucky at all. She drowned in a river, trapped under a fallen branch. My right eye was unsalvageable. Damage to the optic nerve meant I'd never see out of it again. They offered to replace the cochlea anyway. They offered to replace the cornea anyway, to match the other one. But I decided that I liked the strangely pretty, crystalline shape of the star cataract. Even if I didn't call it lucky, it was a reminder that I'd survived being hit by lightning. My brother, Michael, forever blamed himself for the events of that day. It was his fault that we were delayed at the beach. He wanted to chat up some girl he liked, long after we were supposed to head home. I forgave him years ago. Most fifteen-year-old boys are at the mercy of their hormones, but his guilt lingered so strongly that I worried it had truly damaged him, that he'd never have a normal life. In a way, the accident hurt him more than it had hurt me. He was always there. If I moved houses, he'd turn up with a van, loading all the boxes, insisting that I shouldn't lift a finger. Every birthday was elaborate, and every year Michael offered to pay for surgery to fix my star-shaped eye. I think it really bothered him, seeing the cataract. Every time he looked at me, he saw his careless teenage lust staring back at him, overcoming his common sense, putting his sister in danger. When I moved to the other side of the country, he came with me. He uprooted his whole life quit his job, left his girlfriend, and sold everything he owned just to stay close to his half-blind little sister. In truth, I'd done it mostly to get away from him, to try and gain a little independence. But I couldn't tell Mike that. I suppose I reconciled it with myself that he needed to do something that really cost him, to atone for the mistake he had felt he had made. And I hoped it would finally free him, that such a huge sacrifice would be enough to fill the gaping, guilty void in his heart. But it was not. Looking after his crippled sister had moved from penance to pathology. It wasn't just about the guilt anymore. It had become his purpose. It had become who he was. I felt unkind when I thought that he was a little too in love with his martyrdom. And I felt selfish because I didn't tell him to go away but I guess I'd grown so used to him always being there. My right eye had been my master eye, and adjusting to use only my left had been surprisingly difficult. The lack of depth perception especially bothered me, and I really hated the sudden surge in popularity for 3D films. They highlighted my disability even more, and with right eye dominance goes right hand dominance, which was also a problem for me. The lightning strike had damaged a lot more than just my eyes. The sudden and powerful muscle contractions caused by that massive electrical current had pulverized several bones. My own shocked flesh like a vice. Comminuted fractures heal poorly, and I could never fully straighten my right arm, or regain much mobility in that wrist. Retraining yourself to be left-handed takes work and practice. My consisting on doing everything for me really didn't help. He took over to the point where I swear he would have wiped my ass if I had asked him to. After we moved, I embraced my inner bitch, and I'd yell at him to fuck off. To leave me alone for one goddamn hour and let me do things myself. He blamed the outbursts on my trauma, and would be so understanding that I'd grip my teeth in frustration until my jaws ached as much as my wrist. In truly dark and shameful moments, I'd wished he had been the one who had brushed past the lamppost. Sometimes I'd wish that passing nurse hadn't stopped his car. And the more people told me I was lucky, the less I told the truth. Eventually, the story behind the star cataracts became a mundane little lie. 
just a curious birth defect. My twisted arm, just the legacy of a clumsy child. Then one day, on a visit to the coast, I see something, and I see it with my blind eye. When both eyes are open, I see nothing. With the right eye, not even darkness. When I close my good eye, sometimes I fancy I could see something through the star. I try to convince myself that maybe a few photons can drift through all that damaged jelly, and that the optic nerve isn't as fried as I know it is. On particularly bright days, like the morning of our sojourn by the sea, I experiment. I stare into the sun with my blind eye to see if anything at all can get through. The day was breathlessly clear, the sky perfect and cloudless, blue as a child's painting. I sat in the warm sand and covered my good eye, turning my face full into the glare. Something flashed across the blank nothingness of my blindness, so quickly that I almost didn't register it, as quickly as a lightning strike. Jesus, I swore, dropping my hand. Mike was there in an instant. What is it, Brooke? I saw something, out of my bad eye, just for a second. His worry turned skeptical, brows humoring me with a frown. It was probably nothing. Random neurons firing. N no, I, I saw something. I turned away from him, conveniently blocking out his condescending gaze by covering my good eye. I'm gonna try again. Hey, don't do that. Staring into the sun can't be good for you, blind or not. Ignoring him, I turned my head again, just catching something. A fracture in the field of nothing. A hint of a light straight as a torch beam shining into the heavens. Tilting my chin carefully, I snuck up on it, triangulating it back into my field of view where no view should have been possible. And there, yes, there, it was like torchlight. But instead of a white line on black, it was an eerie, impossible reversal. A black beam on a field of nothing. I pointed with my other hand, it's like a light, a beam, shining up from the ground and into the sky, over there. Uncovering my sighted eye, I squinted in the bright sun to see where I was pointing. My finger hovered directly over the smaller of two islands in the harbor, just a hump of rock and sand, with a few scraggly bushes clinging to it. There, it's coming from the island. Mike squinted at the salt-blasted landmark and made a noise that was both dismissive and unreasonably irritating. I don't know what you think you're seeing, B. I could hear the quotation marks. But there's nothing out there. And trust the guy with two good eyes. Just seagull shit and a bunch of rocks. Seriously, Mike. I can see something there. I covered my eye again, peering into the blank gray nothing. And there it was again. The unwavering column of darkness like a negative flare. Okay, whatever, he shrugged, shuffling his toes into the sand. There's some kind of mystery beacon out there that only you can see. Big deal. We'll let the Coast Guard know and they can check it out. Or just tell us you're nuts. No. I sounded like a petulant kid, and I didn't care. I want to see what it is. You're joking, right? We can rent a kayak and paddle out there. Uh, people do it all the time. He bunched his hands in the pockets of his shorts, a sure sign of resistance. No, Brooke, I'm not taking you out there. I sniffed, snatching my towel and sandals. Fine, I'll go out myself. It was manipulative and I knew it. I could see the glassy panic rising in his eyes already at the thought of his crippled sister clumsily rowing out to sea, dashing herself against a dangerous crag of rocks. He took his hands out of his pockets and picked up his backpack, every line of his body a quandary. All right, you win. We'll check it out quickly, but then we're going home. The weather's turning to shit later this afternoon anyway. Come on. He held out one broad hand, and I grabbed it with my good arm, letting him pull me up from the sand. It was an easy row out to the island, though I didn't think I helped much. The two-seater kayak slid effortlessly through the bright water with Mike's oar dipping and rising either side of the orange hull, each stroke strong and sure. 
It was farther than I thought, the distance from the shore deceptive, but the fresh tang of the ocean smelled good, like a promise. We beached on a narrow rind of sand on the far side. Mike hauled the vessel up onto the rocks and tied the lead rope securely around one of the stunted, thorny bushes. Don't want a freak wave to get it, he told me. There's no way we'd be able to swim back. Of course, he meant me. There was no way that I would be able to swim back, life vest or not. But he could easily save himself if some rogue tsunami washed the boat away. My hand over my good eye, I scanned about for the mystery beam, and I found it immediately. It beckoned from the apex of the V-shaped slash of sand, cradling between rising rocks. By covering and uncovering my eye, watching it appear with blindness and disappear with sight, I could make out that it originated from somewhere beneath the ground. Whatever's making it is under the bench, I explained, and I started to dig one-handed, conscious of how awkward I must look like a child pretending to be a crane. Mike gave me a lopsided grin, something hopeful in the set of it. You're fucking with me, aren't you? Jesus, Mike, no. I saw something, and we're right on top of it. Either help me or shut up. Resigned, or more likely concerned that I'd hurt myself scrabbling in the hard-packed sand, he retrieved one of the oars out of the kayak. Here, this will make things faster. Just don't break it or we'll lose the deposit. We dug for maybe twenty minutes, slowly widening the ever-collapsing hole. When the blade of the oar struck something hard, I made a small and triumphant sound of excitement. It's probably just rock, Mike cautioned. Ignoring him in my blister, I kept digging. The circle of black metal sat on the sand. It was smaller than a shrewd lid and thinner than a dinner plate. Yes, it was obscenely heavy, and it had taken both of us to get it out of the hole. As we lifted it, the weight shifted alarmingly inside it, as though the object contained a sea of liquid lead. What the hell is that? I asked. Mike said nothing for a long moment. He stared at the thing we had unburied, wiping sweat from his shiny, shaved scalp. I stared at it too, but with my blind eye. The anti-light was still shining from it, dark and strong, straight up into the sky. The surface of the disk was neither cool nor hot, though the black metal should have quickly grown scalding beneath the afternoon sun, and Mike said he still couldn't see even the vaguest hint of the beam rising from it. This is starting to freak me out. My brother husked finally, his voice low and uncertain. Uh, maybe it's some kind of NASA black box, I wondered running my fingers over the slick, smooth surface. That maybe only special equipment can detect the beacon. Yeah, or only all their half-blind astronauts can see it. He was trying hard, but he wasn't even convincing himself. Maybe you shouldn't touch it. It could be radioactive. I flattened my palms against it slowly and grinned up at him. If it is, then we'd probably have lethal exposure already. Christ, Brooke, why do you joke about shit like that? My smile died. I don't know, I'm just trying to lighten the mood. Mike huffed out of breath, one short step away from picking me up and bodily hauling me out of range. Look, we're going to head back and call the authorities. Let them deal with the damn thing. He was already unwinding the kayak rope and pushing the vessel back into the sand. Okay, whatever. I hope they give us a reward or something. I just hope they don't lock us up. Mike shot back. I stood over the object, looking down on it, still reluctant to leave it just lying there. What if it disappeared and took the only thing my blind eye had ever been able to detect along with it? Uh, take a picture of me with it? God. He saw the stubborn set of my chin and knew we would get home quicker if he didn't argue. All right, fine. One pick, then we're getting out of here. He retrieved his phone from the waterproof pocket in his vest and aimed it at me, tilting it to get both me and the object in the frame. Okay, done. Let's move. One more. I want one with me standing on it. 
Hurry up, then. I stepped off the sand and onto the disc of black metal. A wave of violent static discharge engulfed me. The crackle and shock of it terrifyingly familiar. And then the beach was gone. Replaced by total darkness. My heart still beat. I seemed to be in some sort of cave. Though cave didn't feel like quite the right word. While my good eye showed me only thick darkness, the view through my cataract was quite different. Everything had an anti-halo, strange and wrong in black light. I could make out that the chamber around me was cramped and oval, the walls and ceiling oddly ribbed. Forcing my unused eye muscles to focus, I realized the ribs were metallic tubing interspersed with humps of tangled, colorless cables. Ahead of me, the mouth of the chamber opened into a low tunnel, its construction much the same. The narrow throat curved to the right and out of sight. A dull thump and crack right behind me spiked my skull with sharp, instant fear. My pulse a drumbeat in my ear. I stayed crouched for a long moment, then turned slowly, instinctively shielding my face. It was Mike. Groping blindly, he started yelling my name, stumbling into the walls. I hadn't heard him sound so panicked since the accident. I I'm here, I called softly, touching his arm. Mike, I'm right here. I can't see anything, he warbled, terror writ large on his broad features, eerie and distorted in the soft, hard shadows. I can't fucking see anything took both his flailing hands in mine and soothed him until he stopped shaking. It's okay. I can see for both of us. We're in some kind of cave with tubes all over the walls. There's a tunnel up ahead. A, a cave? That doesn't... Where the hell are we, B? I have no idea. But if we follow the tunnel, maybe we can find a way out. The passage was far too low to stand up in. So we crabbed along painfully, bent over double, shuffling, sometimes crawling. My voice guided him. Mike followed behind me. It took me some time to realize that the noise I kept hearing was his teeth clicking together as he shivered in the darkness. It was cold. Much, much colder than the waning heat of the spring afternoon we had left behind. Now just a memory, bright and distant. I could see my breath streaming in front of me, black as a cloud of ink in deep water, outlined by the maddening, impossible light. You just vanished, my brother told me, his voice halting and stuttering between shivers, echoing strangely in the tunnel. And I ran over, and as soon as my feet touched it, I felt an electric shock, and then I was here. What happened to your phone? Gone. I must have dropped it when it jolted me. The air tasted stale, flat, and expired, and I couldn't feel any breeze. A musty sourness choked my nose, as if old clothes, heavy with mildew, had been pulled from an ancient closet and puffed their invisible spores everywhere. My own teeth were chattering like cassinets now, and Mike stopped talking completely. Saving his energy as he thumped and groped blindly behind me. Just as I decided the tunnel was going to go on forever, that we would freeze to death here in the dark, the passage began to widen. It rose abruptly, leading to a large, vaulted space. There's a chamber ahead, I whispered to Mike, squinting back at the hunched, backlit shape that was my brother. His only response was to nod blindly, arms hugged over his chest for warmth. The floor and walls of our new, larger prison were built the same as the others. Whoever had built this place had an inexhaustible source of those monochrome tubes. Only their width varied, every few feet punctuated with tangles of cabling like the huge nests of industrial rats. Rising above us, the cylinders converged at the apex of the chamber, then appeared to have melted together. The silk puddle rippled impossibly across the ceiling, thick rivulets flowing down into a complicated umbilical mess. Neither organic nor plastic. I thought of intestines, colorless mushrooms, the eyes of snails, 
watching those smaller filaments branching off and hanging in the air. They moved and quested lazily as our presence disturbed the stale atmosphere. Connected to some of those filaments were fleshless corpses. I had no doubt these were genuine remains, and I was just as certain that they were not human. Each skeleton had two arms, but their bones were wrong. Too simple, too heavy, and too long. The cage of ribs, the cages of ribs were a complicated contrast honeycombed with holes, as if eroded by the relentless black light that crawled and spilled through their substance. None possessed legs or pelvis. Each strung bead spine splayed into a horse tail of flattened filaments, gray as six spittle and dissolving into the floor. I could not look for long at what had been their heads. Eyeless, jawless, smooth as a puffball fungus, each skull lollied on a neck, each skull lolled on a neck with too many tapering vertebrae. Hundreds of wires pierced the uniform domes of black-gray bone, needles through eggshells. The only discernible facial features were the twin slits of nostrils, each as long as my index finger. Holy shit! I clenched the words through juddering jaws. What? Oh god, what is it, B? Bodies. Weird bodies. All tangled up in the tubes from the roof. It's hard to explain. Mike's voice was broken. I heard the click of his throat as he swallowed saliva. Can... can you see a way out? No. Not yet. Straight filaments stretched and rose from the skulls of the dead creatures as I approached. Their languid stir like the autonomic response of plants. Faint black light flickered at the ends of a few, winking in and out like dying flashlights. The relentless cold had penetrated through to my bones, and I felt numb, my head filling with an unreal fog. Mike jogged on the spot behind me, his hands wrapped into his armpits. We needed a way out, and we needed to find it fast, before we froze to death. Reaching out to the swaying filaments, I touched a fingertip to the pulse of hypnotic anti-light, then snatched it back as a sucking heat flashed up my hand. Mike, over here. These things are warm. As I held up my palms, more of the snaky filaments lifted from their skull cradles, extending from their long-dead hosts and questing for my flesh. Warmth began to flow through me, such a blessed, comforting heat. I reluctantly drew away to prize the frozen meat of my brother's shaking hand from his chest, thrusting them into the anemone heat. But when that forest of alien hairs grazed his skin, their reaction was very different. Mike's scream of agony was a molten sound as they entered his fingers, burrowing slickly beneath his nails and deep into his hands. Black light bloomed around him like an alien flower. My equilibrium swayed as a queasy, sucking noise filled the room. Cables twisted and writhed all over the walls, revealing glimpses of other pulsing tunnels, then coalescing into purposeless tangles. But on the far wall, smooth as a camera's aperture, the animate's tubes dilated like a great iris, revealing a huge window. Sunlight streamed in, but cold and distant, our familiar star greatly diminished in size. A blue-white marble floated far to the right, lonely, tiny, beautiful, and terrifying. It was familiar from so many glossy space posters, overused in countless documentaries. I fixed it at the center of my star cataract, and my scarred cornea wept tears of black light. Mike bubbled out a groan from behind me, his arms blistered with tangled nodules, colonized by the parasitic worms of alien wires. Oh God, he moaned, his knees buckling. Oh God, oh God. The room shuddered, and the view through the window shifted faintly. Brooke, get out. Y you need to get out. Michael whispered, each word in agony, each breath a labored gulp. One arm twitched and spasmed, pointing towards an uncurling tangle on the floor. 
the deep black shine of metal coalescing into a circle raised from the boil of cables identical to the one on the beach. Mike's skin was losing color, draining to white, then no hue at all, and he fought as more filaments pierced his neck and cheeks, burrowing for his skull and the precious energy-rich soup inside of it. I can fight you, he screamed, his eyes welling anti-light and black blood, a spray of it as his hand thrashed from side to side. I'd fight anything for her. I can feel your thoughts like you can mine. I can destroy this ship. I just need to... Black light seared the room, bright enough to burn my star-blind eye. When it faded, only the wan sunlight from the viewing window remained. Picking out the white bones of my brother, lovingly tangled in quivering wires. A passing fishing boat spotted me on the little island, shivering in the sand, my hands covered in strange pinprick blisters. The disc was gone, and no column or black light shone into the heavens anymore. All that remained was a stupid, crippled girl and her worthless, one-eyed tears. They searched for Mike for several weeks. Everyone was hopeful to start with, so reassuring, even though I told them it was futile from the start. He might have been lucky, they said. You just never know. They stopped saying those things after the first two weeks, and the search became an exercise in grimness, as everybody had to admit we were looking for a body, not a person. And no matter how I told my story, or to whom, not a soul believed me. Just like them, you'll all write my babbling off as insane, as the trauma-induced delusions of an already compromised girl. For a while, I even tried to believe they were right. I coached myself that I hadn't seen those things. I couldn't have visited an alien spaceship. My kid just slipped on the slopes of the rock islet and smashed his head as he fell into the sea. They found his phone, but it was so sodden and corroded that the photos were long gone. Unrecoverable despite my initial insistence that the evidence was inside. But now, like the sea eating away those delicate circuits, any belief that I imagined it all is being eroded. The black light has returned. At first it was random flashes, like a stuttering searchlight in the sky. But as the fear-drenched nightmares of my screaming brother have diminished, the light has waxed ever stronger. The steady beam shines downwards this time, its steady gaze sweeping our planet, ever widening, gathering power. Tonight it is so brilliant that I can see everything clear and cold with both eyes, the right in grey-black, monochrome, and the left in vibrant color. I don't know what it means. I don't know what will happen next. Perhaps some of you will die. Your flesh instantly vaporized like that of my late brother. Or perhaps everything human must be sacrificed, living fuel for the unknown horror that lurks high above us. I think I might be able to see exactly what will happen very soon. Tell your loved ones how much they mean to you. Treat each day on your little blue planet as a blessing. You've been living on borrowed time for far too long. And your luck has finally run out. My mom's death came unexpectedly during a stressful Christmas season. At the ripe old age of 27, she collapsed in the kitchen from an apparent heart attack, leaving behind this world and her six-year-old son. I remember her arguing with my grandpa, though what they discussed was beyond what my young mind could comprehend. It's adult stuff, they simply responded as I asked. The three of us lived together, my mom, my grandpa, and myself. Seeing as my father left long before I was born, leaving nothing behind but a note saying he wasn't ready for children, running off and never looking back. In his absence, Grandpa had stepped back, taking his place as a father figure. He must have been in his late seventies by the time I was born, though none of us knew for certain, because he'd always joke about the answer whenever asked. 
that even with his advancing age, he never took a day off, always working to provide for the family. Despite the sudden onset of her sickness, my mom didn't die immediately. They managed to keep her alive for a week in the hospital, and they worked around the clock to keep her going, doing their best to figure out what had caused her heart to suddenly give up. She spent the remainder of her life in a coma, and I kept her company for as long as I could. My grandpa would take care of me while waiting for her to pass, making sure I ate and just sitting by my side as I held my mother's hand, desperately wishing for her to come back to me. On the day of her death, my mother briefly regained consciousness, only awakening to look deep into my eyes, staring intently into my soul as if she was letting me know everything would be all right. She reached out her hand, grabbed onto mine tightly, and I felt a surge of energy flow through my body, one filled with pure love and joy, making the hairs on my arm stand out. During that split second, our souls merged for the briefest of moments, and something that had existed within my mother was passed on to me. Then, as quickly as it began, it faded away, and my mother fell silent in her bed, an ominous beep filling the room as doctors and nurses rushed to her aid. They did what they could to bring her back for a second time, but in the end, she was a lost cause. Following her death, Grandpa took me out for burgers and a milkshake. It was a tradition that he started years prior, when he discovered that pretty much any time I felt sad, I could be remedied, or at least helped with a burger and a strawberry milkshake. Though it was just a minor act of kindness, one that couldn't ease the fact of my mom's death, it brought me a sense of normalcy briefly taking away the feeling that the world had just ended. Two weeks passed, and the funeral had been arranged. We didn't have much family to speak of, but my mom was a well-liked person at work, with plenty of friends who showed up to pay their final respects. I'd seen a few of them before, her boss, Mr. Roberts, and her best friend, but as a kid, I didn't feel all that comfortable around people who were essentially strangers, and it took me a while to get used to them. I stood by Grandpa, holding on to his hands tightly. As different people spoke a few words, I listened intently to the stories they told and thought about my own favorite memories. Then, as I looked up to see the next speaker take the stand, I saw something surrounding all the guests. It was vague at first, hardly noticeable at all, but as people got closer to me, I noticed a clear outline hanging around them, clinging on to each and every person at the funeral, like an aura radiating out from their bodies, varying in both intensity and emotion. While most were gleaming with strong, brilliant auras, spreading around the church with a sense of hope and joy, others looked darker, feeling more pitiful and empty as if their life force was simply lacking, or spread too thin. Among the weak ones, Mr. Roberts stood out with his pitch-black aura, his energy paling in comparison to the rest, full of despair and a bizarre feeling of intense agony. He looked miserable since the beginning of the funeral, but until then I assumed it to be due to the circumstances. Now, I noticed, he carried himself in a strange way, each step he took was a struggle. I turned to my grandpa, who also had magnificent aura surrounding him. He immediately noticed that something was bothering me, and quickly got me out of there without asking any questions. I wanted to tell him what I'd seen right then and there, but something within me made me keep quiet, as if telling him would be wrong, and that I had to carry the burden on my own. The vision faded as soon as we left the funeral, and my grandpa assumed the mass of people and that the somber atmosphere was just too much for me. We went home, and I thought that would be the end of it, until a few days later when I overheard grandpa on the phone mentioning that Mr. Roberts had passed away suddenly, and that he'd send flowers since he had meant a great deal to my mom. Even at a young age, I was able to connect the dots, and realized his horrible aura at the funeral meant he had been only days away from death. 
Years passed, and the vision had become little more than a distant childhood memory to be ignored. I started school and lived a relatively normal life, though a bit of a loner who kept quiet and without a large family. I was more or less happy. My grandpa took it upon himself to teach me all the important aspects of life, from cooking, washing, reading, and math to more personal issues such as love and respect. As an avid hunter, he even took me along once, teaching me about gun safety and such. After a couple of sessions, we both realized it wasn't for me, but I appreciated the effort nonetheless. For all intents and purposes, he was my father. Nevertheless, I kept calling him Grandpa, and he never seemed to mind. The next vision would come to me on the school bus. I sat in my designated seat and listened to music, just doing my best to ignore all the noise around me, as we slowly made our way to class. As I glanced up, I suddenly noticed the same beautiful aura I had seen so many years ago, now surrounding all the other kids on the bus, everyone full of hope, unique and magnificent in their own way. Everyone except for Lucy. Lucy suffered from leukemia, which at the time I didn't understand the severity of, my immature brain still not realizing that death could strike anyone at any moment, regardless of age. Her aura was weak, though not rid of all life force. It had definitely diminished to the point where she was standing on death's doorstep. Lucy was sick, and it had been showing for quite some time. Despite her illness, she kept her great attitude and eternal optimism though she was more of an introvert. She was well-liked, but kids are immature, and since her diagnosis, many had shied away in fear of her sickness. Knowing exactly what her aura meant, so I decided to sit next to her, just to keep her company while she slowly inched towards the end of her line. We started talking, and to my surprise, we had a lot in common. Daily bus rides together turned into daily lunches, and before long, we became good friends. During the following months, we spent pretty much every day together, hanging out after school, watching movies, talking about our hopes and desires. She confessed a lot of her inner secrets during our talks. That death wasn't something she was prepared for, and that she was horrified of what came after. Then she told me she'd never kissed anyone before, which, at the age of thirteen, wasn't a big deal. Neither of us had any relationship experience. But in her case, she feared she would miss out on a lot of important milestones in her life. It was through Lucy I learned that with the appropriate amount of focus, I could actually lock in on individual people's aura. Rather than just having uncontrolled bouts of my visions, which left me exhausted and confused, I could see each person's aura as I interacted with them. Her aura kept fading as the disease took its course, but... Despite the vanishing life force, the quality seemed just slightly better. Rather than just dull energy I had seen on the bus the first day we spoke, there was a glimmer of joy hidden underneath. And even though I couldn't say it for certain, I liked to think I made a positive impact. As her birthday came around, I brought her chocolate, flowers, and a dinner invitation, a proper date that had been part of her bucket list for the longest time and I fully intended to make the best of it. We ate at an Italian restaurant, and with our exquisite taste in food, we naturally ordered pizzas. The day was followed by a movie. Her pick was horror, which, for whatever bizarre reason, had always been her favorite. The movie itself wasn't anything beyond average, and as we grew tired and started leaning on each other, I felt truly content with life. I'd almost fallen asleep by the time the movie ended. And just as we lifted our tired heads and turned towards each other, a spark ignited, and we shared our first kiss. It was the purest and genuinely one of the happiest moments. Even when the kiss itself wasn't the best, being her first and mine as well, our friendship had over the course of a year flourished into something deeper. One of the most beautiful years of my life, only to be followed by one of the worst. 
Lucy never wanted to die in a hospital. In her mind, an unexpected death at home would be better than a drawn-out month in hospice care, full of suffering before her body finally gave out. We'd both just turned fourteen, and I'd come to pick her up for a walk in the snowfield park during a particularly cold winter. As I arrived, her mother invited me in, explaining that Lucy was getting ready for our date. I knocked on her door, once, twice, and yet she didn't respond. Having seen her weakening aura for the better part of a year, I quickly spiraled into panic. Without hesitation, I barged in to see her lying on the bed, looking as if she was just sleeping, but her aura had completely vanished. No pulse, no breathing. Lucy had died quickly and peacefully from an embolism, all while she waited for our date. Honestly, it wasn't the death on its own that haunted me the most. We'd all expected it, and thus made the most of the short time we had together. What truly tore a hole in my heart was the empty seat on the bus, serving as a constant reminder that Lucy was gone that I had once again outlived one of the most important people in my life. My grandpa was naturally just as distraught as myself, and as he had always done, ever since I was a kid. He took me out for burgers and a strawberry milkshake. We talked and laughed, and I admitted my feelings for Lucy, who had been my first unofficial girlfriend. But then, just for a moment, with all the emotions brought on by reminiscing and just mentioning her, it gave me another vision. I hadn't intended for it, but I unintentionally got a glimpse of my grandpa's aura, and I saw that it had rapidly diminished into a bleak version of its former self. Uh, grandpa, are you feeling all right? I asked as a reflex. He gave me a peculiar look before answering. Of course, kiddo. A bit tired. But I'm as good as ever. He said with a smile on his face. But it didn't feel real. There was something unsettling behind his cheerful facade, as if he knew exactly what I'd seen, that his time on Earth was a limited resource. Time takes its toll, and there's not a single person in this world strong enough to withstand its ever-present tide. Grandpa's once bright and fantastic aura had turned dull, and his time would come soon. At this point, I still hadn't told anyone about my gift. Not that it would have mattered, as death would always be an inevitable part of life, one people would rather keep as a surprise. Instead, I decided to spend as much time with him as possible, just as I did Lucy. Naturally, he was ecstatic to have me around more, though a bit confused to my newfound, clingy behavior. How old are you anyway? I asked him during one of our many lunches. I'm a hundred and five, he chuckled, another false number like he always gave. A few nights later, just as I'd fallen over the edge into the realm of dreams, I was abruptly awoken by sounds down in the garage. I carefully peeked out through the window to see our car pulling away from the driveway quickly leaving the street. I snuck down to see my grandpa had gone missing. I tried calling him, but it went straight to voicemail. Then I sat nervously in the kitchen, staring out the window as I awaited his return. Once a couple of hours had passed, I was about ready to call the police. But just as I picked up the phone, he came driving back, parking the car down the street, and walking the rest in an attempt at being quiet. As he opened the door, I immediately noticed something that should have been reassuring, but instead it sent a dreadful shiver down my spine. In the brief two hours he'd been gone, his aura had grown stronger. And not stronger in the sense that the quality had improved or even changed, but his actual life force had increased as if he'd gone back several decades in time. Where were you? I blurted out as he walked past the kitchen. I, he, hey, kiddo. I didn't realize you were still awake. He stuttered. I just went to the pub. Needed time to think. Didn't mean to wake you. 
Think about what? I haven't been feeling like myself lately. Just needed to get some thoughts in order. At this point, his mysterious disappearance gave way to a hint of anger. And what are you drinking and driving? Just a half a beer. I'd never drive impaired. He walked over and hugged me, promising everything was alright. And without any further explanation, he said he needed to sleep. Maybe I was naive and should have dug deeper. But at the time, I blindly accepted his explanation, and that was that. A few years passed, and my grandpa remained his strong, hard-working self. I, myself, had just reached 18 years of age, which meant I was legally an adult and had successfully sent out a bunch of college applications to be rejected while I worked part-time. Each year, I've made a tradition out of visiting both my mother's and Lucy's graves on their respective birthdays. I'd never felt like I'd gotten closure following my mother's death, with the doctors failing to explain what killed her at such a young age. I put flowers on their graves and... Spoke to them for about an hour, hoping they have found peace on the other side. Even without being particularly religious, it helped me cope with the loss. In the meanwhile, it seemed my grandpa had developed a ritual of his own, or maybe it was one I just hadn't noticed before. Over time, his aura had kept growing weaker, and as it did, he would disappear for a couple of days, at least once a year, blaming it on either a business trip or old friends, only to return with an aura as strong as ever. Since I learned to control my ability, I'd seen auras come in all shapes and forms, but never had I seen someone with a fluctuating aura. And with his biannual disappearing acts, I had started to grow suspicious. After some contemplation, I decided to follow him. To prepare for the eventual stalking, I kept a close eye on his constantly diminishing aura, knowing that once it reached a certain point, he'd leave on one of his trips. December quickly rolled around, and he made the excuse that he had to visit an old friend who had fallen ill earlier in the year. With my part-time job, I'd finally saved up enough money for a car, and in the snowy weather, following him discreetly proved to be an easy enough task. He drove a couple of hours over to the next town, and eventually pulled into a street leading to a run-down neighborhood. I observed him from afar, and made sure I parked my own car on the next street over. I quickly sprinted over to follow him on foot, while he waited outside the door to an old house. After what felt like an eternity, he knocked a second, and then a third time. Once the door opened, he was greeted by a man in his late eighties too frail to keep upright without the support of his cane and his aura just as feeble. He took one look at my grandpa, sighed, and invited him in. I snuck over to one of the windows and watched them walk into the kitchen. They sat themselves down around a table without speaking a word, and the old man poured them both a tall glass of whiskey. While my grandpa didn't touch his drink, the old man instantly chugged his own in one large gulp before snatching the other glass. How did you find me? The man finally asked. My grandpa responded quietly, inaudible through the window. And now you've come to collect what little life I have left, huh? Also, you can keep on living for another hundred years? He said, matter of factly, without the faintest hint of surprise or fear. Grandpa didn't respond. He just sat quietly and stared at the man. Well, I'm halfway dead anyway. No point fighting it. Any last wishes, James? How about fuck you? I should have killed you when I had the chance. The man said as he chugged his second glass of whiskey. He slammed his empty glass down on the table and stared into Grandpa's eyes. Get on with it then. After a short moment of intense silence and the two men staring each other down, my grandpa reached out his hand, grabbing the old man by his arm. The man instantly froze in place, and his angry expression was replaced by one of intense agony. He tried to pull his arm free, but his muscles were paralyzed by the grit. He could do nothing but watch as his own life force drained. 
Fuck you. He let out one last time. Within the span of ten seconds, his aura had completely vanished, and he fell over dead on the table. All the while, my grandpa's aura improved ever so slightly. I slumped down on the ground in shock, horrified by what I had just witnessed. Heartbroken by the fact that the only person I'd relied on since the death of my mother was a murderer. As I heard my grandfather open the door, I quickly ducked out of sight around a corner, where I patiently waited for him to leave. Once I heard his car drive away, I darted into the house to the old dead man's aid, frantically trying to call an ambulance. It felt like hours passed between dialing the number and the ambulance arriving, and be it out of morbid curiosity or the need to figure out how to prevent more deaths, I went searching through the house for answers. The two of them had clearly known each other, and if I was lucky, maybe I could get answers. His mail read, Gordon Lewis, which didn't match what my grandfather had called him, so I figured it could be a fake name. I kept digging, through closets, drawers, and wardrobes, desperate to find any information at all before the paramedics arrived. As I rummaged through his bedroom, I noticed a box stuffed under his bed, marked Charles Bishop. I opened the box to find newspaper clippings and several bundles of pictures. Some of the older, more worn-out photos were sepia-toned, and pictured a middle-aged man holding a ring-necked pheasant he'd hunted, alongside a smiling kid diligently holding onto a rifle. The date on the photo read January 17th, 1939, and the back read, Charles and James Bishop, First Hunting Session. The pictures were all dated in the late 30s and early 40s, and as I studied them, I realized that the man bore a striking resemblance to my grandfather. I grabbed another bundle that seemed to contain pictures from the 70s, and the same man, albeit slightly older, appeared in most of the photographs. It was, without an ounce of doubt, my grandfather, except in the span of the past 80 years, he had barely aged. Most of the newspaper clippings held stories about mysterious deaths and murders throughout the 20th century, while the rest were just obituaries. At the bottom of the box, I pulled out a much newer photograph, one with the date October 10th, 1992. I almost dropped it in shock when I realized I had seen the photo before. It was one of our own family pictures, just my mother, my grandfather, and myself as an infant. I quickly shuffled through the photos again to make a basic timeline. The man who had raised me, who I had called Grandpa, for the better part of my life, had to be at the very least over a century old. As the ambulance arrived with its blaring siren, I collected some photos from the box and met them at the door. A couple of paramedics barged in while the police officer started questioning me about what I'd seen. At a first glance, the murder scene didn't look suspicious at all. Just a heart attack that I happened to witness. A part of me desperately wanted to tell them about my grandfather, that I'd seen him suck the life out of the poor old man, but I knew that would more than likely put me in a psychiatric institution, and that if he ever figured out that I'd accused him, he might come after me. So I made my own plan to bring him down. Once I drove home, I snuck in through the garage, which led into a back room where we stored our hunting equipment. I grabbed one of the rifles, figuring that if I were to confront him, I should at least have the chance to defend myself. I quietly made my way into the kitchen to find my grandfather sipping on a glass of whiskey, visibly distraught. Without letting him notice me, I put the rifle down beside the corner and placed myself in the doorway, a safe distance from him. As he noticed me, he tried to shake off his miserable demeanor and quickly put on a fake smile. Hey, kiddo. I didn't see you there. Where have you been? He said, trying to sound casual. Speechless, I just threw the bundle of pictures onto the table. He took one glance and immediately recognized them. Where did you find these? He asked nervously. I saw you with that man, was all I managed to get out before the words froze in my throat. With the context provided, he didn't need to ask what I meant. He knew he'd been caught red-handed. I followed you today, to that house where you... 
The words froze in my throat. He stood up from his chair, wearing a worried expression on his face as he walked towards me. It's really not what it looks like, he started saying. Before he could reach me, I grabbed the rifle and pointed it directly at his chest. What are you doing? Stay the fuck away from me. I saw how you killed that man. I shouted on the brink of tears. He started backing away with his hands raised. Please, you. You don't understand. Just put the gun down. I kept the rifle pointed at him with trembling hands. As he backed into a corner, almost falling over. I saw the photos. I know how you kill people to stay alive. I said. He froze in place as I inched closer. How many have you killed? No, it's not like that. They were good people. I wouldn't... I... Whether it was the intense emotion of that moment, or if it was just the next stage of my developing ability, I don't know. But something about his aura changed. As if the hundreds of souls he'd stolen started to split apart. Enough for me to recognize each individual person he'd killed. Hundreds of lives sacrificed only to give him a few extra years on Earth. And though the vast majority of them were strangers I didn't know, I recognized the old man he'd killed. And I saw one that sent shivers down my spine. My mother. I chose them specifically because they hurt others. Please, you have to believe me. He began as I snapped back to attention. My mother. You... You killed her, I said, with barely a whisper. She, she threatened to stop me. I tried to talk her out of it, but she wouldn't listen. I'm, I'm sorry. He tried to approach me again, but I quickly pressed him back. Are you going to kill me? He asked in terror. I thought about it for a moment. A part of mine, a part of me desperately wanted to pull the trigger, to avenge my mother. Unfortunately, I couldn't separate the monster that stood before me from the man that raised me, a person I still loved and cared for. No, but I'm going to call the police, I said as confidently as I could. I picked up the phone to call the police, looking away for a split second. Stop that, my grandfather shouted as he grabbed onto my rifle, trying to snatch it away from me. As I tried to get it back, I pulled too hard on the trigger accidentally firing off a shot that hit him straight in the chest. He let go, and without speaking another word, he fell, dead before he even hit the ground. Following the shots, my memory went hazy. I vaguely remember dialing the number. The paramedics showed up along with the police. They asked me several questions, but in the end it was deemed an accident. And with the various aliases the police found linked to my grandfather... No charges were pressed against me. He had lived an extraordinarily long life at the cost of others. Whether most of the people he killed deserved it or not, I do not know. But I'm certain he didn't do it to better the world. As for me, nothing has been the same following my grandfather's death. Not only because I've been left alone by everyone I ever loved, but because as his life drained from his ancient body... Our powers merged into one, and while he knew how to control it, for me, it's something that always lurked in the background. I can no longer stay too close to people, because the more time I spend with them, the more I passively drain their life force, stealing it unwillingly as their aura slowly grows weak. Maybe I can learn to control it, or maybe this is my grandfather's punishment for killing him. Whatever the case, in a twisted turn of events, I've been given the choice between living forever, while those around me die a premature death, or to fade away alone. I've already made my choice. No one will get hurt because of me, so I will observe from afar, letting people know when their time is near in the hopes that they'll make the best of what they have left. In the end, it's not the time we're given that matters but what we do with it that makes life worthwhile. I never thought it would be the last time I saw my little sister. 
It started out as such a typical Friday afternoon. The bell rang, and we had the whole weekend to look forward to. We lived in a small town in Michigan. It was one of those towns where everyone knew everyone. One of those towns where you basically felt safe anywhere you went. We lived in a small split-level house. My little sister and I shared a bedroom, and my parents were directly across the hall from us. Our house backed onto a deep, vast forest, and through the middle of the forest was a river. The woods always provided a sort of natural playground for the local kids, building tree forts, playing hide-and-go-seek, and swimming in the more shallow parts of the river. My little sister and I felt especially lucky. The woods were essentially my backyard, and we really felt like they were ours. Our parents were fine with us playing in the woods, they just had one rule. Don't cross to the other side of the river. The woods on our side of the river were quite well traveled by all the locals. By age seven, you knew them like the back of your hand. The other side of the river, however, was much less traveled. It was our town's myth, a kind of our own scary claim to fame. The Mi'kmaq tribe had largely settled the area around our town so there were a lot of stories based on Native American culture. Everyone's favorite story was about the Wendigo. A Wendigo is a Native American legend, supposedly a half-man, half-beast type of creature. The rumor is that during a harsh Michigan winter, a member of the Mi'kmaq tribe and his hunting partner got caught during a blizzard. The tribe member partner died, and with no food, the tribe member was forced to eat him. Native Americans believe that Wendigos are born when a member of their tribe is forced to resort to cannibalism due to harsh conditions, such as weather or famine. And so, legend was born, and people began to believe that a Wendigo hunted for more flesh in our woods. Everyone from here has a story, that they would be having a campfire in the woods, and all of a sudden a deep, resonating roar would sound out through the forest. The belief around here was that the Wendigo would not hunt for you, so long as you stayed on our side of the river. The rest of the woods beyond the river belonged to him. As per usual Friday ritual, my friends and I filled our backpacks with our swim trunks, snacks, soda, and other trinkets to spend the rest of the day playing in the woods. As we were leaving, my little sister came running out of the house. I was thirteen, and she was nine. She was begging me to come spend the day in the woods with my friends and I. Normally, I would say no, but it was such a beautiful day and she really was not much of a hassle to have along, so I said yes. There were four of us, including my little sister and I. It was three in the afternoon at the beginning of June, so we knew we would have daylight for quite a while. Off we went into the woods, taking the same trail that we took every time. The trail led us straight to the river where we would set up a little camp and spend the rest of the day playing and swimming. A few hours rolled by, and we were pretty tired. There was not much left to do, so I suggested that we packed up and head home. Now, thirteen can be quite a rebellious age, the age where you start to disobey your parents, maybe act out in school here and there, try a cigarette, you know, pretty typical teenage behavior. Let's cross to the other side of the river, one of my friends exclaimed. In my head, I knew this was a terrible idea. Growing up here, you barely have any rules to follow. Not going to the other side of the river was an explicit one, however. Yeah, I've always wanted to do that, my other friend said in agreement. In my head, I knew this was a bad idea, but I also did not want to seem like a chicken in front of my friends. Well, uh, okay... I said cautiously. My little sister looked at me. Her big blue eyes were full of fear. I reassured her, telling her that nothing bad would happen. And so, we began walking to the point in the river where it was shallow enough to walk across. We arrived, and, I'll be honest, the other side of the river looked like an entirely different world. It was darker. It honestly just had this entire unfriendly vibe to it. I brushed it off that it was all in my head. It was about 7.30 p.m., and the sun was beginning to set in the sky, though we still had plenty of daylight. 
We walked across the river. It was about ankle deep at this point, and the water was frigid here, a lot colder than it was where we were swimming. I put my foot down on the other side of the river. For the first time in my entire life, I had done what so many people who grew up here feared to do. Just standing there felt uneasy. It really felt like we did not belong there. But at the same time, there was that feeling of adrenaline pumping throughout my body, and it carried me as we began walking deeper into the woods. My little sister was attached to my hip. I felt bad. She truly had no interest in being here, but also wanted to appear brave in front of my friends. As we got deeper into the woods, the feeling of dread increased. The weird part is, it was not what I could hear. It's what I could not hear. There was not a sound. Not a cricket, not a bird, not even the river. It was silent. Deadly silent. The trees seemed so much thicker in this part of the woods. And not as much sunlight came through, so it was definitely darker. Not just my imagination. We heard a crack in the distance. Everyone gasped. I could not reiterate enough that it was silent. There was not a single noise coming from anywhere. But then to hear that distinct crack, it made my heart skip a beat. Probably just a deer. There's tons of them in the woods, one of my friends stated. At this point, I wanted to turn back, but for some reason, we just kept going. The stories were echoing through my head about the Wendigo, about how foolish people over the years had dared to cross over to this side of the river, and how they were never seen again. As we continued to explore the uncharted part of the woods, another crack. This time it came from behind us. That one really startled everyone. We had all decided that it was time to head back. It was really starting to get dark. There was just one problem. This side of the woods was unfamiliar to us, and we were lost. My little sister began to cry upon realizing this, and while I was doing my best to settle her down, she was really scared. And I have to admit that I was too. The minimal light that was previously coming down from between the thick trees was now beginning to fade as the sun began to set. The darkness was becoming even darker, and we had not even thought to bring flashlights. The thought of when to go ran through my head time and time again, each time sending a sickening chill down my spine. We tried everything we could to find our way back to the shallow spot of the river, but it was to no avail. We could not even find the river to begin with. We heard a crack again from behind us. Then, a low rumble. A rumble that resonated throughout the trees. A gust of wind hit us from the side, knocking me back and knocking my little sister over. The rumble got louder, growing into more of a roar. It's a bear! screamed one of my friends. Another gust of wind hit us, this time from behind. This time it hit us in the front, knocking all of us over. Run! I bellowed, and we all ran, leaving our backpacks behind. I had my little sister's hand in mine, essentially dragging her through the dirt and leaves on the ground of the forest. I could definitely hear something running. Fast footsteps. They would be behind us. Then beside us. Then gone. It's the river! Screamed one of my friends. We all stopped as we approached the river's edge. It was too dark to tell if it was shallow or deep at this point. The roar returned this time coming from behind us. And it was close. We have to jump in, I said. No! My two friends and my little sister screamed simultaneously. Fast footsteps approached, a low growl, and multiple cracks as the predator approached us. Now! I screamed, and in we all jumped. The last thing I heard before my head sunk under the water was a roar. Inhumane, and nothing like an animal could produce. I knew what had just chased us, and I know how good of a hunter it is. My question to myself was, why and how are we still alive? The water was pitch black and it was deep. We were all strong swimmers and managed to find our way to the other side of the river. Our side of the river. Even in the dark, we were able to navigate this side of the river and find our way back to the trail that led to my house. 
The whole walk back, all I could think about was that if the Wendigo wanted us dead, we would be dead. Every legend about it speaks about how it's the best hunter, and once it tracks you, you are dead. We arrived back at my house to some very angry parents, scolding us. We all explained how we had just lost track of time, having too much fun playing in the woods. They bought all of our explanations. No way were we going to mention the fact that we went exactly where we had been told not to go our entire lives. I prepared myself for bed and went to lie down. It was hot this time of year, so my window was open. It was letting in a gentle breeze that felt quite nice, so I decided to just leave it open. As I lie there, I hear the sound of the quick footsteps again, accompanied by the low rumbling. My palms began to sweat. My heart dropped in my stomach. Had the Wendigo tracked us back to our house? As slowly as possible, I turned the lever and closed the window, doing my best not to make a sound. My little sister was asleep on the bed parallel to mine, and I did not want her to hear any of this. I shut the window and flipped the latch to lock it. My parents were asleep, my little sister was asleep, and I was the only one awake for this. I lay under my covers, noticing every little sound my old house made. And then I heard it. The kitchen door was opening. It made a distinct screak when it opened. I could hear it moving about our basement, knocking glass over, opening cupboards, the sound of fast footsteps below me. The fast footsteps became louder as the Wendigo made its way up our staircase and my bedroom door. The knob turned and the Wendigo was inside my bedroom. I shook violently. My hands clammy, my stomach sick. I hid under my covers as I listened to the low grumble grow louder and louder with each footstep it took in my room. And then... The same sound it had made as it hunted us in the woods. The rumbling had stopped, and the fast footsteps were gone. The Wendigo, too, was gone as I emerged from under my covers. But where did it go? The sun shined brightly into my room the next morning, and I hopped out of bed. I went downstairs to find my parents, sitting in the kitchen, my dad reading the newspaper and drinking coffee, my mom frying bacon for breakfast. Morning, champ. You must have slept well after your big day yesterday, my dad said. He was right. It was 11 a.m., and I rarely slept past 9.30. The same for your sister. My mom said. Why don't you go wake her up, champ? My dad said. I immediately ran up to our room. And to this day, it is still the most horrific sight that I have ever laid eyes upon. My little sister's bed was empty. Mom! Dad! Come quick! I cried out. They both ran upstairs. Oh my god, where is she? My mom said. She was already beginning to cry. We looked everywhere. She was not in the house. My parents looked outside, and within an hour, a search party had formed. They searched the woods top to bottom, but she was nowhere to be found. My parents believed that she had wandered off to the woods in the morning, fell in the lake, and drowned. But I knew why they could not find her. I knew why they would never find her. They were looking on the wrong side of the woods. First things first, this happened to me when I was around 10. I lived in Idaho all of my life and spent a lot of time outside or in the wilderness as a kid. My grandparents would take me camping and my older brother and I would always hike up whatever trails we could find to get a view of the sunset. On one of these occasions, something terrifying happened. We were up at a campsite I only know as Warm River. The river there never freezes over, and my brother and I were on a regular evening hike. There was an old tunnel bored through the mountain at one part of the trail, probably an old train tunnel, and we were walking through it when I heard something I'll never forget. After walking through probably two-thirds of the way through the tunnel, I heard a terrible screech at the end as we entered through. 
The screech wasn't like anything I've heard before. I've heard the screams of animals on dark and windy nights. I even think I've heard barefoot calls a few times. But never the metallic, grinding screech I heard that day. The point is, whatever the sound was, it did not sound natural in any capacity. I probably jumped five feet in the air when I heard it. And my brother shouted a few choice curses before shooing me quickly to the exit of the tunnel. At this point, my brother decided we should just continue walking and head back after whatever made that noise hopefully cleared out. We didn't have any firearms on us, so I was pretty upset. My brother reassured me we would be fine, and we made the walk back without incident. However, I didn't get any sleep that night. Whether it was the thing that screeched at us, or just my imagination, I heard things moving around the campsite the whole night, as well as whispers echoing throughout the darkness outside of the trail. I woke my brother up a few times to check out what it was, but he refused each time telling me that it was probably just other campers staying up late and enjoying themselves. The rest of the trip was pretty normal. We packed up the following day, and my life continued as normal. I was disconcerted, but chalked up what happened as harmless events that I must be exaggerating in retrospect. A few weeks later, I went up to Pine Basin, an old ski lodge my family rented each year for family reunions. Here, I would mess around with my cousins. Our favorite activities being night games. We would play hide-and-seek, a game called Ghosts in the Graveyard, and other games like that. In one instance, I was chosen to be the seeker for a hide-and-seek game. Because I was one of the younger cousins, I got a flashlight as an advantage. Normally, all the younger cousins hid close to the lodge, and the older cousins hid in the nearby trees or at the base of the nearby mountain. As I was searching near the bottom of the mountain, I heard a familiar whistle up the mountain a bit. It sounded like someone was hiding way up near a tree, known as the underwear tree, and you can guess why it's called that. So I began trekking up towards the whistle. As I climbed closer, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I continued on warily, and convinced myself that I would be fine. I hated walking in the night alone but figured whoever I found would walk me back to the lodge. As I neared the tree, I noticed that it was deathly silent. This alerted me that something was very wrong, because you could always hear the adults having fun back at the lodge. I was anxious to hurry back, so I called out. I found you, Scott. Come back down with me. I got no reply, but I wasn't planning on waiting. As I began walking back down the path, I heard a voice call. You almost had me. So I ran back up to investigate. I flashed my light in the branches of the tree and saw a monstrosity that was not my cousin. It looked like a poorly drawn stick figure made into a human with its emaciated figure and lifeless eyes. I remember its face looked like the skin on its head was being pulled from behind. It had torn and stretched features. As soon as I saw the creature, I screamed, dropped the flashlight, and ran back to the lodge. The entire time I ran, I was overcome by an overpowering smell, and I could hear the thing running after me. As I approached the camp, I saw my cousins at the bottom of the mountain, waiting for me. I was crying and shaking, and they took me inside. I told my dad what happened, but my cousins all said they didn't see anything following me. The adults kept us inside for the night and I kept hearing sounds drifting in from the mountains. I never played night games after that happened, and was always terrified that my cousins wouldn't listen to my warnings. Ever since that night, I have always felt uneasy up in those mountains. I used to be really religious and figured it was a demon of some kind trying to kill me or something like that. But those mountains have never felt the same after that incident. A few years ago, the game Until Dawn became very popular, and I watched a walkthrough of it on YouTube. When the Wendigo first appeared in the game, I got chills down my spine. It was exactly what I saw, and I did a ton of research on them. I figured someone must have gotten snowed in at that old lodge and resorted to cannibalism. But that doesn't explain what happened at Warm River. I still hear that screeching from time to time and it scares the hell out of me every time. 
I heard it earlier tonight, and that's why I decided to finally write my story down. Wish me luck. A factoid you may have come across while browsing the internet is that blind people don't see blackness or darkness. We see nothing. If you're sighted, you don't see darkness behind you. You just don't see anything at all. That's what it's like for me. I've been completely blind since birth, and vision's always been a very foreign, abstract concept to me. I've never known light or darkness. But that changed when I volunteered to be a test subject for a project named Erebus. I received a phone call last November from someone claiming to work for a private research firm called Noir Laboratories, saying they had gotten my information from the NHS. They were looking for subjects with varying degrees of visual impairment to test something they called an Illumifarious Chamber and wanted to know if I could come in for an in-person assessment. They were willing to pay me fifty pounds just to come in, and another thousand pounds for the testing if I qualified. I had my brother help me research them to make sure it wasn't a scam, and we came to the conclusion that it was a small but legitimate operation. It was a little vague exactly what they did, but their primary research projects appeared to be moonshots based on fringe science. That was, admittedly, a bit of a red flag, but it didn't make the prospect of a thousand pounds any less tempting. I figured just going in for an assessment couldn't hurt. My brother took me to the clinic as I had never been there before, but since I had no idea how long it would take, I didn't see any point in him hanging around. I assured him I'd be fine on my own, and I would call him when I was ready. In retrospect, that was a mistake. They were ready for me as soon as I got in. I consented to them viewing my medical records, orally answering a questionnaire, let them prick my finger for a blood test of some kind, and submit to an eye exam to confirm that I was 100% blind. During the questionnaire, I did hear a very odd sort of mechanical whirring noise. When I asked what it was, they told me it was only an old scanner someone was using. At the time, I just assumed they meant a document scanner. After all of that, I was given a one-on-one -on -one interview with a woman who introduced herself as Miss Noir. I stifled a chuckle at what I assumed to be a very obvious pseudonym, given her company's name and its mysterious nature. But I suppose there are people named Noir, so maybe it was just a happy coincidence. I've finished going over all of your information and test results, and I think you'd make an excellent test subject for Project Erebus, she said as I heard the creak of expensive leather upholstery from her sitting down in her office chair. I couldn't help but take note that the guest chair I was in was of much lower quality, which told me a great deal about how Miss Noir viewed her underlings and test subjects. She smelled strongly of cashmere, so I presumed she was also well-dressed, along with smelling fastidiously and immaculately clean. Her voice was fairly young, mid to late twenties, and she spoke in a properly aristocratic King's English accent. I suspected she was a posh little trust fund baby who had used her familiar wealth to finance this peculiar startup of hers. I assume you have some questions before you agree, I heard her say, and realized I had zoned out while she was still speaking. Uh, well, I'm still not really sure what the project even is, I replied, nervously fidgeting with my folded cane. A luminiferous chamber just sounds like a fancy name for a dark room. Hmm. Have you ever heard of anaconic chambers, Marissa? She asked me over the sound of her fingers softly tapping on a touchscreen. They're the most soundproofed spaces in existence. The quietest places in the world. They're so quiet you can hear your own organs move. Most people find the experience quite unnerving and can't stand to be in one for more than an hour. Electromagnetic anechoic chambers exist as well, 
but they don't have the same psychological impacts as the acoustic ones do. Our luminiferous chamber doesn't just block all light, it doesn't just absorb all light, but is literally a space where light cannot exist. Photons are still created, and survive long enough to enable chemical bonds between atoms and molecules, but are obtained so quickly that if you shined a torch right in someone's eye, it would never even reach their retina. Uh, obliterated? By what? I asked curiously. Have you ever heard of the Luminiferous Aether? She asked in reply, taking a sip of what smelled like saffron tea, and never asking me if I would like some. I... Uh, yeah, I think so. It's a discredited theory about light existing solely as a wave in an otherwise undetectable medium, right? I said uncertainly. Discredited isn't the term I'd use. Scientific theories are never fully proven nor disproven beyond dispute. They're merely adjusted to accommodate new evidence. She said with authority her teacup clanking against the saucer as she put it down. Ah, yes, of course. I smiled weakly, wondering what kind of pseudo-scientific nutter I'd gotten myself involved with. So, you're saying that your luminiferous chamber works by modifying the luminiferous aether so that light can exist inside of it? That's the gist of it, yes, she answered her chair creaking again as she leaned back in it. And as a result, it's the darkest place in the universe. Do you know the human body is luminescent in the infrared spectrum? That means no matter where a person goes, they always have light with them, even if they can't see it. But just as the silence of an anechotic chamber makes previously inaudible sounds quite noticeable, we found that the absence of any ambient light at all allows for the emergence of some rather novel phenomena that have hitherto gone unobserved. What kind of phenomena? I asked, suddenly concerned. For the sake of our experiment, I'm afraid I'll need you to be going completely blind, she replied. I waited for a beat for her to say, no pun intended, or no offense, but she said nothing. Uh, well, uh, am I going to be in any sort of danger? I asked. Not physically, no, she assured me. Psychologically, though, it's a bit unclear. All of our other subjects, all sighted, found the absolute darkness extremely disquieting and were unable to tolerate it for more than a few minutes. You thought you can't see darkness. You see nothing. And we'd like to know what effects, if any... A chamber has on you. Uh, and I'm not going to be exposed to any kind of dangerous radiation or chemicals or anything like that. It's just luminiferous I either? I asked, hoping I wasn't coming across as too incredulous. Yes, it's completely harmless, she promised. All you have to do is sit in a dark room for as long as you can, and you'll walk away 1,000 pounds richer. I pondered my options for a minute. It would obviously be the quickest, easiest thousand pounds I'd ever made, but what if it were dangerous? There was no such thing as luminiferous I either, so Miss Noir clearly had one or two screws loose. Whatever the luminiferous chamber actually did could very well be dangerous. But then again, it might not be doing anything at all. She did say that there had been other test subjects. And unless she was blatantly lying about that, then surely one of them would have notified the authorities had they suffered serious harm, or their next of kin would have if they had died. Right then. So, where do I sign? She slid me a waiver and non-disclosure agreement, in braille and non-braille versions, and after reading them, I signed and initialed wherever she pointed my hand. I've been told I have a doctor's handwriting, but just making a mark is good enough for legal reasons. Once the legalities were out of the way, she led me down the hall and to Project Erebus' Selimanifarius chamber. I was walking straight into it, and told to sit down upon a chair, 
without being provided any description of the device itself. I can echolocate a little bit, though, and I got the impression that the chamber was round, maybe a couple of meters in diameter, with a very hard and smooth shell. Once I was in place, Miss Noir slid the door shut, and it slid with a distinct hiss. That made me a little nervous, since it led me to believe the chamber was airtight, but otherwise, I didn't notice any change. I had assumed that it would be a sensory deprivation chamber of some sort, but I could still hear muffled movements on the other side. The voices were largely indistinct, but I did hear Miss Noir give the very clear order to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. The chamber started to hum, a very eerie, unnatural humming that wasn't quite like anything I'd ever heard before that sent a chill down my spine. And that's when things started getting weird. Have you ever heard white noise that you didn't notice was there until it stopped? I suddenly felt like something was gone. As something that had always been there but I had never noticed. Like a fish who never knew what water was until they were taken from it. There truly was no light within that chamber. And even though I had been completely blind since birth, I felt its absence. The perfect darkness that I felt enveloping me was creepy but not immediately alarming. It was an alien sensation, as I didn't know what to make of it. As it grew stronger, I increasingly got the impression that it was something abnormal, something eldritch, something that wasn't supposed to exist, that couldn't exist under the laws of nature as I understood them. And then I realized why this new sensation seemed so very frightening to me. It was sight. I wasn't just feeling this otherworldly darkness, I was seeing it. I, I don't understand how, but the first and only thing I ever saw was the primordial darkness inside the Illuminiferous chamber. I was horrified and confused, but also curious, so I didn't ask to be let out of the chamber just yet. I stared into the impenetrable darkness as deeply as I could, and the longer I did so, the longer I got the feeling that something was looking back at me. Now that I could see this darkness, it, or something in it, could see me. I took a sudden, deep, reflexive gasp, loud enough for my echolocation to let me know that the chamber no longer seemed only two meters wide anymore. I couldn't sense the walls at all. I thought this was because my brain was devoting all available processing power to make sense of this vision of darkness. People like me who have been blind from birth or young childhood really do have more acute non-visual senses, because our visual cortexes have rewired themselves to more thoroughly processing our remaining sensory input. Now I was experiencing the opposite of that, all my other sensations going numb as my visual cortex attempted to fulfill its intended purpose. It really was a cruel irony. I could see for the first time and there wasn't one photon of light to see with. When I most needed my remaining senses at their keenest, they were dulled as the novel darkness demanded so much analysis from my brain. I tried to fight it, tried to listen, tried to echolocate to figure out what was in the darkness with me. Instead, I felt hot, fetid, rancid breathing on the back of my neck. I screamed and jumped out of the chair. My only thought to bang and scream on the chamber door until they let me out or I knocked it down myself. But it wasn't there. It should have been just one or at most two strides in front of me. But it wasn't. The darkness I had found myself in was somehow far larger than the chamber itself. Terrified beyond reason, I ran as fast as I could, not knowing what lay ahead but desperate to escape from whatever was behind me. But I couldn't escape. It wasn't chasing me, for I heard no sign of pursuit, but I couldn't gain any distance on it. No matter how fast I ran or in which direction, I could still hear its ragged breathing behind me, still smell the odor of death and decay it carried with it. It was in the darkness, a part of the darkness, and I could not escape that darkness. It became harder and harder to breathe as the stench of the thing intensified, and eventually I dropped to my knees, gagging and retching, 
at the mercy of whatever was there in the dark with me. I unfolded my cane and started swinging it all around me in a last-ditch effort to defend myself. But it never made contact with anything solid. Who's, Who's there? there? I demanded, tears of desperation pouring down my cheeks. Maybe in response to me, or maybe not, it came closer. Close enough that my echolocation was enough to get a vague sense of its dimensions. It was an uneven, oblong shape about the size of a person suspended vertically about a foot off the ground. It was pockmarked with various orifices that wheezed out foul-smelling vapors, the entirety of its form expanding and contracting greatly with each labored breath. It shuddered in what seemed like pain with each exhalation, but was otherwise quite lethargic and sluggish. It was right in front of me now, mere inches from my face. I was shaking, trembling, sobbing uncontrollably. What was this thing? This bizarre, otherworldly, alien thing? And what did it want? Did it mean me harm? Or was it simply investigating an intruder into its territory? I just wanted it away from me. And since I couldn't flee, I decided that my only option was to push it away. Reticently, I slowly raised my hand and placed it upon the entity's body. Its flesh was soft and moist like kneaded dough, and warm like it had been left to rot out in the hot summer sun. It didn't react to my touch, so I pushed my luck harder and gave it a subtle nudge away from me. It didn't move one inch. Instead, I felt an eyeless human face emerge from the mass, its mouth hanging agape and askew. I screamed and fell backwards, trying my best to scuttle away, but still unable to put any distance between myself and that thing. And then the face started singing. It wasn't screaming, exactly, but a ghastly, unnatural-sounding wail that carried with it the slightest hint of harmony to indicate that it may have been music. And then another voice joined the chorus. And then another. And then another. It sounded like the creature was forming new faces all over its body, every one of them singing their soul-shattering hymn. More voices came from behind me, another one of the creatures emerging from the darkness, already with a multitude of faces to join in the choir. At least three more drifted in from the sides, and I was completely surrounded now. Their voices just grew louder and louder, and I clasped my hands to my head in a desperate attempt to block it out. They're going to deafen me. I thought, no, please God, no, I can't be blind and deaf, please no. Helpless, I lay in the darkness, enduring the acoustic assaults of the strange monstrosities that had accosted me, with no means of hope or escape. Mercifully, it seemed like the technicians attended to the experiment were neither ignorant of nor apathetic to my plight. In an instant, the singing stopped, and the darkness was replaced by the complete absence of sight that I had known all my life. My ears were still ringing from the ghoulish music, so I didn't hear the door open, and I barely heard the lab assistants as they tried to console me and help me to my feet. What I did hear was that same mechanical whirring I heard earlier, this time accompanied by a bunch of excited jargon that meant nothing to me. They were scanning me, and had scanned me earlier, and were perfectly fine with doing it without asking or telling me. It made me wonder if I hadn't just escaped from one den of monsters to another. A little over half an hour and a quick debrief later, I was back in Miss Nora's office. My hearing was back to normal, but I was badly shaken. I didn't fully understand what I had just experienced. I, I still don't. I heard Miss Noir walk in and smelt that she had a mug of steaming hot chocolate with her. This time, though, she put it down directly in front of me. That's for my personal stash. You won't find it in any shop you'll ever set foot in. On the house, she said, a soft hint of symphony in her voice as she sat in her chair. What the fuck just happened? I demanded. Marissa... I think I owe you an apology, she sighed. 
I thought that since you were blind, the effect of the chamber would be negligible, even non-existent. It seems it actually affected you more severely than our sighted subjects. Likely because you didn't have the luxury of confusing the darkness you were seeing with something mundane. But how could I see anything? And what the fuck was in there with me? I demanded. The darkness. The pure, true darkness created within the Illuminifarious Chamber is primordial. So fundamental that any conscious entity can perceive it. With or without visual sensory organs, she claimed dubiously. As for what was in there with you, that's a tad more speculative at this point. We think that they're made of some form of dark matter, a shadow ecosystem, and maybe even civilization composed of a kind of matter that doesn't interact with our own. We're completely invisible to each other, at least under normal circumstances. But when we create a space of true, primordial darkness without any photons, that appears to allow for at least a degree of interaction. Our sighted subjects, they experience things as well, but not like you. I think it may be because you experienced the darkness in a way that they just didn't. And maybe through some kind of observer effect, you and those creatures became more real to each other than was otherwise possible. I let her words sink in for a minute. Those creatures, those... Monsters I had encountered in the chamber, they were everywhere. We just couldn't interact with them. I had experienced something that was otherwise impossible in that chamber. Encountered the denizens of a shadow earth that I never should have met. Dark matter aliens. And you didn't think this was something I needed to know before I agreed to this? I asked bitterly. You said all I had to do was sit in a dark room. I, I could have lost my hearing. I could have been killed. Yes, it seems our initial risk assessment was a bit off, and we are willing to compensate you for that financially, she told me as I heard her flip open her checkbook. So long as you understand that none of this invalidates your liability waiver or non-disclosure agreement. I scoffed in disgust and reached for the cocoa she had given me. It was rich and delicious, and did calm me down a little. Even if I could somehow find a lawyer who would take such an outlandish case, or a court that would hear it, what chance would I have in a lawsuit against a firm with the resources to literally bend the laws of physics to their whim? Yeah, I understand. I nodded with a dejected sigh. Ever since then, I've been a blind woman who's afraid of the dark. I sleep with my bedroom light on now and always carry an LED light in my purse. Because if I'm in the dark too long, I start to feel that same warm, fetid breathing on the back of my neck. I think Miss Noir was right about there being some kind of observer effect involved in this. The shadow creatures and I know about each other now. And we can't unknow each other. This anchors us in each other's realities just enough that we no longer need perfect darkness to interact. Just regular darkness is enough for us to start to faintly perceive one another. Maybe they don't actually mean me any harm. Maybe they're as afraid of me as I am of them. But I don't think so. Maybe it is just because they're so strange, but I can't think of them of anything other than monsters. I suppose that one day... When the lights finally do go out, I'll find out for sure. I had a dream. I've been having it for the last week and a half. It's just me sitting in a waiting room. I sit and wait. Sometimes I call out, ask why I'm there. But I'm alone except for a vague shadow behind a desk. It never sees me, never speaks to me, never regards me. As far as I know, it doesn't even know I exist. So in this dream, I just sit and wait and wait 
sits and waits for hours on end. Nothing to do and nothing to see. Then I wake up. This morning was the same as every morning. I woke up. I wondered what the hell that dream was supposed to mean. And then I shook it off. I went about my routine, forcing my ass out of bed after hitting snooze on my alarm five times, having coffee for breakfast, and running out the door as soon as I got dressed. Today I was on the hunt for jobs. It felt like I had been hunting for jobs for an eternity. I used to work at a software dev, but the company executives decided my talents were too costly and fired me. I had a good chunk in savings and was pretty good at gambling in the stock market. But I wasn't going to live off my retirement fund for the next four years. The first few jobs were a bust. I knew from the plastic smiles, monotonous voices, and vague answers that none of them wanted me. They wanted some fresh college graduates willing to work for dirt pay. The fourth and last job actually gave me hope. It was a small office on a side street next to a cozy coffee shop and library. It was like something out of a cheesy romance novel. The business itself was named Hardgrove's Technology. I didn't even know what they were, or what they did. Walking into the business, I felt a hard wave of deja vu. The beige and white colors called to me, like an old friend whose name you couldn't remember. I sat down in a chair, still feeling like I should know this place. It was about seven minutes until my three o'clock interview, so I sat and waited, wondering what I would do here. At three o'clock, an elderly man dressed exquisitely walked out and said, Ah, you're here. Very good. Your name is Noah Ortega, correct? Uh, correct, I said. What's your birth name, good sir? He asked. I was concerned. Very, very few people ever ask that kind of question. Unless they know something about me that most people didn't. Uh, I was born Sierra Ortega, sir, I said, fearing judgment. Mm, I see. Well, Noah, I'm very pleased you applied here. Upon reading your application, I was almost certain you were perfect for the job, so I'll skip the normal business speak and, uh, frankly, the bullshit of a first interview, the man said. I thanked whatever powers that be, sighing softly in relief at the fact that he hadn't thrown me out when he asked for my dead name. The man continued. Now, the work itself is very easy for a patient man. I serve rentals to a specific clientele. These are very rich and very powerful people coming through here for my services. Your job consists of two things. You will greet them, and you will escort them to the second door on the right. And you will develop a facial recognition software to install on my security system. You may have questions. Do not ask them. You may have second thoughts, but the pay is $28 an hour. So if that isn't enough to quell your mind, this isn't the job for you. Any questions? For $28 an hour, I was more than content to stay quiet. I shook my head no, and the man said, Very good. I knew you were my type of man, Noah. I expect you here at 7.15 a.m., on the dot, in your finest suit. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I said, elated as I headed towards the door. The man said, Oh, and, uh, well, sir works, you may call me Mr. Hardgroves. I nodded and left. For the first time since I had been fired, I felt a glimmer of hope. Before I went home, I needed to go to a store and buy a nice suit. I had worn my nicest clothes for the interview, and I doubted Mr. Hardgroves was impressed by the attire. I made it home at about 5.30 and watched Netflix. After finishing Umbrella Academy for the umpteenth time, I went to bed. I had an alarm for 5 a.m. I fell asleep easily, easier than normal. I dreamt the same dream I normally had. I was in an office, like normal. This time, though, I knew where I was. The dream was in Mr. Hardgrove's building. I wonder if this is where I had always been, and why I had felt deja vu. I decided to ignore it. This job was the only good thing going for me. Some dream wasn't going to ruin it for me. There was one thing different about the dream. The vague, almost imperceptible shadow wasn't there like normal. I left home at 6.30 and headed to that small coffee shop. I wanted to know the area. 
Walking into the shop, I saw it was best described as cute. I looked around, seeing all the books and a small menu. A waitress walked up to the counter and said, You're a new face here. How can I help you? Uh, I don't really know the menu. Can you get me the best drink? As the waitress worked on the drink, she asked, What's your name? Uh, Noah. How about you? Ellen. Then she walked to the counter with a drink. I arrived at the office at 7.25 a.m. and walked in. I sat down behind the desk, nervous for the day ahead. Mr. Hardgroves walked out from the hall. He looked even better dressed than the day before. He adjusted his monocle and said, Well, you're early. Excellent. Thank you, I said. Mr. Hardgroves nodded and said, Noah, there was a red herring in my description yesterday. Before you began, allow me to clear our murky waters. I listened intently as he said. Majority of this time will not be spent behind the main desk. In the hallway, there are five doors. You will be in the first door on the right. This is where you will develop my facial recognition software. And there are specific notes on how I want that done. Under no circumstances are you to open the doors on the right. In the event of a robbery, you will escort them to my office, the last door. In the event that you cannot escort them, shout the word Kiwi. Any questions? The first appointment was scheduled for 10.30, so I started on the software development. The list of specifications was bizarre, but the pay was more than enough for me to build a database of body profile, hairstyle, and texture, and skin complexion. In reality, this would have been an entire head recognition software but I didn't care. I worked until 10.10 and then went out to the desk, awaiting the first customer. When the appointment time rolled around, I was shocked at who walked in. The regional manager of my old job. He didn't recognize me, but I knew him from the eight figures he made. After I escorted him to the room, I worked on the software more. The rest of the day was entirely uneventful, as were the next two weeks. What was eventful were my dreams and Ellen. The dreams were mostly the same, except the shadow returned, and the shimmering silhouette was of a different person. I ignored the dreams, though. Instead, I focused on the better things, like my fat paycheck and my date with Ellen. I didn't work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so I had a romantic dinner scheduled for Friday evening and an art date for Saturday afternoon. The night I slept with Ellen was the only night I had dreamless sleep. Saturday was when things went wrong. I thought I saw Mr. Hardgroves as we were walking back to my apartment, and when I turned around, Ellen was gone. On Sunday, I filed a missing persons report. There was no sign of her anywhere, and I was late to work Monday. Thankfully, Mr. Hardgroves was understanding of the situation. Monday night, the dream intensified. The shadow had been getting clearer and clearer, and that night, it was finally whole. It was me. I was the shadow. The dream no longer progressed as normal as I looked at myself in confusion. You must be the ten o'clock. Follow me, it said. I followed it, not knowing what was going to happen. It went to open the second door on the right when Mr. Hardgrove said, Noah! This one is different than normal. Please have him come into my office. Once we were alone, Hardgroves asked. You're here to sell, correct? Before I could respond, I woke up. Waking up was the worst part. I was standing in my kitchen, fully dressed and holding a knife. Work was the same. The times were the same and the coding was the same. I was close to being finished. The day after that was much the same, my dreams having Mr. Hardgroves asking if I was there to sell. On Wednesday, I stayed up. I couldn't take the dreams. I managed to stay awake for fifty hours before coffee could no longer sustain me. Falling asleep was a beautiful bliss. The dream was not. I was in a Gatsby-esque mansion at a party. There were rich and powerful people here. Many of them people I've seen personally at the office. Ellen walks down a grand staircase, accompanied by Mr. Hardgroves. 
He spent time talking to some of his clientele, and Ellen walked over to me. She gave me a hug and said, Noah, it's been so long since we've seen you. Have you sold yet? I don't know what to say, and I don't know what this all means. I said, uh, No, this, uh, this is all a dream, Ellen. I'm not here. You're not here. And, my God, it makes me feel like I'm losing my mind. What do you mean, silly? She asked. Her questions seemed to stop all conversation, and most of the guests turned to stare at me before I woke up. Over the weekend, I spent most of my time trying to find Ellen. It was mostly a waste of time, like she had simply vanished into thin air, and not even the security cameras outside the business could tell where she went. At one minute she was there, the next she was gone. A Monday came, as it always did, and I was at the office again. Mr. Hardgroves walked out of his office and asked, Noah, my boy, I hosted a party on Saturday. It was a private matter, and someone who looked much like you crashed the ordeal. Was it you? I realized in fear that whatever I had experienced was not a dream. I, I don't think so, I said, very unsure of myself. My boy, you look like you've seen a ghost. Are you okay? I decided then that if anyone could help me, it'd probably be the man with the most money. No. I've been having these dreams. Normally, it's me in this office. At first, it was just me, alone with a sort of shadow. After I started working, the shadow changed, and eventually, it was me. For the last week, a fake me escorted me to your office, where he asked me if I'm planning on selling. Last Saturday, I dreamt I was at a mansion, attending a party with many of your clients. Mr. Hargrove said. Hmm, very strange. This seems quite inexplicable. You have not entered any of the doors on the left, right? Uh, no, I replied. Mr. Hargrove seemed genuinely concerned and said softly, Well, my boy, your health is more important than one day of work. Take the day, and tomorrow come in around ten. We will work this mess out. As soon as I got home, I fell asleep. I didn't feel tired on the drive, but as soon as my door closed, I was out. I had yet another dream. I was in the office, but I blinked, and when my eyes opened, I was in a completely different place. It was a room full of mirrors, and there were several reflections of me, each looking slightly different. There were two that were incredibly uncanny. To my left was me, except I had never transitioned. Sobbing, he raised a knife and blood spilled. I looked away from the mirror in horror. The mirror I was looking at now was just like me, with a different Mr. Hardgrove's. This one looked sinister, menacing. The polar opposite of the old, yet kind Mr. Hardgrove's I knew. The fake Mr. Hardgrove's tried to say something, but I couldn't hear it. As he tried to speak, there was a rattling as if something was trying to pierce the veil between the worlds that separated us. Suddenly, he shook his fist in anger, nearly hitting the fake me with its plastic face. I awoke suddenly to Mr. Hardgrove's shaking me and saying, Noah, my boy, wake up! Get up, please! My eyes fluttered open weakly, and I took a breath. My lungs burnt and my head ached as if I had been choking. After the first few breaths, I was conscious enough to know that I was in the office. I looked around bewildered and tripped over my tongue as I asked, How? How did I get here? Mr. Hardgrove shook his head and said, I don't know. It's horridly early for you. At 4 a.m. You may have sleepwalked, but regardless, I must know, were you in the mirror room? I was about to answer when I saw the reflection of myself I had seen in my dreams. I shook in fear as I pointed and asked, Who is this? Mr. Hardgroves looked where my finger was and asked, Who? Then he asked again, Did you dream you were in a room of mirrors? I nodded and asked, What is happening to me? 
Mr. Hardgrove sighed and said, My business is complicated, and what my clients rent is more time from alternate universes. The mirror rooms are how I can connect to these other worlds. Your dreams have taken place in these other worlds. As malevolent entities try to get out, they reach to take anyone's place. Most people would have lost it within a few days, but I knew you had a spark within you. The other Hardgroves walked out and said, Noah, this man, he leads you to danger. He expected you to sell your sanity for a hopeless scheme. Don't listen to him. Go into the second door on the right. Relieve yourself of this life. Free yourself of this nightmare. I looked to the Hardgroves I knew and said, "Uh, Why didn't you tell me? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Mr. Hargrove said, The rich and the elites are fools. Complete fucking idiots. They will get what I sell with or without me. This prevents immeasurable harm from coming on to others. But as you see, there is a price. Fix me, please. I begged with my raggedy voice. Hargroves was silent. I knew he wouldn't have a solution. Every part of me hurt, though, as if I was being stabbed by a million needles a hundred times each second. The other Hargroves said, I can offer you a relief to the pain. Go to the room. I looked at the tangible Hargroves and asked, What happens if I go to the room? He replied, Immeasurable suffering will be brought to others. The intangible Hardgrove said, All you have to do is say yes, and I will guarantee your relief. I looked to my Hardgroves, the kindred yet eccentric man, the liar who cursed me with ultimate suffering, the bastard who cursed me to lose my mind. Then I looked to the cold and malicious Mr. Hardgroves who had haunted my sleep. I was going to refuse, to resist, As the pain climbs to levels that not even Satan could create, I cried, Yes. Mr. Hargroves was slammed against the wall by his mirror-born counterpart, and I forced myself to crawl down the hallway. No. Noah, my boy, please don't. You don't know what you're doing. Whoever sent you to this is lying to you. The mirror room will only give you horrors and hell. I don't want that for you, Hargroves shouted. His pleas fell on deaf ears as I crawled, seeking relief from the pain. I opened the door and saw the fake me, waiting, sitting. It pulled a phone from its pocket. I got the message and pulled mine out. I saw an entire story written. A story about me, from the day I got the job until this very moment. The end of the story were my instructions. I followed them to the letter. I ignored Mr. Hardgroves. He pounded on the door and begged. I ignored him. I stopped reading. I pressed post and I followed the rest of the instructions. I posted the story, cut my thumb and smeared the mirror. I say my name five times, close my eyes and jump into the mirror. I take my rightful place and let the real me shine. Nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong. I'm sure you know that the world is full of terrible things. Things that if you were by chance encounter, would kill you with the same ease that you would kill an insect. The fact that humanity is a fairly weak and inconsequential species is a strange and paradoxical fact. On some level, we all know it, and yet... If the full truth of the matter goes out there, there will be no doubt be mass hysteria. People are afraid enough as it is, given the state of the world today, and I don't believe that making them aware of gods and monsters will improve the situation. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Robert Marsh, and as you might have guessed, I've had a bit more exposure to the supernatural than most. 
I've spent a significant portion of the past 500 years researching it for my own purposes. As for what ignited my interest in the supernatural, that would be vampirism. Long ago, a man I once knew saw fit to curse me with undeath, and since then I have been burdened with eternity, a life without end. It wasn't long after I became a vampire that I decided I might as well use my new time and learn all I could about my new condition, which led me down the rabbit hole of the supernatural. I've cavorted with fey, gods, spirits, and mystics, among other things, over the years. I've learned secrets that could bring civilization itself to its knees, and I suppose all that knowledge was what got the attention of the FRB. I've heard of the International Fey Relations Bureau, known to most as the FRB, prior to their initial approach of me. I thought very little of them at the time which should not be interpreted as, I thought poorly of them. I simply regarded them as another group of idealists hoping to foster a better relationship between humanity and other non-human entities. While it seemed a noble cause, I'd seen their like rise and fall before, and was ready to dismiss them as nothing more than another group of well-meaning, yet doomed fools. That was until I actually met them, at least. The year was 1985, and I was living in Rome, Italy. My life was quiet, and more or less peaceful. By day, I worked in sales for a moderately sized company. Not the most exciting career for an entity such as myself, but money is a necessity to survive, and with it, I was able to live a modest life in relative comfort. Every few nights, I would go to the more expensive bars, and when a woman caught my fancy, I would make her my companion for the evening. Usually we would drink and move between bars before we retired together for the evening. While my nighttime companions were often beautiful, I was never one to overstep boundaries. Sometimes our brief relationships would grow more intimate. Other times we would simply part ways after I'd taken what I needed. An unfortunate side effect of being a vampire is that I need blood to survive. Many details regarding my kind are simple mythology. Fatal weakness to sunlight, the ability to shapeshift, and a fear of silver or crucifixes. However, our thirst for blood is all too real. I've never enjoyed taking a life, and while I could easily drain the blood from a person if I so wished, I can survive on lighter, albeit more frequent, meals. My nighttime companions were usually too drunk to remember what I'd taken, and I always took care to ensure their wounds were dressed before I left them. In my long life, I have only had to claim a handful of lives, and I assure you that most of those were in self-defense. The FRB contacted me on one of my nights out. I had visited a lovely little bar that I liked to frequent, and ordered myself the usual glass of red wine as I surveyed the other visitors. Most had come in pairs or groups. I was looking for the loners, much like myself, someone I could befriend for the evening. Male or female, it didn't matter to me. What I spotted was a young woman in a tight black dress, sitting by the bar. She was alone and quite lovely to behold. She looked disinterested in the world around her, and the empty glasses by her side told me that she was looking to get drunk. I knew her kind. I waved the bartender over and gave him my instructions. Get her another drink, on me, I said, and the bartender nodded before going off to do just that. I watched as he served her her drink, and just as I'd expected, she looked over at me. I raised my glass to toast her, and she raised hers in turn, before taking a long sip. I took that as my invitation to go over. Mind if I join you? I asked. Not at all, Mr. Marshall, she replied, and I paused. I very rarely gave out the name I was currently living under to strangers, but she seems to know it instinctively. I caught a wary smile on her lips as she polished off her drink. You can sit down. I'm here to talk, 
not to pick a fight, she said. I hesitated for a moment before taking her up on her offer. All right, I said. Let's talk then. I know you're out to feed tonight, so I won't take up too much of your time, she promised. I have to make sure I got your attention, though. And you do have a type, Mr. Marsh. A single man should be allowed the pleasure of pleasant company if he so chooses, I reply. Of course, of course. I didn't mean to imply otherwise, the woman said. Here, let me just clear the air. My name is Amanda Spector. I'm with the International Fay Relations Bureau. My eyebrows quirked slightly. You're familiar with us, she asked. The name has come up before, yes. What exactly do you want with me? Word on the street is you've been around the block. Seen a lot, done a lot. I must have taught you a lot, too. If you're looking for information, there are more knowledgeable creatures out there, Miss Spencer. I know. We've even gone so far as to employ some of them. The FRB's interest in you is a little more hands-on. Sitting behind a desk doesn't suit you, Mr. Marsh. And what exactly is that interest? Public safety, she replied. The FRB is young, but we aren't stupid. Not everything out there wants peace, and there's countless things that just don't give a damn. To that end, they've started to put together a little subdivision. Most of our recruits so far are human, and while they've gone well enough, the higher-ups are in agreement that we could use something a little more familiar with these matters. So what? You're recruiting me into your secret police? I scoffed. I took another sip of my red wine. Hardly. The Department of Public Safety is meant to protect people from the things out there that pose a threat. Ghouls, rogue vampires, and sirens. Things that could cause some damage if left unchecked. I don't need to tell you that there are more and more incidents every day, and if these things get out, the FRB is toast. I'm recruiting you to protect people. I swirled the wine in my glass thoughtfully. And it ends at monsters and rogues, correct? I asked. I looked over at her. If that's what you're asking, then I'll consider it. But I'm not an assassin, Miss Spencer. I'm not looking for one. I'm looking for a guardian, she replied. There was something in her eyes that made me believe her. Desperation. Sincerity. I'm still not sure which. I finished my glass and stood up. I'll think about it, I said. That's all I ask, she replied, and set a business card on the table. When you're ready to start, give me a call. I pocketed the card and she tipped me one final smile before I left. I had no intention of ever calling her, but the words she said lingered in my mind. I can't say I had much faith in the FRB, but if nothing else, I respected their interactions, and I suppose that was enough. I called Spectre at dawn the next day, and I never looked back. My orientation within the FRB did not last long. Technically speaking, I already had centuries of experience in the field, so the biggest thing to adjust to was the new system. It wasn't long before I received my first assignments and was out in the field working for them. The briefing said that there had been an attack on a small cottage just north of Naples. A family had been killed by something that had come out of the woods, presumably by a ghoul, judging by the description of the carnage it had inflicted. Ghouls are particularly nasty creatures. Stripped of their humanity by inhuman powers, all that remains of them are pale, malformed tusks who only think about their next meal, whatever that may be. They are gruesome creatures who often run afoul of civilization, and the act of killing them is a mercy. I have been instructed to visit a certain restaurant two kilometers away from the site of the attack. It was there that I would meet my soon-to-be partner, Gustav Hauser. Gustav was a short and stocky man, although much of his bulk seemed to be muscle. 
His skin was pale and his eyes were a cold blue. He wore his long brown hair down to a ponytail. I recognized him on sight as he entered the restaurant, and he seemed to pick me out of the modest lunch crowd immediately. The moment he laid eyes on me, he regarded me with an intensity that made me slightly uneasy. I knew disgust when I saw it, but I pretended to ignore it in favor of at least attempting to begin a proper working relationship. You're the vampire, he asked as he sat down across from me. Just call me Marshall, I replied. Uh, Mr. Hauser, I presume. Gustav, he corrected. I assume you've been briefed. Uh, I have. Most likely a ghoul attack. I'd assume you'd seen a lot of those, uh, correct? Gustav scoffed. Once a week, more or less. Damn things are everywhere. Never gets easy seeing them. I don't suppose that affect you much given your... condition. On the contrary... I've seen their alike for centuries, and they've never failed to disturb me. Immortality doesn't chip away at one's humanity if you don't let it. He let out a huff that could have meant many things. We'll leave when the sun goes down, he said. See if we can't draw the ghoul out. Wouldn't it be more difficult to engage it at night? I asked. Yes, but considering your condition, I can move perfectly fine in daylight, if that's what you're worried about, I interrupted. Please don't worry about my condition. I can assure you that it won't be a hindrance or a threat. I can assure you it won't too, he replied. If you think you're up for it, we could head out after you eat. You do eat, don't you? On occasion, I replied. The lobster looked particularly appetizing, if you're a seafood man. Again, Gustav huffed, sounding less annoyed this time. He picked up his menu and skimmed through it without another word. Perhaps he might not have liked me right off the bat, but I could work with that. After we ate, we drove to the cottage. It was a quiet little place, well off the beaten path. A prime spot for a ghoul. As we drove up to the old building, I could see the broken glass of the windows and the yellow lines of the police tape. Gustav parked just outside the tape, and we both got out. We approached the building together, and I could smell the old blood inside. How long ago was the attack? I asked. The bodies were discovered twelve hours ago, Gustav replied. The attack probably happened last night. Someone heard gunshots and came to investigate. Before you ask, I looked into reports of missing pets as well. There were eight in the past year. But rather high for a place so remote, I noted. Gustav huffed in agreement. The cottages are new. Chances are they backed onto the ghoul's territory, he said as he spoke. I scanned the nearby woods. I suspected that Gustav was correct, and if so, our quarry would not be far. I approached the cottage and stepped inside. The stench of stale blood overpowered my senses, although I doubted that Gustav noticed anything. Even without the chalk outlines, I knew exactly where the bodies had fallen. From the look of it, Ghoul came in the living room window, Gustav said. The mother was found nearby in the kitchen. And imagine her screams woke her husband, who got his gun, and attacked the ghoul. He was found in the hallway, and their son was killed in his bed, I replied. Gustav paused. I can smell the blood in the sheets from here. They found blood there, but no body. I grimaced at the knowledge of what the ghoul had done. Yet, in taking something back to its hideout to feast on, it had marked a trail. I walked over to the broken window and looked out at the forest beyond. It was faint, but I could smell blood in the distance, along with the stink of decay. We'll look for tracks, Gustav said. Might be best to check the area outside that window. No need, I replied. It's close. Gustav paused. I can smell it. Old blood... Human decay. I've been around long enough to recognize it. It's faint, but I think I can track it. Christ, you can smell it? He asked. A benefit of my condition. My senses of smell and hearing are much better than yours, among other things. No shit. I suppose I can see why Spectre wanted your kind on the DPS. If you think you can find that thing, lead the way. He drew a pistol from his holster. 
Something high caliber. Probably good enough to kill a ghoul. He followed me out of the cottage and towards the tree line. While we weren't looking for tracks, I still noticed them in the dirt, and we moved into the woods. The smell was getting stronger, and though I trusted my nose, the trees around us made me feel claustrophobic. My senses would only lead us to a corpse, not the ghoul itself. The creature could have been anywhere nearby, and so we tread lightly. But the closer we got, the stronger the smell became. There were no doubt several bodies nearby fresh and rotten meat to feed the insatiable hunger of the ghoul. Up ahead, I spotted a small stone hill. The smell seems to be coming from there, and as we got closer, I recognized a dip in the ground that led into a small cavern. I held up a hand to stop Gustav. I pointed to the cave. I'll go first, I whispered. Lure it out if it's in there. I trust your steady shot. Very, he promised. I've got you covered. Though I had few reasons to truly trust Gustav, I still silently held him to that word as I began my approach to the cave. In the low light, my eyes could see bones picked clean. Most of them looked animal, but there were a few I recognized as human. The ghoul's lair had a rotten, wet stink to it. Bad enough that I covered my mouth as I got closer, and yet as foul as its little hole was... It looks to be completely empty. I grimaced as I spotted the ribcage of what I knew to be the missing child before taking a step back and looking over at Gustav. I shook my head. The ghoul wasn't there. And yet as I looked at him, I saw my eyes widen. The trees, he called and raised the gun and fired before I realized just what he'd seen. A heavy weight bore down on me, forcing me to the ground. I heard the snap of hungry jaws by my ear, but they missed me entirely. I kicked and shoved the creature on top of me and knocked it aside. I saw its spindly, grayish limbs struggle for a moment as it regained its footing. It looked at me with wide, unblinking eyes, tangled hair falling around its face and dried blood around its mouth. The ghoul hissed at me before clawing its way towards me. I scrambled to my feet, but I wasn't fast enough. Its claws raked at my back and dug into my flesh as it pulled me towards it. Its breath stank of rotten meat. It tried to sink its teeth into me, but I grabbed it by the skull and held it back as its jaws snapped wildly. I heard another gunshot and a spray of blood erupted from its neck. The ghoul hissed and tried to look at Gustav before he shot it again, blowing away its head. Still, the damn thing stood, although only for a second longer before its bony limbs collapsed from underneath it. Lifeless, it collapsed to the ground beside me and rolled down into the cave to join the other dead. I looked down at it, panting heavily, and thankfully I had suffered nothing more than a few scratches. The body of the ghoul twitched as if it was still trying to stand up. Once upon a time, that thing had probably been a lovely young woman. Now it was just another monster. Can't do everything, can you, vampire? Gustav asked, his tone cocky. He offered me a hand to help me to my feet. I suppose not, I replied, breathlessly. Damn good shooting. I've had some practice. We should move the body, burn it and contact the police. He looked down into the cavern at the body of the child who'd been there. I'm sure someone will want to give that kid a proper burial. I nodded in response before following Gustav down to collect what was left of the ghoul. While I cannot pretend my relationship with Gustav was ever perfect, I must admit that the first job was the start of a solid partnership. He never did seem to warm to my condition, but over the next four years, it became easier and easier to trust him with my life. Together, he and I put down rogue sirens, who chose to overfeed or hunt for sport. Groups of deep mermaids who'd grown too aggressive, and countless malevolent fae who sought only to spread chaos for fun. Despite our differences, I came to regard Gustav as a trusted friend, and I'd like to believe that he came to think of me in a similar manner. Perhaps that was what made our final job so difficult. On June 12th, 1989... Two hikers in the Ukraine were attacked by an unknown entity, something they described as humanoid. 
Naturally, the FRB investigated the claims and concluded that it was a likely ghoul attack, and within six hours of the police report, Gustav and I were asked to investigate. The trail was remote and designed for more advanced hikers. I can't imagine it saw much use. It would have been ideal for a ghoul to call home. As I walked through the heavy underbrush, well ahead of Gustav, I can't say that I anticipated anything other than a standard ghoul encounter. I expected to pick up the scent of decay any time soon. Or, if we were lucky, perhaps the much fainter, wet stink of a ghoul or its lair. I scanned the trees above me, and Gustav had his weapon drawn as we drew nearer to the spot where the attack had supposedly happened. You smell anything? Gustav asked. Just the forest, I replied and paused. That wasn't entirely true. There's something sweeter in the air here, but not blood. Nothing I'm familiar with. If it's sweet, it's not our ghoul, Gustav said. He paused for a moment before adding, Assuming it is a ghoul, could have just been a bear. How many times have we told people it was just a bear? I asked. He responded with one of his trademark huffs. Maybe this time it really was. You ever seen a bear with a mange, Marsh? Terrifying fucking things. They're bony. Their flesh is pale. They look like zombies. Then the least we can do is confirm it, I said. If nothing else, the walking is good for you. Again, Gustav huffed. Whatever you say, Mr. Liquid Diet. We hadn't gone much farther before the sweet smell I detected grew stronger. It was almost blinding now, and amongst the dark foliage I could see something small and luminous peeking out. I approached it, slowly, and bent down to get a closer look. What is it? Gustav asked as I examined it. A flower, I replied, and that was the simplest description of it. The flower was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It had five petals, and its colors seemed to shift from blue to green, and even pink. There was a slight glow coming off of it, and its smell was strong and sweet. I delicately plucked it before wrapping it up in a handkerchief. I could show this to someone back at the office. Maybe they'd know what to make of it. From the corner of my eye, I saw the slight glow from other flowers, identical to the one I found. In the dim light, they were easy to see. What is this? Gustav asked warily. Hell if I know, I replied as I stood up. But something about this doesn't sit right with me. It's a flower, he said. What's there to be worried about? Humanity fears what it does not understand for good reason, my friend, I replied. This flora doesn't look natural. I consider that very good cause for concern. Gustav responded with another huff. A flower's a flower, vampire. Relax. Quietly, he scanned the area around us before pausing. I heard a rustling of leaves, and my partner took off at full speed, gun drawn. Wait! I called, but Gustav was always the sort to leap before he looked. By the time I was up again, I heard gunshots followed by a scream from him. I raced off in the direction Gustav had gone. I heard one final gunshot and a sound, an inhuman squeal that sent a chill through me. The last gunshot had been close. Gustav was just ahead. And when I found him, he was slumped up against a tree, coughing and hacking. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something dart off into the woods, but my attention was focused more on my partner. Are you all right? I asked. I offered him a hand, but he pushed it aside and climbed unsteadily to his feet. I'm fine, he spat. Fucking thing jumped me. It's a goddamn ghoul. Are you hurt? I asked. Bites? Scratches? Scrapes and bruises. I'm fine, mother, he growled, before pushing past me to head deeper into the woods. Come on, let's kill this damn thing. I would have voiced my protest, but Gustav was a stubborn fool. He would have pressed ahead no matter what I said, and perhaps he was right for that. We had the ghoul on the run. It should have been easy to catch up now. Still, the deep sound of Gustav's hacking cough did not sit well with me. Up ahead of him, I could see the glow of several more of those strange flowers. The sun is getting low. It might not be wise to be wandering out here so late. I'm warned. 
What? Are you scared of the dark? Gustav wheezed. Come on. He broke down into another fit of coughing and gripped a tree to prevent himself from collapsing. You think you're funny, I replied. You can barely stand up, and that cough, it, it doesn't sound right. That fucking ghoul sprayed me with something, Gustav replied. I don't know what. Something sweet that stank. I'll be fine. I just need to clear my lungs. I can keep going. I stared at him, watching as he stood up and knowing that I'd needed to drag him kicking and screaming out of the woods if I wanted him to leave. I also knew that he'd probably shoot me if I tried. With a resigned sigh, I drew my own pistol and followed him. At the very least, I could ensure my thick-skulled partner didn't get himself killed. I had hoped that we might find the dying ghoul nearby, but we had no such luck. I couldn't even smell any blood from its supposed wounds. While Gustav was adamant he had hit his target, I had my doubts. Our quarry had run far, and I couldn't even hear its rustling movements in the distance. As we walked through the forest, the sky began to darken, but the shimmering hues from the flowers around us lit our path. Gustav cut ahead of me, pausing every few moments to cough. In the forest, it was difficult to mark our path already, but with my partner so far ahead, it was next to impossible, even for me. We continued onwards to the point where I wasn't even sure we were on the trail of the creature who had attacked us. The only change in our environment was those glowing flowers that seemed more plentiful than before. They polluted the air with an overpowering sweetness that was enough to make me cough. Gustav! I called. He didn't look back at me. Gustav, it's been almost an hour. We're wasting our time. The ghoul is gone. He just kept going, fueled by a rage that seemed unlike him. I watched him for a moment as he vanished deeper into the woods before I followed, jogging to catch up to him. Gustav! I called as I put a hand on his shoulder. He looked back at me, eyes burning with rage. It's gone. We should turn back. It's here. Gustav replied, It's in the ocean. Don't you feel it? I paused. There was something in his gaze. Something very wrong. He pulled out of my grip. Not much farther, he said. Trust me. I watched him go, and for the first time in a very long time, I felt uneasy. Ghouls did not scare me. Neither did mermaids, fays, werewolves, or even other vampires. These were all terrible things I knew how to deal with. But Gustav, in that moment, scared me. We continued for over an hour, and it wasn't long before I noticed that the sound of our movement was the only sound I heard. Usually in such pristine forest, there would be other sounds of life, but around us the world was silent. No birds, no animals, nothing at all. While I'd known animals to fear ghouls before, this was different. Gustav didn't seem to notice, though. I doubt he thought of anything but the prey ahead of him. At some point, we started up an incline, and I watched him claw at the earth and climb with single-minded purpose. The strange flowers bloomed thick around us and continued to pollute the air with their sweet stench. There, I heard him rasp. Up there. It took me a moment to see what he saw. While the darkness did not impair my vision, it would have been easy to miss the overgrown wood that marked the entrance to an old mine. The tunnel into the earth was overgrown by moss, and yet, deep inside the cavern, I could see the glow of more of those flowers, shimmering like stars. In there, Gustav rasped before breaking into another coughing fit. To his credit, it seemed less severe than before. There, it's in there. Near the entrance of the mine, I spotted old splintered wood. Someone had boarded it up long ago, and something else had forced its way inside. Let's go, Gustav said, before shambling off into the darkness. I stopped him. Are you insane? You'll be blind in there. You're coming with me, aren't you? He asked. Now it was my turn to huff in response. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted an old lantern sitting abandoned just inside the mine. It didn't take long to light a little flame inside it, 
It was rusted, bent, and a little broken, but it sufficed. Of all the fucking vampires I could get, I get the priss, Gustav murmured. I'm doing this for your benefit, not mine, I replied. He didn't reply and just turned to trudge off into the mine. I followed him, keeping the lantern aloft. My every instinct told me that going farther was a mistake, but my partner had made up his mind long ago. The stink of those radiant flowers was almost blinding. Even if the ghoul had made its home in this old mine, I doubt I would have smelled it. Yet, despite my caution, Gustav continued to press on ahead. I noticed a few rotten old supports that looked like they wouldn't hold well. I'd seen them by the entrance of the mine, too. The place looked as if... The place looked as if it was ready to collapse any day now. How exactly do you know where this thing is? I asked. I just know, he replied. I feel it. First I was just following the trail, but now... I feel it, Marsh. It's hard to explain. My brow furrowed as I followed him. That doesn't worry you? I asked, and again he didn't reply. All the same, I found myself falling back a few steps, distancing myself from my partner. Up ahead, I heard movements, bony limbs shuffling against rock. While I couldn't smell the ghoul, I knew that Gustav's senses had led him to the right place. The luminous flowers around us shimmered in their strange hues. My pace slowed a little bit as I looked forward at Gustav. He kept his gun at the ready, expecting the ghoul to jump out at any moment. From the corner of my eye, I caught movements and heard the sound of claw against stone. I spun around just in time to see a shape retreat inside a side branch of the cavern, and I reached for my gun. There, I called. I didn't wait around for Gustav to come. Instinct took over as I pursued the ghoul and thoughtlessly abandoned my partner. Ahead, I could clearly see the ghoul scuttling like an insect along the wall, yet there seemed to be something wrong with it. The shimmering flowers that had accompanied us all the way up to the cavern seemed to be growing out of the ghoul's skin. Its flesh itself seemed to shift against its bones, and when it turned back to hiss at me, it seemed to grin knowingly. I could hear Gustav's footsteps rushing up behind me as the ghoul turns to fight. I fired my gun twice. The first shot blew away a chunk of its skull, and the second went into its shoulder. Neither of them slowed it down. Instead, the ghoul rushed towards me on all fours without stopping. I saw its mouth open, but not in a way it should have opened. Its lower jaw split apart, and much of its neck opened as well, revealing teeth that should not have been there, but even worse pale, yellow eyes. I fired again, shooting into its terrible maw as it advanced on me, but the bullets did nothing. In my desperation, I hurled the lantern at it. The lighter fluid I used to ignite it caught on the flesh of the thing before me, and its body was set ablaze like dry tinder. It shrank back with a pained screech as its flesh sizzled and pulled back from the flames like something alive. I stumbled backwards watching as the creature burned and shambled backwards. Perhaps the flames themselves wouldn't have been enough to kill it, but in its panic, it clumsily stumbled into the walls lined with flowers. The stray flames set those alight too, and all too quickly the fire spread. I looked back and saw Gustav standing behind me, staring wide-eyed and helpless at the ghoul he'd so desperately pursued. I didn't give him much time to watch. I ran for him and grabbed him by the arm before pulling him back at the way we came. We hadn't gone too far into the cavern. It was easy enough to find our way back out, and I tugged him along behind me as the old mine very quickly became an inferno. As we reached its mouth, we stumbled out into the moonlight, and I looked back to see a hellish glow in our wake. Gustav stared back at it in turn, panting heavily before looking at me. That ghoul, he finally said. What the hell was that? It was a ghoul, right? Maybe once, I replied. I looked around at the flowers that surrounded us, and I felt my heart race in a way that it hadn't in centuries. These flowers, they did something to it. It corrupted it somehow. We need to call this in. Quarantine the area. Torch and burn everything. Get rid of them all. Wait, 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 get rid of it? 
Gustav asked. Marsh, what the hell are you talking about? Didn't you see what I saw? That ghoul had those flowers growing out of it, and it was... it was warped. It was something else entirely. It shrugged off our bullets. What if more creatures got exposed to these flowers? Hell, we've been exposed. What might it do to us? Gustav just laughed. His lips curled into a smile. It didn't fit well on his face. I think you're overthinking this, my friend, he said. That ghoul it was. It was beautiful, don't you think? I mean, look at these flowers. They turned something so disgusting, so horrible as a ghoul into something new. Something fierce and beautiful. It gave it an entirely new life. Now you're thinking about burning this all to the ground, without even knowing how far it can go. I stared at him, my eyes narrowing. Do, do you hear yourself right now? I asked. Think about this for a moment. I am thinking, he replied. For the first time in twenty years, I feel like I'm thinking clearly. Marsh, I knew where that thing was. I think when it attacked me, it breathed some of its essence onto me, and it... it enhanced me. <laughs> he paused and looked back into the inferno. No, no, it shared something with me. With us. I think I get it now. It didn't want food. It wanted to share something. To show us an ocean of possibilities. That's why it led us on. The one is to chase it so we would see, and now I see, Robert. An ocean of possibility. You should, too. I stared at him, watching as his breathing grew heavier. I still clutched my gun in my hand. I'm burning this to the ground, Gustav. I replied. And once you get your head right, you'll agree with me that this was the right thing to do. In an instant, Gustav was on top of me. With strength that surpassed my own, he ripped my gun from my hands and forced me to the ground. No. No, I will not let you do that. I'll make you see, he said, grinning wide from ear to ear. I'll make you see it, just like I see it. I'll make you see it. Come, Robert. Come into the ocean. Breathe in deep. Gustav's smile only grew wider and wider as I saw his head begin to change. His skull began to split open as that sweet stink only grew stronger. I could only stare in silent horror as I realized that there was no saving my partner. Whatever the ghoul had done to him, it had corrupted him outright. It had changed him, and now I was seeing just how much of him had been changed. In just a few hours, Gustav was no longer human, and as he prepared to unleash his payload on me, I struggled to push him off of me. I grabbed the side of his head and forced it upwards. Thick, shimmering spores drifted from his open skull, and with a scream of exertion, I threw him off of me. Gus fell towards the mine, leaving a trail of spores in his wake. Behind him, the flames were growing stronger. The mine was burning up. He climbed onto all fours, spores leaking from his skull. I watched a bone jut out of his arm like a blade, and shimmering flowers grew from the wound. If you'll not join in life, I shall have your corpse. Gustav said, his voice distorted and garbled. Like an animal, my former companion raced towards me, but I was ready for him. As he lunged for me, I ducked under him and moved towards the mine. Arrogant as ever, Gustav pursued me, still moving like a twisted animal. His skull had reformed, and his lips were curled back in a twisted smile that I will never quite forget. As I backed towards the inferno, I spotted one of the rotten supports nearby and focused back on the thing that was once Gustav. He stood up, raised the extended bone shard jutting out of his arm to try and impale me. I sidestepped him and used his own momentum to push him deeper into the mine. The flames licked at his back as I saw moments of panic in his eyes. Marsh, wait! He called in a voice I knew I recognized, but he wasn't going to stop me. With all my strength, I broke through the support. The rock above us shifted, and I watched as Gustav made a desperate scramble for the entrance. But I was faster. When the mine came down, I was out, but he was not. The last I heard was a desperate scream before the collapse of the mine crushed him and hopefully sent him to a peaceful rest. The DPS was quick to quarantine the area and burn the flowers, 
as per my request. Whatever was out there, it was too dangerous to leave unchecked. Of that I was sure. However, Gustav's loss did not sit well with me. I know that in his final moments he was not himself, and perhaps that bothered me even more than his loss. Either way, I did what I had to do. The flowers needed to be destroyed. I only hoped that we got all of them. If we didn't, well, I'd rather not think about that. I've never really talked to anyone about this before. Partially because I didn't think anyone would believe me, and partially because I'm still not entirely sure what happened to myself. But what happened that night has definitely stuck with me, no matter how dreamlike it may seem in hindsight. In those memories, it was as real to me as the nose on my face. That kind of terror doesn't just go away so easily, no matter how hard your brain tries to rationalize it. In order to understand the situation better, here's some context. I work as a closing manager for an old retail store, one of the chains of stores that died off in the early 2000s, and only a few locations still exist. It's always nerve-wracking trying to keep our sales up and the doors open, but since we're so far out from any overseeing corporation, we're allowed to function on our own, making decisions and store changes as we please. Because of this, we're all more like friends than co-workers, and we have each other's backs whenever something comes up, be it a problem customer or a surprise visit from our regional manager. The thing about the store is that we don't have a lot of firm rules and regulations that we uphold on the day-to-day, -day aside from keeping the store in order, helping customers, and making sure the tills don't go over a certain dollar amounts without being pulled and reset. All the usual sort of stuff. When it comes to closing the store, there's a rule that requires us to always leave the store in parts. That means whenever there is anyone in the store closing up, or anyone going into the parking lot at night, we need to exit in pairs. The other managers always speculated that it was some corporate policy to keep managers from stealing from the safe, or someone from getting mugged in the parking lot. To be honest, none of us really minded the rule all that much as it protected us from being suspected of theft, and the area is actually a bit dicey at night. I always follow this rule pretty diligently, until one night a few associates were going to get some drinks and wanted to head out early. They invited me to go along, but I still had tills to settle and the safe to deal with before I could leave. In hindsight, if I knew then what I know now, I never would have stayed there alone. I would have had them stay a bit longer with me, and we could have all gone out together, around on me for the delay. Uh, but as they say, hindsight's twenty twenty. I didn't make them stay. I let the others out and told them to have a good time as I locked up the front doors behind me. What happened next was a series of bizarre events that I still think about to this day. After locking up the front door and the shutter gates behind me, I went back to the cash office to finally settle the till for Register 1. And normally, I listened to music on my phone while I did this, as the store music could be heard through the walls of the cash office and was getting pretty annoying. But my phone was at 3% at that point, and I didn't want to drain it completely useless unless I needed it on the way home. The funny thing about the terrible music they played in the store is that there are only two ways to turn off the music. The most common way being to pick up one of the store phones and use the intercom to just silence it out with the white noise. This wasn't uncommon among the older managers who'd worked there for years, as they hated listening to the overly poppy, out-of-date music after hours. The second way to turn that awful music off would be to go into the electrical closet, locate the correct switch, and turn it off manually. But that was more dangerous, as nothing is clearly labeled, and flipping the wrong switch could cause the power loss to our computers, registers, or even our security alarm, automatically calling the alarm company and local PD. Needless to say, we usually avoid doing that, and just opt for the intercom system, leaving a phone off the hook, just remembering to put it back before we leave for the night. This night, I just let the music play, 
as it didn't bother me as much as the quiet world, and I was hoping to finish up and be out of the store shortly. I mention this detail because just as I was finishing up the verification of the first register, I realized that the music had stopped playing. I wasn't sure when exactly it happened, but it was like one minute I saw the sun was droning in the background, and then silence. I turned around to look at the monitor behind me that showed one aisle in the store leading all the way to the doors out back, where our break room and receiving are. The monitor was a direct feed to the one and only camera in the store, and despite the recording in progress sign displayed on the aisle's corresponding monitor, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Our store didn't have the funds for more cameras, let alone a way of storing recordings, so all we had was a live feed. The monitor was displaying the aisle as well, empty, except for the occasional buzzing line that would roll down the screen. I thought it was strange that the radio was off, and began to wonder if maybe someone had been left behind in the store. It's true that I hadn't walked the store after locking up, and I never checked the break room to make sure everyone had left as a group. I started kicking myself in the back for not making sure, although in the back of my mind I was playing out everyone's faces as they left, and I had been so sure they were all together. Leaving the cash office, I shut the door behind me and stepped out into the main store area, half expecting to see a grumpy employee ready to be let out. But there was no one near the front. I thought of calling out to see if anyone was around, but for some reason, my gut told me not to. I'm not sure if it's from all the crime shows I watched growing up or what, but I scanned the areas of the store that I could see and found no one. So I walked over the keypad by the door and watched the display to make sure our back entrance was locked down correctly. The display cycled through each point of security in the store. Area 1, armed, a receiving area on the back of the store. Area 2, ready to arm. The cash office that I'd just come from, Area 3, ready to arm. And finally, the alarm for the store's entrance, and the motion sensor that engages when we leave for the night. All seemed to be in order there, so there's no way someone could come in from the outside. With that realization, I relaxed a bit of the tension that built up in my shoulders. I hadn't noticed it was there until I let go. I thought I should do a walk of the store and check the break room, just to make sure no one had been left behind back there. I was a little freaked out at first, but started relaxing when I reminded myself about the alarms on the exits, the locked doors, and shutters keeping anyone that might want to get in out. Despite all the rationalizing, however, I couldn't fully relax that last bit of concern I had in my gut. The silence stretched across the store served as a reminder that something was still off. Kicking myself in the back again for letting everyone go early and not checking the store properly, I grabbed a pair of dull scissors from the customer service desk and went about checking all the phone receivers before heading out back. The phones were all on the hook, and nothing out of the ordinary, aside from the silence. Somehow, that didn't help settle my stomach at all. As I walked down the main aisle of the store, I peeked down each row, feeling like any minute I might pass by Rachel or Mark on their way to the front. Maybe we'd both have a laugh and say something like, You scared me, before heading out together. But I never did. Each empty aisle felt like another knot, twisting up my intestines. The eerie silence of the store stretching out for eternity. If you've ever been somewhere after hours that you shouldn't have been, you may know that feeling. Staying after school until the sun goes down, staying late at work by yourself, or falling asleep somewhere, like a bus or a train, and waking up to find you're all alone in a place that doesn't feel natural when it's so empty and quiet. Yeah, it's that sort of feeling. Like you're stepping into a place that you never should have been. At least, not without the comfort of numbers, or even some kind of ambient sound to break the sort of tension that builds up in a space like that. When I finally reached the back of the store, I felt like there was a pressure building up in me, like at any moment it was going to pop. I was so on edge at that point that I was practically begging to run into someone just to break the tension, just to shake that awful feeling of isolation and paranoia. 
As I pushed myself through the break room doors a little more forcefully than I'd expected, I looked around to see any coats or bags left on hooks to denote the presence of another familiar person. But just as I thought, there was nothing there. No rolled up snack bags from lunch, no purse and no coats, or anything else to show that anyone had ever been there. Some part of me must have wondered in that moment if anyone had indeed been there before. At that moment, I felt more small and alone than I'd ever felt before in my life. Still, the silence stretched on, almost deafening in its weight at this point. I never thought there would be a time when I'd give anything to hear those terrible pop songs and outdated tracks. But there I was, a bundle of nerves and cooling sweat, wishing I could hear anything but my own tight breath. I gripped the nearly forgotten scissors in my hand to anchor myself, as if to shield me. I put them in front of me as I thought back through the alarms, the locks, the shutters. Nothing could get in. There's no way anyone would have been in the store with me, unless they were already in the store before we closed. As the thought crossed my mind, I felt my stomach drop. I'd never considered it before now, unless they were already in the store. My mind repeated over and over as I licked my dry lips. I'd been so concerned about someone breaking in that I'd never stopped to consider that they could have been there all along. I could hear my own pulse, and my fingers felt cold and clammy around the scissors. I could feel the tightness in my legs, and I tried to bring myself another step towards the receiving area. It was the only other entrance or exit from the store, and there was a phone in the back. The only phone left that could be using the intercom system. I patted around my pockets with my free hand, realizing then that I left my phone in the locked office at the front of the store. I felt so stupid for not bringing it, and at the same time, I felt stupid when I thought about what I would do if I'd brought it. But would I call the police? And tell them what? That I got spooked after breaking protocol and staying in the store by myself? Would I call another manager in the late hours of the night? and asked them to come check out the store with me. The more I thought it over, the more alone I felt. I didn't know what to do, or what to think, but I decided I needed to at least know for sure what was happening. I shifted the scissors in my hand and stiffened up my back. I wasn't about to look like some fool getting scared of nothing. I was going to face whatever this was head on. After all, it could have just been the wind. Or some hooligan messing around the store after hours trying to prank me. Or do some silly overnight challenge you see online sometimes. Feeling a new sense of power from that thought, I pushed past the receiving doors with a measured degree of caution and confidence. The receiving lights are on a motion sensor. And after 45 or so minutes of inactivity, we'll drop into a dim eco mode. Where only a quarter of the lights remain on. I've been in this store for a few years now, and I've gotten used to this, being able to see easily in the dim light, and even knowing how to move through without triggering the old motion sensor. The lights were in eco mode at this point, and somehow that took some of the weight off my shoulders, knowing that the lights had a long window of time before they timed out, one that surely would have been more than my store walk had taken, and knowing that anyone unfamiliar with our store would have set off the motion sensor made me feel a sense of safety. In that moment, I felt alone again. Not the terrifying loneliness I'd felt before, but a more secure, sort of independent feeling. I moved through the big room with ease, past the packing bays and pallets of overstock, back towards the corded phone and receiving door. I could feel the tension from before slipping away as I walked through the space. It was familiar to me, and I felt safe again. The store had become like a second home to me over the years, and I felt like I knew all of its inner workings like the back of my hand. This was my turf, and any thought of another person looking around was all but put out of my mind as the room stayed dim and quiet. When I reached the phone, I saw that it had been knocked off the hook by a cute toy robot our inventory manager kept on the shelf above. I almost laughed at how silly I had been before. The toy must have just fallen and knocked the phone off its base. I put things back as they should be, still smiling about the whole situation as I went back towards the front of the store. This time, though, I'd put the toy on the opposite end of the shelf. 
As silly as it may have been, I'd had enough of a scare for that night to last me for a week. As I was walking up the long aisle leading to the front, I looked up at the monitor on the other end. Recording in progress. Yeah, sure. I often watched that hazy monitor as I approached, thinking how lame it was, when we all knew full well it wasn't really recording anything. But as I smirked up at the monitor in my approach, I saw what looked like a flicker of light clicking on to the receiving door windows. I felt my blood run cold as the realization dawned on me that something had just set off the motion sensor light. Something big and fast enough that the old dim sensor couldn't pick up on. All at once as my pulse picked up, I felt my feet carry me toward I felt my feet carry me forward before I could even think to move them. I was running then, mindlessly trying to get as far away from whatever could have been back there. As I made it to the front of the aisle, nearly beyond the view of the monitor, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. With my last view of the monitor as I rounded the corner, I could see something barreling out to the two swinging doors I'd just come from. I never got a good look at it, but whatever it was, it was big. Big enough to flow through both of the huge doors with a resounding bang that echoed throughout the empty store. I didn't stick around to find out. I burst past the main office door and fumbled my manager keys into the lock of the cash office door. My heart was so loud in my ears it sounded like a thousand sets of feet thundering right behind me, like the hounds of hell reaching for my heels. When the lock clicked in one exuberant moment, I ripped the door open and wrapped myself tight around it, pulling it closed faster than I expected possible for the weighty storm door. As the door shut, I heard a loud thud as a massive pressure slammed against the other side. What followed was an onslaught of banging and crashing against the reinforced door. I never had a chance to breathe before I heard it. A sound so blood-curdling and horrible. I just stood there, frozen in terror, blood like ice in my veins as every hair on my body stood on end. The sound was so far from human that it blew away any thoughts I might have had about hooligan pranks or intruders. As the pounding increased on the door and the unearthly screams filled the air, I thought again about the alarms, the locking doors, and the shuddering. They had given me a sense of safety before, thinking that if no one could get in that everything would be okay. But now, now that just terrified me even more. Whatever that thing was just beyond the door, it was big, inhuman, and starting to shake the door frame with its assault. Even worse, if I were to call for help now, no one could even get in to help without a key. I remembered my cell phone on the table beside me, like some kind of miracle in all of this. Without a second thought, I grasped for my phone and pulled up my contacts to call another manager. I knew Jake, the day manager, would be opening in the morning and had a key to open the doors. If I called him, he could come with the police and maybe do something about whatever was outside, now thundering what sounded like hundreds of thrashing limbs across the floor and walls of the main office hall. My battery was at 2% now, as I heard the dial tone on the other end of the line. As soon as the ringing started, the sounds from the hall went silent, an eerie sort of silence that followed such a cacophony of noise from before. The coils in my stomach tightened again at this. As the ringing continued, my brain ran through what was happening. Whatever that thing was out there, it wasn't human. But worse still, it wasn't just some animal. It could hear me in that office. It could hear the muffled scream of the dial through the steel, it could hear the muffled sounds of the dial through the steel door, through my cupped hand, through my body. It could hear all of that, and was now so deathly silent that had I not heard it there before, I might have never known it was ever there at all. Whatever it was, it was capable of hunting, in complete silence. And I thought then about the unease I'd felt walking through the store alone. Had it been following me? stalking me throughout the aisles? How close was it then, lingering silently, just out of sight? If I hadn't gotten lucky, if I hadn't seen the lights click on when I did, I don't know what it could have done. The ringing stopped as an automated voice chimed up that I reached voicemail. I wanted to curse and shouted him for not picking up, but for all the anger I felt, 
The terror and panic swallowed it up as I realized my battery had dropped to 1% and was flashing red as the screen was dimming down to barely visible. I hit redial on the recent calls list, hoping and pleading. Pick up, pick up, please pick up. I whispered frantically into the phone as my eyes shot around the room for a charger, an outlet, a forgotten cell phone, something, anything to get help. The ringing stopped, and for a second I thought I'd gotten through. Jake, are you there? Hello? I was shouting into the phone in a panic. Hello? Are you there? Silence. I stared down at my phone to see the screen had gone black. I'd never gotten through before the battery died. I slumped to the floor, still staring at the screen. I wanted to cry. My body ached from all the stress, and my head was pounding. I just wanted to go home and forget any of this ever happened. And I almost did cry. I could feel the tears sting my eyes, and my heart climbing up my throat to choke me as the silence filled the air. And that's when I heard it. A sound like a squeaky wheel, or the wheezing sound you might hear when you let the air out of a balloon just right. That sound slipped under the door and stretched across the room like a haunting reminder of what was waiting just outside. I'd nearly forgotten in all my frustration what I was so afraid of. The sound broke occasionally and twisted on itself. Wheezing turned into a crackled sort of vocalization as it folded and stretched. I could hear it, pressed up against the base of the door now. I shuddered at the twisted up assimilation of speech digging into my ears. I tried covering them with my hands, but it was practically useless against that unnatural thing. It wheezed to the crack under the door as the frame creaked against its weight. No! I screamed back. Out of fear or frustration, I still don't know. But as the sound left my mouth, I regretted it immediately. It said back, more clearly than before, in a voice that began to sound a bit more human. I scrunched myself up tightly around my knees, pressing my hands to my ears. This was insane. This couldn't really be happening, I thought. It shouted as a bang at the door. This couldn't be happening. I must have fallen asleep while counting the drawers. I must be asleep in the office. I'll wake up any minute now and go home. I told myself all of these things and more in my head over and over, just trying to keep my minds together as that uncanny voice on the other side of the door began sounding more and more like my own, but wrong, so wrong and off that it couldn't possibly be a proper mimicry. Clearly this time, it came through the door. I felt my breath stop at this. The silence hung in the air thick like molasses as the sweat cooled on the back of my neck. My own voice was coming through the door, clearer with each syllable. A sort of scratching noise ran across the base of the door, agonizingly slow, followed by a loud inhale of air, pulling the dust from the floor to dance. No, you are there, it said matter-of-factly. I was frozen there on the floor after this, silence hanging in the air, the beast outside the door, me trapped inside, no way of calling for help, and the certainty that it not only knew I was here, but it was smart, and seeming to learn me each second, how long until the door gave way or it figured out some way to break the lock, how long until it got to me, how long until I went mad staring at that door. Hello. Something solid thumped against the door, shooting pain through my already stiff body. Hello. It slammed again, harder, as trailing sounds of tumbling limbs followed. Hello. It seemed to begin barreling at the door over and over as the slamming began again in earnest. Hello, hello, hello. You are there. You are there. 
A ruckus, rolling sound of scraping, thudding, and screeching beat against the door as I pushed myself as far back under the table as I could, pulling my legs tightly up to my chest. I'm not sure how much time passed like that. I sat there, staring at the door in silent terror, watching dust fall from the frame, knowing any second might be my last. The sounds echoed across the walls and swallowed me up. Somewhere underneath it all, I could faintly hear the poppy music being swallowed up by the monstrous groans and screams. It wasn't until the following morning when the door finally did click open. After all that time frozen with terror, I was too shocked to do anything as the door easily slid open. I stared at the door handle for what felt like eternity as it did, feeling almost betrayed that it would open so easily to leave me to that beast. But as the light of the hall came in and my heart was ready to explode, I saw him. Jake, the opening manager. He stumbled a bit as he made eye contact with me. What the hell? What are you doing in there? He stood in the doorway, staring at me, but I couldn't think of anything to say. I couldn't even bring myself to move from that spot under the table. I was too afraid to even take my eyes off of him. At the off chance that it wasn't really Jake at all, but some monster in disguise. He tried to approach, but... I pushed back against the wall. Whoa, are you okay? What's going on? He crouched down by the door, and I could see behind him the morning lights coming through the hallway. What? What time is it? I asked, not realizing until that moment how dry and sore my throat had been. He told me it was 7 a.m. and that he was getting ready to open the store. He looked over the tills and money left on the table from the night before with a worried look. After that, he kept prodding me for what happened the night before, but I couldn't find the words to describe the events, or even know if I wanted to. I've been working at this location for almost four years, and never had I experienced anything like that before. As I struggled to get up from the floor and think of how to make him understand what really happened, I looked up at the monitor again. The camera feed buzzed across the screen as our morning cashier walked up the aisle with her coffee in hand. I could see the morning light dimly through the low-res feed. If only it had been recording the night before. I looked down at my dead phone, feeling numb and cold after the restless night. I think, I said, around my dried-out tongue, I think I need to take some time off. He sighed shakily and gave me a hand above the concrete floor. You think? He gave me a half smirk, but I could still see the worry in his eyes as he tried to play it off. Go home and get some rest. Just give us a call when you're feeling better, okay? After that night, I slept for what felt like three days, unsure how to handle the thing I'd seen that night. I took two weeks off from work and tried to take my mind off of the event. None of my co-workers really questioned me about what happened when I got back, but I could see by the way their eyes followed me that they wanted to. It was definitely suspicious how I was found that morning, but nothing was missing, and no one seemed to want to upset me by asking about what happened. For that, I was thankful. It took me a long time to feel comfortable enough to even come back to work at all. I still work there to this day, and I've never had another incident. But from that point on, I never stayed in the store alone again. And every time someone asks to silence the store music, I feel a cold chill run down my spine. I've never told anyone what happened that night, and I didn't think I ever would. Until now. 766 today, I say in the usual customer service voice. You know, the monotone one that sounds polite and annoyed at the same time. Yeah, that one. My name's Dean. I work overnight at a gas station in the middle of nowhere. To be fair, it pays pretty well. All I do is smoke quickly and rip ass without any customers catching me, but let's be real. They always do. Except for one night. Some guy came in freaked out. Oh my god, you have to help me. Please, I'm begging you. He says as I think, Oh God, another one. With what, sir? I say. My girlfriend, she's been kidnapped. He says, 
Okay, uh, give me a minute, I say as I grab the phone from behind me. You mind giving some details? Uh, where y'all were at, who took her, what happened? I die on 911. You're not going to believe me, he cries. Well, son of a bitch, I had to tell the cops something, I say, getting pissed off. What you say in police? Says the cop. Hi, my name's Dean, and I have some guy telling me his girlfriend's been kidnapped. Okay, can I get the victim's name? The cop cries. What's your name, man? I ask. Ronnie, he mutters. It's Ronnie, I say, before I saw it. I can hear the officer saying something, but I tune it out. It must have been six foot nine. I can't tell what it looks like, but it had uh, antlers or horns. I drop the phone and it slowly go for my gun, making sure I don't drop eye contact. It's staring at Ronnie. No, it's him. Ronnie cries and he runs to the back room. I'm getting really tired of how bitchy he is, but I guess I get it. Some tall shit staring at me would freak me the fuck out too. Gun unholstered, I turn off the safety, point, and aim. I blink and it's gone. I saw it run for a split second, but it must have been going about 60 miles an hour. I stood there, shocked. I reset the hammer on my gun and rushed to the door. I lock it and try to find Ronnie. Ronnie? I shouted. I return the gun to its holster. Is it gone? He whispers. Where the fuck are you? I demand. Ronnie squeezes out from underneath the sink. He pissed his pants on top of it. Now I feel bad because there's no way that was comfortable, and now he smells. I sigh and help him out. What the hell was that, Ronnie? I ask. A skinwalker, he says. A what? A skinwalker, he whimpers. Oh, hell no. Get your stupid, superstitious shit out of here, I gripe. Hey, you saw it too, he argues. No, it's some jackass in a mask. I try to reason, lying. I have to admit, it was some weird shit. Nobody moves that fast. And you're saying that guy kidnapped your girl, I ask. She's dead. They die. They always die. If a skinwalker gets a hold of you, you don't come back, he says, monotone. No, we're not going to start that shit. A, you don't know she's dead. B, I've already called the, the, the phone. We can... The lights cut out. Fuck, another outage? Or is this thing smart enough to cut power like that? The two emergency lights fill the room. Shit, I say. I pull out my phone. No signal, of course. I get my gun and pull the hammer back. Whoa, you're not going to go after that thing, are you? Ronnie exclaimed. Hell no. But if, and I say if, that guy is what you say he is, I need something to protect myself with. I reply. A gun's not going to kill it, he asserts. Really? Hollow points to a shit ton of damage. I don't know, but... I heard that guns won't kill them, he says. What? How would you know? I asked. I called it, he sputtered out. That's some bold shit to say to a guy with a fucking gun in his hand. Why the fuck would you do something like that? How do you know this isn't just some guy fucking with you? How do you know this is a skinwalker? I demanded. I went to the medicine man, he mumbled. A medicine man? You mean like some kind of witchcraft bullshit? You're fucking with me, right? I say. Then you explain what you saw, he cries. A really tall fuck with a really good mask, I deny. I called it. I wanted him dead. I wanted her all to myself, and now they're all dead. Ronnie cries. What the fuck are you talking about? I ponder. Ronnie pauses. I'm native to these lands. I know that Native Americans get a bad rap around here. You don't say. I cut him off. He glares at me and then continues. But I know that this is real. I know that if I couldn't marry Savannah, I would rather be dead. Now, the skinwalker is out. They're always out, but I called this one. There's no saving me. He gets up and begins to walk to the door. 
You're not making any sense. What the hell are you talking about? I yell. Ronnie stops. I called the medicine man. He gave me instructions on how to summon the skinwalker. I marked Savannah's father, and it killed him. Now it killed Savannah, and clearly he wants me. He ignores you. Just stay safe, Dean. He continues to walk. What the hell are you doing? I demand. Giving myself to the skinwalker. He'll stop once I'm dead, but he'll want more, eventually. He'll get you if you call. If you stare. If you're scared. Ronnie says. No, I'm not going to let you do that. What makes you think it'll stop if you die? If you're not lying out of your ass. It just sounds like you're giving up, I say. He presses on the door before shoving it. Like I said, it's not going to happen. It's locked, and you can already see the wire in the windows. You're not going to die. Not if I can help it, I assert. Ronnie screams and begins to slam his hands and body against the doors. I take a step back and ready my pistol. Eventually, he breaks down and just cries. That's when I see it. A police cruiser rolls in. It pulls up to the front parking spot and comes out. Officer Jenny. <sighs> Not OJ. I have to do something. Move, I commanded. Ronnie scurries out of the way as I shuffle through the massive keys that I have. Then I see the thing, charging at her in the distance. No! I yell. I find the key, unlock and rip the door open. Dean, buddy, what's the issue? Asks OJ. I draw my gun. Hey! She yells and draws hers. Behind you! I yell. She realizes I'm pointing my gun behind her and sees it. Whoa. Whoa, what the fuck? She yells. I fire my gun. Missed. She fires hers. Miss. She fires a few more rounds and missed. I grab her by her small frame and pull her in. She lands hard on her back and she's out cold. I go back and turn the key and the thing's locked out. Oh my god. I've never heard a gun get shot before, says Ronnie, astonished. He gasps. I turn to find the skinwalker standing at the front doors. It's strange. It seems to be slightly shorter than before. More agile, and his horns are more like goat horns now. Much smaller in comparison to the anther-like horns I saw earlier. Half man thing, half beast. This shit kind of looks like a naked man on the bottom and a goat or a bull on the top. It looks different. Is there two of them? I thought so. Until I saw, it started growing taller. It made disgusting snapping noises as it grew. Its horns extended out. And next thing I knew, it ran away. We're screwed, I said. What happened to you staying alive? Ronnie says. Look here. It's you, me, and a passed out cop right now. Her cruiser is there. Maybe we got a shot at getting out of here. My car is... I stumble. Is what? Ronnie cuts in. The back. The back door. Shit, it's not locked. I run while Ronnie follows. It's too late. We made it to the back room to find the skinwalker standing in the door. It points its face to Ronnie. He freezes. Thinking quickly, I slam the back office door shut. Ronnie, help me! I shout. We pick up Officer Jenny. To the cooler. It'll lock itself, I say. We pull OJ into the cooler with us closing it all the way and locking it behind us. OJ is still out cold. The fridge is locked from the outside and Ronnie is on the verge of crying. What a bitch. D Dean? Ronnie muttered out. What? I demanded. Is she okay? Is she dead? He asked. No, you dick. She just got knocked out. I say, honestly, how stupid can this idiot be? I'm not going to lie, she hasn't moved, and I don't know how well she'd do in a cooler. Uh, Ronnie scurries his fat ass over to Jenny and leans in real close. 
The fuck are you doing? I demand. What if she needs CPR? Arnie squeaks. Move your ass over, I say. I look over and do a once-over to see if she's bleeding from anywhere. Nope. I can see the condensation leaving her mo- I can see the condensation leaving her nose and mouth in the cold air. She's fine, see? She's still breathing, I say. OJ starts grumbling. Jenny. Officer Welsh, I call. I heard you the first time, OJ groans out. Shit, you really went all out on my skull, didn't you, die arch? She muttered out. Well, I... I say she overlaps. You mind telling me what the hell you're doing with a skinwalker? Me and Ronnie are shocked. Uh, you mean... I ask and she cuts me off. Yeah, they're real. There's no hiding it from you, but... Like I said, what are you doing hanging around them? She demanded. You know, OJ, just doing my job. Before Romeo over here barred his in and called one to take out his girl's dad. I glare at Ronnie. You did what? She asks. I, 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 he stumbles. He called one to take out his girlfriend's dad because he didn't get the blessing to get hitched. I stay. Jenny gives him the mom stare. Did you? She asks. Yes, he said. What the fuck is wrong with you? She demands, whacking him on the back of the head. Do you know what those things are? Do you know how many cops were lost to those sons of bitches? Do you know how many families we had to lie to just to cover them up and keep to say and protected? Skinwalkers don't hurt people unless they're called. Very rarely, if they need to hunt. Hey, I cut her off. Listen, we all hear a faint banging noise, growing more aggressive with each strike. We peer through the racks in the cooler to see through the glass doors. Next thing you know, the office door comes flying across the store and crashes into the register. It comes out, scanning the area. After finding nothing, it approaches the double doors and peels them off their hinges and tosses the frames behind. Oh my god, we're dead, cries Ronnie. No, Romeo, we aren't dead. Not yet, OJ says. For now, let's get our heads on straight. Seconds pass like minutes, minutes like hours. I check my watch, and it's only been three minutes in real time. We gotta think of something. That, and I don't have my gun. I must have dropped it when Dean pulled me in, OJ says. Hey, die Ark, let me use your gun in the meantime. The hell you are, I say, giving her bitch face. You damn straight I am, she asserts. Oh no, guys, don't fight. Ronnie squeals. Shut up, Ronnie. Shut up, Romeo. We overlap each other. I thought you said he was Romeo. OJ says. Yeah, the Romeo to his now gone Juliet. I say. The silence grows louder. You're right. You'd have to pry my Beretta out of my cold, dead fingers before I'd give him up. Let's go out and find my gun. OJ says. Y yeah, right. The door's locked from the outside. Ronnie says. Shit. She mutters. Any plans? Yeah, the shelf posts are bolted into the ground and the walls. But the shelves themselves, they're held in with a metal peg. Help me take off the product and we should be able to push open the glass door from the inside, I say. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go for it, OJ exclaims. We begin taking cans, beer, and bottles off the shelves and throwing them behind us. Ronnie and I lift the metal shelves up, and OJ helps us pull them out and get them to the back. After a few minutes, 
we finally have enough space for OJ to squeeze out. OJ, I think you can fit through there. Squeeze out and open the cooler door, I say in a low voice, handing her my gun. Are you sure, Diark? I don't want to get between you and your babe, she says, referring to my gun. She laughs and squeezes out. Quickly, she presses her back to the wall, pointing my gun to confirm clear. She makes her way back around and opens the cooler doors. We're clear for now. I hope you didn't miss your sweetie for too long, she says as she hands my gun back. Now cover me so I can look for mine. We crouch down and make our way to the front doors. We find our gun almost immediately. I'm assuming these things don't know what guns are, because I don't know about you. If I saw a free gun on the ground, I would take it, OJ says. Shit, who wouldn't? I chimed in. Me, Ronnie says. We know. It's okay, says OJ. Let's get back to my truck. We can make it down to the station. From there, we can have Sergeant hunt this thing down. You've killed one before? How? Ronnie says. You get a big enough gun, you can kill anything, OJ says. I'll drink to that, I say. Come on, we gotta move. The station is just a few miles down the road, OJ says. We make our way to our truck and get in, back out and drive. We're flooring it, going at least 70 to 80 miles per hour. It's so dark that we can't risk crashing, but OJ knows these roads like the back of our hand. Jenny tried calling into the station. Static echoes. Buckle up, boys. We're going for one hell of a joyride, Jenny says. We'll be fine, right? Uh, right? Ronnie whimpers. Wrong. The skinwalker is running behind us, catching up to the truck. Shit, they can do that? Ronnie yelps. Yeah, they're hella fast. Just don't look at him. If you do, stare him down, kid. You hear me? Stare him down, OJ yells. That thing's going to look at Ronnie, Jenny, and we all know he's not going to stare that skinwalker down, I reply. Ronnie boy, you need to put on your big boy pants now. If he tries looking at you, you look back. You got that, kid? You got that? She screamed at him. But it's too late. The skinwalker is already staring at a crying Ronnie. The beast tears off one of its antler-like horns and throws it under the car, causing a blowout. No, shit! Jenny yells. Jenny loses control of the truck, fishtailing from side to side. Brace yourselves, Jenny shrieks. Up ahead, I see the famous bend on the 64. I'm screaming no in my head, but I can't find the nerve to get it out. Dean? I'm scared, Jenny says. I turn to see that she started to cry. Jenny, listen to me. We don't have time to be scared. On the count of three, slam on the brakes, I shout. Jenny nods. One, two, three. Hit the brakes, I yell as I pull the handbrake. The truck fishtails one last time before I can feel the tires lifting off the ground. Shit. Time freezes, like everything is going in slow motion. I turn to see the safety rails and think we might just be saved. But it's the rail that threw the car over the edge. Don't get me wrong, Arizona is pretty flat, but trying to break at 80 miles an hour and hitting a low barrier sends a truck rolling. Everything goes black. Which wouldn't be so bad if I didn't know Ronnie wasn't wearing his seatbelt. I come to. The truck is still hissing. OJ is passed out, and Ronnie is nowhere to be found. Fuck him. Fuck that guy. Why didn't he just wear his fucking seatbelt? Luckily, the truck landed tire side down. I get out of the truck. Ronnie! I scream. Ronnie, answer me, you son of a bitch! I threatened. I hobble around the fields, trying to find Ronnie. I notice OJ is coming around. Dean! Dean, where are you? 
I think my leg is broken. Dean! Jenny groans. Just don't move, Jenny. I need to find Ronnie. I yell. That's when I see it. An irregular lump in the dry and rocky landscape. Is that Ronnie? I approach it. It's too dark to see. One step closer and closer. I reach my hand out. And just when I'm about to touch the shape. Dean! My door is stuck. I can't get it open. I smell gasoline. Says Jenny. I turn, but it's too late. The back of the truck bursts into flames. Jenny shrieks. No! I yell, doing my best to run to the truck, feeling my own joints and bones aching and cracking. No, the door is stuck. You have to get me out of here. Jenny starts panicking. I'm going to get you out. I yell and make my way to the other door. Fire begins to envelop the dry shrubs and grass under Jenny's truck. The components under the hood catch fire, popping and searing. Dean, I'm running out of time. Jenny says, crying. I pry the passenger side door open and try at her seatbelt, but the console of her truck wedged the belt's buckle between the base of the seat and the console itself. Jenny shrieks as the dashboard begins to melt and drop on her legs. She kicks at each piece of debris that falls onto her. Teen, I don't want to die. Jenny cries. I'm not going to let you die. I yell. I begin ripping apart the center console, bending it until the lid broke off. In the console, I found a buck knife. Welsh! I scream as I unsheath the knife and cut her belt over the lap. It was close enough to slide through the buckle's loop pretty quickly. I wedge my feet on the chair and the melting steering wheel and kick, causing both of us to fall out of the car, and Jenny shrieks. I realize her femur is sticking out of her leg. She passes out. I carry her out of the rock and burning shrubs, and gently lay her down about twenty feet away from the burning truck. I hear sirens. How? No one was on the road. Then I see it. The skinwalker. It's walking towards the weird bump in the landscape. It crouches down and picks up the lump. It screams, revealing that it was, indeed, Ronnie. How did he survive the crash? No, no! Ronnie screams as the thing runs with him, dragging him behind and across the desert scape like a rag doll. I run after him, gun unholstered, but the skinwalker runs faster. So I point my gun and take my shot. I hear the creature groaning and bodies tumbling. I hit it. I run as fast as I can to find Ronnie and the skinwalker about 200 feet away. I can't feel my arms and legs, he says, crying, but I ignore him. Where is that motherfucker? Where's he at? Where are you at? I demand. I stomp around the area and finally find it trying to crawl away. I see my bullet hit its leg. It's dangling by a thread. I lost it. I unloaded the rest of my magazine into the fucker. And when I ran out of bullets, I pulled the trigger a few more times just to be sure. Then I got on top of him and began to decimate the remains of the thing. Using Jenny's knife to cut out its still beating heart, listening to its squeal, then die as I pull out its lungs. I knew he was dead. I was drenched in its blood. And if that wasn't good enough, I took the knife and cut around the circumference of its wrist and ankles, made an X-shaped incision from the torso to its extremities, and peeled its skin off. Or at least what was left. It was dense, coarse, and heavy. When I got to its head, I broke its neck with the butt of OJ's buck knife, and cut the muscles around the base of the skull, and pulled that son of a bitch's head off. It was still twitching when I began walking away from its hide. I was delusional. In shock. Ronnie? He was silent almost the entire time. I'll never know if he was able to see what happened. Quite frankly, I don't give a shit if he did. He needed to grow a pair. I dragged the thing's hide back to the scene, and the cops and fire department saw me. They drew their weapons while the EMTs ran to see if I was okay. The cops demanded that they back off and command that I put the deer down. I can hear Jenny in pain. Good. I know she's alive. When the cops got to me, they froze because they knew that I wasn't holding a deer. They patted me on the back and demanded the EMTs help this man now. They knew. So they silently and awkwardly patched me up, cleaned me off, and kept me covered. Most of the rides to the local hospital is a blur. I remember the ride was awkward and silent. The EMTs only checked on me to make sure I wasn't showing signs of concussion or other internal damage. 
turns out I had a compressed spine, concussion, and a bruised rib, and minor internal bleeding. I remember the pain I was in, but was too shaken to really care. Ronnie was paralyzed from the neck down, suffering internal brain hemorrhaging. The doctors didn't know how he survived that crash. He was stabilized and went through the night. He ended up dying two days later. That fucker. Jenny was surprisingly okay. She suffered a broken femur, several concussions, and several second-degree burns to the shins and thighs. She has some trouble using her left leg now, but she's working through it. We went to the kid's funeral. It was the least we could do. They buried him and Savannah next to each other. They didn't find her body, but held a service anyway. And Savannah's father next to them. Well, at least his empty casket. It's a sick thing Ronnie did. But he was just a stupid kid. A stupid fucking kid. Hey, die arc. Jenny broke my thoughts. What? I grunted. It's a brave thing you did out there. You've saved my life, she said. The kid died, I replied. I know, Dean. That wasn't your fault. Nobody could have ever done this the way we did. We were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hell, I would be dead right now if you hadn't pulled me out of the fire, into the cooler, uh, into the store. As far as the cops see it, you're a hero, she states. Uh, yeah, I asked, just letting her talk. We need folks like you on the force, Dean. I don't know where you got your instincts from, but it would be a gold mine, she says. I'll think about it, I say, ignoring her. She ended up getting me to cave, especially after she, herself, healed. It's been a couple of years since this all happened. Jenny stayed by my side the entire time, dedicated to take those suckers out. We know a 45 hollow point can take out one of those fuckers. We hunt them with 45s and up. We've only gotten a few over the years, but that's better than none. And it turns out they want revenge. We're waiting, and we're prepared. It's been about a decade since the first recorded death of a skinwalker in Tuseon, but now we know that they're smart and fast, but still killable. We also know that they want the hides of their kind. We'll come and get them, fuckers. We're waiting. You did fine, Dean, OJ insisted. I appreciate it, but you need to know that could have gone smoother, I replied, disgruntled. We throw the dead skinwalker into the back of my truck and cover it with a tarp. You don't get to complain, Dean. Your aim's better than mine, Jenny says. And all I can complain about is how much of a fucking mess you made when you killed these things. Yeah, I joke. Show me how to shoot something without it bleeding. Then I'll show you what I can do. That's not what I meant, Dean. You know what I mean. Jenny asserted. I get you're upset, and we're not exactly killing these fuckers in the name of mercy, but you've got some serious anger issues you got to work out. The ride to the station was less than pleasant. I knew OJ was right, but I also knew she could be hard-headed. We made our way back to the station. Hey! It's Dean and OJ! Should I say DJ? exclaims Daryl. Ha, gets me every time, I say, clearly annoyed. Hey, Daryl, get back to filing your important paperwork, or I'll tell your wife you went to that club last night, Jenny backlashed. The office roars. Yeah, staying late my ass. If you actually stayed late, like you tell Heather, you'd actually have some field time and not a mountain of paperwork to finish. She adds on, slamming the office door. We both heard the entire office teasing Daryl as we peer through, then close the blinds. So are you going to tell me or what? Jenny insists. You were silent the entire ride here. I guess you're not in a good place, but obsessing over whatever isn't going to help you sleep at night. I would know. We do share a bed. We're not going to do this. Not here, not now. I say, bolting towards the door. Then when, Dean? When are you going to figure out that there's never a good place or a good time to talk about it? I put my hand on the doorknob and freeze, 
realizing she's right. I know. You know that I've had a crush on you since I worked at that gas station. I say, locking the door. And saving your life has been the best thing that's ever happened, because I know it's probably the only reason you said yes to my proposal. It's the only reason you said yes to any of my dates. It's the only reason you're in my life as my wife. It's the only reason we had a kid. The only reason we're in this office, arguing about the petty shit. And I don't think you realize how hard it is to appreciate that from my perspective. I monologue. Then what is it about? Me appreciating you? God, it's like I have to fall to my knees and worship you to get it through your head that I do love you. Jenny exclaims. I never asked you to bow down to my will. I never asked you to worship me. I didn't ask for any of this. I feel like the shit we're doing is just so forceful and artificial that it pulls every past element in question. What's real, Jenny? You expect to know anything and everything there is to know, but never tell me what's up with you? I can't do it. You've got to tell me what's fucking with your mind, too. You're just stone-faced in and out of the office. I'm your husband, but you can still treat me like that cashier you met years ago. I said sternly. Just be real with me, Jenny. I'm not just another case for you to work on. I'm not doing this. Not now. She heads for the door. No, we are. You wanted to chit-chat? Now let's talk. I said, blocking the door. Move, Dean, she states. You can't just do this shit. You asked me to talk, and I did. Now you're running away? I argue. Hey, uh, is everything alright in there? Sounds like domestic violence if you ask me, Mark says, knocking harshly at the door. Yeah, Jenny says, unlocking and pulling the door open. We were just leaving. Thanks for minding your own fucking business, Davidson. She bitches. I'll take my cruiser home. See you in a few, Dean. She storms off. Ooh, die arc. Nice to know she's got the pants in this relationship. The office roars. Don't forget your purse, buddy. Daryl chimes in. Hey, don't be mad that Heather has your balls in her purse, Daryl. We all know your ass is whipped. I replied. The office screams on as I leave. I rush home and get the skinwalker strung up in the garage. I've learned to drain the blood on sight. It makes less of a mess at home. I'm almost done skinning the thing before Jenny comes in. I'm going to Addie's, Jenny says, breaking the silence. We still need to finish our conversation, I say, peeling off the rest of the hide. She pauses for a second and sighs. I don't know how long we can keep Dana. She's got schoolwork to do. Just get that thing out of here before she sees. I'll keep her distracted for you, but I'm shooing her away in 15 minutes. She nods, closing the door and leaves. I skin the thing and bury the body in a pre-dug hole, planting a tree on top. Same plan, same execution, done on time. We have six other trees like this one. Hopefully nobody gets nosy and tries to see why we're planting so many of them. It's not like anyone at the office is in the dark. It's the civilians that we have to worry about. I watch as Dana leaves. Bye bye, Mr. Dyark. She shouts as she closes her car door and leaves. Of course, I offer the friendly wave. It's getting dark out, and Sage only wards off skinwalkers. It's no guarantee. I rush inside to cold food for McDonald's, again. That's when I hear a noise outside. I see the red eyes peering in the distance. For the second time today, I'm dealing with a skinwalker. Where's Jenny when you need her? I dart upstairs and search for and hide Clay. Clayton, son, wake up. Daddy? He mutters. Look, bud, we're out of time. We're going all in for real. A time to play cat and mouse, I say hurriedly. Clay springs up for joy. Really? For real? Yes, Clay, but you're mouse first. Hide in for the secret spot so mommy doesn't find you and remember to wear your super strong, super protective Diego the Explorer button. Daddy, it's go Diego, go. Clay corrects. Yeah, kid, I, I know. Hide, I assert. Clay gets up and puts his go Diego, go vest with his favorite stuffed animal and hides in the cross, hides in the crawl space in the back of the closet. He turns on the lantern inside. Now Clay, don't open the door to anyone. 
Not me, not mommy, not Dana. Nobody. Got it? I ask. He proudly nods. Unless you say the magic word and open the door. Good. You remember. I exclaim. Now hush hush until you hear the magic word, okay? I see he silently nods and I close the door. I can hear him lock it from the inside. But what Clay wasn't expecting was that I would padlock the door shut on my side. It doesn't matter who showed up. If they don't know where to look, they can't find him. If they hear him, I don't know what I'd do. I'm not going to risk it. Not now, not ever. <sighs> Jenny, answer the fucking phone. There's a skinwalker scoping out the place. Be careful. I love you. I leave one more message. I confirm that all the doors and windows are locked. Not that it'd matter. They're double pane, bulletproof, plexiglass. The doors are reinforced, lightweight steel. Nobody in, nobody out. I turn around to find Jenny standing behind me. Oh Christ, I have my gun out. How'd you get in? Did you get my messages? I interrogated. Yes, Dean. Jenny says meekly. What does the last message say? Verbatim. I ask. Baby, it's me. You don't have to ask me all these questions. She says. You're not Jenny. I say, pointing my gun at her. Before I can pull, the fake Jenny looks up with those red eyes and blows some kind of powder in my face and runs. I'm careful not to breathe, but I think I inhaled some anyway. Fuck. They can shift into other people? I run to the kitchen and try to clean my eyes, ears, nose, and mouth of the foreign substance. But as I run to the sink, my vision becomes blurry, legs heavy, and arms flaccid. I'm blacking out. I made one last ditch effort to activate the GPS on my phone so Jenny can track me. I blacked out before I was able to confirm it was on. I wake up, groggy, tied to a large wooden post that's been dragged through the woods. <sighs> hey! Hey! I yell. The skinwalker stops and peers at me. I know from Jenny that you can never break eye contact. It's never been this hard. Usually I peer at them with iron sights in between. This time, I have no gun. I'm bound and I'm alone. What do you want, you son of a bitch? Vengeance? I provoke. They know no words that could ever do you justice, you fool. I hear a woman speak. She's wearing an owl mask that covers the top half of her face. She walks towards me and continues. But I hear it's you who destroy my babies. What do you have to say for yourself? She demands. Your babies? You bird these animals? I question, sickened. Birth? No, these children are not of my flesh. They are the wicked, the divine. They seek out the world that hosts them. They are those who choose to live outside the life of humiliation, she said. Before I was able to add to her crazy, she gestures to the skinwalker and points to a pile of wood. The skinwalker drags me to the pile, lifts the stake, and presses it into the ground. So this is it? I ask. You kill me and think you're free? This won't stop the killings. This will not end the fight between you skinwalkers and humankind, I state. Kill you? You fool. We know you're the leader in your pack. We're not going to kill you. A dead leader creates chaos, but dead followers. That leaves one leader with nobody to follow. A madman, she says. Before I knew it, she turns into an owl and flies away. She's a skinwalker too. But her transformation was smooth and silent. Usually skinwalkers bend and crack in awkward ways before changing into something that usually looks like a deer or a wolf. I would know. I have their hides. I guess I wait. The sun is pretty much all the way down at this point. I'm just relieved that they don't have Jenny or Clay. I watch as the stripes of red, magenta, orange, and yellow fade from the sky, one at a time. I feel the bugs biting and pricking my arms and neck. As the moon rules the sky, I can hear faintly in the distance, Jenny. We are currently in the approximate area where his phone last pinged. If the project pings correlate well enough with our info, he's here. Team 1, you will finish searching subsection A, then B, then C. We're not resting until we find my husband. 
I don't care if we, God forbid, recover a body. We're finding him. I hear her voice command. No. I know they're going to be picked off one by one if they split up. I've got to act quickly. I doubt the owl bitch is going to cut me a deal. I begin wrestling and twisting my wrist to loosen the ties. The owl bitch shrieks and digs her talons into my shoulders. That way! I hear Jenny yell. I hear the troops running my way. The owl bitch lets go and flies. Jenny comes first, followed by a moderately large group of men. Dean! OJ runs to me. No, it's a trap! Men, clockwork formation! I command. You hear him! Cover your sixes! Jean asserts. The troops are... The troops arrange themselves in a circle, backs to each other, kneel, guns out, with OJ in the center. Dean, buddy, talk to me. What do I need to know? Jenny asks. Look for red eyes. There's two known walkers. One is Easy ID. The other is an owl, I say. Heard. One birdie, one walker, Jenny confirms. Keep your eyes peeled, she commands. That's when a large rock comes flying from the sky, knocking Jenny out. No! I yell. Maintain formation! I command, still bleeding from the shoulders. Davidson, Whitmore, Fabritz, focus, bird. Gordon, confirm clear, then cut my ties! I command. Gordon scans the area, then approaches me, climbing on the mound. He stores his gun and reaches for his knife. He partially cuts free my hand before a blow dart nails him in the neck. Fuck! No! Give me the knife! I command, but Gordon goes down, tumbling down the pile of wood before he can get to me. It came from my one! I cry. The man focused to my one. We get ambushed by about four walkers, who pull four men from the back of the group, then two more from the front. Guns fire, but to no avail. The formation was broken, and there is nobody. All six men have been successfully disarmed and pulled away from the group. I can still hear them yelling but their screams are fading. Gordon is still at my feet, and Jenny is down. That's when I see the woman with the owl mask approaching me. You really believe you can defeat us? That was easy. Easy enough to lead me to believe that there's more. Any more magic tricks, Dean? I stay silent. Shame. I'm willing to make a deal with you. I'll keep your men alive, and they'll stay that way if you retrieve from me one thing. She remarks. I don't make deals, bitch, I grunted. Fine. Your rules, your way. She turns around and lights a bundle of wood on fire, transforms back into an owl and flies away. Shit, what is she going to do? I tear the rope and free my right hand, then grasp the stake and start pulling at the rope to tie and free my left hand. It wasn't too hard to pull apart. With my legs still tied, I let myself fall forward and try to reach Gordon's knife. It's too far, and the rope is clenching my ankles to the stake. Fuck, I mutter to myself. I push myself back up and try to crouch, feel around and undo the rope around the feet, which is harder than it seems when it's dark, and the rope is taut enough to inhibit my bending. It's almost like I could pivot my ankles with minimal clinching, but I can't angle the legs inwards or outwards to bend. That's it. I could try and pivot around the stake to loosen the rope. I firmly grasp the stake and pivot around it, flexing my calves to allow a saw-like motion to work away at the rope. But it didn't seem to be doing much. Shit, I mutter, defeated. I look up to find the eyes of a skinwalker in the distance, dragging one of my men towards me. I grasp the stake, hoping the thing didn't see that I was untied. As the skinwalker approached, it placed Daryl in front of me. Hey, buddy. Daryl says, monotone. I stay silent. Is it actually Daryl? He sounded like fake Jenny when he spoke. I need your help. I will die. I don't want to die. Will you help? Says Daryl. Before I could answer, the other skinwalkers approach my stake, dragging unconscious troops to my sight from all directions and piling them onto the mound of wood. I turn to find Jenny only to see her being lifted by a skinwalker and gently placed at my feet. The silence grows louder. The owl transforms back into the woman and approaches me. Have you decided wisely? She asks. Putting my troops' lives at stake is the most cliché power play. Once the collateral is gone, what'll happen? 
you'd only be digging your own grave, I state. Fair enough, but look at it this way. Once your forces are gone, there will be nothing stopping we skinwalkers from prowling the earth. You humans know so much, yet it only scratches the mere surface of the truth. She replies, What will you gain from breeding your kind? Superiority? Dominance? There is no world to control without the chaotic nature of cat and mouse. You'd only be dooming yourself and your kind to turn on itself, just like mankind. I provoke. You disdainful boar. The minds of free-willed flesh is the only mistake that's been had. Men amongst men will stall its progression, yet it's men among men who will catalyze its development. The sensuous and arrogant appetite is man's only downfall. We crave peace, solitude. Man is the only species who prevents us from our haven. We will not be driven from our land. You will extinguish our kind no longer. She refuses. Killing us will only bring more. First by the tens, then by the hundreds. The only way you can live in secrecy is to run away. It's a responsibility that's clearly too much for you to handle. Just run. Run while there's still time. I reply. Running will only allow you to take more. She hisses. I look down at Jenny, only to see that she's crying. It appears your companion is awake, she observes. I'll give you just a few moments to your love while you still both live. Jenny drags herself up and finds her strength, or at least enough to loosely stand. I love you, Dean. Never forget me. She holds back her tears. I know, OJ. Give me one last kiss, I ask. She stumbles and clutches my shoulders. I can smell the blood coming off the top of her skull. Quickly thinking, I pull the knife off her side and on the gut of her hip and fire at the woman. But the skinwalker standing next to her jumps between me and her, taking the bullet. The woman shrieks. The skinwalker that took the bullet is now dying. Now it seems like a trance is broken and the skinwalkers become disoriented. One of the walkers comes and tears Jenny away from me. After regaining lucidity, my men search for their protection. While the woman and skinwalkers are distracted, I cut the rope at my feet using OJ's knife. I hear my men screaming, commanding, and teaming up, using their spare knives, guns, or weapons to fend off the nearest beast. A couple of them transform to an animal and flee. I run at the woman and tackle her, using my knife to cut her neck just a little. Bring her back, I demand. Tell the skinwalker that took her away to bring her back. I can't. You broke the chain of spells. I have to see the skinwalker that took her, she begs. In spite, I take the butt of my knife and break her nose. She screams in pain. Simultaneously, the living skinwalkers turn and peer at me. Soon after, they all charge at me. My men were able to pick off one or two at the tail end, but one got to me and hurled me off the witch. I feel branches and thorns pierce my skin and break my ribs as I land in a mesquite tree. Helpless, I can only watch as the witch turns back into an owl and flies into the night. The trip back to the emergency room was hell. First, we had to hike to the nearest road for ambulance access, besides one of the troops breaking an arm or busting a lip. Everyone was seemingly unscathed. That witch had enough power to control these skinwalkers, and these walkers have enough superhuman capabilities to have killed all of us. Why didn't they? For the first time, the fire beneath my ass is gone. I don't feel hatred or disgust, bitterness or revulsion. I'm scared. I know that I'm staring silently into the nothingness. I know that if I don't sleep, I can't save Jenny. I know that if I force myself to eat, I'll be strong enough to save Jenny. I'm literally watching myself spiral into an obsessive, compulsive fit of controlled rage. The guys at the office tell me they'll keep searching. They tell me that we'll save her. She's Jenny. She's a fighter. But I already know the chances of finding a missing person after 48 hours MIA 
is almost a guarantee to the possibility of finding a body. It's been three weeks. I already told Clay that Mommy is gone and she'll be back. I told him not to worry. Needless to say, Dana has been practically living at the house. She knows I can't possibly pay her for all the time she's been over. She feels bad because she knows Jenny is missing. Almost anyone in Jenny's life has been over to try to help me cope. If anything, they're forcing me into my tunnel vision. They need to stop. Or else I will do something stupid. I've got to step away emotionally from this situation so I can clear my head. You've been cleaning your gun all night. Dana finally breaks the silence. I glance at her, knowing she needs to go back home. Knowing she's probably tired and knowing she can't pay her bills or college tuition on free babysitting. Look, Mr. Dyark, I know that Miss Dyark is your wife, but the obsessing isn't going to help. She speaks. I think it's time for you to go. I bitterly reply. Fine, she says, grabbing her backpack. I know I've overstepped my bounds. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to help. I stare, expecting her to leave. If there's anything you need me to do, you have my number, she says. She's right. I need to do something. Clay comes running down the stairs. Daddy, Mommy's shirt is in the trees, he says. I feel the chills run through my spine as I sharply turn towards him. Really? Show me, I demand. Clay leads back up the stairs to his room, where he finds Jenny's flannel casually hanging from the tree branch. No blood. Nothing. It looks just like the night she found me three weeks ago. Clayton, stay here. I'm going to go and see why Mommy's shirt is there. I say, closing and locking his door. It's a classic trap. I call for backup. After about ten minutes, the search team arrives. Buddy, how you doing? Daryl asks. Uh, fine. The shirt Jenny was wearing at the time of disappearance is located at the east end of the property, in a tree. I'm pretty sure the skinwalkers are baiting. Uh, for what? Uh, I don't know. I state. Die Ark! Hank calls. Look at this! He points out some writing on each of the trees. What are these, runes? Daryl asks. Uh, why only on one of those trees? Hank asks. I think they know. I stutter out. Know what? Daryl asks. These trees are where I buried the bodies of the skinwalkers I hunted. I reply. Hey! Hank yells, pointing his gun out to the open. I look in the direction to see that someone's there, hiding in the wilderness. To same police, show yourself! Daryl blares out. The three of us go to see who's spying on us. Before we know it, a woman jumps out and runs away into the wilderness. Hey, stop right there, Hank says. We all chase the woman, but she's fast. After a minute or two of running, we're barely within sight of my house. I can't keep going. Clay's home alone, I assert. Then go back. I'll call Heather. She'll watch your kid. We'll keep looking for the woman in the meantime, Daryl says, pulling out his cell phone. It's getting dark out. I expect you guys to be using the phone trackers. We can't afford to lose anybody. I bark. Yes, sir. Hank and Daryl affirm. They turn on their GPSs and head out. I run back home and look for Clay, expecting for him to be doing something in his room behind his locked door. I get through the back and head upstairs. Clay! I call out, knocking on the door. There's no answer. Clay! I bang on the door, reaching for the top of the door frame for the key. Bingo. I shove the key into the pinhole-style lock and unlock the door, shoving it open. Clayton, where are you at? I demand. I look under the bed. Nothing. The window is still closed, so I go to the closet door to see if he's in the crawl space. Clay! I shout, ripping the crawl space door open. I find Clay, clearly scared. Why didn't you answer me? I yelled. He points behind me to the owl I recognized from three weeks ago. But before I can get up and charge at the witch, skinwalkers come in and bombard us. Daddy! Clay screams, 
No! I shout. They take clay and run as another skinwalker grabs my arms and another grabs my legs. This is it, isn't it? They're going to kill me. But they stop. The witch approaches me. You'll regret the day, she says. She gestures and the skinwalkers take me into the wilderness, full speed. It's like an odd dream, like I've been here before. Eventually, I see that famous bend on the 64. I realize we're going north, towards the Grand Canyon. Besides the occasional annoying tourist attraction or hiking route, there's really nothing there. So I'm assuming that's where I am to be slaughtered, massacred like I did those other skinwalkers. At least I'll be able to see Jenny. I already know she's dead. There was so much blood dripping from her hair when they took her away. There's no way they let her live. Even if she did survive, why wouldn't they kill her? She hunted them just like I did. I wasn't going to fight. There's no use in getting road rash. These things run at 60 to 70 miles an hour. I'm unarmed. The only thing I have to live for was... The only thing I had to live for was Clay. Jenny. But now I don't know what's going to happen. Besides the occasional bump, nick, or scratch, I am relatively unscathed. We reach the south end of the Grand Canyon. All the skinwalkers seem to gather near the edge. Then, one by one, they jump off the rim. Holy shit! I exclaim. Then, the two skinwalkers carrying me line me up, paralleling the canyon. No, no! I scream and fight. They hurl me over the rim. I let out a scream, but the group of walkers that jumped before me harshly caught me, knocking the wind out of me. Feeling the adrenaline rush, I put up a fight. Worst case scenario is that they kill me. To no avail. They hold me down. I can't even really squirm in my position. Ah! I scream in frustration. More like grunt out because I still can't breathe. After my fit of rage, they continue alongside the Colorado River, seeming to move in a more calculated manner. Eventually, falls. Everything falls silent. No insects, no river. Silence. I can only hear the sounds of my own breath and a fluttering in the night. Then I see her. The owl dives from the sky above and lands in front of the walkers. She turns back into a human and walks towards a flat side of the canyon wall. She mumbles something and takes a vial, pours its contents into her hands and begins drawing on the wall. They looked like some kind of pictographic runes, similar to the ones of the trees I planted. The runes slide down to the ground. Behind us, I can hear rocks scraping as the riverbed pulls itself open. A dim light emits from the hole. She jumps in. The skinwalkers follow, jumping in. Same as the last time. I am thrown down to the pack of skinwalkers, caught, then restrained. It appears she's been established here for a while. The cave-like hole seems to burrow further into the canyon. We follow the witch. We walk for a moment or two before I begin to hear someone crying. I think it's Clay. Clayton! I shout. Daddy, I'm scared! He screams. I know, buddy. Just stay strong for me, okay? I assure. The two skinwalkers carry me to a cell-like cave and hold me down. The others in the group wedged thick wood posts in the cracks of the rock, ultimately fashioning a jail cell. It's weird being on the other side of prosecution, with no intentions to protect. Not for me. Not for Clay. By the looks of it, we're being guarded. I look across the cave and see another cell, made the same way with a woman inside. All I can see is her back. I wonder what she did to deserve this. To my left is Clay's cell, and to my right, another cell. I wonder who's in that one. Maybe it's empty. We wait. I have no concept of time to communicate. There's no light besides the torches and the fire pit. These skinwalkers just sit and stare. They are still as stone, not even really blinking. Occasionally, the witch has brought some kind of dead animal or plant. She ultimately throws all or some of the items into the fire, mumbling. Suddenly, a skinwalker approaches the witch. She stares at the skinwalker. Bring me the remains, she commands. 
the skinwalker bows and leaves. Dean Dioc, she summons. Seeing that I didn't respond, she turns her head to me and asks one more time. Dioc, Dean. She provokes, semi-sensually striding towards my cell. You're not going to monologue, are you? I gawk. Because I really don't want to hear it. I continue. Oh, I think you do, she says, surely. Right, I reply. The skinwalker comes back with a long box, maybe three to four feet long and one to two feet wide, and props it open to face me. Do you know what's in this box? She asks. Your hopes and dreams? I provoke. Hmm, you could say that. More like my despairs and incubus, she says, monotone. She opens the box to reveal a seemingly human skeleton, arranged with an empty slot on top, and what I can assume are the pelvis, legs, and arms of the remains. As you know, I treat these creations with the tyranny of my own kin. If they find themselves in trouble, I write a spell. If they are hurt, I heal. Yeah, yeah, what's your point? You care. Good for you. Maybe next you win the next presidential election or Nobel Peace Prize, I say sarcastically. That's quite the audacity for someone in a jail cell, officer, she states. Especially since we have your very pride and joy. Your love and hate, she says. Your point? I gawk. When one of my skinwalkers betrays me, I take it personally. I cast a spell, I cast them out, whatever the case may be. This one, she gestures to the box, betrayed me. Oh, so let me guess. You killed him, iced him, laid him down. Yeah, I got that. What's the moral of the story? Don't hurt your feelings, or else, I say. Wrong again, Mr. Diark, as usual, she says. This one, I cast out for the night. Perhaps he'll strike fear to the locals. Maybe he'd sleep on the rock of the canyon, or maybe he'd come back and alone from his betrayal. Or maybe he'd come back and atone for his betrayal, she says. And? I ask. Clearly, Mr. Dyark, none of the expected bechance, she said. And? I ask. And? And this skinwalker happened to meet another witch. Or, shall I say, a wise man. Those damn do-gooders. Because he performed a simple ritual to summon skinwalkers. A ritual weak enough for most skinwalkers to ignore. But him. He was a novice at best. So he couldn't resist the spell and answered to the summons, she said. I sit silent. He was given a task, a feeble task that only mortals could ever be weak enough to request a skinwalker to do. It was to kill another mortal. Oh, please, give me a break. Just do it yourself, human. Don't distract yourself by having the supernatural entities do your petty work. She dramatically turns and gestures to no one. So I communicate to my skinwalker, telling him to ignore it and report back to me instead. He ignores me and thought out that he would bring back the three marked entities here and sacrifice them at the altar. Now that was an idea, she says with sarcastic excitement. I commanded he come back, but he never did. So, I say. She turns and directs the skinwalker behind her. It goes to the cell across from mine and pries open the wooden bars. The woman inside freaks out and backs up to the wall. The skinwalker grabs her and leads her out, throwing her in front of my cell. Do you know who this is? The witch asks. No, I reply. Oh, she was the topic of the night. You likely know this one as Savannah, she says, putting her hands on her hips. My stomach dropped. I look at her, and she's starting to tear up, face pressed into the ground. The missing persons case from five years ago, I mutter. Correct. There's a point for you. 
I would present to you her father, but he died during his stay. The remains are well disposed of. As for the third one, uh, what's his name? The blubbery one. She gestures to the skinwalker who twists Savannah's arm. Ronnie! It's Ronnie! She yells in pain. Hmm, that's the name. Ronnie. She repeats in disgust. The lardacious coward who summoned us to begin with. The one who earned an easy death. The one who started all of this, I mutter. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, Dean Dyark. I would have cared less for those weak, feeble mortals. But you, you have to butt in and save the day. Save the girl, get married. You even went as far as to have this disgusting child. She melodramatically gestures to Clay's cell. Why do you even care, witch? Why does my life matter to you so much? I cut in. Oh, don't be hasty, Dyark. The skull. Where's the skull? She pointed to the box. I don't know, I reply. I loathe these games, Dyark. You have to know where it is, she says, getting angry. I don't even know what you're talking about, I argue. The skinwalker you killed five years ago, Dean. Where is his skull? She demands. I say, it was taken from me by the police that night. I don't know. You are the cursed chief of police. You know where it's at. She demands. I defend. It's a shitty fucking skull. Why do you care so much? Because he's my son. She overlaps me, yelling. The cave falls quiet. We can only hear the witch heavily breathing. Savannah is sobbing now. Hanging in my office. At the Toussaint police station. I reply. A trophy. You made my son a trophy. She asks. Rhetorically. And as for the hide? She asks. Stored in the detached garage. Inside a wooden crate. There you will find seven hides. I reply. Thank you, Mr. Dyark. She says through gritted teeth. She continues. You heard him. Go. She commands the skinwalker. It leaves the room. Savannah's sobbing grows louder. Oh, shut up. The witch picks her up and shoves her. Savannah trips and lands in the fire. She shrieks. The witch glares at her actions and walks away. After regaining some level of control, Savannah rolls out of the flames while rapidly rubbing her hair to put it out. At least what's left of it. It's mostly charred scalp. She just lays there, twitching, moaning, and crying. Eventually, she drags herself back to the cell. Ages later, the walker returns, hauling the hides of the skinwalkers. Excellent, she says, sifting through them and picks up one of them. I'm assuming it's her son's. Seeing the others were buried to some proper degree, there's no use in keeping their skins, she says throwing the hides into the fire. As soon as the hides hit the fire, they scream. They sound distant, only fading away after a minute or two. She mutters more. The smoke turns white. I can see figures leaving the hides. Uh, spirits. Did you know, Mr. Dyark, that a skinwalker's spirit remains with the hide after death? Since you blindly preserved the hides, the spirit cannot pass on. Since the bodies are beneath the trees, I cannot put the hides back. Burying them will eventually lead to the decomposition. But in the meantime, fire shall purify, she says. I stare, not really caring. But I have to admit, it is scary to know that those spirits of the skinwalkers were still hanging around my house. It explains a lot, actually. Bring me the child, she commands. No. Whatever it is, witch, your beef is not with him. It's with me, I demand. Oh, you'll see, Dean Dyark. I'm not going to do anything I wouldn't do to my own child, or myself, for that matter. She replies. I'm not playing your fucking games. Whatever it is, let him go, I command. The witch glares at me, but the skinwalker in Clayton's cell has already brought him to her. 
She pulls a knife off her person, provoking me to charge the wood bars. The two skinwalkers in my cell grab each side of me and throw me to the back of the cell, pinning me to the wall and ground. The witch scoffs and slices her own palm. Child. Burden. Curse. She addresses Clay, kneeling. Today will be the best and worst day of your life. You will know pain, but you will also know love, she says. No. Clayton whines. Yes, fear not. I promise I will show you no harm, she says as the skinwalker holds him in position. She covers his mouth with her wounded hand. Clayton tries to scream but can't. All he can do is cry. No, what are you doing to him? I demand. One of the two skinwalkers in my cell holds their deformed arm across my mouth, silencing me. Clayton stops and falls silent. The skinwalker lets him go. He doesn't run. He doesn't cry. He doesn't flinch. He just stands there. After a second, he looks at me and cries, having a complete and total meltdown. The witch begins to click her tongue at him. It's all right, child. Your daddy loves you very much and he means well. You already see that he loves you, right? Clayton nods yes and heads to the cell across from him. The wooden bars are pried open and he is let in. The skinwalkers let me go. Poor fool, she comments. What did you do to him? I ask. The witch stares at me, approaching my cell. I showed him what you've done to my own, how you've murdered them. I told him the truth, she says. He's just a kid. He doesn't need to be seeing that shit, I yell. Just like we never needed to see our own die, your own die, she says. The skinwalkers let themselves out. I stand, confused. Reveal yourselves, the witch commands. The skinwalkers begin to bend, crack, and shriek, shedding their bloody hides. They're people, human. These monsters you've been exterminating are human. The same ones you swore to protect and serve, the witch says. Hello, Mr. Dyark, one says, peeling off her hide. Dana! I confirm. She nods and grasps one of the wooden bars of my cell. I've seen your good side and your worst. Quite frankly, Mr. Dyark. I wish I could defend you, but I can't, she says. She walks away towards the cell Clayton is in. He rushes to her, hugging her arm through the cell bars. These epiphanies always bring out so many emotions, just like battle, the witch says. I can only sit and watch in my own guilt. What can I even do? Even if I do save my son, even if I do bust out of here, I still have to live knowing I killed people. I didn't know they were human, but what am I going to do? I sit there, then lay. Reassume yourselves, the witch demands. The people reapply their skins and transform back into skinwalkers, circling the fire. I'll make you one last offer. A pact. You leave us alone, and we will leave you to the rest of your waking life, for however long you may live, the witch says. The skinwalkers approach and pry open my cell. You're not playing games. No conditions, no strings, I confirm. Only one thing. I want my son back. You killed him, but you can also bring him back, the witch says. How? I pry, more so demanded. A sacrifice. Pure atruvi, she says. I'll do it, Savannah cuts in from her open cell. Don't be so zany, darling. The divine won't want your broken soul. And your body doesn't have much to offer, either. It's not like you're a virgin, nor do you have virgin blood. If you were, I just might have said yes. But you have nothing to live for. The witch scoffs. 
Silence. Savannah just cries more and more. No, I can't. Not my son. I retract. Hmm, I thought so. Alternately, the witch says. Me. It's me. I'll do it. I hear a woman mutter from Clayton's new cell. She barely walks out of the cell. She's lost so much weight. She's bony, frail. It's Jenny. Jenny! I leap forward, only to be stopped by the skinwalkers. I can't. There's another way. There's always another way, I say. I'm afraid not, Mr. Dyark, the witch says assertively. The hands of the killers must kill. And your wife, tortured soul, weak body, yet she still offers all she has left to save her son and you. She even has virgin blood. The divine shall be pleased. No deal. She has to live. Jenny and my son have to live, I demand. The witch gets angry. Don't say I didn't try. She charges a clay and transforms into an owl. If I can't have my son, I'll have yours. She sinks her talons into Clayton's arm and rapidly flaps her wings to drag him to the fire. No, I scream. Jenny grabs him and it slows the witch down, but she's too weak to hold on. The skinwalkers charge at Jenny and separate her from Clay. Thinking fast, I grab her son's hide and throw it into the fire. The hide begins to shriek. The witch wails and lets Clayton go, diving into the fire to save the hide. A skinwalker throws me down to the ground and holds me there, compressing my chest. She pulls the hide away and begins to rapidly flap her wings to put the hide out. She transforms back into herself and lifts the hide from the ground. If I didn't need you to perform the ritual, you could have called yourself as good as dead. She hissed at me. You will feel pain. She dashes at me with her knife and commands the skinwalkers to hold me down. She tears my shirt and starts to carve at my chest. I scream in pain. The skinwalkers pick me up and put me in Jenny's cell with Clayton. I cover my chest and we all back up into the corner. We're sealed in. United once again. But why? Why this way? Clayton clings to his mother once more and she clings to me. I cry in silence because I don't have the slightest clue nor the slightest way to even fathom how I'm going to save the family I was sure I already lost. I peer, seeing the witch, frustrated and crying while smothering her son's hide with some kind of gel, grooming it. For the first time, I'm pretty sure I understand how she feels. Fuck, I mumble, pressing my head against the cave's wall. Bring me the boy, she commands. The skinwalkers open the cell once again and go for clay. Jenny grasps harder and I dive in front. They shove me out of the way one last time and snatch clay away. Mommy, he yells as he's being dragged to the witch. The witch scrapes the gel off the hide and throws it onto Clayton. The witch and clay shriek as the gel is being thrown. It seems to be searing his skin, transforming the burns from the hide. Enraged, I charge at the witch. She transforms one last time, dropping her knife in the bowl of gel, and flies away with the hide, leaving me with my burning child. The skinwalkers evacuate. As soon as they leave, the hallway closes itself off. I do my best to wipe the gel off and accept the burns. Desperately, I wipe off as much as I can and try to flick it off, but it clings to my skin. I lift my son to embrace him. His breathing is slowing, but he's still alive. I know what I have to do. I'm not letting my son die like that. I stand, carrying him to the knife the witch had dropped and shoved it into his heart. He lets out one last whine and dies. I wail, cry, sob, and shake. I begin to have a panic attack and cling to my son. He still bleeds. I embrace him tighter. Jenny drags herself to me and cries. She hugs us, accepting the burns too. Our flesh peels and sticks to each other. It is done, the witch says, standing behind me.
I try with all my might to attack her one last time, but the simple sight of her gaze stops me from doing so. I let go of Clay. Jenny holds him and falls to the ground. She peels my shirt away from the knife wounds. They are scarred and healed. To sacrifice your own, you bathe in the blood of your kin. Shall you live as the beast of the divine? Says the witch. I feel my bones break, snap, and rearrange themselves. I grow taller. My vision turns red like fire. And to the divine do we serve and seek. To obey and give. I find myself thinking, following her mantra, kneeling and bowing towards the witch. I take the hide of her son and place it over my son, resurrecting his body. But it's not him that appears, but her son, who takes my son's vessel. I can hear the witch commanding me to kill Jenny and Savannah, remembering what she said. Fire shall purify, echoes through my head. <laughs>